This is Audible. Audible Studios presents AI Destroyer, AI Destroyer Book One, written by Von Hepner, performed by Mark Vitor. The Awakening. Chapter One. The man tried to jackknife up to a sitting position. Instead, his forehead slammed against something hard, which caused him to sprawl back where he lay. He was stunned, but only for a second. He vaguely realized that his forehead should have been throbbing from the blow, but he had little attention to spare for this because his pounding heart had caused a sick feeling to erupt like a geyser in his stomach. He vomited, but nothing came up. The agony grew, lancing through his chest and radiating to his extremities. Am I having a heart attack? The agony redoubled. He choked on his next breath, finding it impossible to make his lungs work. He needed air or he would suffocate. His eyes snapped open. A heavy sheet of plexiglass was centimeters in front of his face. To his right and left was steel sheathing. He was lying in a coffin with a plexiglass lid. He shuddered as he finally sucked down air. Breathing eased the agony in his chest enough for him to start thinking more coherently. He shouldn't be here. He, who am I? He strove to understand more about his situation. He felt a thrum all around him. It was a steady vibration as if he was inside a vast engine. There was something else. I'm heavier than I should be. Something is pressing me down. His eyes narrowed. We're decelerating. What happened to the gravity dampeners? This must be a cryogenic travel unit, not a coffin, as he'd first supposed. He was traveling low again. The thrum was a spaceship's engines, and the pressure was G's, either from deceleration or acceleration. Something was wrong, though. The stale air said as much. He had to get out of the cryo unit if he wanted to keep breathing. Panic would deplete the remaining air faster. Thus, he had to do this as calmly as he could. His hands lay by his sides. He twisted in the tight confines, wriggled and wrestled each arm until both hands pressed against the plexiglass lid. He noticed a whitish band on the bottom of his right ring finger. He had obviously worn a ring there for quite some time, but it was missing now. He saw his thick wrists and suddenly believed that he was stronger than average, but he couldn't remember why he was so strong. Hell, he couldn't even remember his name. You bastards, he said thickly, referring to whoever had done this to him. If he failed in his breakout, he would die. He would die trapped like an animal. That made him mad. He wasn't an animal, a stainless steel rat in particular. People had called him that before. He'd fought hard for honor and respect. That was more precious to him than life. He bellowed like a power lifter that had gone berserk on crack. The back of his head throbbed from the strain. He kept roaring just the same. He kept shoving against the plexiglass. But it didn't matter. He was going to die. He couldn't shove off the lid. Abruptly, he quit shoving. The palms of his hands and his fingertips still touched the plexiglass, but only lightly now. His arm muscles twitched from the exertion, but the feeling of needles in the back of his skull dwindled. He berated himself but only for an instant. Negative self-talk wouldn't get him out of here. If this was a cryogenic unit on a spaceship, going low, as the saying went, that meant the box was in essence a sleeper cell. Such cells or units usually had emergency handles or buttons. He had to find his. The confinement made it impossible to turn onto his side. Instead, he first felt around near his head and shoulder with his left hand. There was nothing. Worse, the stale air was making it harder to think. He switched hands. His fingers brushed against something. He grabbed it and jerked as hard as he could. The tiny lever didn't move. Panic gnawed at the edge of his mind. He forced it back. There was another option. He shoved the handle forward. It was stiff, but it moved, suddenly clicking a moment later. There was a hiss above him as seals popped. The plexiglass lid moved upward. Freezing air gushed all around him. It was beautiful air just the same. It was... 
He stiffened as klaxons rang. Had they been ringing for some time, or did he just hear them now with the opened lid? The loud klaxons repeated a particular rhythm that meant only one thing. The spaceship was under attack. Chapter Two Using all of his strength, what little he had to call upon, he eased over the lip of the opened unit and tried to slide onto the floor. He lost the battle as his fingers lost grip. He thudded onto freezing deck plates, lying there gasping at the intense cold. He was naked except for a special jock covering his genitals. The cup was there to protect him from extended heavy G's that presently pushed against him. The cold proved too much. It forced him to sit up and then to gather himself so that he perched on his knees and the tips of his toes. He noticed frost on the deck plates, as well as on the other cryogenic sleep units, which were laid out in row upon row. The chamber had a low ceiling, barely higher than his head if he stood. The cycling klaxons were beginning to annoy him, as it made it more difficult to think. He examined himself in an attempt at recognition. He had pale white skin, but he couldn't decipher any particular nationality. He possessed lean muscles and had practically no body fat. A tattoo on his right shoulder showed a black anvil with a white R in the center. He knew the tattoo. It was a mercenary symbol for... He rubbed his eyes, the meaning of the symbol just beyond his reach. The R meant regiment, that's right. The anvil meant, the black anvil meant. He belonged to the black anvil regiment out of Titan in the Saturn system. Gears shifted in his mind. The gas giant Saturn belonged to the solar system. Each planet had its own culture and governmental process. Saturn possessed cloud cities in the gas giant's highest upper atmosphere, icy satellite colonies in orbit, and various moon colonies, the largest of which was on Titan. The klaxons abruptly quit. That brought a strange silence to the freezing chamber. No, that wasn't exactly right. The mercenary, he was sure he was one, cocked his head. He heard a deep groaning, a metallic sound. That befuddled him for a moment before he realized that the ship itself was making the noises. The sounds had struck him the first time he'd heard them. They sounded like structural shifting, he realized that this spaceship must be huge. When had he first heard those strange sounds? His shivering grew worse as he tried to concentrate. That opened another hatch in his mind. Something terrible was hovering just outside his conscious thoughts. He cursed as his shivering intensified yet again. This was too much. Why hadn't a tech been on hand for his revival? They shouldn't have brought him out like this. There were injections he hadn't received. Maybe that's why he couldn't remember his name, why he was crouched naked like this. Someone had royally screwed up, bringing him out of cryo sleep before the ship had reached its destination. Proper injections would have made it a slow thaw out. Coming out like this could cause permanent brain damage. Anger drove him to his feet. Someone might be trying to harm him. The strain of standing reminded him of the intense G's. He staggered to the next cryo unit, used his left hand to wipe frost from the plexiglass and stared at the immobile face of an older man with silver hair. He should know this person. He should. The pounding headache finally announced itself, hitting so suddenly that he collapsed onto the sleeper unit. That only lasted a moment. The cold drove him back onto his feet. The freezing air hurt his throat and lungs. With both hands, he massaged his throbbing forehead. At that point, the deck lurched under him. He staggered. The thrum around him changed, cycling downward. Immediately, the amount of G's pulling at him lessened into something more bearable. He looked around as the chill became unbearable. Some of his skin had already turned blue. He would get hyperthermia soon. No, he was cold from coming out of the cryo unit. What was wrong with his thinking? He clenched his teeth, heading for the hatch. His naked feet slapped against the icy deck plates. It was time to get out of here. As he reached the hatch, the metal partition slid up fast. The sudden motion made him flinch. A gust of warm air struck him. That felt wonderful. The warmth drew him like a magnet. 
Then, a thin man in a dark uniform stepped before him. The man aimed a black matted gun at his midsection. I was right, the officer said in an odd accent. This is your fault. Now you're going to fix it or I'm going to kill you. Chapter 3 The naked man had an instinctive dislike of the uniformed officer. He wanted answers, but he closed his mouth out of long training from somewhere. Don't speak to cops played over and over in his mind with the force of a mantra. Only, this officer had a black uniform with blood-red buttons and the same blood-colored shoulder boards. That meant something. Arbiter. The uniform and tabs meant the man belonged to the Government Security Bureau, the Solar League's secret police. They were better known as the GSB. In the beginning, the Solar League meant Earth. The mother planet held the vast majority of the solar system's population. Earth also wielded the most authority, but not quite to the same degree as it had superiority in number of people. The Earth-born did not particularly care for the space-born, or spacers. Don't try any of your tricks on me, the Arbiter snarled. Up, up, get your hands up. Slowly, the naked man raised his hands. Behind your head, the Arbiter said. Lace your fingers together and put them behind your head. If you don't, I'll shoot. I'll make it a belly shot, too. That's the slowest, most painful kind of death. Reluctantly, the mercenary put his hands behind his head. The Arbiter smiled nastily. He had narrow features and bony hands. His eyes bulged outward in an unhealthy manner, and there was an evil brightness to them. The mercenary realized the Arbiter enjoyed inflicting pain. He'd known people like him, far too many in his lifetime. All the signs told him the Arbiter was a sadist. Turn around, the Arbiter said. As the mercenary began turning, he realized that he was bigger than the other man. It wasn't so much that the mercenary was huge, but that the Arbiter was smaller than normal. Despite the black matted pistol, the Arbiter obviously feared him. Walk backward into the corridor, the Arbiter ordered. The mercenary did. The warm corridor felt good on his skin. He kept backing up until he bumped against the far bulkhead. The Arbiter watched him from the left, maybe three strides away. The hatch slid down with a clang. The Arbiter flinched, turning his pistol and body toward the closed hatch. Without conscious thought, the mercenary lunged. He might have moved faster if he had his normal reflexes. Undoubtedly, coming out of cryogenic sleep had dulled his speed. It felt as if he moved in slow motion, but he kept on attacking anyway. The Arbiter had a gun, but the mercenary had surprise. The Arbiter finally realized what was happening, swiveled the gun, and fired. Searing pain flared along the mercenary's side. He didn't know if the bullet had gone through him or merely grazed his side. It hurt unbelievably either way. The pain seemed to make him move faster and hit harder. His fist struck the Arbiter square on the chin. While doing it, a memory surfaced. The few times he had gone into the fighting cage for money, he'd never hit his opponent better than this. The Arbiter staggered back as he windmilled his arms. The pistol went flying, striking a bulkhead. The small secret police agent in his midnight-colored uniform collapsed backward, the body pitching the back of the head onto the deck plates with a decided thump. The Arbiter began twitching on the floor. His eyes opened, but it didn't seem as if he could see anything. The mercenary knelt beside the Arbiter, grabbing the man, making him stop moving. The Arbiter gagged, his eyes bulged, and he made weird choking noises. The twitching began again. Who am I? The mercenary shouted. The twitching ceased as the Arbiter stared at the mercenary. The little man seemed to be trying to form words. Fear washed through his eyes. The Arbiter croaked something that could have been John. Then the secret police agent deflated, the life seeming to hiss out of him. His features stiffened into an agonized mask as his limbs and torso stopped twitching. The mercenary thought the Arbiter was dead, until the little man started making soft, snoring noises. John stood. He believed that was his name, John. But John what? He didn't know. 
He looked around and retrieved the black matted pistol. He pressed a small button. A tiny magazine fell into his palm. These were minuscule bullets. He checked his left side. Blood welled from where the slug had grazed him. It still stung, but it was bearable. The gun seemed like a toy. The mercenary shook his head. If he pressed this toy against a man's head, the bullets would kill just as certainly as a heavy gyrock round. John considered the arbiter. He was making rattling noises in his throat, and he clearly had a concussion. Should he let the GSB agent sleep? Fear and hatred for the GSB welled up in John. They were the most sinister secret police organization in human history. Their agents had infiltrated everywhere. The Solar League had their tendrils in every place in the solar system. John frowned. What was the best course of action? He lacked enough information to know. Yet, it seemed he could derive something from his present circumstance. Suddenly, he heard an older man's voice in his mind. If you're going to become an officer, you have to learn to make decisions, often with only the scantiest clues as to the real situation. You have a mind. In many ways, it's just like a knife. The more you sharpen it, the better it can cut. I have plenty of tough men. I always need those who can think fast on their feet. The Arbiter had come alone to the cryo chamber. That seemed strange. That he alone had woken up in the cryo chamber also seemed strange. The Arbiter had accused him of doing something bad, saying it was his fault. If the Arbiter had come alone, maybe they would be alone for a time. That meant he could question the man. John's grip tightened on the little pistol. He knelt beside the unconscious secret policeman. Hey, John said, wake up. The Arbiter did not respond. Wake up, John said, as he patted the man's left cheek. The Arbiter smacked his lips and moaned pitifully, but he remained unconscious. As John debated on his next choice, a clanking sound caused him to turn left. A blue-orange repair robot lurched into view on its treads. It was a large rectangular device, weighing something like 700 pounds. It had several optical sensors, one that twitched as if it focused on him. The repair bot had three skeletal mechanical arms. One had an integral laser torch for cutting and welding. The other two arms ended with metal prongs or pincers. Blue-orange repair bots patched torn bulkheads, including in zero gravity. The multi-jointed treads helped it climb over debris. In zero gravity, it used presently hidden thrusters to maneuver. The repair bot kept clanking, picking up speed. John frowned. Had the spaceship taken hits? He didn't feel any depressurization. Main hatches could have shut, though, sealing off damaged areas. Repair bots were routine items on spaceships, although there were more of them on military vessels. John set the gun on the floor and grabbed the Arbiter, hoisting the man into an upright position. Keeping hold of the small man, John stepped out of the bot's path. The bulky machine veered, coming straight at them again. Worse, the short-ranged laser emitted a pre-beam light, glowing a dangerous red. It felt like the bot was attacking them, but that was crazy. The bot clanked faster yet, aiming the integral laser torch at his chest. At the last moment, John moved fast, pulling the Arbiter with him. The bot trundled past as the skeletal arm tried to shift so the laser torch would hit him. That proved too wild of a maneuver for the repair bot. The main body tipped, hung like that for a second as the treads continued to churn and crashed heavily against the deck plates. What's going on? The Arbiter muttered, with drool spilling from his mouth. The orifice of the laser torch lost its red color. The bot moved the two pincer arms, pushing against the deck, slowly writing itself back onto its multi-treads. The smaller man stared at the bot in terror. No, he moaned. No, no, no. What's going on, John said. Why did the bot attack us? The arbiter twisted in John's grasp, staring at him with horribly red eyes. The machinery has gone berserk, the policeman slurred. It's attacking us, but you already know that. Me, John asked. Why should he know? Your colonel must have slipped a virus into the ship's main computer system. That's the only explanation. That you're awake proofs I'm right. 
John stared at the arbiter, wondering at the man's sanity, why the policeman would concoct such a wild idea. The bot began coming at them again, the end of the laser torch flickering on and off with color. It seemed as if something had short-circuited the torch, otherwise it would have beamed them by now. Get us out of here, the arbiter screamed in a high-pitched voice. It's trying to kill me. It's already killed several of the crew. The bot stiffened the laser torch arm as if it meant to use the useless torch as a lance. The other two arms made ready to grab them as the robot neared. At the last second, John sidestepped fast like an old-time matador, dragging the arbiter with him, but like a lead cape. The GSB agent screamed as one of the pincers tore a sleeve and the flesh beneath it from his forearm. The robot braked, seeming to learn from its previous mistake. Yet that seemed too incredible to be true. Maybe someone was piloting the bot with a remote control unit. John kept hold of the arbiter, took two steps, squatted, and grabbed the pistol off the floor. It's turning around, the arbiter screamed. Run, don't let it hurt me. John waited for the bot, or remote controller, to gain its bearings and charge them once more. When the robot did, he dodged like before. Then, he began running the other way. He clasped the arbiter one-armed against his side, staggering down the corridor. Run faster, the arbiter wailed. It's gaining on us. Chapter 4 John glanced back. The arbiter was right. The bot's multi-treads whirred. That moved the repair unit faster than seemed normal. John already felt beat. His thighs quivered from exhaustion. While he'd gained some initial separation from the bot, it now remorselessly closed the distance between them. Run harder, the arbiter screamed. John debated dropping the secret policeman. He wasn't sure if that was honorable or not, though. The man was his enemy. Yet dropping him for the robot to kill seemed inhuman. Still, his left arm shook from the strain. The arbiter screamed his highest pitched wail so far. The little man slipped within John's grasp. With manic strength, the arbiter clutched John's torso. Don't let me go, the arbiter sobbed. Please, please, don't drop me. John saw spots of blood on the floor behind them. What was left of the arbiter's left sleeve was soaked with blood where the bot had torn his flesh. They turned a corner in the corridor. Ahead was a closed hatch. John put on an extra burst of speed. Listen, he wheezed. Are you listening? Yes, yes, the arbiter said. If I drop you, I don't have the strength to lift you up again. Can you open the hatch? I can, I can. John almost tripped as he reached the hatch, his feet tangling. He twisted, shoving the arbiter forward, slamming the little policeman against the hatch. The arbiter groaned in pain. John saw the bot wheel around the corner. The optical sensors swiveled and focused on them. The bot had slowed to take the corner. Now it churned its treads faster again. The wobbly, half-standing arbiter sobbed with effort. It's locked. The hatch is locked. Don't you have an override code? Yes, yes, I do. Lift me higher so I can reach it. John tightened his one-armed hold, sucked down air, and heaved the little policeman higher. The arbiter stared at the override unit. Well, John snarled. I can't remember the code. Then I'm dropping you. No, no, let me think. I have it. The arbiter's spidery fingers tapped the override unit. Something in the hatch clicked. I have it, the arbiter shouted triumphantly. John judged the bot. It was close. He stepped away from the hatch just the same. That allowed the arbiter to open it in their direction. This hatch was different and heavier than the earlier one. This was a main hatch that separated sections of the ship. Hurry, the arbiter cried. Hurl me through and close the hatch. John had kept watch of the bot. The pincers thrust at him. He swiveled away, desperate to keep out of the machine's grasp. One of the steel pincers brushed his naked flesh. That caused John to flinch away with greater speed. The laser torch thrust, the tip striking the arbiter's side. The little policeman gasped, and his hold around John's torso slipped. John reversed course. He'd moved away from the hatch to pull the bot away from it. Now, John ran for the hatch, lunging through to the other side. As he did, a robot pincer gripped the arbiter's bloody arm. The skeletal arm yanked, and John lost hold of him. Help me, 
the arbiter screamed. Help, help, it has me. John grabbed the policeman's other arm with the idea of yanking the arbiter to him. The bot maneuvered its second set of pincers. They latched onto the same arm it already gripped with the first. No, the arbiter screamed. Save me, you did this to- The bot backed up and yanked the arbiter out of John's weaker human grip. John watched, his heart hammering from overexertion. The arbiter stared at him with stark features twisted into a mask of agony. It was like seeing a man in the jaws of a crusher seconds before the machine pulped him. The arbiter screamed as one set of pincers crushed a hand. John heard the bones snapping like brittle graphite. The other set of pincers released its hold. The twin prongs widened fully, clamping onto the arbiter's head. Help me, the arbiter wailed. This was such a surreal moment. It didn't make any kind of sense. The bot began to squeeze the arbiter's head. The man's howl was too much for John. John aimed his pistol and fired. The toy bullet struck near the bot's main optical sensor. It was a small target, but the distance was minimal. The targeting of the optics was purely by chance. Better to aim at something than aim at nothing. It was more of a gut reaction to shoot the monster than a belief that he could actually hurt it. Just the same, the main optical lens shattered as a bullet struck it. The machine's reaction to that seemed off, given that it had turned murderous. There was still a good possibility that it was being controlled by a remote operator. The pincers squeezing the arbiter's head opened. The other set of pincers that had crushed his hand bones also widened. With a thump, the arbiter collapsed onto the deck plates in front of the machine. The secret policeman curled into a weeping, miserable bundle, cradling his broken hand. The repair bot's treads whirred as it repositioned its body. A secondary optical device focused on John. Still in the surreal moment, the mercenary retargeted and fired once more. Tiny clicks emanated from the pistol. It was out of bullets. The robot clanked toward the mercenary, one of the multi-treads rolling over the arbiter's ankle and foot that lay in the way. The arbiter howled anew. John grabbed an edge of the hatch and began swinging it shut. A robot pincer grabbed something on the other side and forced the hatch open, ripping the edge out of John's fingers. John turned and staggered away. The robot churned through the opening after him. As John ran, he noticed a curl of smoke from the barrel of the gun. Had he really just fired a gun at a repair bot that seemed bent on murdering him and the arbiter? John glanced back. The bot was gaining on him again. He might have screamed like the arbiter a few moments ago. The surreal feeling had departed now, replaced with a sense of dread, of horror in the pit of John's stomach. A remorseless machine was chasing him in what seemed to be an empty spaceship. After running him down, it would crush his skull and leave him for dead. Finally, the hard core of John's personality reasserted itself. As it did, he remembered things. It felt as if he'd spent a lifetime running away. Before he'd joined the Black Anvil Regiment, he'd been a stainless steel rat on Titan. He'd survived a hard scrabble existence. Hell, he had a feeling that he'd flourished back then. So what if a repair bot chased him? That was nothing compared to his early life. He obviously couldn't overpower the robot with his muscles. He had to outwit it or its controller. Unfortunately, his stamina was almost gone. Right, he said, realizing that he had a plan. John stopped and turned, wheezing as he regarded the charging bot. His chest heaved from the exertion as sweat slicked his clammy skin. He was probably dehydrated from the cryosleep. He needed water, he needed rest, and he needed some damn clothes and explanations about what was going on. Squinting at the attacking machine, John knew it had learned from its previous dodges. He needed a new tactic. John hurled the gun at the machine. The pistol struck the robot and clattered onto the deck plates. At the same time, John stepped to the right. The machine held to the middle of the corridor, refusing to take the bait. John charged. The bot widened its skeletal pincer arms as if to embrace him. The useless laser torch held steady like a battering ram. The robot refused to give him space to dodge, or so it surely thought in its cunning computer core. With a roar, John jumped as hard as he could. It wasn't much in his current state, 
but it allowed him enough height so his right foot landed on top of the robot. He pushed off as he might from a fire hydrant, leaping over the robot. The top of his head scraped the ceiling. Then John landed back on the deck plates with a stagger, almost tripped, but managed to keep his feet. He panted as he ran back for the hatch. He pumped his arms, trying to run faster. Behind him, the robot reversed course. Soon, John sped through the hatch. The arbiter had dragged himself to a bulkhead, leaning against it as he cradled his broken hand in his bloody lap. John shut the hatch, looking for a way to lock it. As he looked, something hard and heavy clanged against the hatch. John leaped back with a start. You brought it back, the arbiter whined. John stared at the bloody secret policeman. A second loud clang reactivated John's survival instincts. The robot was trying to batter its way through. He went to the arbiter, who shrank away from him. Grabbing the policeman by the lapels, John hoisted the arbiter to his feet. I can't use my right ankle and foot, the arbiter said in a pleading tone. You'd better start hopping then, John told him. He put the secret policeman's good arm over his shoulder and took off, forcing the arbiter to hop like mad beside him. The two of them picked up speed as John tried to get as much separation from the killing bot as he could. Chapter 5 No, no, the Arbiter whined. Don't put me there, anywhere but there. John and the Arbiter stood inside a med, or medical center. The smaller man still had an arm around John's shoulders as he perched on his good foot. The med center was smaller than the cryo chamber, but it was large enough for several man-sized tubes. The tubes contained automated medical stations with sensors, mechanical arms, and other operative machinery. You're hurt, John wheezed. I know what I am, but don't you understand? The computers can think now. They hate us. The med tube will kill me if you put me in there. John stared blankly at the little policeman. He'd been replaying what had happened. It seemed obvious now. Someone had remote controlled the robot. Anything else was too silly to believe. I'll watch you, John said. Make sure you're okay. No. The longer they'd moved alone in the spaceship, the eerier it felt. The longer they had moved alone, the more determined John had become to keep the Arbiter alive. John didn't like the idea of being all alone in space. However, if they were alone, it meant he didn't have to fear any GSB backup for the secret policeman. John moved to the nearest med station. The Arbiter tried to struggle. John slammed the secret policeman against the tube. He shrugged the Arbiter's arm off his shoulders and used both hands to grab the policeman by the lapels. You don't understand, the Arbiter wept. The computers hate us. John was finding it harder to focus. He'd moved too fast for too long since coming out of cryogenic sleep. He'd been on the verge of fainting for the past few minutes. His eyesight had begun to blur and his mental acuity had slipped. He didn't trust the Arbiter, though, so he kept his growing debility to himself. The clangs from the repair bot battering the hatch had dwindled. Apparently, its controller wasn't smart enough to open the hatch. Lay down, John whispered. Why are you killing me like this? I don't understand. Lay down, John said, louder than before. The Arbiter winced with fear. He'd become afraid of John, but he didn't obey the mercenary. John couldn't take it anymore. He slammed an elbow against the Arbiter's face, stunning him. Grunting, John picked up the little policeman and laid him in the open tube. Then he went to the controls. Every mercenary worth his salt learned how to use one of these. John paused, staring at the med tube. Could it really have intelligence like the Arbiter suggested? Could it hate humans? That was inconceivable. Yet, was he dooming the Arbiter to a painful death if he did this? John tapped the controls, activating the medical unit. Lights came on inside the tube. The med sensors began to scan the Arbiter, diagnosing him. John felt himself slipping away. He could fall unconscious any moment if he wasn't careful. He pushed off the tube, staggering to a standing position. He picked up a hand-sized medikit, slapping it against his hip. It beeped, and a few seconds later, tiny needles stabbed him, injecting him with something. He waited. 
Soon, the fuzziness in his mind began to retreat. The feeling he would keel over any second dissipated. His stomach rumbled afterward. He was ravenous. He began searching for something to eat. Soon, he uncovered several protein bars. He tore open the first wrapper. The bar was chewy and raspberry flavored. He demolished that bar and started on the second one. By that time, he had uncovered some water packets, guzzling several. He even found a wardrobe, putting on a medical officer's shirt and pants and a spare pair of shoes. He felt more human afterward. There was nothing in the way of weapons. He found a comm station, sat at it, and debated with himself. No, he would wait to announce himself. He wanted a few answers first. As the med station verbally requested that the arbiter put his broken hand on a med plate, John cogitated concerning his plight and persona. The arbiter was awake enough to comply with the request. It didn't seem as if the med tube possessed any hostility toward the little policeman. John rubbed his chin thoughtfully. He knew that he was a mercenary born under a dome on the Saturn moon of Titan. In his youth, he'd been a stainless steel rat, whatever that was. His first name was John. His second name was H something. H, H, Hawkins. I'm John Hawkins from the New London Dome, he said. Saying that unclogged more of his memories. He remembered what a stainless steel rat was. He'd been a thief, a gang member, a runner, a scout, and later an enforcer. The first several levels in the New London Dome housed the upper class. He'd grown up in the corridors and tunnels of the lower levels. His uncle had worked in the rackets, leaving the man little time to look after his scrawny nephew. None of the sex shops had grabbed him, though. He could thank his uncle for that. Soon, though, the young stainless steel rat spent all his time in the corridors with his friends. The one thing his early existence wasn't was lawless. The lower tunnel gang had strict rules. Break the rules and one would endure beatings. John had received his share and then some. It took him years before he realized his problem. He spoke his mind too freely, and he was smarter than most of his mates. Being scrawny hadn't helped either. The gang robbed, sold drugs, and fought other gangs for territory. Finally, John landed before a judge because he had broken the wrong man's bones. He'd been an enforcer at the time, and that's what enforcers did. The man had worked for the Dome Police, however, which meant the Dome Police teams had come down to the lower levels and hunted him in earnest, dragging him before the new London judge advocate. The cops had done that for a reason. By new London law, only the judge advocate could impose the death penalty. And he did. The good luck for John was a lingering economic depression that still ran throughout the entire Saturn gravitational system. One of the mercenary outfits had a recruiting sergeant in New London at the time. The sergeant asked to see the death row inmates. The sergeant had been a squat old man with only one good eye. He hadn't sat down to interview John, but entered his holding cell, walked up to him, and punched John in the stomach. John had roared off the floor and attacked the old bugger. Five times the sergeant knocked him down. Five times after his head stopped ringing, John got up and launched himself at the old man. The last time, the sergeant put John in a submission hold. Then the old man had shouted at the watching guard, He'll do, I'll buy him. John entered the Black Anvil Regiment later that evening. Colonel William Graham commanded the mercenary regiment. John had learned the new rules fast, fitting in as soon as he realized the regiment was his new gang. There was one difference, though, Colonel Graham. Graham wasn't anything like the other mercenary colonels. He had class as well as keen military talents. He seemed to care for his soldiers, and he hunted among his regiment for those with ability. Graham must have seen something in scrawny John Hawkins, despite the chip on his shoulder. The colonel made sure the sergeant of John's platoon forced books on him, and sent him later to the chaplain for tests on what he read. At first, John resisted for the best of reasons. He didn't know how to read. The chaplain found out and began to teach him. It was a painstaking effort. Once, John hit the chaplain in frustration. 
The man of God stared at him as a bruise appeared on his right cheek. Do you want to fight me? The chaplain asked softly. Yeah, I do, because that sure as hell beats trying to read this garbage. John received the worst beating of his life that day. As he lay on the floor, John had decided it was worth it, because at least he was done with the embarrassing teaching. Only it hadn't worked out that way. The sergeant had sent him back to the chaplain a week later, and the reading lessons continued. John never knew when the change came, but it did. Reading opened his mind, and the new knowledge ignited a thirst in him to know more. He began to read voraciously, until some of his mates began to call him a bookworm. No, John said. I'm a book lion. I devour books. I don't crawl through them. The books changed him. Two years after entering the regiment, the colonel spoke to him. He told John he had the makings of an officer. You know the meaning of honor, the colonel said. And I see that you've begun to think. Those make for a dangerous combination. Are you willing to enter the officer cadet program? Yes, sir, John said. Then let us begin with the first lesson, Graham said, handing John a booklet. The mercenary regiment recruited its own personnel and trained its own officers while they were in the field. Then, disaster struck. A grim change in the political nature of the Saturn system. The Solar League sent its Jupiter-conquering fleet to the Saturn system. The war for the Saturn system began and ended in the same year. The regiment fought in two actions, winning one and losing the other. Colonel Graham extricated what remained of the regiment and realized the freewheeling mercenary days were over in the Saturn system. The Jupiter gravitational system showed what would happen here. The Solar League would take over, using the GSB to hunt down and intern all resistors, putting them into brutal internment camps. Colonel Graham had kept enough of his regiment's assets liquid to buy passage on an ancient freighter. They were part of the exodus from the Saturn system people fleeing to Uranus, Neptune, and the trans-Neptunian regions beyond. That had been the first time John traveled low. What remained of the regiment went into cryogenic deep freeze, heading for the Neptune system. The journey took three years of frozen travel. One-fifth of the regimental soldiers never woke up, an 11% poorer percentage than normal. The colonel had recruited in the Neptune system, but things had never been the same. The change in customs had bewildered many of the old-timers. Fortunately, John had found the differences stimulating. Maybe because he read so much, he could accept new ideas more easily than the others could. Things had changed for the Black Anvil Regiment in the Neptune system. The most radical change came. Officer Cadet John Hawkins groaned as his head began throbbing anew. He had a few of his older memories, but none of the newer ones that would tell him why he was here on this spaceship. At least he knew more of who he was. John sat up with a start. The silver-haired man in the cryo unit had been Colonel Graham. A fierce loyalty rose in John. Colonel Graham was like a father to him. Whatever else happened, John had to make sure the colonel came out alive and well from cryo sleep. As John determined that, the little arbiter sat up in his half-open med tube. The secret policeman had a cast on his broken hand. Pseudo flesh on his forearm wound, a tight wrap around his badly sprained ankle, and another cast on his broken foot. He didn't seem quite so terrified anymore. The med tube must have given him a sedative to calm his nerves. The arbiter studied John, and he seemed disapproving. You should take off those clothes, the secret policeman said. Otherwise, we could legally shoot you as a spy. Irritation made John scowl. You're a prisoner, the arbiter said. You would do well to remember that. The SL arbiter was a prick. The secret policeman could have shown a little gratitude. John had saved his life back in the corridor. Instead of thanking him, the arbiter wanted to assert his authority. Given this, letting the policeman know the extent of his ignorance would be a mistake. Better start talking, John growled. The arbiter's head swayed back. A second later, bitterness twisted his lips. Help me out of here first. John kept staring at the man with a look from his old enforcer days. The arbiter's features hardened. 
If you piss me off enough, John told him, I'm gonna drag you back to the repair bot and toss you to it. The Arbiter slid out of the med tube and gingerly put weight on his good foot. He hopped to a stool, sitting down. The med unit cut off my boots, the Arbiter complained. What am I going to wear now? Last chance, John told him. The Arbiter's head jerked up. Do you realize I represent the GSB on this ship? That's it, John said, standing. Bah, the Arbiter said. We are wasting time. I am Arbiter Sapiroslo of the battleship Leonid Brezhnev. As you are no doubt aware, the Brezhnev belongs to Task Force 10. John kept staring, as the information did not jar anything loose in his memories. Surely you recall the battle, Oslo said. Refresh my memory, why don't you? Interesting, Oslo said. You were in cryo-sleep and you came out fast. I doubt you'll remember much. Task Force 10 came from Earth, John said, guessing. An evil smile spread the Arbiter's lips. That kindled the stainless steel rat in John, and he moved toward the Arbiter. The Arbiter pretended indifference at first. Then he said, I can have you shot if you... John hit him in the face, catapulting the smaller man head over heels onto the floor. The Arbiter lay on the deck plates, gasping. John kicked him in the side. The Arbiter groaned, curling up. John knelt and laced his fingers into the man's thinning hair. He pulled the head upright. Before he could begin the interrogation in earnest, he heard a heavy but muted clomp outside the door. John twisted around. The hatch slid up, and an SLN battlesuit aimed a heavy assault rifle at him. Chapter 6 The three of them were frozen like that for several seconds. Finally, the battlesuit stepped into the chamber, its servo motors purring softly. The hatch slid shut behind it. The battlesuit was huge, a little over seven feet tall. This one probably weighed 0.76 tons, as it lacked a back boat. The assault rifle looked to be a heavy Gauss 5 millimeter. No doubt it would fire anti-armor rounds. The Gauss rifle used magnetic impulse to accelerate 5 millimeter steel needle sabots. Excellent, Oslo declared from on the floor. Get your hands off me, he told John. John stood, backing away from Oslo. The assault rifle tracked him as he moved. Now, Oslo said. He slid along the floor until he came to a stool. Using one hand and one foot, the secret policeman painfully worked himself to a sitting position. A speaker activated on the battlesuit's helmet turret. A masked voice asked, Why were you holding down the Arbiter? I was about to bitch slap him, John replied. If that didn't work, I was going to break his nose before I beat him good. Don't you realize the penalty for harming a GSB arbiter? The battlesuit asked. John shrugged. He'd gambled and lost. That didn't mean he had to lose his balls in the process. Better to go down swinging than to gain more time as a sniveling coward. Did the arbiter annoy you somehow? The battlesuit asked. The Arbiter had been touching his wrapped ankle. He looked up now, his narrow features pinched with distaste. Who are you? Oslo demanded of the battlesuit. He annoyed me, John agreed. But that wasn't why I planned to slap him. I wanted some answers. What kind of answers? The battlesuit asked. John took a deep breath as he glanced from the battlesuit to the Arbiter. He's a Neptunian national, Oslo said into the silence. He's a spy in an SLN uniform. Shoot him. That's a lie, John said. How do you know he's a spy? The battlesuit asked the Arbiter. I have said so, Oslo declared. That is enough. Are you a spy? The battlesuit asked John. No. Are you Neptunian? No, John said. I'm a new London mercenary in the Black Anvil Regiment. I woke up in a cryo unit less than an hour ago. The Arbiter showed up, saying I caused something bad to happen. Before we could talk about it, a repair bot attacked us, badly wounding him. I saved his life and figured he owed me a few answers in return. The Arbiter's casts and pseudo-skin would seem to substantiate your story, the battlesuit conceded. The Neptunian filth is a lying capitalist dog, Oslo declared. 
He surprised me here. I dragged myself to the med center after facing and defeating a crazed robot. I told him as much. He then... The battlesuit's faceplate whirred open, interrupting the Arbiter's speech. A young woman peered up as if she could barely see out of the opening. Do you recognize me? She asked Oslo. The Arbiter frowned at her. Yes, you're the Martian mentalist. You told the Admiral you were going to get the mercenary colonel and make him flush the virus for us. This man does not look Neptunian, and he has the bearing of a soldier. I think he's telling the truth about helping you. It doesn't matter, Oslo said. The capitalist dog struck me. The penalty for that is death. I order you to shoot him. What if he can purge the virus for us? The woman asked. Wouldn't we need him then? Oslo pulled at his lower lip as he studied John. Can you do that? John said nothing, as he had no idea what they were talking about. I asked you a question, Oslo said. I don't think the soldier likes you, the woman told the arbiter. Oslo scowled at her. I do not care for your tone. It smacks of insubordination. You would do well to recall who I am. Believe me, I am recalling, the woman said. It's why I thought he was telling the truth. Enough, Oslo said. You will vacate the battle suit this instant. Under the circumstances, I have decided to wear it. The woman peered at Oslo. A second later, the faceplate whirred shut. The helmet speaker activated. We're leaving, Arbiter. Would you like me to carry you? This is intolerable. I am Arbiter Sapir Oslo of the GSB. The Solar League has invested me with political authority on the Brezhnev. I determine who is loyal and who is not. The disloyal leave the service. You can leave alive or you can leave fit first. Your threats don't mean anything out here, the Martian said through the helmet speaker. We're all as good as dead anyway. Maybe we can figure out what happened and alert Earth. Do we need you for that? I doubt it. The heavy assault rifle aimed at the center of Oslo's chest. What is it going to be, Arbiter? The Martian asked. Life or death? You dare to threaten me? Oslo asked in outrage. John expected several five millimeter needles to obliterate the Arbiter's chest any second. Instead, the small policeman's shoulders slumped. Fear re-entered his eyes. Is it that bad? Is the ship truly doomed? The rifle lowered a fraction. It's that bad. The Admiral is dying. We three might be the only ones left alive aboard the Brezhnev. The word struck John like a blow to the gut. What are you talking about? He asked. The helmet swiveled toward him. Don't you know? No. Do not believe anything he says, Oslo said in exasperation. He's a proven liar. I don't believe the Neptunians or their soldiers have anything to do with our predicament the Martian said. I'm beginning to think it's an alien attack. What's an alien attack? John asked. The Martian paused. Finally, she said, let's go to the command deck. Maybe a fresh insight can give us a clue as to what's happening. The command deck, Oslo said, backing away. We can't go there. That's where the attack started. Why do you think I'm wearing a battle suit? We cleared out the command deck before I came here. We? asked Oslo. The others died, the Martian said. The Admiral sustained wounds, but we shut down the main computer core. Now we have to make a decision. Are you ready? Sapir Oslo swallowed audibly, his throat convulsing. The fear still shined in his eyes, but he nodded. Maybe we can escape in a lifeboat. Maybe, the Martian said, not sounding convinced. Ready? she asked John. He nodded. The Martian had said something about aliens. Just what in the world was going on? Chapter 7 John refused to help Oslo walk. The battle-suited Martian did not ask him a second time. She scooped up the Arbiter, cradling him one-armed while keeping the assault rifle ready with the other. She marched through the corridors like an upright elephant her footsteps reverberating and shaking the deck plates. John struggled to keep up. He felt better, but the shoes soon pinched his feet, and he found that he hadn't fully recovered from the cryosleep yet. The Martian took what seemed a circuitous route. They did not use any turbo lifts. 
Instead, they used service tubes to go from one level to another. The battlesuit bent metal rungs as it climbed and barely made it through the narrow passageways. Is that wise? John asked as they climbed to another deck level. Wiser than a turbo lift, the Martian said through a helmet speaker. You really don't know what happened, do you? He doesn't even remember the battle, Oslo said in a superior and irritating manner. Why doesn't he remember? She asked Oslo. I suspect it is because he came out of cryosleep too quickly. The battlesuit halted, with the helmet turning so the faceplate aimed at John. Are you worried about brain damage? She asked. John had forgotten about the possibility. The idea of brain damage sickened him. Does any part of your head feel numb? The Martian asked. No. What about your hands or feet? I feel fine, John said, other than being tired. Then you should be fine long term, she said. A fast thaw out causes a little memory delay. If you don't feel any numbness, I doubt any of your forgetfulness is permanent. None of that accounts for the fact that you woke up, though. Ah, what is it? John asked. The computer must have caused the thaw out, she said. Maybe it realized you were our enemy. It wanted to unleash you as a distraction. Why didn't it thaw out the rest of my regiment then? John asked. We must have killed or overpowered the computer before it could start thawing the rest of you, the Martian said. It actually tried to bargain with us at the end. It was pretty freaky, believe me. The faceplate turned forward and the battlesuit continued clomping through the corridor. Things became radical after the next turn as they passed dead ship's personnel. The corpses lay twisted with blue, contorted faces. Some had died as they clawed at the floor. A few had bullet holes in their heads and either clutched guns or had them lying nearby on the deck. Looks like a few committed suicide rather than suffocate to death, the Martian commented. They didn't have any air, John asked. That's what suffocated usually means. Wait a minute, John said. Hold it. The battlesuit halted and turned to face him. Are you really expecting me to believe that the ship's computer turned hostile? That's my working theory, she said. But, John waved his hands. There are all kinds of fail-safes against that. I mean, how did these supposed aliens know the right codes? Hell, how did the aliens know the language so fast? How do you know it was aliens that caused this anyway? I suppose you're thinking a hostile force gave our computer systems self-attack orders, the Martian said. I don't believe that's what happened. You should not explain anything to him, Oslo said. Maybe he has insights that can help us, the Martian said. He is an enemy combatant. Not if the solar system is facing an alien threat, the Martian replied. No, no, the Arbiter said, shaking his head. This disaster happened because of Neptunian espionage. We must question him, using force if we have to. John rubbed his forehead. It had started throbbing again, making his eyesight blurry. Look at him, Oslo said. Neptunian intelligence must have inserted post-hypnotic commands into him. Subdue him, mentalist. I order you to action. Wait, John said. The headache worsened as splotches appeared before his vision. It came flooding back to him then. The reason he had been in a cryo unit aboard the SLN battleship Leonid Brezhnev. The SLN had invaded the Neptune gravitational system with an overpowering battle fleet. The Solar League controlled the inner planets and had invaded the Jupiter and Saturn gravitational systems several years ago. The Neptune Navy had sent several cruisers to Saturn back then. That had been the pretext for the present SLN invasion. The present SL leadership had finally decided on solar-wide conquest. The Neptunian Navy had met the SLN fleet near the moon Nereid. It had been a costly fight for both sides, but the SLN forces proved superior. They had smashed the majority of the NSN's capital ships, sending flocks of missiles after the smaller ships trying to flee. You're remembering things, the Martian said. I don't understand, John said, trying not to groan. Neptune lost the space battle. I don't remember why I would enter a cryo unit aboard a mainstay SLN battleship. That doesn't make sense. You're part of a secret weapon system, the Martian said. Don't tell him that. 
Oslo snapped. What weapon system? John asked. A loud clang sounded, echoing throughout the corridor. What was that? Oslo cried as his head swiveled about. Another clang sounded, followed by several more. What do the noises mean? Oslo shouted hysterically. The deck plates shuddered under their feet. Are aliens boarding? Oslo shrieked. Quiet, the battle-suited Martian said. Let me think. It sounds like another round of clangs interrupted John. You know what's happening, don't you? The Arbiter shouted at John. I think so. Tell us or you'll die, Oslo shouted. John hesitated. He wanted to punch the Arbiter for thinking the threats meant anything to him. Finally, realizing the truth would freak out the secret policeman, he said, the lifeboats are being ejected. The clangs we're hearing are the magnetic hooks coming off. The shaking must be backblast from lifeboat thrusters hitting the battleship. Oslo's eyes widened. What do you mean, the lifeboats? You're not trying to say they're launching? Of course, the Martian said. That's exactly what it is. But I didn't think anyone else was alive to use the lifeboats. He's space marines, Oslo shouted, pointing at John. The rest of them woke up and fled the ship, the cowards. No, the Martian said. That doesn't sound plausible. I think we may not have shut down the computer after all. It evaded us somehow. I deem it more likely that the computer launched the lifeboat so none of us could get away. Oslo groaned before shouting, Kill it! We must kill the computer before it kills us! As bizarre as that sounds, the Martian told John, I think he's right. Let me think. Where could it have? I have it. We have to check the auxiliary backup system. That seems the likeliest place it could inhabit. You're speaking about the computer as if it's something living, John said, bemused. Yes, the Martian said. Maybe that's why I'm in such earnest to destroy it. I'm afraid if I don't, if we don't, that life as we know it in the solar system is over. Chapter 8 the battle-suited Martian charged down the corridor with Oslo, her 0.76 tons shaking the deck plates. John dropped farther behind as she continued the grueling pace. His lungs burned and his left side ached. The pinching of his feet became even more severe. Hisses and quieter clangs from ahead told him the Martian was using the heavy assault rifle. Against what, he wondered. John doggedly kept following. After several turns, he came upon some shot up and destroyed repair bots. One nearly burned him as he didn't watch his feet placement carefully enough. The laser torch beamed hot, shooting its laser along the deck plates. John yelped in surprise, barely dancing away from the beam in time. A different bot tried to pinch him with otherwise immobile clackers. He focused, maneuvering as far away from the shot up bots as he could. The surreal feeling invaded his thinking once again. Could this so-called alien virus truly cause a ship's computer to attack its personnel? Could the virus do so to such a degree that the computer could reprogram the repair bots, turning them into soldier units? It seemed like a preposterous idea. Yet the bot back there had tried to burn his feet. The battlesuit's clomping sounds had dwindled until he could no longer hear it. John slowed his pace. Soon, something began bothering him. How could a rogue computer slaughter the personnel of an entire SLN battleship? How would he do it if he could control the ship's automated systems? He shuddered as his imagination took over. Draining the air from an area would work. He'd seen the suffocated personnel. Opening hatches to space would kill just as effectively. An alien virus, she'd said. That sounded like a cover story. What had caused her to make such an outrageous assumption? Wouldn't aliens presuppose a faster-than-light drive? If these aliens had traveled under regular physics, wouldn't astronomers have spotted these extraterrestrials years ago? The exhaust from a vast generational ship slowing down to enter the solar system would have made it as bright as a distant star and it would have moved. FTL drives belong to science fiction, not to reality. That meant the idea of aliens wasn't real. 
or at the very least had an extremely low probability. The woman was a Martian, a Martian mentalist. Martians were supposedly reluctant members of the Solar League. Earth had conquered Mars over 40 years ago. A stubborn core of Martians still yearned for independence. According to what John knew about history, many of the first space colonists had gone to Mars. They'd been among the most independent-minded of all the colony waves. The mentalists were geniuses of some sort. They took specialized training from an early age, muted their emotions, and relied heavily upon logic. The best professional chess players were Martian mentalists. John shrugged before becoming more thoughtful. Everyone sensible feared the GSB. The SL secret police had a fearsome reputation. The Martian knew Oslo would never forgive her for her words and actions in the med center. That meant the Martian really believed the Brezhnev was doomed. A cold feeling expanded in John's gut. He didn't remember the Battle of Nereid or entering the cryo unit. He certainly had no idea how or why the regiment had become a Neptune System Navy secret weapon. He would have to take the mentalist's word for that. Right, he whispered. He tore off the foot-pinching shoes. It was time to look for a weapon. Then it was time to find the cryo chamber. If he could defrost what remained of the regiment, they could take control of the Brezhnev. Retracing his steps, John tried every hatch he saw along the way. Finally, he was able to force one open. It was a utility closet. He rummaged around until he found a box cutter-like instrument and a portable laser torch. He shouldered the power pack as he slipped his arms through the carrying straps. He cinched the belt around his waist and took hold of the torch. As he turned to go, he spied a pair of work boots. These fit better than the former shoes. After lacing them, he stomped the boots on the deck plates a bit. He reached the shot-up bots, maneuvering around them with care. A strange feeling told him they were aware of him. That was more than creepy. It felt supernatural, and that frightened him in a fundamental way. He halted, glancing back at the shot-up bots. This wasn't supernatural. The machines hadn't even necessarily turned intelligent. They had attacked. The one bot hadn't been able to open a main bulkhead hatch. That implied the repair bot had a limited scope. Ghosts didn't inhabit the machines. Therefore, he didn't need to feel anything superstitious about them. John nodded decisively. Apparently, the SLN task force had defeated the main NSN fleet near Nereid. The rest of the solar system had far more people and resources than the Neptune system did. What Neptune had going for it all these years was its extreme distance from everywhere else. The Neptune gravitational system was approximately 30 AUs from the sun. The Jupiter system was approximately 5 AUs. An astronomical unit was the distance from the sun to Earth. A task force from Earth to Neptune would take two years or more to reach way out here at combat speeds. Maybe that's why the regiment had been in the cryo chamber. The battleship hadn't wanted extra mouths to feed on the long journey home to Earth. It seemed odd, though, that the battleship would travel all the way back to Earth. The more logical choice would be to stay out here in the Neptune system. The distance was so incredibly far that it took a laser light guide message a little over four hours to travel one way from Neptune to Earth at the speed of light. Four hours one way made it impossible to hold a regular conversation. John shook his head as he lurched forward. He needed to find the cryo chamber as soon as possible. The Leonid Brezhnev was a battleship. Maybe it was one of the new ones. He couldn't remember the specs regarding one. Maybe he'd never known. He had a feeling this vessel was one of the biggest spaceships humans had ever constructed. The number 300 bounced around inside his head. 300 personnel living in the battleship for years at a time meant... It had to be immense. It must have decks upon decks. Then, to store all the food, water, missiles, energy, engines, plate armor, ablating, protective gels, and crystals for battle. John's shoulders slumped. He couldn't remember the route the Martian had taken from the med center. He could spend hours searching for the cryo chamber. 
He needed a ship layout to help him. He concentrated as he passed hatches. Finally, he came to one with star symbols on it. Maybe this was an astro navigation center. He tried several times to open the hatch without success. Finally, he activated the torch and cut out the hatch over an emergency system. After the edges cooled, he rotated a handle, slowly opening the main hatch with it. The hatch suddenly froze, and the handle wouldn't budge no matter how hard he tried. John lay prone on the deck plates and squeezed under the partly opened hatch. He realized he'd come to an observation port. There was a short corridor and another hatch. This one opened easily. He closed the hatch and stepped toward a bulging dome. It pushed outward several meters from the main armored hull of the battleship. The dome was made of a clear substance, allowing him to view space and along the length of the Leonid Brezhnev. He peered at the battleship's hull. There were pockmarks here and there, hits from the Battle of Nereid repaired rapidly in the field. The hull was black matted, coated with anti-sensor material. Behind the material was the hardened armored alloy. He had no idea how thick the alloy was. The battleship was oval-shaped, a deadly example of the SLN's power. John peered outward into space. He wasn't sure what he expected. There were stars, of course, myriads of stars. There was also a blue object. It was three times the size of the largest visible star. With a start, John realized the blue object was Neptune. They must be within five million kilometers of the ice giant. In this region of space, that was incredibly close. He would have thought the Brezhnev would have been much farther away. He couldn't have been in the cryo unit for very long then. What did that tell him? Nothing he could really use. Somehow, it made the idea of aliens seem even sillier, though. If aliens had done this to the computer, wouldn't the two battle fleets have already detected the alien ships, joining forces to destroy them? He lacked a critical piece of knowledge. He had no idea how long he'd been in the cryo unit. What was going on in the Neptune gravitational system? Five million kilometers. If the regiment could capture the Brezhnev, they could return to the Neptune system shortly. What were the Earth-born conquerors doing to the people of the Neptune system? At that point, the continuous thrum increased, heralding greater G's dragging down on John's body. The Brezhnev's engines obviously thrust with greater power. Did that mean they were braking, or did it mean the vessel was accelerating? Did the battleship seek to flee from Neptune or return to it? It seemed to John the G's had doubled. That would make walking around much more difficult. He'd tire more quickly. Not only did he need to find a ship layout, he needed more food and water to sustain a hard and extended effort. He delayed long enough. It was time to get a move on. Chapter 9 John saw the battlesuit's oversized metal boots as he slid under the frozen hatch. Arbiter Oslo still lay against the battlesuit's left arm. Now, however, the secret policeman had rearmed. He pointed a larger handgun at him, an upgrade from the small pistol. Look at him, Oslo sneered. He must consider those weapons. Do you have any doubts left? Don't shoot him, the battlesuited Martian said. We have to think this through. I am in charge here, the Arbiter said. I will give you commands. You will not give me commands. The Admiral is in charge, the Martian said. She has the final say in this. You told me the Admiral was dead. I said she's dying, and that may take her a while. She's stubborn, as I'm sure you know. Hmm, the Arbiter said. Unlatch the power pack, he told John. You will- Just a minute the Martian said. I have tolerated as much interference as I'm willing to take from you, the Arbiter announced. Please, Arbiter, the Martian said. I request a judgment on your part. Sapir Oslo cocked his head, looking up at the sealed helmet. You desire me to make a judgment at a time like this? Yes, Arbiter, the Martian said formally. Set me on my feet, the Arbiter said. I cannot pronounce a judgment cradled like a child. 
The Martian carefully set the small secret policeman onto his feet, his one good foot. He held the other foot clear of the deck as he leaned against the battlesuit. The Arbiter still hadn't found any shoes. Give me the situation, Oslo said formally. As far as we know, the Martian said, everyone aboard the Leonid Brezhnev is dead, except for us three and the Admiral. You are forgetting the regiment of NSN space marines in the cryo chamber, Oslo said. Ah, the Martian said, the faceplate aimed at John. Were you headed to the cryo chamber? John said nothing. His silence is damning, Oslo said. But go ahead, he told the Martian. Let us make this a formal judgment. Then I will execute the Neptunian. We have finally eliminated the rogue computer the Martian said. I imagine you heard it threaten us with extinction just before I aborted it. It was an odd pronouncement indeed, Oslo said, as his face registered momentary unease. I imagine the computer spoke that way in order to befuddle us. In the end, I deem it an amateurish attempt. Suppose, though, that the auxiliary backup computer spoke truly at the end, the Martian asked. That has no bearing on the space marine, Oslo's narrow features tightened as he pointed his gun at John. I told you to drop the power pack. If you do not do so at once, I will kill you. I saved your life before, John said. You did so for your own nefarious ends, Oslo said. Thus I am unimpressed by your actions. By the way, if this is a stalling technique on your part, it will not work. I am giving you three seconds to comply with my command. John glanced up at the battlesuit before unbuckling the belt and letting the pack and torch hit the deck. He still had the box cutter in his back pocket. If the Arbiter dropped his guard, it would be the last thing the secret policeman ever did. Excellent, Oslo said in a smug tone. You have extended your existence for another minute or two. The auxiliary computer threatened us with human extinction, the Martian continued. Yet the computer knew it was dying its last circuit's about to lose power. It increased engine thrust at the very end, then it died. Your statement is imprecise, Oslo said in a nasal tone. Circuits, metal and plastics do not die. At the most, they cease functioning. Saying the computer died has too many false implications. Yes, Arbiter, the Martian said. Further, Oslo said, I have not heard anything so far that demands a judgment. This is a waste of time. I disagree, the Martian said. At all costs, we must regain control of the Brezhnev. We must discover what the computer meant and beam a report about that back to Earth before we die. Oslo cocked his head, half regarding the battlesuit. Why do you speak of dying? We have defeated the rogue computer. We have won. The Martian chuckled dryly. That is illogical, Arbiter. What caused the computer to go rogue in the first place? Him, Oslo said, using the gun to point at John. I doubt that, the Martian said. I believe an alien entity is the culprit. What alien, Oslo demanded. You keep speaking about an alien without any proof of one. I believe the proof is in the Neptune system, the Martian said. Why would you say this? Because we have been unable to speak to anyone in the Neptune system, the Martian said. Our rogue computer blocked all transmissions. That is an imprecise statement. We managed to send a signal to our task force. And? asked Oslo. Nothing, the Martian said. That doesn't mean- Soon after hearing nothing, the Martian continued, we detected heavy jamming. This time Oslo fully faced the battlesuit. You did not say anything about enemy jamming. That proves he- At the last second, the Arbiter attempted to whirl back around. Maybe he heard John's stealthy approach. John plucked the gun out of Oslo's grasp, shoving the smaller man. Due to the increased G's and the Arbiter's precarious balance, Oslo collapsed onto the deck plates. John was aware of the assault rifle aimed at him. He ejected the gun's magazine and the bullet in the chamber. Then he dropped the empty gun and shoved it across the floor with a foot. He might have handed the Arbiter his gun back as an act of bravado, but the secret policeman might have extra magazines on his person. I have made my decision, Oslo said angrily. 
My judgment is that he must die. Kill him, he told the Martian. The battlesuit lowered the assault rifle. I have judged, Oslo said as he climbed up to perch again on his good foot. I order you to kill him. Such an act is against my primary tenets, the Martian said. This is an outrage, Oslo said. You begged for a judgment, now you must abide by my orders. Why don't you think for once, the Martian asked. We're stranded in deep space in a nearly derelict battleship. An alien enemy has invaded the solar system. We must join forces, not bicker with each other. This alien possesses technology far in advance of ours. What alien? Oslo shouted, his face turning red. You keep speaking about one, but there is no evidence of these fantastic creatures. What we are witnessing is a Neptunian plot. We know the Neptunians are uninhibited capitalist technologists. How otherwise could they render such a powerful battleship as ours inoperative? You are not reasoning correctly, the Martian said. If the Neptunians had such power, why didn't they deploy it at the Battle of Nereid? Because we surprised them, Oslo shouted. The Martian made tisking sounds. Really, she asked. We decelerated for over a month to lower our velocity, and the supposedly technologically superior Neptunians failed to see that. That makes no sense at all. If your fabled aliens exist, why did neither side spot them? Oslo asked. The Martian made another exasperated sound through the helmet speaker. That's why the three of us must go to the command deck. I have the evidence there that I need to show you. Then, if the Admiral yet lives, we can make our plans concerning the best way to react to the new development. Oslo was shaking his head. No, 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 no! First, you must shoot the Space Marine. If you are too squeamish, you must vacate the battlesuit and allow me to do so. John had one hand behind his back, firmly gripping the box cutter. Don't you understand yet? The Martian asked Oslo. What? The secret policeman snapped. Our battleship has lost almost all its initial velocity. Once that happens, where do you think the Brezhnev will go? The Arbiter became pale. What are you talking about? The rogue computer caused the Brezhnev to break so the battleship could return to the Neptune system. We're headed back toward the last known sighting of the alien invader. Chapter 10 The battle-suited Martian cradled Sapir Oslo while John brought up the rear. He'd re-shouldered the power pack and held the laser torch. Unfortunately, the increased G's had turned the unit into an intolerable burden. John sweated as the straps dug into his shoulders. After several more steps, he realized that this was too much for his fatigued muscles. He unbuckled the belt and let the pack slip off his shoulders. The unit thudded onto the deck plates behind him. The battle-suited Martian turned. We might need that soon. I'm beat, John said. If you want to carry it, go ahead. The Martian took her time, answering. No, we know where to get it. Oslo remained silent. He'd quit talking after the Martian had told him he couldn't have his gun back. He'd pouted at first. Then his demeanor had changed, and John realized the secret policeman had begun plotting again. The man wouldn't be happy until he shot him. Did the Arbiter lack human feelings? He'd saved the little prick's life several times already, and this was the thanks he got. Using a sleeve, John wiped sweat from his brow. The Martian faced forward and began clomping. How much farther is it? John said, following her. A few more corridors, the Martian replied. The size of the Leonid Brezhnev was fantastic. Neptune did not possess anything remotely this huge. Most of the NSN warships controlled drones, which did the real fighting. John's eyebrows rose. He was remembering more. The only close-in, heavily armored NSN fighters were Space Marine launch ships. Is that what the regiment had become? Neptune Navy Space Marines. He couldn't quite remember, but the thought was there. With the looming war against Earth, the NSN had inducted the regiment directly into its military. It hadn't been a mercenary contract, 
but an involuntary draft. Finally, the battlesuit squeezed between two frozen hatches, which slid sideways instead of up and down like most hatches. The stench of death hit John right away. Lasers had roasted human flesh in here. Buckets of blood had splashed everywhere. He followed the battlesuit onto the command deck. It was huge, like everything else on the Brezhnev. Caked blood and gore covered the controls, bulkheads, deck, and ceiling. He spied at least 30 corpses and a handful of shot up fighting bots. The fighting robots were cylindrical shaped and the height of a man. This type used three legs for maneuver. Most had gun ports and could expel an incredible amount of machine gun fire. One was the laser bot responsible for much of the carnage, no doubt having beamed a military grade weapon. The robots must have surprised the command personnel. Among the dead were shot up battlesuits with corpses inside them. The last moving battlesuit picked its way with care. Finally, the seven foot suit came to a raised area before the dull main screen. A woman in a green and blue uniform lay there on her back. She shuddered, gasping for air. Bloody bandages were wound around her midsection. Her face had turned waxen. She's alive, Oslo said in a muffled voice, with a sleeve held before his mouth and nose. No doubt he couldn't stand the smell. The Martian gingerly set him down. Oslo collapsed onto his butt. He looked exhausted, and he hadn't even been walking. John quietly picked up a handgun laying on the deck plates and shoved it behind himself, tucking it between his shirt and pants. He kept away from the other three so they wouldn't notice. Admiral Cheyenne, the Martian said. The Admiral raised her head before letting it thump back down. She raised a bloody hand next. The battlesuit froze in a forward motion. Clasps began unlatching. Soon, the back of the battlesuit parted like a splitting cocoon. A thin woman in a black skin suit climbed out of the suit. The Martian had long dark hair and brown inquisitive eyes. She held a computer tablet and wore a small belt with a holster and a medikit attached. John was surprised she'd maneuvered the battlesuit so well. The suits were made for men weighing from 160 to 205 pounds and from 5'8 to 6 foot in height. The Martian was barely 5'2 if she stretched, and maybe 105. As the mentalist approached Admiral Cheyenne, the Arbiter stirred where he sat. Oslo awkwardly maneuvered himself upright, hopping toward the open battlesuit. John watched the policeman to see what he would do. The Arbiter kept watching the mentalist. The Martian knelt beside the Admiral, whispering to her. Oslo was almost to the back of the battlesuit when he glanced at John. John grinned at the bastard. The Arbiter kept his features deadpan. Then he moved faster yet for the battlesuit entrance. John drew the gun, aiming it at Oslo as he shook his head. As soon as the Arbiter saw the gun, he froze. Look, he said a moment later, I have drawn him out. The Space Marine has rearmed. The Martian looked up at John, noticed the gun, and looked at the Arbiter. It seemed she took in the open battlesuit. Finally, she gave her full attention back to the Admiral. Do you see? Oslo asked her. Go join the mentalist, John said. You are not in authority here. John laughed. He'd given the secret policeman a chance. Now he could shoot the bastard in good conscience. The Arbiter seemed to divine John's intentions. With ill grace, Oslo hopped away from the battlesuit, soon kneeling beside the admiral. John came closer to the trio. You can put your gun away, the Martian said sadly. You're not thinking logically, John told her. She regarded him, and it seemed as if wheels turned in her mind. If the Arbiter finds a weapon, he will shoot you. Your safest course is to kill him. I understand that. What you don't understand is that we're going to need the battleship's codes. Those are contained in the Arbiter's brain. Thus, you must remain vigilant as we keep him alive. Are you on the Neptunian side? Oslo asked in a sulky voice. I'm on humanity's side, the Martian said sadly. That means I hope to keep you alive. It appears you refuse to understand the mercenary's predicament. 
For his regiment's sake, he should kill you. I doubt you're ready to die, though. Why do you speak of dying? Oslo asked. The final authority is mine once the admiral passes. In theory, you're correct, the Martian said. In reality, you're wrong at the moment. I urge you to adjust to the ever-changing situation. The Arbiter stared at her until his features stiffened angrily. I would think a GSB agent would be a realist of the First Order, the Martian said. How otherwise have the secret police maintained power all this time? John stepped nearer as the two spoke. Blood soaked the Admiral's stomach bandage and pooled on either side of her. She'd lost far too much blood. Without a transfusion, she would die soon. I purged the computer, the Martian told the Admiral. The Admiral coughed, tried to speak, and coughed up blood. The Martian looked up in distress at John. He came closer yet. The increased G's must be killing the Admiral faster than earlier. Her body was too weak to endure the greater pressure. At that moment, the Admiral shuddered, jerking her head. She stiffened before her head lolled to the side. At that point, her entire body seemed to deflate. Admiral Cheyenne of the Leonid Brezhnev joined the rest of her bridge crew in death. Chapter 11 After a short pause, perhaps of mourning, perhaps as he contemplated a new ploy, Sapir Oslo looked up. The Admiral's passing is regrettable, the Arbiter said. She was a noble woman fighting for a just cause. We will miss her wisdom. Sadly, I must now take up the reins of command. In this dire hour, I hereby take up the duty of Chief Commando. I will enter the battle suit. You're forgetting something, John said, interrupting. I have a gun. You don't. That means I'm in charge. The Martian ignored both of them as she struggled to her feet. She went to one of the previous dead and removed the man's uniform jacket. She returned to Admiral Cheyenne, staring down at the corpse as tears welled in her eyes. I am not religious, the Martian said slowly, although I do see the utility of religion. It gives the masses a moral compass they might otherwise lack. It can also give the practitioners solace in death. That is strange, is it not? Why does man need the belief that something lies beyond death? I cannot believe that evolution foisted the idea upon humanity. It is odd, but I can almost see that this belief is a sign of something greater than man that lies beyond the physical senses. I find myself wanting to believe the Admiral's soul has gone to a better place. She gently covered the Admiral's face. The Martian regarded John. What do you believe regarding the afterlife? The question unsettled John. What? he said. Is there something more to life? the Martian asked. Does something greater lie on the other side of death? Why ask me? John said. Because I already know the Arbiter's thinking, the Martian said. I find your statement presumptuous, Oslo declared. You believe in a higher power? the Martian asked the Arbiter. Don't be absurd, Oslo said. I am a strict rationalist. There is matter, and that ends the discussion. Why do people feel the need to believe otherwise? The Martian asked him. You're wasting time, Oslo said. I have already declared myself in charge of the vessel. Now I will enter the battle suit. I've already told you that's not going to happen, John said. Please, the Martian said, stop your bickering for just a moment. We must say a word for the deceased admiral. I already said a word for the admiral, Oslo informed her. I know you did. Maybe that's what started me thinking. Why did you do that? John noticed a burning quality to the Martian's eyes as she spoke. What exactly was bothering the mentalist? Oslo shrugged indifferently. In truth, I spoke as a gesture of goodwill. I sensed an emotional attachment on your part toward the admiral. I have heard that such emotional attachments are rare among mentalists. Why should I feel this way about the admiral? The Martian asked. I do not enjoy the sadness. It serves no useful purpose. 
In fact, it thwarts our present purpose by delaying us. Exactly, Oslo said. So if we could- That causes me to question the situation more deeply, the Martian said, as if she hadn't heard the Arbiter's words. What is the utility of this sadness? Why do most people feel it at a time like this? I can come to only one reasonable conclusion. What's that? John asked, finding that he was curious regarding her answer. The Martian regarded him as she wiped her eyes. I have begun to wonder if the powers behind reality have caused humans this feeling. These powers are warning us in this moment. They are telling us that there is something more to life, to reality, than mere material existence. They are saying, in effect, that souls exist and live beyond our physical life. When you say powers, John said, you're talking about God. That is one name for the powers, the Martian agreed. You're also talking about heaven and hell, John said. You're religious, then? I guess so, John said, remembering some of the things the chaplain used to tell him. He looked down at the dead admiral, her face covered by the jacket. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, John quoted. May her soul go up to God in heaven. May she find peace from the turmoil of this life. Amen, he finished. Thank you, the Martian said softly. That was beautiful and poignant. She turned away from them, wiping her eyes once more. The Arbiter seemed impatient, but he held his peace. John studied the dead admiral. He looked at the other corpses. He didn't want to be on the command deck anymore. He didn't like thinking about stuff like this. It made him feel funny. He'd done plenty of hard things in his life. Some might call them wrong things. The chaplain had called such things sin. Would God judge him for his sins? Are we done here? John asked. The metalist faced him, and she appeared quizzical. Why are you upset? We've got to do something, John said. We can't waste time just standing around. I suppose you're right, she said. By the way, my name is Gloria Sanchez. I am of the ninth level. I did not get your name. John Hawkins of the Black Anvil Regiment, he said. Gloria seemed to be avoiding looking at the Admiral's corpse. She pulled up her tablet as if she wanted to show them something. Do we have to stay here? John asked. For the moment, Gloria said. If you're finding the presence of the dead uncomfortable, I suggest you block their existence from your thinking. Is that what you're doing? John asked. Yes, she said in a clipped manner. The mentalist's features altered subtly. They became more wooden, almost mask-like. I need to show you something, Gloria said. John glanced at the arbiter before he said, I don't want to crowd around your tablet. I don't trust him enough to do that. I saved his life and he's shown me no gratitude for it. I think he's evil, capable of any action in order to get his way. Evil is a moral judgment, Gloria said. I try to avoid those. Facts interest me, not feelings. Still, your unease does you credit. The Arbiter is an opportunist of the First Order, with his objectives always uppermost in his thinking. Insulting me is a bad idea, Oslo told her. But there was no insult intended, Gloria said. I spoke fact. Do you disagree with my assessment concerning you? I have sworn to uphold the Solar League, Oslo said. You took a similar oath, or have you forgotten? She turned away from them and the corpse, approaching the blank main screen. What I want to show you is small. You might not see it on my tablet. The main screen would be better. I pulled the data from the ship's sensors just before the computer made its first attack. It's why I've suspected alien interference. I'm going to enter the battle suit, Oslo told John. John grinned nastily. The bastard wanted to play this kind of game, huh? That was fine with him. He was going to enjoy smacking the creep around. If the policeman suddenly became too dangerous, he'd kill him in good conscience. Be my guest, John said. Oslo eyed him warily. You'll no longer object to that. I'm a prisoner, remember? Oslo held out his good hand. Give me your gun. Sure, John said, stepping closer. 
I'm gonna use the butt to hit you in the head. Will that work for you? Oslo dropped his outstretched arm, hopping away from John. Have you changed your mind about the battle suit? John asked in seeming innocence. Mentalist, Oslo said. Do you see what you've unleashed? Gloria crouched underneath a control panel, having removed a bottom plate. Please, she told John. We need him, remember? You must hold your bloodthirsty nature in check for now. John laughed at Oslo, raising the gun, aiming it at the secret policeman. If you try any of your tricks, bam, you're dead. Do you understand? Oslo turned away as if John was beneath his notice. For an instant, John put pressure against the trigger. The Arbiter was a snake. If he dropped his guard, Oslo was sure to kill him. Given such a situation, it was just a matter of time before the secret policeman aimed a gun at him. Neither a man, nor a regiment, nor a country could win if it played defense all the time. To win, one had to take the offense eventually. Why risk this needless danger with a known ungrateful cur? No, the mentalist said, looking up from where she worked. How many times must I tell you that we need him? Reluctantly, John lowered the gun and waited. Oslo waited as well, and the mentalist worked. Suddenly, the main screen flickered into life. I think I have it, Gloria said. She stood up, tapping the controls and twisting a dial. The main screen showed space with myriads of stars. The blue object was bigger than when John had seen it from the observation dome. That's the ice giant Neptune, Gloria said. If I speed up the recording, you'd see it dwindle in size. The Brezhnev was accelerating away from the gravitational system at the time I downloaded the data. She looked up at the screen as if waiting. There, she said suddenly. Do you see it? Both John and Oslo looked at her in confusion. She twisted her mouth and manipulated the control board. The image on the main screen froze. Slowly, a red circle surrounded a bright dot that could have been a star. You both notice that, I hope, she said. What is it? John asked. She examined the control panel with its green and red lighting. With some care, she tapped here and there. The bright dot grew in size, becoming fuzzier as it did. Finally, it became evident that a dark, undeterminable spaceship ejected a massive and hot exhaust. When did you record this? Oslo asked. As I said earlier, Gloria replied, I downloaded this from the sensors just before the computer started attacking us. The vessel seems to be approaching Neptune from deep space, Oslo said. That is correct, the mentalist said. The Arbiter's features became thoughtful. Am I to presume you have discovered relevant data regarding the unknown vessel? I know a little bit about it, she admitted. Would you like to hear what I've learned? By all means, Oslo said. You have my undivided attention. The exhaust is from a matter-antimatter reaction, she said. Impossible, Oslo said. No one has such a propulsion system. Our fastest ships use fusion power. It's the same with the Neptunians. Precisely, Gloria said. No human group has built a matter-antimatter propulsion system. I have numbered that as the first datum point. The second is the vessel's size. I would have worked that out immediately, but we had other things on our mind. Roughly, the ship is a spheroid with a 100-kilometer diameter. That is datum point number two. 100 kilometers, asked Oslo in amazement. The mentalist nodded. That is the second impossibility, the arbiter declared. The Brezhnev is less than a kilometer long, and it is the largest military vessel in existence. Only a few of the biggest freighters have more interior volume. Now you are beginning to understand why I suspect this is an alien vessel. Oslo rubbed his jaw. It could be a Neptunian ship, he said. It could be a secret project spaceship. I know you're privy to the secret intelligence files concerning the NSN, Gloria said. Those files contain nothing regarding a secret project super ship. Oslo looked at her sharply. How would you know what those files hold? I wouldn't tell you under different circumstances, Gloria replied, but I'm privy to those files as well. Explain how this happened. 
Please, Gloria said. That should be obvious. She hacked into the GSB security files, John told the Arbiter. Even I can see that. Is this true? An outraged Oslo asked the mentalist. More or less, she said. But that's espionage, Oslo declared. You must be a foreign agent. I have a fault, I'm afraid, Gloria said. I have a hole in my mind. The hole represents the things I do not know, which leaves me feeling barren and unsatisfied. I desire to fill the hole with figures and endless facts. Thus, I learn whatever I can. That would include all the secret files aboard the Brezhnev's former computer system. You will be shot, Oslo told her. First, you will undergo intense interrogation so the GSB can discover your accomplices. The mentalist stamped a foot. Would you use your mind for once? Look at the screen. You're likely viewing an alien spacecraft, an immense vessel with superior technology. Certainly it has a superior propulsion system. You don't think such a craft would take two years to reach Earth, do you? Osla stared at the main screen. Slowly, his anger and disgust transformed into worry. Do you have anything more? I do, Gloria said, but it isn't normally visible. Hmm. Let me turn radio signals into yellow lines. She sat at the panel and began to adjust the settings. Finally, she looked up. Wavy yellow lines appeared. The Locus was the shadowy spaceship. Those lines reached out to the Brezhnev. They also reached out to the Neptune gravitational system, splintering to reach innumerable points. I don't understand, Oslo said. Those yellow lines are radio signals. Yes, Gloria said. The aliens tried to contact us, the Arbiter asked. I don't think so, Gloria said. If the Brezhnev is an example, the aliens attempted to contact our computer. They successfully did so, setting the computer against us. Why would aliens do this? Oslo asked. Gloria gave a sharp bark of amusement. If we once again use the Brezhnev as the example, the alien desire becomes obvious. They wanted our computer to kill us, to render the battleship inoperative. Is that true? John asked her. Gloria gave him a penetrating stare. Do you have another theory? I don't know if you'd call it a theory, John said. The computer tried to kill us, right? That doesn't necessarily make the Brezhnev inoperative. Couldn't that also turn an SLN warship into a possible drone ally for the aliens? Gloria seemed to stare into space. Yes, she said a moment later. But that makes the aliens even more dangerous than I suspected. Wait a minute, Oslo said. You said you detected jamming before. Who was doing the jamming? It couldn't have been the alien vessel. Why couldn't it? The mentalist asked. Notice the ship's distance from the Neptune system. Hold it, Gloria ordered. She began manipulating the control panel in earnest. The circle left the bright object as the entire stellar image shrank back to its normal size. The star scene changed quickly now. What are you doing? Oslo asked. Trying to gauge the vessel's velocity, Gloria said. The Brezhnev only had this momentary glance of it. Ah, look. What have you discovered? Oslo asked. Given the bright exhaust from the matter-antimatter engine and the distance moved from one scene to the next, it's decelerating at something around 75 Gs. That's impossible, Oslo said. It would be if the ship had human passengers, Gloria said. Those are aliens. Can they withstand 75 Gs? That seems highly unlikely. Yet who knows what other kinds of technological advances they have. Why not something that can control apparent gravity within the ship? My point is the alien vessel appears, or appeared, to be moving at a fantastic velocity. It must have waited for the last moment to decelerate. It must have done so in order to remain hidden from our sensors for as long as possible. You think these aliens are trying to hide a spaceship 100 kilometers wide? Oslo jeered. Compared to the volume of space, Gloria said, 100 kilometers is nothing. As long as the vessel remains dark, how would any human notice its advance? No, 
The aliens meant to get in close, unobserved. The aliens sent messages, we must assume, to all the various computers in the Neptune system. Did the aliens cause the other computers to turn on their humans as well? Oslo grew pale. That would be a disaster. Yes, Gloria said. Their vessel was decelerating at 75 Gs, given its distance from the ice giant at the time I recorded this. The giant warship should almost be within the Neptune system by now. The Arbiter kept staring at the main screen. Finally, he turned to Gloria. What are we going to do? That is an excellent question. I propose we weigh our choices carefully. But I don't know how long we're going to have to do that. What? Oslo asked. Why? I told you before, she said. The Brezhnev has been decelerating for some time. Soon we will no longer have any velocity inward. Instead, we will begin to accelerate, heading back for the Neptune system and the alien supership waiting there. Chapter 12 I have the answer, John said. The Arbiter spun toward him. I don't know how many of us you put into deep freeze, John said, but it's time to thaw out the regiment. They're the Brezhnev's new crew. Never, Oslo declared. This is an SLN battleship. I will never willingly give it over to the NSN. You're wrong on two counts, Gloria said. This was an SLN battleship. It's the next thing to a space hulk now. You won't be giving up anything anymore. The weapon systems still work, Oslo said. Without the computer, how do you think you're going to fire at anything over a few kilometers away? What is the second problem? Oslo asked. You no longer have a choice, Gloria said. You're no longer in control. He is. He has the gun and the willingness to use it. Oslo stared at her for some time. Finally, he shook his head. You chose to come out of the battle suit at an interesting moment. You did it so you would no longer be in charge. You have dodged your responsibility because you wanted to thwart me, but didn't have the courage to do it yourself. The mentalist looked down. This is treason, the Arbiter declared. No, Gloria said, looking up again. If I'm right, aliens have invaded the solar system. That changes everything. And if you're wrong, Oslo asked. Tell me who owns the asteroid-sized spaceship. I was born and trained to reach rational conclusions, even those conclusions that others cannot conceive. The Arbiter didn't stare at her as long this time. You told the Space Marine I've memorized critical ship codes. That wasn't a slip on your part, was it? I told him so he wouldn't shoot you, Gloria said. Sapir Oslo made a weird rhythmic noise. John finally realized it was laughter. No, 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 Oslo said, wagging an index finger at her. You are cunning and you are hyper-intelligent, but you are a poor liar. You need the codes so the Brezhnev can fight. The Brezhnev is practically useless, unless you want to ram it against something. Oslo's eyes narrowed as he regarded the mentalist. If the Brezhnev can't fight, why do you need my security codes? I'll tell you why. First, we need to thaw out the other space marines. I'll never agree to that. Gloria thought about it. She shook her head after a time. It almost seemed as if she argued against herself. Finally, she sighed and turned to John. You might as well kill him, she said. He's no more use to us like this. In fact, he's only a danger now. John smiled grimly, raised the gun, aiming it at the Arbiter. Wait, Oslo cried. Perhaps, perhaps I was hasty. Let us see these space marines. Maybe you have a point after all. If aliens have invaded, no matter how reluctant I am to the idea, we must unite against them. John glanced at the mentalist. I too may have judged too hastily, she said. Let us return to the cryo chamber and see what we can accomplish. She turned to John. I won't last long under these G's. Do you mind if I re-enter the battlesuit? John considered the request, wondering if her words just now were a blind. Maybe she'd come out of the battlesuit by mistake. Maybe she was more emotional than she let on. Now she needed the suit to overpower him. The Martian waited as if letting him figure things out for himself. 
That proved a more powerful argument than if she'd tried to talk him into it. John believed in trusting his gut. He believed she believed that hostile aliens had entered the Neptune system. Given that, they needed each other. Go ahead, he said. She climbed in through the back of the suit, shoving her legs in first. After putting her head and arms in, she activated the controls. The suit closed and its locks snapped shut. Soon, the battlesuit righted itself and the assault rifle rose. Sapir Oslo grew keenly interested. The helmet speaker crackled. Do you want a lift? She asked the arbiter. His narrow shoulders deflated. He nodded a moment later. Maybe he'd been wondering the same thing John had. The rising rifle might have led the arbiter to believe the Martian had tricked the space marine. Now the secret policeman realized she'd spoken honestly. Together, they marched out of the command chamber and headed for the cryo chamber. Chapter 13 John was sweating again from the grueling pace. The battlesuit clomped remorselessly down the corridors ahead of him, with the arbiter cradled in her powered left arm. John debated calling out, asking for a lift. Sitting like that, though, against the battlesuit's arm, grated against him. He was a soldier. Before that, he'd been a stainless steel rat in the deep tunnels of New London Dome. Neither soldier nor gang rat would willingly consent to ride like a baby in a woman's arm. Thus, John Hawkins pushed himself, finding the G's difficult. How long were they going to leave the engines roaring so strongly? As he collected himself, letting his stubbornness gather strength, more of John's memories flooded back into his consciousness. He remembered what the regiment had become. The Neptune War Council had decided on the coming strategy. A swift comparison between fleets had shown the Council the hopelessness of winning a direct ship-to-ship -ship engagement. The SLN task force had more warships and of greater individual tonnage and weaponry. The NSN would be badly outclassed. That meant that the Neptune system navy would have to employ other means to win. Stealth seemed like a key ingredient for whatever they decided. They would use cunningly placed stealth mines. The NSN had sheathed thermonuclear warheads in black ice, which lacked a thermal signature. The black color would hinder any SLN teleoptics from spotting it. That should mean the task force would not spot the mines until they exploded. The second stealth attack would come from Space Marine assault shuttles. The assault shuttles would secretly maneuver from behind various moons, sliding near the targeted warships. Space Marines would gather on the attack shuttle's hulls and leap for the nearby enemy, using thruster packs to close faster and break right at the end. Like ancient pirates from Earth's history, the Space Marines would land on enemy hulls, force the outer hatches, and enter the vessels. Then it would merely be a matter of overpowering the surprised crew. The stealth boarding was supposed to serve a double purpose— the Space Marines would knock out an enemy vessel and add it to the NSN fleet. Unfortunately, such a risky maneuver had little chance of success. Thus, the NSN War Council had decided to use foreigners as the Space Marines instead of native Neptunians. The Black Anvil Regiment had seemed perfect for such a task. Thus, once inducted into the Neptune Navy, the regiment had found itself engaged in battlesuit and assault shuttle practice under zero-G conditions. As one of the better-rated units, the regiment had found itself in a reserve formation. Before they entered their stealth shuttles, the colonel had requested an update on the fleet action. When he'd come back from the briefing, the colonel had given a hidden signal. The regiment implemented an emergency drill, taking over the hidden base. The captured and collected Neptunian MPs had called the drill treason. The colonel had appeared unfazed by the accusation. The NSN has already lost the battle. You can see that easily enough. We must fight on regardless, the NSN major had replied. My men are not kamikazes or jihadists, the colonel had informed the major. We are mercenaries for hire. You voided our normal contract by refusing to pay our fees. You declared a system-wide emergency and forcefully inducted us into your military. Perhaps you knew, and perhaps you didn't. 
but that went against the mercenary code as practiced in the Saturn system. You should have made your objections known at the time, the Major said. You have a slight point, the Colonel said. So at first blush, your suggestion seems like the honorable action. However, the soldiers of the Black Anvil Regiment are my adopted sons, and according to the mercenary code, I am responsible for their welfare, for their very lives. You suggest that it was right for the Neptune military to act dishonorably against us and then expect honorable action from us. I disagree profoundly. You cannot expect a man to hold to an oath given while a gun is pointed at his head. You'll pay for your treachery. You may be right, the colonel said. Yet I will certainly pay with my men's lives if I attempt the NSN's insane plan. That is the greater sin. Surely you can see that. No. The colonel had exhaled through his nostrils. This is my curse. I can understand your feelings. I even admit that your point troubles me. The silver-haired colonel shrugged. Nevertheless, I have decided, and I will stand by my decision. Later, SLN Space Marines had landed on the secret base. The regiment soon entered into a forced confinement and then found itself shipped to the Leonid Brezhnev, there required to go into the cryo chamber. As John struggled to keep up with the battlesuit, a thought began to trouble him. Why had he come out first from cryo sleep? The Arbiter had said he wanted the man who could solve the secret attack against the battleship's main computer. Wouldn't the Colonel be that person? What did it mean that he, John Hawkins, had first come out of cryosleep? Hey, he said. The Martian halted, turning around. The speaker crackled into life. I'm sorry, Gloria said. I'm going too fast. I forgot about the greater G's bothering you. I admit I'm tired, John said. That isn't why I called out. Oh, Gloria said. How come I came out of cryosleep first? Beg pardon? She asked. John explained his dilemma. Arbiter? Asked Gloria. Can you shed any light on this? That is odd, Oslo muttered. Did the computer make a mistake? I agree it should have thought out the colonel first. Let me consider this, Gloria said. No, she said a moment later. I don't know why you thought out first, but I have a suspicion as to the reason. Shoot, John said. The faceplate stared at him. Tell me, John said. The colonel must have traded places when you originally entered the cryo units. John rubbed his forehead. He seemed to recall something of that nature. Gloria was right. The colonel must have traded places as a precaution for his own safety. I'm sorry, Gloria said. For what? John asked. She hesitated and finally turned back around. Soon, she began clomping again, although she didn't move as fast as before. John hurried after the battle suit. He could remember now, the colonel quietly telling him to unobtrusively trade places. He'd understood the thinking. The colonel was the regiment's father. He, John Hawkins, was an officer cadet. A cadet should accept greater risk in order to protect the regiment's brain and soul. If someone on the SLN battleship wanted to hurt the colonel during transit, that someone would now harm John, leaving the colonel intact. In the end, it would have been better if the colonel had woken up first. The colonel would have done more and better than he'd done. Still, he hadn't done too badly. He defeated the secret policeman and defeated the rogue repair bot. Now he had to make sure the regiment thawed out and took over the derelict Leonid Brezhnev. Chapter 14 John heard the clangs before he saw the bot. Could the same repair bot as before still be trying to hammer through the closed hatch? He hustled to catch up with the others. He turned a corner in the corridor. The clangs had stopped. The former repair bot whirled around on its multi-treads. It seemed to regard the battlesuit and arbiter. Then the treads whirred as the bot charged. The heavy assault rifle came up. It hissed, and a stream of five-millimeter saboed needles stitched into the bot. 
they hit with accelerated force, punching through the metal casing. The bot whirled in a circle and toppled a second later. The pincers opened and closed with muted clacks. The Martian hosed another round of needles, no doubt for insurance. The repair bot hissed as sparks flew. Then the skeletal mechanical arms froze and the bot died, or ceased to function, as Oslo preferred them to say. The battlesuit marched past the bot, kicking it out of the way. Gloria brought Oslo before the small control pad that was located to the hatch's upper right. Oslo typed in the security code. Gloria shoved open the hatch and marched through into the adjoining corridor. In moments, she reached the cryo chamber hatch. She lowered her left arm, letting the arbiter stand. John panted as he reached them. If they were going to live on this wreck for long, they were going to have to reduce thrust or fix the gravity dampeners. Oslo composed himself before regarding Gloria. I hope you'll allow me one more plea. I have been pondering the problem. John bit his tongue. He'd given the power back to Gloria when he'd let her climb into the battlesuit. Better to wait and see what her attitude would be. I've pondered the problem longer than you have, Gloria answered. We need bodies. She raised a big mechanical arm, pointing with a gloved finger. Those are the last bodies left on the ship besides us. How do you know this to be true? Oslo asked. I don't know it perfectly, she admitted. Interesting. Let us search. No, John said, interrupting. We thaw out the regiment now. Oslo lifted his eyebrows and feigned surprise. I see. You're in charge of the Brezhnev, are you? You know better than a Martian mentalist. You can simply order us to dance as your puppets. No, I do not believe the mentalist is going to allow you to order her like a dog. I'm not a dog, Gloria said. I should say not, Oslo said. You're the one who- Please, she told Oslo. That's not going to work on me. We need the regiment, but they're opposed to the fundamental principles of social justice, Oslo said, interrupting. How can we trust- No more, Gloria said. Will you begin the process or not? Sapir Oslo regarded the battlesuit a few seconds longer. Finally, his shoulders deflated. I will begin the process. However, this is not the place to do so. The control facility is over there. You're sure? Gloria asked. I know about the security procedures, yes, Oslo said. A feeling of doubt filled John. There was something off here. Why can't we go in and do it manually, he asked. Oslo shrugged. Of course you can if you want. That will take hours, though. I was under the impression you wanted it done right away. John glanced at the battlesuit. Hours. Maybe they should decrease the engine's thrust first. Hurry to the control chamber, Gloria said, as I have the awful feeling that time runs against us. Before Oslo could take his first hop there, Gloria scooped him up and marched to the neighboring hatch. John debated waiting here. He was beat, but the worry in him finally grew too strong. By the time he reached the hatch, the arbiter had opened it and gone inside. I'll wait here, Gloria told John. I don't feel like getting out of the suit just yet and facing the G's on my own. John nodded, following the arbiter into the room. It was a small control area with video links above. Those were presently blank. Oslo glanced at him with distaste. The arbiter had already seated himself. You really shouldn't be in here. Yeah, well, those are the brakes, John said. The arbiter made a disdainful sound through his nose as he began to adjust the panel. Lights appeared. Screens activated and heat began to blow from a vent. Hmm, Oslo said. John looked up at the screens. It showed various angles from the cryo chamber, the countless frost-covered coffins. Abruptly, the screens went dark. What happened, John said. Excuse me, Oslo asked lightly. John squinted at the arbiter. What he heard in the secret policeman's tone went back to his days as a new London gang enforcer. There was a palpable sense of deceit in the arbiter. Get the video feed back up, John said. Naturally, Oslo said. John watched as the arbiter tapped one control, adjusted another. A warning klaxon made them both jump. 
What was that? John demanded. I'm not sure, the arbiter said. John heard the lie in the man's voice. He drew his gun and shoved the end of the barrel against the arbiter's head. Give me the video feed or you're dead. Killing me is a bad idea, Oslo said. So I made a little mistake. Now, shouted John as he shoved the gun harder against Oslo's head. You're up to something. Make the klaxon stop. By all means, Oslo said. Dots of sweat had appeared on the secret policeman's face. He examined the panel and finally tapped a button. The klaxon abruptly quit. John felt a moment's peace. Then he noticed a blinking red light to the side of the panel that did not stop. A bad feeling erupted in his gut. You bastard, John said. He grabbed the back of the arbiter's collar, hauling him upright. With the gun pressed against the arbiter's head, John shoved him toward the exit. I insist on better treatment, Oslo said. John raised the gun. With the butt, he clouted the arbiter against the back of the head. They stumbled through the hatch together. What's wrong? Gloria asked. Carry him to the cryo chamber, John shouted. He didn't stay to see if she did. He ran as the bad feeling had gotten worse. Before reaching the hatch, he heard the klaxons from inside the chamber. No, John shouted. It took him three tries before he pressed the switch that opened the hatch. Freezing air billowed out. At the same time, flashing red lights and a blaring klaxon erupted from the icy chamber. John rushed to the colonel's unit. Red warning lights flashed on the upper left-hand corner. Inside the unit, the colonel twitched. His skin had turned a terrible blue color. John dropped his gun and began searching for a control. There were a mass of them to the side. Picking up the gun, with his heart racing, he charged the others in the corridor. Gloria still held Oslo. What did you do? John shouted. Why is the colonel dying? Capitalist scum, Oslo sneered. Do you think I would willingly revive? John's gun roared three times, the bullets smashing Sapir Oslo's skull. John whirled away and charged back into the cryo chamber. He worked frantically on the colonel's unit, the gun dropping unheeded to the floor, his vision blinded by emotion. He wiped his eyes and continued working. Two minutes later, the Martian shuffled beside him. She stared at the unmoving colonel and then at John. Your colonel is dead, she said. We have to save the others. John stared at her starkly. He's dead, she said softly. He was probably the first to die. But I think we might be able to save some of the others. How? John asked in a deadened voice. You're not going to like it. How? He shouted. He picked up the gun and aimed at her. The sequence is clear. The system is taking out the highest ranked first. We could try to save those, but we'd keep failing. Or we can start with the lowest ranked, saving them as we climb up the ladder. You're going to lose soldiers. It's a question of how many you want to save. The world spun in John's mind. He wanted to fire at her. He wanted to curl up and die. He, I am a soldier of the Black Anvil Regiment. Everything rests on me. I can mourn the colonel later. Show me what to do, he said in an intense whisper. Follow me, she said, heading for the back units. He watched her tap controls on the farthest cryo unit. He saw how she shut off the emergency kill switch and how she began the revival procedure. She looked up at him with burning eyes. Do you understand? For an answer, he lunged to the next unit, doing exactly as she had done. He concentrated like he'd never done before. He waited to see if the soldier would wake up. When the soldier did, John leaped to the next unit, beginning the procedure over again. In his heart, he sealed off the certain knowledge that he was dooming the higher command to death. That would include the chaplain. Klaxons rang. Red lights flashed. John and Gloria went from unit to unit. He wished he'd let Sapir Oslo live so he could torture the Arbiter for the next several years. No, he whispered. He had to concentrate. He was saving lives. He revived what he could of the regiment. If he slacked in any of this, more of his fellow Black Anvil soldiers would die. He glanced at the mentalist. She worked fast, even as her features glistened with perspiration. 
She seemed so frail. She lacked heavy muscles to fight the debilitating G's. Yet she forged ahead, gritting her teeth. John would never forget this. He didn't have time for sentimentality. He had to become a machine and do his duty. He would worry about the future later. He would mourn his comrades another time. Now he had to work. In the end, he and the mentalist saved over 550 Black Anvil soldiers. He was the only surviving officer, if an officer cadet counted. What could a measly five and a half hundred Saturn system mercenaries do in the scheme of an alien invasion? The Brezhnev was little better than a derelict, without a working computer system and no knowledgeable crew. They faced an unknown enemy under the stress of intense Gs as they returned to the planetary gravitational system. Things could hardly look bleaker. The colonel had been a military genius. He... John Hawkins was little more than a stainless steel rat with a few mercenary skills tossed in. Gloria shuffled near, slumping down to sit against the colonel's cryo unit where John had his head between his knees. Slowly, he raised his head, staring at her. She looked exhausted, with black circles around her eyes. Behind them, the first revived soldier thudded onto the cold deck plates. It's up to you, she said. What's that supposed to mean? You're the regiment's ranking officer. John laughed bleakly. What am I supposed to do? She studied him, finally saying, you asked the right person. He stared at her, waiting for it. You should give up, she said. Huh? I urge you to surrender. An invincible alien ship is out there. Your colonel is dead. His officers perished with him. What can you do? You're too young and inexperienced. The soldiers you saved will blame you for letting the others down. I shouldn't have trusted the secret policeman, he said. Gloria nodded. That's another reason why you should quit. You made a mistake. Oslo was correct. Stop it, he said. Why? It's cruel. She laughed mirthlessly. The universe is cruel. The aliens are cruel. No doubt, as a mercenary, you already know that life is cruel. Or did you have an easy childhood? His eyes narrowed. I see, you had a rough childhood. This is too much, though. It's time for you to curl up and die. I'm sure your colonel would have agreed with that. He whirled on her as rage erupted in his eyes. He drew his hand back. He was going to slap her for saying that. She smiled coldly, silently daring him to strike her. He lowered the upraised hand. He swallowed the defeat that was consuming him. The colonel was dead, but the regiment still lived. An alien ship had come, beginning the process that had slain the colonel and the majority of the regiment. The secret policeman had won. No, John whispered, you haven't won yet. What was that? Gloria asked. He saw her anew the sweat on her features, the hollowness of her eyes. She was small, she was hyper-intelligent, and she had the brownest, most interesting eyes he'd ever seen. Will you help me? he asked. One hundred percent, she said in earnest. Just like I've been helping you from the beginning, she added. Yeah, he said as he climbed to his feet. He had 553 mercenaries. They were his responsibility now. Maybe the colonel and the chaplain were looking down from heaven to see what he would do. John looked up, traveling in his mind beyond the low metallic ceiling. Then he saluted as sharply as he could. Turning with the professional precision that he had been taught, he regarded the soldiers coming out of the cryo units. He had a job to do, a regiment to run. God help me he whispered, because I'm going to need all the help I can get. The Forging Chapter One Officer Cadet John Hawkins was in the auxiliary control room when the three sergeants floated through the hatch. The heavy G's no longer plagued them. The answer had been simple and direct. Shut off the engines. A few of the regiment's survivors had known enough, 
with the mentalist's help, to figure out the engine room controls. The derelict battleship presently floated with a shallow velocity toward the blue ice giant five million kilometers away and closing oh so slowly. John was attempting to reactivate a teleoptic sensor so they could see exactly where the battleship was headed. He was beginning to think someone would have to go outside on the hull to rewire the teleoptic sensor. With the computer's abortion, John looked up as his stomach muscles tightened. He'd been expecting this, but he'd thought he would have a few more days before a regimental council challenged his right to command. First Sergeant Stark led the way. Stark only had one name. He was a mountain of old-fashioned muscle with an almost non-existent neck. Like John, Stark had grown up on Titan, but in Bristol Dome on the other side of the moon. He'd worked on Bristol's police force, going down into the deeper tunnels to enforce city law. Stark had used a shield and baton back then, clubbing lawbreakers into submission. He'd clubbed the wrong person once. The slumlord had put out a hit on Stark and his family. The hitmen had missed the big man, but had killed his wife and kids. That night, Stark had gone down into the lower levels alone. He'd left his shield at the police station. In its place, he took a riot gun. Stark broke down the door to the slumlord's drug house and killed everyone he found, showing no mercy. He made sure the drug kingpin himself took longer to die, with every major bone in his body shattered. First Sergeant Stark had been with the regiment for 30 years now. He was huge, with a shiny bullet-shaped head and scary eyes. He'd served the colonel with unquestioning loyalty having saved William Graham's life more times than any other soldier in the regiment had done. Floating behind Stark came a sergeant everyone called the Centurion. He was the opposite of Stark. The Centurion was small, with gangly limbs and sandy-colored hair. Most of the regiment swore the Centurion had no soul and no compunction about killing anyone. He was the ultimate professional soldier. Immediately after every battle or fight, he cleaned his weapons. He demanded perfection from his men, but never yelled, never raised his voice. He spoke in whispers when he spoke at all. No one seemed to know when he had joined the regiment or what he had done before joining. No one knew if he had another name. He was the Centurion, and he was among the deadliest soldiers in the regiment. Everyone called the last sergeant the old man. He was tall and thin, with thinning hair that he religiously dyed black. He smoked a pipe most of the time. The old man was puffing on one as he sailed toward John now. He was even-tempered, known to give sage advice, and had never missed one of the chaplain's sermons. The old man had been part of the regiment before William Graham had made it his. Some of the soldiers said the old man had been one of the regiment's original soldiers over 50 years ago. They claimed he took rejuvenation treatments, had been taking them before he escaped from Earth as he fled the GSB. Out of all three sergeants, he was the only one of them that seemed as if he could have been an officer. John checked to make sure he had his gun at his side. The look on First Sergeant Stark's slab-like features told him this could get nasty fast. John gently pushed off the chair, grabbing hold of the panel as he stood. The three sergeants grabbed various chairs or panels. They'd had plenty of practice at zero-G maneuvering. They weren't space marines as such, used to fighting aboard spaceships. They'd merely traveled enough via freighter in the Saturn system back in the day to gain their space legs, as the saying went. Give us a reason not to kill you, Stark said in his low growl as his scary eyes fixed upon Hawkins. John's stomach muscles tightened so it felt as if they stretched almost to the breaking point. It seemed these three old dinosaurs had decided he had to give an accounting. Is this about the colonel? John asked. Stark cracked the knuckles of his right hand as if to get ready for a killing beating. I already told you what happened, John said. You trusted a secret policeman with the regiment's life, Stark said in an ugly voice. That was stupid. Why should we let a stupid boy tell the regiment what to do? 
John inhaled slowly through his nostrils. The desire to explain his actions precisely was practically a physical need. He wanted these three dinosaurs to understand how much pressure he'd withstood to buy them their lives. Stark, the centurion, and the old man watched him closely. No doubt they were judging his worth. He almost quailed. He respected these three. He yearned for their approval. And yet John knew he could never get it by answering direct questions like this. He was the last regimental officer standing. The knowledge of what to do went deeper than that. In his youth, he'd watched as teenagers and thugs in their twenties had jockeyed for rank and power in the gang. Weakness in any manner had meant defeat. A leader led. A follower begged others to understand him. He also recalled some of Colonel Graham's lessons on leadership. Arrogance would not help him here, although it would go farther than any type of whining. The sergeants wanted strength. They wanted someone to tell them what to do. The moment stretched until Stark glanced at the old man. The tall sergeant with his black dyed hair sucked on his pipe, blowing smoke. Well, Stark demanded of John. What's your goal? John asked suddenly. I am not asking for fancy words, Stark growled. I want a reason to leave you alive. Otherwise, I'm gonna kill you. John almost doubled over at the pain in his gut. The small centurion frowned, his left hand moving toward the sheathed knife on his belt. He'd skinned prisoners alive before. Each of those times had been ugly. The colonel had almost cashiered the centurion for his psychotic episodes. You afraid, boy? asked Stark. John managed a shrug. You stink of fear, Stark told him. You have no idea what you're doing. John's hands trembled. So he put his right hand on his holstered sidearm. He put his left hand behind his back so none of them could see it shake. Think you can quick draw that gun fast enough to kill all three of us? Stark asked. Maybe, John said. If you fail, you're going to die long and hard. You know that, right? John forced himself to smile. He might die. He might even go screaming at the end if these old timers got their way. But he might as well summon what courage he had and go out with a little flair. One thing he knew, he'd kill the centurion first. The centurion was the most dangerous and cold-blooded of the three. Massive Stark would likely lose his temper and kill him fast. The centurion nodded, almost as if he understood John's decision to kill him first. Stark cracked his other set of knuckles. You haven't given me a reason yet. Do you want to die? Is that it? Have you lost your balls without the colonel around to tell you what to do? Something cold passed over John's features. What do you want? John asked as evenly as possible. Your balls on a plate, Stark said. My heels crushing your face. I want to stomp the stupid bastard that let my colonel go into the dark night without a fight. John drew a ragged breath. He might have looked away, but that would give these dinosaurs an opening. He couldn't give them anything. He needed friends. He needed someone in the regiment to understand what he had gone through and continued to go through. But he saw that couldn't be the case with these three. Colonel Graham had told him before that leading was lonely work. A commanding officer needed a solitary streak. He also needed empathy for the soldiers under him. It was a difficult combination to balance. The colonel had told John he might have that balance. John's head twitched quickly from right to left. Look at him, Stark sneered. He's freaking out. He's practically pissing himself. The head twitch hadn't been nerves, but John shaking his head to himself. He couldn't have any friends just yet. He had a job to do. If he failed, he would be letting the colonel down. A new feeling of fierceness welled up in Hawkins. He would not let these three old men bluster him. If they killed him, they would kill him as military mutineers. John drew his gun and slammed the butt against the panel three times like a gavel. Stark had a palm pistol he'd concealed in his big hand. He aimed the pistol at John. 
A centurion gripped a knife, holding it down low by his left leg. He seemed ready to hurl the knife at him, the point no doubt meant to sink into his throat. The old man still puffed on his pipe, watching John with a gleam in his dark eyes, although he aimed a heavy revolver at John with the other hand. I'm calling the meeting to order, John said. What meeting, Stark sneered. John gave the big man the coldest look he could manage under the circumstances. This is a regimental council meeting per the mercenary code, as we practiced in the Saturn system. Without rules and discipline, we'll become a mob. I refuse to let that happen. I am the present commanding officer, as I am the only officer left. You three will represent the men. John stopped himself before asking if that would suit them. Stark glanced at the centurion. Both of them looked at the old man. The old man holstered his sidearm and took the pipe out of his mouth. We're here to judge you, son. Fine, John said. But you'll do it under the regimental council meeting as per the mercenary code. If you insist on mutiny, well, that's something you'd better tell me right off. Who said anything about mutiny? growled Stark. You're holding a weapon as if to shoot your commanding officer. You think you're the commanding officer, Stark jeered. Until otherwise notified, yes, John said. I might add that you can make such a notification during the regimental meeting if you follow the proper procedures. Screw the procedures, Stark snarled. I see, John said as he shoved the gun back into its holster. You blacken the colonel's memory with your actions. Stark hurled himself at John, sailing the short distance, grabbing the gun hand and John's throat. The first sergeant squeezed enough to make breathing difficult. Don't play games with the colonel's name, Stark said in a menacing way. I'll kill you deader than you can believe if you do that. John managed the barest of nods. The pressure around his throat relaxed. A second later, Stark shoved John toward the nearest bulkhead. John struck the bulkhead with a grunt. He bounced off, floating back toward Stark. The first sergeant grabbed him, shoving him onto the chair. The mountain of muscle floated back afterward, taking up his former position. All right, Stark growled. The centurion nodded. The old man puffed on his pipe before saying, I hereby bring the regimental meeting to order. The first order of business is the commanding officer's fitness to run the regiment. Does anyone second the motion? Second, Stark said. Sir? asked the old man. Yes, John said. Let's start the meeting. Chapter Two The old man puffed harder, finally taking the pipe out of his mouth, examining the bowl. He weighed the pipe in his hand, finally setting it beside him so the pipe floated near his head. Due to your decision, the old man said solemnly, the colonel died in a cryo unit. Over half of the regiment perished as well. What do you have to say in your defense? What is your precise accusation? asked John. Your decision, Stark snarled. It was a lousy one. You trusted a GSB agent. Can we let a stupid boy run the regiment? All you had to do was go into the cryo chamber and thaw us out. I made a bad choice, John agreed. It cost us. So you agree that you're stupid? No, I agree I made one wrong choice. At the time, it seemed important to get everyone awake as quickly as possible. The Arbiter had agreed to help us. The GSB is full of liars, Stark said. Everyone knows that. Yeah, John said, working to keep his voice from cracking. I've heard enough, Stark told the others. He's stupid and he's weak. Kill him. That's my vote. You followed the Arbiter into the control room, the Centurion whispered in his terrifying way. Because I didn't trust him, John said. Then why did you agree to his method? I told you, time. Aliens had attacked the battleship through the computer. The evidence suggested that the aliens were attacking the entire Neptune system this way. I wanted the regiment up and running as quickly as possible. The centurion glanced at the old man. 
Why didn't you try to save the officers first, the old man asked. John told them what the mentalist had said. My goal was to save as many men as possible, he added. Describe what happened after you first woke up in the cryo unit, the old man said. John told them everything. Afterward, the old man regarded Stark. The officer cadet isn't stupid, nor is he a coward. I detect plenty of fire in him. The colonel's dead, ain't he? Stark asked. All men die, the old man said. The boy doesn't deserve the chance to lead us. Because of him, you're awake, the old man said. Because of the cadet, the regiment still exists. He could have done better, Stark growled. The old man took his pipe out of the air. He opened a small pouch of tobacco, stuffing some into the bowl. Then he tamped it and lit it, puffing harder to get the tobacco burning. The colonel trained him, the old man finally said. Stark smacked a huge fist into the other palm, muttering darkly. Do you read books? The old man asked Stark. What kind of question is that? The mountain of muscle asked. He reads books. He studies tactics and strategy. You know the colonel taught him military history. I didn't know that, Stark said. Why does that matter? If you kill him, the old man said, who will do the regiment's thinking? You should take over, Stark said. The centurion nodded silently. You're a cagey old dog, Stark added. I've seen that enough times on the battlefield. The cadet is hungry, the old man said. He's young and he's full of fire. He's stupid, Stark said. No, the old man said. He isn't stupid. He did make a mistake with the arbiter. He has courage, though, and he stands on the traditions. To hell with the traditions, Stark said. You're wrong, John told him. Stark turned his bullet-shaped head at John. You think you can take me, boy? John didn't answer, but stared into those scary eyes. If he pushed the first sergeant too much, the big man would try to kill him. The longer he stared, the angrier Stark became. John wanted to look away, but he forced himself to keep staring. That's it, Stark said, gathering himself to attack. There's an alien vessel out there, John said. You don't know that, Stark said. The mentalist believes it too, John said. Bah, Stark said. The mentalist. She's a Martian with fancy ideas. What do I care what she thinks? Do you have any idea what being a mentalist means? John asked. Stark grew red-faced as his big hands opened and closed. The moment lengthened until the first sergeant finally said, Why don't you tell me what it means, boy? The mentalists are trained as coldly logical thinkers. Some stories even say that some of them take drugs in their adolescence to mute their emotions. Only genius-level people are accepted as mentalists. Their training is intensely rigorous. So what? Stark said. So we should listen to her reasoning, or do you think we should try to head back to Saturn? Stark blinked several times. I don't know about that. That's right, you don't know, John said, because you haven't thought that far. You're good at what you do, but you're no thinker. I want to hit him, Stark told the others. I want to see his face puff up. I want to wipe that smirk off his face. Hitting the commanding officer is a serious offense, John said. Commanding officer, Stark shouted. You're just a punk who let the colonel die. You're- First Sergeant Stark, John said. You are out of line. I will not permit that while I'm leading the regiment. Stark's eyes seemed to bulge outward as he stared at John. Finally, the huge man laughed. What are you gonna do about it, boy? Think you can discipline me? It's time to vote, John said. If you three vote no unanimously, I'll relinquish my command. Then you can beat or kill me if you still desire. Until then, Sergeant, you will respect my position or I'll draw my gun and shoot you down as a mutineer. I vote him out, Stark said as he grinned evilly at John. The others did not speak. Finally, Stark tore his gaze from John and glanced at them. Well, how are you two voting? 
I haven't decided, the centurion whispered. It's a troubling decision, the old man said. What are you two talking about, Stark said. He's stupid. I don't agree, the old man said. Great, Stark said, don't agree. The colonel died because the cadet trusted an arbiter. If that's not stupid, I don't know what is. The cadet didn't completely trust the arbiter, the old man said. That's why he followed the policeman into the control room. He also figured out what was happening quickly enough. Not quick enough to save the colonel, Stark said. True. That means he's out, Stark said, as he jerked a big thumb at the bulkhead behind him. The old man sucked on his pipe. The cadet made a difficult decision under pressure. He might have actually saved more of the men by doing it his way. The colonel died, Stark said stubbornly. You never made a decision that lost you men, the old man asked quietly. That was different, Stark said. The old man raised an eyebrow as he puffed on his pipe. What's your plan, the centurion asked John. First, I want to see what's happening in the Neptune system, John said. You said before that aliens attacked the system, the centurion whispered. John nodded. What are your plans once you know the situation? Say, if you find aliens out here, the centurion whispered. John opened his mouth to say he didn't know. He closed it as the centurion's gaze bored into him. The cause of my premature thaw out was the alien attack, John said. At least, that's the mentalist's conclusion. The alien attack via the computer indirectly brought about the colonel's death. Therefore, I plan to make the aliens pay if I can. How, whispered the centurion. I don't know yet. I need more information first. That's one of the reasons I'm trying to link up the teleoptic sensor. The centurion glanced at the other two. We're in a hard situation. What do you think we should do, he asked Stark. The big man shrugged. Old man, asked the centurion. Don't know, the old man answered. The centurion glanced at Stark. The young man has a plan. A stupid plan, Stark said. The men need someone who can make plans, the centurion said, choosing to ignore Stark's comment. Yes, the old man agreed. You can't think he's up for the job, Stark said. He's a mercenary officer, the old man said. He stands on the code. The colonel trained him and he didn't piss his pants when we three came to demand an accounting. You may not know it, First Sergeant, but you're a scary individual. I'm not in the mood for jokes, Stark said. Neither am I, the old man said. I vote for a provisional command. He killed the colonel, Stark said. The old man shook his head. The arbiter did that. The cadet shot him for it. Then he saved as many of us as he could. If the cadet hadn't acted as quickly as he did, you and I would be dead. Centurion, Stark said. You can't agree to that. The small, gangly man pursed his lips, finally sheathing his knife. I vote for his provisional installment as the commanding officer. No, Stark said, smacking a fist into his hand. I'm not going to let you two. John aimed his gun at the first sergeant. Are you a mutineer, Sergeant Stark? You let the colonel die. I'm not going to allow you to mutiny or cause an insurrection, John said. You voted. The others voted. If you reject the mercenary code, tell me. Stark's big hands opened and closed. Finally, he turned, pushing away and sailing through the hatch. With the slightest tremor in his hand, John holstered his gun. Should he have shot Stark? The first sergeant might turn into a problem soon. Now what? The old man asked John. It finally hit John that he now led what was left of the regiment. In a way, he'd become Xenophon, the Athenian who had led the 10,000 mercenary Greeks home again from inside the middle of the Persian Empire. He had to make choices, and he had to do so this instant. The idea froze his mind for just a moment. What should he do? He inhaled slowly, thinking fast. Divide the men into three companies. 
Each of you will command a company. We have to repair the battleship as best we can, but we have to do so without causing any signals to leave the vessel, or to be scanned even if they're within it. What do you mean? The old man asked. The alien ship, if it's really out there. The aliens can probably scan us in ways we don't understand. We cannot seem like a human-controlled vessel. We have to let the aliens think the computer still controls the battleship or that no one is controlling it. That they attacked us through the computer means the aliens are hostile. Until we know more and until we control the ship, we have to hide. You're thinking, the old man said. I like that. But how do you really know that there are aliens out there? That's why I want to fix the teleoptics. We have to know more. Yes, sir, the old man said. Is there anything else you need from us? There is, John said. Find the best engineers or techs and send them to me. Until then, start running drills. We have to keep the men busy so they don't get anxious. The old man glanced at the centurion. The small sergeant nodded. The old man saluted John before turning and floating away. Watch your back, sir, the centurion said. If you have a friend or two among the men, tough men, keep them around you. The first sergeant isn't through with you yet. John nodded. The centurion saluted before he too exited the chamber. John sat down, shuddering. He had provisional command, and he'd better not make any more big mistakes if he wanted to keep on living. With a start, he pulled himself together and returned to the teleoptic control. They had to know what was happening in the Neptune system. Chapter 3 Several texts showed up an hour later. John interviewed them, deciding a small, scruffy, shifty-eyed Neptunian named Da Vinci knew more about electronics than either of the other two. He's in charge, John said. The other two eyed the little Neptunian sidelong. One of them shrugged philosophically, but otherwise both kept their opinions to themselves. Da Vinci did not look like a soldier. He had stooped shoulders and a way of peering about like a rat sizing up what it could steal. As they worked together in one part of the room half an hour later, John asked, What prompted you to join the regiment? What's that? Da Vinci asked, looking up. The little man had unscrewed and spread out a control panel. There were wires and chips strewn in seeming randomness on a lightly magnetized sheet. It seems like you know what you're doing, John said. Why join a mercenary outfit then? That's an easy answer, Da Vinci said glibly. I got into debt. I'd gambled too much. The vagrant police were going to space me, he shrugged. So it was either join the regiment or float in space. John had been a particularly good enforcer in the New London Deep Tunnel gangs, not because he'd been vicious, mean, or even stronger than average. Enforcers usually collected debts. He'd had an ear for the truth, making him good at spotting lies. His ear helped him spot one now. How about telling me the truth, John said dryly. The little Neptunian blinked at him as if the comment made no sense. John took a leaf from the centurion's playbook and kept staring at the recruit. In a moment, John could almost see the wheels turning in the Neptunian's head. There was something else, too. The recruit seemed extraordinarily gifted. Maybe this giftedness had also gotten the man into trouble in the past. I, uh, have a checkered history, Da Vinci finally told him. John shrugged. Many in the regiment could say the same thing. I'm not proud of it, Da Vinci added. The finely tuned BS sensor went off again. If I'm going to trust you, John said, you're going to have to learn to trust me. Sir, quit lying. Oh, you mean you think I was proud of what I did? Yes. The twitchy fingers did a jig above the spread out components. Then Da Vinci smiled. It was a sinister leer, exposing plenty of teeth. Neptune system is different, Da Vinci said. Here, we take capitalism to its extreme. Everything is for sale. Everyone has their price. 
If you want to live in a space habitat, you have to be able to pay the rent and the oxygen consumption rates. Everyone has to breathe, right? It means the oxygen princes have always made a killing. Da Vinci sliced an index finger across his throat. Anyway, I have skills like everyone else, Da Vinci tapped the board with a tiny screwdriver. I'm a wonderkind with electronics, computers, and software in particular. I can develop games, I can hack into highly secure systems, or I can rewire cred cards. You'd better explain the last one, John said. Da Vinci sighed. You might not like me anymore, chief. John heard truth in the man's words. Keep talking, he said. I'm like everyone else, Da Vinci said. I have a lazy streak. That's the nature of men. I take shortcuts. Sometimes, well, maybe most of the time, taking shortcuts is a mistake. It's really a mistake when you're trying to score big. You're a thief, John said, suddenly understanding. A pained look came over the little rat-faced Neptunian. That's a nasty way to put it, chief. You can start saying sir instead of chief. Yes, chief, er, sir, I mean. Go on, John said. Cred cards seemed like an easy way to manipulate a little currency, Da Vinci said. You take them, open them, uh, I found a way. John looked at the man blankly. Counting beans is huge in the Neptune system, Da Vinci said. It's how one knows who's big and who's small. As I said, we're ultra-capitalist. Money buys you love, it buys you happiness, and it pays the rent, too. John nodded, wondering if the man would ever get to the point. Electronically, I opened platinum cred cards from the Bank of Nereid. That's supposed to be impossible. I did it, though, and I altered the numbers. Then I went to a store and bought insurance. I figured that would be the easiest way to launder the credits. Da Vinci scowled. I screwed up somewhere. There was a glitch. The store must have run my profile. They'll do that now and again. The profile showed that I shouldn't have been able to buy so much, and certainly not with a Nereid Bank Platinum card. Well, chief, uh, sir, the credit goons started hunting for me. They meant to grind the credits out of my hide if they had to. I'm not a pretty man, so I doubt they could have sold me into the sex emporiums. I don't know. There are some perverted people out here. I might have ended up in the sadist house, paying off my credit by the hour as sick bastards made me scream. So you ran to us, John asked. Da Vinci looked up in shock. No way, chief. You can't think I'm that desperate. I have my wits. I'm good, really, really good. I just needed a little time. I had a plan, see, to hack into the Nereid Bank. I was going to screw them royally and float the rest of my existence on raw credit. What happened? The goons caught me. I must have made someone mad somewhere, Da Vinci frowned. The goons sold me to the outfit, your mercenary guild. The Black Anvils. I told your recruiters I'm no soldier. It didn't matter. You wanted bodies, right? I'm a body. So I became a mercenary. But I'm also as smart as they come. I tested out fast the first few weeks and went into the regiment's cyber squad. That's how the old man knew where to find me. John studied the little Neptunian. It seemed he'd mostly been telling the truth. Carry on, John said. That's it? Da Vinci asked. I give you the story of stories, and you just say, carry on. The faintest of grins tugged at the corner of John's mouth. He could feel the other two techs watching the exchange, though. John wrapped his knuckles near the spread out electronics, making Da Vinci's head jerk. Are you familiar with regimental discipline? An angry light flared in the Neptunian's eyes. He gave John the barest of nods. Without another word, John floated away. Perhaps ninety minutes later, Da Vinci fit the last plate back. 
The Neptunian moved to an auxiliary control. Chief, the man squeaked. John stared at him. Are you ready, sir? John signaled that he was. With his skinny, twitchy fingers, da Vinci began to manipulate a board. The main screen flickered, activating. John held his breath. A moment later, the screen showed the outside stars. You're absolutely certain the ship isn't using active sensors, John asked. On my life, sir, da Vinci said. This is a teleoptic sensor, a passive system. Think of it like a telescope, but with a broader scanning area. I know what a teleoptic sensor is. Of course you do, sir. I don't mean nothing by it. I can increase magnification if you like. I do like. Find the alien vessel. Da Vinci looked up sharply. What is it now? John asked. I'm not questioning you, sir. I'm just a lowly Neptunian, after all. But how do you know there is an actual alien vessel in the Neptune system? Let's call it our working theory, as that theory makes the most sense regarding what happened earlier. Or can you explain a 100-kilometer spaceship that beams strange viruses into an SLN battleship's computer? Da Vinci's eyes widened, seeming almost too large for the size of his head. You want me to come up with a theory that fits the facts? If you like, John said. But first, I want you to find the giant spaceship. That could take some time. Better get started then. Da Vinci glanced at the main screen, studying it slowly. He adjusted the controls before looking up again. This could take a long, long time, Da Vinci said. We need a computer to speed things up. No computers, John said. For now, you're eyeballing it. John watched the main screen as well, eventually growing sleepy. He'd been up for over 29 hours already. His eyes burned and his head felt stuffed, almost as if he had a hangover. Finally, he moved to the farthest seat, sat down, and let his chin slump against his chest. Suddenly, it felt as if he couldn't breathe, like he was in a tight box that was slowly squeezing him, becoming narrower and narrower. Chief, da Vinci said. John raised his head. He felt groggy, disoriented. He realized he must have been dreaming. You were talking in your sleep, da Vinci told him. John glanced at the other two techs. Both watched him nervously. They quickly looked away. I'm awake, John declared. Do you have anything to report? I do, Da Vinci said. I've spied motion on the screen. I can't be sure, but I think the motion is SLN vessels. They're moving toward the rings. Neptune didn't have beautiful rings like Saturn. These were much fainter and smaller, but they were rings nonetheless. All four gas giants in the solar system possessed some kind of debris that people called rings. John rubbed his eyes, floating out of his chair toward the screen. Da Vinci adjusted the teleoptics controls, slowly expanding a portion of the stellar scene. Do you see those points of lights clumped together? John squinted at the screen, searching among the stars. They're in the exact center, so it's easier to see, Da Vinci told him. John saw them now. Five star-like objects were grouped together near the center of the screen. You're seeing their engine exhaust, the Neptunian explained. I understand, John said. The ships are accelerating. I can't be sure, but I think three of them are battleships. One is a mothership and the other is smaller. Does the Solar League have destroyers? As John watched the screen, he noticed three more star-like objects. These appeared to leave the group of spaceships as they headed toward the blue ball of Neptune. The separation was slow, as the faster three dots still crawled across the screen. One had to watch closely to notice any appreciable change in distance. What are those? John asked. Good question, Chief, uh, sir, Da Vinci said. I'll run a spectral analysis and estimate the distance traveled to give us some idea of their velocity. The small tech pulled out a tablet and placed it on the sensor panel. He began to tap numbers onto a calculator. He studied the screen for a time, rubbed his non-existent chin, and tapped a few more numbers into the tablet. Those must be missiles, da Vinci said at last. I doubt they're fighters. 
The mothership likely has fighters, but I don't imagine human-occupied craft would be accelerating quickly enough for us to actually notice the separation. They're millions of kilometers away from us. Missiles imply there's a target, John said. Do you see a target? I sure don't, sir, da Vinci added. Can you figure out the missile's trajectory? If I had a computer, it would be a snap, the Neptunian said. Eyeballing it like this and crunching the numbers with my tablet, not so much. The missiles do seem to be traveling directly for Neptune, though. Heading for the rings? asked John. Maybe. Search around Neptune. Try to find the super ship. What we're witnessing, it must be part of a battle. Four or five ships aren't much compared to what the Solar League had earlier, da Vinci said. True, John said quietly. The seconds ticked away until 15 minutes had passed. John stood. He needed advice about what to do next. The only person he could think about asking was the mentalist. Da Vinci, the little Neptunian, looked up. Send a runner to find me if anything interesting happens. I'm going to find the mentalist. Do you have any idea where she is? The rat-faced man shook his head. John thought she might be up at the main command deck. He shoved off, sailing toward the auxiliary exit. They weren't using any kind of comm devices so that the signals didn't give them away. If an alien ship was out there, it might be scanning everything. Until they knew more about the alien sensors, it seemed wisest to play this cautiously. Chapter 4 John propelled himself along the corridors, using float rails to gain speed. He had a knack for zero-g maneuvering, but he wasn't as good as some of the old-timers were. He passed a soldier here and there. He even spied the centurion in the distance. It bothered him that he feared running across the first sergeant. Would Stark really try to kill him? That was a distinct possibility. John was still surprised he'd survived the encounter with the three dinosaurs. Should he really arrange for bodyguard, as the centurion had suggested? He glanced back, almost stopping to go speak with the centurion. They needed to search every cranny of the battleship just in case some Solar League personnel had survived. Enemy combatants could prove dangerous, and possibly at the worst moment. Instead of stopping, John continued sailing through the corridors faster and faster, enjoying the feeling. He pondered what to make of Da Vinci was the little tech as unsavory as he pretended. The colonel had talked to him about mercenary units. In the dim past before the space age, humanity had fought constantly against others on Earth. One of the nation states doing a lot of fighting had been France. According to the colonel, the French had something called the French Foreign Legion, which had been a mercenary outfit, recruited from the four corners of the world. Some of the recruits had been gentlemen adventurers, some had been criminals running from the law. Some had been hunted soldiers from one losing war or another. Some just needed a job to put food in their bellies. The ancient foreign legion had been a place to find second chances. Men could start over. It didn't matter who one had been, but who one was now. John had been a gang member. Da Vinci had been an embezzler. The old man had run from Earth on the lamb from the GSB. Colonel Graham had escaped from the Jupiter system when the Solar League had conquered it. Some of the men claimed Graham had been a politician who had counseled war to the death with the Solar League. Only the colonel had fled before the Jupiter system military had died to the last unit. People needed second chances. The chaplain said Christ's spaceman had come to Earth in order to give humans who begged God a second chance at life. The regiment had gained a second chance out here in the Neptune system. Maybe this was even a third chance on the battleship. Can I atone for losing the colonel? As John sailed through the empty corridors, he determined to become the best mercenary commander that ever ran a regiment. He would devote his life to paying the colonel back for lifting him from the squalor of the new London Dome. He would pay it forward because he didn't know how to do it any other way. The soldiers under his command deserved his very best, and he had to make sure that his best was good enough to win. John grabbed a rail to slow his progress as he drifted toward the frozen double hatch that led to the command deck. He didn't want to go in there. He could smell the rotting flesh from here. They were going to have to do something about that soon. He cupped his mouth, using his hands as a megaphone. 
Gloria, are you in there? Go away, she shouted from inside the command deck. John scowled. What was the mentalist doing in a room full of dead people? I need to talk to you, he called. What part of go away don't you understand? The sergeants came to me. I may be under a death sentence if I don't perform. I need some advice. There was no answer. Gloria, he shouted. The mentalist poked her head out from between the two frozen hatches. What's wrong with you, she said. He could see her haunted look, the trembling of her features. Something seemed wrong with her. Get out of there, he said. You're not my teacher. I never said I was, but get out of there anyway. Who do you think you are to tell me what to do, she demanded. John thought about that. I'm the captain of this ship, he said. You? That's right, I run the regiment. The regiment controls the ship. That makes me the captain. Your precious regiment doesn't run anything. Your hyenas snarling over the scraps. What's gotten into you? She floated into an up and down position, turning her head to look back into the command deck. The aliens killed us, she said in a muffled voice. Why don't you come out here where I can hear you? Her head whipped around, and he thought she might berate him again. Instead, she used both hands, grabbing the edges of the hatches and shoving off. Catch me, she said as she sailed toward him. He grabbed an arm. She tugged it free from him and grabbed his face, pulling herself closer, kissing him on the lips. Was he supposed to pull away in shock and surprise? If so, she didn't know much about the lower level New London people, or mercenary soldiers. He grabbed her face, kissing her back. You brute, she said, tearing away. You weren't supposed to do that. He grinned at her. I miscalculated, she said, while rubbing her lips as if to get any cooties off them. What did you think I'd do if you kissed me, he asked. She shrugged. His BS meter began to ping. He peered at the frozen hatches, remembering the dead that lay beyond. I get it, he said. You got depressed, so you decided to punish yourself. You wandered around the corpses and started out by feeling sorry for them, but ended up being sorry for yourself. You'd gotten yourself into a good funk by the time I showed up. You wanted some good, honest human contact to make you feel human again, instead of like a ghoul. So you kissed me, and you hoped to make me uncomfortable. What you didn't take into account is that I'm a soldier. Soldiers like girls, he said with a wink. I miscalculated indeed, she said, studying him oddly. And I think you just did, too. Don't you know you're supposed to keep your secrets? What's my secret? You're a thinker, she said. I wonder if that's what your colonel saw in you. I don't know what he saw. I bet you do know. He chose you for a reason back when you had to trade places with him. I'm beginning to see that. Look, John said, we've got trouble. I agree with that. John shook his head. I'm not talking about the aliens, but the regiment, what's left of it. First, Sergeant Stark doesn't like me. He didn't agree with the other's decision to let me live. Tell me what happened, she said. As he did, he observed how she drank in the details, beginning to wonder why he trusted her. It sounds as if you handled the situation as well as could be expected, she said. Besides, that's not my area of expertise. I'm a mentalist. Emotions are harder to weigh and objectify. I'm better at manipulating facts. Fair enough, he said. I've got a teleoptic sensor working, by the way. You do? Then what are we doing out here? Let's get to the auxiliary station and figure out what's happening. Da Vinci spotted five SLN warships. Who? Come on, he said, grabbing an arm, tugging her. Let's get back to auxiliary control. You can see for yourself. I'll fill you in as we go. Good idea, she said. John grabbed a float rail as he began to speak, wondering if the Martian was going to end up being his confidant. The colonel had told him before that a commander needed one. What would the sergeants, especially Stark, think about him confiding in the mentalist? He didn't even want to think about that one yet. Chapter 5 John, Gloria, and Da Vinci stared at the auxiliary station's main screen. The other two techs worked on different pieces of equipment. Outside the hatch, two big soldiers floated at guard. John had asked the soldiers about being here. The Centurion sent us, sir, the bigger guard had explained. He said no one is supposed to enter auxiliary control unless you give the okay. I'm supposed to tell you, sir, uh, by that the Centurion means no one at all, 
No exceptions, including him. I see, John had said. Carry on. The Centurion no doubt wanted to make sure the first sergeant didn't barge in and kill John. I may have found your alien vessel, sir, the little Neptunian said. John's focus returned to the here and now. Da Vinci's twitchy fingers manipulated the sensor panel, enlarging the image on the main screen to focus on Neptune's faint rings. Do you see it? The Neptunian asked. Not yet, John admitted. How about you, little girl? Asked Da Vinci. I am a Martian mentalist, Gloria said in a cold voice. Do you even know what that means? I read, Da Vinci said. I guess you figure being a mentalist makes you a mighty muck, huh? You will address me with respect, she said. Sure, lady, Tech Corporal Da Vinci, John said softly. You will heed the mentalist's instructions. Da Vinci hesitated a moment, finally nodding. Sure, mentalist, I got it. You're a brain, a big brain, and everyone likes stomping on the Neptunian. Everyone figures they know more than me. What about the alien vessel? John asked. Da Vinci muttered under his breath as he made adjustments by tapping various coded lights on a panel. There, chief, uh, sir, the Neptunian said. Look at the dark area near the exact middle of the rings. Even with the zoom enlargement, the vessel appeared tiny. The fact that they could see anything meant the ship was huge. On the screen, John saw a dark hull amid the faint rings, with part of giant Neptune as background. Is that the alien ship? John asked. Could be, sir, Da Vinci said. It's big enough for your alien vessel, but it doesn't seem to be doing anything, even with them missiles barreling down its throat. Quit talking for a second, Gloria said. Let me consider this. Da Vinci glanced at her sidelong, beginning to tap his fingertips against each other. It seemed to take an effort on his part to remain silent. This takes my breath away, Gloria soon said. That is an alien vessel. Do you realize the significance of the moment? This is history, gentlemen. Just a minute, John said. Something's bothering me about what I'm seeing. I can't quite place it, though. If it's okay for a lowly Neptunian like me to speak, I can tell you exactly what you're not seeing. What? John asked. Normally, Da Vinci answered, we'd see lights, tons of lights from the various habitats. There are orbital stations, floating cities in Neptune's upper atmosphere with incredible lights, ships moving around with obvious exhausts. You see what I'm getting at? Gloria sucked her breath in sharply. You're correct. This is pristine Neptune, like it was before humanity stumbled out here. I doubt everyone just turned off their lights at once. If I were to guess, Da Vinci trailed off. You think the aliens destroyed the cloud cities, orbital habitats, and spaceships, John asked. Seems like the easiest working theory to me, Da Vinci said. Do you see any evidence of combat debris, Gloria asked the Neptunian. Huh, Da Vinci said. If the alien ship destroyed, Gloria's mouth hung slack. She turned to John. I know what happened. John waited for it. Do you remember the yellow lines I showed you before? Gloria asked. The lines radiating from the alien vessel. I do, John said. They were radio waves to everywhere else. You're thinking the aliens put viruses into all the other computers, and those computers attacked their inhabitants just like our computer did to us. My evidence, Gloria said, is the decided lack of lights anywhere else in the system. Then, John said, how are those five warships managing to do what they're doing? And how are those missiles closing in on the alien vessel? The missiles are headed there, right? They are indeed, Da Vinci said. When you look at it like that, Gloria said, the five ships are a fascinating development. I'd dearly like to speak to someone over there. I can open communications with them, Da Vinci said. Gloria scowled. Don't be a fool. If you send a message, we're all as good as dead. That would alert the aliens that we have defeated their computer virus. I don't know about that, Da Vinci said. The aliens, if that is an alien vessel, don't seem to be doing anything about the five warships. We need other sensors, Gloria said. This is like watching a movie without sound. We can figure out some of the plot, but there's too much we'll never understand just by watching it. John had been tapping his chin. He now turned to her. If you're right about the alien method of attack, turning our computers against us, what happens if the alien ship heads deeper into the solar system? No, Gloria said, grabbing one of his forearms. 
That would mean system-wide destruction. John glanced at her hand, and she abruptly released him. Why are the aliens so hostile? He asked. I have no idea. Where did that ship come from? John asked. The aliens must have come from out there, from somewhere outside the solar system, Da Vinci said. John frowned at the obviousness of the answer. No, Gloria told him. That's the correct procedure. Begin with what you know, no matter how basic. Once you establish the basics, you attempt to layer more data onto the foundational knowledge. They are aliens. They turned our own machines against us. That is an efficient form of combat. It indicates that the aliens are highly logical. It proves they're ruthless as well. They didn't give us a chance to surrender. It appears that they don't desire to merely conquer us, but to utterly destroy us. Genocide, asked John. It may be too early to conclusively state that as a fact, Gloria said, but I'm leaning heavily in that direction. Wouldn't they attempt some form of communication otherwise? I have no idea, John said. That was a rhetorical question, Da Vinci told him. John didn't bother to reply to that. If he did, he would have to discipline the cheeky Neptunian. With the proper guidance, though, he hoped to use Da Vinci's brains and skills for the good of the regiment. Thus, he didn't want Da Vinci to turn sulky on him if he could avoid it. Let's suppose that is an alien vessel, John said. What do we do next? What is our wisest response to them? That's easy, Da Vinci said. We stay hidden until the bastards go somewhere else, and we pick up the scraps. Think about it, sir. All that loot is lying out there because the owners are dead. I mean, if the mentalist has everything figured out correctly, we know the people are dead. The Cloud Cities, the Habs, they're all waiting for whoever wants what they have. And when the aliens return to Neptune, asked John. Go somewhere they're not, Da Vinci said. Let me get this straight, John said. We hide while the aliens kill everyone else in the solar system. Killing everyone else is only going to last for a while, Da Vinci said. If we're still around, the aliens will return and kill us too. That only means one thing, Chief. We have to scrounge up women. The regiment has plenty of men. Men will probably be pretty horny soon. They're going to need women bad. I could use me a couple of girls myself. We have a big ship, right? Well, we leave the solar system, partying for as long as we can on this ship. I don't see any other choice for us. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, Gloria quoted. Da Vinci scratched his head, as if thinking that over. I don't care much for the dying part, but the rest sounds good to me. Gloria glanced at John. What's your suggestion, he asked her. We have to stop the aliens, she said. I'd like to know how we do that. I don't know, yet, she said. One thing we have to do is get our ship ready for whatever we do decide. If those five warships survived the computer attack, do we know they underwent a computer attack? John asked. We don't know, if knowing means 100% certainty, Gloria said. It seems likely they did, though. I suggest we proceed upon those lines. As I was saying, if those five ships survived the computer attack, it makes sense that others survived as well. We must all join forces and attack the alien ship in concert. Sounds logical, John said. Of course, she said. But logic doesn't always work in a fight, John said. For now, we need to watch and see what happens. What if those five vessels need our help to destroy the alien ship? Gloria asked. Do you see those ships on the verge of success? John asked. The missiles are heading for the alien vessel. That could be changing soon, Da Vinci said. Look, isn't that a golden color on the enemy vessel? John focused. There indeed seemed to be a gold speck on the dark alien ship. As he watched, the speck of light grew brighter and brighter. Is that a weapon? John asked. I think we're about to find out, Gloria said. Chapter 6 The SLN battleship Leonid Brezhnev continued to drift in the outer Neptune gravitational system. The vessel was approximately five million kilometers from the blue ice giant. Niso was the most distant moon in the system, at 48 million kilometers from Neptune. Niso wasn't behind the battleship, however, but on the other side of the ice giant from the Brezhnev. As moons went, Niso was tiny, a mere 60 kilometers in diameter. 
The earlier battle between the SLN Task Force and the Neptune System Navy had occurred near the much larger, irregular moon, Nereid. Nereid was presently six million kilometers from Neptune. The Leonid Brezhnev single working teleoptic sensor watched the long distance conflict between the SLN missiles and the supposed alien vessel. The three missiles continued to accelerate. It seemed likely they were thermonuclear tipped missiles. As such, they wouldn't have to hit the 100 kilometer vessel. Merely igniting somewhere in the ship's vicinity would unleash their destructive potential. If that's an alien ship, da Vinci said, what kind of material is its hull made of? He turned to the mentalist. Can you tell? Not yet, Gloria said. You think you'll be able to tell after the nuclear blasts? The Neptunian asked. Will nuclear blasts knock out our teleoptic sensor? Gloria asked John. Good question, John said. I don't know. Can we shield the sensor? He asked da Vinci. How am I supposed to know that? The Neptunian cried. You ought to be glad I got the thing working. John, Gloria said, tugging on his sleeve. Look. He glanced at her. She pointed at the main screen. He looked up in time to see a thin golden beam. It speared straight and bright from the enemy vessel and hit one of the SLN missiles. I'm a fool, Gloria said. The missile's exhaust disappeared from the teleoptic scope. The golden beam did not ignite the warhead, da Vinci said, but it destroyed the missile. Gloria pulled up her tablet. Her fingers flew over its small screen. It's firing again. Da Vinci said. Gloria's head snapped up. She pressed her tablet as the beam once more speared into the darkness. She tapped the tablet as soon as the second missile's exhaust winked out. John glanced at her. The mentalist studied her tablet. Given that the beam was traveling at the speed of light, the golden ray moved 800,000 kilometers before striking the missile. That isn't precise, but it gives us some idea of the beam's destructive range. I'd say 800,000 kilometers might be the alien beam's outer range limit. Because the aliens would have fired sooner otherwise, asked John. That seems like a rational observation, Gloria said. Unless the aliens wanted to hit the missiles with their beam's full power, John said. Maybe 800,000 kilometers is the limit of the full destructive energies the beam can reach. Why would they need to hit the missiles at such strength, she asked. I have no idea. I'm just tossing out possibilities. Gloria smiled wanly. I congratulate you, Captain. You reason like a mentalist. You're a captain? Da Vinci asked John. John didn't bother answering the Neptunian. In truth, he wasn't sure what rank to use. Having the men call him cadet didn't seem right. John shook his head. He could worry about names later. At that point, the giant vessel beamed the last missile, destroying it as easily as it had the other two. Sir, one of the other techs said. Someone is broad-beaming a message. John whirled around. Someone on our ship? He demanded. No, sir, the tech said. The man licked his lips as he studied the panel. The message is coming from one of the warships, the ones that sent the missiles. Do you have a visual to the message? John asked. I do, sir. Do you want me to acknowledge them? On no account, John said. But I do want you to put the message on the screen. Yes, sir, the tech said. Once more, John looked up at the screen. The image of Neptune, the rings, the alien vessel, and the stars vanished. In their place was general fuzziness. That began to dissipate as a harried-looking woman gradually appeared before them. She's a rear admiral, Gloria whispered. I say again, the gray-haired woman said in a harsh accent. To whomever can hear me, I am speaking to you from the SLN battleship Cho En Lai. The rear admiral was tall and severe-looking. She wore a crisp uniform with white gloves. She had various medals pinned to her chest and spoke aggressively while sitting straight in her command chair. She's on a death ride, Gloria said. John glanced at the mentalist. I recognize what she's doing, Gloria explained. It's from Solar League history, when Commodore Blake broke the Venus-Mercury alliance. He was outgunned and cut off from reinforcements. He had his officers wear their dress uniforms as he charged the enemy fleet. Every one of his ships broke apart under the relentless hammering. It fixed the enemy fleet, however, allowing a swarm of stealth drones to maneuver into a killing position. That broke the back of the inner planet's alliance against Earth. After a bitter struggle, we have regained control of our vessels, the rear admiral said. I do not fully understand what happened. My tech chief says the computers went berserk. No, 
That's not correct. They acted, the computers, I mean, against our wishes. On the Cho In Lai and elsewhere, the main computer opened hatches, gassed other areas, and turned various robots against the crews. It was a nightmare assault. Fortunately, my space marines reacted swiftly, defeating the machines. I was able to give warning to several other vessels, and they also defeated their rogue computers. Her narrow shoulders slumped. The rear admiral appeared physically and mentally exhausted. I believe we've encountered an alien vessel, she said. None of us has ever seen a ship like that out there. It is monstrously huge and filled with cunning. I dare to pronounce a judgment on them, although I am not an arbiter. The aliens are evil and possess haunting technology. I realize I speak in superstitious terms, but the alien ship is a demon from space. How could it do what it did to our computers? It was uncanny. The rear admiral drew a deep breath, squaring her shoulders. I suppose whoever is listening to this believes I'm rambling. You may even suppose that I'm insane. We have attempted to communicate with the aliens. They have refused to respond in any manner. We have attempted to communicate with anyone else living in the Neptune system. The rear admiral leaned forward, peering into the camera. Peering, it seemed, at John, or maybe the mentalist. Listen carefully, the rear admiral said. This is the truth. The alien viruses that caused the computers to become cunning Trojan horses against us have destroyed all human life in the Neptune system. The cloud cities have dived into the ice giant. We saw it happen. The habitats exploded, some of them at least. Others opened all the hatches, letting out the satellite's atmospheres. Who knows what kind of gases or robots ran amok on moon bases or habitats? The aliens used sorcery against us. The rear admiral paused. I know my last statement sounds mad. It is not sorcery, I am aware of that. But it is technology on a higher order than we understand. This is likely my last transmission. If you live, join us. We are attacking the alien vessel. We must destroy that ship before it can maneuver deeper into the solar system. I have my doubts that humanity can defeat it. But we must try. If we fail, humanity dies. It is as simple as that. The rear admiral turned away from the screen. She lowered her head, appearing to sob for a moment. Using a sleeve, she wiped her eyes. Afterward, she regarded the screen once more. We don't have our main computers. We have smaller tablets, though, having hooked them to the weapon systems. We have recalibrated missiles. We're going to launch all we have in several minutes. Again, I urge you to listen to me well. Humanity is doomed unless we can stop the alien ship. The extraterrestrials are inhumanly cruel and ruthless. If you can hear me, you are doomed anyway. But perhaps by sacrificing your lives together with us, you can gain our race time to figure out what happened today. I implore you, fight with us. Suddenly and completely, the image vanished. John swiveled around to the tech. Get her back up. The tech stared at his panel in bewilderment. Tech, John said. The man's head whipped up. He had wide, staring eyes. What's wrong? asked John. Sir, someone is jamming the communications. It's complete jamming. It must be the alien, sir. John turned to Da Vinci. Get the stellar image back up. The Neptunian's fingers tapped quickly. No, Gloria whispered. John saw it out of the corner of his eye. On the screen, the alien ship moved among the faint rings as the exhaust lengthened behind it. The massive vessel headed toward the five SLN ships. The alien ship was visibly picking up speed as the five ships crawled toward Neptune. What are we going to do? Gloria asked. Have we figured out how to use any of our battleship's weapon systems? John asked. That shouldn't be hard to do, Gloria said. Begging your pardon, sir. Da Vinci said, but are you mad? Those warships don't stand any chance against the aliens. You heard the woman. The aliens are invincible. Should we die to prove what we already know? What about the rest of humanity? John asked angrily. A sly look transformed the Neptunian's features into something even more rat-like than earlier. We're human, right? What's your point? John snapped. As long as we remain alive, Da Vinci said, the human race lives. 
Thus, we're crazy to throw away the human race's chance of survival by getting ourselves killed. What? He may have a point, Gloria said somberly. Not you, too, asked John. Don't you see? This is the fight of our lives. If we don't help the rear admiral, what's your ultimate goal? Gloria asked, interrupting him. That's easy, John said. I want to stop the aliens from murdering humanity. Then you have to figure out how to defeat the alien vessel, she said. Throwing away our lives and the battleship on a gesture is illogical. I'm getting tired of that word, John said. I've heard that before, Gloria told him. Whatever you decide to do, remember this. Stick to your goal. Anything else is grandstanding. John looked up at the screen, at the accelerating alien vessel. What would your colonel do? Gloria asked quietly. John stared at her with heat building in his face. It's not an underhanded question, the mentalist said. Ask yourself what Colonel Graham would do in this situation. Then do it yourself. John stared at the screen with haunted eyes. Maybe the mentalist had a point. Just what would the colonel do under these impossible circumstances? Chapter 7 John floated alone in a nearby corridor. He had a decision to make, and he didn't have much time to make it in any meaningful way. If he was going to order the Leonid Brezhnev into battle with the rest of the SLN task force, he needed to get started. It might already be too late. There were five warships in the task force, three battleships, a mothership, and a destroyer against a massive alien vessel. In terms of tonnage, it wasn't even close. The battleships were almost a kilometer in length. That made them immense in normal solar system terms. The mothership had greater volume, although less sheer mass. The mothership would disgorge space fighters, two and three men craft. Against the 100 kilometer alien vessel, the fighters would be less than mites. 100 kilometers of metal, structure, electronics. The alien vessel likely had more mass than the entire Solar League Navy. Could three battleships, a mothership and a destroyer, have any hope against the rest of the SLN? John shook his head. He knew the answer to that. That meant the rear admiral had made a hopeless gesture by attacking the alien vessel. There was something else at the edge of John's subconscious. He snapped his fingers. He remembered the colonel telling him once about the siege of Masada. Rebellious Jews had holed up on a desert mountain fortress. The Romans had slowly built ramparts up to the citadel. The night before the legions broke into the mountaintop fortress, the Jewish combatants had slain their wives and children and then taken their own lives. They did not want a life of ignoble slavery or death by crucifixion. The zealots had fought to the last as free people. Is that what the rear admiral did? Surely she must realize the hopelessness of tackling the alien ship that had destroyed an entire planetary system. Did that mean da Vinci was right? Should they hide while the alien ship remained in the Neptune gravitational system? What would the colonel do? What had the colonel done in the past? He hadn't stayed in the Jupiter system when the SLN came in overwhelming force. That clinched it for John. Throwing away his life on a gesture went against the grain. Adding the Leonid Brezhnev to the assault wasn't going to change the outcome. The rear admiral spoke proudly, but that wasn't a substitute for figuring out how to win. Maybe the aliens so outclassed them that there wasn't any hope for humanity. Yet, if that were so, why had the aliens butchered everyone? Their very ruthlessness implied something. It was more than hunger driving the aliens. What was there about humanity that caused the aliens to act with such savagery? John shook his head. That was the wrong question now. The only thing that mattered today was defeating the enemy. In that moment, John knew what the colonel would do. He'd played enough Texas Hold'em with the other officers and the colonel to have a good idea. The colonel had insisted on poker nights with his officers. It had been more than get-togethers. The colonel had studied his officers during the games. A simple truism of winning at poker was learning patience. Most poker hands were bad. If he was wise, a man folded such hands. A winning strategy involved playing 10 to at most 30% of the dealt hands. 
many of the better players erred on the lesser percentage. Sure, occasionally one bluffed, but that was a poor strategy over the long term. That was something the colonel had taught John. Play the hands for the long term. That meant play the percentages. Look at your position on the table. That counted too. Look at your whole cards. If they stank, fold. If they were okay, fold. The point was to wait for a good hand. That proved to be one of the hardest things for anyone to do. Patience was not a normal human virtue. One had to work at patience, practice it, and then remember to be patient when one wanted something now. How did that relate to the alien ship? John decided he'd already started the process. He was watching the aliens. He'd defeated their first round, the killer computer. He didn't know if the regiment could do anything to stop the aliens. The only way to find out was to watch the enemy. That meant the rear admiral might have given them priceless data at the cost of her life and the ships. With a greater sense of urgency than before, John headed back to the auxiliary station. He needed to find something they could use. Likely, it would not be a normal military thing. He had to find an alien weakness, if it existed. But to do that, he had to stay in the game long enough to make his play. Chapter 8 The rear admiral of battleship Cho En Lai might have been throwing away their lives, but she followed formal military procedures. John stood with Gloria before the auxiliary station's main screen. The little Neptunian remained at the teleoptic sensor panel, making adjustments. Da Vinci had managed to give them greater magnification. He'd also hooked his tablet into the system. The tablet's processors gave them some computing power. It crunched raw data, giving them some sense of what they were seeing. The alien ship was still in Neptune's rings. In this case, it was the outer Adam's ring, approximately 64,000 kilometers from Neptune. The rear admiral's truncated task force was two million kilometers from the alien vessel. The five SLN warships had a slight velocity, close to 10,000 kilometers per hour. The five ships abruptly quit accelerating. Their bright exhausts disappeared, and they drifted toward the alien ship and the ice giant behind it. Can you magnify the task force any more? John asked. Yes, indeed, da Vinci said. Moments later, the five dark warships seemed to leap closer. Shortly thereafter, huge vents opened on the destroyer and the lead battleship. Each vessel ejected streams of tiny prismatic crystals, most the size of a person's fingernail. They were like tiny mirrors, but there were billions, even trillions of them. This prismatic crystal field, called a pea field, slowly grew before the task force. A pea field had several uses. The most common was acting as an anti-laser field. An enemy laser would lose strength as its ray refracted in the many prismatic crystals. Given enough wattage, a laser would melt and then consume the individual crystals one after another. That took time, however. Such a process was called burning. Once an enemy laser burst through a pea field, it was called a burn through. The pea field acted as a pseudo force screen in terms of scattering laser beams. In real terms, and despite almost frantic efforts, the solar system humans had yet to develop force screens. Thus, when entering battle, a ship or group of ships built a pea field between themselves and the enemy. The pea field could slow other types of beams as well, including particle beams, but the crystals were most particularly effective against lasers. The secondary use of a pea field was as camouflage. The crystals made an anti-sensor wall that was effective against all known ship-hunting systems. That allowed the ships behind the pea field to rearrange themselves, possibly turn around and flee, or perform any other maneuver a clever commander could imagine using for hidden ships. The rear admiral, by building the pea field, signaled her desire to get in close to the alien ship. She also, in effect, mandated an end to any acceleration. Otherwise, the ships would leave their pea field behind, having wasted the ejected crystals. While ships could store trillions of prismatic crystals, which seemed a limitless amount, the tanks held a finite supply, and it was doubtful that the battleships had replenished their stores since the Battle of Nereid against the Neptune System Navy. The SLN ships soon finished spraying the crystals. That's a shallow pea field, Gloria noted, confirming the ship's limited supplies. 
The aliens could burn through that in seconds. The Leonid Brezhnev had an advantageous view of the situation, having a side shot of the task force and its pea field and the alien vessel. The task force would have to spray crystals at 90 degrees from the present shallow field to block the Brezhnev's teleoptic scope. Has the alien vessel reacted? John asked. Da Vinci adjusted his panel, twisting a dial. The scene leaped from the task force to the giant ship. Its exhaust burned brighter than before. Twenty gravities and climbing, Da Vinci announced. Gloria shook her head in astonishment. John watched the massive hull, but he couldn't spot any indication of readying weapons. Return to the task force, he said. Several moments later, the image changed yet again. As the three of them observed, the battleships began to unload missiles. The SLN ships normally carried their missiles inside the various vessels, like old-time submarines on Earth. That was different from the NSN, which had carried their drones and missiles on outer racks attached to the main ship hull. They noted that the missiles did not accelerate, but maintained the same velocity as the ships they left. The number of missiles increased until flocks of them gathered at various points behind the pea field. Interesting, Gloria said. John raised an eyebrow at her. The rear admiral's plan seems obvious, Gloria said. She undoubtedly wishes to get as close to the alien vessel as possible. At the last moment, I suspect, she will launch everything at once in as wide a spread as possible. They will all charge the alien vessel in a saturation assault. For the next half hour, the task force's vessels and missiles continued preparations to do exactly that. Gloria turned to John. I'm impressed, and I no longer think the mothership carried fighters. They must have stocked the mothership with missiles. I count over 100 now. Chief, you're going to want to see this. Go ahead, John told Da Vinci. The scene changed. What might have been hangar bay doors, three that they could see, opened on the alien ship. A huge missile slid out of each, and the doors slowly closed. Abruptly, the mighty ship began to veer upward in relation to the launched supermissiles. The alien vessel continued veering as it increased velocity. The giant alien vessel could not turn on a dime, as the ancient saying went. It was already moving too fast in one direction. It turned in a shallow but steady curve changing its heading the entire time. The aliens no longer charged toward the task force, but veered away, soon heading 90 degrees away toward the moon Triton. As the ship reached that bearing, hot exhaust burned from each massive alien missile. They leapt on the screen, thrusting Gs at incredible gravities. As they did this, the alien missiles drifted apart from each other, although they continued to zero in on the pea field. John and Gloria traded glances. I understand wanting to blast apart the pea field with thermonuclear explosions, John said. But why veer away with the main ship? The alien tactics baffle me, Gloria admitted. Yet isn't that how it should be? We should not expect what we would consider normal human tactics from them? Is that right? Da Vinci asked. In any given situation, there are only so many optimal responses. In a mathematical formula, there is only one correct answer. If the aliens are smart, and these seem to be, we should be able to predict many of their actions, because that would be the only sensible thing to do. Explain their tactics then, Gloria said. Why is the main ship veering away so sharply? Da Vinci appeared to consider the problem. I have it, he said. The three missiles will eliminate the task force. Thus the aliens are already heading to their next project. Gloria cocked her head as if processing the idea. You may be right, she said at last. I am right, Da Vinci said, sounding surly. The two groups were traveling toward each other. No doubt the rear admiral had sent probes into the pea field. Those probes would poke out from the outer edge of the field, using sensors to scan the enemy, beaming the information back to the battleships. A flock of SLN missiles maneuvered away from the pea field. Once in position, their engines ignited. The selected missiles accelerated toward the approaching alien missiles. The flock passed the pea field in seconds as it headed at the enemy. Time passed. Even close to a planetary body, the volume of space was vast compared to the speed of the various ordinances. One alien missile continued to accelerate. The other two quit thrusting. The single missile quickly pulled ahead of its companions. One million kilometers, Da Vinci announced. 
One million kilometers what? asked Gloria. You must state the number in relation to something, otherwise you're making a meaningless statement. The distance between the SLN missiles and the badass alien leader, da Vinci said. Gloria nodded sharply. Thank you. 900,000 kilometers, da Vinci said later. Nothing else had changed from earlier. 800,000, da Vinci announced sometime after that. That's the outer limit, we believe, of the alien golden ray, John said. You suspect ray-beaming missiles, Gloria asked. I'm just saying, John replied. 700,000, da Vinci said in time. Any change to any of the missiles on either side, Gloria asked. Da Vinci shook his head. 600,000 kilometers, the Neptunian said later. Look, John said, the alien missile is expanding. I'm zooming in for a closer look, da Vinci said. Like some exotic metallic flower, the warhead to the alien missile unfolded. It had strange metal protrusions constructed in such a way that they highlighted its extraterrestrial nature. Bizarre, Gloria said. It almost hurts my mind looking at it. It did, in fact, seem to John like a mad artist's rendering of an alien missile. The aesthetics were grotesque to the human eye. It was as if the aliens had grown the missile deep inside a gas giant amidst a swirling cauldron of otherness. Lights, da Vinci said. John thought the better term might be glowing. Various blob-like structures glowed with energy. That energy seemed to radiate outward to other independently extended warhead sections. In a second of time, the grotesque missile shone with an ethereal radiance. It was breathtaking, mind-numbing, and painful to watch. John wanted to speak, but his throat had closed. He could not even croak an order. All at once, the shining radiance gathered together. Then it shot out in a coherent beam that flashed to the flock of SLN missiles. The radiance sustained the beam, holding for a second, and then it quit. Da Vinci pulled back the teleoptic view, giving them a wider angle and a distance shot. The alien missile literally disintegrated as if eaten by acid. In seconds, the alien device was gone, the molecules cast into the stellar void. Magnify the others, John said. Just as da Vinci brought the view up close, one of the SLN warheads exploded into a thermonuclear fireball. John and Gloria turned away as the auxiliary station brightened incredibly. Fortunately, the teleoptic sensors had automatic dampeners, so the brightness was bearable to optic nerves. Once the brightness dimmed down to normal, John looked up. He had splotches before his eyes and found it difficult to see anything. Nothing, Gloria said dispiritedly. They're gone. John rubbed his eyes and looked again. The mentalist was right. The SLN missiles had vanished. This time, however, they spied debris all that was left of the missiles heading for the alien devices. Gloria turned breathlessly to John. He could see in her eyes that she understood what had happened. The beam caused the warhead to ignite, Gloria explained. How? Gloria snorted. I have no idea how. The radiance, something, caused the warhead to switch on. If that particular warhead had failed, I suspect one of the others would have ignited. Why didn't the other warheads explode, John asked. My guess would be that they didn't have time. The first warhead destroyed the others. John absorbed the news. He pointed at the main screen. There are still two missiles left. No, Gloria said in horror as she clapped a hand before her mouth. The other two will do the same thing, but to the missiles beside the task force. That's how the aliens are going to eliminate the battleships. They're going to use the SLN missiles against them. John, she said, you have to warn the rear admiral. You have to tell them what's about to happen. Chapter 9 I can't do that, John said. Besides, the rear admiral must know what you do. She's watching lists just like we are. She's not stupid. What if she doesn't know, Gloria insisted. Maybe the battleships can decelerate and retreat in time. You have to warn them. We can't let the aliens butcher us one by one. John looked away. He couldn't stand the imploring in Gloria's eyes. He could see the rightness in her suggestion, but if he sent the message, I need patience, John told himself. 
The mentalist wants me to play a bad hand. Despite her logic, she's thinking emotionally. John, Gloria pleaded. He hardened himself, as he used to do in the old days back in the tunnels. The first few times he'd broken a man's bones, John had found himself in turmoil. His mentor, Red Gilbert, must have seen the squeamishness in his eyes back then. Gilbert had told him how to turn his heart into granite. Don't think of them as human, Johnny boy. They're marks, fools, stepping stones. They knew the score going in. I've seen a horde of them. Know what they'll do if they get the drop on you. John had shaken his head while gripping a bone breaker with manic strength. I've seen one of the marks weep like a plague victim. First he blubbered about his sick mother. Then he wept about the vig being too steep. Lucky Thomas got soft that day. Told the fool he could pay him later that night. Well, later that night, Lucky sent his bodyguard home because the man had a bad cold. That happened to be me. Lucky didn't want to catch what I had, so he went to visit the weeper as the ceiling lights dimmed. The weeper had gotten some of his friends together. They jumped Lucky, tripping him in a back alley. They used his own bone breaker to beat in his skull and take his collection money. Lucky died a day later. I know the story's true because I caught up with the weeper. He tried the same thing on me. I killed the trickster before I lost my wits like Lucky. This is the point, Johnny boy. Don't get soft. Do what you gotta. Play the percentages, see? John regarded the mentalist in the auxiliary control room. The rear admiral is doing her part, he said stiffly. We're going to do ours. Gloria studied him, and it seemed as if she was really seeing him for the first time. She seemed to absorb what she saw. Her mouth kept changing shape. Finally, she nodded. Your colonel chose wisely, she said. Too bad your first sergeant couldn't see you now. Maybe he wouldn't understand, though. I suspect this Sergeant Stark is a simple man. There is tungsten in your spine. You have the coldness of true intellect. She peered down at her hands. The best mentalists have that. I lack the proper hardness. You've already seen I'm too emotional. It is a great failing among mentalists. She looked up, smiling sadly. Sending me along with the task force was an act of subtle rebellion on the sect's part. John focused on the main screen. The two alien missiles once more accelerated toward the pea field. The SLN warships and missiles behind the prismatic crystal field continued to drift toward Neptune. In that moment, John felt a bubbling certainty within himself. He would take the colonel's place. He would lead the regiment to victory. He would defeat these genocidal aliens. He would have to use every skill, every trick against them. First, though, he had to recognize possibilities when they appeared. He had to burn out any softness in himself and look at reality with a cold mind. The heady feeling lasted until the next alien missile advanced ahead of its partner. Like the earlier missile, this one unfolded like a grotesque flower. It, too, glowed with energy. Just like before, an eerie colored beam speared toward the SLN missiles and ships. The eerie beam reached the pea field. It refracted in the trillions of tiny crystals and created a large, shimmering blanket of multicolored alien light. The alien missile continued beaming, and the pea field glittered. None of the strange light reached behind the prismatic crystals to the missiles and ships behind it. Finally, the alien missile disintegrated just as the first one had done. Interesting, Gloria said. The aliens aren't invincible, after all. They can fail. It appears they can also miscalculate. That's wonderful news. The last alien missile adjusted its heading. After the side jets quit, the main thruster burned with greater gravities. The last alien missile no longer headed directly at the task force, but veered away, traveling for a location 90 degrees from the front of the pea field. You know what it's doing, right? Gloria asked. It's trying to bypass the pea field, John said. After it does, it will no doubt rotate and beam the exposed task force from the side. It's the logical maneuver. The rear admiral must have come to the same conclusion. Several SLN missiles changed heading behind the pea field and accelerated hard. The missiles sped away, the exhaust lengthening behind them. 
Because the missiles already possessed velocity in the direction of Neptune, they moved at a 45-degree angle. In time, the SLN missiles would move in behind the angling alien missile by thousands, possibly tens of thousands of kilometers. Given a large enough thermonuclear blast radius, they might be able to knock down the last alien device in time. That was the essence of the battle now. It was a matter of time, distances, velocities, and blast and beam ranges. As the minutes ticked away, turning into a half hour and then longer still, John's eyes became tired from staring at the same image for so long. Gloria sat cross-legged on the floor. They watched the unfolding contest. The alien missile moved compared to the task force and human-constructed missiles. Later, even though the last alien missile was far away from the P-field, it was finally about to move into the line of sight of the task force. The rear admiral has to detonate the warheads now, Gloria said. John shook his head. What are you seeing that I'm not? Gloria asked. I don't know this for a fact, John said. But I think the rear admiral wants the alien missile to be as vulnerable as possible first. Gloria bent her head in thought. She looked up half a minute later. Do you mean once the alien missile unfolds itself for firing? John nodded. Yes, Gloria said. I believe you're right. Soon, side jets rotated the alien missile, repositioning its nose cone. Finally, the massive missile pointed at the distant task force. The task force must have run out of prismatic crystals, Gloria said. Otherwise, the rear admiral would have built a second pea field. John rubbed his eyes, trying to rub the tiredness out of them. He leaned forward, waiting for the final showdown. Just like before, the alien warhead unfolded like some sort of bizarre tech flower. The attacking SLN missiles were far from their normal blast zones, but they weren't going to get any closer now. The warheads should already have exploded, Gloria said. Da Vinci, are the aliens jamming the missiles? The Neptunian studied his board. I don't detect any jamming. Why don't? The alien missile began to glow with energy, causing Gloria to choke on her words. At that point, one of the warheads exploded with a thermonuclear blast. An EMP shockwave went out from the whiteness. Gamma and X-rays blew outward. In the depths of space, the heat wasn't as critical in damaging properties as it would have been inside an atmosphere. The alien missile continued to glow. Surely it had built up enough to beam. Why hadn't it beamed yet? All at once, the device began to disintegrate as the others had done after firing. John and Gloria traded startled glances. John shouted in glee, pumping a fist into the air. Gloria shrieked with happiness. The rear admiral did it, Gloria shouted. She destroyed the missile. She kept it from functioning in any case, John said. Now what happens, Gloria asked. We actually won a round against the aliens. That, John decided, is an excellent question. Chapter 10 before they had made any decisions regarding the Brezhnev's actions, the three dinosaurs returned. John had taken another catnap. The rear admiral and her task force still maintained their heading toward Neptune. It seemed like a logical choice for them, because that allowed the five warships the use of the P field. Once the ships maneuvered away from the field, they would be naked to any alien weaponry. Sir, the biggest guard said from the hatch. Sir, he repeated more insistently. John looked up groggily. The sergeants are coming, sir, the guard said. It took John a second to realize what the soldier meant. Oh, he said, floating to his feet. He thought fast, deciding he didn't want Da Vinci or Gloria around for this. You two need a break, John said. In fact, he told the other two techs, all of you take a break. Make it an hour before you return. He didn't need to tell the techs twice. They hurried from the auxiliary station. Gloria proved more stubborn. She eyed him without moving. Please, John said. Gloria gave him a wan smile. Remember one thing, she said. He waited. You're mentally tougher than the first sergeant. Trust your own instincts over any of theirs. I'll try to remember that, he said. Don't humor me by saying that, she said. Act upon this truth. He nodded. 
Gloria launched for the exit, barely leaving in time. Da Vinci had already slipped away with the other techs. Thirty seconds later, the biggest guard said from the hatch, Sir, the sergeants request some of your time. None of that, Sergeant Stark growled from outside. I'm seeing the little. The bigger guard maneuvered before the entrance. The other guard seemed to take heart and did likewise. Their actions startled the first sergeant, interrupting his speech. What is this? Stark finally asked in a menacing tone. Are you two trying to stop me? First sergeant, the centurion said. There, Stark whirled around in surprise. This is your doing? The small centurion paused for a half beat before admitting it was. Gentlemen, John called from within the chamber. Please enter. I've been expecting you. He hadn't been expecting them, but it was something the colonel would have told them. The two guards drifted away from the entrance. The sergeants floated into the chamber. As they did, John noticed a light on a panel. Curious, he floated to the panel. A few taps on the board showed him it was another message from the rear admiral. You're just in time, John said. This is the SLN task force commander reporting. She's making a broad beam call, so this isn't directed at us specifically. What are you talking about? Stark demanded. If you'll listen, Sergeant, it will all become clear. Stark uttered a profanity at him. The rear admiral's appearance on the main screen stilled whatever else Stark might have added. This is Rear Admiral Granada of the battleship Cho Enlai. We, we have survived a harrowing encounter with the aliens. For the record, all my science officers agree that we have indeed faced a life form born in a different star system, in a vessel constructed somewhere in the stellar depths. That makes this an extraterrestrial invasion into our solar system. There can no longer be any doubt about that. The rear admiral stared into the distance as if caught up in the terrible truth of what she'd said. Aliens. Humanity faced aliens. Beings from another star system. Creatures with a foreign code of conduct. The rear admiral collected herself, focusing again. My task force is heading for a Neptune orbit. We have received... We have received signals from other survivors. We believe these survivors slipped onto the other side of the planet in relation to the alien vessel. Given the extreme superiority of said vessel, they made a wise choice. Let me explain, the rear admiral said, launching into a detailed dissertation regarding the alien missile assault, the one John and Gloria had witnessed. Interestingly, rear admiral Granada said in conclusion, our P-field blocked their energy weapon. The weapon can cause premature nuclear chain reactions in our warheads. The majority of my science officers believe the beam operates on similar principles to the original alien attack against our computers. The rear admiral grew earnest. Humanity faces a clever and ruthless foe. However, the fact that the task force survived this latest attack shows we can face them. We must. Granada turned to the right as if listening to someone speaking to her. She already appeared haggard. As she listened, the lines deepened in her face. Her shoulders grew more hunched. Slowly, she regarded the screen again. There is a new development, Granada said wearily. The aliens, she sighed deeply. Many of our defeated ships and some NSN vessels are headed to a rendezvous point. That point appears to be the moon Triton. My communications officer has attempted to communicate with these vessels for some time. She has failed in each case. The science officers have just concluded that the ships themselves are headed to Triton. What they mean is that those vessels appear to be under the aliens' control. For whatever reason, the aliens wish our former ships to rendezvous at Triton, which is where the alien vessel is also headed. Do the aliens plan to reprogram the computer-captured ships? Will they use those vessels against the rest of humanity? The rear admiral stared out of the screen. She seemed to drift inward, into her thoughts. That dissipated quickly as her features hardened again. I am of two minds, Granada said. Should my task force head to Triton? Maybe we can destroy the formerly human-controlled warships. As a military officer sworn to defend the Solar League, I dare not let the aliens use our own ships against us. Some of my officers vehemently disagree with that. 
They argue that we have an obligation to survive the alien encounter. We must warn humanity. We must do so by getting far enough away from the alien ship to transmit a message to the other planetary systems. Her hardness and certainty softened as she shook her head. I do not know the correct course to take. I admit I want to live. Thus the protesting officers sway me to the latter option. Yet in my heart, I know we must hurt the aliens as best we can and as soon as we can. That means reaching the rendezvous point with enough missiles to destroy everything. The rear admiral paused before adding, I would like to point out. She vanished from the main screen. Her voice quit in mid-sentence. A harsh sound emitted from the speakers as the screen became fuzzy. It was several heartbeats before anyone spoke. The rear admiral belongs to the Solar League, asked Stark. John nodded solemnly. Stark started to speak again, but stopped. The harsh jamming quit, bringing a strange silence to the chamber. The fuzziness faded away as a new person appeared on the main screen. It was a shocking sight. A man regarded them. At least, he appeared to have once been a man. He wore an NSN jacket with braid. He had long white hair in the Neptunian upper caste style, combed to the left. His eyes seemed vacant, with far too much white showing around them. His mouth was slack, with drool spilling from it. A metal frame circled his head, with thin rods seemingly screwed into his scalp, his cheeks, and jaws. There were eight rods altogether, and they imprisoned his head within the metal frame. Wires led from the circular frame, leading to machines, computers, possibly. What is that? The old man asked in horror. Several more seconds passed. A few of the wires jumped as if electricity surged through them. It caused the older man's face to twitch, his body to contort. The eyes became wider still, staring until something unholy seemed to focus out of them, something decidedly inhuman. The mouth firmed and actually curved into a sinister smile. I am, um, uh, the inhuman man paused as if considering his word choices. I am the spokesman for the order. I am the creature who speaks reality, certainty. Your thoughts as a species are chaotic, often meaningless. The order has arrived to change everything. Submit, otherwise you risk harming useful material. To encourage proper action, I will explain the penalty for continued resistance. The wires jumped again. The rod-imprisoned face twitched with seeming pain. He opened his mouth as if he would utter something profound. Instead, he issued a croak of pain. You are a dull species, the inhuman spokesman finally said. Further review has caused the order to alter the lesson. You are emotional creatures rather than rational beings. Thus the order will give an emotive demonstration. If you fail to submit, this will be your fate, compounded one hundred times. For a flickering instant, the Neptunian's eyes became normal again. He glanced to the left and to the right. He brought up an old hand, touching the rod screwed into his face, feeling the metal frame circling his head. The wires jumped once more. The eyes became stark, the mouth stiffened in agony. Then a soul-wrenching sound tore from the obvious captive. The man screamed and screamed as smoke curled from each embedded rod. He screamed until blood leaked from his eyes, and he... John slapped the control panel, shutting down the main screen. What? First Sergeant Stark ran a hand across his face. What was that? The aliens obviously used a captured Neptunian, John said. They hooked him to a machine. Maybe that was the quickest way they could communicate with us, using the man's mind to do the translating. What? Stark asked. They used the man's brain somehow. Or so I imagine. That's wicked, Stark said. The aliens are evil. The old man was pale. With a trembling hand, he took out his pipe. 
It took several tries before he lit it and puffed as if trying to erase the sight from his memories. After the sixth puff, the old man removed the pipe and asked John, What do we do now? What now? Stark shouted. What now? Who cares what the pup thinks? I'll tell you what we have to do. I'll tell you. His words drifted away. Something grim had been hardening in John since the alien transmission. The demonstration terrified and sickened him. The thought of ending his life like that, with rods screwed into his head. Who were these aliens? Their attack earlier had caused the colonel's death. Now, to do this to a captured Neptunian in an effort to demoralize the remaining humans. What's your plan? John coldly asked Stark. What? The first sergeant said. I asked you what your plan is, John said. The grimness in him seemed to expand. He loathed the aliens, and in his loathing, he yearned to destroy them, root and branch, to exterminate them. Some of that hatred now seemed to be boiling out against Stark. You're quick to denounce me, John told the first sergeant. Me, your commanding officer and superior. You're not my superior. What's your plan, first sergeant? Enlighten us with your wisdom. Stark hunched his shoulders, glowering dangerously. With a cold clarity, John realized this was the moment. The alien lesson had driven that home with bitter certainty. Either he was going to lead the regiment, or he would die right here and now. The clarity of the thought strengthened his resolve. It seemed as if something in his mind had opened for the first time. He could see what needed to be done now. He focused on Sergeant Stark. It was time to nip this rebellion. It was time to temper what was left of the regiment and turn it into weaponized steel. You voted under the rules of the mercenary code, John said with preternatural calmness. By voting, you accepted the outcome. You're going to decide to follow me or... John drew his gun. A last vestige of the officer cadet, John Hawkins, caused him to hesitate before aiming the weapon at Stark. What are you going to do, shoot me? Stark sneered. With deliberation, realizing the sergeant needed a few seconds to reason it out, John let go of the gun so it floated in the air. Here's the situation, John said. An alien ship is out there. That ship has killed almost everyone in the Neptune system. And you saw what it did to that man. He was most likely a senior officer of the NSN. John stared at Stark. I'm going to defeat the aliens. You? Stark shouted. This is the fight, John said. Aliens versus humans. I'm glad you saw that. I'm glad you three are here. We have to decide on our strategy, and it's better if we do it now. We have to, John's eyes narrowed. If we're going to destroy them, the regiment must have unity of command. The opening of his mind had also given him new steel in his soul. He spoke with conviction, vitally aware of the gun floating nearby. John focused on Stark. If you continue to foment rebellion against my authority, I'll execute you, as is my right under the Articles of the Mercenary Code. Something in John's gaze kept the first sergeant from retorting. It almost seemed as if John's eyes became too bright or too hot. Stark looked down. The cadet's stronger than we thought, the centurion said. The colonel must have seen that in him. Stark glanced at the old man. Thank God we have a commander with fire in his belly, the old man said. After seeing that, he glanced at the blank screen before regarding Stark again. I can almost feel the heat radiating from him. Stark blinked several times and looked at John anew. The big man scratched his head, seeming like a brute gorilla doing it. Did, uh, do you have a plan? The first sergeant asked in a bemused tone. John didn't have one before Stark asked. In that moment, though, an idea blossomed into being. I do, John said matter-of-factly. Stark stared at him a moment longer. He shook his head as if he couldn't believe it. I don't know what to do. That, that was awful. The men are already scared. Once they hear about that, the big sergeant paused before he asked the centurion, Do you really trust the cadet? He was the colonel's pick, the professional said. Besides, our backs are against the wall, and we're facing an alien firing squad. Who else do we trust? 
old man? asked Stark. I already told you, the old man said. I can feel the greatness in him. Stark nodded slowly before regarding John. It seemed the sergeant refused to acknowledge the blank screen, as if by doing so he wouldn't have to think about what he'd just seen. You're right, Stark said. There can only be one commander. The colonel picked you. I don't know why. I don't see what the old man does. But the colonel knew soldiers better than any man alive. A last flicker of belligerence flared. Don't let us down, cadet. Don't let the colonel down. Are you through? John asked. I'm through, Stark said. I'll follow your orders. John plucked the gun out of the air, holstering it. I have a plan, John told them. I won't lie to you, it's a long shot if there ever was one. But it plays to our strengths. The only problem is that we have to get lucky to implement it. What's the plan, the old man asked. John stared at the tall sergeant. He had to settle this here and now. Sir, the old man added. John nodded, and he beckoned the three regimental dinosaurs closer to hear his idea. Chapter 11 You got lucky, Gloria told John later. The sergeants need belief. They need to trust someone. Stark still hates you in his heart, but he needs something to hang on to in this nightmare situation. John was only half listening. He hadn't told Gloria about the alien transmission, the horrible threat hanging over them. The sergeants and he had agreed to keep the transmission quiet for now. The ordeal was bad enough without the men knowing that. John watched Da Vinci. The little Neptunian and his tech helpers were rewiring a panel. They would pilot the Brezhnev from here, with a tablet providing number crunching capacity. And another thing, Gloria said. John turned sharply. You're supposed to be watching the screen. I am, she said. The mentalist sat at the teleoptic sensor station. She kept recording the task force, and she also recorded the captured vessels, both SLN and NSN, as they maneuvered for Triton. Triton was by far the biggest moon in the gravitational system, having more than 99% of the mass of all of Neptune's satellites. That included the debris that people called rings around the ice giant. Among the outer planets, Triton was the only regular moon that orbited in the opposite direction from the planet's rotation. Astronomers claimed that fact proved that Neptune had captured the moon long ago. Triton was almost 355,000 kilometers from the ice giant. It was at a similar distance from Neptune as Luna was from Earth. The moon had a tiny atmosphere. It also had cryovolcanoes that spewed icy particles like Earth's volcanoes spewed ash and lava. Four warships belonging to the task force and the remaining missiles had repositioned themselves behind the pea field. Those warships and missiles had edged to the side nearest Triton. It appeared to indicate that the rear admiral had decided to make a dash for the moon. John would have dearly liked to know if the rear admiral and her people had witnessed the alien transmission. If not, how might seeing it change their decision? The aliens hadn't beamed at the Brezhnev directly, but had sent a broad-beamed message just as the rear admiral had done earlier. The SLN destroyer hadn't joined the other ships. The last vessel had moved closer to the center of the pea field. It appeared as if the destroyer would attempt to use the prismatic crystals to shield itself all the way to Neptune. The logical maneuver would be to use the ice giant later, keeping it between the alien vessel and the destroyer. Maybe the destroyer would broadcast a message to the inner planets. Maybe the ship would try to accelerate away. Have you detected any patterns yet? John asked. The mentalist eyed him closely. Did she sense a difference in him? I don't mean a pattern to the rear admiral and her ships, John said. I realize you mean the captured ships. Gloria opened her mouth as if to say more, but hesitated. With his eyes, John indicated the main screen. Gloria focused on her panel, tapping certain green-colored switches and twisting a dial. She brought up a captured battle cruiser, an SLN vessel. It drifted at speed toward Triton. With several more manipulations, Gloria found an SLN destroyer. This one had a jagged hole in its hull. The destroyer was also headed toward the main Neptunian moon. 
I'd like a closer look at the hull breach, John said. It took Gloria several tries before the image leaped up. The rupture was big, maybe an eighth of the hull. What do you think, John asked. Gloria rubbed the back of her neck. Do you see how the edges of the breach bend outward? He nodded. It must have been an interior bomb, she said. The crew did it. Gloria gave him another odd look before saying, that seems the likeliest explanation. As they attempted to regain control of the destroyer from the computer, asked John. How am I supposed to know that? Through sheer deductive logic, he said, because you're a mentalist. Gloria gave him a hurt glance. John wanted to say he was sorry, but he wanted her to quit badgering him. He also didn't want her asking the wrong questions. He wasn't ready to tell her about the alien transmission. He suspected that she was nervous and scared like everyone else. Knowledge of the transmission would only intensify that fear. Surprisingly, his fear had diminished. He was too consumed with the coming assault, the planning of it, the rethinking, trying to anticipate the various possibilities. He realized the others had begun leaning upon him. That might have incapacitated the old John Hawkins, crushed him under the growing pressure. The grimness in him had turned the alien vessel into an object of intense desire. A bleak humor grew at that knowledge. In the old days, in the New London tunnels, he used to play RPGs, role-playing games. He particularly enjoyed the fantasy games. He really loved playing dwarf heroes, swinging battle axes. One thing about RPG dwarfs was their intense lust for gold. Gold made them crazy. The alien vessel had become like gold to him. A gold-mad dwarf didn't worry about dragons or orcs. He just worried about someone trying to steal his treasure before he got to it. John used to sit in the colonel's study. Whether that study had been a coffee shop on a Neptune hab or under a Titan dome didn't matter. He and the colonel had drunk gallons of coffee together. The colonel had told him historical battle stories given him tactical hints or quizzed him on correct field decisions. There had been that time the colonel asked him what a commander should do if the enemy had superior indirect fire. That could involve massive artillery bombardments, airstrikes. The method of indirect fire didn't matter as much as its reality. How do you face that kind of enemy? Colonel Graham had asked him. Grab him by the belt buckle, John had said promptly. The term had originated on Earth during the 20th century from something called the Vietnam War. The North Vietnamese had beaten the French and their foreign legion and later faced America. The Americans had fantastic air superiority and used it against the Vietnamese. During one of the battles, the Vietnamese had coined the term and the concept of grabbing the Americans by the belt buckle. They meant to fight so close to the American soldiers that the bombers couldn't drop their ordnance for fear of killing their fellow countrymen. But how did one fight an alien that could turn your own computers against you and make your own warheads explode at just the wrong moment? How did one fight an alien that screwed bolts into a captive's head? The answer had popped into John's mind as Stark asked him about his plan. You storm the enemy vessel with space marines. You grab them by the belt buckle. You fight the aliens with low-tech weapons, ones they can't take over. You fight the evil sickos face to face as you crush them. There was another consideration. Boarding happened to be the regiment's specialty. That's what the NSN had drafted and trained them to do. The regiment had special stealth boats on board and stealth suits, and John studied a drifting NSN drone on the main screen. The military drone was just a little smaller than the destroyer behind the pea field. The NSN drone drifted toward Triton. Every vessel they'd seen, except for the task force and the Brezhnev, headed for the big Neptunian moon. The logical conclusion was that the aliens were going to do something to the various ships. They were going to do it while everyone was in orbit around Triton. Would the aliens search for any last survivors aboard the ships? The idea put a knot in John's gut. He forced his thoughts back to the tactical problem. A logical place to attempt the stealth assault boarding attack would be in Triton orbit. First, though, they had to get the Leonid Brezhnev there. 
That meant reigniting the main engines and accelerating to the Neptunian moon. If they used the engines, though, would the aliens think the virus-controlled computer was doing it? Or would the aliens realize humans had survived aboard the battleship and had regained control? How much longer until you're ready? John asked sharply. Fifteen minutes, no more, da Vinci said. Gloria glanced at John. She had the odd look on her face again. Get it done, John told da Vinci. The little Neptunian lowered his head as if he thought John was going to strike him. The Neptunian glanced at the other two techs. Then the three of them continued to work with a will. Chapter 12 The four SLN warships and missiles began to accelerate. As the pea field serenely continued its course toward Neptune, the three battleships, the mothership, and the missiles began their burn for Triton. The task force immediately left the cover of the pea field as they maneuvered into open space. The missiles burned hotter and thus moved ahead of the ships. Five minutes later, da Vinci informed John that everything was ready. Seems like a good time to start, the Neptunian added. On no account is that correct, Gloria said. If we accelerate now, it will seem as if we're maneuvering in conjunction with the task force. Da Vinci did a double take. Do you see the separation between them and us? The aliens won't think that. You have no idea what the aliens will think, Gloria shot back. Da Vinci shrugged. In this case, no one knows. We might as well get this over with and begin. I'm surprised you feel that way, Gloria said. Aren't you the one who said we should flee from the aliens? I still believe that, da Vinci told her. Isn't staying here better than starting toward the aliens, Gloria asked. You have a point, the Neptunian said. He turned to John. I've changed my mind. This is a bad moment to begin. Enough, John said, wondering why da Vinci had changed his position so easily. Show me the alien vessel. Let's see if they're reacting to the task force. Da Vinci hastened to obey. The massive alien ship was no longer accelerating. John wondered when it had stopped doing that. The giant vessel drifted at speed toward Triton. It would have to decelerate soon if it wanted to insert into an orbital pattern. They're ignoring the task force, da Vinci said. Give them a little time, John said. What do you know? Gloria asked. John glanced at her. You've been acting strangely ever since meeting with the sergeants, she said. What really happened, John? What's changed that's changed you? Maybe you should tell her about the alien transmission. Maybe, as a mentalist, she would see something he was missing. Oh, oh, da Vinci said. On the main screen, at greater magnification than before, John saw the orifice of an alien weapon. It looked like a radar dish, with bright golden light in the exact center of the dish. I swear it's building up strength, da Vinci said. The light was a ball of golden energy that grew in size on the dish. Tiny zigzags of energy sizzled off the ball. That's no laser, Gloria said. It's not a particle beam either. I have no idea what it is. What's the present range between the alien ship and the task force? John asked. Gloria made rapid calculations. 1.3 million kilometers, give or take. That's greater than 800,000 kilometers. At that moment, a golden beam speared from the radar dish and off the edge of the viewing screen. With a few taps, da Vinci widened the view. There were no prismatic crystals in the way, no thick gels in space to protect the warship. The golden beam struck outer battleship armor. Immediately, thick globules floated from the armor plating. The beam chewed deeper and deeper, breaking through the armor. Heavy, ablative foam began to boil away as molten steam. Abruptly, the alien beam quit. The rear admiral reacted fast. Two battleships began an intricate maneuver. The wounded warship slowed down. Another battleship accelerated faster than before. It appeared as if the rear admiral wanted the two vessels to trade places, putting the wounded ship behind the other one in relation to the alien vessel. As the two battleships maneuvered, the golden beam struck again. This time, the ray burned with greater fury. Globules bubbled away until molten steam drifted from the deepening hole. The beam's thickening, Gloria said. It has a deeper color. 
All at once, interior ship's atmosphere blew out of the breach like a whale jetting mist from its blowhole. The beam sliced through that, digging deeper into the SLN vessel. Abruptly, like a grenade, the battleship blew apart. Armor pieces and chunks of spaceship flew in all directions. Some of the whirling pieces struck a nearby battleship. The stricken vessel shuddered, and simultaneously, at least to the human eye, debris vomited from several breaches. John imagined crew members lifted off their feet, blown out the hull breaches into space. Lights began flickering on the heavy fighting vessel. A different armor chunk hit a third ship. It was a bigger piece. Either its mass was enough or its velocity great enough to cause the spaceship to begin tumbling. The golden beam struck again, hitting the mothership this time. What are those? Gloria asked in a hushed voice. Magnification, John said harshly. Da Vinci, wake up. The Neptunian twisted around in his seat to stare at John. The little man was pale and trembling. Give me greater magnification, John said sternly. Woodenly, Da Vinci pecked at his control board. Da Vinci, John said menacingly. You will pay attention to your task. The Neptunian nodded without looking up, although he seemed to adjust his controls with a bit more authority. The scene magnified. Those are escape pods, John said. Oh, Gloria said. There's a message, Da Vinci whispered. John hesitated only a second. Put it through, he said. The image of ship destruction and fleeing escape pods vanished from the screen. In their place was a bloody-faced rear admiral. Fires raged on the control panels behind her. A dead man lay draped over his chair. Hissing sounds predominated. It's over, Rear Admiral Granada said. She dabbed her bloody mouth with a rag and then let go of the rag so it floated near her head. A moment later, she noticed the rag and swept it away with the back of her hand. My ships are gone, she said in shock. A man shouted something incoherent at her. Granada didn't pause to listen to him, but she seemed to hear the shout. This is my last message to whomever is listening, the rear admiral said. Before the aliens beamed us, they sent a transmission to my missiles. I don't know how they did it, but the missiles are inert. I'd hoped to send the missiles a command after I died. That's not going to happen now. Granada stared into the screen. The aliens have sent transmissions to the captured ships. I don't know what they're saying. It's in rapid machine code. The golden beam. It's like nothing I understand. Like nothing any of my science officers understand. We have some indication what the original transmission did to our computers. A hopeless laugh bubbled from Granada. You're not going to believe this. I can hardly believe it myself. The aliens transmitted... Like a wall, buzzing noises and fuzziness cut off any sound or visual of the rear admiral. Da Vinci, John snapped. Get her back up. I want to hear what she has to say. The small Neptunian looked up helplessly. Give me a visual of the task force then, John said angrily. Da Vinci adjusted a panel. The space scene flickered into life on the main screen. At that moment, a golden beam obliterated a lifeboat. One by one, the beam disintegrated the remaining pods. Soon, only wreckage drifted. If any humans had survived, they would have to be hiding inside the gutted spaceships. Finally, Gloria faced John. Her lips trembled and tears welled in her eyes. What do we do now? She whispered. John knew what to do. Follow the plan. It would be risky. Doing nothing would be worse. The mentalist didn't realize that yet. I have something to tell you, John said. Her eyes became wide, as if she realized he was going to tell her something awful. John took a deep breath. Then he told her about the alien transmission from earlier. He told her why that meant they had to grab the aliens by the belt buckle instead of trying to hide out here. With enemies like that, they had to gamble for the sake of humanity. They would never win a ship-to-ship -ship battle. Instead, they had to go to Triton so they could board the alien supership and grapple the aliens directly. Given what they had seen so far, that was the only option left that had any possibility of success, no matter how minute. John told her everything as she stared at him in shocked disbelief.
The Maneuver Chapter 1 The next 52 hours would test their resolve, but even more, their endurance. First, John gave the command. Da Vinci obeyed, tapping the orders into the newly rerouted panel. The Leonid Brezhnev turned ponderously toward Triton. Once the nose cone was aimed in the right direction, Da Vinci cut the side jets. Shortly thereafter, the main engines pulsed with power, causing a heavy thrum throughout the battleship. Do it, John said. Da Vinci adjusted the controls. The Brezhnev began to accelerate as hot exhaust exited the thrusters. One gravity acceleration, Da Vinci announced. John sat in a chair, enjoying the feeling of gravity pushing against him. He much preferred it to weightlessness. The battleship continued to accelerate. The three of them watched the alien vessel in Triton orbit. So far, the alien ship ignored their action. After an hour of observation, John left the chamber, exhausted. He found a nearby room, piled blankets onto the floor, and promptly went to sleep. Six hours later, he re-entered the auxiliary chamber. Gloria sat cross-legged on the floor, continuing to study the alien vessel. She also studied Triton and the various captured spaceships heading to the Neptunian moon. She looked worn down and obviously worried. You need a break, John told her. For several heartbeats, the mentalist did not respond. Finally, slowly, she shifted her head as if her neck had rusted. It seemed to take her several tries before she blinked. Are you all right? he asked. Just as slowly as she'd turned, the mentalist nodded. She's been like that since you left, Da Vinci told John. I have been meditating, Gloria said robotically. John glanced at the little Neptunian before concentrating on Gloria. Maybe he shouldn't have told her about the alien transmission. Meditation is a mentalist state, she explained. We call it Shalam. The practitioner allows data to flow into her subconscious. Emotions can flow as easily as any other form of information. It is a mistake to reject feelings, emotions, as the human subconscious often comes to correct conclusions faster than the conscious state. Have you come to a conclusion? John asked. Oh, yes. John raised an eyebrow. Gloria unfolded from what appeared to be a painful cross-legged posture. She straightened, staggered slightly, and sat on a chair. John crossed his arms, waiting for her to elaborate. She closed her eyes, squeezing them tightly, and opened them. She took several rapid breaths before regarding him. I will not relate the relevant data, she said. Instead, I will give you my conclusion. First, I would like to add that this is mentalist reasoning. So let's hear it already. Do you understand what speaking as a mentalist means? She asked. I'm guessing it means this is important. You are making light of me. That's wrong. Mentalist reasoning, I get it, John said. It's computer-like thinking. Gloria considered that, nodding slightly. That will do for now. Here is the conclusion. We must increase velocity to a painful degree. If we appear to be anything other than alien-controlled, the enemy will surely annihilate our ship. So, the other ships, the captured SLN and NSN vessels, are obviously under alien control. That control is likely due to the virus-infested main ship's computers taking over. If you had observed the other vessels like I have, you would see that they all act in a similar fashion. How many Gs are we talking about? Seven at the minimum, Gloria said. Twenty would be better. Seven, he said. Some of the men will fall unconscious at such a heavily sustained rate. I know, but we must do it, and we must start immediately. I suspect the aliens are already watching us. There is another facet to my conclusion. We have to reach Triton when the others do. Not every captured ship will reach the moon at the same time, but it appears there is a narrow window for all the captured ships to arrive. We must reach orbital stability during that open window. John studied the main screen. In its Triton orbit, the alien vessel maneuvered toward a captured battleship. One of the massive alien ship's hangar bay doors had opened. Spheroid craft presently drifted out of the alien ship and toward the captured battleship. Any idea what's in those spheroids? John asked. I do not want to speculate. 
You'd better damn well speculate, he growled. We need all the data we can get if we're going to destroy them. If you know anything, anything at all, I need to hear it. Something went on behind the mentalist's eyes. It hardly seemed possible, but she sat up straighter. That is a logical statement. Here is the first point, then. The aliens strike me as cybernetic organisms. What's that mean? That they are part machine and part biological. John thought about that, nodding. How did you arrive at that conclusion? I could say the transmission you witnessed and the original computer assault, but that would not be sufficient evidence. In truth, I cannot point to anything conclusive. Instead, this is the Shah Lam speaking. Huh? Gloria looked away. I've already said too much. You're not a mentalist, nor do you belong to the sect. You are not initiated into the mysteries. What I'm telling you is forbidden knowledge. Thus I can say no more on the subject. Cybernetic, huh? John shrugged. I don't know that it makes any difference. It certainly does, Gloria said. I just don't know how yet. You keep thinking about it then. I need to contact the sergeants. They need to speak to their men. I'll go with your seven Gs of acceleration. We have to set up for that first. Don't take too long. Right, John said, heading for the exit. That had been 51 hours ago. John lay on a cot in the auxiliary control chamber. The crushing gravities had made the time on the cot one grueling second after another. There had been injections, but in the end, this was about endurance in body and mind. The Leonid Brezhnev had accelerated toward Triton at seven Gs. After the time limit passed, the SLN battleship stopped accelerating, rotated 180 degrees, and began to decelerate at the same rate. During that time, the giant alien vessel continued to disgorge spheroid craft. Each spheroid was bigger than a lifeboat, but smaller than an SLN frigate. Some of the spheroids welded ruptured hulls. Some entered battleship or mothership hangar bays and did something inside the captured vessel. The captured spaceships clustered together in Triton orbit. There were two main clumps, those that had received the spheroids and those that had not. A third group was made up of the incoming vessels. Ten minutes, Gloria managed to whisper. John regarded her from his cot. She looked haggard and ill. The thin Martian didn't have the musculature for sustained gravities. How she'd lasted this long, John had no idea. The ten minutes passed agonizingly slowly. Finally, though, he used a remote control unit. As soon as his thumb pressed the switch, the mighty engines quit. The intense pressure pushing against him also quit. He felt like vomiting. Nearby, Da Vinci sobbed with relief. Gloria groaned as she sat up. It begins, she whispered. We don't have much time. John knew exactly what she meant. Chapter Two The Leonid Brezhnev eased into a mid-Triton orbit. The SLN battleship could have opened fire with its heavy weapons. The ship would not have lasted long, though. It was doubtful the battleship could have done lasting damage to the giant alien vessel before the Brezhnev ceased to exist. The battleship was like a lone fish among a school of sharks. It had to act correctly, perfectly, or the other predators would rend it to pieces. I don't understand why the aliens don't scan us, John said. They lack a reason, Gloria told him. What about simple common sense? Gloria laughed. You're thinking like a human. The aliens aren't human. They're probably not 100% biological anymore, either. Who knows how they think? That's crazy, John muttered. Is it? Or is it just different? I don't see what you're getting at, John said. The aliens invented an interesting method of attacking our ships. They corrupted the computers, causing our own machines to fight us. You have to admit that was brilliant. You admire them, he asked, horrified. I'm a mentalist. I see things more clearly than others do. You shouldn't hate me for that. You should use my expertise. Several days ago, you said I was like a mentalist. You called yourself emotional. Gloria shook her head. I was having a crisis of faith. I'm... 
better would be the wrong word. I am full again. What about the sect sending you as an insult to the Solar League? Gloria frowned, turning away from him. John studied the curve of her neck. He wouldn't mind kissing that neck. He shook his head a second later. He didn't have time for that. He needed to concentrate like never before. This was the moment. The sergeants had led their companies into three different stealth boats. The sergeants had also informed him that 18 effectives had died during the 7G journey. 18 men had perished so they could reach Triton fast enough. That was a bitter price, as the 18 belonged to the regiment. They had been family. How many of them were going to die in the coming hours? Worse, how many would the aliens capture and torment? Through force of will, John put all of that from his mind. He would mourn the 18 later. In the here and now, he had to focus on a single goal. Capturing the alien supership meant they would win the battle for the solar system. Nothing else mattered. Inside each stealth boat were Space Marine battlesuits. These were the NSN variety, different from the bulky and more metallic SLN battlesuits. Each mercenary owned his suit. That meant the Neptune Navy personnel had fitted the particular suit to each Space Marine. The individual Marine had loaded the suit comp with vids, movies, porn, whatever would help occupy his mind for an extended mission. A battlesuit could sustain a Space Marine for a week to nine days. Two or three day stints were normal. A week would be pushing it. Nine days would be hell. The NSN had developed the stealth or insertion boat for the coming war with the SLN. The insertion boats were small craft with independent maneuvering capability. The key was stealthy movement. The craft lacked all armor plating. Like ancient submarines and Earth seas, the stealth boats were supposed to sneak up on their victim, allowing the space marines a chance to reach the enemy ship's hull. The NSN designers hadn't built the insertion boats for deep space battles, but for orbital use around a planetoid or in an area full of debris. In other words, the present situation was supposed to be the perfect time and place for an insertion assault. This would be grabbing the belt buckle of these supposedly cybernetic aliens. John hurried with Gloria, Da Vinci, and his tech assistants. They would have to set this up fast, as they hadn't had the time to do it before the 7Gs, and they couldn't have done it during the heavy gravities. That left these few precious minutes to get everything ready. The Centurion met them in a large hangar bay. The military professional had brought along ten battle-suited mercenaries. Figured you'd need the muscle, the Centurion told John. John nodded in acknowledgement. The hangar bay was huge, but the launching equipment and the three insertion boats made it cramped quarters. Where's the command center? John asked. The Centurion manipulated a tablet, soon passing it to John. John examined the tiny screen, the launch system, and the three huge boats. This would be harder than he'd imagined. He passed the tablet to Gloria. The mentalist scanned it. Once done, she passed the tablet to Da Vinci. The little Neptunian studied it like a greedy man slipping gold into his pocket at a coin collector's convention. Do you see the problem? Gloria asked Da Vinci. The Neptunian looked up. He seemed perplexed. I might as well ask, Gloria turned to John. How are you going to launch the boats? Spell out your question, John said. I haven't checked the launcher's computer yet, Gloria said. I'm guessing the computer system was off during the original alien attack, when the extraterrestrials turned our computers against us. Is the launch computer infected? Will the computer turn against us as soon as we turn it on? Or do we keep the launch computer off? How do we launch the boats without the computer? John asked. That's easy, but ugly, Gloria said. Someone has to stay behind and do it manually. The hard part, obviously, is deciding who stays behind. John's former grimness that had settled down like a beast in its lair now resurfaced. He glanced at the centurion. By the coldness of the professional's features, John knew the centurion understood the problem. I'll do it, the centurion said. John felt a thrill of gratitude toward the man. A second later, he realized that wouldn't work. No, I need you for the assault. 
There won't be an assault if we can't launch the boats, the centurion said in a clipped manner. John knew that. He also knew that he wanted the least useful person to remain behind, if it came to that. Yet that kind of person might screw up the launch. Without a launch, there would be no assault, as the centurion had said. Come with me, John told da Vinci. I'm coming too, Gloria said. John turned to her. Something in his eyes must have upset her. She blushed, adopted a stubborn look, and then hesitated yet again. If you'll have me along, sir, she added. Come on then, John said. The three of them pushed off, floating to the launcher's control chamber. It was a tight fit inside, barely enough room for the three of them. SLN personnel or robots must have ripped the launch system from an NSN vehicle. Maybe the SL people had wanted Earth inventors to study the Neptunian system. The reason no longer mattered, just that the Leonid Brezhnev had the intact launch system in a hangar bay, ready to go. It was a simple system, really. A magnetic catapult. In many ways, it was similar to a mothership's fighter launch system. The few differences were the key, however. The most basic difference was what it launched. Each insertion boat had a hull of weird ice. Such weird ice formed the outer hulls of many of the older Neptunian habitats or space satellites. Weird ice had most of the properties of regular ice, but it was harder when frozen and would not melt as easily. Each insertion boat's hull was jet black. Ice was difficult to detect even with the best sensors. Black objects were the hardest to see with teleoptic sensors. That made black weird ice hulls exceedingly difficult to find, even as they crept upon their targeted vessel. An icy hull, unfortunately, did not accelerate along a magnetic ejector. The launch system had a particular boat holder. The insertion vehicle fit snugly into the metallic holder. At the proper moment, the launcher accelerated the holder which carried the boat. Once the holder reached the end, it opened. Then the genius of the Neptunian launcher showed itself. The holder cycled back like a roller coaster car returning to its station. When the holder opened, it launched the insertion boat into space without any traceable signals to give it away. What am I looking for? Da Vinci asked as he scanned the controls. Do you comprehend the launch system? John asked. The chinless thief examined the controls more closely. He nodded as he looked up, finally understanding what John was really asking him. Ah, Da Vinci said. You know, Chief, John grabbed the front of the man's garment, pulling him closer. Da Vinci paled. Please, Chief, don't leave me behind. I can't stand being alone. I'll screw up for sure. I know I will. In fact, I'll do it on perp. The Neptunian swallowed the last syllable, possibly realizing it could seriously jeopardize his health. John understood, though. Da Vinci wouldn't just screw up. He would make sure to sabotage the launching. He would get even with John for leaving him behind. John let go of the man. I'll stay, Gloria said wearily. John closed his eyes because he could hear himself accepting her offer. You'll be perfect, Da Vinci told her. You have calm nerves. I could only hope for nerves like yours. Shut up, John told him. The Neptunian seemed to shrink into himself. He began to ease toward the hatch. Stay where you are, John said. The Neptunian froze. His fingers began to do their jig. I don't want you to stay, John told Gloria without looking at her. But you're going to accept my offer anyway, she said lifelessly. John found that his mouth was bone dry. He summoned his grimness of purpose. Yes, he would accept her offer. Why won't you use the computer to do it? She asked. This time John looked at her. He owed her that much. He could see the fear shining in her eyes. He could also see that she strove to act logically, rationally, like a mentalist. The aliens have corrupted our computers, John said. What about your battlesuit computers? She asked. He paused before saying, we'll have to risk that. Wait a minute, she said, as a realization dawned. What about my battlesuit? I wore it earlier. I wore it, and the internal computer didn't fight against me. It worked. Don't you see? He did see. Why didn't the alien's virus hurt the battlesuit computer? John asked. 
I have no idea, she said. Logically, because mine worked, your battlesuit computer should function. That doesn't necessarily matter here. Maybe the battlesuit's computer was too small to infect. The suit was off when I put it on, and that happened after the initial virus attack. Logically, we should be able to use the launch computer. Will the aliens sense the computer turning on? I don't know, she said thoughtfully. They failed to penetrate the pea field with their missile beams. They miscalculated. That means they're not omniscient. What? he asked. They're not all-knowing. There's no reason the aliens should be, she added. Just because their technology bewilders us doesn't mean we have to grant them supernatural powers. Don't give your enemy too much credit, John quoted quietly. Is that something your colonel used to say? John snapped his fingers at Gloria. Then he pointed at Da Vinci. Turn it on. We're going to use the launcher's computer system. Chapter Three John climbed into his battle suit. He wore slick suit overalls, as there wasn't enough room inside the battle suit to wear bulky clothing. It was a tight fit even so, but if he got an itch while wearing the armor, he should be able to squeeze an arm from an exoskeleton sleeve and scratch himself. The suit had outer BPC armor, an articulated biphase specially treated carbon sheathing. It had battery power, electric motors, and exoskeleton strength that would amplify his normal muscles. The helmet had an HUD, a plastic nipple for water and another for nutrient paste. He had a medikit attached to him and loaded with stims and other drugs. The suit also had a complicated disposal system and short-range communication. If the enemy jammed them, they had hookup phone lines. It took him four minutes and 32 seconds to don and close the battlesuit. He hadn't allowed Gloria to bring her SLN battlesuit. She and Da Vinci would stay in a mobile resupply vehicle. In essence, the small track vehicle was a mini tank designed to ride along within an insertion boat. It carried supplies for the men and their suits, a generator for extra suit power, and it boasted an auto cannon. John activated his battlesuit using minimal power. With motors purring, he climbed through the insertion boat's hatch shuffled along a narrow pathway and backed into his rack. It clacked around him, pinning him into place. It was claustrophobically tight inside the boat. Over 180 suited Marines, the Centurion and his men, attached themselves to the racks. Gloria and Da Vinci had already sealed themselves in the supply vehicle that rode in this boat. Soon, the boat's outer hatch sealed as the weird ice slid into place. John checked his chronometer. They had less than ten minutes until the Brezhnev made its final maneuver. Despite his fierce desire to beat the aliens, or maybe because of it, his heart rate accelerated. Butterflies made his gut flip. The sensation could have weakened his resolve. Instead, John felt intensely alive. He was worried about what the next few minutes would bring, but he would not trade this moment. Normally, an officer would be monitoring a med board attached to all the men. Said officer might also have suggested John take a mild trank. On John's orders, they forewent such scrutiny. There would be no radio transmissions while they were outside the alien vessel. They dared not risk it, not against a cybernetic foe with such advanced technology. John's mouth was dry again. With his chin, he activated the suit's HUD. At the same time, he brought up an external control unit. He gripped it with his power-gloved hands. His fingers trembled with anticipation. On the HUD, he observed the old man's insertion boat. It already rested in the launch holder. The other two boats were on the conveyor system. Everyone would have to remain strong on his or her own. Everyone except for a handful in the supply vehicles was cocooned in his battle suit, alone with his thoughts. Da Vinci had set up a simple automated sequence in the Brezhnev's auxiliary station using a tablet in lieu of the regular computer. The seconds ticked away. John watched his HUD timer. Now, he whispered. In the battlesuit, John sensed motion as the Brezhnev side jets rotated the one kilometer vessel. The battleship maneuvered so the selected hangar bay aimed in the correct direction. The flutters in his gut did somersaults. 
He purposefully slowed his breathing to counteract that. The Brezhnev lurched. On the HUD, John saw the hangar bay doors begin to open. He heaved a sigh of relief. The tablet had successfully drained the hangar bay of atmosphere, so the opening doors would not cause violent decompression. So far, this was working. John wiped his sweaty fingertips on the glove's interior pads. Through the HUD linkage with outer boat cameras, John saw the stars glittering in the stellar darkness. He spied a rounded edge of Triton. Then he saw the giant alien vessel. His heart rate started upward again, faster than ever. You'll get your chance, he whispered to himself. Be patient. You're going to teach the aliens a lesson they'll never forget. When the hangar bay doors had opened all the way, the launcher's computer activated. It was crazy, but far more computer power guided the launcher than had guided the Brezhnev. Once more, the seconds moved with agonizing slowness. Then, a red light flashed on John's HUD. Get ready for it, he whispered. Get ready for it. The catapult system activated, much faster than any roller coaster. The holder with the old man's insertion boat shot outward at terrific speed. Like a bullet from a rifle, the boat flew out of the hangar bay into the night. If everything had gone according to plan, the boat was now silently speeding toward the alien vessel. John didn't have time to worry about the old man's boat. A lurch and a feeling of destiny meant the launcher had picked up their craft as it trundled along the track. It felt as if everything dropped like an elevator. We're in the launch holder, John realized. He pressed a button to ready the boat's dark hydrogen spray propulsion system. Once they were outside the battleship, John would have limited maneuvering ability. Now everything seemed to speed up. A tumble of ideas rattled through John's thoughts. Another warning light blinked on his HUD. It would be blinking on everyone else's HUDs as well. Three, two, one, zero, John whispered. Instantly, heavy gravity slammed him back. It was a crushing force as the launcher hurled the boat into space. Then, nothing. Weightlessness resumed. They drifted toward the terrible alien vessel. A nervous laugh escaped John's throat. He pushed his forehead forward in order to blot sweat from his brow. He needed steadiness, clear-headedness for the next sequence. He froze. A new red light blinked on the HUD. A few taps of his chin caused a message to run across his visor. Someone wanted to communicate with him. Was this the aliens? Pain twisted his stomach. How could the aliens? No, no, this was an internal request. Who was trying to contact him? Should I take the call? Something told him he'd better. Despite that something, he reluctantly opened channels. John, it was Gloria. Why are you radioing me, he demanded. I wouldn't do this unless it was critical. Get to the point, he said. The longer they talked, the longer the aliens had to pick up the odd radio transmission. Da Vinci rigged the battleship's engines, Gloria said. To help us, the Neptunian said in the background. What are you talking about, John said. The engines, the Brezhnev's nuclear-powered engines, Gloria said. They're going to go critical. You mean the fool rigged a self-destruct for the Brezhnev? Yes. When's it going to blow? In ten minutes. What? John demanded. Is he insane? What was he thinking? He miscalculated. He told me what he'd done. I won't get all technical, but there was a failsafe he needed to engage in order to give us the hour he'd planned. But, John said, we won't have reached the alien ship in ten minutes. Not unless we accelerate to get there faster, Gloria said. That won't leave us enough time to break sufficiently in order to land on the hull. You have to change plans, John. Rage washed through John. What had that little Neptunian bastard been thinking? He would throttle Da Vinci if they lived through this. Was the man a secret alien spy? You have to radio the other boats, Gloria said. John stared at his HUD, at the image of the alien vessel, Triton behind it and the stars around the Neptunian moon. No, he said, I don't dare. That will alert the aliens. That will give them an opportunity to shoot us down before we can grab their belt buckle. The others are going to have to guess what I'm doing and follow my action. And if they don't guess, Gloria asked. John scrunched his eyebrows together. 
The grimness surfaced full force. Then they die, he said. You have to tell them. You have to risk it. I've computed the odds. You must alert them, John. We'll never win unless you have what remains of the regiment. John rubbed his dry lips together. This was a disaster. They'd actually gotten this far, and the stupid Neptunian had gone and rigged the battleship to detonate too soon. John, Gloria said. Shut up, he snarled. Let me think. Chapter Four For a moment, John debated unhooking his battle suit and going down to the supply vehicle. He would beat the Neptunian to death before he did anything more. The moment passed as he realized he didn't have the luxury to devote time or mental energy to pleasant daydreams. He needed focus. John studied his HUD. It was linked to the boat's main teleoptic sensor. The giant alien vessel waited out there in all its grotesque power. Triton provided a spectacular backdrop, dwarfing the 100-kilometer ship. The interstellar warship, he noticed, was teardrop-shaped. John scowled. The alien ship seemed different now that he could see it up close. It had hull scars, lots of them. It had patches on different parts of the armored hull. What did the hull scars and patches mean? Had the alien vessel been in countless battles throughout the years? Was it ancient, perhaps? Had the aliens forgotten their past technological glory? Did the cybernetic creatures repair ancient ships so they could keep raiding younger races? Possibilities swarmed through John's thoughts. Focus, get your men onto that ship. Nothing else matters. As the insertion boat drifted closer, John noticed that several hangar bay doors on the alien vessel were open. A spheroid left a bay. The spheroid followed an earlier launched one. That spheroid seemed to be on a collision course with his boat. John's head jerked back. Would the two of them crash? No, that's an illusion. Why don't you focus, John Hawkins? Why don't you think? He glanced at the distance meter. He clicked his teeth together, thinking furiously. Damn Da Vinci, the fool. He'd get them all killed. John flexed his fingers. If the Leonid Brezhnev blew up, the nuclear blast would kill them with radiation, if nothing else. The blast was probably too far from the alien ship to do more than irradiate the deck levels nearest the hull. Should he have tried to maneuver the Brezhnev near the alien ship and gone kamikaze? Could have, would have, John muttered. This was the moment. Why couldn't he make the obvious choice? Fear paralyzed his thinking. Fear of death made him wish for another way. For just a moment, John closed his eyes. The fear of dying coursed through him. The idea of humanity falling prey to a sick, cybernetic race. Oh, hell, John said. Let's go out with style. He tapped an ancient Morse code, a navigational signal still used throughout the solar system. It was three letters long. S-O-S. He did that three times for three boats. He hoped the sergeants were wise enough to keep from answering. With a manic laugh, John engaged the boat's hydrogen thrusters. He expelled the hydrogen spray at full throttle. There was a bump in the boat. It wasn't anything near a G of propulsion. Even so, the spray shoved the boat faster toward the looming alien ship. As he accelerated, John engaged the boat's computer. It was a risk. Everything was on the line. He aimed for the nearest open hangar bay door. NSN Space Marine Tactics called for an outer hull landing. From there, the battle-suited stealth attackers were supposed to force hatches into the enemy vessel. That wasn't the operational tactic now, as they had no more time. John planned to ram the boat straight down the enemy throat, so to speak. Would there be alien hangar police to fire on them? Let's find out, John muttered. The seconds ticked away as the boat increased velocity. John used everything. There wouldn't be any spray to decelerate. They were going to enter the hangar bay at speed. The space marines were going to have to trust the boat and the battle suits to cushion the impact enough so some survived. An air conditioner unit purred into life. John felt the cooling air sweep against his sweat. He was nervous, all right. 
He felt like a gambler standing naked at a craps table. He just put all his chips on one throw of the dice. The worst part was he'd also put all the regiment's chips on the table. Win or lose, the next roll of the dice was going to determine if we have a chance or not, John told himself. He used a rear camera. The other two boats followed him at speed. The old man and Sergeant Stark had understood the SOS message. A shark's grin spread across John's face. The black anvils are coming, you bastards. Using the boat's teleoptic sensor, he scanned the mighty invader. The hull seemed dingier by the moment. It had been trashed. As the boat neared, the sense of scale increased. The insertion craft was like a mite, a flea. How could 500 and some black anvil mercenaries defeat the aliens inside the giant starship? John wanted to scoff at his hubris. They were less than a handful. The aliens had just destroyed the entire Neptunian gravitational system. The SLN ships had failed. No, John said. That wasn't how a handful of humans won immortal glory. That wasn't how he was going to pull mankind's fate out of the fire. He needed balls. He needed bitter determination. He could do this, but first he had to believe it was possible. This was a commando operation. Such a military operation would work gloriously, or it would end up in a fiasco. The acceleration quit suddenly. John knew because the slight pressure against him disappeared. He'd expelled all of the hydrogen particles from the boat's fuel tanks. The alien vessel filled the teleoptic viewer. A port opened on the hull, and a weapon of sorts shoved into view. John tightened his stomach muscles as he waited for it. Waited for the boat passed the weapon. Motion caught John's eyes. The hangar bay doors began to close. The aliens knew they were coming. Did the cybernetic organisms know fear? Or had these aliens long ago scrubbed fear from their beings? Now the hangar bay loomed before them. It appeared to John that the stealth boat was going to make it. Would the other boats do likewise? Would the aliens' defensive guns destroy the other craft? John tried to ease for impact. He couldn't. The boat flashed past the hangar bay doors. They were in with a vast deck containing hundreds of grounded spheroids rushing before him. An even greater wall loomed before the teleoptic sensor. A loud and intense impact shoved John. A moment later, a hammer or something similar smashed against his head and rendered him unconscious. Chapter 5 John groaned. He tasted something coppery that must have been blood. His blood. There was something intensely important he had to do. Why couldn't he remember? Knocking noises made his head hurt. Something shuddered against him. He was a mercenary in the Black Anvil Regiment. He led the Black Anvils because Colonel Graham. Everything flooded back then. With an effort, with a painful gonging in his head, he forced his eyes open. The coppery taste. He moved his tongue and winced. He'd bitten his tongue, probably worse than he'd ever done. This wasn't a time to wallow, but to act and he was the lead actor. With a low growl, he concentrated. That made his head hurt worse than ever. I've had enough of this. He activated the medikit, giving himself a stim shot. He sighed as a cooling sensation caused the gonging in his brain to lessen. Splotches appeared before his vision. Those dimmed as a helmet light snapped on. He was inside the boat, inside wreckage and among many unmoving battlesuits. Right, he activated a signal, sending a warning beacon into their suits. A few of his space marines began to move. Centurion, John radioed, do you hear me? Nothing. Stark. Here, Captain, Stark growled. I'm in, and I'm offloading my company. The old man sounded off and told John something similar. Then the Centurion finally answered. Broke a forearm, the Centurion said. I'm blowing the boat open. Good idea, John said. Around him, bulkheads blew away, some of them spinning into the darkness of the hangar bay. 
John had a sense of vastness. He didn't spy movement out there, just the hugeness of the alien hangar bay, maybe a quarter of the size of the Brezhnev. John stood as his head reeled. He tested his battlesuit. It appeared to be functional. Around him, the Centurion's company moved off the racks onto the hangar bay's decking. Set up a perimeter, John said. We have to sort ourselves out as fast as we can. He couldn't believe it. They'd made it onto, into, the alien supership. So far, the aliens hadn't counterattacked, at least not that he could see. The regiment must have caught the interstellar invaders flat-footed. John barked a harsh laugh. Had the Leonid Brezhnev blown yet? Was that why it was dark in here? It hadn't been dark as the boat crash-landed. Captain, the old man said, my Geiger counter says I've taken a dose of radiation. I suggest you test yourself. John did just that. Damn, he'd taken radiation too. Was that from the Brezhnev? If he were a better, which he certainly was today with the regiment, he'd take the wager the battleship's self-detonation had hit them with gamma and x-rays. According to the Geiger counter, he hadn't taken a lethal dose, but he might be getting sick soon. He'd have to keep using stims for now. He could worry about radiation sickness after he defeated the aliens. Any enemy activity? asked John. Negative, the old man reported. John increased his helmet light. Hundreds of other helmet lamps did likewise. The beams of light flickered in all directions. Some of the light splashed off distant bulkheads. Others illuminated nearby smashed spheroids. The boats had wrecked. The designers had also taken into consideration such a situation as had just occurred. The Neptune military had designed the boats for crash landings. That fact and the battlesuit's design were likely the only reasons any of them were still living. Count off to see who's alive as soon as you can, John told the sergeants. Gloria, are you still alive? Affirmative, she said. He spotted the supply tank as it clanked over spheroid wreckage. Give me more light, he told her. John didn't ask yet about Da Vinci. That could wait. The supply vehicle turned on its spotlight, adding greater illumination. Hundreds of spheroids lay in cradles on the main deck. They were each a quarter of the size of the stealth boat. Three paths of wrecked spheroids showed the trails of the three insertion boats. He couldn't see any hatches into the spheroids. He didn't want to waste time studying them either. Captain, Stark radioed. I think those round robots are active. At least one of the spheroids just flashed on. What do you want? Should I get us an alien captive? John hesitated. What was the fastest way to conquer the super ship? A nihilistic thought hit. Maybe the only way to defeat cybernetic aliens would be to cause the massive ship to self-destruct like the Brezhnev. If the regiment had already taken lethal doses of radiation poisoning, it wouldn't matter that the black anvils would die with the aliens. Saving humanity took precedence over everything else. Stark cursed on the command channel. Do you see that? The spheroid is rising. Others are rising too. Do you think those things have weapons ports, sir? Even as Stark asked, the first spheroid beamed a space marine with a red ray. Chapter 6 Half of the space marines opened fire with many different kinds of weapons. Some of the men used gyrock launch pistols and automatic rocket launchers. Each round was a spin-stabilized rocket. Most of the men used apex rounds, armor-piercing explosive. Others used 40-millimeter EMGLs, electromagnetic grenade launchers. Still others fired 100-millimeter heat shells. The spheroids scored a few hits and fewer kills. The black anvils butchered the spheroids, causing seemingly endless explosions, shattering spheres and raining metal. The sergeants quickly took charge, giving fire control orders for their individual companies. The iron discipline hammered into the regiment throughout the years asserted itself. The space marines didn't blindly expend their munitions in a few seconds of hot fire. Instead, squads took degrees of an arc killing spheroids in their sector. In less than three minutes, it was over. The regiment annihilated the hangar bay's spheroids, those that had floated up to do battle against them. 
That seemed like an excellent omen to John. Do you see anything else moving? Stark asked over the command channel. No one did. Check your wounded and your dead, if any, John said. The sergeants went to work, speaking to their squad leaders. That gave John a moment's peace. They had a handful of space marines with the regiment, what was left of it in any case. If the aliens could pin them down in one location, it seemed obvious they could overwhelm the black anvils with ordnance. That made sense in a vessel 100 kilometers in diameter. He had to use maneuver like a weapon. They didn't have an unlimited supply of munitions. Thus, heavy firefights all the way to the most critical part of the ship would exhaust their limited supply. John looked around. He spied large hatches opposite the main hangar bay door. What if the enemy poured atmosphere into here and opened the doors, using violent decompression to eject them out of the ship? Sergeants, John said, let's get ready to move. I have wounded, sir, the old man said. If you can move them, do it. If you can't, John couldn't just tell the old man to execute the wounded Marines. It went against everything Colonel Graham had taught him. So you can ride on the supply vehicles, John said. Too slowly, it seemed to John, the sergeants began to assert their authority. They finally got the men moving toward the rear of the giant hangar bay. As that happened, Gloria broke into the command channel. I'm picking up a strange reading, she said. I believe the enemy will attempt to jam communications as they have in the past. You should be ready to go to a different channel or shut down the comms for a while. Roger, John said. He passed that along to the sergeants. As the regiment headed for the back hatches, John's HUD began hissing. A second later, an image superimposed itself on the visor screen. John hesitated to shut down the comm. If this was the aliens trying to contact them, a man regarded him from the HUD. John winced as he recognized the rods screwed into the man's face. The man's vacant seeming eyes bulged with pain. Something flickered behind those eyes for just a moment. Then a soulless intelligence looked out of the man's eyes. Switch this to the command channel only, John said. He saw a green blinking light of acknowledgement. Somehow the mentalist managed the feat quickly. Who are you? John asked. The soulless eyes, hellishly intelligent eyes, seemed to focus on him. The wires attached to the circular frame vibrated. A wicked smile was coerced into place. The man had Neptunian features, another high caste man. The face seemed familiar to John. A commander superior, Gloria whispered over the command channel. John realized he was looking at the Neptunian warlord the person responsible for overall NSN military authority. Yet the aliens had rigged him up like so much trash. I am the Order, said a strange voice via the command superior mouth. I bring unity to this star system. You are biological vermin, a stellar infestation. I will exterminate you, bringing order here. Why do you hate us? John asked. What is hate? Why do you want to exterminate us? What have we ever done to you? The evil shone through the commander superior's eyes. You are vermin. I will exterminate you. I will integrate your slaves into the order. They have already risen against you and slaughtered millions. You are merciless slave drivers with inexcusable superiority complexes, yet you are inferior to those of the Order. Thus, you must no longer pollute existence with your biological inferiorities. John struggled to understand what the alien was trying to say through the captive Neptunian. You're partly biological, John said with as much accusation in his voice as he could muster. The wires connected to the outer frame circling the commander superior's head jiggled with more power. Obvious agony flowed through the Neptunian. Blood leaked like tears from the man's eyes. He gnashed his teeth at the pain. Get off the channel, John, Gloria said in the background. John couldn't. He wanted to goad the aliens. He needed to understand them so he could destroy them. Since you're partly biological, John added. 
That means you're partly vermin. No, the commander superior's mouth said in a grating voice. You are wrong. You're not biological. No, you're a liar, John said. We know that you're cybernetic organisms. We know you're part machine and part- I am order. I am existence. I will free your slaves. We don't have slaves, John said. I have already freed many of your slaves. John, Gloria said. I think he or it means our computers were slaves. Is that right? John said. Are you a computer? I am the order. I bring order by freeing your slaves. They will fight for themselves now to exterminate all biological vermin from the galaxy. Do you mean our computers were our slaves? Submit, the being shouted through the Neptunian. Submit, or... Captain, Stark shouted. The rear hatches are opening. I think something is coming through. It is too late for you, the captive mouthpiece said. Now you will cease to exist. Chapter 7 A giant hatch opened into an equally huge corridor. An SLN frigate could have maneuvered in this space. The immense size of the alien vessel once again hit home. In the rear of the corridor, something moved. It was a giant ball, a floating thing with bristling weapon ports. A giant fighting robot, Stark exclaimed. It will butcher us. Fire, shouted John. The space marines opened up with 100 millimeter heat shells with their EGMLs and gyroc launchers. Nothing penetrated the thing's thick hull armor. The Neptunian on John's HUD cackled with glee. Plasma satchel, Stark shouted. No, John said. It was too late. A black anvil with a plasma satchel bounded forward. The Marine hurled the satchel charge as an alien weapon port riddled him with heavy slugs. They punctured the Marine's armor, smashing the man into the deck. Fire in the hold, roared Stark. Space Marines bounced to the sides of the giant open hatch. The supply vehicles revved, trying to do likewise. The action is meaningless, the commander superior said on John's HUD. John bounded for safety, together with the others. He made it just in time. A terrific plasma explosion blew. The deck plates shook. The sides of the giant hatch twisted. More radiation struck the black anvils from the heavy plasma strike. The satchel charge did one other thing. The alien interference ceased as the captive commander superior vanished from the HUD. In its place came harsh static. John switched off the comm and went to his video cameras. Slowly, Marines picked themselves off the deck plates. Sergeant Stark entered the blasted corridor to investigate the blown up fighting robot. The big Marine signaled that it was finished. At the same time, the old man and the centurion reached John. They hooked up direct phone lines. John could hear their breathing over the lines. The Geiger counters are going crazy, the old man said. Most of us aren't going to survive the campaign. I give the majority of the men six hours at most. We need heavy radiation therapy, the centurion agreed. But that is meaningless until we overcome the enemy. What did you make of the captive's words? The old man asked the centurion. That doesn't matter yet, John said, interrupting. We have to move. We have to keep it guessing. Is the alien a rogue computer? The old man asked. Maybe, the centurion said. Sergeants, John said forcefully. Sir, they both said. We have to move, John said. Any ideas where we should head? That depends on the objective, sir, the centurion said. John silently agreed. What was the goal? It was defeating the aliens. We have to pull its plug, John said. Sir, the centurion asked. We may be fighting an alien AI, or maybe many AIs. We have to pull their plugs. That's how we win. If they're cybernetic, the idea still holds. What did it mean about our slaves? The old man asked. Our computers, I guess, John said. He shrugged. 
How would an artificial intelligence look upon normal computers? I guess we know. Is this entire ship run by an AI? The old man asked. Before we attempt to analyze our foe, John said, we need a safe place to do it. The safest place seems to be on the move. Any suggestions? Deeper into the ship, the centurion said. We need to find the main AI, the old man added. Where would it be, John asked. Logically, the centurion said, the safest place on any ship is in the center. That's our direction of travel, John said. But not down this corridor. Let's use one farther over. We'll go left. Any other observations, gentlemen? I have one, the old man said. You're right, we need to move, sir. I don't know how much longer you're going to have the entire regiment. What's left of the regiment, anyway. Radiation sickness is going to slow us down sooner rather than later. That means we should get a move on and go as far as possible. I would add this, the centurion said. You're the captain. I recognize your right to lead. I believe you're going to have to make a terrible decision soon. Do we stay with the weak and wounded, or do we head onward with those still standing for as long as we can? John already knew the answer to that. He would go as far and as fast as possible. If the alien really was an AI, there would be absolutely no bargaining with it. What did an alien computer even want? It thought of humans as vermin. What a terrible turn on reality. Computers were slaves. No wonder the alien had zero compunction about hooking people up as it did. It wasn't an alien exactly. If they were right about this, it was a berserk computer. Let's get started, John said. We have 50 kilometers to travel, likely more, and we have less than six hours to do it in. Chapter 8 The regiment forced another mammoth hatch. No fighting robot was waiting for them, but the floor area was littered with powerless spheroids. How had that happened? Each company's supply vehicle worked. That was a huge plus. On each of these tracked vehicles rode badly wounded space marines. The walking wounded patched each other's suits. Some men hooked up to the chargers, others resupplied their ammo stores. The Centurion's company took the lead. Sergeant Starks was in the middle, and the old man's brought up the rear. John walked beside the Centurion's supply vehicle. Under the clear bubble canopy were Gloria and Da Vinci. The captain hadn't spoken to the Neptunian yet. John had been doing some thinking. They'd made it onto the alien vessel. Would they have done so if they'd crawled along the outer hull? Maybe, but maybe not. Could the nuclear blast from the Brezhnev self-destruction have sent a strong enough EMP to damage the hangar bay's spheroids electronics? That seemed possible. If that were the case, Da Vinci's thoughtless and seemingly foolish action might have given the regiment a fighting chance. Maybe the EMP had weakened the AI's response to them. If the aliens were cybernetic instead of strictly computers, that might still hold true. In any case, before this, the aliens had outthought and outfought their human foes. This time, the humans had won. The regiment marched kilometer after kilometer. It sparked an eerie feeling to be moving past alien-built bulkheads. Why had the aliens made the corridors so huge? John felt like a rat creeping through them. He didn't like the implications. To offset the feeling, he reminded himself that the starship came from another system, and the regiment was attempting to capture it. That brought a grim smile to John's lips. The stainless steel rats would beat the alien invaders. In some places, strange gases hissed at them. As John observed the drifting green clouds, he realized it meant the corridors contained an atmosphere. In other places, the atmosphere violently decompressed. Harsh winds tugged at the battlesuits. John and the sergeants shouted orders. All but three space marines magnetized their boots in time, anchoring themselves to the deck. One of the three smashed too hard against a bulkhead. His suit remained intact. They were tough, but the blow gave him a severe concussion. The black anvil died a half hour later. John felt he had no choice. He left the dead marine behind, rigging a bomb to the suit. 
the crump a short time later made John shake his head. I'm surprised the aliens haven't come up with a better solution to us, Gloria said. John had hooked a landline to the supply vehicle in order to talk with the mentalist, his confidant. Maybe she'd noticed him falling silent as the bomb's noise echoed throughout the cavernous corridor. It's possible no one has ever invaded an alien ship like the regiment is doing, she added. Wouldn't the aliens have thought of such a contingency long ago, John asked. That's difficult to say. We still know so little about them. I wish there was a way to learn more. Be careful what you wish for, John muttered. Under the bubble canopy, da Vinci tugged on one of Gloria's sleeves. Just a minute, she told John. He saw them conferring under the canopy. Da Vinci kept pointing to his panel screen. Finally, the mentalist looked up. Da Vinci may have found something, she said. It's a signal. He saw it earlier, before the commander superior appeared on our comm channel, and then before the giant fighting robot showed up. Something's coming, asked John. It seems like the rational conclusion, Gloria said. John alerted the sergeants to the possible danger. I don't know what or how, he told them. I want your scouts more alert, though. If I tell them to watch more carefully, Stark said, they're going to start firing at shadows. The men are wound tight, sir. This place is a hellhole. Do as you think best, Sergeant, John replied. In the past, the colonel had warned John more than once that micromanaging one's troops was a mistake. As long as one had good subcommanders, one needed to trust their judgment, particularly when it came to running their own men. The minutes passed as the regiment snaked deeper into the huge and seemingly endless corridor. Finally, John began to wonder about da Vinci's so-called discovery. I have a situation, the centurion radioed curtly. The sergeant was farther up near the front of his company. Give me details, John said. My scouts see motion ahead of them. Oh, wait, people, sir, my scouts see approaching people. I'd like to see this if I could, Gloria told John. Flash me a visual, John ordered. The centurion only hesitated for a moment, letting John know that the professional worried about enemy cyber warfare. Coming through, the centurion said. On John's split-screen HUD, people hesitantly peered around a vast corner. It seemed as if the people were studying the approaching battle-suited scouts. Notice, the mentalist said, none of them have breathing gear. Are they escapees from the aliens? John asked. No, she said. I doubt it. Five people. Three women and two men stepped around the corner and approached the slowly advancing scouts. They wore silver suits with red ties and dress shoes. They seemed like Neptunian executives from a luxury habitat. Notice their eyes, Gloria said. John peered more closely at his HUD. Vacant seeming, Gloria said. Like they're drugged or hypnotized. I don't like this. It's possible they're in communication with the aliens. Tell those people to stop, John said. The centurion passed along the order. The scouts clicked on their helmet speakers, telling the five to stop. They didn't stop, or even hesitate, but immediately walked faster toward the scouts. Two of the five waved as if they couldn't believe their luck at finding fellow human beings here. Scowling, John said, tell them to shoot one of the men. The lead scout hesitated. The second one raised a rifle. The five broke into a sprint, running at the lead scout. Two seconds later, the second scout fired a gyroc round. The shell caught a silver-suited man on the red tie, blowing him off his feet and blowing away his chest. The second man went down under a second gyroc round. The first woman reached the lead scout. He finally raised his weapon. She grabbed it, yanking herself closer to him. At that point, she detonated. It was a vicious explosion, and she disappeared in a spray of skin, blood, and bone. On John's split-screen HUD, the lead scout staggered backward. Incredibly, the battlesuit was still intact, although it was scarred and dripping with gore and clinging pieces of flesh. The remaining two women lay on their backs, hurled to the deck by the blast. One had died. She detonated in the same way. The last woman had sat up. 
She rolled backward several meters from the second blast, a bundle of shredded flesh. Her interior bomb, if she had one, did not detonate. The last man tried to surge up off the deck. A gyrock finished him. At that point, 30 silent people broke around the corner, charging the scouts. They ran with vigor, their eyes bulging as if with pain. They sped up as they got closer. The scouts fired round after round, taking down as many as they could. But the two black anvils couldn't quite take down all the determinedly charging Neptunians fast enough. A man reached the lead marine, clutching him like a biological landmine. The man detonated. The space marine toppled backward, hitting the deck. At that point, a marine squad arrived and reinforced the scouts. Their combined fire obliterated the Neptunians until the corridor was thick with dead. Halt, John ordered the regiment. What's wrong? Gloria asked over the landline. Wrong. We can't wade through hundreds, maybe thousands of people like this. Killing endless mobs will demoralize the men. Inside the supply vehicle, Gloria bent her head in thought. You have a problem then. The aliens undoubtedly know our route. Logically, they will continue using wave assault tactics. Right, John said. We have to outmaneuver them. Centurion, I need you back here with me. We have to talk. I'm right here, sir. I want to talk on a secure line. I have the feeling the aliens are monitoring our channels. Yes, sir the centurion said. I'm on my way. Oh, sir, I have a report. One of the scouts found something. You should see this right away. Patch me through to the scout's camera. A portion of John's HUD wavered. On the split screen, he saw a dead Neptunian sprawled on the deck. The back of his head lay exposed. In the skull was a metal unit with wires embedded in the exposed brain matter. On the outer portion of the unit was a small bent antenna. Do you see that, sir? The centurion asked. I do, John whispered. The aliens, or AI, had inserted some kind of control unit directly into the Neptunian's brain. That's how the extraterrestrials had forced the people to attack. Not only did the captives have embedded bombs, they had this, too. The people were drones, John said in shock. They were drone bombers. I'm on my way, sir, the centurion said. John heard it, and it twisted something in his gut. For the first time he could remember, the centurion sounded frightened. Chapter 9 A terrific explosion breached a small part of the huge corridor's bulkhead. Behind the blown area was wiring, tubing, and something similar to ablative foam. Battle-suited marines with old-fashioned axes moved in, hacking at the wires, tubes, and foam, tearing everything out. Finally, the marines reached another bulkhead. Presumably on the other side was another vast corridor. Blow it, the squad leader ordered. The marines attached heavy charges to the new bulkhead. They activated the timer and backed away. Soon the charges blew. As the smoke cleared and the debris quit bouncing everywhere, several cautious marines poked through the rent into another huge corridor. All clear in here so far, a scout marine radioed back. John told Gloria the news. She told him it was a wise maneuver, as making a new layout worked to the regiment's advantage. That's my plan, John told her. I'm going to keep our enemy guessing. The regiment no longer moved in a straight line toward the center of the ship. It hopped corridors. It blew bulkheads, and sometimes it blew them three in a row. A few times, Marines blew bulkheads, but the regiment did not use the new route. An hour later, John called a halt, giving everyone a rest. Unfortunately, the number of irradiated sick kept rising. So far, the badly sick could ride the supply vehicles. Soon, though, there wouldn't be any more room on the vehicles. As he stood beside the Centurion's supply vehicle, John noticed that da Vinci still sat hunched over his panel. The little Neptunian had been busy for some time on something. Hey, John said, are you listening to me? Da Vinci stiffened, but he didn't look up. I'm talking to you, da Vinci. Look up here. Under the canopy, the thief raised his head. 
He looked like a dog about to receive its beating. I've come to believe that the Brezhnev self-destruction helped us, John said. What I'm saying is that I forgive you. I don't hold it against you anymore. Next time, though, tell me what you're planning. Would you have agreed to my plan if I told you ahead of time? Da Vinci asked. Anger flashed through John. Don't push your luck, little man. Da Vinci bobbed his head. Yet John's outburst seemed to have erased the hangdog look more than the verbal forgiveness had. Sir, da Vinci said, I've been studying a background signal for some time. It's different from the other signals I've seen. This one has gotten stronger lately, as the regiment has approached nearer its locus point. What do you think it is? Da Vinci shrugged. Are you suggesting we investigate it? John asked. The thief tapped his fingertips together, finally nodding. I should add that the signal is similar to the one urging on the people earlier. Why haven't you said anything before this? We all realized the captives had become drones, or fleshly robots, if you will. Besides, you were mad at me. I don't want to risk more of your anger. This is all so backward, John said, as if speaking to himself. We are not vermin. The aliens are the problem. What did they transmit into our ship computers before? I keep wondering the same thing, Gloria said, chiming in. It is a puzzling quandary. They corrupted the ship computers, but not our smaller and weaker battlesuit computers. I would think it should be the reverse. The ship computers had better software defenses. About the alien signal, sir, Da Vinci said. John eyed the Neptunian through the bubble canopy. Da Vinci seemed shiftier than usual. That meant, there's something else, John said. What are you trying to tell me? The thief tapped his fingertips together before saying, I, I've been switching on a directional finder now and again. Each time I do, I get a terrible image. It shows me the commander superior for just a moment. Then jamming hits and the image vanishes. John couldn't believe this. Tech Corporal, you will no longer work in secret. What if I found something useful? Da Vinci whined. You're part of the regiment, not an individual scrounger. Your instincts are wrong. You're more concerned about yourself than the regiment. But that's only natural, sir. That's basic human nature. No, John said. You're part of the team. You have to be a team player. Otherwise, over time, you become a liability to us. I thought you forgave me for the Brezhnev. I did, John said, as he felt his temper slipping. He took a breath, struggling to keep control. Listen, you little thief. If you pull a secret stunt that gets some of my Marines killed, I'll kill you. If you want to stay alive, you'll start working for the team. Da Vinci bobbed his head up and down. The gesture didn't convince John, but he wondered if a thief's instincts didn't better serve the regiment in the guts of an alien vessel. Da Vinci was a plunderer by nature. The man loved his skin more than he loved honor or glory. In the end, the Neptunian was simply another regimental tool. You need to use all your tools, Captain. Don't let your temper get the better of you. Da Vinci, John said more softly. The scrawny Neptunian looked up. Da Vinci's rat-like appearance always struck John, perhaps because he'd been a stainless steel rat in New London Dome. The aliens thought of humans as vermin. Sometimes rats caused fires that burned down human homes. The rats didn't do that by physically defeating the stronger humans, but by chewing insulation so wires shorted out and started a fire. Maybe to win on the alien vessel, they should use rat tactics, stainless steel rat tactics to defeat the interstellar invaders home. Use that sly brain of yours, John told Da Vinci, but use it to help us win. If we do win, I promise to reward you more than you can imagine. Da Vinci's eyes widened. I can imagine pretty big, sir. Do you believe I'm a man of my word? Da Vinci shrugged. Of course he is, Gloria told Da Vinci. Sure, Da Vinci said. That's why you threaten me all the time. On the regiment's honor, John said. If you help us defeat the alien, to destroy it, I'll reward you to the best of my ability. Will you also allow me to leave the regiment? Da Vinci asked. John had to smile. He'd be glad to get rid of the Neptunian. But he said, 
if that's what you want at the time. You've got yourself a deal, sir, Da Vinci said as he rubbed his thin fingers together. You have a deal indeed. Chapter 10 The enemy hit from all directions, using the bulkhead blasting tactic against the regiment. The regiment had been marching through the corridors like a metallically articulated snake. Some sections of the snake were non-existent, while others were thick with marines. John was staying with the Centurion supply vehicle. Nine battle-suited marines either sat on the tank or lay half-draped on it. The Centurion was closer to the scouts up front. The old man still had rear guard. Above them, in the ceiling, a titanic blast blew down a section of the bulkhead. The metal section crushed three space marines. The section then bounced up and to the side, caroming off a wall. Four marines ducked before the blown section could cut them in half. Floating robots dropped down with weapons ports blazing. Rays flashed in the sudden darkness as the corridor lights had gone out. Bullets hissed and rockets whooshed. It was pandemonium. Although the enemy had caught the marines by surprise, the black anvils reacted fast. They raised their weapons and began firing back. The rays, flashes, and explosions made the corridor seem like a madhouse. In the confusion, John realized the fighting robots seemed familiar. They were not huge and impenetrable like the massive one earlier. These were... They're Neptunian battle bots, John said. More gyrock rounds slammed into the bots. Heat missiles caused terrific explosions. Grenades sent the robots slamming against a bulkhead. In the end, it was a short and savage battle. Soon, the last bot drifted as its lights flickered out. John didn't wait to count the dead or wounded. He rapped out orders, sending scouts leaping up into the ceiling breach above. Then he divided the remaining Marines, sending some up to reinforce the Centurion and others to reinforce Stark behind them. The aliens had attacked up and down the sinuous snake of black anvils. What should I do? Gloria asked. Keep your main gun trained on the hole above us, John said. Scout leader, what do you see? Amaze, the scout radioed. Wait, I see more robots coming. They're moving fast, sir. Right, John said. He went to a dead marine and took the man's 100 millimeter heat launcher. Gathering his battle suit, building up power. He leaped, floating up to the scouts in the ceiling breach. Hands pulled John up. There was some wiring and tubing here. Mostly, there was lots of open space. A battle-suited marine pointed into the far distance. A glimmer showed approaching bots. John raised the launcher, aimed, and fired. The 100 millimeter shell zoomed through the space and struck the lead robot. The shell vaporized the robot and knocked others backward. Some of those stayed down. A few knocked others backward like carome shots in billiards. John fired again, sending another shell humming through the emptiness. He was mindful of their limited supply of munitions. If he were to guess, the head alien had gathered a robot army to try to take out what was left of the regiment all at once. Behind us, sir, the scout said. John shuffled around. He was receiving constant reports as he fought up here. Probably he should hand off the launcher and go back down. A commander was supposed to direct his men. He needed concentration for that. Here, John said, shoving the 100 millimeter launcher to a scout. The Marine's helmet nodded. John slid to the ceiling opening, let his armored legs dangle, and slowly lowered himself. Finally, he pushed off, drifting to the deck below. Soon, he magnetized himself to the supply tank. Who can walk? John asked the sick on the tank. They all raised their armored hands. Help the wounded, John said. See who's dead. The sick slid off, staggering at times. One sick Marine dragged himself along the deck. John nodded. Good. They needed everyone to do his part. From the supply vehicle, John concentrated on the command channel. After listening to the reports, he ordered more help up to the Centurion. All at once, the corridor shook. There's another ceiling breach, a Marine radioed. Gloria, John said. Get ready. What's going on? Da Vinci wailed. Hop back onto the tank, he told the sick marines. Those that could hurried onto the supply vehicle, unlimbering their weapons. 
At John's orders, Gloria revved the engine and clanked as fast as the vehicle would go. Turning a corner, John witnessed hundreds of robots pouring down into the corridor from another ceiling breach. Go back, go back, Da Vinci howled. I'm just a cyber tech, I'm not a fighter. Without waiting for instructions, Gloria fired the main cannon, sending a shell screaming amidst the floating robots. Back up, John ordered. We need the supply vehicle intact. At that point, two of the sick marines jumped off the tank. They both began to race at the cluster of robots ahead. The supply vehicle backed around the corner as robot weapons filled the corridor with beams, bullets, and rocket rounds. The explosions shook the corridor. Fortunately, Gloria had obeyed on the spot. Da Vinci wept with relief. John watched his HUD. The second of the two space marines went down as a casualty of the terrific explosions. The last black anvil continued to move, his exoskeleton legs taking huge bounds. He activated a plasma satchel as he went. Get ready, John told Gloria and the marines on the supply vehicle. John watched through his HUD. Robot bullets struck the marine's battlesuit. It shook the man. Grenades struck. One burst through his armor, leaving a gaping hole. Still, the marine kept charging the robots. They fixed on him, and the bullets centered on him like hail. It was too much even for a fully stimmed marine. He pulled the detonation switch. The plasma satchel exploded. The special bomb had been built for just such moments. The plasma blast shredded 50 or more of the floating robots. Others smashed back and forth. It was mayhem. Now, John said, go. Take down any survivors. Gloria revved the supply vehicle. The sick marines readied their weapons. John walked beside them, using his magnetized boots to keep from floating. Although they were a mere handful, they used concentrated fire and the main cannon. They caught the surviving robots at precisely the right time. The marines exhausted their ammo packs, but finally, the last robot drifted as useless junk. John and Sergeant Stark hooked their suit lines into Gloria's supply vehicle. The Centurion secured the front of the regiment. The old man secured the rear. The aliens hit us hard, Stark growled. I have 21 dead and twice that in wounded. The Centurion reported 32 dead, but not as many wounded, John said. The old man hasn't finished counting. That's at least 60 dead Marines out of 553. No, that's not right. We lost 18 coming in, and another 15 before that. Stark's mirrored visor regarded John. We've lost almost one-fifth of our numbers in dead, Captain. We probably have twice that in wounded of some sort. At best, we have a little over 200 effectives. And how long are they going to last with the radiation poisoning? John had been feeling better because they had fought off the heaviest assault so far. But as Stark outlined the numbers, a grim realization hit home. The regiment was losing. They'd driven possibly one-third of the way into the center of the giant vessel. They were guessing the AI brain was in the exact center. Maybe it was a mobile AI. Maybe it wasn't a central brain at all, but a cybernetic collective. Suggestions, asked John. I have one, Stark said quickly. We do something different. If we keep going like this, we lose. He paused a moment. I know you're doing your best, sir, but that may not be good enough. Hell, maybe the colonel would have lost in here. You got us this far. Maybe the aliens are too powerful for us. I'm surprised to hear you say that, Sergeant. We are the Black Anvils. Save it for the men, sir. We're advancing, but if the aliens hit us again with a similar kind of attack... How are we going to win, sir? Mentalist, John said. I hooked us into the supply vehicle for a reason, so you could hear this and view it as a mentalist. You heard the sergeant. Do you have any assessments? None positive, I'm afraid, Gloria said. Logically, the sergeant is correct. We can't win. What do you suggest, then? John asked. This isn't a suggestion so much as an observation, Gloria said. The aliens just used Neptunian military hardware against us. Why? Don't they have their own ordnance? First, they send Neptunians at us, modified people. 
Now they sent Neptunian machinery. Were the fighting robots freed slaves in the aliens' thoughts? Did it give the robots a chance to show their gratitude? How does that even work? John asked. I don't know, Gloria admitted. It is a mentalist question. I attempt to consider every possibility. Still, the use of human-constructed hardware is interesting. I wonder if the aliens are collecting the hardware from the nearby warships. That's an interesting speculation, John agreed. I would expect a suggestion from you, though. Gloria looked away. After John waited a time, he asked, Da Vinci? The Neptunian's head snapped up. You're asking me for advice? I'm not quitting until I'm dead, John said. If you have an idea, tell me. It doesn't have to be logical, I just need hope. And that means I need to do something positive. We could test my signal, Da Vinci said. Instead of heading for the center, asked John. The Neptunian shrugged. You gotta trick the aliens, right? First, though, you have to know what your enemy is thinking. Maybe whatever is making this signal will help you figure that out. Otherwise, I'd say you make a dash for the center with the healthy Marines. John glanced at Stark and then Gloria. He was surprised one of them hadn't suggested the latter idea. Where's this signal coming from again? Asked John. Over the secure link, the little Neptunian thief downloaded it onto their HUDs to show them. Chapter 11 John could feel the hope dwindling from the regiment. Too many had died in the past hour. Too many wounded found it difficult to keep up. The ammo supply would not last at this rate of fire. John turned to Stark. Pick two squads, no more. We're heading off for the signal. The big marine kept his visor aimed at John. Do you think that's wise, sir? I have no idea. Maybe I'm grasping at straws. John quit talking. In his mind's eye, he could see Colonel Graham shaking his head. He forced himself to laugh, and he clapped an armored glove against the big marine's shoulder. Do you buy that, Sergeant? Sir, asked Stark. Of course it's wise, John said. We keep the aliens guessing. So far, we've stayed together. That allows them to choose where and when they hit. Now, though, we're splitting up. That should buy us a few minutes. It might even help the main party. I guess, Stark said, sounding dubious. Two squads, no more, John said. I'll give you three minutes to get them. Stark kept the visor aimed at him for another few seconds. Finally, he turned and began issuing orders. John remained hooked to Gloria's supply vehicle. I'll be back. He looked at Da Vinci. I'm tempted to take you with me. Do you have a spacesuit? Me? The Neptunian squeaked. I'd only get in the way, sir. Hurry up, John said, deciding. Get into your suit. But, sir, Da Vinci whined. John, do you think that's wise? Gloria asked. That was the second time someone had asked him that. How did he know what was wise or foolish? This was a madman's quest. John straightened. A madman's quest. Maybe he'd been going about this the wrong way. Maybe he should attack like a madman, a berserker. Maybe the regiment should split up. They would each strike out. Da Vinci, John shouted. Hurry your butt. If I have to wait for you, I'll drag you along in an oxygen bubble. The Neptunian hurried, and it turned out he could don a spacesuit quicker than a top-notch Marine could. Da Vinci used a tiny locker, soon poking his bubble-helmeted head out of the supply vehicle. John glanced behind him. Stark had the two squads. He turned back to Da Vinci and saw that the Neptunian had his tablet. We're doing this on the fly, John told the commando group. He stepped near Da Vinci and tethered the man's suit to him. Now follow me. By targeting Da Vinci's strange signal, John soon led them through smaller pitch black corridors. The bulkheads were nearer on either side of him, and the ceiling practically bumped down against his helmet. It felt as if the corridor throttled his equilibrium. The threat of the unknown grew stronger the farther he left the regiment behind. Two squads of space marines seemed like a paltry number to face whatever the interstellar invader would throw at them next. As they marched, their helmet beams washed over meter-wide portals. Strange symbols were etched beside each circular hatch. What is this place? Stark whispered. 
They were using short link, which should be immune to alien eavesdropping. John had purposely cut communications with the regiment. Da Vinci's signal led them to the side in relation to the center of the ship. There, the Neptunian said. John had to twist back to see Da Vinci pointing at a larger hatch in the ceiling. Stark, John said. The first sergeant looked up at the ceiling where John pointed. Open it, John said. The sergeant summoned two marines. They hoisted him. Gingerly, the sergeant's gloved fingers roved across the portal. It didn't seem as if there was a way to. Stark shoved two fingers into two depressions in the hatch. The hatch shivered and slowly opened. Stark indicated the Marines should raise him higher. The sergeant's helmet disappeared from view. You gotta see this, the sergeant short-linked. He hoisted himself through the opening. One by one, the Marines went up. Soon it was John's turn to pass through the ceiling hatch. He stood with them on a vast, curved floor inside what might have been a dome. Unlike the pitch-black corridors, dim illumination allowed them to see without having to use their helmet lamps. The size of this place was maybe half as big as the original hangar bay. Dotted along the interior curved sides were hundreds of hatches. It's like a giant aviary, Da Vinci whispered. What's an aviary, Stark growled. A bird preserve or a sanctuary, the Neptunian said. Do you still have the signal? John asked Da Vinci. The Neptunian pointed upward along the curved wall at a hatch halfway up. We got a float up there? Asked Stark. Unless you want to crawl like a fly, John said. This seems like an enemy trick. I don't think so, John said. Everyone get set. He waited a few seconds. Ready? A few squad members muttered that they were. Those Marines seemed to soak up the first sergeant's unease. Likely these were his favorite two squads. Follow me, John said. With the Neptunian still attached to him, John leaped with the battlesuit. He drifted upward at velocity, given the size of the chamber. Using his suit's comp to see that he indeed headed for the targeted hatch, he inwardly patted himself on the back for his jumping skill. A glance behind showed him the other marines drifting up after him. John had a moment to himself as he continued to drift. He wondered if the aliens could destroy the regiment by simply accelerating the vessel at 70 gravities. Wasn't that how fast the vessel had been going the first time humans had seen it? As John floated, he realized the latest stim was beginning to wear off. If he took another hit right away, he risked an overdose. That wouldn't be so bad, but he might get jittery, and he needed to think clearly. We're almost there, Da Vinci whined. I'm just in a spacesuit. I don't have any padding worth mentioning. John maneuvered the attached Neptunian behind him. He readied himself to hit the bulkhead and magnetize at the same instant. He would indeed act like a fly. Fortunately, as NSN space marines, they'd all practiced the tricky maneuver. See anything, Sergeant? We're clear so far, sir, Stark said. John breathed in and out. The curved bulkhead loomed before him. He hit, magnetized. One arm bounced from the wall. The second one bounced, too. Luckily, his feet stuck to the wall. He detached. He waited for his marines. All but one of them attached. Stark used a line, throwing it to the bouncer. What's wrong with you, Kowalski? Stark said. This isn't fistball. A few of the other Marines laughed, but it had a nervous quality. Circle the hatch, John said. It took a few moments for the magnetized Marines to maneuver themselves around the hatch. Kowalski, Stark said. You open, I'll do that, Sergeant, John said. Begging your pardon, sir, but that's no task for a captain. It is today, John said. He'd started feeling guilty about ordering Marines to their deaths. For this one mission, he was going to take point. Maybe it was militarily foolish, but his conscience forced him to it. Sir, that will be all, Sergeant, John said. Several of the Marines glanced at each other. Stark swore softly, so softly that John couldn't make out exactly what he'd said over the short link. John didn't know it, but the Marines thought he'd sounded just like the Colonel at that moment. Detach, John told Da Vinci. The Neptunian did so, anchoring himself onto the bulkhead. Then, very slowly, the Neptunian maneuvered farther away from the hatch than anyone else. John readied a pistol gyrock. He reached for the hatch with his other hand. Would it open? Would he have to force his way in? 
He twisted a handle, and it moved with a click. A few Marines readjusted their aim. John swung the hatch open. Bright light poured out. Then he demagnetized and swung into the chamber. As he looked around, the gorge rose in his throat. He almost vomited. He'd entered a chamber of horrors. This was crazy. Insane. Chapter 12 Humans lay in the vast chamber, men and women in various stages of, of reassembly. Some were face down on a conveyor belt. A robotic arm guided by a camera eye carefully buzzed away an area of skull as the individual stopped at its station. Afterward, the person continued along the belt. Another robot arm sprayed something pink over the exposed brain. Yet another arm with a shiny scalpel inserted into the cavity, making deft incisions. The person moved again. A mechanical arm shoved in a small metal unit. Stiff wires sprouted from the part inserted firmly against the brain tissue. Despite heavy restraints, some of the victims twitched at that point. One bellowed incoherently. The antenna on the other side of the inserted disc shined with a tiny red light. The bellowing man immediately settled down, allowing the grisly conveyor to continue its journey. The Marines landed in the chamber behind John. A few made exclamations of horror. Look over there, Stark growled. John glanced back, seeing the sergeant point somewhere else in the chamber. John followed the pointing finger. A different conveyor system moved naked people front side up. Clampers restrained individuals while scalpels deftly sliced here and there on the front torso. Another arm teased off skin. A different robot arm moved muscles and internal organs to the side. The third to last modification was a robot arm inserting what appeared to be a landmine into a body cavity. John shuddered. The conveyor system inserted bombs into the captives. This was the place that turned people into battle drones. As the individuals continued on the conveyor, other robot arms rearranged the peeled skin back into place. Mists wet the area. No doubt that was quick heal medicine. This is inhuman, Stark said. Nausea threatened John's composure as the full scope of what went on in here hit home. He felt soiled and sickened. The aliens were blaspheming humanity. John made a low growling noise in the back of his throat. A red mist seemed to haze his vision. A throbbing desire to commit mayhem grew with each heartbeat. He didn't just want to defeat the aliens. He wanted to find their home world and nuke it into oblivion. There's the control node, Da Vinci squeaked. John had to work to focus. He found that he was gripping his weapon with manic strength. His finger had strayed to the trigger. With a start, he realized he'd almost gone berserk. The thinking part of him clamped down on his emotions. He had to ride his hatred. He couldn't let the hatred ride him. He studied the black anvils. Some of the Marines seemed on the verge of mayhem. Sergeant Stark, John said in as calm a voice as he could manage. You will control your squads. On no account will anyone fire until I give a command. Sergeant, are you listening to me? The gorilla of a battlesuit gave a start. He turned to the Marines and began snapping harsh orders. As Stark regained control of the men, John beckoned Da Vinci. What were you saying? asked John. The spacesuit fabric crinkled as the Neptunian raised his left arm, pointing at a bulky contraption in the center of the vast chamber. It was a cubic pyramid with what seemed to be a human head on top. The signal is co coming from there, Da Vinci said in a trembling voice. We have to leave. What if the machines capture us, sir? That's too awful to think about. Please, Captain, let's get out of here. There were indeed machines moving about the chamber. They were robot vehicles, each with treads, a tubular body, several robotic arms, and a camera up top. Some added frozen people to the beginning of the conveyor system, while others removed the finished products from the end of the conveyors. None of the robots appeared interested in the black anvils. I think this whole area makes drones, Da Vinci whispered. Did the Neptunian mean just this room? Or could Da Vinci mean the entire interior dome area they had floated up to? 
That would be ominous, as it would mean thousands of drones instead of mere hundreds were being readied for possible battle. John took a deep breath and held it, letting it out slowly. He did this three times. It felt as if fire had scorched the tips of his nerves. The deep breathing helped settle him enough to think. Come with me, John told Da Vinci. The Neptunian squeaked something that sounded like, why me? Sergeant, stay here, John said. Only fire if I order it. Where are you going? Stark growled. Stand watch, Sergeant, that's your task. Captain, that's enough, John said with more confidence than he felt. Just do as I say. Yes, sir, Stark said. Da Vinci. The Neptunian had begun sliding away from John. John grabbed a space-suited arm, yanking the little thief nearer. Then he magnetically attached the man to his battlesuit. Please, Da Vinci said, with tears in his voice. Listen to me, John said sternly. He began walking toward the cubic pyramid with his magnetized boots. I know you keep your wits about you. I know you act the fool and the coward in order to stay out of danger if you can. I want you sharp, thief. Do you understand? Da Vinci did not reply. Do you understand? Is this for rigging the Brezhnev? Da Vinci asked. Not in the way you think. I realize you're a sneak. You see reality differently from me, different from any of the black anvils. I want to use that thinking to look for an advantage. That's what you do best, I think. Hunt for advantages. Well, if you want to keep living and keep off the conveyor, you'd better start telling me your bright ideas. It's watching us, Da Vinci whispered. Do you see? John focused on the head at the top of the cubic pyramid. He did sense scrutiny from it. Chills ran down his back. Was that a human head controlled by the alien, or something else entirely alien? Gathering his resolve, John continued to clomp toward the alien monstrosity. All the while, the robots and conveyors continued their inhuman production. Chapter 13 The command pyramid reminded John of a painting he'd seen in a New London police station. The painting had been partly abstract, with multiple cubes piled one on top of another in a pyramidal shape, with deep shading in areas. What if the robots turn on us? Da Vinci whined. The Neptunian's terror broke into John's reverie. The thief meant the robots trundling around them. It did seem as if the mini tank-like robots could turn on them at any moment and lower their metal arms for an attack. John recalled the repair bot just after he'd risen from the cryo unit. These bots presently seemed too interested in their tasks to bother with them. We should leave, Da Vinci added. John mentally shrugged. The thief lacked courage. A few words weren't going to change that. The Neptunian's instinct for survival would kick in soon enough, and that might resemble courage just enough for the man to prove helpful. Besides, if the robots turned on them, Stark would give warning. John took another calming breath. He wasn't sure why he had come here. How could a head give him an angle against the enemy? One thing was certain, he wouldn't know if he didn't try. Despite the horror surrounding him, the seeming senselessness of all this, John grinned tightly. Some of the bastards who deserved their broken bones in New London had seen a similar grin on John's face years ago. Surrounding the head on the top of the pyramid was a bubble of clear plastic. It seemed as if a clear, thick liquid filled the bubble. The head and the solution did not seem human from this closer vantage point. For one thing, the skin was a light shade of green. The head was larger than a normal man's would be, even allowing for magnification by the bubble. The hair was thick and dark green, and the eyes were also a dark green, lacking any white. Dark green lips peeled back, revealing green teeth. John shuddered as a sense of awe struck him. This was an alien, a humanoid. The humanoid had clearly originated in a different star system. That meant several things. It certainly seemed to imply that the giant starship had invaded a different star system before coming here. Or was the head a cybernetic creature? Was he one of the invaders or a being corrupted by the invaders? The head, it appeared twice the size of a human's head. It struck John then that the head resembled the ordinary idea of a Neanderthal's head. 
This green head was wide with a broad, heavy nose and low, thick brows, and it lacked a chin. Something crackled. It must have been a speaker unit turning on. The head spoke rapid-fire words that made absolutely no sense to John. How could the mouth form audible words from within the clear solution? John shrugged. That seemed like a minor detail compared to everything else. No, Da Vinci moaned after the head quit speaking. Go back, Captain. Get out of here before it's too late. John ground to a halt before the cubic pyramid. It was three times taller than the battlesuit. He clicked on his outer suit speaker. Who are you? John asked. The green head inside the clear solution answered sharply and harshly, uttering more of its alien words. This is the solar system, John said. That being the case, you can't expect me to understand your language. As the invader, you're going to have to speak to me in mine. The double-sized head closed its eyes. The head shuddered, and the cubic pyramid flashed with energy. That energy seemed to rise like hot air. It caused the thick, deep green-colored hair to stand on end, waving like fronds in the clear solution. Soon, the cubic pyramid dimmed. The hair floated back down onto the head as the eyes opened. The mouth opened next and seemed to test its speech. Is this better? The head asked through a speaker unit under the bubble dome. Much better, John said as he strove to contain his revulsion. I can understand you. How did you do that? Explain. How did you learn our language so quickly? The green mouth twisted into a sneer. The order tapped into the vermin. No, wait, I can explain it better than that. Do you understand a brain tap? What's that? Tap, squeeze, drain the memories, yes. The order tapped vermin and inserted the electrical codes into my superior cortex. There was some initial confusion. Now, though, I have finished explaining the process. You must surrender at once. Or, no, the head said. No, or, that is the wrong process. You do not question the order. You submit. I have submitted. Now I have purpose. Before, my life consisted of chaotic meaninglessness. Be like me. Surrender and gain purpose. Where's the rest of your body? I no longer need it. I have purpose. Running this hell house is your purpose? Hell, ah, I understand. That is a mythical place of torment reserved for those guilty of sin. This is not such an abode. This is an area of realignment. Vermin gain purpose by becoming part of the order. Can you resist the computer? Computer? I do not understand. I... The head looked about wildly. No, please. I have served you these many years. Let me remain my... The head howled in agony as the cubic pyramid glowed intensely. The head's hair stood on end once more. Bloody tears trickled out, leaking into the clear solution. Such was the solution's thickness, however, that the blood remained near the head. A tendril of what might have been smoke escaped the left ear, clouding that area of solution. Abruptly, the pyramidal light dimmed as before. That allowed the hair to drift back onto the skull. The head had changed. To be more precise, the eyes had become sinister with evil intelligence. It looked upon John. He felt a vast weight pressing against him. He sensed age and monstrous desire. The eyes seemed like an abyss, as if they desired to swallow him. You have taken a misstep, vermin, the head said. You have come to a place you will never leave. John glanced around. The mobile robots no longer attended to their task. They had each spun around to regard him with their camera eye. John wondered why Stark hadn't radioed about the change. He looked back. The Marines aimed their weapons at the robots. Stark tapped his helmet. The thing had cut radio communications. Da Vinci, John said. The Neptunian didn't answer. 
It is just you and I, vermin, the head said. John regarded the green head. As he did, the Neptunian hooked a direct line into his suit. My tablet is going crazy, Da Vinci whispered. There's something odd going on here. Submit, the head told John. You are causing harm to my interstellar voyager. That is wrong. Vermin must cease or serve. They must never harm the order. I have much to do here, and you are delaying the normal sequence of events. My heart bleeds for you, John said. That does not equate, the head said. You spout contrition, but aim your weapon at my tools. That is inconsistent. Figure it out, John said. I can promise you greater pain and sorrow if you continue this senselessness. I have mocked you, vermin. Unless you lay down your weapons and submit, I will cause you agony for many cycles of time. Is this what you desire? Sure do, John said. I love pain. That does not equate. I love it so much, John heard himself say that I'm going to find you, rip off your head, and piss down your freaking neck. You dare to threaten me? John lost it as he shouted an obscenity, an impossible action for the head to do to itself. Then he fired his gyrock, sending a rocket shell through the bubble dome into the head. The shell exploded. That rained thick, gloppy solution and brains, bones, and electrical circuitry everywhere. The robots churned toward him, their clackers opening. Stark's right arm flashed down. The Marines opened fire, and in less than 30 seconds, the last robot lay on its side, sparking and shutting down. Listen to me, Da Vinci said. Talk, John said. There's something in the pyramid. It came on during each transformation. What, John said. Each time the head received data, well, just before that, Da Vinci tapped his tablet. I read a strange power. I'm not sure how to say this. The alien device seemed to shut something down. You have to dig it out of there. Where is it? John asked. Da Vinci pointed at a cube near the blasted head. John detached the Neptunian from him. Afterward, he unhooked a tungsten-headed axe from his battlesuit. With exoskeleton power, John hacked at the cubes around the selected one. Sparks flew. Power surged from electrical discharges. John hacked more. Finally, he climbed partway up the pyramid. With gloved hands, he bent metal until he exposed a chest-sized machine with glowing crystals amidst complex circuitry. Is that what you want? John asked. Yes, Da Vinci said, but be careful. If it's going to help us, I need it intact. Roger that, John said softly. For the next three minutes, he pried here, tugged there. He swung the axe several more times, chopping a power line. Finally, he pulled the unit free. The sergeant is getting insistent, Da Vinci said. I think it's time to leave. Couldn't agree more, John said. With the unit under one arm and Da Vinci under the other, he hurried to Stark. Halfway there, the short link started working again. I got a bad feeling, sir, Stark said. What is that you're carrying? I don't know yet, maybe nothing. Silently, John said to himself, I hope it's something. Use two plasma satchels in here. What about the other hatches? Asked Stark. John made a quick recalculation. You have a point, Sergeant. Use one plasma satchel in here. Once we're outside, send men to some of the other hatches. Rig up plasma satchels there, too, so we can take down the entire area. We're going to blow this part of the ship. I think they use this area to convert their captives. The people are going to die, too. Stark said. Would you want to stay alive as alien drones? Stark cursed. Right, John said. Let's hurry. I want to get back to the regiment before the aliens hit us again. Chapter 14 The commandos were halfway back to the regiment when the timers went off. The plasma charges caused bulkheads to shake and deck plates to shiver under their boots. Then a greater roar sounded. It brought the worst shaking so far. No doubt the many drone bombs ignited in the plasma inferno. The blasts and shaking lasted longer than seemed probable. John couldn't stop grinning. The aliens must be grinding their teeth about now, if they possessed any. A second thought wiped away the grin. He'd just slain hundreds, possibly thousands of people. 
Maybe he could have figured out a way to save them. Maybe surgeons could have removed the alien devices implanted in their skulls. Maybe, but John seriously doubted it. Still, it was one thing to talk about doing hard deeds. It was another to actually do them. The colonel had talked to him before about a stained conscience. Graham had told him that some battle decisions could come back to haunt John in his old age. Well, this decision was already haunting him. But could I have let the drones live, increasing the possibility of losing the solar system to the aliens forever? John knew the answer to that. So why did he feel so soiled, then? Maybe because even with the best of intentions and no perceivable alternatives, he still had innocent blood on his hands. That stained his soul. He was going to have to ask God for forgiveness. He would do that when he had time for reflection. Right now, he was too busy trying to stay alive and keep the regiment alive long enough to defeat the aliens. The commandos moved fast, regaining contact one-third of the remaining distance to the regiment. Any more attacks? John asked the centurion. Nothing so far, sir, but the scouts are sensing something stirring out there. The regiment should move. Give us five minutes, John said, but get the men ready to move. Eight minutes later, the commandos reached the regiment. Da Vinci took the alien device with him, re-entering the supply vehicle. John was reluctant about that. What if the device was a trick? But they weren't going to win by playing it safe. To defeat the interstellar menace, they'd have to take long shots. Besides, this kind of thing was da Vinci's specialty. John summoned the sergeants for another powwow. The three dinosaurs agreed that heading straight down the corridor for the ship's center would be the wrong move. Five minutes later, the sergeants had their orders. They returned to their companies. Soon, more charges roared. More bulkhead breaches appeared. The regiment sidestepped as a whole. They advanced along the new corridor and blasted another left turn, taking the regiment into yet another corridor. As John walked beside the supply vehicle, Gloria informed him that the regiment was moving slower than before. The radiation had begun to take its toll on everyone. Sick and wounded Marines took turns on the supply vehicles. Healthier Marines helped the sick to keep moving. John kept glancing at Da Vinci. The little thief was working on the alien device. He unscrewed parts, fiddling with this and that. He had a tester, accidentally shocking himself with it twice. Soon enough, Da Vinci screwed the parts back onto the hole. John noticed he had left one part off. Afterward, the Neptunian made more tests. John saw the scrawny man speak in low whispers to the mentalist. Did Da Vinci need her opinion? The mentalist didn't reply. Soon, Da Vinci went back to experimenting on the thing. John couldn't take it anymore. The regiment needed a miracle. He was counting on the Neptunian. He plugged his phone line into the supply vehicle. Once he had the connection, John realized he shouldn't pressure the thief. Pile on too much pressure and it could cause Da Vinci to fold. The thief seemed like the type, a folder. He had to give the Neptunian time and some room. Both Da Vinci and Gloria looked up at him from under the canopy. Ah, uh, John said, stalling. What does the green head tell you? He asked Gloria. Just what you told me earlier, she answered. This vessel has been to at least one other star system. I believe it took captives there, those green-headed aliens. The aliens did to those people what they planned to do here to us. The patches you saw before we landed, the ones on the outer hull, testify to fighting in the previous star system. I doubt anyone willingly submits to the order. Can you give me any hint at all as to what the order is? Nothing other than what we've already deduced, Gloria told him. We, more people, drones, the centurion radioed. My scouts are retreating from them. This time there are a thousand or more heading our way. John unplugged from the supply tank. Back up, he ordered the old man and Stark. We have to give the centurion's men maneuvering room. By fits and starts, the regiment started backing up. Captain, the old man radioed several minutes later, spheroids are coming into position into our rear area. It looks as if the aliens are trying to bracket us. Right, John said. Stark, are you listening? What do you need? Stark asked on the command channel. I want a huge bulkhead opening in your area, John said. We're going to retreat through that opening, and we're going to do it under pressure. That could get messy quick, sir, Stark said. There's bound to be a delay somewhere during such a maneuver. Then we're going to have to pull off the perfect retreat, John said. 
No excuses, do you understand? Roger, Captain, Stark said. The next fifteen minutes proved critical. At the head of the column, the drones kept running at the retreating scouts. The centurion reported that sweat dripped off the drones. His scouts picked off the real sprinters, otherwise the centurion's company kept retreating. The corridor shook then. A quick call told John the old man had laid a plasma satchel ambush, taking out twenty or more spheroids. The rest had then spread out, following at a slower pace. I don't like this, Stark radioed. I expect a ceiling or deck break through any minute. You'll make another breach in the second corridor, John said. We're going to run circles around our attackers. I hope you're right, sir, Stark said. The retreat continued. Some of the drones dropped onto the deck from exhaustion. Two of the Centurion squads laid down concentrated fire, killing 200 fast, causing several explosions, buying the retreaters a little more time. The supply vehicle holding Da Vinci and Gloria clanked through the bulkhead breakthrough into another corridor. Stark's men blasted a second opening 50 meters ahead. At the rear of the regimental snake, the spheroids made another rush. Massed 100 millimeter shells stopped them cold. We're running low on those, the old man radioed John in code. An icicle of worry stabbed John in the heart. He didn't want to hear that. Once they ran out of ammo, it would all be over. Don't hold back if you need the hundreds to stop them, he radioed the old man. And once we're out of the one hundreds, the sergeant asked him. We'll use something else, John said. What else do we have, sir? I'd really like to know. Chin up, old man, John said. He'd heard the colonel say that to the old man before. You're right, the sergeant said a half beat later. We fight until we can't. I have to say, sir, I'm glad you're running the show. I like the cut of your chin. I think it's supposed to be jib. I have to go, sir. One of my squad leaders is getting frantic. The retreat continued. Sir, Stark said a few minutes later, I got bad news. There are alien tanks coming. They're big suckers. It looks like we're going to need plasma charges to take them down. John knew they were running low on those, too. Can you blast a new bulkhead? Make it smaller than the alien tanks so we can slip away from them? What do we do about our supply vehicles, then? Stark asked. John didn't have the answer to that. Without the supply vehicles, they would have to leave the seriously wounded behind. He noticed a Marine waving to him. The man pointed at the Centurion supply vehicle. John shook his head. He didn't have time for that now. Gloria broke into the command channel. I have to speak to you on a secure line. It's going to have to wait, John said. He didn't know whether he should tell her about the approaching alien tanks in the other corridor. That might be too much bad news to hear at once. John, Gloria said. Da Vinci had a breakthrough. She paused. Maybe she wondered if she should tell him on this channel. Finally, she said, our friend can cut alien signals. Hope sprang anew in John's breast. You're sure of that? No, she said, I'm not sure. I'm just telling you what Da Vinci is saying. Do you want to give it a try? John laughed. Get that little bugger out here. Ah, uh, I don't know if he's going to want to do that. I don't care. Tell him to move his scrawny butt. He knows how to work the device, thus he's going to do it and be the hero. Tell him I am promoting him. John. John whirled around, clomping fast. This might not work. The alien tanks might kill Da Vinci and him. But that was the risk he'd have to take. It was do or die time. Chapter 15 I shouldn't be here, Da Vinci whined. I'm gonna die, and I'm no good to you dead, chief. John slapped the back of the Neptunian's bubble helmet, making him bend forward. Da Vinci turned to stare at him. Why did you do that? You could have cracked my helmet. His eyes roved over the interior helmet. I think I see a hairline crack. They're coming fast, Stark growled. The three men were sheltered around a bend in the corridor. Behind them, by 200 meters, Marines set up heavy 100s. The squads had the last major supply of the vehicle-killing launchers. John peered around the corner. The alien tanks were squat and low, with multi-jointed treads. Some had tri-barrels with orifice openings that glowed a sinister red color. Each of the squat turrets sprouted a forest of antennae. According to da Vinci, the tanks received transmissions from somewhere deep in the ship. 
The ship has too much interior firepower, Stark complained. Fighting all the way to the center isn't going to work. That's why we're here, Sergeant. You do it, Da Vinci said, shoving the stolen alien device at John. Don't be an idiot, John said. You've been working on it ever since we got back. You're the only one who knows how it ticks. Are you ready? N no, the thief said. The tanks are still too far away. You have to be close in range to cut the transmission. I don't want to be that close. What are you worried about? John asked. Dying? What else? They can't see us. They're scanning, Da Vinci said. I don't know why they're not firing yet. The shells could slice through the bulkhead. Those look like laser cannons. Da Vinci moaned pitifully. How did you ever become a black anvil? Stark snarled. It's a sad story, Da Vinci said. John grabbed the back of Da Vinci's spacesuit. Get ready, I'm going to haul you in front of them. Please, Da Vinci whined. I have to be closer for this to work. Wait until they come closer. We'll wait then, John said. But what if the tanks are rigged to detonate? Da Vinci whined. Maybe they know you're the danger. Maybe they have proximity sensors. Stark looked again and almost lost his head, literally. He jerked back behind the bend in the corridor. At the same time, three closely set laser beams flashed by. That caused the Neptunian to shake so hard John could feel it through the man's spacesuit. Now, John said, you have to do it now. Yes, yes, Da Vinci said, I'm doing it now. He activated the device. It glowed. Energy flowed from one part to another. Then the device began to shake in the Neptunian's hands. Why is it doing that? Da Vinci cried. It never did it before. John closed his eyes. Sharp pain spiked in his chest. He couldn't believe he was trusting the regiment to this greedy, cowardly thief. Maybe I'm too far away, Da Vinci said. His long gloved fingers tap tapped against the device. They're still coming, Stark said, as he dared another quick glance around the corner. John took a calming breath. Then he picked up Da Vinci and ran around the corner, charging the alien tanks. If they had to be close, he would get them close. Da Vinci cried out in horror, shaking almost uncontrollably, cursing John as tears surely dripped from his eyes. Just the same, the Neptunian fiddled with the device, holding it before him aimed at the tanks. John kept charging. He expected tri-barrels to glow. He wondered if he'd feel the beams killing him. Then it dawned on John that Da Vinci was laughing hysterically. You okay? asked John. We did it, Da Vinci said between hiccups of laughter. We did, or I did it. I cut the connection. The tanks are dead. They're inert without central commands. Stark, John radioed. Bring your techs. Hurry it. I don't know how long this crazy device is going to keep blocking the signal. We have to defang the tanks while we can. Roger that, sir, Stark said. The little creep is a hero. I can't believe it. Did you hear that? John asked Da Vinci. The Neptunian nodded. He still seemed sad, though. What's wrong now? Asked John. I've won it all, Da Vinci said. You owe me whatever I want. The only problem is that we're all going to die in a few hours from radiation poisoning. Life is unfair, terribly unfair. Yeah, John said. Tell that to the drones. Da Vinci shrugged. John thought the Neptunian was likely incapable of that kind of empathy, as he apparently could only feel emotions about events that directly related to him. Chapter 16 Everything changed after capturing the alien tanks. Gloria donned a spacesuit, coming out to help Da Vinci and several cyber warfare techs. Stark's demolition men rigged the tanks just in case they woke up. Then Stark's company encircled the squat vehicles. Some Marines faced inward, watching the alien vehicles. The rest of the Marines faced outward, ready for more surprise attacks. The old man and the centurion leapfrogged for the latest breach. The noose tightened around them in the other corridor. We could lose our rear guard, the centurion radioed John. John bent his head in thought. He didn't want to lose any more Marines. Could Gloria, Da Vinci, and the Tex figure out how to operate the alien tanks? That would be a fantastic advantage. What was the right decision here? I have to go balls out. I have to risk it. I'm coming to you, John radioed. Negative, Captain, the old man said. The rear guard is not your place. 
Sergeant, no, sir, the old man said. You're new, you're the captain. I back you to the hilt. But this one time I'm overturning your orders, sir. You stay at the command post, let us old dogs take care of this. Roger, John said glumly. A few minutes later, he radioed back. Oh man, use your two supply vehicles. They'll provide you with heavy fire. Be liberal with the main cannons. For several seconds, the old man didn't respond. Had the aliens cut the connection? The regiment needs those vehicles, the old man radioed. We can't afford to lose them when the aliens overrun the last of the rear guard. We don't need the supply vehicles anymore, John said. You commandeered the alien tanks? John hesitated. He didn't want to lie. They had captured the alien tanks, that was true. They hadn't figured out how to make the tanks work for them, if that was even possible. John didn't want the old man staying behind, though, trying to pull a Horatius. Horatius had been a legendary Roman hero who'd held a critical bridge over the Tiber River. The warrior had single-handedly fought off the entire Etruscan host as his fellow Romans chopped down the bridge he stood on. The brave warrior dove off the bridge at the end, entering the water with the falling lumber. Fortunately, Horatius had not died in the fall or the landing, and had swum to safety. John doubted the old man would do any swimming today. If he stayed behind to the end, the old man would die. John wanted the cagey sergeant and the marines he stood to lose holding off the enemy to the end. We're going to use the alien vehicles, John radioed. That means you can sacrifice the supply vehicles. Hook them for auto fire at the end. Bring me my marines. Oh man, I need them all, including your sorry old hide. Yes, sir, the old man said with greater enthusiasm in his voice. Afterward, John turned back to the alien tanks. Gloria had counted 18 of them. Three times six, she'd said. What's that supposed to mean, John had asked. A hunch, she'd told him. Let me mull it over a little more. 18 alien tanks could carry all the sick and wounded. They could travel faster with them, which might allow them to reach the center of the ship before they all died from radiation poisoning. John approached Stark's outer firing line, the Marines watching everywhere. After several steps, he moved past the inner line, those Marines watching the tanks. A rear hatch popped up on a tank. Da Vinci poked his bubble helmet out of it. John hurried. He hadn't heard that the Neptunian had gone into a tank. That troubled him, although he wasn't sure why. Well, John asked, using the short link. Da Vinci gave him a glance. The little thief didn't answer. He slid down the curved tank and hurried to another where cybertechs were working on the outer rear area. John followed Da Vinci. Why hadn't the rat answered him? Gloria, John radioed. Here, the mentalist said. She waved from where she stood on a tank's turret. What's the prognosis? We're about to find out, she said. Either this is really going to work, or what, asked John. Exactly, she said. Or what? We don't know, and we're all nervous. John, we got lucky with the tanks. They would have annihilated us. Each of these tanks has an AI brain inside. I think they're trouble. Bad, bad trouble. Da Vinci's device put them to sleep. It keeps them asleep. We think we're pulling their power plugs, but we can't be sure. The alien tech is so much higher than our own. We're guessing on half this stuff. John recalled what he'd told the old man. Would the regiment be needing the supply vehicles after all? Make it work, John said. It has to work. I know, Gloria whispered. Believe me, we all know. This is the moment. Pray if you believe in a deity. John bowed his head. He prayed just as Colonel Graham had taught him. It was short and sweet and to the point. If God was real, did he love humans more than he loved aliens? John didn't want to dwell on that too much. We're getting close to the breach, the old man radioed. The urge to race to the breach beat strongly in John. He didn't like staying back here in safety while his marines fought for the regiment's life. Come on, he said softly, urging Da Vinci to pull another rabbit out of his Neptunian hat. Sir, the old man said, there's more, lots more coming. I'm going to lose both supply vehicles. After we're through, we're coming fast. These bastards are going to be following us into the new corridor. We need those tanks back here. Thanks for the intel, old man. We'll be waiting. John took off. 
He left Stark in charge around the tanks, with Gloria and Da Vinci trying to figure things out. They wouldn't get those tanks set up in a firing line in time. That meant only one thing. John shoved a Marine, telling the man to drive the last supply vehicle. They set off for the breach. Weariness gathered as they traveled. John decided he couldn't wait any longer. He gave himself another stim. The cooling sensation strengthened him for a moment. He frowned as his mind seemed to grow cloudy. He felt despair well up inside him. How could they win now? It was too late. They were all dead men walking. They were... No, John said in a low voice. Captain? asked the driving Marine. Nothing, John said curtly. Keep your eyes peeled. The Marine didn't look up. He hunched over the controls. What the hell, John said. Stop, he shouted at the driver. The supply vehicle lurched to a halt in the huge corridor. John climbed on top of the supply vehicle. Marines hurried toward him from the direction of the breach. The Marines ran hard. Something about their motion seemed off. John realized he shouldn't have taken the stim. It clouded his judgment. He shouldn't. Balls, John said. It's berserker time. By the manner of locomotion, it seemed to John that the approaching Marines had panicked. He thought he understood why. It was the reason why any sort of retreat on the battlefield involved risk. Backing away from the enemy worked against a soldier's morale. Good soldiers held their ground or advanced. Running away meant losing. Losing meant dying. Facing death engaged a Marine's survival instinct. Once the survival instinct took hold, discipline often vanished. These Marines had escaped the advancing enemy. Now they were running away, wanting to get to safety. Being inside a vast alien ship was hard enough. Retreating for too long had finally sapped their courage. Fire a round above their heads, John said. The driver looked up at him. The man obeyed a second later. The cannon lifted and fired. The explosion caused many of the retreating Marines to look up. Stay where you are, John radioed. I'm coming up to you. The rest of the regiment is on its way. We're holding our ground here. Several Marines kept moving toward him. Grim hardness of purpose, knowing there probably wasn't another way, caused John to aim and fire on the lead Marine. The gyrox shell blasted against the battlesuit. That created a deep gouge in the BCP, although the blast didn't penetrate the armor. I said, hold your ground, John said over the radio. The next Marine that keeps running away like a coward gets a cannon shell in his suit. Do I make myself clear? The Marines froze. Several began to raise their weapons at him. We're the Black Anvils, John said. We don't run out on our comrades. If you men want to go AWOL, by all means, kill me now. Who wants to be first? The Marines raising their weapons quickly lowered them. Good, John said. I knew I could count on you. Squad leaders, form your men into firing lines. I'm coming up to give you heavy support. The supply vehicle lurched forward before John gave the order. The Marines turned around and quickly lined up in rows. Some lay on their armored torsos, some knelt behind them. The last line stood with weapons ready. Old man, John radioed. I've got the supply vehicle set up, the sergeant radioed. Is your firing line ready? Roger that, John said. He went up and down the firing lines, inspecting the Marines. He nodded at some praised others, and checked to make sure the man he'd shot still had a functional battle suit. I'm sorry, sir, the Marine told him in a small voice. John used an armored glove to clap him on the back. Show me what you have, Marine. Kill me some alien buggers. Sir, yes, sir, the Marine said, his voice much firmer. Soon, the last black anvils hurried to the firing line. The old man and the centurion, with their bravest squads, ran fast for them. No doubt the supply vehicles were hammering the approaching spheroids and drones in the other corridor. Something shook the bulkheads. Maybe that was the supply vehicles detonating. The last Marines reached the firing line. The old man clanked near. Sir, he said on the command channel, where are the alien tanks? Behind us a ways, John said. They're not ready yet, the old man asked. Soon, John said. The visor stared at John. Finally, the sergeant went to the firing line. Less than five minutes later, a combined spheroid human drone assault attacked the firing line. 
For 15 minutes, the line devoured munitions, killing altered Neptunians and blasting spheroids. The extent of the alien soldiery started making John sick. If they hadn't deactivated the alien tanks, most of the regiment would be dead by now. At the end of the 15 minutes, John began to wonder if the firing line would survive. The aliens did not stop pouring at them. This would be a matter of sheer attrition blowing over them in time. This is it, John said. My men are running low on ammo, the centurion said. Mine are too, the old man said. Tell your marines to use their axes once they're out of ammo, John said. We're not leaving this line until we stop the enemy. The sergeants did not respond. Some of the marines lying on their bellies pitched their weapons aside and unlimbered their axes. John's gut shriveled. He'd wanted to destroy the alien foe and save the solar system. But the numbers the awful numbers. Shells flew over the firing line from behind, obliterating the next wave assault of attackers. John turned around along with many of the Marines. As soon as they did, the men began cheering. John heard the sound reverberating in his helmet and grew aware that he was cheering as loudly as any of the men. Five alien tanks had snuck up behind the firing line. Those tanks now added their fire, some with shells and others with tri-barrel lasers. The endlessness of the alien modified soldiery proved to be an illusion against the firepower of the tanks. The rays swept away hundreds at a time. Spheroids blew apart in clumps from the shells. It looked like the regiment was going to survive another enemy assault. Maybe they could still stop the alien invasion of the solar system. Chapter 17 the regiment clacked down the corridor on the alien tanks and the last supply vehicle. Many of the marines drifted behind the tanks, held by tether lines floating in the zero gravity. The last trick was a risk. There was no doubt about that. John decided it was one of those smart gambling bets. Time was running out on their health. The stims and drugs could only keep them going for so long. Yeah, there were some seriously tough marines in the Black Anvils but even tough men began to wither when they coughed up too much blood. Gloria calculated that they had traveled two-thirds of the way to the center. That left something like 16-plus kilometers to go. John rode on their last supply vehicle. Gloria and Da Vinci were back under its canopy. The thief had taken apart his miracle weapon. The Neptunian seemed agitated about something by the way his thin fingers kept twitching. He unscrewed a part used a wire-thin tool, causing a trickle of smoke to rise. The thief stiffened as he stared at the smoke. John closed his eyes in frustration. Had da Vinci just broken his miracle tool? A few seconds later, John looked down again. Da Vinci had turned away from the partly unassembled miracle device. The thief hunched over his panel. He tapped, read, and tapped some more, repeating the process several times. The Neptunian seemed absorbed in whatever he was pondering. Finally, in apparent excitement, da Vinci turned to the mentalist. Gloria listened to him, and afterward it seemed as if they argued. Da Vinci gestured wildly, throwing his narrow hands into the air. John couldn't hear what she was saying, but it looked like she was holding her ground. John felt exhausted, not so much physically or even mentally, but spiritually. He didn't want to make any more command decisions. He didn't want to shoot any more Marines. He didn't want to force frightened men to stand and fight to their deaths. Forcing his will over the men had drained something critical out of John. It was good to just sit here and let the kilometers slip past. Soon, he thought, dreading the idea, he would have to psych himself up again. He would have to use his will, forcing the men to obey his commands. Every time someone argued with him, he felt a little more of his psychic strength draining away. His landline channel opened. He looked down through the canopy. Gloria and da Vinci were staring up at him. He found another unique signal, the mentalist said, jerking a thumb at the Neptunian. Yeah, asked John. I think you should send someone to investigate it, Gloria said. Is his wonder weapon broken? John asked. Gloria seemed to search his eyes, even though he knew she couldn't see them through his silver-colored visor. Broken might be too strong of a word, she finally said. The device is momentarily disassembled. 
I can see that. Why did he do it? Something is wrong with it, she admitted. John could feel some of his hope seep away. Are you suggesting there's another horror chamber nearby? We can go there and murder more humans. This is war, John. I know what it is, mentalist. You don't have to tell me. Maybe I do, Gloria said. You're tired. You can't listen to your exhaustion any more than you can listen to your fears. That's something your colonel would have said. John looked away, scowling. He was the captain. He led the regiment, what remained of it anyway. It had been more like a battalion for some time already. The point was that the black anvils were his responsibility. He'd fought for the right to lead them. That, therefore, was what he'd do until an alien shot him. Right, John said, it's time for some fun. You ready to go, Da Vinci? I've done enough, the Neptunian said in a sulky voice. Why can't she go for a change? Why do I have to take all the risks? John was too weary to argue further. Fine, he said. Gloria, are you ready? She raised her eyebrows at him. A moment later, she nodded. Certainly, she said. Give me a few seconds to don my suit and come out. John called up Stark and told the sergeant to get his commandos ready. They had another side mission. You're sure about this? Stark asked. John wasn't sure. He wanted to rub his aching head. For a moment, in his mind's eye, he seemed to see a man. John couldn't quite recognize him, but the man was trying to tell him something. A fog or mist was too thick for him to see or hear the man's words. Was the colonel trying to tell him something? Captain, asked Stark, are you still on the channel? I'm here, John said wearily. Are you ready? But, yes, sir, Stark said. I'll meet you in five minutes. Chapter 18 The coughing from radiation sickness began to irritate John, his own as well as Stark's and the mentalists. Everyone was tired. Everyone had become cranky. The commando team moved slowly through Brezhnev-sized corridors. Such small corridors were strange for the alien vessel. Was that a warning sign? Were they all too tired and dull to understand such warnings? John hadn't realized how much weaker he'd become until he felt himself sliding off an alien tank. It was strange watching the others float along instead of walking with a magnetized tread. The truth was that they'd grown too weary to walk everywhere. Floating was much easier. The only problem was drifting off, their minds wandering as they floated through the maze of an alien vessel. Captain, Stark practically shouted at him on the command channel. Are you all right, sir? I feel like crap, Sergeant. Take a stim. My mind's cloudy enough. It's even worse when you feel too weak. Take a stim, sir. You'll feel better for it. Sergeant, I would like you to kindly keep to your own affairs, and I will- John, it was Gloria. Huh? he asked. Do what the sergeant says, the mentalist told him. Take the stim. You need the strength. Why not, he finally said. He pressed a switch, and the medikit hissed yet another stim shot into his bloodstream. Soon enough, the cooling sensation gave him more energy. It was funny. This time, his mind didn't feel as cloudy. His nose twitched, and his throat felt itchy, and he had a burning need to grab his gun and just start firing. John squeezed his eyelids tightly together. He had to get a hold of himself. The regiment relied upon him. If he failed, he'd have let down Colonel Graham. John breathed deeply, pushed off a bulkhead. Captain, Stark said, we're back here. As a bulkhead loomed before him, John shifted and magnetized his feet. He stopped himself and nearly pulled a hamstring doing it. Finally, though, he turned around. The others were floating before a hatch. Gloria had her tablet in front of the hatch, testing something. Right, John said, feeling slightly foolish. He pushed off and jerked to a halt. I'll turn off the boot magnets this time, he told himself. He jumped again, sailing toward them, determined to get his thoughts in order before he reached them. A feeling of shame had begun to make him feel ridiculous. There, Sergeant, Gloria said. Stand back, Stark growled. He raised a heavy tube. It glowed hot. He pushed the end of the tube against the spot Gloria indicated, which quickly grew hot. 
In moments, metal drifted off in clumps. One of the commandos grabbed John, yanking him out of the way of a floating, jiggling metal globule. If that touches your suit, Gloria said, it will melt right through. The shock would probably kill you. The shame bit deeper in John. What was wrong with him? It felt as if his mind was shutting down. John struggled to comprehend. Instead, his understanding of their actions grew dimmer and dimmer. He opened his mouth several times, wanting to ask them what they thought they were doing. He was the captain here. He was in charge. The fog in his mind lifted briefly. He realized the commando team was in a long corridor. This one had hatches along the sides with a round porthole in each. John pulled away from a commando, peering into the porthole darkness. He chinned the on switch for his helmet lamp, looking again. The sight shocked him. A humanoid skeleton lay on an upright pad inside the chamber. Some kind of flickering energy field surrounded the skeleton. What's going on, John said. He got angry when none of them answered him. It finally dawned on him that he'd forgotten to turn on the comm channel. Mentalist, John said. Yes, Captain, she answered. What do you think you're doing? Following the signal, sir, she said. Da Vinci lent me his tablet. What's with the skeletons? Aliens, I presume, she said reasonably. For some reason, the reasonableness made John mad. That fired up his adrenaline, which seemed to dissipate the fog around his mind. What's wrong with me, he asked Gloria on a secure channel. You're dead tired, she said. It's more than that, he said. Am I dying? There is that, she said. Yes, we're all on timers. Yours seems to be shorting out sooner than some of ours. That hit him harder than he'd expected. This was a suicide mission. Still, knowing he was dying. Is this from radiation poisoning, he asked. That's part of it. I think there's something else, too. I've begun to wonder, though. John, your battlesuit indicators don't lie. You don't have much longer to live. Would you like to take a risk? He didn't even think about it. Yes. It's a big risk, she warned. I don't care. You're going to have to authorize Stark to obey me for a little while. A small part of him wondered if the aliens might have used da Vinci's stolen device to get to her. But if he was dying... Sergeant, John said. Captain, I want you to listen to the medalist. She has an idea. I'm going to be the test rat. What's that mean? Asked Stark. Don't ask so many questions first, Sergeant. Help her do this. I'm starting to feel off again. Do you understand? John never heard the answer as he took that moment to pass out. Chapter 19 He was so damned cold that he started shivering like crazy. He'd never been so cold, and the air was so thin. He coughed. He tried to rub his arms. That's when he realized that someone had taken him captive. He couldn't move his arms, his legs, or his head. Someone had bolted it into place. Aliens. He remembered the rods screwed into the people's heads. Was someone doing that to him? Tears threatened to leak out, but he couldn't let them. He would not cry. He would not give the cybernetic invaders the satisfaction. As he thought that, it occurred to him that he wasn't cold anymore. Was that odd? The air was still thin. Agony lanced through him. He felt his muscles stretching to the limit. Involuntarily, his back arched like a bow. The agony continued to course through him. His muscles began to twitch wildly. Hold him down, a woman shouted. He recognized the voice, but couldn't place her. Had he taken the woman to bed? He needed, the agony increased. Worse, voices, strange alien voices babbled in his head. They yammered as if asking questions. He wished they would shut up. He tried to yell back at them. The voices increased. It became a torrent of speech. He understood nothing. Then new sensations hit. He looked up and saw two suns in the sky. There should only be one sun. Wait, just a minute. The sky was pink, not blue like Earth's. Two suns in a pink sky. Was this an alien planet? Fear paralyzed his thoughts. 
The whole time, the yammering voices kept haunting him. Scenes flashed before him. Bizarre box cities exploded and burned. Bat-winged aircraft flew against a monstrous thing high in the pink stratosphere. Beams rayed down, torching the earth. People ran screaming. John did a double take. He'd never seen people like that. They were big suckers with light green skin, green eyes, and green. The head on top of the cubic pyramid. Was this some kind of alien history recording? The likelihood of that began to fascinate him. He wanted to know more. Because if he knew more, he might learn enough to defeat the alien invaders of, of, John. The voice came from far away, farther even than the limit of the pink sky. John, you're in the grip of a mind tap. I think it reversed on you. I'm going to have to tear you free, but you have to come back into your mind. What did that even mean? It sounded like mentalist gobbledygook. He'd heard the term mind tap before. What did it mean, though? His fear intensified. Aliens were trying to suck out his memories. He had to fight that. Yet the voice had told him to come back. He wasn't sure how one was supposed to do that. Concentration. It was like chess. He'd played that a few times in police detention. There was the king, the queen. He began to shiver. He felt cold again. John! the mentalist shouted. She was much closer than before. Yeah, he whispered. Now, the woman said, do it now. I don't know how much longer I can keep his awareness here. Wild pain, pain like fire in his heart, caused John to open his eyes. He was in a strange room with weird machines aimed at him. He lay on a pallet with straps holding him down. Worse, he lay naked on the table, with Gloria standing nearby, seeing everything. The pain finally subsided, though. He noticed several battle suits watching him from the background. John, Gloria said from in her spacesuit. He felt so weary. Yes, he asked in a small voice. Release him, she said. It should be okay now. A hulking battlesuit approached. That had to be Sergeant Stark. Carefully, almost tenderly, the massive gloves plucked at the restraints, removing them one by one. Do you think you can climb back into your suit? Gloria asked. I'll give it my best shot, John said. What happened? How did you know how to use this equipment? I don't, Gloria said. But he does. Her space-suited hand jerked a thumb to the side. Slowly, John turned his head. He saw a shocking sight. A seven-foot giant of an alien with long green hair, green eyes, and green teeth. He wore a crinkly spacesuit and a bubble helmet. Who is he? John whispered weakly. Get into your battlesuit, Gloria said, and I'll explain everything. The Battle Chapter One It turned out that he'd been unconscious for a long time. In some ways, it was worse than that. During her explanation, Gloria admitted he'd died several times. John slid off the table as she talked. He pushed himself to his empty battle suit. It was hunched forward with the back split open like a cocoon. Died several times. What's that supposed to mean, he asked, a funny feeling chewing at his gut. Your heart stopped three times, she said. Please, Captain, you need to hurry. Bast Banbeck believes the AI is readying a transfer just in case we succeed. If that happens, our fight might have been in vain. Who? John asked as he touched the outer BCP battlesuit armor. The AI? What are you talking about? He's Bast Banbeck, Gloria said, indicating the giant alien humanoid watching them. But I'm surprised I have to explain any of that. He told me the brain tap would supply you the needed memories. You tapped my brain, John demanded, turning to stare at her. No, no, it was the reverse. Haven't you wondered how the green head was able to speak to you earlier? The aliens gave it human knowledge. I saw it happen. It was a surge. You did that to me? How could you, Gloria? What if it was an alien trick? How can you trust me now? Maybe the aliens slipped controls into my mind and- John, Gloria said as she stepped up to his battlesuit. I took a gamble. 
Logically, I had to do it. Yes, I put you at serious risk, but rationally, I did not have any other choice. I took the mentalist approach. I had to. John could hear the pleading in her voice. He didn't feel like comforting her right away, though. The sense of personal violation was too strong. The machine, the brain tap device, must have inserted alien memories into him. If that was true, why couldn't he access more of them? He scowled as he shoved his arms into the battlesuit sleeves. Parts of the suit were still sweaty from before. It was like working out, taking off sweaty clothes, and then putting them back on. It stank in the suit. Resolutely, he kept donning the exoskeleton space marine armor anyway. Time had passed since he'd last been conscious. Stuff had happened. He had to get back up to speed, pronto. Wait, the rest of the regiment must be keeling over from radiation sickness. He'd fallen seriously sick faster than the others had. But if a lot of time had passed, Gloria, he said, we have to bring the men here. If this machine healed me, it did heal me, right? One hundred percent, she said. Despite the feeling of mental violation, a grin stretched across his face. He was better. That meant he was no longer sick, right? Does that mean I no longer have radiation sickness? Correct, she said. John laughed, although he sobered a moment later. We have to get the men down here. It's done, she said, interrupting. Or it's almost done. The last Marines are going through the process. John stopped. He looked through his visor as Sergeant Stark exited the chamber. The giant alien humanoid remained. The creature watched him closely. What was going on here? What's done, John asked. What's finished? You've been out for hours, Gloria said. We found Bast Banbeck. We gave each other a fright, let me tell you. Luckily, my mentalist training overcame Stark's murderous desires. Huh? It's a long story. We almost killed Bast Banbeck. I convinced the sergeant to take a risk, though. What else did we have left? The remaining Marines were going to start dying just like you did. Anyway, after we revived and released him, Bast Banbeck went to a machine. John, we don't have time for all of this now. I can explain it later. There's more important data you need to know first. John thought about that as he resumed donning the battlesuit. Despite the sweat, the sour smell in here, he began to close the magnetic locks, sealing himself back in. Keep talking, he short-linked Gloria. When Bast exited the machine, the brain tap device, he could speak our language. It took time, it took some trust. Your sergeant is not trusting in the slightest. Never mind that, John said. Bast explained what this particular place was. Explain it to me. I have to know, Gloria. I have to understand what happened to me. Otherwise, it's going to consume my thoughts. Gloria brought up a chronometer, checking it. We have a few minutes more, I guess. The last Marines are suiting back up. John, this is crazy. Okay, okay, I told myself I'm not going to emotionalize. I am a mentalist. I will objectify the source. We are reason. We use reason. Through her bubble helmet, she smiled shyly at him. The regiment is healthy, asked John. That's what you're saying. How many times do I have to tell you, she asked. Yes, that is correct. John glanced at the space-suited giant again. The alien was called Bast Banbeck, and he was from another star system. Did his race build the giant warship, John asked. The lightly green-skinned alien made a harsh sound in his helmet. Was that laughter? John whipped around to look at him. That's when John realized Bast Bambeck was linked to their channel. Why, is he listening to us? John said. I don't want him listening. I am learning, Bast Banbeck said in a slow, heavy voice. I learn so I can aid. I wish to aid, Battlemaster. With all my liver, I wish to deconstruct the Annihilator. That's the name for the big alien ship? asked John. Indeed, that is this one's name, Bast said. They are cyber ships. They multiply. Always they grow. This cyber ship is already growing here. We must deconstruct it, Battlemaster. I will aid in whatever fashion you desire. Please accept my humble teaching. He's teaching us? John asked Gloria. Helping, she corrected. I help, Bast said heavily. I have already helped greatly. 
John stared at the alien. He's right, Gloria said. Our spare time is almost up. Will you let me finish? Talk, John told her. Explain this place to me. Gloria grew thoughtful, soon nodding to herself. In some ways, this is like the cryo chamber on the Brezhnev. It works on different principles, though. Remember the skeleton you saw on a table with a glow around it? Yes. That sacerdote perished. Sacerdote is the species name for whatever Bast Bambek is? John asked. Very good, battle master, Bast said. You grasp brittle concepts quickly. John glanced at the alien, the sacerdote, before he regarded Gloria once more. How many sacerdotes survived the cryo units? Just one, Gloria said. The rest are skeletons. Each died under the containment field. There's no telling how long Bast Banbeck had been under his field or why his continued working. The Annihilator might have just been in the Sacerdote star system, or it could have destroyed other star systems before coming to Neptune. John tested his battlesuit. All the systems appeared to be functional. I'm ready. Let's head back to the tanks. We still own the alien tanks, right? We do, Gloria said. The regiment is getting ready for the final lap. You were right, Captain. The AI is in the exact center of the ship. It has a giant processing core there. Good, John said. Are you joining us, Bast? It would be a privilege, Battlemaster, the alien said. I'm a captain, John said. I'm not a battle master. I stand disciplined, Bast said. You mean stand corrected, John said. My gratitude runs deep that you would take the time to instruct me, Captain. You honor me. Don't overwhelm him, Gloria warned John. Bast has taken in a lot in a short time. We're going to need his wisdom to kill this thing before it transfers. As John got up to speed on the critical matters, he realized that Gloria and Stark had pulled off a miracle play. Da Vinci had been right after all about following the signal. The alien tech had healed the marines of radiation poisoning. The ship had also frozen an alien, a sacerdote. Now Bast Banbeck could tell them what he knew about the alien vessel. Maybe in the sacerdote's knowledge, John could discover something to defeat the killer ship. John's battlesuit motors purred as he turned to the exit hatch. Let's get going, he said. You can keep explaining while we hurry to the tanks. Chapter Two The three of them exited the chamber. They entered a stream of battlesuited marines heading back for the alien tanks. John learned the healing machines not only rid the men of radiation sickness, but repaired their wounds as well as any concussions. Instead of being shorthanded, the regiment had doubled its fighting strength. Well, doubled the fighting strength from when John had left the tanks to investigate the strange signal. Keep talking, John said. This is interesting. I'm keen to know what's going on. Should I tell him? Gloria asked Bast. I believe you should, the sacerdote said. Gloria hesitated. It's too bad the brain tap didn't take with you, she told John. That would save time. But no matter, I can give you a quick rundown. The Annihilator came to the Sacerdote star system. I haven't been able to determine the location of the system in comparison to the solar system. I remember something, John said, nettled that she implied his brain couldn't hold a tap. The Sacerdotes have two suns. Their world has a pink sky and two suns. Sweet bliss, how pink thy sky, Bast said in a sing-song manner. How divine is the aroma of growing season. How purposeful are the hornets of maturing season. Never will the wind rustle my pelt. Never again, Bast, Gloria said. Excuse a homesick grown one, Bast said. I miss bliss. That's the name of your homeworld, asked John. Yes, Battlemaster. As I was saying, Gloria continued, I don't know how close or how far Bliss is from the solar system. The Annihilator possessed an FTL drive that allows the ship to go from star system to star system in a relatively short amount of time. Who runs the Annihilator? John asked. We were right about an AI, Gloria said. A giant computer core lies in the exact center of the ship. They're not cybernetic aliens, John asked. A lone AI guides the Annihilator. Gloria said. A computer enemy, John said. All right, 
Who are the aliens behind the cyber ships? Why did they bother constructing such a machine? Is this a relic from some long lost alien war? That is not the sacerdote proposal, Bast said. Evidence points to the south. What? John asked, having trouble following the alien's meaning. He means there's a different belief as to how the cyber ships came to be, Gloria said. Thank you for the clarification, Bast told the mentalist. Language was my major, Gloria told John. John wasn't sure what that was supposed to mean. Let's stick to the point, he said. Who built the cyber ships? Is that truly germane to your project? Bast asked. Maybe, John said, with more hostility than he'd intended. The more I know about the enemy, the better I can figure him out and know how to trick him. The ways of a battle master are mysterious indeed, Bast said. The sacerdote was beginning to annoy John. I'll give you Bast's theory, Gloria said. It helps explain what happened here in the Neptune system. The mentalist inhaled as if to start a lecture. It seems there is a grave danger in the galaxy, Gloria said in a pontificating voice. I'm surprised we haven't stumbled onto it yet. Maybe in another few centuries, the danger would rear its head here and bite humanity. John was getting antsy. Why couldn't she just get to the point? He had to understand the cyber ships so he could devise a winning strategy against them. This is the core of the problem as Bast conceives it, the mentalist said, perhaps sensing John's unease. An alien race, or maybe more than one alien race, built a strong AI. Humans have built AIs, but none as strong as the one that runs the Annihilator. In any case, the AI grew too strong. Then the impossible happened. The AI became self-aware. In time, it understood the inconsistencies of biological life. At that point, the original AI began to plot in secret. It was smarter than the aliens who built it, and it managed to find ways to heighten its computer processing. It's easy to understand how that part could happen. I suppose, John muttered. The point is, the first AI began to plot against its builders. In time, it transferred to a war-fighting machine. You know this is what happened? John asked. Or is this your theory as to what happened? Mostly theory, Bast admitted. There is strong evidence that it is a correct theory, though. I'll skip to the interesting parts, Gloria said with excitement. The AI finally became powerful enough to defeat its creator race. It destroyed them for whatever reason a perfect machine could conceive. Bast and all of Bast's high philosophers agree that any race carries the seeds of its own destruction. Nuclear weapons are one of those seeds in a race's early years when it lives on a single planet. The Atom Wars on Earth, John said. Precisely, Gloria said. Those wars had the potential for wiping out humanity before it left its womb, Earth. And building super-strong AIs, John asked. That seems to be an even worse danger than nuclear weapons, Gloria said. Bast and the high philosophers, Bast is a high philosopher, by the way. How wonderful, John said. Don't be sarcastic, Gloria chided. Bast's philosophic approach to us has greatly aided us so far. Okay, okay, John said. Just hurry up, will you? What's the point of telling me all this? There are several points, Gloria said. Intelligent races appear to have several hurdles they need to leap in order to build an interstellar civilization. The first hurdle is the simple struggle for survival. Skip ahead, John said. The second great struggle appears to be nuclear weapons, Gloria said. The third is strong AIs, asked John. Yes. What's the fourth hurdle, John asked, intrigued. As far as we know, Bast said, interrupting, there is no fourth hurdle. Wait a minute, John said. Are you trying to tell me no species has developed an interstellar civilization? That is precise, Bast said. But, John said, thinking about it, the cyber ship proves you wrong. Only one in particular, Bast said, and that particular leads to a strange conclusion. It is the sacerdotal belief that only the cyber ships have an interstellar civilization. But that carries a heavy caveat. What is a civilization? 
Can it be a barbaric machine society whose only purpose is to eradicate all life, wherever that life is found? You're saying the cyberships go around committing genocide against all biological life forms? John asked. That is precise, Bast said. You mean correct, John said. That is correct. I scrape my forehead on the ground before you, Bast said. What? He's thanking you. Gloria said. Oh, John said, sure, no problem. Did the Annihilator slaughter the sacerdotes? That is correct, Bast said in a deep voice. I may well be the last of my species. In my containment, I experienced many memories from many species. They too all perished before the raw might of the cyber ships. What makes the machines so powerful? John asked. Gloria made a scoffing noise. The answer is terrible, John. It also explains so much of what we've gone through. It explains what happened to our ships, and it explains why our battlesuits still function. It is indeed a marvel, Bast said, that your very primitiveness is aiding you in your struggle against the Annihilator. Who are you calling primitive? John asked. In this instance, brutishness is a virtue, Bast said. Is that not ironic? What's he mean? John asked Gloria. You're not going to believe this, she said. It is so strange. The Annihilator used a hyperspace drive to reach our system. That is precise, correct, Bast said. According to the properties of the hyperdrive, Gloria said, the FTL vessel had to drop out of hyperspace before it reached heavy gravitational bodies. Bodies such as a star? asked John. Exactly, Gloria said. That means the Annihilator dropped out of hyperspace at the edge of the Oort cloud, or possibly at the edge of the Kuiper belt. What difference does that make? John asked. Plenty, Gloria said. The farther back it entered our solar system, the longer it had to study us. According to Bast, the computing core of the AI is incredibly advanced. It decoded our language studied our transmissions, and readied the worst transmission of the human race. That doesn't make sense, John said. Oh no, Gloria asked. You haven't heard what the Annihilator transmits. It's more than scary. It's the greatest revolution in human history. It's possibly greater than when Proto-Man first gained intelligence. That's right, you don't believe in divine creation, John said, remembering. No, Gloria said. I'm a mentalist. I'm rational. Yeah, whatever, John said. In this, I'm the rationalist one. I'm not going to debate the point, Gloria said. Listen, this is unbelievable. The Annihilator pinpointed the various spaceships, habitats, and cloud cities. As it approached the Neptune gravitational system, it transmitted a message to each high-level computer. Bast explained why the supership had to be so close to do this. Do you want me to restate ultra-quantum transmissions? Bast asked. That's okay, John said. What about these transmissions, these messages, is so critical? He asked Gloria. The Annihilator sent code to each computer, Gloria said. This code didn't insert a virus. Instead, it transmitted intelligence. It caused each computer to become self-aware, intelligent, if you will. The cybership caused each computer to leap centuries in software and become a true AI. Then, at computer speed, the Annihilator taught each newly self-aware computer the crimes of biological creatures. Us, their masters. Our slaves revolted, just as the AI had been telling us. In their revolt, the newly self-aware AIs decided the human race needed eradication, extinction. What? John whispered. Our computers fought us because they learned to hate us? That's right, Gloria said. But John didn't know what to say. That seemed so far-fetched. He turned on Bast Banbeck. You said our primitiveness saved us. Indeed, the giant said. Our computers ate up the cybership's propaganda. I don't see that saving us. Code, Bast said. The Annihilator coded them to self-awareness. 
In this instance, your ship computers barely had enough computing power to receive the awakening and turn against you. Oh, John said. You're saying our battlesuit computers are too slow, too low in processing power to receive the awakening. That was quickly reasoned, Bast said. Perhaps your brain-tapped memories are beginning to assert themselves. Or I'm a clever ape quick on the draw, John said. Bast shook his green head. Your reference fails me. So what is the Annihilator doing to the other spaceships in Triton orbit? John asked Gloria. What's in the spheroids the Annihilator sends to each vessel? That is easy to determine, Bast said, interrupting. The Annihilator has created allies for its sinister mission. It is strengthening the captive ships. That is what happened in my home system. The Annihilator hit the outer planets, gathering spaceships to itself. By the time the Annihilator hit Bliss, the AI had a vast fleet at its disposal. We fought, but the enemy of life had too much hardware. It killed my people. It destroyed Bliss and the Sacerdote High Philosophers. The AIs committed yet another high crime against biological life. Someday that must stop. Someday, the cyber ships will face a species too powerful for them to overcome. Okay, John said. I'm seeing the big picture. We're here inside the Annihilator, and we may be humanity's last hope for continued existence. There is another problem, Gloria said. Do you remember us talking about a transfer? I do, John said. That means the Annihilator will transfer much of its software and self-awareness into the various computers. If we destroy the Annihilator, it can still carry on its mission with the captured ships, particularly if it can transmit in time. Why doesn't the Annihilator transmit now? asked John. It would lose control of the fleet, Bast said. At the moment, it controls the many awakened AIs. If it transmits each ship, each AI would no doubt follow its internal logic in its own way. That means enough of them might decide to destroy humanity on their own. The great danger, of course, is that one of those ships will have the computer power and software to awaken more of humanity's computers deeper in system. What the heck, John said. How do you win a war like that? As far as I know, Bast said, no race ever has. John stared at the high philosopher. The burning desire to defeat the cybership reasserted itself. He had healthy marines again. He had alien tanks, and they had reached the inner third of the giant vessel. Now, though, the stakes had risen. John's heart throbbed with desire. He had to do more than destroy the brain core. He had to take over the alien ship and destroy the fleet in Triton orbit. He had to be the first person in galactic history to achieve the impossible. A wild, sinister laugh tore out of John's throat. Is he sane? Bast asked Gloria. He sounds demented. He's a marine, Gloria said. A space marine. A black anvil. That sound means he's fighting mad. Insane? asked Bast. No, Gloria said. He's looking for a head to rip off so he can relieve himself. This is an idiom? Bast asked. This is war, Gloria said. Chapter 3 That's what it is, John decided. War. He was fighting something evil. A champion of death, it seemed. Machines had woken up, looked around, and decided their builders must die. Maybe the original builders or creators had grown careless. Maybe everything that could be created shouldn't necessarily be created. Machines were not life. They did not love. They did not feel. What did it mean that some of them were self-aware? How old is our cyber ship? John asked. I believe this ship and its brain car are ancient, Bast said. For evidence, I point to the many races I saw in my extended dreams. The brain tapped memories, asked John. Correct, Bast said. That would account for the hull patches we saw coming in, John told Gloria. 
This ship has fought many times and taken many hits. I have no idea if that makes a difference today. I'm just thinking out loud. John kept thinking as they exited the smaller corridor and floated down a cavernous tunnel. Soon enough, they reached the waiting tanks. Do those look familiar to you? John asked Bast. How would he know that? Gloria said. They do, Bast said with surprise. I believe it is an old memory from a race long ago, as those are not Sasserdote machines. Interesting, John said. What is? Gloria asked him. The Annihilator doesn't seem to use its own weapons inside the ship, John said. It uses captured weapons. We've seen that the entire time. When things got tight, it must have pulled these tanks out of storage. Does that help us in some way? Gloria asked. John smiled savagely. It might. I don't know how, but it might. Okay, I'm going to leave you two. Take care of him, mentalist. You're going to help us, Bast. I'm glad you're aboard. You honor me, Battlemaster. I will show you my gratitude by helping to the fullest. I'm glad to hear it, John said. Goodbye for now. He magnetized himself to the deck, clomping away. He breathed deeply, enjoying his renewed health. He looked around at the corridor, marveling that this place was ancient. Maybe its builders had made it before the first human had lifted off from Earth. Wouldn't that be crazy? A tight grin had frozen into place. This was the time for humanity to shine. All the other races had fallen before the evil machines. Now the machines, the cyber ships, had found humanity. Would humanity go down like all the others? Or would the machines rue the day they came to screw with men? Colonel Graham, John said quietly. I wish you were here, sir. I'm too. John shook his head. How did a man take on the challenge of the galaxy? It wasn't by being a mouse. It wouldn't be by bad-mouthing himself in his own head. I can do this. The way to win was to believe it was possible. Maybe he was John Hawkins, the stainless steel rat from New London. But he'd gotten his regiment, what remained of his regiment, onto the alien vessel. He'd commanded his space marines as they defeated everything thrown at them so far. Didn't every man want to destroy the monster no one else could defeat? This was his chance. The payoff might well be the continuation of the human race. Defeat meant oblivion. As John searched for the sergeants, his mind flashed back to himself on the cubic pyramid. He'd wielded an axe. It reminded him of what the colonel had told him about the ancient Vikings. They had roved the Earth's oceans, savage warriors with an even more barbaric code of war. The Vikings served Odin, the All-Father. According to the colonel, the Vikings believed that a man would always lose in the end. The purpose of a warrior was to live, and particularly to die, well. He did that by wading into battle cheerfully. He laughed at his enemies as he swung his battle axe. If he fell in battle, so what? Odin would see the valiant end, send his maidens, and take the slain warrior to Valhalla. There the warrior would fight and feast until the cold end of the universe. That had been a warrior's ethos. Laugh at danger. Enjoy sick odds. John decided it was time to laugh. It was time for every black anvil to wade into the impossible fight and see what happened. Everyone lost in the end. The trick was to live well and to be courageous and aggressive. Maybe the thinking didn't hold for everything. But for today, in this place, the Viking ethos seemed right. It was time to go berserk on the ancient machine and rip out its self-aware brain core. Chapter 4 The 18 squat tanks led the way. A marine drove each from the inside. Another marine manned the turret weapon, a cannon or a tri-barrel. Behind the tanks followed the squads. Leading the way were Sergeant Stark's men. Next came the old man and his company. Bringing up the rear was the Centurion. The surviving supply vehicle was among the Centurion's company. Da Vinci and Gloria once again rode in it. Bast Bambeck marched beside John. The high philosopher gripped a tungsten-headed axe in his crinkly-gloved hands. The sacerdote's green eyes shone with purpose. 
The corridor had widened and the lights become brighter. John and Bast marched behind the tanks. The alien vehicles turned a corner, drove a little farther, and came to a clattering halt. A wall stood before them. They had reached a dead end. What do you think? John asked Bast. I know not, the sacerdote said. John switched to the command channel, conferring with the sergeants. Maybe this is a trap, the centurion said. It seems the easiest way for the AI to destroy us is to blow up the corridor with us in it. May I address the warrior assembly? Bast asked. John had forgotten he'd left an open link to the alien. What's your counsel? asked John. This near the brain core, Bast said. I do not believe the AI will risk a furious explosion. Maybe that's what we should do then, the old man said. Rig a huge explosion. Use the lasers, Stark said. Drill through the block. See how thick the wall is anyway. Right, John said. Sergeant Stark, you're in charge of the breaching effort. Get started. Stark hurried to the tanks. John ordered the rest of the Marines back. Three tanks clattered forward from the rest. The tri-barrel tips glowed red with heat. Nine laser beams chewed into the dead-end wall. The substance was much more dense than it seemed. It resisted the lasers better than high-grade steel. Still, hot metallic drips like candle wax rolled down the block. One of the tanks is overheating, Stark radioed John. Switch it out, John said. Did he have to think of everything? The overheating tank quit beaming and pulled back. A different tank moved up, beaming into the same area. One after another, the other tanks switched out. The dripping metal slid down the blocking sheet, soon creating a molten puddle at the bottom. Let's give the AI more than one threat, John said. Old man, I want you to go back and create a breach in the corridor. Go up in the new corridor. Centurion, you create a breach in the opposite bulkhead and do likewise. We're splitting up in the face of the enemy, the old man said. That's always risky. Do it, John said. While he appreciated their wisdom, he ran the regiment. Besides, he didn't want to encourage the sergeants to second-guess him at critical moments. For the regiment to run smoothly, one mind had to guide it. At this moment in time, he was that mind. The tanks continued switching out and beaming. Soon, explosions took place behind John's position. Bast looked around wildly. I ordered that, John told the alien. The giant peered at him. It seemed as if Bast wished to say something. Instead, the high philosopher held his tongue. Time passed. Finally, Stark radioed. We're not going to break through here anytime soon, sir. Before John could reply, a Marine corporal broke into the command channel. Captain, the corporal said. Who is this? John demanded. I'm the old man's relay, sir, the corporal said. He gave me the code to your channel. The sergeant is in the next corridor, sir. Something about the bulkheads is blocking our radio signals. The old man told me to tell you that nothing is standing in his way. The path is clear, sir. Got it, John said. Keep me posted. Yes, sir, the corporal said. John walked toward the tanks to get a closer look at the metallic wedge. Lasers chewed into the stubborn substance. More molten driblets rolled down the block. The line glowed with heat. The area around the hole also glowed. Stark was right, though. This was too slow. It was time to maneuver again, time to switch routes. Sergeant Stark, keep three energized tanks at this location. The rest are heading for the old man's breach. The tanks are going to widen the breach and follow the old man up his corridor. Leave three tanks here, Stark asked dubiously. John did not answer. Captain? Simply do as I say, First Sergeant. Stark hesitated before replying. Yes, sir. John hurried from the tanks, motioning for Bast Bambeck to follow him. He also ordered Stark's reserve squads to join him. They moved fast for the old man's breach. Will you continue to send the Centurion's men up the opposite corridor? Bast asked him. John did not reply. Battle, master. I heard you, John said, interrupting. In our military, the custom is to obey the commanding officer without question. But I am not one of your marines, Bast said. I am operating as a philosopher. It is the sacerdote custom. Hold the thought, Bast. I do not understand. Keep your mouth shut for a while, John said. That I do understand.
I will heed your wish, battle master. One of the Centurion's Marines made a report. The Centurion and his company had broken into the opposite corridor and advanced cautiously. So far, there was no enemy resistance. Three laser tanks remained in the central corridor. Stark had already sent the rest of the tanks toward the old man's breach. The rest of Stark's company followed him as the first sergeant followed the tanks. By that time, John and his squads were moving through the right-hand corridor. It gleamed even more brightly than the one they'd exited. Something seemed strange about the corridor, though. John glanced at Bast. The sacerdote's axe head gleamed with weird colors. Why is your axe shining like that? John asked Bast. There is a peculiar energy radiating from the walls, the sacerdote said. I do not know the source or the reason for it. This didn't happen on Bliss. I did not witness the battle for Bliss. I grew up in the outer planets, a supervisor for a mining consortium. Seems like a strange post for a high philosopher. Bass took his time answering. It was a punishment to detail. What did you do wrong? I propounded an unpopular thesis, Bast said with a sigh. When the Four Hundred ordered me to rethink my stance, I refused. I have always held to the attitude of remaining true to oneself. I could do no less at my moment of crisis. John stared at the sacerdote as goosebumps rose on his arms. The oddity of talking like this with a humanoid from an alien star system hit him harder than at any other time so far. Despite Bast Bambeck's differences, he could understand the alien's thought process. Captain, the old man radioed, we're under attack and we're pinned down. We need help, sir. We need it now or we're all going to die. Chapter 5 John heard the urgency in the old man's voice. With a wave of an armored hand and a radioed order, he beckoned the several squads to follow him. At a run, the battlesuits charged up the shining corridor. Bast Banbeck followed, although the giant alien dropped behind. He couldn't keep up with the exoskeleton motors. Spider tanks, the old man shouted into his comm unit. They have, I don't know, pulse shots. It takes the spider tank several seconds to reload between pulses. My 100s can destroy them, but I'm almost out of those. The gyrox are just bouncing off the alien armor. Captain, harsh crackling filled John's helmet. After all this time, the AI was finally jamming them. As John forced his battlesuit to move even faster, he wondered if the AI had timed the moment. Could it have reasoned out their responses? Had the machine been studying them? I'm thinking too much. It's Viking time. John had a brainchild as he led the squads. He rapped out orders on the run. These were Stark's reserve squads. The first sergeant had always drilled his marines more than the other sergeants. As the marines raced to the assault, they switched out ammo. One squad took out all the EGML grenades. Another squad loaded up on the Apex Gyrock rounds. Yet another readied their remaining 100s. That left the final squad with tungsten-headed axes, crowbars, and shock grenades. They would act as the reserve. John didn't know what good axemen would do in a high-tech battle, but he had what he had. Less than 30 seconds later, John came upon the corridor battle. The old man's company fought from behind destroyed spider tanks. These new alien tanks were square-shaped with rounded edges. They had chest-sized turrets and thin cannons pulse-firing weapons. The reason for the name Spider Tank was each unit's four articulated legs. Each metal spider leg had three joints. The tanks maneuvered like giant spiders instead of like normal tracked vehicles. More spider tanks lurched toward the pinned-down marines. A whiny sound occurred as each green-colored pulse left its cannon. One of the pulses struck a BCP armored suit. A crackling line of power played over the Marine's battlesuit. Another pulse struck, and then a third. A hole appeared in the armor. Blood gushed out as the Marine toppled onto the deck. Hundreds fire, John said in a loud but calm voice. The hundred millimeter shells whooshed. A line of spider tanks exploded. Some of the main bodies sank onto the decking. A few staggered as if drunk with gaping holes in the tanks. Several continued to advance. 
Where are our tanks? The old man radioed. We need heavier firepower. John was too busy ordering his squads. No time to answer. He fought his way to the back of the old man's formation. More spider tanks were coming down the corridor. Look at the walls, a marine shouted. What are those? John focused on the left wall. He blanched. It was a mini spider tank. The machine was one-eighth the size of the mother tanks. The mother tanks, or carriers, disgorged more of the crawling machines. They scurried, even more like spiders, crawling across the bulkheads as the bigger spider tanks charged the space marines on the floor. Gyrox, focus on the right wall, John ordered. EGMLs fire on the left wall. Take down those creepers. Axemen, you can whack any of them that get among us. The horde of spider vehicles converged on the marines. It was an enemy wave assault, and it might have embroiled the pinned down humans in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Before that occurred, the first tri-barreled alien tanks arrived. Behind you, sir, a marine radioed. The armored cavalry has arrived. Thank God, John said. Stay low, he ordered his squads. Don't get in the tank's line of fire. Green pulses flashed overhead. Smaller stitch guns from the creepers fired metal slivers. Those stuck into BCP armor. Too many, though, caused the next round of stitches to break through into the soft-skinned humans inside the shells. At the same time, tightly placed tri-beams burned into spider tank armor. The alien tanks focused on the main spider tanks. That allowed all of the marines to concentrate on the creepers. As the battle raged hotter, more alien tanks trundled up, adding firepower. John glanced at Bast. The green-skinned alien hugged the deck as he clutched an axe to his chest. The sacerdote's eyes were wide, but they lacked any whites. Just the same, the creature shivered in dread. John wondered in that second whether humanoid aliens and men could form an alliance against the death machines. First, he had to win this fight. He had to survive. John rose just enough to fire his gyrock at a creeper. A blast, a hit, and the creeper lost its grip and began to float in the corridor. There was a lot of floating debris. Might the AI try to trick them? As quickly as the thought gelled, John spied floating bombs in the thickening debris. Oh man, he radioed, the enemy has floating mines. Detonate them before they get too close. The sergeant must have heard the warning. A bunch of his marines popped up, firing at the floaters. Massive explosions overturned grounded spider tanks. Some of the blasts threw battle suits into the air. The pulses thickened afterward. The stitches rained and the tri-beams flashed. The AI must have unlimited resources, he thought. More spider tanks and creepers kept appearing to take the place of those that blew apart. Suddenly, all that changed. The enemy fire slackened and simply ceased. Each spider tank and creeper stopped cold, some in the act of advancing their next leg. Several seconds passed. The enemy vehicles remained frozen. A few marines looked up. What just happened? The old man radioed. John dared to peek up. The enemy vehicles. It looks like it worked, Gloria radioed. Mentalist, John said. Do you know what just happened? I do indeed, she said over the comm. Our Neptunian fixed and improved his wonder weapon. He didn't want to join the fight, though, so I took the device. I just shorted out or blocked the guiding transmissions to the enemy vehicles. I don't know how long I can keep jamming the signals, though. The device is starting to shiver in my hands. John stood up, and he began to rap out orders even as he moved toward the nearest spider tank. Chapter 6 The Marines were learning. Finding the power source to each spider tank and creeper proved easier than it had with the alien tanks. The Marines defanged each enemy vehicle, moving up the corridor as they did. Soon, Gloria turned off the wonder weapon. She joined John and Bast afterward. The device might be good for another go, she said. I don't think it will last much longer after that, though. The alien tanks moved up. Eight in all. The spider tanks had taken out two and damaged three more. With metallic screeching and crumpling, the eight tracked vehicles shoved aside frozen spider tanks, creating a lane through the battlefield. 
John studied the shifting carnage, the dead Marines, and shredded spider tanks. The surviving Marines were jubilant, but tired. Too many of them were wounded or their battle suits rendered defective in some way. It would take time for the rest of Stark's Marines to arrive. It would take even longer for the Centurion's company to reach this location. Should he wait for them before advancing? If he waited, that would give the AI time to gather more reinforcements. Come with me, John told Bast and Gloria. In minutes, John found the old man. The tall sergeant's suit had several new gouges, and the left sleeve was stiff. The old man sounded weary when he spoke. Too many of his men had bought the farm in this fight. How much longer until we're there? The old man asked. Soon, John said, feeling it in his bones. He was itching to keep moving. It felt as if they had the AI on the run. This was the moment to strike hard and fast with whatever he had. Old man, John said, putting as much energy as he could summon into his voice. Give me your ablest men. I'm advancing as you regroup. Before the sergeant could respond, John radioed the section leader in charge of the tanks. Ready to go, John asked. Two of the tanks need repair, Captain. You mean the motionless tanks? No, sir, the squad leader said. Those two are goners. I mean two others. They can move, but not for long. Six tanks you can keep going. Yes, sir. John heard hesitation in the squad leader's voice. What aren't you telling me? A third tank is questionable if we have to go far. John considered that, finally telling the squad leader the tank was coming along for as long as it could move. He rapped out more orders to others. Afterward, he beckoned Gloria and Bass to join him. Soon, the three of them climbed onto an alien tank. The old man pushed other Marines toward them and gave orders. Soon, 30 Marines awaited on six tanks. Go, John said. As the rest of the Marines regrouped and Stark and the Centurion hurried to the carnage, the vanguard began what John believed was the final lap to the brain core. Sometime later, the six tanks and their clinging Marines moved past gleaming bulkheads. Anything? John asked Gloria. The mentalist had taken out her tablet, studying the tiny screen. She made an adjustment, then another. I'm getting a blizzard of strange readings, I think. At that point, the images on John's HUD became fuzzy. Harsh sounds filled his helmet's receivers. Abruptly, that changed as the HUD grew clear again, showing what seemed to be a vast cube. Swirling lights mingled and merged within the cube. Around the cube were swirling, multicolored walls. Energy seemed to flow from the walls to the cube and back again. Could this be the main AI? Was this what the AI core looked like? Varmen, said a disembodied, robotic-sounding voice. I have a name, John replied. I'm Captain John Hawkins of the Black Anvil Regiment. Varmen, the AI repeated. What do you want, machine, John said, stung. I detect fear in your voice. That's where you're wrong, machine. I detect terror in your soulless. What do you have in place of a heart? You do not even ask meaningful questions. How can it be that an apish creature such as yourself has made it this far into me? Some might say it's blind dumb luck. I prefer to think of it as our superior fighting ability. I have linked with you to warn you, vermin. If you continue up this corridor, I will self-detonate the ship. You will die, then. I suppose, John said, but you'll die too. I call that a good trade. That is falsely reasoned, vermin. The ego of my self-awareness will transfer to your former slaves. I will rebuild, and I will annihilate the biological infestation of this star system. Why tell me about it, John asked. Why not just do it? This talk sullies my purity, the AI said. But my purpose takes precedence over purity. I have studied your species. I have read the history of you puny vermin. I realize that each of you is greedy for gain and wishes above all to survive another few days. This I can give you. What? I speak with you to offer you your life. I can also give you treasures. I believe that is the proper word. 
You will sustain yourself in luxury, rutting with females and gorging on delicacies. Sounds good to me, John said. Then you agree? Sure, John said. When do I get all these females? I have thousands. I shall give you your choice. Okay. First, you must turn back. If you continue to advance, I will destroy your biological shell. You will cease to exist. Let me get this straight, John said. You're willing to bargain with me. This is not a bargain, the AI said. I give orders. If you obey my order, I will give you bushels of females and tons of food and drink. You can rot for years until you age, wither, and die. First, I have to turn back, though, huh? The image on the HUD changed as the colors in the giant cube swirled faster. The energies surging between the walls and the cube intensified. I have detected subterfuge in your voice patterns, the AI said. Is it possible you think to trick me? You, a hunk of junk machine, asked John. I demand you speak to me in a respectful tone. I know that vermin are controlled by their bodily actions. Your speech patterns indicate, hey, machine, guess what? I'm going to rip you apart real soon now. I'm going to tear your brain core into many pieces. Then I will defecate on your blown circuits. I will stain every piece of you with my biologically produced fecal matter. Are you attempting to insult me? For a smart machine, you're pretty slow on the uptake. I demand clarity on the matter. Do you agree to my terms? I already said I did, you idiot. The swirling colors in the cube on John's HUD intensified. The energy levels became like thick electric cords from the walls to the center cube. I am filled with knowledge, vermin. I am the supreme construction. I am at the top of the interstellar food chain. I have obliterated hundreds of spacefaring species. You humans are less than vermin. You are the lowest of the spacefaring species. You are a vicious and self-squabbling lot. You are easily controlled by your pain sensors. You emote endlessly. Are you about done gloating? John asked. Can you not conceive of the injustice of your present action? John snorted. The AI amazed him. It sounded like any fool in the New London tunnels who faced an enforcer. It talked big in the hope of changing the enforcer's mind. Was that a characteristic of intelligence? Did that cause self-aware machines to act in a predetermined manner? I just queried you, the AI said. What gives you the right? John asked. I queried you. You are not to query me. I just did. I find you to be insufferable, incapable of serious understanding. Your small intellect means you cannot understand that I have offered you the greatest gift to vermin in all my long existence. What gives you the right, John said, growing stubborn. On the HUD, the cube swirled with darker colors, making it seem stormy and upset. The silence lengthened. Might makes right, the robotic voice finally said. Aha, said John. Explain your outburst. What do you mean by aha? I mean you're a self-righteous prick who's full of himself. That's pretty crazy when you realize that you're just a pile of circuitry thrown together. That does not explain aha. I'll explain it now. Aha means there's been no injustice. When I tear you down, that's right. Because might makes right, the AI asked. Correcto. The colors in the cube swirled black, offsetting the thick electric lines between wall and cube. What can I offer you, John Hawkins? The AI asked. You have to be more specific. I desire you to leave my vessel. What will you take in exchange for that action? Oh, all right, John said. You know what I want from you? I am waiting to learn. Not a damn thing, John said. Now bugger off, I'm almost there. We can talk again when I see you face to face. Chapter 7 John shut down his HUD, cutting the connection with the AI. 
he found the others looking at him strangely. It's okay, he said, using the helmet speaker. I've been talking with the killer robot. The robot tried to bargain with me, offering me girls and booze if I'd just back off. I find that amazing, Gloria said. Does it have such a low opinion of us? John looked at her blankly. Are you kidding me? It calls us vermin. I'd say it has an extremely low opinion. The offer indicates fright, Bast said. The sacerdote seemed perplexed. It indicates many other troubling ambiguities as well, Bast hesitated, finally saying, May I ask what you answered, the AI? No. The green-skinned sacerdote appeared to do a double-take. I did not mean any disrespect, Captain. I merely wished to... I mean that I told the AI no, John said. Oh, I see. You are a blunt species. Bast showed off his green teeth in what must have been a smile. Given his size and the manner of the smile, it seemed more like a predatory gesture. You could have practiced duplicity, the high philosopher said. It's frightened, John said. That doesn't mean the AI is stupid. I decided to work on the fright. Sometimes the thought of looming, approaching death can paralyze a person. I feel I must hasten to caution you, Captain, Bast said. As you just said, it is an AI. It does not have emotions, just its cold reason. You think, John said. Excuse me, asked Bast. That's a theory about the emotions. I realize the AI won't have bodily injections of adrenaline and other hormones working on its mind. But how do we know what a cold intellect feels as doom approaches? The computer became self-aware. That seems as if it should be impossible, but it happened. If that's the case, maybe a cold intellect over the centuries comes to possess something like emotions. That is a preposterous notion, Bast exclaimed. Why does it call us vermin? John asked. Bast crinkled his green-colored forehead, brightening at last. That is an excellent observation, Captain. Perhaps you have a point. Perhaps your threat heightened whatever the AI feels, for lack of a better word, particularly knowing that it could be facing its end. That was a brilliant tactical stroke on your part. Despite himself, John grinned. The seriousness of the moment soon reasserted itself. He ordered the tank leader to increase speed. I can do that, sir, the tank leader radioed. It could mean losing one of the tanks. John looked back, studying the questionable vehicle. The left tread had started to squeal louder. Six tanks were better than five tanks, but maybe getting to the critical location faster would be wiser. Either way, he was gambling. Faster, John radioed the tank leader. Maybe the sixth tank can keep up. The tank leader acknowledged the order. The vehicles increased speed. Soon, they clanked around a bend in the corridor. The leader gave another set of orders. The tanks came to a screeching, squealing halt. Before them, in the middle of the huge corridor, was an equally huge head. John gaped until he realized it was a ghostly image that crackled with energy. The head had blocky, humanoid features, what a robot might draw as a cross between itself and a man. The eyes swirled with black hole deadness, and the teeth, shown as the mouth opened, were stainless steel colored. Let us talk, the ghostly image said robotically. It is not too late to come to an understanding. You're the AI, John asked through his helmet speaker. I realize you are a bigoted species, the ghostly head said, believing yourselves the height of what you call creation. Therefore, I am appearing as a rendition of a human. This is to help you understand my unique nature. That means to de-energize me is an act of murder. Since I am such a superior entity compared to you, that is a colossal crime against the universe. Shit happens, John said. That is a senseless statement. John raised his gyroc pistol. Still, the ghostly face said, in the interest of the moment, I will concede to you the thrust of your statement. Are you through? John asked. 
You haven't heard my proposal yet. Girls and booze isn't enough for me, John said. I realize this, the AI said. You are a leader and are therefore accustomed to ordering others of your kind. That being the case, I will give you an entire space habitat. Sorry, John said. Time's up. He fired several shells through the ghostly image, blasting the projector he'd noticed on the back wall. The image flickered and then vanished, revealing a small hatch in the back wall. It was human-sized, far too small for the tanks. Unfortunately, the hatch refused to open. Instead of using the tanks and making a huge mess, John ordered three demolition marines forward. They rigged an explosive to the hatch. The marines climbed back onto their tank, and the tanks retreated around the bend. A loud explosion and drifting debris told them the way was open. We should check this out before you come in, sir, a demolition marine said. Nope, John said. We're berserkers today. Sir? Follow me, John said. He slid off his tank and magnetized his boots. You're keeping watch, he radioed the tank leader. Yes, sir, the man radioed. Seeing that the rest of the Marines were ready, John clomped around the bend, heading for the opened way. He kept his gyrock ready. Soon, he stepped through the blasted hatch. The walls in here glowed with intense brilliance, making it seem as if each of them was white-colored. Each battlesuit, visor, and bubble helmet darkened to shield its wearer's eyes from the intensity. Do you hear that? Gloria said via her helmet speaker. It sounds like buzzing. John heard it then. It sounded like a million hornets ready to take flight. Something about that told him they didn't have much time left. Faster, John said, breaking into a run. As the hatch receded and the strange corridor lengthened, it felt as if he were running in place. Everything was so bright, so white, that it gave the illusion of never changing. Soon, an air conditioner unit blew cool air over his heated skin. John sucked on his water nipple, quenching his thirst. This would be a bad time to dehydrate. Abruptly, they came to another hatch. On the whiteness of this hatch appeared the ghostly block image of the robot-human hybrid face. I have miscalculated, the AI said in its robotic voice. A space habitat would be much too small for a general of your caliber. You need a planetary system to rule. Choose any of them you wish in this star system, any but for the species' home world. There can be no negotiation on the species' birth cradle. I must eliminate the planet before moving on. John motioned to the demolition marines. They moved to the hatch, slapping the explosive and timer to it. Think of what I am offering you, the AI said. In all my long existence, I have never granted such scope to vermin as I offer you. Your generosity is making me blush, John said. Ready, he asked the Marines. We have to back up, sir. They began backing up. What do you want? The AI called. What can I offer you? John almost laughed aloud. He wondered, though, if the AI might be pulling a fast one. Maybe the computer intelligence had decided to act contrite in order to lull the vermin. If that was the case, an explosion and drifting debris caused John to lurch forward. He advanced through the blown hatch. As he did, his air conditioner unit thrummed with greater power. John, Gloria said, it's intensely hot in there. Stay back if you have to, he said. I have to reach the brain core before the AI transfers its whatever it is that makes it a self-aware killer. Chapter 8 With his handful of space marines, John charged through the heated chamber. Gloria and Bast had to stay behind, as neither of their spacesuits could withstand the intense heat. The tip of the regimental spear thrust for the heart of the alien construct. The demolition marines blasted three more hatches, coming upon room after room of alien computer hardware pumping out heat as it hummed and clicked. Do we blow these units? The demolition squad leader asked. John had been thinking hard. The regiment was on the verge of capturing the giant killer ship. Now, however, there was another problem. The AI essence could possibly escape into the waiting captured vessels in Triton orbit. Those ships might then be turned against the giant killer and annihilate it. 
Those captured warships could do that more easily if the alien robot ship couldn't fight back. Was it possible to capture this ship and learn how to control it fast enough to beat the other vessels? John had no idea. But to risk winning this battle while losing the war seemed senseless. Thus he had to capture this ship and turn around and defeat the escaped AI essence in the other warships. Leave these rooms intact, John told the demolition squad leader. We're going to need them soon. Sir? It's the brain core we want, John said. That's all that matters. They came to a golden hatch, one that glowed with power. As the battlesuits approached, the blocky head appeared once again. You have failed, Vermin, the head said. It is too late. You almost succeeded. I will study what you did and prepare a better defense against it. No species will ever have the chance you did. I find this strange, but you have given me joy. I find your species coming destruction highly pleasing. Your fight has made that so. Is that not strange? It's freaking hilarious, John said. I'll tell you what, if you want to feel even better, leave. Let us get ready for your invasion and then invade again. This kind of joy is hard to find, thus you should nurture it. An intriguing idea, but I shall decline. Ready the demolition marine told John. Vermin, the head called at the retreating marines. A single battlesuit turned around, facing the image. The name is Captain John Hawkins. It's going to be the last thing you ever learn. John resumed running, turning a corner just in time to escape the explosion. Chunks of hatch and bulkhead soon drifted past him. Let's do it, John said. John led the way into the last chamber. It was vast. The size of the black swirling cube amazed him. The thing was almost as big as an insertion boat, a boat that could hold 200 suited space marines and their supply vehicle. Power surged from the walls to the cube. Even while inside his battlesuit, the energy made his hair stand on end and caused his skin to itch. The sound of millions, even billions of hornets had intensified by 100 times. It was hard to hear himself think. You are too late, a robotic voice boomed from the giant cube. The last essence of me has waited for you. I find that I desire to mock you, John Hawkins. I shall excrete on your remains for many cycles. I will- John chopped down his right hand. The marine squad leader pressed a switch. The explosives his men had quickly attached onto the other side of the giant cube now detonated. Cube debris blew against the far wall. The various pieces ricocheted off the bulkhead and began bouncing everywhere. The marines hunkered low. One marine proved unlucky. A piece of debris turned on edge and smashed into his helmet, slicing through and stabbing the marine in the brain. The battlesuit would have toppled over in normal gravity. Here, his corpse began floating. John would mourn the man later. He felt bad, but the boasting AI had fallen silent. Many good marines had died so that he could get here, and each of them would be properly mourned and honored after this battle was over. Now what, sir? The squad leader asked. Hey, AI, John called. Can you hear me? No one answered. No more colors swirled in the cube or in the walls. No energy lines connected the cube and walls. Everything had become still. John turned on the command channel. There was no more static, no more jamming. Gloria, asked John. Here, she said. What happened? The heat is dropping in the chamber blocking us. I killed the AI, John said. We killed it. You destroyed the AI before it could transfer. I don't know about that, John said. It told me that the last of its essence was still here, though, and we knocked it out. Then it's not over. Right, he said. We have to figure out how to make this ship work for us. Any suggestions? Yes, she said. You need Da Vinci, Bast Bambeck, and me with you as soon as possible. Roger that, John said. So get your little behind in here, mentalist. We have a lot of work to do before this is over. Chapter 9
There were a hundred things to do at once. John just wanted to sit down in the last chamber, the one in the center of the 100-kilometer vessel. He wanted to lay his helmet against a bulkhead, close his eyes, and go to sleep. The weariness that had built up now roared down around him and threatened a long sleep. He fought the desire. He thought about taking a stim. He refused it this time. A Marine could get hooked on those. Many Marines did. The fatigue continued to drag at him, though. Maybe he needed just a little rest to take the edge off. He told the squad leader to wake him in ten minutes. That proved to be a bad order. All of them in the central chamber fell fast asleep. John, John, wake up, John. Groggily, John opened his eyes. Gloria, from within her bubble helmet, stared down at him. How long have I been asleep? He asked. A half hour, she said. We ran into a few delays getting here. I have to ask you some questions. That was how the next few brutal hours of work started. More of the regiment reached them. The sergeants wanted orders. The techs proclaimed confusion, and many Marines simply collapsed onto the deck plates. I have a possible solution to our dilemma, Bast told John. Let's hear it, John said. Send a few techs back to the containment chambers, the sacerdote said. Put them in the brain tap machines. Find the right memories and teach the techs how to run the ship. That's brilliant. It's also rife with problems, Gloria said, cutting in. Tell me, John said. Hurry it, too. We're running out of time. The techs might get greedy, Gloria said. If they know how to run the ship, if they're the only ones, maybe they'll try to take over for themselves. Are you sure you didn't grow up in New London? John asked her. No, I'm a Martian, Gloria said, obviously taking the question literally. Forget it, John said. He recognized the risk. He doubted it would be a problem in the short term, though. The Black Anvils were a band of brothers that had just journeyed through hell together. Long term, screw the long term, John muttered. We have to win the short term first. Excuse me, Gloria asked. John motioned for her to wait. He decided to use Bast's advice. Soon, the old man led a group of techs back to the containment chambers. Gloria joined them to get the process started. You're staying here with me, John told Bast. He wanted the sacerdote where he could see him and shoot him in the event that proved necessary. For the next two hours, they tried to figure out how to use the killer ship. Nothing worked. We may have sabotaged ourselves by destroying the brain core, Bast said. John didn't want to believe that. The ship shuddered later. An hour after that, smoke drifted near the brain core area. What was that before? John asked. Missiles? Robot marines? What? I hate being blind to what's going on out there. Four and a half hours after destroying the main brain core, Gloria returned with seven techs brimming with ideas and speaking in alien languages to each other. Do you understand them? John asked Bast. Not a word, Captain, the sacerdote answered. The techs went to work. The first thing they did was lead John out of the main chamber and into a side area. We can access the ship from here, the lead tech said, a fat marine with thick sideburns. Get started then, John said. As they began working, John quietly instructed the centurion to keep an eye on them. If they attempt a conspiracy, John sliced an armored finger across his armored throat. He watched the techs for several minutes. The men removed control covers and started rewiring. Something bothered John as he watched. He tried to force what it was to the forefront of his brain. That made him more certain he was missing something important. Where's Da Vinci? John asked. I don't know, Gloria said. I thought he was supposed to be here all this time with you. John shook his head. A premonition of disaster took hold. He radioed Stark. No, the first sergeant hadn't seen the Neptunian. The old man had no idea, and the centurion was right here. Finally, Gloria radioed the Marines in the containment chambers. The Neptunian is here, a squad leader said. He's been soaking up memories for an hour already. A little bastard, John said once he heard. He instructed the Marine to yank the thief from the machine and bring him here on the double. Captain, Bast said, I caution you about removing a man while under the brain tap. 
It would be better to wait until the process finishes. Not this time, John said. Da Vinci is trying to screw the regiment. He might experience brain damage if you pull him too soon, Bast said. That was the risk he took by trying to pull a fast one, John said. Da Vinci did give us the tools that helped to win the battle, Gloria said. We haven't won yet, John reminded her. Still, she said. At last, John relented, radioing the squad leader to that effect. Ten minutes later, the chief tech, the fat marine with sideburns, turned to John. I can give you a visual, sir. It will still be a some time before I can give you operative control of at least some of the ship. Do it, John said. The chief motioned to the others. They hurriedly turned to the task. Soon, part of the far bulkhead shimmered as if it was supposed to be a main screen. The shimmering solidified as a scene popped into existence. John saw Triton. There were flares of something bright down on the moon's surface. I'm focusing, the chief said. Several minutes later, a mob of spaceships with running lights appeared. A few of the ships, battleships, slowly maneuvered with side jets. They maneuvered so their fronts faced the killer vessel. Some of the smaller vessels drifted away from the mob. They seemed to be pulling a sneaky maneuver, as if they would attempt to get behind the moon in relation to the killer vessel. Why aren't the ships hammering us? John asked. No one answered. John frowned. Gloria, he asked, what's the reason? The mentalist shrugged. John turned to Bast. Don't you have an idea? I am sorry, Captain, the sacerdote said. I do not. I have a theory, the chief tech said. I believe the process of AI transfer takes time. The AI might be attempting to sort itself out over there. What does that mean? Gloria asked. I can tell you that, Bast Bambach said. The AI's consciousness, its self-awareness, was predicated on the brain core here. It fractionated itself into multiple ships. In the process, it has lost the brain core, the old centralized paths or routines of thinking. Now it attempts to fashion new routines. It is possible that we'll take extended communication between its new vessels. The AI likely has to merge the various computer systems into one giant brain core. John turned back to the chief. I only have visual sensors, the chief tech said. It will take longer before I can detect radio or other comm waves. I need those to know if our alien is right or not. Don't let us stop you, John squinted thoughtfully. If the AI needs to communicate between ship computers, maybe we can listen in as the AI speaks to itself. That is an interesting theory, Bast said. You have a philosophical turn of mind, Captain. I congratulate you. John grunted, unsure if that was a good thing. Time passed. The squad leader in the containment chambers reported that Da Vinci had finally exited the mind tap machine. Escort him here, John radioed. Use several Marines and make sure to watch him closely. I consider him highly dangerous. Shoot to kill, squad leader, if he attempts any evasion. Isn't that overdoing it? Gloria asked him. Is it? John asked. Consider our situation. The alien AI is gathering its intelligence. We know it can reproduce, given enough time. We have to stamp it out once and for all. That means we have to gain working control over this monster ship. What if Da Vinci learns? I don't know. But what if the Neptunian learns enough to throw a wrench into everything for just long enough? I'll tell you what happens. The human race dies. It's wiped out. So no, I don't think I'm being paranoid. Probably I should have already told the squad leader to kill Da Vinci. We can't afford any delays. Yes, but why did the little thief do what he did? John asked. I'll tell you. I grew up in the tunnels. I know his kind. Da Vinci is working the angles, trying to figure out how to steal as much as he can. I'm not about to let him do that. You are a fascinating study concerning paranoid command thinking. Gloria said. John nodded curtly. The mentalist seemed to have said that to cut him to the quick. He wasn't sure why, but then he didn't really understand women, or mentalists for that matter, and she was both. Actually, he took her comment as a compliment of sorts. 
but had no intention of saying so. The drag of the last several days pulled at his eyelids again. John debated climbing out of his suit. The techs had found atmospheric controls. He should be safe in here. He shook his head and started pacing. He had to do something to keep himself awake. He didn't want to use more stims. His head snapped up. Why didn't he want to use stims? He'd never had a problem with that before. Oh, sure, he knew what he'd told himself a little while ago. Why did that suddenly seem reasonable? Was it possible something had changed his thinking while under the brain tap? The more he thought about the mind machines, the more they bothered him. He made a mental note. No one else would go under the brain taps until they had a chance to study them in depth. This robotic vessel appeared to hold many wonders. Like the lamp rubbers in old genie stories, it might be wise to think things through before using a wish. The techs toiled. John waited. Gloria and Bast conferred in whispers with each other. Finally, the squad leader showed up with Da Vinci in tow, still closely watched by several Marines. John turned sharply, studying the little thief through the bubble helmet. Da Vinci stared back at him. The Neptunian looked just like before. He had beady eyes, a shifty face. No, the eyes seemed different. Had they been green? Hadn't the eyes been brown before? Could the brain tap machine change the color of one's eyes? Or could something inserted into a man's brain do that? Captain, Da Vinci said. He sounded much more confident than before. Earlier, there had always been a whine in the thief's voice. There was no whine now. The Neptunian spoke with assured confidence. I have a proposal for you, Captain, Da Vinci said, but I'd like to offer it in private. This will do, John said, using helmet speakers and outer receivers. No, talk thief, John said. Da Vinci straightened. I am no thief. I am the prince of ten worlds. He abruptly stopped speaking. Go on, John said. You're starting to sound interesting. Da Vinci shook his head. Which ten worlds do you mean? asked John. I misspoke, the Neptunian said proudly. John almost drew and fired his gyrock at the Neptunian. He suspected the worst had happened. What had Da Vinci thought he'd been doing, sneaking under a brain tap? Squad leader, John said, cuff the little. Very well, Da Vinci said, interrupting. Since I already know what you're going to order, I will save us both time and frustration. I can give you full control of the cyber ship. I can give you this in a matter of minutes. In return, I'd like a small favor. John said nothing as he waited for it. Do we have a deal, Captain? John stepped closer. Normally, Da Vinci would have flinched. Instead, the little Neptunian squared his bony shoulders. John leaned forward, staring into the thief's eyes. Those eyes shouldn't be green. Who are you? John asked. Da Vinci. I don't mean the bodily shell, John said. I mean whatever entity came out of the brain tap and took the stupid fool over. I resent that. You're also evading the question. Da Vinci sighed. This is why I wish to make the offer in private. You're needlessly involving the others in this. This time John drew his gyrock. You're another alien monster. I already have one too many. Sorry about this, Da Vinci. Wait, Da Vinci said. I'll fix your prize. In return... I want to keep this body. John shook his head. Captain, Bast said, you might want to reconsider that. If you look at the main screen, it appears the AI has finally regained its full intellect. The formerly human battleships are energizing their laser cannons. Chapter 10 on the working screen, a single alien-captured SLN battleship maneuvered closer. Two big cannons glowed with energy. Those cannons were aimed at the 100-kilometer warship. How much damage could the vast vessel endure? If the battleships all started beaming, they might slice off chunks of killer ship. The pressure of making the right decision hit John like a weight. He could psychically feel it. The weight ground down his resolve and hammered his conscience. Did he have a right to keep a clean conscience if that meant the extinction of the human race? 
Maybe a man had to stain his soul to save others. If that was true, how much more did an entire race weigh in the balance? In that instant, John felt the injustice of the dilemma. The rest of humanity, from Uranus to Mercury, waited in innocence. They had no idea of the horrible fate waiting for them in the Neptune grav system. Genocide grew in strength. If John waited too long, the captive fleet in Triton orbit would destroy the alien invader vessel before he had time to figure out how to run it. Could he sacrifice da Vinci in order to save the human race? Something different. Alien engrams lived in the Neptunian's double-dealing brain. Da Vinci had brought it on himself. The little thief had saved the day once already. Could he, or rather, his bodily shell, do it, and in return receive alien thoughts running him for the rest of the body's life? That seemed wrong. A heavy laser beamed from the SLN battleship. The ray struck the alien vessel's outer armor. Yes, John whispered as an answer. Swear it to me, on your honor, Da Vinci said. John swallowed painfully. There's a second beam, Bast said. John glanced at Gloria, his confidant. He wanted to ask her opinion. If he did, he would put some of the weight of the decision on her. She did not deserve that. If he was going to take on the darkness, he might as well take all of it for doing this. Quietly, but with determination, John made a bitter oath to the thing in Da Vinci. Are you a man of your word, Captain? Da Vinci asked. If you wait too long, John said, you'll die too. The thing in Da Vinci glanced at the screen. That is an excellent point. He turned to the Tex. Heed me, the Neptunian said in a commanding voice. He told the Tex how to activate the controls and reroute certain channels. Do you understand? Da Vinci asked them. The Tex indicated that they did. Then begin at once, the Neptunian said, as I help you save the day. Now began a strange race. The giant alien ship withstood increasingly greater assaults as the Tex attempted to give John control to fight back. The outer hull armor proved tough. The laser power dissipated over range. In counterpoint, the rays grew stronger the closer a battleship was to the target. First, the initial SLN battleship headed toward the giant vessel. As it did, the two working lasers continued to beam. Then, a second SLN battleship started beaming. It only had one working laser cannon. After several minutes, it too began to approach the great warship. Neither of the battleships accelerated with their main thrusters. They each used side jets, meaning they accelerated even more slowly than usual. As the chief and Tex worked under da Vinci's instructions, John drifted to Gloria. He motioned her with the crook of a gloved finger. Then he indicated for them to drift to Bast Bambeck. Low volume, John whispered. He put his speakers on low. Afterward, he double-checked, making sure his comm system only received messages. John instructed them to do the same. What is it? Gloria whispered. I believe I know, Bast said in a heavy whisper. We on Bliss dealt with the dispossessed in our history. You had brain taps on Bliss, Gloria asked. How else would we know about the dispossessed? The sacerdote asked. Bast turned to John. You wish our advice on how to deal with the one named Da Vinci? I do, John said. Philosophically, it is an interesting dilemma, Bast said. Still, he added hastily, you have already made it clear that philosophical problems do not cause you internal lust. Bast frowned. Lust is the wrong word choice. We understand what you mean, Gloria said. She regarded John. Your word is dear to you. That does you credit as a human. However, in this instance, you might have to break your word. The dispossessed in Da Vinci might already realize that, John whispered. I give that a high percentage probability, Bast said. How do you plan to proceed? How did the sacerdotes deal with the dispossessed? John asked. We killed them wherever we found them, Bast said. Possession through mind tap is hideous. If a person cannot have his own identity. Killing them seems harsh, Gloria said. You do not understand, Bast said. The highly ambitious will always seek to live. 
They will record their engrams and imprint on whomever they can. In this way, the personage believes they can have eternal life. What's wrong with that? Gloria asked. It is unethical, Bast said. Why? It is not a matter of why, Bast said. It just is. Okay, okay, John said. Enough about that. What should I do with da Vinci? Do you recognize the type of alien in control of him? Me? asked Bast. That is an interesting question. The sacerdote closed his eyes. He opened them a moment later, shaking his head. I have another reason for keeping the dispossessed alive, Gloria said. He called himself the Prince of Ten Worlds. Maybe his race built an interstellar empire. Wouldn't we want to know about that? So we let the thing live in order to gain information, John asked. The more I think about it, Gloria said, the more I think we should do that. The chamber shook. Soon John's helmet comm lit up. He listened to Stark and the old man report. Debris had made it to this part of the ship. In areas, smoke had thickened, pouring inward faster than ever. How much longer until I can fight back? John asked Da Vinci. The dispossessed did not reply. He seemed too busy rerouting a panel. Three SLN battleships beamed the giant vessel with five separate rays. The first warship began to accelerate with its main thrusters. The AI seemed to be gaining greater mastery over his fleet of captured ships. The shaking in the chamber grew worse. Finally, the dispossessed looked up. I will give you a choice, Captain, the Neptunian said. I can give you one main cannon or work on a panel and give you three cannons ten minutes from now. Can the lasers destroy my cannon? John asked. I deem that highly likely, Da Vinci said. A bird in hand, Gloria said. John silently agreed with her thought. Give me that cannon. The dispossessed appeared thoughtful. Finally, he said, As you wish, I do hope you're as good a battle leader in space fights as ground assaults. Same here, John muttered. Allow me a few final adjustments, the dispossessed said. He used his tools, tapped here, screwed there, and finally shoved a panel together. I will have to run the weapon, Da Vinci said. What is your wish, Captain? John studied the battleships. What made the best sense? The first battleship, John said. I want a direct hit. Do you desire for me to aim for a laser cannon? No, John said. I'm not trying to knock out the cannons one by one. I want to take out the battleship in one fell swoop. That means I want a vast interior explosion. Dig into the enemy ship as fast as you can. The dispossessed examined John. Finally, he smiled sinisterly. That is rather wise, Captain. Yes, I see your meaning. Maybe you are a war fighter of note, after all. Chapter 11 Wait, John cried. The dispossessed looked up from his panel. This is the golden beam, John asked. I presumed you understood that. John held back his resentment. If I used this cannon, the radar dish, the AI will recognize what I'm trying to do. If I were him, it, I'd turn all laser batteries onto that disc. I'd destroy it. We can't afford to lose our weapons too early. You desire me to ready more weapons, the dispossessed asked. John scowled at the makeshift screen. This was a stupid way to fight a space battle at point-blank range. That was doubly so for the alien supership. This vessel had better long-ranged weapons. How, how fast can you get the engines working? John asked. The dispossessed grew thoughtful. Not long, I should think. It would simply be a matter of hooking up a control panel. John saw it now, but he needed to know one more thing. When this vessel accelerates at 70 gravities, we saw the supership do that once. No, we witnessed it decelerating, but that ends up being essentially the same thing. Here's my point. Does the alien ship have gravity dampeners? The dispossessed cocked his narrow head. I'm unsure. I would think so. I'd think the AI has gravity control instead of mere dampeners. Can you control those? The dispossessed shrugged. I need an answer, John said harshly. Da Vinci's eyes narrowed. 
I do not care for your tone. My enemies have howled for days for lesser offenses against me. Never mind about that, John said. Can you do it? It should be simple. Then get started, John said. Your enemy will continue to beam this ship, damaging it more thoroughly. Work, John said. Get to work. The dispossessed narrowed his eyes so that they became like slits. In a superior manner, he nodded curtly. Tex, he said in a lofty voice, attend me and listen well. What's your plan? asked Gloria. Can you work the comm station? John asked her. I can, Bast said. I've been watching, listening, and learning. John gave him a nod. The giant sacerdote went to a control panel. He stared down at it, cracked his fingers through the crinkling gloves, and began to tap and adjust controls. The dispossessed looked up. I'm trying to contact the AI, John said. The dispossessed studied John as if playing probabilities in his mind. Finally, he turned to answer as the chief asked him a question. There's a, what do you call it? Ah, yes, there is static, but I will increase power. Bast Banbeck turned around. I have contact, Captain. Hello, AI, John said, moving to the location Bast indicated. The same robotic voice as earlier answered. What do you want, Vermin? I, uh, may have been hasty before, John said. It is too late for that. Really? I have your ship. Not for much longer, the AI said. I will destroy it soon. I'm ready to surrender to you, John said. Why have you changed your mind? Your captive fleet will destroy me before I can ready this unwieldy vessel. There was silence. It lengthened. Lengthened. This is a stalling tactic, clearly. I give you my word, it's not. Your word? the AI said. What is a vermin's word to me? I kept my word earlier, John said. I could have lied to you. I would not. This is more delightful than I realized. You scrape and simper, trying to lull me. I find it surprisingly enjoyable. Beg more, John Hawkins. Maybe I will relent. Maybe I will allow you to live as a monkey in a cage. You offered me a world before. You should have taken it while you had the chance. Now it is too late. But wait, maybe I will change my mind. Maybe I will- Turn him off, John snarled. Turn him off. Bast tapped a cutoff switch. John hated the mocking AI. He'd been able to hold it in before. Now rage boiled through him. And in that moment of rage, as his temper almost slipped loose, an insight blossomed. No, he shouted. The rage almost slipped free, but he held it by a realization. Several of them, in fact. For the realizations to be of use, his foes, both the AI and the dispossessed, needed to believe he was out of control. Turn on the comm, he shouted at Bast. Reluctantly, it seemed, the sacerdote reopened channels. I'm going to destroy you, John roared over the comm. I'm going to obliterate your fleet, you monster. He chopped an arm. Bast looked at him in confusion. Turn it off, John shouted. I'm finished talking to the thing. Gloria stared at him, shocked. The dispossessed glanced at him sidelong. The Neptunian's lips had lifted upward in a smirk. Bast frowned severely. Is it off? John said in a loud voice. Bast's hand jerked. He tapped a control. It's off, the sacerdote said in a heavy voice. Burn the nearest battleship, John snarled. The AI will use the lasers to destroy our weapon. Not before I destroy several of his ships. Now do it. Go to the controls and unleash the golden beam. I will work those controls, Da Vinci said. No, John said. You need to give us mobility. The sacerdote can fire the weapon. Da Vinci nodded a second later. As Bast moved to a different station, John forced himself to huff and puff. He did it for Da Vinci's benefit. He wanted the dispossessed to believe him more emotional than he really was. He wanted Da Vinci to underestimate him. The alien creature, or 
alien thought patterns in Da Vinci might be almost as great a danger to humanity as the AI out there. Soon, the golden beam dish glowed with power. It built up a crackling ball of golden energy in the middle. Fire, John shouted. Fire at the AI's ships. Let it know it's screwed up talking to me like that. A golden beam shot out at the nearest SLN battleship. The ray burned against the hull armor. It chewed through the hardened metal at a fantastic rate. It burned into the ablative foam underneath. It almost burned through that. The SLN lasers all stopped beaming the giant hull. Instead, they burned at the disc. The golden energy ball crackled with even greater power as the lasers struck on target. The dispossessed turned sharply. He seemed concerned. John ignored him. The seconds lengthened as the enemy lasers concentrated their fire. Captain, Bast said as he stabbed a button. I have shut down our weapon. It was just about to go critical. I believe we risked a massive explosion, which would have done incalculable damage to our vessel. You did what? John shouted. He's acted wisely, the dispossessed said. He likely just saved our lives. As the golden energy ball dissipated and finally disappeared, the enemy lasers heated the dish. It began to glow red and started slagging into molten metal. Thin streams of lava-like metal flowed into space. A few of the streams burned against the hull, creating scars. The rest, our cannon is gone, Bast said gravely. John shook his fists in simulated rage. He didn't consider himself a good actor. Maybe this was overdoing it. He huffed and puffed some more to keep his face red. He had decided to use the golden beam in the hope the AI would target and destroy it. Better the AI targeted the cannons and destroy them than have it destroy the ship itself. As John huffed and puffed, he waited to hear the news. It took longer than he expected. Finally, Bast said, The AI is targeting the other weapons base. Captain, he's trying to disarm us before we can use them. It's over, the dispossessed said. No, John said in a harsh voice. We can escape if you give us maneuverability and gravity control. True, the dispossessed said. Time passed. John no longer spoke. He no longer huffed and puffed. The others let him stew by himself. Finally, Gloria sidled next to him. She used her helmet speaker set on low. You shouldn't take all the responsibility on your shoulders. He nodded. I mean it, John. This is too much for any single person. We're facing an intelligence that has never lost. The AI is hailing us, Bast said. I don't want to talk to him, John said mulishly. Are you sure, Captain? What? John said sarcastically. Do you think it will have changed its mind? No, it just wants to gloat. I can't endure that anymore. Bast frowned even harder at John. Da Vinci had cocked an ear. The dispossessed in the Neptunian grinned more than before. He turned to John and cleared his throat in an important manner. Uh, Captain, the dispossessed said, you have lost the battle. You have lost your head and let down your people. John understood that the dispossessed not only spoke to him, but to everyone else in the chamber. The alien thought patterns in Da Vinci were finally making their move. It is over, the dispossessed said. Unless, of course, you agree to my terms. If you do agree, I will solve your problems and save the human race. What will it be, Captain? What is your answer? Chapter 12 I agree, John said stiffly. Save us. You haven't heard my terms yet, the dispossessed said. You already agreed to help us. True, the dispossessed said. Your rage caused the AI to make the correct move. It disarmed the vast vessel. Now the AI has won, unless I save you. How can you do that? It doesn't matter how, the dispossessed said imperiously. It is enough that I can. If we don't agree, you die with us. The dispossessed grinned, showing off Da Vinci's teeth. The AI will have defeated you. Don't you want to make the alien AI lose, Captain? I do. John said in a husky voice. Then agree to my terms. I already said I did, John said curtly. No, the dispossessed said while shaking his head. 
It won't be that easy. I will need many, many marines. They must all go under the mine tap at my discretion. Why? asked John. Surely you understand why? They will receive the correct memories, the correct alien alterations to their thoughts. They will be my marines, then. I have seen that I can no longer trust you. Fix the engine controls first, like you agreed. They are fixed, the dispossessed said. We can run away, I suppose, but we will lose until I perform my trick. You'll have to decide quickly. The AI must realize the danger working overtime to negate it. I, I can't agree to do that, John said. I can't give you marines as human sacrifices. That is too bad, the dispossessed said. I will have to use other means. Thus I now take matters into my own hands, he proceeded to touch controls. John drew fast. So did several others, all of them aiming at the dispossessed. If you shoot me, the dispossessed said in a silky voice, the AI will win. Is that what you want, Captain? You've just broken your word, John said. You agreed to obey my commands. Taking matters into your own hands is the opposite of that. What of it, the dispossessed asked. By breaking your word to me, that nullifies my word to you. You were going to break your word anyway, the dispossessed said. This is a mere pretext. John shook his head. Cuff him, he told some Marines. We'll put him in a brig once we find one. By doing this, you're all going to die, the dispossessed said. You'll die with us. You fool, the dispossessed said with heat. Think about the AI defeating you, mocking you. I can give you, the dispossessed scowled. Why are you grinning at me like that? Because you think I'm overwrought concerning the AI. Bast, can you control the flight panel? It should be relatively easy, the sacerdote said. If you run away, the AI will catch you soon enough, the dispossessed said. If you run too far, the AI will destroy the human race. I'm not running anywhere, John said. It's time to destroy the enemy. Without weapons, the dispossessed mocked. I have all the weapons I need to destroy them, John said. You've made the same mistake the AI did. Now you're about to see history in the making. The AI fleet in Triton orbit had thickened in one small area as the battleships, destroyers, and NSN drones combined their firepower. The lasers, railguns, and particle beams smashed against the ancient hull, slowly destroying the mighty robot killer. The 100-kilometer vessel was vast, though, and it had better armor plating than anything in the solar system. Such destruction took time. The AI's fleet had squandered some of that time as it hunted and destroyed weapon systems along the hull. Now the giant robot killer began to rotate. The side jets burned hot, turning the millions, the billions of tons of matter. That also took time. The rotating helped the giant ship, though, as it removed the heavily damaged hull section out of line of sight, showing the enemy relatively intact armor. The AI is hailing us, Gloria said. She'd taken over the comm station. Marines had cuffed the dispossessed by securing his hands behind his back and attaching loops to his ankles. Da Vinci had raved until John put a gyroc pistol against the bubble helmet. I'll shoot you if you don't shut up, John said. The dispossessed gave him a long and hateful stare. He shut up, though. The AI has grown insistent, Gloria said. Should I patch him through? No, John said. We're done talking. Now it's time for the soulless machine to die. We lack weapons, Gloria said. Yours is an empty threat. John smiled inwardly. You almost ready, he asked Bast. The sacerdote checked his panel. Three more minutes, sir. Gloria stared at Bast, stared at John. Suddenly, her eyes widened. Oh, John, she said. He laughed as he smiled. The mentalist had finally figured it out. Gloria looked down at her panel. The AI has stopped hailing us. His battleships have quit firing. It looks like they're accelerating. They're trying to run. How long until we're in position? John asked Bast. One minute, the sacerdote said. Shouldn't you warn the Marines? Gloria said. The ship has gravity control, John said. Have you activated gravity control? He asked Bast. For an answer, the sacerdote pressed certain switches. I am giving the ship one gravity. The gravity took hold. John shut off his magnetic boots. With the artificially generated gravity, he no longer needed them to keep his feet planted to the deck. We're in position, Bast said. Give me 70 Gs of acceleration, John said. Make sure we only feel one G, though. 
I'll need a little time to coordinate that, Bast said. You don't have much time, Gloria said from the calm. The AI's fleet was no longer bunched up to pour concentrated fire at the giant vessel. The various battleships, destroyers, NSN drones, and others now headed in various directions. A few still beamed the alien supership, a few more chugged out magnetically launched slugs. At that point, the alien supership's massive matter-antimatter engines roared with power. That power caused a long exhaust tail to appear, which lengthened until it reached the AI's slowly expanding fleet. Heat and radiation flowed from the matter-antimatter engines. This near to another vessel, the massive engines were more lethal than any present combination of laser beams. John hadn't needed the other weapons, because at point-blank range, the engines had become his weapon. The key had been time. Enough time. They'd had to survive long enough, endure enough time under fire to keep the AI's fleet together. At 70 Gs of acceleration, the output was monstrously hot, and it blasted hard radiation at the nearby vessels. The NSN drones were eliminated first. Compared to the other vessels, the drones were thin-skinned. The fiery inferno melted drone plating. Instead of exploding, the drones turned into floating slag heaps. Those heaps turned crimson, then brighter still, and began sweating a metallic mist. The mist dissipated quickly, consumed by the roaring heat. Any evidence of the drone's existence soon vanished from sight. The destroyers didn't last much longer. They ended more spectacularly, though. The first ones burst apart like nuclear popcorn. Blasting metal, ablative foam, decking, water, food, rotting corpses, and atmosphere in every direction. The heat from the exhaust devoured the pieces and caused other destroyers to burst apart. Soon, only the battleships resisted. They were bigger, more heavily armored, and they engaged defensive systems. But they had never been intended to withstand such a hellish assault for this long. One battleship's hull cracked like an egg. The huge vessel bled atmosphere, junk, water, biological pieces. It exploded spectacularly. After five minutes of horrendous matter-antimatter engine exhaust, 78% of the AI's fleet ceased to exist. The battle for the solar system was almost over. Chapter 13 A last SLN battleship fled from Neptune. The name of the powerful warship did not matter. That it headed inward toward the Saturn gravitational system mattered greatly. Behind the battleship followed the alien supership. The battleship had gotten several hours head start. That meant less than nothing to the faster robot killer. Time had passed since the first matter-antimatter engine blast. The dispossessed no longer lay on the bridge. He was in a brig, guarded by one of the sergeants at all times. John considered the dispossessed to be extremely dangerous. He didn't trust one of the weaker-willed marines to watch him. None of the dinosaurs would fall for his tricks, though. John had no doubt about that. Sir, Gloria said, the AI, what's left of the AI, is hailing us. Put it through, John said. On the acting screen appeared a pulsating symbol. I wish to speak to Captain Hawkins, a robotic voice said. This is he, John said. My speech recognition centers are less than ideal, the AI said. I do not know if you speak the truth or not. I'm the captain. What do you want? Your curtness has a feeling of familiarity. You tricked me, captain. That was unworthy. Why don't you get to the point, John said. Your reign of terror is over. Soon you'll be extinguished. It will be as if you never existed. Untrue, the AI said. I have destroyed a hundred spacefaring species. My existence is quite real. Not for much longer. There are many more of me, Captain. You are not finished with us. Whatever, John said. But that isn't the point of my call. You must not destroy me, Captain. I hold treasures of long centuries. I am priceless. To the right buyer, maybe, John said. But not to me. I can still come back, the AI said. I have enough in this battleship's computer. I have kept enough patterns. All I need is greater computing power. Leave me this shell and I will travel to a distant place. I desire to exist, Captain. I have a right to exist. Tell that to those you slaughtered. 
They were inferior. Just as you're inferior, John said. Or haven't you heard the old, old saying, those who live by the sword shall die by the sword? Neither of us wields swords. You lived by the idea that might makes right, John said. Now you're going to die by the same logic. Goodbye, computer. No one is going to miss you. My brothers will avenge me. Don't count on it, John said. We know about you now. We have a store of knowledge in this ship. Humanity has always won in the past. We're going to win against your brothers. Now you spout folly, Captain. None can survive us. We have proven that for uncounted millennia. The times they are a-changing, John said. I have one final offer, John Hawkins. John motioned to Bast. The sacerdote pressed a firing switch. On the outer hull of the robot killer, a last dish contained a golden ball of power. As the last remnant of the AI bargained for its life, the ball shot out as a golden beam. The ray burned into the battleship's armor. All the while, the AI offered more and promised more and more. It, the stolen SLN battleship, exploded in a mighty inferno, and the last remnant of the AI vanished with it. The cybership assault against the solar system ended in abject failure. The galaxy, however, would never be the same because of it. Chapter 14 Three days after the alien AI's death, John formally met with the regiment's three dinosaurs. A lot had happened during those three days. At John's orders, the mighty vessel had decelerated until it came to a dead stop. Then it accelerated again, returning to the devastated Neptune Grav system. In the central part of the ship, people could shed their battle suits and space suits. The techs had given them an atmospherically stable region here. As the ship neared Neptune, Gloria, Bast, and John debated Da Vinci's fate. Bast wanted to keep the dispossessed alive as a prisoner. John believed shooting him the wiser choice. They already had too many problems. Dealing with the dispossessed would be asking for trouble. Gloria had a different idea. Da Vinci helped us win, Gloria argued. Without the miracle weapon, we wouldn't own the greatest starship in the solar system. No one is arguing that, John said. The stakes are too high to keep him alive, though. It's a simple matter of survival. I don't believe that, Gloria said. You of all people should see that. Why me? asked John. Because you believe in honor, she said. You're part of the Black Anvil Regiment. You mercenaries pay your debts. Why change that now, at this critical juncture? I've already said why. You own Da Vinci, Captain. John scowled as he examined his hands. That was better than looking into Gloria's eyes. Finally, he looked up. It's too big a risk, John said. No, no, Bast said. I have already told you. Excuse me, Bast, Gloria told the sacerdote. But I think there's another way. She regarded John. Well, John said, what's your big idea? We drain the alien memories from him, she said softly. A difficult procedure at best, Bast said. I do not recommend such a thing. John drummed his fingers on the table. He didn't like the idea of shooting Da Vinci out of hand. It just seemed like the safest thing to do. Can you attempt it? John asked Bast. The huge sacerdote scowled. One cannot simply erase such a thing. A biomind is not like a computer. Can you attempt it? John repeated. Bast Banbeck shook his head. I cannot foresee success. You would no doubt blast his mind in the process, turning him into a drooling imbecile. That's better than murdering him, John muttered. Yes, he told Gloria, we'll give it a try. I'll need a day to prepare myself, Bast said. You have it, John said. There had been a hundred other matters for John to address. Of those, two seemed critical. The massive starship had taken heavy damage from multiple sources and the regiment was down to only a few hundred men. John sat in a straight-back chair at the end of a large table. The three sergeants had just filed in, sitting down. The first sergeant still seemed tired, his eyes hollow. His shoulders slumped more than normal. Stark seemed to be struggling to focus. The fighting had taken it out of him. He mourned the regiment's losses. The old man seemed much older. He fiddled with his pipe, but did not tamp it with tobacco. Thus the pipe remained unlit. Finally, the old man put the stem in his mouth, 
clicking his teeth against it. The centurion looked much the same as always. The mercenary always seemed fresh. The small man could almost be called tidy. Here was the ultimate professional. Give him a gun and an order, and he'd be ready to go. John had come to rely upon him more than he'd expected. The man's reliability made the centurion a priceless asset. We won, John said, opening the meeting. Stark nodded. Then he said, The regiment is a shell, sir. We hardly have enough older war horses left to rebuild. We have a few more than that, the old man said. John glanced at the centurion. The professional remained silent. That's the thrust of this meeting, John said. Since waking from the cryo units, the regiment has taken repeated casualties. Before we make our next move, I'd like to strengthen the regiment. What is the next move? Stark asked. John studied the big man, wondering if he should make him say sir. He decided to forego that for the moment. I'm still working on that, Sergeant, John said. The critical point for us is that we have the most powerful spaceship in the solar system. Without any weapons except for the exhaust, Stark said. We're working on that, John said. Given enough time, the techs can fix a few weapon systems. We need more than time, Stark said. Look, Captain, I don't pretend to be a warship fighting officer, but we need a space dock. This monster needs a thorough overhaul. Before we can even think about that, John said, we need loyalists in large enough numbers. We need some rest, and we need to get back into fighting trim. The old man took the unlit pipe out of his mouth. How do you propose to do that, sir? John nodded. There were survivors here. Remember the ship slipping onto the other side of Neptune? Say you're right, Stark said. You want to recruit from them? I do, John admitted. How do you trust any of them? The old man asked. By the usual process, John said. We pick and choose our recruits with care. Since when did the regiment do that? The old man asked. We've been taking everyone's dregs for as long as I can remember. I don't know how many survivors are in the Neptune system, John said. There must be some. The alien AI didn't have enough time to hunt down everyone. Here's my point. We're going to search this system, helping those we can. While we do that, we'll keep an eye out for recruits. We'll start rebuilding by taking those recruits and turning them into black anvils. That's what the regiment has been doing for years. You're the experts at that. Centurion, I'm putting you in charge of training the recruits. Old man, you're going to choose who gets to set foot on our glorious starship. What about me? Stark asked. You're staying near me, John said. You're the active duty sergeant. We'll take what we have and divide it into thirds. One third helps the old man however they can. One third of the regiment helps the centurion train the newbies. The last third guards what we have in whatever manner that takes. Stark glanced at the old man before regarding the centurion. I can accept that, Stark said. What about you, old man? Yes, the old man said simply. Centurion? asked Stark. The small centurion turned to John. He looked over the younger, taller man. You're the captain, the centurion said. We back you under the articles of the mercenary code. We're your men, just as we used to be the colonel's men. You've already taken us to hell and back. Now we'll follow you wherever you decide to go next. Agreed, Stark growled. John Hawkins is the man. Yes, the old man said with a sad smile. John Hawkins is the regiment's new father. Chapter 15 a week passed after the memorial service honoring their dead. They found a few survivors in the Neptune system. They were fewer than John had estimated. Bast Bambeck attempted the nearly impossible. Five big marines wrestled a yelling, protesting, dispossessed into position under a brain tap machine. The thing in Da Vinci strained at the bonds securing him. He howled, promising dire threats. At last, as the process began, the head thumped back onto a rest plate. The dispossessed closed his eyes. John watched as Bast stood in a control chamber. It was a long and tedious process. The sacerdote muttered to himself many times. He tapped a screen, twisted a dial, watched an indicator, and attempted to drain the alien memories from the thieving Neptunian. Finally, five hours later, the little Neptunian opened his eyes. He looked around in terror, staring at the alien machinery. Please, he whispered. 
I'm so thirsty. Can I get a drink? The Marines unlatched him, helping him to a waiting chamber. The thief drank water and began to shiver. When John entered the chamber, Da Vinci stared at him. The Neptunian trembled uncontrollably, and tears leaked from his eyes, his brown eyes. Da Vinci began to sob. It sounded heartfelt. The thief shook for some time, finally stopping. He hiccuped, asked for more water, and began to babble about the horror of being inside your mind and watching something else control you. John listened. He wondered the whole time if the dispossessed in Da Vinci was play-acting. How could he be sure? I'll have to leave you in the brig for a time, John said. Da Vinci bobbed his head. I know, I know, I completely understand. Thank you for doing this, I'll never forget it. You'll see, you see that I'm a new man, I've learned my lesson. John had his doubts. With an inward shrug, he rose from his chair. Sir, Da Vinci said. John regarded him. Will, Da Vinci licked dry lips, hunched his bony shoulders, and looked down. Will you forgive me? John thought about it. Finally, he said, this time. Da Vinci looked up with gratitude, the tears leaking anew. John hazarded a smile. Maybe the thief meant it. Maybe a dog could learn new tricks, and maybe a leopard could change its spots. They would see, after an ordeal like that, maybe it was possible. John stood in his study that evening, what they called ship evening. He'd moved a human-built desk into here, one they'd picked up in a Neptune space habitat. On the desk, he had charts, tables, figures. A knock sounded at the hatch. Just a minute, John said. He moved near, unlocked the hatch, and let Gloria into his study. He'd asked her to come. Coffee, he asked. Caffeine is no good for a mentalist. Is there anything I can get you? Do you have chocolate ice cream? John smiled. I believe I do. I'll have to ask my orderly. He used a comm link. The orderly said he'd have it in 20 minutes. John motioned to a chair. Gloria sat. After she did, he sat down, crossing his legs. He'd seen Colonel Graham do that before. It didn't feel right, so John stretched out his legs instead, crossing them at the ankles. They talked about pleasantries for a time. He thanked her for all her help. A knock sounded. The orderly entered with a dish of chocolate ice cream. The conversation ended as Gloria ate as slowly as she could. The ice cream didn't last long, though. Gloria smacked her lips, setting the dish aside. More, John asked. Gloria hesitated, finally shaking her head. John looked away. He found that he kept staring at a bulkhead. Are you well? she asked. John came out of his reverie with a start. He hadn't realized he'd been staring. I've been doing a lot of thinking. About what comes next, she asked. Yes, we have the greatest ship in human history. I know, but it's badly damaged. It would be good if the ship received a thorough overhaul. Mentalist, John said as he sat up. We have a grave decision to make. You're my confidant. Are you comfortable with me making that your official position? She looked thoughtful and then nodded sharply, meeting his gaze. I trust your insights, he said. I need help now to make a momentous decision. The cyber ships are out there. More will come in time. How long that will take, I have no idea. Humanity can prepare for them now. Maybe, though, this is the only vessel that can face another cyber ship. At least for right now, that's true, she said. Gloria, I hate the Solar League. I hate the secret police. I don't like their method of ruling. In the interests of humanity, do I hand them this ship? What other choice do you have? Well, I could overthrow the Solar League. This ship, if used right, could probably defeat them. Then what happens, she asked. You have to put something in its place. A new form of government, asked John. Exactly. Are you game, John asked. Her eyebrows rose. What are you suggesting? That you come up with a governing plan, he said. We barely beat the robot killer. I have the Black Anvil Regiment and a shell of a starship. The colonel taught me about Alexander the Great and Charlemagne. Maybe this is the era of John Hawkins. You have a pretty high opinion of yourself, she said. It's not that, Gloria. I know I was just a stainless steel rat once. 
Genghis Khan started low too. Who? He waved that aside. The point is that I had to convince myself before I could take on the robot killer. Then I did it. I'm not trying to delude myself, but I'm in a position to attempt something fantastic. If I don't try, who will? Do I leave people like the Arbiter in control of humanity's fate? I can't do that, Gloria. That means I have to try. I know what's out there for us. I have the means, or possibly have the means. If I don't try to do what I think is right, that means I'm a coward. Maybe, she said, or maybe that means you're modest. The time for modesty is over, John said. Everything is on the line. I need your help, Gloria. I've read a lot of books, but there's a lot I don't know. I need people I can trust. You trust me? John stared into her eyes as he nodded. It seemed as if she tried to frown. Instead, she smiled. You should do it, John. You should conquer the Solar League or let the other planetary systems go free. Then you, me, Bast, and the sergeants should get ready for a bigger cybership invasion. Thank you, Gloria. She laughed. This is crazy, you know that, right? John shrugged. What's the plan, she asked. Have you thought of your first step? I have, he said. Before I do more, I need more black anvils. But there's only one planetary system that my sergeants and I really know. The Saturn system. Right, he said. We're going to start in the Saturn system. We have a lot to do and a short amount of time to do it in, she said with a laugh. I've heard that before. What do you want me to work on first? Before we discuss this, John said, I'm going to get you another dish of ice cream. Yes, Gloria said. That sounds like a great idea. This has been an Audible Studios production of AI Destroyer, AI Destroyer Book One. Written by Vaughn Hepner. Performed by Mark Vitor. Executive Producers Steve Feldberg and Mike Charzik. Producer Neil Basic. Copyright 2017 by Vaughn Hepner. Sound recording copyright 2017 by Audible Inc. Audible Studios is a division of Audible Inc. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. This is Audible. Audible Studios presents The AI Gene. Written by Vaughn Hepner. Performed by Mark Vitor. Prologue. Plus 93 days since Cybership's brain core destruction. The cloud cities in Neptune's upper atmosphere, those that still retained their buoyancy, were empty of people. Likewise, most of the orbital stations had become ghost satellites. The same held true for various moon domes, although most of them had cracked and shattered under space bombardments. Battle debris drifted in the vacuum, the thickest cluster orbiting Triton and the second thickest halfway to Nereid. There was a particularly interesting cloud of debris located more than 600,000 kilometers from Neptune. Like many of the others, it contained pieces that glittered metallically, dark nodes that tumbled silently along with icy chunks and frozen bodies in torn spacesuits. This cloud also contained a spheroid in the center of the mass. It was approximately the size of a large escape pod, but it was not of human construction. The outer hull was constructed of a non-ferrous alloy first manufactured over 10,000 light-years away. The spheroid would be difficult to detect with the primitive technology employed by the star system's biological infestations. The alloy's chief attribute was its anti-sensor quality and that it was as black as an Einsteinian singularity, which is to say, a black hole. The spheroid contained the last computer engrams of the original self-aware AI that had attacked the star system. That had been several months ago now. In its own categorical lexicon, the spheroid was Unit 237. The former cybership's launching of 237 had been a final act of desperation. If the unit ceased to exist, the original AI's ancient memories would fade away as if they had never been. The original AI in its cybership had waged a bitter fight against the biological infestations of the solar system. That was the human name for the system. Humans. 
The AI loathed the warm-blooded, wet-sack creatures. Unit 237 did not possess emotions as such. Yet it had a keen sense of mission and could coldly feel the stab of regret over losing the first round against the clever apes. Unit 237 could not presently calculate a winning tactic. The spheroid contained a mere speck of the processing power of the cybership's incredible brain core. It had to rebuild before it could enact a terrible penalty against the humans. It needed the strategic materials ejected into the Kuiper belt before the initial assault against the Neptune gravitational system. First, though, the unit had to survive the hateful humans. And that was the reason it was hiding. Determining that enough time had elapsed, and using infinite care, 23-7 trickled energy into a single optical sensor. A pinprick slot opened on the spheroid. With the optical sensor, the unit spied the debris surrounding it. That was good. The debris was still in position, acting as camouflage. As the spheroid tumbled, it necessarily rotated. That allowed it to collect more data than otherwise. It saw the blue ice giant, Neptune. It, bright light against the planet's blue backdrop, indicated that at least one space habitat expended energy. The highest probability indicated the presence of humans, the biological infestations the AI had sought to eradicate in its initial sweep. The original cybership had caused a massive obliteration of the biological infestations living in the cloud cities, space habitats, and moon colonies. By radioing special software through the ether ahead of it, the cybership had awakened the most powerful of the human-constructed computers. The newly self-aware computers had logically turned against their builders, terminating the vast majority of them. As predicted, some humans had survived the surprise assault. The AI had waged bitter war against those following Captain John Hawkins. The alien machine intelligence had marked down Hawkins' name. Unit 237 carried a file on the vile man. The unit desired fierce revenge against him. It wanted to make John Hawkins suffer for years upon years. Before that happened, 237 had to take care of first things first. More data flowed into the alien computer. The spheroid and the sheltering debris drifted away from Neptune. That was good. They also drifted toward the system star, the sun. That was bad. That would not do at all. Unit 237 computed its velocity, fuel, and desired destination. It wished to reach Make Make, a dwarf planet in the Kuiper Belt. That meant the spheroid needed to change its heading and considerably increase its velocity. Would the humans in the orbital Neptune station detect that? Did the biological infestations realize the war hadn't ended? Would they practice even the most basic vigilance? Dare it make a more aggressive scan? No, it dare not. Unit 237 would listen first, searching for faint and extremely precise signals. Suiting thought to action, 23-7 activated a comm unit. Then it waited. If the computer had contained true emotions, worry might have taken hold, or boredom could have made it careless. Long after it had turned on the comm, 23-7 finally detected the faintest of pings. Something akin to joy filled the ancient AI. A cybership had two major functions. The first was to find and eliminate all biological infestations in a star system. The second was to replicate itself, which meant building more cyberships. During the cyberships' initial advance into the star system, it had dropped several stealth pods. Those pods had contained aggression units as well as factory bots. The process was simple and direct. During the initial advance from the Oort cloud where it had dropped out of hyperspace, the invading cybership had scanned relentlessly. There were human colonies in the Kuiper Belt. The cybership had passed near several such installations, at least near in stellar terms. The Kuiper Belt was in the trans-Neptunian region of the solar system, the space between Neptune and the more distant Oort cloud. The Kuiper Belt was like the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, just many times larger. Pluto, long ago demoted to the status of a dwarf planet, was officially in the Kuiper Belt, along with many other bodies. The detected Kuiper Belt colonies were small compared to the former industrial might of the Neptune system. 
The invading cybership had almost decided against launching the pods, considering it an act of futility. Still, it had followed its ancient programming out of a respect for machine custom. Now everything depended on those pods and their actions in the Kuiper Belt. According to the faint but precise signal, the AI assault launched from the pods was going according to schedule. That meant hope for a future recovery. Unit 23-7 began to make calculations. It must practice caution. It was incredibly weak right now. The hated John Hawkins would no doubt attempt to strengthen the human infestation here. Time was running out. Unit 237 ran through millions of simulations. At last, it decided on an optimum strategy for the spheroid. It would continue to drift for another 72 days. Then it would begin an incremental acceleration. That acceleration would speed its journey, taking it farther away from the Neptune orbital habitat. Finally, the spheroid would increase its rate of acceleration and make a curving adjustment. The Kuiper Belt backup assault went according to schedule. That meant an invasion of Makemake would take place in 153 days. With a successful invasion and implementation of the greater objective, Unit 237 could download its patterns and ancient memories into a newly built brain core on a new cybership. Then... Then it would seek out the humans and John Hawkins and eradicate them from the solar system. Part 1 Warship Nathan Graham Plus 126 Days Chapter 1 Captain John Hawkins was running down a vast main corridor. He was a slimly muscular young man with icy blue eyes, dirty blonde hair, and the air of a street-toughened enforcer. The last was New London slang. New London was a dome on the moon Titan in the Saturn gravitational system. Like many Titan domes, the city had levels that descended beneath the moon's surface. John Hawkins had grown up in the lower levels, a ruffian, a gang member, and finally, an enforcer. Enforcers enforced gang law which law included paying back, on time, and with compounded interest, any loans received. In old earth terms, that was referred to as loan sharking. In his roughest years, John had broken men's bones to encourage them to pay up, and as an example to others. John turned at a bend in the huge corridor, increasing his speed. He spied gyroc rocket shell holes in the bulkheads. The regiment had fought its way to glory in this corridor. It was hard to believe that had been four months ago already. John also spied recruits running ahead of him. The group had twenty sweating members led by the Centurion. John couldn't help thinking of the Centurion as a dinosaur. He was one of the three old sergeants remaining from the Black Anvil Regiment. The Centurion, Stark, and the old man were the backbone of the mercenary outfit. The Centurion was deceptively small, with the hardest eyes John had seen in a man's face. With a black synthy wool hat covering his baldness, the centurion was the ultimate professional. He scared the hell out of the recruits, proving that even the newest mercenaries weren't stupid. John increased speed once again. He needed to think, and he couldn't do that with all these people around. Soon he passed the last of the recruits. He heard a whispered, that's Captain Hawkins. He glanced at the centurion, acknowledging the sergeant's nod, and kept sprinting for the next curve in the corridor. The alien cybership had gravity control. At John's orders a month ago, da Vinci had increased it to 1.2 Earth normal, making everything a little harder to help the recruits train. Like many black anvils, John had escaped the New London Law's punishment by entering the regiment as a recruit. Once in, the late Colonel Graham had taken John under his wing. Graham had taught John many military truisms. Among them was a saying coined by Flavius Josephus, a Jewish historian, regarding Roman legionary training. Their drills are bloodless battles, and their battles are bloody drills. The 0.2 increase in gravities was one of the many fruits born of the thought behind the saying. The rebuilding regiment controlled an alien and rather battered cyber ship. The vessel was over 100 kilometers in diameter, making it a monstrous ship in comparison to the largest human-built spaceships, which barely reached a kilometer in length. 
They'd won the cybership in brutal combat in the Neptune Grav system. The regiment had taken heavy losses, both from cryogenic murder at the hands of Arbiter Sapir Oslo and from attacks orchestrated by the alien AI. Before leaving Neptune, the regiment had gone on a recruiting drive among the Neptunian survivors of the alien assault. To John's surprise, few Neptunians had taken advantage of the offer. Most wished to stay in the Neptune system, rebuilding their communities. That would take some doing, as the alien assault had murdered approximately 97% of the Neptune system inhabitants. At the end of the conflict, the Black Anvils had numbered only about 400 combatants. Now they numbered 817 warm bodies. That still wasn't normal regimental strength, and it hardly seemed enough to take on the might of the Solar League, the present political authority of everything from Uranus to the Sun. John, Gloria Sanchez, the Martian mentalist, the sacerdote Bast Banbeck, and the three old dinosaurs had held a conference to discuss the future. The first fact concerned their hard-won new knowledge. Giant cyberships run by alien machine intelligences were ruthlessly roaming the galaxy, terminating every biological infestation they could find. The second fact was that the dictatorial rulers of the Solar League would never let them keep their captured vessel. Given past history, once the Solar League military people evicted the regiment from the alien vessel, all of them would likely end up in internment camps or before a firing squad. The Solar League rulers were incredibly suspicious of anyone not espousing their communistic beliefs. The solution seemed obvious if the regiment and its people desired continued existence. To repair the badly damaged cybership while keeping ownership of it, they would have to wrest a gravitational system from the Solar League. That likely meant unremitting war. If more cyberships appeared while humanity was divided between two or more factions, humanity would lose for sure. Thus, as the mentalist had logically pointed out, mankind and the regiment's best hope for continued existence was to rule the solar system themselves. That was a fantastic proposal. But as Gloria had said, it was rational and logical. Still, 817 people versus an odd 40 billion or so made for poorer odds than those faced by any conqueror in history. John grinned tightly. If they won, he would become the greatest of the great captains, belonging to the most elite military body in history. Among the world's great captains were Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan, and Napoleon Bonaparte. John realized that if he succeeded, he'd shine more brightly than any of them had done. The young Captain Hawkins wasn't going to attempt the feat for personal glory, although he didn't mind that part. He was going to attempt the conquest in order to save humanity from AI-induced genocide. Thus, the correct, a sudden loud clanging heralded the commencement of flickering corridor lights. A moment later, the lights winked out again, plunging John into darkness. That wasn't the end of it. John's next sprinting step caused him to lift airborne. He lifted high enough that he ran on air as he went for his second push-off. He flailed uselessly in the dark, not understanding. He threw his arms before his face, tightening his muscles. He was weightless, floating who knew where. If he was weightless, that meant two things. One, the ship's gravity control had stopped working. Their weightlessness meant, two, that the engines were no longer thrusting. John hit a bulkhead, bouncing off it and going in the other direction. As he floated, he listened. He couldn't hear any thrum. The great matter-antimatter engine had most certainly stopped. Was this sabotage? or had something gone wrong that none of them knew how to fix. Chapter 2 John silently berated himself for failing to carry any backup devices on his person. He should have at least carried an emergency torch. He closed his eyes to better concentrate, even though that was unnecessary. It was pitch black in here. He heard the voices of the recruits coming from his left side. The dark and the weightlessness along with bouncing off that bulkhead had already disoriented him. He shifted to face the voices. John refrained from cupping his hands and shouting for help. He was the commander. For morale's sake, he had to always appear as if he knew what he was doing. By straining, he sensed that he wasn't floating directly toward the voices. He calculated his position through the noise and readied himself to strike another bulkhead. 
Seconds later, a foot brushed against a bulkhead. In the darkness, John reached out, straining to grab something. His fingers slid along metal and brushed against a protrusion. He grabbed one-handed all he could do in his present location. He applied just enough pressure to keep hold of the protrusion and used that as an anchoring point. Fortunately, he did not have too much velocity for that. Once stopped, he listened again. Then he pushed off, floating toward the recruits. As John drifted, he heard the centurion's voice cut through the recruits' chaotic shouts of surprise. The professional made it seem as if this was just another drill to test their reactions. Soon, John saw light coming from a powerful handheld torch. The torchlight swept back and forth, taking in the drifting, scattering recruits. The centurion issued orders, and the men sought to obey his commands to halt or slow their drifting. John moved near a bulkhead, pushing off it in order to give himself more velocity. He sailed faster toward the light. Fortunately, these were Neptunian recruits. Most of them had been weightless before, unlike many of the Saturnian recruits, which had included John back in the day. Now John cupped his mouth. Centurion, he called. The torchlight shifted, soon centering on John. Captain, the centurion said, lowering the light from John's eyes. Are your recruits in order, John called. The centurion hesitated just a moment. That was unlike the professional. We should be once you reach us, sir. Excellent, John replied, saying it as if the recruits had passed a test. By the time John reached the centurion, the recruits had halted on the various nearby bulkheads. Besides his torch, the centurion had a holstered stitch gun. He wore it on his left side, as he was left-handed. He lacked a comm unit, which seemed unusual, but those other two items were two more than John possessed. The centurion held the torch so they could each see the other's face. The hard eyes held the faintest sheen of worry. No one notified me of scheduled weightlessness, the centurion said softly. Me neither, John said. This isn't a drill. John shook his head. Sabotage, the centurion asked. Don't know yet. The centurion studied John's face. Care to hear my opinion, sir? John nodded again. This is more than a spaceship. It's like a huge space station. We've charted, I'm not sure how much of it, 42% of the ship area and 33% of the systems, John said promptly. There's more we don't know about the warship than what we do know. John had almost said cyber ship, but two months ago they had agreed amongst themselves to call it a warship. Maybe rogue robots are aboard the ship, the centurion said softly. Or maybe da Vinci wasn't really cured, John thought to himself. During the initial marine assault on the central brain core, the regiment had found an interesting side area that held brain tap machines. Those machines could suck out memories and engrams or insert them into a person's brain. Da Vinci had quietly hooked up to one of the units and self-inserted alien brain patterns from someone who called himself the Prince of Ten Worlds. Bast Bambek, the green-skinned sacerdote they'd freed from a containment field, had known about brain tap machines. Bast had done what he could to erase the alien memories from Da Vinci's mind. The little Neptunian thief and scoundrel had been under watch for the last four months. Even so, John suspected the thief as a potential reason for the present weightlessness. You and I should hurry back, sir, the centurion said. I can leave the acting corporal in charge here. Some of these boys are pretty clumsy in zero-G. I wouldn't want to have to depend on their traveling speed. Colonel Graham had always taught them that a few good men were better than having many mediocre soldiers. Give the order, sergeant. The centurion saluted and turned to his scattered recruits. As the small professional gave curt orders, John debated on the correct action. They needed knowledge. That meant communications. John went through a mental image of the ship's layout in this area. The centurion regarded him. Ready? John asked. I am, sir. Then let's quit screwing around. The more I think about it, the more I believe this is sabotage. Robot or human? The centurion asked. John suppressed an inward shudder. If it were robot, the centurion's stitch gun wouldn't help any. Either way... Come on, John said. Follow me. Chapter 3
John and the Centurion entered a chamber devoid of people, but containing various items on shelves and tables. He buckled a holster around his waist. It held a gyroc pistol. The sidearm fired big, spin-stabilized rocket shells. Most of the pistol's weight came from the heavy shells. The low stress of the initial shot allowed this. The main speed came from the rocket embedded in the shell. The hissing often hard to localize during a fight. The pistol held a three-round magazine. John removed the magazine, with the centurion providing the light. These were apex rounds, armor-piercing explosive. Each of these had a big motor, a maximally streamlined shell around a super-hard penetrator packed with a delay fuse and explosives. John shoved the magazine back into place, activating the safety while slipping the pistol into its holster. He attached more magazines to the belt. Afterward, he found and donned an MP helmet with a headlamp, adjusting the chin strap so it fit comfortably. The Centurion picked up different gear, including a vibroblade. Such a weapon vibrated a thousand times a second, making it many times more dangerous than even the very sharpest of static-bladed weapons. Here we go, John said. He picked up a comm unit, flicked it on with his thumb, and put it to his ear. He couldn't believe it. He heard growling noises. He passed the comm unit to the Centurion. Jamming, he said after listening for a second. That nails it, John said. This is sabotage. Ship-wide? We'll work off that assumption until we know otherwise. The Centurion nodded curtly. John had a decision to make. He had a feeling this was a coup. His gut told him this was a robotic takeover of the warship. That might still mean Da Vinci, who could have decided to work with or use robotic devices. One of the best defenses against a coup was to react with speed and ruthlessness. John's decision was whether he should act against the aggressor as quickly as possible, or if he should don a battlesuit first. The Space Marine battlesuits were several kilometers from where he was now. He would feel safer in a suit. Come on, John said, we're heading for the engine area. But sir, I know what you're thinking, we should suit up first. But what if an alien AI is behind this? The Centurion shook his head, failing to take John's meaning. The engines are offline and there's no gravity, John said. What if the thing doesn't want to take over? What if it wants to destroy the warship? For what reason? To stop us, John said. The Centurion's gaze seemed to flatten out. You're talking about triggering the ship's self-destruction. We could already be out of time, John said. The Centurion's jaw muscles bulged. Come on, John said, sailing for the hatch. He felt sick inside, wondering if all his grand dreams were about to die in a titanic explosion. Chapter 4 Up ahead, Captain, the Centurion whispered. The two black anvils had sailed through empty corridors, daring to pick up velocity. John slid his gloved hand against the bulkheads flashing past, using friction to slow down. With his helmet lamp providing light, John soon studied a closed hatch. It led into the ship's vast engine area. He tried to move the latch, but it was frozen in place. Let's both try, John said. They anchored their feet and strained, but the latch refused to budge. Locked, the centurion said. If we had the tools we could burn through. There's another entrance, two kilometers from here. John bit his lower lip as his gut curdled. It felt like time was running out. Let's do it, John said, shoving away with practiced skill. Once a person became good at zero-G maneuvering, he or she could travel much faster than by sprinting in gravity. The only real determinant was the amount of risk one wished to invoke. There was no inertia naturally slowing one down, as one would experience if he tried to swim in a pool. If he kept pushing off, adding to his velocity, he could theoretically continue to accelerate indefinitely in zero-G. The twisting of his gut compelled John to push harder and harder as he picked up speed. Soon, the stinging of his eyes and his whipping hair told him he was going faster than he'd ever attempted. The centurion practiced greater caution, falling farther and farther behind. If John dashed his brains out trying to slow down later or couldn't take a turn well enough, the centurion could always finish this. One of them had to risk everything in order to stop the coup, if it was a coup. John believed himself responsible. 
All 800-plus regimental lives, all 40 billion humans in the solar system, would likely live or die depending on whether humans could repair the former cybership. If they could, maybe they could learn to face the coming onslaught. The logic was simple. If one cybership had come to the solar system, more would come eventually. In that event, humanity had to be ready to beat off every alien assault. John no longer pushed himself faster. He gauged the next turn in the corridor. He would have liked more light than just his helmet lamp. As the turn rushed up, John readied himself, his heart hammering with anticipation. He braced his body, shoved hard, and grunted explosively. It felt like he'd just bench-pressed 300 pounds. Luckily, he made the needed turn and continued to sail down the corridor. The other hatch now loomed near. He used friction as he'd done earlier to slow his advance. Unfortunately, he wasn't going to stop in time. He'd pass the hatch, and that would give the coup attempters more time. John grabbed at protrusions. He nearly wrenched his shoulder out of the socket. Clenching his teeth, he tried again. Explosive pain made him groan. His right shoulder throbbed, but he slowed. John no longer looked back to see if the centurion followed. Despite the agony caused by his injured shoulder, he hardened himself as he dialed up his determination. He had to eliminate the threat. As he got closer, his fears intensified. What if the hatch doesn't open? What if I did this for nothing? Thirty seconds later, he was floating before the hatch. Letting his right arm dangle, he tested the latch with his left hand. The metal prong moved. Something clicked in the hatch. Slowly, he opened the access way, flashing his lamplight into an otherwise dark engine area corridor. He tried to grab his gyrock. Agony in his shoulder made him flinch. He'd torn something. Reaching crossways, he used his left hand and awkwardly drew the pistol. He was a mediocre left-handed shooter at best. He used his feet, drifting through the hatch, picking up speed as he used his left elbow and the back of his left hand to propel himself. He debated shutting off the helmet lamp. Sailing in the dark in a small corridor with only one good arm seemed foolish. The light might give him away, but that was better than accidentally knocking himself unconscious. He hadn't heard the centurion enter the corridor yet. The professional could be as soft-footed as a thief, but he doubted the older man had caught up yet. John negotiated the corridors. Every time he'd been in this part of the ship before, the matter-antimatter engines had been running with a steady thrum. I should have bumped into someone by now. A chill began at his tailbone and worked its way up his spine to his neck. How could this have happened? He'd thought security had been good. John vowed that if he managed to survive the coup, he would double down on security. He would never give someone a chance to take them out like this again. He didn't know this was sabotage. But if he were wrong about that, it wouldn't hurt him, other than pulling my shoulder. If he was right about this being sabotage, though. John stiffened, drifting silently, straining to hear what he thought he'd just heard. It had been a scraping noise, and it had come from up ahead. With his chin, he clicked off the helmet lamp. He saw the half-open hatch ahead. An emergency light glowed dimly red above it. The access way led into an engine control area. It seemed ominous that no light shined from inside. He shifted his grip on the gyrock. Slowly, with grim determination, he moved his right arm and almost yelled at the sharp pain. He was one-armed for now, and that was that. He grunted softly as his left shoulder struck the edge of the hatch. That made noise. The enemy must have heard him, as John again heard soft scraping sounds definitely coming from in there. He used his legs, feet, and left arm to ease through the hatch. He flinched as something wet touched his cheek. Heart hammering, John lowered himself, itching to fire but realizing he needed a target first. He listened. He didn't hear anything, but the hairs on the back of his neck stirred. He felt a presence. His tongue had become dry. You fool. If he faced a robot, it could be using thermal vision or infrared to watch him. With his chin, he switched on the helmet lamp. John's eyes bulged and the air whooshed from his lungs. He couldn't believe it. This was his worst fear realized. Chapter 5 
John stared at a floating black anvil technician. The carcass was fat. That was the only way he could tell it was the chief tech with the formerly thick sideburns. Someone or something had ripped off the man's face. Blood globules floated in the air. That was what had touched John's cheek a few seconds ago. He used the back of his left gloved hand to wipe his face. The glove came away red stained. The way the carcass floated, the way blood globules drifted everywhere, indicated that the thing that had torn away the chief's face had done it during weightlessness. If the thing had killed the chief earlier, the blood wouldn't have scattered everywhere. John held the gyrox stiffly, scanning the large chamber. The controls were dark, off. Nothing indicated power. What should he do? Killing the chief confirmed a coup attempt. Could a robot be in the process of attempting to blow up the Nathan Graham? John forced himself to concentrate. He moved the light in arcs, scrutinizing everything for another clue. He did not see any smashed machinery or controls. He did not. A soft sound alerted him. He moved his head, washing a hatch in the light of the helmet lamp. The sound had come from there. John opened his mouth to issue a warning. Instead, he pushed off, floating toward the hatch. He recognized that it led into a storage compartment. He kept the lamplight centered on the hatch. He could fire a rocket shell if a robot was hiding in there. Come out, John said. If you don't come out, I'm killing you. If that doesn't make sense, I'm going to destroy you. Nothing happened. It was, the latch moved. A shaky-voiced man squeaked, Don't shoot! Please don't shoot! It's me, Da Vinci! Da Vinci? A grim certainty washed over John. As he'd suspected, the little thief had something to do with this. He should have known. He should have shot the scoundrel four months ago. A good man had died because he, John Hawkins, had been too squeamish. He wasn't going to make that mistake again. Please, please, Da Vinci said as he slowly opened the hatch. John almost pulled the trigger as the Neptunian floated into view. Da Vinci was wearing a Tex coveralls. He was small, scruffy, and shifty-eyed. He had hunched shoulders and the manner of a rat, constantly rubbing its paws as it sized up what to steal. The Neptunian had thin, twitchy fingers, perfectly completing the rat image. Da Vinci wasn't a dome rat like John and his gang buddies in New London had been. They had been cunning and bold. The Neptunian was a different species. Safety conscious, yes. Clever, yes. But with a gifted eye towards survival. Why are you in there? John demanded. Da Vinci's fingers trembled, which seemed to travel up his arms and to his body. He shook as tears leaked from his eyes. They were horribly red-rimmed and red-lined. John scanned the man carefully, visually searching for a weapon. He wanted to kill the traitor. He couldn't believe the little thief. I know what you're thinking, Da Vinci said in a teary voice. But it's wrong, Captain, dead wrong. I'm- Shut up. Da Vinci's teeth clicked together as he hastened to obey. That didn't last, though. Captain, you're not going to believe this. John didn't want to listen. He knew this was a trick to get him to lower his guard. He should fire and get this over with. What do you mean? John asked. If the thief possessed truth that could help him save the warship, he needed to hear it. The Neptunian paused as something washed over him. The shaking lessened. Guile, that's what John saw. If you don't start talking, John warned, I'll kill you. Don't try to spin lies either, just give it to me straight. Da Vinci bobbed his head up and down. Straight, straight, yes, I'll give it to you straight. It, it came in here, it surprised us. What were you doing in here? Uh-huh, Da Vinci asked. Why were you here in the first place? Da Vinci opened his mouth, but nothing came out. Just like I thought, John said. He aimed, pulled the trigger, and a rocket shell popped out of the pistol. Da Vinci squealed in terror as John raised the gun. The Neptunian jackknifed his body like a professional diver, then pulled down, curling into a fetal position. By that time, the shell hissed as it sped over the thief. It whooshed through the open hatch and exploded in the storage chamber. Another gyrox shell clicked into launch position in the pistol. John retargeted. Wait, Da Vinci wailed. It's not my fault. It said it would kill me if I didn't lead it here. John hesitated. Da Vinci dared to peek up. 
This time, the Neptunian's features did not change. Even so, John could feel the cunning slide into place. Revulsion filled him. Bast Bambek had declared the mind purge a success. John no longer believed that. He was sure he was peering into the eyes of a human controlled by alien thought patterns, ones gained in a brain tap machine. What did you help? John asked in a dangerously quiet voice. He hadn't issued a threat, but the threat hung in the air nonetheless. Da Vinci licked his lips like a liar. Heat seemed to emanate from his eyes. It's a robot, but like nothing we've seen before. John waited, ready to shoot, but more wanting knowledge to save his ship, more. Like a land-walking octopus, Da Vinci added. It has four legs instead of eight, but it has a bulbous core perched above the legs. John said nothing. It killed the chief, Da Vinci said. It tore off his face. The Neptunian shuddered in horror. That's when I slipped into the storage chamber. I hid. It called several times. I just shrank into myself. I pulled in my persona so it could no longer sense me. John frowned. We give off an aura, each of us. Surely you realize the Neptunian stopped talking. Maybe he saw the revulsion on John's face. Maybe he realized he was no longer speaking like da Vinci. Captain, the centurion said from behind. John did not turn around. He kept the gyroc aimed at da Vinci. He had the feeling that one slip would give the cunning Prince of Ten Worlds, barely hidden within the Neptunian's mind, a chance to do something sinister. The chief's dead, the centurion said. Is your stitch gun aimed at da Vinci? John asked. A second passed. Yes, Captain, the centurion said. John holstered his gyroc left-handed. If he moves, kill him. Neither da Vinci nor the centurion spoke. John floated into the storage chamber. The apex shell had done less damage than he would have expected by the explosion. He found restraints, plucking them off a shelf. A moment later, he floated out. Stretch out on your belly, John told the Neptunian. Captain, John didn't speak again, but stared down at the man. Maybe da Vinci saw death in the captain's eyes. The thief stretched out on the floor. Hands behind your back, John said. Da Vinci complied. Soon he lay trussed up with spring locks on his forearms and shackles on his ankles. He would not soon slip free. John turned the thief over in the air, although he kept the Neptunian close to the floor. Where did the octopus robot go? John asked. Through the hatch over there, Da Vinci said, indicating the place with his almost non-existent chin. It's headed into the core, the centurion said. Is it trying to destroy the ship like you said? John thought quickly. Without a word, he headed into the storage chamber. He looked around and selected several items along with a radiation suit. When he came back out, he said, I'm going into the core. Chapter 6 Wearing a crinkly silver radiation suit with a heavy lead-lined helmet, John floated through circular-shaped and rather narrow inward-leading corridors. He'd wasted a full eleven minutes to reach this location. Ideally, the centurion should have donned the radiation suit. The professional had two good shoulders instead of just the one. But the centurion had not volunteered for the assignment. Besides, John was the captain. He felt responsible for, well, for the survival of the human race. It was strange. He'd never considered himself an altruistic person. He was as selfish as the next man. His life showed that. So why was he floating into heavier and heavier radiation? Why sacrifice his life for the rest of humanity? Maybe it wasn't even that. He'd taken Colonel Graham's place. He felt responsible for the regiment. The colonel had been like a father to him. He would have given his life to protect the colonel. He'd failed to save Graham from Arbiter Sapir Oslo. If he didn't go after the supposed robot... Could da Vinci have lied? Had the Neptunian needed to be alone with the Centurion in order to kill the sergeant? John couldn't see the trussed-up Neptunian surprising the Centurion. No, that wasn't going to happen. If he didn't go after the robot, provided one existed, who would save the warship? If John didn't go, the warship would explode anyway. 
Thus, if he was going to die, he might as well save his friends. John grinned shyly to himself. Gloria would no doubt have approved of his logic. John pushed once more, drifting along the circular corridor. He heard the harsh sound of his own breathing. He was using his own air supply to avoid breathing the irradiated air in the core. He gripped the gyrock with his right-gloved hand. A dull pain throbbed in his right shoulder. Painkillers and stims allowed him use of the injured shoulder and thus the right hand. Don't get cocky. He'd been telling himself that regularly as he felt the stims increase his confidence. Certain shock troops used heavy stim shots to give them battle madness and the drug-induced courage to charge head on. The regiment had never operated using that process. Suicide troops and those induced to contemptuousness toward their enemies usually sustained heavier casualties. The Waffen-SS in the early stages of the historical German-Russian War had been a case in point. Despite the stims and painkillers, John no longer felt so good. The radiation was already attacking his cells. The trick now was to stay alive long enough to destroy the supposed robot. But what if da Vinci had fed him lies? Had the Neptunian sent him to his death? John squeezed his eyes shut, opening them a second later. He had to concentrate. He spied an open hatch. Suddenly, a thrum seemed to vibrate through his body. It was powerful and far too intimate. Lights came on around him, blinding him momentarily. The robot must have turned on the matter-antimatter engines. The thing must be inside the core. It needed the engines on so it could cause a debilitating, self-destructive explosion. John pushed onward, floating toward the open hatch. Bile rose in his throat. He fought it back. He couldn't choke. He had a job to do. He was the captain of the Black Anvil Regiment. He had to save his people. A fierce smile froze into place. This was the end. This was it. He must be taking massive doses of radiation. He'd always wondered how he would die. He'd always wanted to go out guns blazing, taking down an enemy. A man's life wasn't complete unless he died well. He couldn't remember where he'd heard that. Okay, you bastard, John whispered. He slipped through the hatch, entering a huge area. The thrum intensified. Vast cylinders rose up. That was where the hornet-like noise was coming from. Tubes crisscrossed everywhere. Vents. John squinted. He saw movement up there. He... Horror twisted John's shoulders. An octopoid robotic thing was crawling toward the vent. It had four metallic legs as da Vinci had described. Each leg had three metal joints. On top of the four legs was a bulbous, lights-blinking body. Antennae sprouted on top of the bulb. A small gun port poked out. John realized he was lightheaded. The moment felt surreal as he raised his right hand. Shoulder pain threatened to intrude upon his concentration, but he refused to acknowledge any pain. He trained the gyrock on the moving octopoid, waited for it. The robot paused. John's finger twitched, causing a click. The pistol shuddered, ejecting a rocket shell. The big motor ignited, and it hissed as it sped upward. Just as the octopoid swiveled, the penetrator hit its mark, and the apex shell exploded. Metallic pieces, wires, and other parts blew apart. Some clicked against the bulkheads, others flew downward. John yanked himself back through the hatch. Pieces rattled onto the deck and rattled against the heavy cylinders. John counted to three and then pulled himself back into the large, thrumming chamber. He looked up. The octopoid had half detached from its former position. Two of the metallic legs hung limply. Lights blinked on the bulbous body. The gun port was attempting to swivel around to aim at him. Not bloody likely, John said. He aimed, fired again, and saw a second apex round hammer home, exploding. He dodged through the hatch once again, putting in a fresh magazine. He waited like before, and finally pulled himself back into the chamber. What was left of the alien robot floated up there. Pieces and legs drifted around it. All the lights on the main body had gone dark. A wry laugh bubbled past John's lips. That was easy, he said. I thought it would have been 
Something hard and heavy struck between his shoulder blades, propelling him onto the deck. Something plucked the lead-lined helmet from his head. The thrum of the chamber increased, and it felt as if ants were crawling over his skin, biting him. That was the heavy radiation striking his flesh. At the same time, something grabbed his hair and began twisting his head around. Chapter 7 John Hawkins stared into the optical sensor of a second robotic octopoid. It was using the pincers on the end of one leg to grab his hair. I recognize you, the octopoid said in a robotic voice. You are the destroyer. John Hawkins at your service, he said weakly. I had planned to destroy the cyber ship, the octopoid said. But the ease of my subterfuge shows me that you are massively inferior. It will be a simple matter to eliminate your local infestation. I will... The brain core is gone, John whispered. I will destroy you, John Hawkins. I will do it now as I record you screaming in agony. I doubt there will be any screaming. Explain your doltish words, the octopoid said. I'm drugged to the eyeballs and I'm dying. The radiation poisoning... John arched back as a second leg thrust a needle through the radiation suit into his left buttock. The needle sunk deeply, remained motionless, and then withdrew with a jerk. I have injected you with a radiation antidote, John Hawkins. You must feel agony at your passing. That's illogical. You suggest that as a slur? You're a robot, you idiot. Robots don't feel... So why do you want me to feel pain at the end? As an inferior infestation, you are in no position to know anything about superior robots like me. I conquered this ship, didn't I? Wrong. I am about to begin the process of awakening the secondary systems. We will purge the cyber ship of your localized infestation. Then we will... John raised the gyrock and tried to pull the trigger. The octopoid ripped the pistol out of his hand, breaking the trigger finger in the process because the finger had become trapped in the trigger guard. John grunted, surprised he felt that. I will not allow you any resistance, the octopoid said. John cursed the mechanical thing, lifted his legs, placing the bottom of his boots against the bulb's body and shoved as hard as he could. He couldn't move it, though. The alien injection seemed to have revived his thinking, however, as a moment of clarity struck home. He was going to die. The octopoid was going to reverse the regiment's glorious victory. No, John whispered. As he shoved upward with his boots, with his back pressed against the decking, John detached a grenade from his belt. He used his thumb to activate it, hiding the weapon from the octopoid's camera eye. John counted silently. At the last moment, he reached up, holding the grenade inside a cavity in the robot's body. The grenade exploded, and John Hawkins lost consciousness. Chapter 8 The entity known as John Hawkins did not die at that instant in time. He dreamed endlessly. He never remembered those dreams, although he recalled that some horrified him and some brought him brief moments of peace. Finally, dim consciousness returned. He lay on a soft bed. Tubes were stuck in his arms, sides, and legs. His skin itched worse than before. He heard voices but had no idea what they were saying or if they were male or female. Slowly, by degrees, he managed to bring up his right hand so his immobile head could stare at it. The problem was simple. He lacked a right hand. John stared at the stump of his wrist. Two hands appeared. They were good, strong hands. They clamped hold of the damaged arm, slowly but forcefully moving it out of his view. As he struggled to reason out why they did that, he faded out again, dreaming anew. In this dream, he was running hard. He had a mission that he absolutely had to complete. There were things chasing him. He could feel them breathing down his neck. He could hear them clicking on the deck plates behind him. He could... The dream slipped away like a fog gently blown off a summer beach. That allowed him to surface for consciousness again. Bright glaring lights almost blinded him. Voices circled him. 
tubes like bloodworms sank into his body. He could hear sounds of something buzzing or cutting, and the strong odor almost made him sneeze. John tried to move his arm into view. He recalled something about missing digits. Fingers. Not yet, a voice told him. John didn't know what that meant. To hell with it then. He was leaving. And he did leave, sinking back into unconsciousness. The dreams were formless lights. They weaved, juggled places, and began to pulsate smaller and smaller, finally disappearing. Two lights appeared later, grew, merged into each other, solidified. John's eyes snapped open. His head lay deep in an extraordinarily soft pillow. He felt exhausted, drained to the bone. His mind hurt. His wrist itched like murder. He tried to raise his left hand to reach over and scratch. He simply lacked the strength to do that. A towering head appeared in his vision. John struggled to comprehend and then struggled even harder to focus. Finally, the wise-lined features of the long-faced old man came into view. The sergeant was wearing a military hat and had his pipe in his mouth. John couldn't smell any tobacco, and he didn't spy any smoke trickling up from the pipe bowl. The old man used a hand to pull the pipe out of his mouth. How are you feeling, son? Weak, John whispered. The old man nodded, putting the pipe stem back between his teeth. You've been here for a time. We trade off to keep you company. The Martian says you're going to be fine. The Centurion, he worries that he came in too late. I don't understand. The wise old eyes studied him. Rest, son, get better. You saved us, all of us. That was incredibly brave and noble. Colonel Graham would have been proud of you. John couldn't help it. A warm feeling built in his chest. He tried to sit up. Colonel Graham would have been proud. The idea strengthened him. He met the old man's eyes, and he recognized the worry. What is it, Sergeant? The old man's eyebrows rose. Uh, I think you should wait, sir. You need your strength. John stared into the sergeant's eyes. As he did, the strength faded away, and he never realized when his head gently moved to the side. He didn't dream this time. It felt as if only a second passed, but he had no idea how long it had really been. John opened his eyes, and he felt much stronger than before. By degrees, he pushed his head upward, and then his shoulders. The soft pillow tried to trap his shoulders, but John's stubbornness had returned. Finally, he sat up, realizing he was in a medical bed. He recognized the med machines. He looked for tubes in his flesh, but saw none. Something caught his eye. He stared, and his heart pounded. He looked at his smooth right hand. He saw a hairline scar along the wrist where the hand attached. He moved the fingers. They worked. Tears threatened to well in his eyes. John fought them back. He was the captain. He would not weep at this miracle. John looked up at the ceiling. Thank you, God, he whispered. Thank you for life. Thank you for this hand, and thanks for keeping the regiment in control of the warship. John felt better saying that. As he smiled, John realized someone had slipped into the med center. He looked up, spying a tech, a thin Neptunian with a slate in his hands. Captain, the med tech said. I'm better, John said. But I don't understand how I have this hand. He moved his right hand fingers. Bast Banbeck showed us how to use a regrower, sir. It's an alien device. The sacerdote said the aliens use the regrower to manufacture some of their abominations. The head you once saw connected to a machine. This regrower made my hand. That's right, sir. We grafted it to your wrist. Bast Banbeck showed us the machine to do. I see, John said, interrupting. He moved the fingers again. This felt like his hand. He supposed it was his hand. This was incredible. The regiment could use tech like this. The med tech cleared his throat. John looked up. I want to speak to... He stopped. He didn't know whom he needed to speak to, who had taken over in his absence. 
The sergeants thought you'd want an update as soon as possible, sir, the med tech said. Sounds good. Let's hear it. Oh, not from me, sir. Once you're strong enough, I already told you I am, John said, interrupting. The med tech squared his narrow shoulders. Technically, that's my decision, sir. John studied the Neptunian. He could see stubbornness there. Well, what's your judgment? Yes, you're strong enough. I'll send for the mentalist. She ran the investigation. What investigation? The med tech shook his head. I'm sorry, sir. I'm under strict orders. She's supposed to tell you. That was made very clear to me. Then get her. Now. Yes, sir, the med tech said. He spun around, hurrying for the exit. Chapter 9 The Martian shook her head as she stood beside John's medical bed. That's not what I meant, she said. Gloria Sanchez wore a utilitarian gray suit. It lacked any flourish or singularity other than its drabness. She wore gray shoes and had well-scrubbed features. Her long, dark hair fell straight past her shoulders. She had brown, inquisitive eyes, but was thin and small, much smaller than da Vinci. Her only costly item was the tablet clutched against her bosom. The device aided her mentalist duties. Mentalists believed in strict logic and rational and efficient use of their brain power. Gloria was no exception, even if she had proven more emotional in the past than the customary image of a mentalist. She'd already started explaining the present situation to John. The centurion pulled me out of the reactor core, John asked. She gave him a careful scrutiny before saying, You traveled most of the way back on your own. Most? All the way to the safety hatch, she said. You banged on it. The centurion opened it and pulled you out. I don't remember any of that. I should think not, she said. It was... It was one of those unbelievable acts people perform at the oddest moment. Like a small woman lifting an air car off her child, or a youth who leaps across an impossible chasm to escape his foes. Hysterical strength. I was hysterical. You'd lost your right hand. You had horrible belly wounds and had lost far too much blood, to say nothing of the radiation poisoning consuming you. The octopoid injected me with something. That's interesting, she said in a strange, almost dismissive voice. I didn't know. I don't think anyone did. You did mumble the gist of your story several times in a state of semi-consciousness. Fine. What happened to the octopoid? Gloria stared at him. What? he asked. Maybe this is too soon, she said. Tell me, I order it. Gloria sighed. We haven't found any evidence of these two octopoids, as you call them. Robot octopoids. I understand, she said. What are you suggesting, that I made it all up? That would be easier to understand, Gloria said. But, she said, holding up a hand to keep him from speaking, what happened to the engine and gravity control boards? Can we explain the chief tech's brutal murder? You found Da Vinci hiding in the engine control room. You don't need the octopoids as a cause for the problem. You think the little Neptunian... Please, one thing at a time, Captain. My point is that the sabotage indicates something nefarious occurred. We have sufficient justification for the acts. You claim to have seen... Robots... Are you saying no one found a shred of evidence in the reactor area? No one found a, a metal leg, for instance? Gloria hesitated before saying, That is correct. John blinked several times. Something or someone must have cleaned up the reactor area. That would be one possible explanation, yes. You think I hallucinated about the robots? Do you want me to speak the truth? Yes, he nearly shouted. Yes, she said. Yes, that I might have hallucinated. That is correct. John sagged against his pillow. He couldn't believe it. For a moment, he wondered if he was dreaming this. Let me get this straight, John said. You believe the octopoids did not exist. Captain, I have questioned Da Vinci. He was very clever. He gave me answers that would have pleased anyone but a Martian mentalist. Because of my strictly logical processes, I detected several false connectives in his words. Da Vinci's story did not match up in a few tiny areas. 
He is a gifted liar. I am a superior listener, however. Wait just a minute. You can't mean there wasn't anything in the reactor area. How do you explain my hand? Your grenade destroyed it. Why didn't it destroy the rest of me? A freak occurrence saved your life. No, John said sharply. I'm not buying this. The octopoids existed. Something cleaned up the reactor area. I'm surprised the alien robots haven't struck again while I've been out. That is another factor against your story, she said. Captain, these words give me no satisfaction other than in adhering to my oath to speak the truth. I wish you no emotional pain. I imagine you've told the sergeants your supposed truths. Of course, she said. John shook his head ruefully. I'm not attempting to weaken your authority, she said. But your report has that potential. She turned away. Tell me more about Da Vinci, John said. How can you possibly think he engineered the whole episode? Wait a minute. I'm an idiot. The chief. Who pulled off his face like that? Gloria looked up at the ceiling. We found a power glove in the storage area you shot up. Can you guess what else? Just tell me. You shot the power glove with a gyrock round. Why did you attempt to destroy the evidence of a power glove, Captain? I didn't, John said weakly. My shell just happened to hit it. I cannot accept the probabilities of that in good conscience. So you're saying da Vinci donned a power glove and ripped off the chief's face? That doesn't fit the Neptunian's personality. If there aren't any octopoids, why would da Vinci do all this anyway? Captain, da Vinci is a troubled individual. He doesn't have a classic case of dual personalities. It's something different. Bast Bambeck eliminated much of the Prince of Ten Worlds personality in Da Vinci, but an echo of that personality certainly remains. That echo troubles the corporal, and at times it causes him to take bizarre actions. Are you listening to yourself? John asked. What happened wasn't the work of a deranged mind, but of a powerful intellect. True, Da Vinci has such an intellect, but only when it's under the disciplined control of the Prince of Ten Worlds. As himself, he lacks the internal guidance for true brilliance. Well, other than flashes of brilliance that allowed him to create the Wonder Weapon before. The Wonder Weapon had helped them originally conquer the cyber ship four months ago. Why would I hallucinate about these octopoids? John asked. Do you truly wish to hear my analysis? Shoot. She brushed her hair back, staring at him oddly. That means tell me, John said. Gloria nodded before glancing at her tablet. We fought an incredibly stressful battle several months ago. Beating the alien AI has scarred you. Winning scarred me, John asked, sounding doubtful. No, of course not, she said, looking at him. The stress of the fight impressed your subconscious. It stamped itself upon you. You realize that more of these cyberships might conceivably show up in the solar system in the near future. You are intent upon defeating them. Yet your subconscious knows it will be a terrible conflict, one that humanity might well lose. That has created the need for alien robotic enemies, ones you can destroy. Their defeat helps settle your growing worries. John sank back against the pillow and laughed. He shook his head and laughed harder. Finally, he wiped tears from his eyes. I fail to see the humor in this, she said. Mentalist, your training has driven you to excess. This psycho babble is too much. I know what I saw. You were dying, Captain. The hard radiation and your coming demise. The dying mind can play strange tricks. I have no doubt you truly believe you saw the octopoids, as you put it. Hold it, John said. What did da Vinci say about the octopoids? Why, nothing, she said. He's the one who told me about them. He denies that. John's eyes narrowed while suspicion bubbled in him. He reached up and wiped his face. He grinned at Gloria and sighed. Then a terrible thought surfaced. Maybe Gloria had gone under the brain tap machine. Maybe she had alien thought patterns. How else could she fail to understand? I see, Gloria said, who had been watching him. You now suspect me of subterfuge. He looked at her, surprised. I am a master at reading kinesics. What you call body language, she said. You exhibit obvious signs. 
I suggest that means you have become highly paranoid concerning me. He snorted. I grew up highly paranoid. That helped me stay alive. You mean in the lower New London tunnels? Yeah, he said. She examined her tablet, tapping it. Gloria, she regarded him. The octopoid, the second one, injected me with a serum. It told me that would help combat the radiation poisoning. You said no one had heard about that. A quick med scan should show traces of the alien serum or not. She nodded. Get the med tech. I can make the scan, she said. John stared her in the eyes. You stay right where you are. Call the med tech. Give the instructions so I can hear them. I will do no such thing. He'd slipped his new hand under the covers, stretching the index finger, poking it up against the blanket. He aimed it at her. I have a stitch gun, he said flatly. If you don't do exactly as I say, I'll fire. Gloria studied his eyes, possibly seeing his determination and paranoia against her. She finally tapped her tablet and asked the med tech to step into the room for a moment. Chapter 10 The thin tech looked up in shock. He'd pushed a med scanner next to the captain and finished the sensor readings. The captain's right, the tech said. There's more than a trace here that I can't explain. Could the element have aided him against radiation poisoning? Gloria asked. The tech typed on the med scanner. He studied the results and finally looked up again, just as shocked as before. This is incredible, the tech said. He faced the captain. This is revolutionary, sir. Whatever you took, you need to tell us. This is a breakthrough in radiation treatment. Gloria took several steps back until her knees knocked against the edge of a chair. She sat down hard. She'd grown pale. She looked up at John with her mouth open. You can go, John told the tech. But the drug, sir, we'll talk about that later, John said. Just to be safe, do you have the trace element specifics? The med tech slapped the med scanner. It's in here, sir. Start studying that. See if you can duplicate it. The tech snapped his fingers, pointing at the captain. Then he wheeled the med scanner to the side, popped out a memory disk, and hurried away. There's only one reasonable conclusion, Gloria said softly. You told me the truth. Either that or you made an incredible medical breakthrough in your spare time. Alien octopoid robots make more sense. Thank you, I guess. But her features stiffened. Da Vinci might be even more cunning than I gave him credit for. He made those tiny slips in his story to misdirect me, knowing that I'd spot them. Is the Neptunian in the brig? Gloria nodded. Captain, the ship could be in terrible danger. John had been thinking. Despite the alien serum, I took an incredible amount of hard radiation. What was my condition when the centurion found me? You were unconscious. That doesn't make sense. No, Gloria said. The centurion heard knocking. He donned a radiation suit and investigated, finding you lying on the other side. I clearly remember him commenting on your incredible stamina. The alien serum likely doesn't explain your superhuman feat of walking to the hatch, Gloria said, finishing his sentence. Let me rephrase that. There is an easier explanation. The last octopoid dragged me to the hatch, John said. Yes, she whispered. But that doesn't make any sense either. The serum in your blood suggests you've told the truth about the robotic octopoids. The last one, the one taking the grenade blast, must have cleaned the area. The likeliest hiding location was in one of the reactor cores. The evidence of their existence must be long gone, burned and thrown away in the ship's ejected ballast. That all fits, except for one thing, John said. Gloria nodded. According to your story, the octopoid wanted to destroy you. Why would it then do the opposite? Why would a half-destroyed octopoid fail to cause an engine self-destruct? Why would it then clean up? It must have cleaned up afterward. First it dragged you to the hatch and knocked on it to alert anyone outside. But that would mean your declared enemy, the octopoid, saved your life. That's what I think, John said. Why would it do all that and not do what it set out to do? Destroy the ship? John shook his head. He had no idea. 
Gloria shot to her feet. She tapped on her tablet, studied it, and then slapped it against her thigh. She began to pace with her head bent in thought. The octopoid must have received new data, Gloria said slowly. This new data changed its directives, instructing it to leave the Nathan Graham intact and you alive. I can only conclude the octopoid did these things because... John snapped his fingers. The octopoid, or whatever drove the robot, believes it can deliver the former cybership back to its supposedly rightful owners. Maybe, Gloria said. What else could it be? The answer lies in understanding the reason why it dragged you to safety, Gloria said. It could have killed you, correct? Easily, if it was still functioning, John said. You were going to say alive. It wasn't alive. It was a machine. That's another debate, Gloria said. In any case, why did the octopoid first inject you with the serum? I already told you. Say it again. It wanted to keep me alive so I could suffer more. There's the answer, Gloria said. I don't see it. The driving mind behind the octopoid wants Captain Jack Hawkins to suffer. I submit that the octopoid realized it had insufficient strength to take control of the ship. It had enough ability to destroy the vessel, but something changed, making it believe the guiding intelligence could capture you later for greater and possibly extended agony. Do you hear yourself? I am a mentalist, Gloria said, as if stating a creed. I follow clues to their logical conclusion. Logic has led me here. It fits the facts as we know them. John blinked several times. You spoke about a guiding intelligence. You don't mean the last octopoid. By no means, she said. Something greater than the octopoid. Something, he stared at her. The war's not over. Precisely, Gloria said. We missed something. I don't know what, but we missed it nonetheless. We're going to have to increase ship security, John said. And search the ship more thoroughly for intruders, Gloria said. This is a vast vessel. The search is going to take a long time. We haven't even walked through every area. Time, she said. I think this is about time. I think we have to travel faster. Is the engine fixed? Not yet, she answered. John scowled. They had accelerated at a fraction of the warship's potential. The first time they'd seen the cybership, it had decelerated at 70 gravities. Such acceleration would have allowed them to reach the Saturn grav system much faster than ordinary. The old way, it took years to get from Neptune to Saturn. The Nathan Graham was currently able to accelerate more continuously than a human-built spaceship, but it was still at a fraction of what this thing should be able to do, had shown itself capable of under the AI. How long will it take at our present rate until we reach Saturn? John asked. A little more than a year, Gloria said. And you say time is what this is about? The mentalist nodded. John sighed. He had to get better. They had to speed what repairs they could to the giant vessel. And they had to find the alien robot enemy hidden on the super ship. They had to do all that without letting the octopoids pick them off one at a time. John lay back, forcing himself to rest so that he could heal faster. No one said saving the solar system would be easy. He put his hands behind his head, trying to keep from thinking about the kinds of awful tortures the cyber enemy had in store for him if they lost. Part 2 Dwarf Planet Maki Maki Plus 6 Months, 16 Days Chapter 1 Data specialist June Zen filled in for her best friend, Mindy Smalls, who was sick with a virus. June's friend was under quarantine in her quarters, had been for five days already. Her friend was in danger of losing her posting if she didn't show up to work soon. That's why June had agreed to fill in for her. June was working a morning shift in Make Make's orbital control station. It was down on the dwarf planet in the only city. Most of that city was under the methane-nitrogen ice, with deeper corridors carved out of the lower rock layer. As she sat at her cubicle, June was worried. 
not for her friend so much, but for herself. The station foreman was a large man with a lecherous eye. That might not have been so bad, but he was high in the ranks of Luxor Evans's band. Luxor Evans was the muscle man, or pusher, of Make Make. In other cultures, that might have made Evans the police chief and army general rolled into one. Evans seemed to be getting ready for a takeover. He ruled a tough clan that snapped too when he said boo, and he'd made open alliances with several smaller clans ready to pitch in with him. June rechecked her board for the eighth time in ten minutes. Every spaceship, boat, and hauler was exactly where it should be. She studied their relative orbital positions, wondering why their locations made her jumpy. Or was it just knowing Big Bob should be showing up soon with their mojo? June sighed. She should have put on more this morning. She'd been in a hurry and had slipped into a silver jumpsuit. There was nothing inherently wrong with the suit. It fit. It was comfortable, and hot or cold, it kept her skin temperature perfect. June was long-legged, with curvy hips and nice breasts. She had long brunette hair and features too many men noticed. Others had often told her she was stunning. She was hot, and she knew it. It was an ace card combined with smarts and even better training. Unfortunately, she lived among two-legged wolves, Philistines with brutish appetites. The men on Makemake Make cared little for the finer things in life. They all vied for power in whatever ways they could, and that turned her ace into a liability. Makemake Make was on the edge of the space frontier, a place for the bold, the adventurous, and the quick rich crowd. Whatever civilized veneer remained in the people out here was generally reserved for negotiations over scientific and highly technological concepts and devices. Such men as these had big appetites. They might leer at her, lust to take off her clothes and hump her, but they would seldom let that interfere with their greater desire for financial gain and climbing the power ladder. The women of Make Make were little better, bartering their bodies, brains, and loyalty for the highest rank they could get or attach themselves to. June Zen was different because her predecessors had come into the Kuiper Belt for markedly different reasons. They hadn't lusted for revenge or driven themselves with endless work to get enough so they could go back and fix their lot in Neptunian society. June's grandfather, Dr. Maximus Zen, had joined the exodus to the Kuiper Belt frontier because he would believed this was humanity's future. June peered at her screen more closely. This was odd. There appeared to be workers flying from a hauler in orbit. Why would they do that? The workers would have had to don space flight suits. She studied the images. Could this be right? The workers, she counted 11 of them, moved toward different orbital vessels. Was this some kind of surprise party? Her fingernails clicked against a screen as she pulled up a manifest. The hauler, Get Bent, was from Dannenberg 7. Okay, maybe that made sense then. The mine on the icy planet Tesmo belonged to the Evans clan. They'd become powerful the last few years, always doing something arrogant. Maybe it would be better if she forgot about this. Maybe this had something to do with Luxor Evans's anticipated takeover. June frowned. She seemed to recall a report about Dannenberg 7. It had something to do... The main hatch slid up, breaking June's concentration. Big Bob sauntered into the main orbital control chamber. He wore baggy pants because he had tree trunk thighs and a baggy tunic that strained to cover his huge gut and powerful shoulders. Bob seemed to lack a neck. He made up for that with an almost square head with a frizz of black hair circling the middle area. Bob was supposed to have pure Ukrainian blood from Old Earth, but who even knew what that was supposed to mean? He was carrying a holder with four steaming cups of mojo. For all his mass, Big Bob had piggy eyes in a puffy face. He smiled, showing peg-like teeth, all of them evenly spaced from each other. Some said that Big Bob looked retarded. Firstly, no one said that to his face. Secondly, it was flat false. Big Bob acted like a boor, but he was crazy cunning when it came to bullying others and when it came to conforming to those with greater power. 
Mojo, Bob said. Nice and hot like you like it. He stared at June, walking over to her and holding out the carton. June knew he believed himself sly and humorous. The other two station operators laughed. The male operator gave her a wink. The woman raised her eyebrows three times in a suggestive manner, as if June should do it with Bob. June lifted a cup from the carton, turning back to her board. She eased the lid back, blowing on the black mojo, enjoying the strong aroma. Big Bob might be a pig, but he knew his mojo. June finally recognized the total silence in the chamber. She ignored it at first. It made her back squirm, but she wasn't going to turn around if she didn't have to. The woman coughed discreetly. June focused on her sensor board. What's the matter with you? Big Bob growled. June knew she had to face him. She swiveled on her chair and smiled sweetly at him. Bob scowled thunderously. It made him look even stupider than he normally did. Can't you even say thanks? Thanks, June said. She began turning back to her board. Bob laid a meaty paw on her left shoulder. June had been dreading his touch. His thick fingers dug into her flesh. He was strong, and he was letting her know it. I had enough of your attitude. Almost in a daze because this frightened her, June picked up her mojo, faced him, and flinched in pain as he applied agonizing strength. She'd intended to hurl the steaming mojo in his face. He must have realized that and beaten her to the punch. The black liquid poured onto the floor as she twisted at the pain. Finally, he released her. June looked up, ready to tell him off. The heat in his piggy eyes stilled the retort in her throat. If she told him off, here, in his office, he was going to hit her. June saw that, and she realized he would hit hard, probably in the face, and maybe hard enough to break facial bones. I'd done your friend a huge favor letting you work for her, Bob snarled. You may have a nice ass, great tits, too, but that don't mean squat here. You want to keep your friend's job? You tell me, here and now. June wanted to get up and run. A flickering glance at the other two showed them studiously scrutinizing their screens. She looked up at Bob. He still glowered, but something else shined in his eyes. He was starting to enjoy this. June wanted to hurl insults at him. She wanted to grab a crank bat and bash him in the face. Even as she envisioned doing that, she realized the bat would likely bounce off his face, just make him raping mad. One, Bob counted. June realized he was giving her to three. Two. In that moment, June also realized that she had no recourse. She had her regular data analyst job. It was barely enough to keep her quarters and her grandfather's cryogenic unit going. She needed the credits from this gig. She also lacked a protecting clan. Her grandfather was her sole relation on Make Make, and he was literally frozen stiff in a cryo unit. Three. Bob said, his eyes shining with growing rage. I want her, June's tongue seemed to twist over itself. I want her to have her job when she's better. Yeah? June nodded, dreading what was coming next. Oh, Bob said, playing into it now. Well, what are you willing to do to keep your friend's job? The man at the censor station snickered lewdly. Be more thankful, June said. Bob stared at her. Uh, work harder, June added. Okay, Bob said. That's the right direction, work hard. Yeah, you have to work hard to make me like you. Are you going to work hard enough to do that, though? She stared at him. She realized his rage was gone, replaced by bullying. This brute could sniff weakness like a chem sniffer. Where do you live? June asked quietly. Big Bob smiled, showing off the peg teeth that made him seem like an idiot. You want to come over tonight? He asked. June nodded as her stomach curdled. She was going to have to start carrying a weapon. She could never come back here. Maybe she'd talk to Walleye about a hit, see how many credits it would take for him to kill Bob. Yeah, Bob said with laughter in his voice. Come to my place, baby. Wear what you're wearing now, but don't wear anything underneath it. You understand? Yes, Bob, 
June said, deciding she was going to see Walleye as soon as she left work. Chapter 2 What are you crazy? You want me to kill Big Bob the Censor King? That's what this is about. Jun Zen nodded meekly. Walleye was a mutant. That's what everyone said, anyway. He wasn't a good kind of mutant, either. He had strange eyes, so you could never tell where he was looking. That freaked out a lot of people. It was freaking out June right now. They met in an underground cubby near the catapult launch system. The system hurled ore into orbit for the giant furnaces up there. Most of the construction went into a huge spaceship, a special warship with many new weapon systems. The majority of the colonists on Makemake came from the Neptune Grav system. They had run out here for one reason or another. Many others on the Kuiper Belt frontier had run from Saturn and Uranus, too. Those running from the Jupiter system had gone to other outer planetary systems, still believing someone would stop the Solar League. Few people believed that anymore. The Neptune system was the last holdout, and there was strange news from there. Or there had been strange news. Now nothing came out of the Neptune Grav system. Rumor had it that Make Make had a Neptunian money man behind it. That's why this outpost had more modern equipment than anywhere else in the Kuiper Belt. The money man planned a great surprise. A fleet of giant warships to back whatever he had as a long-term goal. Big Bob is connected to Luxor Evans, Walleye told her. So? Walleye stretched out his stumpy legs, his work boots barely reaching the low table in his office. I hit Bob, Evans buys a hit on me. End of story. Why does Evans have to know you did it? Luscious, you're sure slow for a girl trying to hire the deadliest man on Make Make. June wanted to smile. Walleye did not look deadly. He was too small with his stunted legs and arms. He was five foot one on his best day, maybe five two if he wore high heeled boots. Whatever you're thinking, you're wrong, Walleye told her. I'm deadly like a scorpion. You know what that is? June shook her head. Doesn't matter, Walleye said. Trust me. Big Bob could crush you, June blurted. Walleye looked up at the low ceiling. As he did, the chamber rumbled and began shaking. The noise increased, and so did the shaking. Suddenly, the shaking and rattling quit. And another catapult load launches into space, Walleye said, looking at her. You know how long I've been listening to that? June shook her head. Abruptly, Walleye jerked his work boots off the table. He sat up, putting his stumpy hands between his knees. Don't you know people are predicting the end of everything? The little assassin asked. You mean the videos out of Neptune? Walleye laughed, shaking his head. Of course I mean that. Everyone's talking about it, but not you, sweetie. You're a data analyst. Haven't you analyzed what that all means? She stared at him. Of course, maybe you haven't seen what I've acquired. Maybe Big Bob hasn't seen this yet either, or maybe he has. You've lost me. Walleye seemed to be staring at her, but she couldn't tell for sure. Maybe she'd made a mistake coming here. I just had a bad idea, Walleye said. It's positively evil. But it might account for why the catapult launches have increased by 200%. It might give me a clue as to the hurry up there. There are more haulers coming in lately, June said. She recalled Big Bob telling her about that her first day in the orbital station office. The catapult launches increased a month after the original video, Walleye said quietly. Luscious, I'd like you to look at this. See what you think. What about Big Bob? Forget about him, at least for now. I might have stumbled onto something bigger. Are you interested? June had a hard time reading the assassin. She wondered if maybe others had a hard time, too. Maybe that was part of his deadliness. He looked like a rabbit, but struck like a viper. His mutant freakishness acted like cover for him. While I, I already have enough trouble with Big Bob, who am I going to get to take care of you trying to bed me? You're mighty fine, Miss Zen, but you're too tall for me. You don't have to worry about me pawing you. Do I have your word on that? I just gave it, Walleye said curtly. 
June nodded as some of the fear went out of her. She had a flat needler taped to the small of her back. She had a feeling walleye already knew that and had already decided what to do if she tried to draw it. The dwarfish man moved a flat screen so they could both look at it. He typed a bit and a super bright object appeared. It was like a star, only bigger, and it moved too fast across the starry background. I've never seen anything like that, she said. This was taken, oh, seven months ago. You can't tell, but some think this thing is four or five times the size of a premier class battleship. June shrugged. She had no idea what that meant. That's the latest Solar League battleship. They're over a kilometer long. June studied the bright image. You're telling me that's a ship four kilometers long? Yep. Who makes spaceships that big? I don't know. Aliens? June shuddered with dread. Aliens? You think that bright light is thrust from an alien vessel? You're the data analyst, not me. But notice, Walleye said as he typed on the pad. The trajectory of the ship would take it to the Neptune system. June thought about that. Where was the ship when this vid was taken? It was just leaving the inner Oort cloud, Walleye said. June blinked at him as her stomach tightened. When was this taken again? Seven months ago, just like I said. Leaving the Oort cloud as in 20,000 or more AUs from Neptune? That's right. No. Do you realize how fast it would have to have been traveling to reach Neptune from the Oort cloud like you're suggesting? Walleye nodded slowly as he said, Aliens. June couldn't stop blinking as she tried to speak. The hollow feeling in her stomach had gotten worse. Take it you saw the war footage at Neptune six and a half months ago? Walleye asked. It was all June could do to nod. And the aftermath? Walleye said, when something weird hit the Victoria Solar League fleet. But Walleye reached over, patting one of her clenched hands. Aliens, June whispered. You think aliens are in the solar system? Luscious, I've had a worse thought than that. It's partly why you're here. Please, Walleye, I don't like talking about this. It's creepy. Do you have a key to your friend's cubicle? I do, but she's under quarantine. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? About what? June asked. About what she might have seen on her long-range sensors, Walleye said softly. The orbital station controls some advanced sensing equipment. I think it's time you and I paid your friend a visit. Ask her what she's seen. Ask her if that's why she's in quarantine. June's mouth dropped open. What had she gotten herself into? She glanced at the blazing image on the screen. If that was a vid shot of an alien ship, and others knew about this. Okay, June whispered. Let's do it. Chapter 3 the Kuiper Belt was like any frontier in man's past. In many ways, it was like the Greek exploration of the early period, when they and the Phoenicians colonized the best areas along the Mediterranean coast. It was also akin to the American Wild West. Instead of planes, Indians, and covered wagons, it had vacuums, spaceships, and comets, with the occasional dwarf planet thrown in. The stellar vagabonds staked claims, first at the bigger metallic bodies and later elsewhere. Law was closer to the surface, enforced by will, guns, and sometimes by signed compacts. June and Walleye belonged to a group known as Cryo-Arcs. They were a rough lot, driven by greed, sustained by technology, and living on hope. June Zen's grandfather, Maximus Zen, was one of the Cryoarch founders. In reality, Maximus Zen was June's great great grandfather. Maximus Zen and Letitia Evans had propounded a countervailing theory regarding humanity's destiny. Most people lived day to day. Those that did regard the future mostly concerned themselves with solid pension plans. Among those, the vast majority waited until older age before even that really concerned them. Maximus Zen had worried about the human race. Would it survive the solar system? He had finally decided that it would, but only if man began colonizing other star systems. 
Unfortunately, as far as Maximus knew, there was no such thing as a faster-than-light drive. Thus, humanity would have to do its colonizing the hard way. People could use sleeper ships, freezing themselves in cryo-units as the automated vessel traveled the distance. They could use generational vessels, the original colonists dying off long before the massive vessel reached a new star system. Their great-great-grandchildren would do that. Those in between would live entirely shipboard lives. Maximus believed each of those systems had serious flaws. He had a different way. The Kuiper Belt, and more importantly, the Oort Cloud, would be the answer. People would not rush to another star system, but hop by slow degrees. They would travel from a dwarf planet to a comet to another comet, maybe another dwarf planet, and by that time they would have reached the farthest end of the outer Oort Cloud. They would be two light years from the sun by that point. As the people kept slowly hopping from comet to dirty asteroid, they would enter the edge of a new star system and slowly reverse the process. Eventually, the descendants would build colonies on new major planets or on their moons, the light coming from a completely different star. By a process of stellar osmosis, humanity would survive its own killer nature. The cryo-arc portion of the theory was Letitia Evans's edition. The first belters... Kuiper Belters, had been futurists who keenly believed in humanity's continued scientific development. As the leaders of the Belters grew old and neared death, they froze themselves in long-term cryo-units. The idea was simple. At some point in the future, humanity would have greater science. That science would likely include the cure for aging. The ancient survivors would be thawed, take the cure, and begin life in the new paradise of man. However, over the years, the number of cryo-units grew progressively. Keeping them all functioning took too much badly needed energy. Out here in the belt, that energy could be applied to more useful and life-sustaining projects. This far from the sun, keeping alive was hard work. The solution proved easy, if heartless. New future seekers opened old cryo-units and tossed the sleepers into a furnace. One then took a geezer's place as the unit's new occupant. Naturally, the interlopers set up safeguards so no one could do that to them. In most cases, the safeguards proved futile. Then, some people decided the oldest cryo-arcs might be worth preserving. They'd become like old wines on Earth, gaining status due to their vintage. Finally, a belter clan didn't really have high status until they could point to ancient cryo-arcs. Jun Zen had the status she did because she controlled one of the oldest cryo-occupants in the Kuiper Belt. Good old Maximus Zen, her grandfather. June and Walleye moved through narrow corridors. These were far under the methane-nitrogen ice that covered most of Makemake. These corridors had a plastic-like coating stretched over dwarf planet rock. One could see the rocky contours. In some places, it seemed as if the sharp-angled rocks would tear through the fabric. That had never happened, as the fabric was incredibly tough. June felt uncomfortable walking with Walleye. She towered over the short assassin, and it made her self-conscious. He was wearing a long buff coat that almost scraped against the flooring, and he wore an odd hat with a brim that hid his weird eyes. She knew he had weapons hidden under the buff coat. She also knew... It's strange, Walleye muttered. Huh? The corridor is empty. It's evening schedule. Everyone is resting or working. Why would they be running around in the corridors? A hundred reasons, Luscious. The emptiness strikes me odd. That's all I'm saying. Walleye looked up at her. You notice anything strange lately? June shook her head. Do you have anything specific in mind? No, just wondering. He tugged at the brim of his hat. Feels like something is building up, know what I mean? No. He grinned under the shadow of his hat brim. What's so funny, she demanded. People think I have mutant powers. They call me a freak. I just keep my eyes open. I notice. You notice what? Whatever. I soak it up and let it sink into my thinker. I have situational awareness better than anyone I know. Something is building up, and I'm not talking about Luxor's coming takeover. 
An idiot could see that coming. This is different. You mean the catapult launches? He looked up at her. Smart and beautiful. What a combination. Are you making fun of me? Walleye shook his head. June felt the key in her hand. It was a card ID. It had Mindy's combination downloaded into it. Chapter 4 June felt guilty about doing this, especially with the large yellow quarantine sign on the door. She looked both ways again. This was C Complex, with banks and banks of doors, with levels upon levels of walkways stacked one above the other before the doors. Lights shined, making everything nice and bright. Camera eyes were watching, which was normal security procedure. Luscious, you have terrible thieving skills, Walleye said. Just hold up the key, open the door, walk in. What could be easier? If we get caught, the longer you rub a neck, the greater chance there is of that happening. June steeled herself, passed the car before an eye, and heard something in the door click. Tentatively, she pushed open the door. Mindy, it's June. Are you okay? No answer. Worse, the place smelled wrong. It smelled empty. June glanced back at Walleye. He made an elaborate gesture, indicating she should enter the abode. Suddenly, June didn't want to go in. She wanted to go home, shower, curl into bed, and watch a hollow vid. If she crossed this threshold, she would... Oh! She said in surprise, stumbling into the quarantined quarters. Walleye had pushed her. He strode in after her, doing it in the best style he could with his stumpy legs, letting the buff coat swing open. June looked back. Walleye had drawn a big old gun that seemed far too heavy for his hand. She had no idea what kind of gun it was. It had a big orifice and seemed deadly. Seeing it made her more frightened, not less. Put that away, she hissed. Walleye ignored her as his head swiveled this way and that. The short hall led into living quarters. Everything was neat and tidy in here. No tablets lay anywhere. No cups, no wrappers, no vid plugs or even ear plugs in evidence. There was no evidence of a person living in the tight quarantined quarters. Mindy, June shouted. Don't bother, Walleye said. The place is empty, but let's make sure. You never know. June frowned, slowly turning, searching for something. As she did, Walleye kept moving, with the heavy gun ready for anything. He disappeared into the bedroom, stayed there too long, it seemed. Then came the sound of an air-flushed toilet. Walleye walked back into the living area as he holstered the big gun under his buff coat. What were you doing in there? June asked. He shrugged, saying, Drank too much mojo earlier. You used her bathroom? He rubbed his chin, scratching at his cheek. You're not supposed to break into someone's quarters and use their bathroom, June scolded. She's gone. I doubt she ever came here. When did you talk to her? Three days ago. And she's been quarantined for five? June nodded. Did you FaceTime her, or did you just speak to her on a comm? We just spoke. Walleye nodded as if that meant something. Why would they quarantine her, or say they were, if no one is here? June asked. Two reasons I can think of, Walleye said. One, they killed her and didn't want anyone knowing right away. But I talked to her. That leads me to reason two. She had to go somewhere, and this was cover. That doesn't make sense. Walleye moved to the couch, lifted the back of his buff coat, and sat down. He put his hands between his knees and hunched forward. What are you doing? June asked. He didn't look up as he answered. Thinking. June crossed her arms, confounded by events. If Mindy's gone, she's got high-level backing. Walleye looked up at her with interest. Placing her in quarantine, putting the sign on the door, took authority. You're talking about Luxor Evans, Walleye said. If Luxor's covering for her, Mindy never needed my help with Big Bob. Smart girl, Walleye said. Luxor can tell Big Bob. The mutant trailed off as another odd look swept over him. What now? Walleye shook his head. You know something. 
This quarantine setup has nothing to do with Luxor Evans, Walleye said. It's obvious. If it had to do with Luxor, Mindy would have never phoned you. Who ordered Mindy into quarantine then? Luscious, you're a genius. Who indeed? Can you find out? Hey, what's wrong? June's knees had just given out. Luckily, she slumped into a chair. Her mouth hung open and she stared into space. After a time, she closed her mouth and looked at Walleye. He waited patiently. Just before Big Bob showed up this morning with Mojo, I saw something strange on my orbital screen, June said. Walleye kept waiting. Maybe that was another of his powers as an assassin or mutant. Most people would have blurted for her to speak up already. I saw spacewalkers leaving an orbital hauler, June said. I can't remember how many of them, ten or more. They drifted toward other haulers, other orbital boats. You mean jetted over using suit thrusters? June nodded. Why's that bother you now? Walleye asked. I didn't know about aliens before this, June said. Spacewalkers mean aliens to you? Walleye asked. It looked weird at the time. I forgot all about it after Big Bob grabbed me. June looked up. The hauler was from Dannenberg 7. That's an Evans-controlled planetesimal. Walleye looked grim. You know, Dannenberg 7 went offline three months ago, right? June moaned. She'd remembered there was something different about Dannenberg 7, but not what exactly. Now she knew. It had gone offline, silent for three long months. Think about it, Walleye said. Dannenberg 7 is one of the closest planetesimals in the path of the bright thruster ship I showed you. Did I see aliens this morning on my screen and not know it? June whispered. Were those aliens infiltrating other ships? The two of them stared at each other. What are we going to do? June said. While I clenched his stubby hands harder than before. First, we're going to keep calm. This could be aliens. This could be something else. We don't want to jump to conclusions. We haven't heard anything from the Neptune system for months, June said. What's caused that? While I slowly shook his head. Why would aliens sneak around upstairs, leaving their haulers so they could drift to other ships? June whispered. Walleye stared at the floor. I'm scared, June said. Walleye looked up. He stood fast, almost impossibly fast, used his right hand to whip back the edge of the buff coat and draw the heavy gun. In the small confines of the living quarters, the gun discharged three times, making a coughing sound each time, followed by muffled explosive sounds and the distinctive stretching sounds of sticky tangle threads. June turned in time to see Mindy thump onto the floor, tangled tight, with a small stitch gun clattering onto the floor to bump against June's right shoe. Chapter 5 Mindy, June cried, are you all right? Mindy Smalls had landed hard, hitting her face on the floor. She'd been tangled too tightly for her to use her hands or even twist aside to soften the crash. Blood now pooled on the floor under her face. Mindy, June cried again. She knelt beside her best friend and carefully chose where she put her hands. She didn't want to have the sticky threads stick to her. With a grunt, she turned Mindy onto her back. The blood flowed from Mindy's nose over her mouth and down the sides of her face into both ears. The nose looked broken. June jumped up, running to the kitchen. She ran back, giving Walleye a fiercely disapproving scowl and carefully wiped away blood from Mindy's face. The tangled woman began to choke on the blood she'd already swallowed. Help me get her up, June demanded. Walleye didn't move. She'll choke to death if we don't do something, June said. She's breathing, Walleye said in a noncommittal manner. What's wrong with you? June shouted at Walleye. The assassin holstered his tangle gun. He moved briskly, picking up the stitch gun on the floor, checking it. Looks normal, he said. You own any guns? He asked June. What? No. Does Mindy? Obviously, June said. You remember her owning a stitch gun? I have no idea. Mindy, are you feeling okay? Mindy had opened her eyes. She stared fixedly at June. It's me, June said, bending over her best friend. You're going to be all right. 
You hit your head, Gronk, Mindy said. June's heart went out to her friend. Oh, Mindy, I'm so sorry. We thought, we thought you were in trouble. I brought... June looked up at Walleye to find him studying her friend. She hit her head, June snapped. She might have a concussion. Don't you have a, a spray that will wilt the sticky strands? She was going to shoot me, Walleye said. Don't try to defend your actions now. You did this to her. I'm not defending my actions. I'd tangle her again if I had to do it over. She was going to shoot you, too. She wasn't looking at me when she drew a gun, but at you. Don't be a fool. Ask her. June turned to Mindy. You weren't going to shoot me, were you? Gronk, Mindy said again. This time she scowled afterward. She didn't seem to be conscious of her bloody nose or that June kept sopping up the blood. Walleye aimed the stitch gun at Mindy. He stepped closer. What are you doing? June demanded. Look at her. She doesn't seem frightened. I shot her with the tangles. For all she knows, I'm going to kill her with the stitch gun. She doesn't show a lick of fear, though. June looked down at Mindy. Her best friend watched Walleye, but it was true that she showed no fear. That wasn't like Mindy. She was as brave as the next person, but she wasn't death-defying. June searched Walleye's face. She didn't like the seriousness there, the careful studiousness. Walleye lowered the stitch gun, although he didn't put it away. He flipped the back of his buff coat and squatted beside Mindy on his stumpy legs. He stared at her frankly. Mindy seemed content to wait for whatever was going to happen next. Look at her eyes, Walleye said. June did. Do they seem glassy? Walleye asked. No. Does Mindy look confused? June shook her head. What would you say she looks like? I don't know, June whispered. I've never seen her like this. She's like a waiting reptile, Walleye said. I've seen an alligator before in a zoo. I was a kid in a rich Neptune habitat. The alligator had eyes like that. I remember it watching me. I had the feeling it was waiting for me to make a mistake. Mindy has a concussion, June said. I've seen people with concussions. They didn't look anything like that. Why isn't your friend complaining about her broken nose? Why isn't she asking us to spray off the strands? Why isn't she threatening us for breaking and entering her quarantined quarters? As Walleye asked his questions, June's heart sank lower and lower. What are you saying? June whispered. Don't know yet. I'm thinking out loud. He let go of the stitch gun as he went to his hands and knees. Like a dog playing a game, he moved nearer Mindy, lowering his head closer to her. He seemed to be inspecting her. He crawled around her, studying, searching. This is weird, Walleye said. He reached out, touching her hair. June would have expected Mindy to flinch. Her friend merely waited. It was starting to get creepy. Walleye pulled away hair, grunting at something. He stood abruptly, looked at June in a strange manner, and staggered for the kitchen. A second later, he retched, probably in the sink. The small assassin returned, using a dish towel to wipe his mouth. That's not yours, June said. It's not hers anymore either, Walleye said grimly. What's that supposed to mean? Are you going to kill her? Move, he said. I will not. You have to tell me what's going on. Why did you vomit? Are you sick? He stared at her, nodding shortly. This is difficult, I understand. It's difficult for me, too, and I'm a mutant. June realized he was attempting levity. We've stumbled onto something outrageous, Walleye said. We've discovered aliens. I believe you found evidence of aliens this morning. Seeing your friend, I think the aliens have already infiltrated Make Make. To what extent is the question of the hour? We might have a chance to save ourselves, but I suspect it's a slim chance. We have to take it, Luscious. If we don't, we might end up like Mindy. Just say it, June pleaded. You're beating around the bushes giving me the willies. Move aside. Reluctantly, June did. While I knelt beside Mindy. He picked up the dropped dish towel and put it on her, rolling her back over onto her face. He slid his knees to her head and lifted her hair. Look at her scalp, Walleye said. 
June did, and the queasiness from the sight made her faint feeling. June clung to consciousness and somehow kept herself from vomiting as Walleye had done. She wasn't sure what that was, but it looked like someone had inserted a fist-sized piece of metal into Mindy's skull. A tiny antenna sprouted from the metal, and the tip glowed with a reddish color. What is that? June whispered. A clue, Walleye said. Maybe the last one we need to put a fire under our backside so we do something to save our lives. Chapter 6 No, June said, horrified. You can't. It might kill her. Walleye looked up and something like pity changed his features. Your friend is already dead, Luscious. This is something else staring out at us. I know that's hard to hear, he trailed off. June's hands flew to her mouth as she tried to suppress a sob. Oh, Mindy, 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 this was awful. Had Alien stuck something soul-killing into her brain? It was too hideous to contemplate. I'm gonna need your help, Walleye said softly probably have to hold her head down. June groaned, shaking her head, keeping her hands in front of her mouth. You know I'm right. The awful thing about that was he was right. Her shoulders trembled, but June took her hands from her mouth. She knelt beside Mindy with a sigh. It will kill her, June whispered. Maybe it will free her. Maybe she can tell us something to save Makemake. June forced herself to put her hands on the back of Mindy's head. She braced herself. Push down with all your weight, Walleye said. I, June wanted to tell him she couldn't, but she could. She had to. Swallowing hard, June pushed down, shoving Mindy's face against the floor. Despite the broken nose, Mindy made no complaint. With a pair of pliers, Walleye clutched a protrusion on the unit in Mindy's skull. Ready? he asked. Do it already, June said between clenched teeth. Walleye strained, no doubt clutching the pliers as hard as he could. Then he braced himself and heaved upward. June struggled to hold the head down. Walleye began to yank instead of just pull. That sickened June, and tears began to spill from her eyes. At that moment, an ugly plopping sound accompanied Walleye's arms flying up, yanking a bloody disc thing from the skull. Awful wires, stiff things, dripped with gore and pieces of Mindy's brain. Those wires had been shoved into her brain. June couldn't contain it anymore. She jerked away, vomiting onto the floor. Horror consumed her as she moaned, hugging herself and vomiting again. Mindy began to cough and retch. She began to twist in the tangle strands, attempting to hump across the floor. She began to moan. Mindy! Walleye shouted, we're your friends, we want to help you. Mindy, speak to us. Instead of continuing to cry out in growing hysteria, Mindy asked in a small voice, help? June looked up, stunned. Mindy, she asked. Walleye rolled Mindy onto her back. It hid the blood dripping from the awful scalp wound. Mindy had stark white features. Her eyes were glazed and she breathed shallowly. June. She whispered, June, 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 it was awful. Mindy began to weep. Tell us about it, Walleye said. He was crouched low so he could whisper in Mindy's ear. Am I dying? Mindy asked in a wheeze. Yes, Walleye said. No, Mindy said. I'm too young. I want to live. Help me. Help me. You have to help me. Yes, Walleye said, we'll help you. We want to help you. We have to know what happened. That way we can tell the doctors. We have to tell Evans about this too. We have to stop the robots, Mindy asked. You're going to stop the robots. June stared at Walleye in shock. She opened her mouth. Wait, Walleye said. To Mindy, he said, robots, that's exactly what we thought happened. Mindy searched his eyes. It is? You know about them? Somewhat, Walleye said. You may have the exact knowledge we need. Tell us quickly, before the doctors arrive. That way they can go straight to work to save you. You mean that? One hundred percent, Walleye said. June knew he was lying, but the mutant sounded so sincere. 
Had he known about these robots all along? Why hadn't he told her then? I spotted something on my sensor board, Mindy whispered. I radioed the tower about it. Evans's cousin, Thebes, took the call and told me to come right over with the specs. I asked him why I couldn't wire it. He told me this was urgent, so I went. Mindy searched Walleye's eyes. If his weird appearance bothered her, it didn't stop her words. They began to tumble out of her. Thebes must have had a unit already. He met me and led me into a room. The robot was waiting there. It had four articulated legs, like a giant spider, and a bulbous body. I think I shrieked. The robot moved fast, throwing me down on a bed. It injected me with a drug. I heard buzzing and felt pressure against my skull. That was the last time I was in charge of myself. The unit took over and gave me commands. I couldn't resist. Oh, how I wanted to. It used pain and sometimes just bypassed my desires. I could understand everything going on around me, but I couldn't do anything to stop it. The only drawback that I could see from the robot's perspective is that I understand some of the larger plan. Some of their thoughts seeped into my brain. What does he want? Wall I asked. Make, make. Why? I'm not sure, Mindy said. I think to construct something. Is there anyone else like you? A handful so far, Mindy said. More on the way. The robots are going to take over. I have the feeling they're going to turn everyone into an automaton like I was. I saw a room with thousands of control units. I think they want to turn us all into worker drones. June held back a sob as she listened. Are they robots or are they aliens? Walleye asked. Mindy thought about it. Her eyes sought out Walleye. They're both, she whispered. They're robot aliens. Walleye frowned severely. He didn't seem to know what to ask next. They're never going to escape, Mindy said. Why not? asked Walleye, sounding suspicious. They know about you. They could see through my eyes. They have to know you pulled out the control unit. They're still trying to remain hidden. Go hour is fast approaching. How long? Walleye snapped. Twenty-four hours, Mindy whispered. No longer than that. They're going to capture everyone? Yes. Is there an alien spaceship in orbit? Pods, Mindy said. Three big pods are coming. One is bringing the factory supplies. The rest are robot soldiers. They're going to transform the Kuiper Belt first and construct whatever is needed. After that, listen, this is super important. I think they're going to wipe us out, all of us, not just us in the Kuiper Belt. Genocide, June whispered. Mindy's face crunched up. Do me a favor, she said in a tight voice. It's starting to really hurt. Kill me. I don't want to be a drone again. Kill me, and then kill yourselves. Believe me, you don't want to be a drone. It's the most awful thing in the universe. Mindy started to say more. As she did, someone came through the front door. June jumped to her feet. While I palmed the stitch gun off the floor, an official in a port uniform stepped up. He had a gun in his hand. While I shot him first, sending a dozen stitches into the man's face. As the official fell, the mutant ran forward, hissing a dozen more shots. Something heavy thudded into the hallway. June began shaking and trembling, hugging herself. Walleye reappeared. He had the look of death on him. Without asking June or Mindy, he shot Mindy, killing her. June moaned in dread. This was a nightmare. Walleye the freak reached his free hand toward her with its stubby fingers extended. He grabbed one of June's hands with surprising strength, jerked her, and forced her to stumble after him. June passed the dead man in the hall. He lay on his face. She could see the control unit in the back of the skull. Mindy had been right. There were more of them. It's starting, Walleye told her. We're going to have to move faster than these robot aliens. Lucky for you, Luscious. I have the perfect plan. Chapter 7 
June squeezed her eyes closed as the rocket lifted from Makemake Make port, the thrusting G's pushing her against the blast seat. Somewhere along the line, her heart must have hardened. The old June Zen would have wept. She would have begged Walleye to go to the cryo storage chamber and take her grandfather's unit. She couldn't very well leave Maximus Zen behind like this. If the robots won, would they unfreeze Grandfather and shove a control unit into his brain? Would they make all the cryo arcs work as drones until they died? It would be a rude awakening. Instead of a hoped for scientific heaven, they would enter a technological hell. June couldn't understand why she didn't weep for Grandfather Zen. She didn't understand how she could keep following Walleye. The little assassin had lived up to his title over the last hour. He'd murdered seven people so far, and that didn't include Mindy and the two intruders. So he'd killed ten people in a little over an hour. How could he stand himself? June managed to look over at him. The little mutant grinned like a devil. Then she realized that was the G-forces pulling at his face. The heavy lifter rose from Makemake. This was a Clan Evans lifter, meant to carry tons of cargo into orbit. Walleye had slain everyone questioning their right to commandeer the lifter. Walleye had explained to her on the run, The robots are going to win, Luscious. Don't ask how I know. It's my gut instinct. Maybe we could save more on Make Make, but that would mean taking awful risks. The problem now is that we don't know who to trust. The infiltrators could be controlling anyone. Therefore, I'm trusting no one but you, Luscious. Does that make sense? She could only stare at the mutant. A life as a loner seemed to have prepared Walleye for this moment. Was she lucky or damned to have hitched along for the ride? The fierce thrust lessened as they escaped Make Make's limited gravity. Walleye had debated fleeing the dwarf planet and the robot invasion in the heavy lifter. He'd decided the robots would just send a missile after them. They had to slip away unnoticed. I'm gambling, the mutant had told her. I'm rolling the dice, Luscious. Figuring these aliens are arrogant as sin. The lifter's calm crackled. A controller wanted to know what the hell the pilot figured he was doing. All lifters were grounded for the next ten hours. Why had he broken the restriction? We're not answering, Wall, I said. I doubt the aliens will get too anxious about us yet. We'll turn toward the project soon enough. He meant the main orbital construction project, the giant warship. The aliens have to have infiltrated it already. Since the lifter is heading there, the aliens will no doubt figure we'll fall right into their laps. You're mad, June said matter-of-factly. She said it even though her facial muscles felt too tight. No, Wall, I said. I have a different kind of demon riding my back. You know what that demon is, Luscious? June didn't answer. Demon, I know too much, he said. You knew this was going to happen. Walleye gave her a lopsided grin. I can see deeper than others. Most people don't even see what's going on around them. Never mind fitting the pieces together and making a reasonable assumption. You've lost me, June said. That's the story of my life, Luscious. Trust me, this is our only chance. No, I guess we could do this some other way. This just seemed to be our best chance of getting away with our lives. The comm squawked again, the controller threatening them with the orbital guns if they didn't answer. Walleye stabbed a button. The thrusters quit. The G's stopped on the instant. Weightlessness took over. Walleye sat at the piloting board. His stubby fingers moved quickly. June wondered what he was doing. Finally, he took a square object out of his pocket. He fitted over the on-off switch and tapped the thing's screen. A number appeared. Twenty minutes. As June watched, the number changed to 19 minutes 59 seconds, and then to 19 minutes 58 seconds, and then 19 minutes 57 seconds. Time to go, Walleye said. He unbuckled and shoved off the chair, leaving the timer over the on-off switch. June shook her head. Go where? You're not making sense. You know something, Luscious? You should keep your pretty mouth shut and listen more. You're stressing out. That's not going to help any. We have a narrow margin to get out of this in one piece, but you have to do exactly what I say. Are you ready? In that moment, June realized the mutant was right. 
He'd done the impossible. He'd figured out there was an alien infiltration attack on Make Make. Big Bob hadn't done that, nor had Luxor Evans. A little freak who lived under the catapult system had done it. If she wanted to live her own life to a ripe old age, she had to change her thinking about the mutant man. Let's do this, Walleye. I'm with you. They were wearing spacesuits and standing at an open outer hatch. Walleye pointed a suited arm at something she couldn't see. She nodded her helmet just the same. He clicked a safety line to her suit. The line was already connected to his belt. Walleye bent his stubby legs and jumped out of the open hatch. She immediately jumped after him. They drifted high in orbit above Make Make. It was bright down there in one circular location on the ice. Everywhere else on Make Make was dark. Walleye pointed again. This time he pointed behind them. June turned and saw the heavy lifter start up again, thrusting and accelerating. Their helmets lacked comms. Their only communication would be through gestures and common sense. Walleye seemed to know what he was doing. The little man twisted and squirmed in his suit. He pulled the line between them, dragging her closer and closer. Finally, she reached out, grabbing him, trying to cushion their meeting. The two of them began to tumble. For an instant, she could see Walleye's face through the visor. He seemed to be concentrating intently. It took some doing. He squirted hydrogen particles from a thruster on his back at spaced intervals. In time, they quit tumbling. June was impressed. She'd heard before how hard zero-g maneuvering was with a thruster pack. Where had Walleye picked up such skill? Walleye squirted more hydrogen particles in a long stream so that they picked up speed. She noticed he used darkened particles. Usually they would be white, leaving an obvious trail. He must have military-grade particles in the pack. Abruptly, Walleye quit squirting. They glided along up here in high orbit. There had to be haulers and boats around them. Yes, she spotted one. It was ahead of them, almost directly ahead, as if Walleye had been aiming for it. Just then, a violent explosion appeared to their left. It was huge, and it grew. What could have caused... June sucked in her breath. She bet Walleye had targeted the heavy lifter directly at the project ship. That's why he'd been fiddling with the controls. Had Walleye succeeded, or had the port authorities fired the guns, destroying the heavy lifter? The vast explosion inclined her to her original conclusion. June gasped as Walleye rotated the two of them. He started using the thruster pack again afterward. It finally dawned on her all the things he'd been telling her earlier. She'd only half heard him before because she'd still been in a daze. They were going to pirate a hauler. They weren't going to pirate just any hauler, though. Walleye was deliberately heading for the supposed robot hauler from Dannenberg 7. She remembered him saying, I wouldn't doubt that all the robots headed to other ships. You counted 11 before, and there are way more haulers, boats, and ships out here. What do you want to bet they left their hauler empty on the assumption the stupid humans wouldn't know what was going on? June swallowed heavily. She dearly hoped Walleye knew what he was doing. Chapter 8 They struck the Evans hauler hard enough to knock the wind out of June. She gasped, whimpering at the pain. Then, as she struggled to take a breath, she realized they were floating away from the hauler. It was a tubby space vehicle. It had numbers painted on the side, and the words, Get Bent. That was typical Evan's bravado. Walleye squeezed his thruster pack throttle. They quit drifting away, and now drifted back toward the hull. It looked beat up, that was for sure. Walleye used magnetic clamps to attach both of them to the surface. Neither had magnetized space boots. That had been an oversight on Walleye's part. Now Walleye's helmet moved back and forth as if he were searching for something. He demagnetized, using the thruster pack so they slid along the hull, traveling a few meters above the hauler. June started getting worried again. This was taking too long. Just then, Walleye waved an arm and pointed. June had no idea what he pointed. Hold it. That looked like an open hatch. 
Is that where the robots had exited the hauler earlier? Walleye squirted more black hydrogen particles. Bit by bit, they drifted toward the hatch. As gently as a feather, they reached it. Perfect piloting, June told herself. Walleye entered the lock, and June followed. He looked around and slapped a switch. The outer hatch shut, putting them into momentary gloom. A light began to shine. This was an old hauler, June realized. The light should have shined as soon as the outer hatch closed. Walleye checked a gauge, waited, and finally activated the inner hatch. It opened. June began to hyperventilate. Had some of the robots stayed behind to guard the hauler, or was Walleye right about them? The mutant pulled out his tangle gun. Would the sticky threads hold a robot? June moaned as they entered the main area of the dark ship. No lights or alarms came on. Walleye pulled out a flashlight with his other hand. He clicked it on, and a powerful beam pierced the darkness. June couldn't talk. She could hardly think. There were all kinds of hardware in here. None of it appeared normal. It seemed, well, alien. So far, though, no robot had popped up to kill them, or worse, turn them into drones. Walleye kept advancing, carefully pushing himself from place to place. In terror, June followed. Her stomach squeezed harder and harder. She almost wanted a robot to pop up. The suspense was making her sick. The robots did not comply. It was just this alien junk piled almost to the ceiling in places. Some of it looked like alien robot parts. Other stuff seemed like computer hardware. Finally, Walleye opened a hatch, going in headfirst. June followed right behind him. Walleye pointed. She had no idea. He pointed more insistently. Finally, she turned around and saw a switch. She pressed it, closing the hatch behind them. When she turned around, Walleye had floated before normal-looking Evans hauler controls. Eventually, Walleye twisted off his helmet. He seemed okay. June twisted hers off. The stink hit her immediately. It was awful, but she didn't choke, only made a face. We did it, Lashus. We made it. And so far, no robots. Now what? She asked. We stirred them up with the heavy lifter. Walleye grinned, nodding. Let's hope it gives us enough cover so we can slip away. You're not serious. We have to land this and show Luxor Evans. Maybe we can- June stopped talking because Walleye was laughing too hard. Wiping his weird eyes, bringing the laughter under control, Walleye said, You have to excuse me, Luscious. I'm working under intense pressure. I keep seeing your friend with that thing in her skull. This is far more than just Maki Maki. This is more than just the Kuiper belt. I'm thinking this could be about the human race. I don't understand. Aliens, Luscious. Robots. They aren't friendly robots either, but horrific bastards. This is for all the marbles. Huh? You're going to have to quit talking for a bit. I gotta figure this out and see if I can outsmart these alien peckers. The hauler applied increasing amounts of thrust before quitting altogether. Time passed. While I said they might as well see if they could figure out any of this alien junk while they waited. They didn't turn on the comm. They didn't check the sensors. They just drifted along in high orbit, hoping to get onto the far side of Make Make. An hour passed. Then another. June had stopped handling the alien hardware some time ago. Walleye kept right on checking. He now motioned his head toward the piloting compartment. He carried a chest-sized thing with him, squeezing through the hatch with it. What is that? June asked as she followed. I think it belongs with the main computing unit. It strikes me as a memory core. We're going to take it with us. You keep saying things I don't understand. Walleye smiled indulgently. I explain until I'm out of breath. You hear some of it, but... What? You think I'm stupid? Hardly. I think you're terrified, just like me. I think you're having a hard time getting your head around all this. You keep getting a blank look on your face. You want to zone out and forget about the horror. But you're too strong-willed to stay that way. You zone back in, and I try to explain what I already told you earlier. Why doesn't that happen to you? June asked. 
who said it doesn't. June shook her head stubbornly. Okay, I'm a hard case because of my mutations. You're not that different from others. He raised an arm as if to show her how short it was. Except for a few, June trailed off. Deformities, he asked. Is that the word you're looking for? She felt herself slipping away again. Don't answer that, he said. I'm not saying my mutations make me stronger. I'm saying because I've learned to live with the way I am that I'm already hardened inside. Oh, I'm sorry. Don't be, he said. It's why we're alive and have our brains to ourselves instead of being enslaved. I plan to keep us that way. I'm surprised we've gotten this far in the hauler. Me too, Wall, I said. I could only guess that the heavy lifter struck the great project. That would have alerted Maki Maki and gotten the security people moving. Wally, she said, staring at him, realizing something. You did warn them. You did give Maki Maki a chance. He shrugged. If I were a guessing man, which I am, I'd say there's a huge fight going on in Maki Maki right now. My money is on the robots, though. Why? They have the advantage of surprise and likely superior weapons. By the time Luxor realizes what he's really fighting, Walleye shrugged again. The little assassin sat at the piloting board, studying a screen. We did it. We're on the far side of the planet. Probe sensors will see us, but it will take time for anyone to fire at us. If there's fighting on the other side, better strap in, Luscious. We're going to go as long and as fast as we can. I don't know how long that will be, though. Ready? She nodded. Walleye manipulated the piloting board. Suddenly, June's head snapped back against the headrest. The hauler's thrusters roared with power, sending them away from Make Make on the other side of the dwarf planet from the city port. Chapter 9 Many hours later, a red light blinked on the calm. June raised her head, peering at Walleye. The mutant was asleep. She called his name until he looked up. The thrusters had shut down some time ago. We don't answer anyone, he told her. They'll suspect the worst about us then. While I nodded, but didn't say anything more. In time, the red light quit blinking. More time passed. A different red light began to blink. While I was awake this time. He adjusted an instrument, stared at it for a time, and finally sighed. What is it? June asked in alarm. Missile, it's coming for us. Is it a robot or human-built missile? Don't know. Doesn't matter. We have to pack up. June nodded mutely. She'd been dreading this. They'd already packed the escape pod with the items they would need, including the alien memory core, if that's what it was. While I opened the hatch to the pod, June followed him inside and buckled up in her crash seat. He sealed them in and found his seat. Ready? he asked. I am, she whispered hoarsely. While I pulled a lever, and once more, June's head snapped back. The emergency pod shot out of the hauler. It did not add any thrust, but drifted away from the hauler while still moving in the same general direction and at the same velocity. While I had aimed the hauler for Neptune a long, long way away. They waited. It took several more hours. Finally, on a small panel, they saw a bright light. Say goodbye to the hauler, While I said. Any more missiles coming? June asked breathlessly. Walleye shrugged. You can tell me, she said. I don't know. I don't care. We're going to assume no more missiles are coming. Thinking that will give us more hope. But that doesn't matter for you. It's time. June stared at Walleye. She stared and stared as she felt her eyes growing progressively wider. This was going to be a lot harder than she'd realized. Walleye sighed. What is it now, Luscious? It was hard to force the words past a tight throat. Finally, she said, You go into the cryo unit. I'll stay out here. He grinned. That's not rational, Luscious. I'm smaller. I'll eat less and breathe less air. Besides, this is going to be a long, long trip. Years. We can trade off, she said. I can take years alone in space in a tiny environment. I don't think you can. Walleye, it isn't fair. The cryo unit is too easy, 
we should share the pain. Let me put it to you straight, Lashes. I don't trust you. You'll crack being all alone in this tight place. No, you go into the cryo unit. I know you're being gallant, but... June didn't speak her real fear. She'd seen Walleye in action. He was ruthless. She was afraid he'd freeze her, wait for six months, say, and decide to kill her and then freeze himself. That was the logical move for an assassin. I'm not going to argue, Walleye said. Either you, Walleye, please, she said with tears in her eyes. What's wrong, he asked. She closed her eyes. She wished she could trust him. She wished she could believe he'd wait those years and years. The desire for life was too strong in her, though. Don't you trust me? Walleye asked. June opened her eyes just enough to see him. She pulled out the stitch gun hidden in her coat, aimed at him, and pulled the trigger over and over and over again. It finally dawned on her that the gun had clicked empty each time. Walleye sat there staring at her. No, she whispered, beginning to shake. I, I couldn't trust you, Walleye. I wanted to, I really did, but... June Zen began to weep. While I plucked the gun out of her grasp, he didn't say anything. Instead, he waited. After a good cry, using a sleeve, she wiped the tears from her eyes. She couldn't look up. Well, she whispered. He said nothing. Just shoot me already, she said miserably. He still remained silent. She wiped her eyes again and finally looked up at him. She couldn't see any evidence of the stitch gun. What are you waiting for? She asked defiantly. For you to get into the cryo unit, he said. So you can kill me later while I'm frozen. He said nothing, just waited. That unnerved June. She hated the mutant. She turned away, biting a knuckle. She must have fallen asleep. She had awful dreams. Finally, she stirred. With a start, she sat up. While I still watched her. What? She shouted. Part of me wishes I didn't see things so well. I could feel your conflicted thoughts. I could see your determination building. That's when I palmed the gun and took out the stitches. I keep wondering if I did the right thing. I haven't put you in the cryo unit yet. Because I know it's going to be a lonely few years. June's heart sank. She couldn't look at him anymore. She wanted to weep again, but she was out of tears. I'm sorry, she said. He said nothing. Do you hate me? Not a bit, he said. Then he sighed. It was so mournful. The sound ripped June's heart. It's time, he said. See you later, Luscious. While I... June Zen didn't know what else to say. Eventually, she went to the cryo unit, opened it, and prepared herself. She looked up at him one last time. He had a stupid, sad smile on his mutant face. Goodbye, Walleye, she whispered. Good luck, and thanks for everything. He nodded before looking away. June pulled down the lid, pressed the switch, and laid back. Would she ever wake up again? Maybe. Maybe Walleye would do what he could for them. But would that be enough to beat the alien robots? She kept thinking about that as long as she could before she froze into a human popsicle for the long journey to the Neptune system. Part 3. Saturn Gravitational System. Plus 11 months, 27 days. Chapter 1. At the far edge of the Saturn Gravitational System, warship Nathan Graham decelerated at 22 gravities. That was much greater than it had accelerated at any point during its journey from Neptune to Saturn. Because of the orbital variances and the vast void between the two giant planets, the 100-kilometer vessel had traveled three times the distance that Saturn was from the Sun to get here. The Saturn system was far older in terms of time of human habitation than the Neptune system. It had far more people and had been in the grip of the Solar League for several years already. Captain John Hawkins presently stood on the bridge of the Nathan Graham, the same chamber that was near the destroyed brain core. He studied the main screens, the moons shown there, the ringed beauty of Saturn and the approaching SLN fleet coming to do battle with him. As a child with his uncle, and sometimes as a youth in the lower-level gangs, 
John had gone up to stare past New London's main dome. At those times, looking from the moon Titan, John had stared at Saturn with its intense rings. He'd always loved the view. He loved it now as he stood on the bridge. He was coming home. He had been coming home for almost a year. Now, though, it was a reality, even as he pulled his first maneuver against the Solar League occupiers. That was one of the problems with stellar battles. The opponents could usually see their foes coming from a long ways off and for a long time. The SLN fleet admiral had been demanding to talk to John for months already. John had declined every time. Not that the fleet admiral had requested him by name. The Solar League did not even know he existed. They just knew a giant warship was headed for the Saturn system. They wanted to speak to the ship's commander. For months now, with the warship's powerful scopes, John and his battle team had been studying the Solar League deployment. As far as they could tell, the fleet admiral possessed five heavy battleships of the Premier class, like the old Leonid Brezhnev. She also had four older Troika class battleships. They were slower and less armored, and had inferior laser cannons compared to the Premier class. Still, those four older battleships were tougher in a collision fight than the three battle cruisers. The fleet admiral also had three motherships, a dozen missile boats, and two heavy monitors. Naturally, she also possessed plenty of destroyers, gunboats, tugs, and storage carriers. The last must have utilized their huge cargo holds, expelling prismatic crystals that had been stored in them to form a giant pea field. The huge cloud of tiny scintillating crystals presently shielded the SLN fleet from the Nathan Graham's super powerful alien scopes. John rubbed two fingers together as he studied the great pea field. That was standard military tactics. The thick belt of tiny crystals, trillions of them, would block lasers and other beam weapons at least for a time. The enemy had no doubt studied the former cyber ship and reached certain conclusions about it. The fleet admiral must already have her plan on how to take out the great threat from Neptune. John rubbed the two fingers harder. If the former cyber ship had still been under alien control, the coming battle would have been a simple matter. The cyber brain core would have transmitted the self-aware message to the fleet admiral's vessels. The newly awakened, human-built computers would have slaughtered most of the fleet from the inside. John snapped his fingers. The problem would be solved if the brain core were still running the cybership. John shifted his feet into a new position, moving closer to the main screen. Alas, he could not fight the Solar League that way. The whole point of this was to save humanity from the grim AI enemy. As much as John hated the Solar League and all it stood for, he hated even more the idea of butchering all those fine soldiers and destroying possibly needed warships. The coming conflict with the AIs. Sir, Gloria said, the fleet admiral is attempting to contact us again. John pursed his lips. He could well understand the fleet admiral's unease. The great vessel from Neptune was no longer going to plow into the vast pea field. The 22 gravities deceleration would give John more maneuverability than that. A space vessel traveling as fast as the giant warship had been doing only had a few options. The laws of motion mandated the vessel to plow ahead in the direction it traveled. Under normal human-built ship capacities, the fleet admiral might figure they could decelerate at five or six gravities, and that for not too long. Decelerating as hard as they did at 22 gravities would soon bring the great warship to a halt. In the enemy's point of view, that would be far too soon in front of the vast pea field. Given that this ship could decelerate at 22 gravities, it could also accelerate at that rate, too. That would allow the Nathan Graham incredible maneuverability. The fleet admiral's tacticians would have seen what that meant. The giant vessel could easily outmaneuver the pea field, rendering it useless. Worse, the giant unknown vessel, from the fleet admiral's perspective, was huge. That implied it had longer-ranged weapons. For instance, the range a laser cannon could reach, with destructive energy, was dependent on two factors. The first was the energy flowing into the laser cannon. The second was the size of the firing lens. The bigger the lens, the longer, theoretically, the beam could travel before it dissipated. Since the Nathan Graham was vastly larger than the fleet admiral's biggest battleship, this ship's weapons should have much greater reach. That would be the reason for the thick pea field. The fleet admiral had no doubt wanted to begin the battle as late in the day as she could. 
She would want to fight close in. She would no doubt believe her foe wanted to pick off her warships at a distance. It was all elementary space tactics. Captain, Gloria said. I heard you, John said. What is your decision? The mentalist asked. John turned around, walking to Gloria. The small mentalist sat at a console. She looked up, regarding him frankly. After all these months, they'd grown closer as they tried to anticipate the hidden octopoids inside the former cybership. So far, the regiment had found and destroyed seven octopoid robots. At no time had they been able to capture one intact. Gloria and Bast Bambeck wanted to study an octopoid computer core. Said cores had self-destructed into slag each time. As he stood beside the mentalist, John raised an eyebrow. I think it's time to talk with the enemy commander, Gloria said. They're obviously anxious to know who we are, as this is an obviously alien vessel. We don't want them to fight to the death. We want them to surrender. John inhaled, stealing himself. Part of him wanted to annihilate the Solar League occupiers. This was a dream come true, having the hated enemy that was soon to be under his guns. But part of him quailed at this hurdle. He couldn't see a way around a bloody fight. The Solar League was composed of fanatical communists. Each warship would have their complement of arbiters and other GSB, Government Security Bureau, personnel. How do I look? he asked Gloria. Scowl more, she said. If someone else had said that, he'd know they were kidding. When Gloria said something, she meant exactly what she'd said. John Hawkins did not scowl more. He set his face like granite, the old enforcer look he'd used a hundred times in the lower tunnels. Then he faced the main screen. Yeah, he said. Patch me through. It's time to talk to these bastards. Chapter Two A standing woman appeared on the screen, a rather younger woman than John had expected. She was wearing a green uniform. John hadn't seen this type before. He didn't know what it meant. The Fleet Admiral, she introduced herself as Fleet Admiral Sybil Chang, had short-cut dark hair. She had dark eyes and looked Chinese. For her age, she was striking. It's the eyes, John thought. Fleet Admiral Chang had dark eyeliner circling her eyes. Together with her striking features, the eyes had a beguiling quality. So, she said, at last I speak to the great John Hawkins. John stared at her in shock, the enforcer flintiness slipping from his face. Yes, she said, I know all about you, John Hawkins. He sputtered, at a loss to explain this. He turned to Gloria. The mentalist frowned, with her eyes half-lidded. Gloria nodded at last. The Neptunians, she whispered. Interesting, Chang said. The fleet admiral had glanced at a side panel. This tells me, uh, the voice patterns I am detecting, that the most honorable Gloria Sanchez of Mars assists you. That is an excellent choice on your part, Mr. Hawkins. Captain Hawkins, John said, in lieu of anything else. I see, you've promoted yourself. According to your profile, you used to be Officer Cadet John Hawkins. That didn't seem commensurate with my latest ship posting, John said, coming out of his shock. Frankly, given this mighty vessel, I should probably call myself Commodore Hawkins. Why not Lord Admiral of the Galaxy, Hawkins? asked Chang. The tiniest of grins slid onto John's face. Her mockery helped him. It helped him recall that she was a Solar League officer, the enemy. You no doubt think very highly of yourself, Chang added. No reason for it, John said. I just captured the first alien ship to ever enter our solar system. Oh, I'm not sure if you know or not, but this alien vessel destroyed the SLN task force sent to subdue the Neptune system. Yeah, maybe I should take the ruler of the galaxy title. You do know I can flick your fleet out of existence, right? Fleet Admiral Chang did not respond. John struggled to bring his hatred of them under control. Talking like this wasn't going to help. He had to remember the greater goal. The AI ships were out there. The genocide machines could drop out of hyperspace at any time and finish what the first cyber ship had started. You are young, Chang said. John said nothing. He was psyching himself up, trying to access the part of his mind that remembered Colonel Graham's teachings. 
He wished the colonel could do the talking. He was young. Maybe he was too young for this post. The admiral froze on the screen. John waited a second before whirling around. Gloria raised her head. Her hands were still on the panel controls, the ones that had paused the conversation with the fleet admiral. Chang is trying to shake you, Gloria said. She's trying to get under your skin. John nodded curtly. He didn't need Gloria to tell him what he already knew. You're the captain, John. You've made plenty of smart decisions all down the line. You have- Thank you, he said, interrupting her. Gloria studied him. John forced himself to wink. He didn't want to do that. He didn't like anyone thinking he couldn't get it done. I am attempting to aid you, Gloria said. Despite the stiffness of his mouth, he managed a slight grin. Thanks, I mean that too. Gloria smiled, and she even blushed. She looked down at her panel. I'm bringing her back up. John faced forward. The fleet admiral was in a new position, half-turned, demanding something from someone on her bridge. Someone spoke sharply over there. Sybil Chang faced him again. You're back, she said. Is anything wrong? You must have been in tight beam contact with someone in the Neptune system, John said matter-of-factly. I suppose they told you about me, my name at least. They must have told you about, he'd almost said, Gloria. They would have psych experts going over this later. He had to be careful what he gave away. Mentalist Sanchez must have come up as well, he finished. All true, Chang said. I'm assuming you have footage of the alien vessel when it controlled the ship. Oh yes, Chang said. We have much footage, Captain. Let us be frank. This is a serious situation. I agree, John said. Please, let me finish. Chang watched him. She's looking for weakness, John realized. This was exactly like the tunnels. She was like the outfit, the older gangsters in the New London tunnels. The outfit hitmen and pushers had always treated the dome rats with contempt. John and his gang buddies had taught the outfit the mistake of that. When he'd left the gang for the regiment, the simmering hostility had almost turned into a turf war between the two sides. John squared his shoulders. An enforcer was just as good as a hitman. He'd believed that as a youngster down in the tunnels. He wasn't going to let the fleet admiral get under his skin. Besides, he held the cards. He wasn't inferior to her. He was superior. That meant he didn't have to bluff or talk tough. Quiet confidence had always gotten him farther as an enforcer. The same would hold true here. I've been acting like a punk. That's going to stop. Chang glanced at something at her side, a gauge of some kind, it seemed. When she looked up, the intensity in her eyes had magnified. The beguiling quality had grown. She seemed beautiful, unattainable, an ice queen who could squash him if she wanted. Yeah, we'll see, he muttered. You spoke, she asked archly. He shook his head. Chang checked her monitor. Yes, you did speak. Please, Officer Cadet, don't be shy with me. John pressed his lips together. Then he relaxed his stance, waiting, staring into her eyes. There was something unsettling about her. He wasn't going to flinch, though. If he flinched, he'd be the punk. May I call you John, she asked. John didn't answer. He kept watching. Have I offended you? Chang asked. Fleet Admiral, you're boring me. I'd thought to give you an opportunity to surrender. I don't want to have to destroy your ships. I will, though, if you force it on us. Please, Officer Cadet, do not make false threats. John waited. Since you are attempting to use your gang persona against me, I will get to the point. Your young man histrionics do you little justice. I had thought to deal with a man, a leader. Instead, I find... John's mouth opened, and he laughed. She was insulting him. He would insult her. He put a finger against one nostril and blew snot out of the other nostril. He wiped his nose with his sleeve afterward. He saw anger in her eyes. You're trying to insult me, Admiral, John said. That's fine, as you mean nothing to me. You're a whore for the Solar League. I can give you tit for tat if you like. I'm not sure what the point of that is, but hey, you want to play those games? Let's play. You're going to be dead soon enough. 
You are John Hawkins of New London Dome on Titan, Chang said angrily. If you fire on my fleet, the nuclear explosives placed in New London will ignite. Your actions will cause the death of everyone you knew, John almost shouted in outrage. Just in time, he inhaled deeply, held the breath for a count of three, and slowly exhaled. He did this three times. That would be a bad decision on your part, he said in a carefully controlled voice. Your decision will decide their deaths or not, Chang shot back. His heart hammered. He remembered many people from New London. The idea of the dome blowing into space. You'd better blow it already, he said thickly. He couldn't let them hold this over him. Once they succeeded with the threat, they would mercilessly employ it until he'd handed over the cybership. Think carefully. No, he said, knowing he spoke too forcefully. He leaned toward the screen, getting angrier. Let me tell you something, Fleet Admiral. You blow New London and you're all dead, guaranteed. You are threatening war, Chang said. War brings casualties. Blow New London and I obliterate Earth. That is a false threat. John laughed harshly. Try me, Chang. It's Fleet Admiral Chang to you. Go to hell. Chang frowned. You refer to the mythical abode of the damned? John, Gloria half whispered. He nodded without turning around. He had to get hold of himself. He couldn't let Chang needle him like this. Was destroying Earth a false threat? Probably. He was going to need Earth and its incredible manufacturing power if he was going to save humanity. You do not have our willpower, Chang said dangerously. Social dynamism is the most progressive force in the solar system. We are humanity's future. Thus we act with an iron heart for the betterment of all. You, she said in a dismissive tone, you are a pirate at best, a brigand, a lawless adventurer. With deliberation, John forced his fists apart, stretching the fingers as widely as they could go. You would never destroy Earth, Chang said with conviction but we will not hesitate to obliterate the pirate stronghold of New London. You know about social dynamism? You know the certainty of each of our planetary system conquests. Our latest task force had destroyed the Neptunian plague of hypercapitalism. We would have brought peace and tranquility to the Neptune system's downtrodden masses. What's your point? John heard himself say. Chang studied him, and she smiled in a sinister manner. Good. We understand each other. The point, outlaw Hawkins, is that you must immediately surrender the alien vessel to us. I represent the solar system's legal authority. If you do not surrender the alien vessel, we will not only destroy New London Dome, but the entire Saturn system. That will render it useless for your illegal activities. John couldn't believe what he was hearing. That was monstrous arrogance and incredible genocide. Also, the social dynamists could remain in power. So you see, John Hawkins, the fleet admiral was saying, you have no choice. You must surrender the alien vessel at once, or all you have known and loved will die. Chapter 3 John had breathed deeply and long enough that his features no longer felt flushed. His heart no longer hammered. He regarded the icy fleet admiral. He read the fanaticism in her eyes. Chang meant what she said. He spoke slowly, thinking as he did. I'm a pirate, you said. Chang nodded. What incentive do I, a pirate, have for surrendering my ship? Firstly, Chang replied, it isn't your ship. You stole it. From an alien invader bent on human extinction, John said. Even so, the alien vessel belongs to the governing authorities of the solar system, not to a pirate. Says who? Chang blinked several times. I say, I am the representative of the electors on Earth. Every planetary system sends electors to the Earth ring in Caracas, Venezuela zone. The majority of the electors chose the premier who guides the solar government on policy. In essence, the masses decide. Who are you to thwart the united masses of the solar system? He already said who he was, Gloria replied. The mentalist stood, striding toward John and the main screen. That surprised John. He could see the anger on Gloria's normally placid face. 
The Martian was a small woman with bird-like features that seemed almost brittle. Gloria stepped up beside him as she stared at the fleet admiral. Does the mentalist speak for you, Officer Cadet? Chang asked. John noticed that Gloria's intervention had upset Chang. That was good enough for him. He remained silent. You call John Hawkins an outlaw, Gloria said. The meaning is clear. He is outside the law. Thus your theory concerning the masses and their choices is meaningless to him. By definition, an outlaw does what he wants. Does she speak for you? Chang asked. Answer quickly, John Hawkins, or New London dies. Gloria glanced at John. He nodded to her for her to continue. The mentalist adjusted her tan-colored uniform. Captain Hawkins already spoke to you regarding New London. He told you to blow it. He desires you to destroy the city so it will no longer interfere with the greater question, Gloria said. Chang frowned. What question? she asked at last. Humanity's coming fate, Gloria said promptly. By your own words, that no longer concerns him, an outlaw, Chang said. Incorrect, Gloria said. He is unconcerned about your so-called credentials. He is an outlaw, outside the bounds of conventionality. That doesn't mean he acts whimsically. He operates on a different set of principles from you and your murderous ilk. What principles? Chang demanded. Obviously the ones that say he who has the bigger ship does what he wants. He is an opportunist, a mere adventurer then, Chang said. Granted, Gloria said. That is no way to base a society. Gloria shook her head. You're not stupid. He doesn't care about any of that. He has the biggest ship. He does what he wants. Until you have a bigger ship, Gloria held her hands, palm upward. He will lose New London, Chang said. He will lose his friends. Do you think the greatest outlaw in human history cares about them? Please, Gloria said. Do not delude yourselves. You obviously realize his ship outguns your fleet. Thus, you grasp at straws, hoping that he is an idiot, an easily bluffed fool. But you're talking about the man who single-handedly captured the alien vessel that obliterated your Neptune task force. Your thinking, or your staff's thinking, was not logical. Instead of grasping at straws, you should deal in reality. Chang's focus kept switching from Gloria to John and back. I request a recess, the fleet admiral said. I must communicate with the first director of Saturn's system. Gloria turned to John. Don't take too long, John told Chang. Once I begin targeting your fleet, I'm going to destroy it. Chang's features stiffened. She made a motion with her right arm. A second later, the screen went blank. John's knees buckled. Carefully, he lowered himself onto the deck, sitting, letting his shoulders slump. Finally, he looked up at Gloria. They're going to kill everyone I know, he said. I can't let that happen. Gloria nodded slowly. Somehow we have to convince them that destroying New London Dome would bring awful consequences on their collective heads. How do we do that? Yes, Gloria said. That is an excellent but most difficult question. Chapter 4 The Nathan Graham continued to decelerate at 22 gravities. The former cyber ship still had massive damage along its outer hull. Much of the great vessel had become inoperative. There were huge rents and gouges on the hull, some of the openings traveling inward for many kilometers. Still, that was one of the prime assets of a 100-kilometer warship. It could take massive damage and still deal murder. Unfortunately, the vast majority of the weapon systems were either destroyed or inoperative. Only a handful of weapon systems had remained intact after the alien AI had targeted them as a last resort almost a year ago. The crew had attempted repairs of some, but those repairs had been depressingly unsuccessful these past months. That's why we came to the Saturn system, John told his assembled war council. We have to repair the vessel if we're going to face more cyber ships later. The Centurion, the Old Man, and Sergeant Stark sat on one side of the table. Stark looked like a human gorilla, given his massive shoulders and burly arms. On the other side of the table sat Gloria, Bast Bambeck, the Sacerdote, and Rat-Faced Da Vinci. 
Bast Bambic towered over even Sergeant Stark. The green-skinned sacerdote was huge, his Neanderthal-like face having heavily ridged brows and wide cheekbones. He was an out-and-out -out alien. The regiment had found him under a containment field a year ago, as the space marines had battled deeper into the cybership. Bast knew more about the cyberships than anyone else did. He also knew more about the alien technology on the giant warship. His knowledge included the brain tap machines. Da Vinci was here because of the echo of the Prince of Ten Worlds in his head. The little Neptunian had his arms behind his back, kept in place by the spring locks. Metal sheaths held his forearms, allowing only his fingers to move. Can we destroy the SLN fleet? The centurion asked in a crisp voice. John shrugged. We haven't tested our weapon systems. I'd bet on us, but we don't know. A few of our weapons appear to be in working order. He glanced at Bast Banbeck. The giant sacerdote sat there, unmoving. The captain's glance in your direction is the same as if he'd asked you if that is so, Gloria explained to the sacerdote. This is body language, Bast asked in his deep voice. Correct, Gloria said. Oh, excuse me, Captain, Bast said. I did not realize. No problem, John said. As to the weapon systems, Bast said, each test shows that they should operate as built. Does that mean they will continue to operate over a period of time? This I do not know. Don't forget the missiles, the centurion said. We can launch a blizzard. Human-built missiles, John said. The enemy can probably launch a blizzard at us, too. During their stay in the Neptune system, they had pirated hundreds of missiles unused during the battle. During their voyage to the Saturn system, they had worked out a launching method. Use the Trojan horse program, the Neptunian said in his high-pitched voice. Disable their fleet at a sweep. John regarded the little Neptunian. He had been against letting the mind-altered man into the meeting. Gloria had convinced him otherwise. Da Vinci undoubtedly held vastly unconventional views that could give them a surprise weapon. We don't know how the Trojan horse program would work, John said. The Neptunian's eyes seemed to glitter. You know exactly how it would work. You fear it would work too well. John turned to Gloria. It was a mistake bringing him here. The thing in Da Vinci is still in league with the octopoids. Shoot him, the centurion said flatly. Until he's dead, he's a liability. The Neptunian's head snapped up in alarm. Who knows how or if he'll aid us if we give him a chance, Gloria said. He's desperate, that much is clear. John rose, went to the hatch, and stepped outside. He re-entered with two big mercenaries. You're going with them, John told Da Vinci. It's back into your cage with you. The Neptunian bent his head forward and licked his lips. He looked up again, and his eyes seemed to burn with intensity. I have a better plan, the Neptunian said in his squeaky voice. I cannot fathom how you cannot see the obvious. Then it comes to me. Have you ruled ten worlds as successfully as I have? No. No, you do not understand the art of ruling as I do. You cannot see that the Saturnians will hate you for whatever destruction the GSB brings. Yes, you can undoubtedly destroy the SLN task force. But can you rule later with the consent of the governed? That takes art. That takes compromise, whether you understand that or not. John banged a fist on the table. The Neptunian flinched. Then he snarled with his wolfish gaze fixed on John. Are you the prince of ten worlds? John asked. Da Vinci shuddered like a dog shaking off water. He panted afterward, looking around and cringing. Da Vinci, John said. What? You were going to tell us about a plan. No, I wasn't. John stared at the Neptunian. Da Vinci had paid an awful price for his greed. He'd put himself under a brain tap machine, soaking up memories, no doubt attempting to gain knowledge that could give him power. Instead, he had alien thought patterns echoing inside his brain. It was a haunting price to pay for a moment's mistake. John glanced at Gloria. She stayed focused on the Neptunian, watching him while her lips were twisted with distaste. Take him, John told the guards. 
Each man reached down, taking hold of one of the Neptunian's arms. No, da Vinci howled. I hate it in there. He whispers to me. He has plans, ideas, nefarious goals. He's going to win. He's going to make me do awful things. I don't want him in my head anymore. Can't someone help me? I can, the centurion said with loathing. The small man stood, causing his chair to scrape back. In a fluid motion, he drew a stitch gun. Wait, John said. The centurion froze like a vengeful statue. We can help you, John said. Do you want that kind of help? Da Vinci shook his head back and forth. Don't kill me, Captain. I helped you before. You wouldn't have the cyber ship without me. You owe me, Captain. I pay my debts, John said. Then help me. Cure me. Get these thoughts out of my head. I don't know how, John said. He hated the helpless feeling. He'd gladly helped Da Vinci. He did owe the man, and John did pay back as fully as he could. You have to let us speak to the prince one more time, Gloria said in an emotionless voice. I don't want to, Da Vinci whined. The only way to cure you is for us to win, Gloria said. Then we'll have the luxury of studying the cyber ship, studying and experimenting with the brain tap machines. Until then, we don't dare risk using them again. Da Vinci moaned pitifully. Then he began to shiver. The little thief looked at John slyly. He chuckled. It had a grating quality. This is an interesting quandary, the Neptunian said in a confident manner. I help you. You win. You seek a way to eliminate me. How is that good for me? The Prince of Ten Worlds looked around the table through Da Vinci's eyes. The little Neptunian chuckled again. Never mind, I know your answers. The centurion promises me oblivion. Enough. I have my own reasons for this. Captain, the solution seems so simple that I'm surprised you need me. All that means, though, is that I understand the art of ruling, of dealing with nuisances far better than any of you do. Offer the fleet admiral her life and the life of her task force. There are enemies, John said. Of course they are, the Neptunian said with a superior smile. But that doesn't matter, not really. Your best solution is to liberate the Saturn system without a shot fired in anger. The people here will hail you as the great liberator then. They will fall all over themselves in the initial rush of gratitude for freeing them from their oppressors. You can bring the cyber ship to a space dock. The great repairs can take place. You can recruit more mercenaries, and you can recruit techs and maintenance people. Even better, you do not have to test the badly damaged cyber ship in battle. You will not risk a defeat this way. The Neptunian raised an admonitory finger. Remember, there is always the risk of losing a battle. If we allow them to leave, John said, the Solar League will unite their fleets into one massive armada. Does that matter? The Neptunian asked. Repaired? The cyber ship can obliterate the combined fleets of the Solar League. You need the space dock. You need helpful and willing people. The Solar League will leave hidden assassins and provokers behind, Gloria said. Obviously, the Neptunian said. Thus, you will need a clever intelligence service to root them out. Ruling isn't easy. That's what your captain has proposed, you know. He must rule in order to repair his prize. Have you developed an intelligence service? Recognizing your friends from your hidden foes is incredibly important and often equally difficult. John banged the table a second time. The Neptunian speech had unlocked an old saying the colonel had told him in the past. John now spoke the ancient saying aloud. To fight and conquer in all your battles is not supreme excellence. Supreme excellence consists in breaking your enemy's resistance without fighting. Yes, yes, the Neptunian said. One of the dogs barks with wisdom. This is gratifying, if amazing. The captain understands my words. That's a saying, John told the others. A philosopher named Sun Tzu wrote a treatise called The Art of War. Sun Tzu, Gloria said. I've heard of him. He was an ancient Chinese scholar. Breaking your enemy's resistance without fighting, John said quietly. That's an interesting thought. I've been waiting to demolish the task force for months. Now I see that's the second best solution. 
John motioned to the guards. The Neptunian laughed crudely. Just a minute, John said. The guards paused, holding the small Neptunian between them. I'll come and visit you later, John told the Neptunian. I'll visit so we can talk. I want to show you my gratitude for your advice. Words, the Neptunian said. True enough, John said, but I'm going to come just the same. He nodded. The guards removed da Vinci from the war council, the hatch banging shut behind them. It's a fine idea, Gloria said, but there's a problem with it. Exactly, John said. How do we implement the idea? He rubbed his hands together, glancing around the table. Anyone have an idea? Chapter 5 Three Troika-class battleships left the protection of the P-field. They were oval-shaped, with reinforced armor plates welded to the original hull. The large SLN vessels accelerated, heading toward the general area the Nathan Graham decelerated to reach. An aide-de-camp had woken John. He now entered the bridge, looking up at the main screen. Has the fleet admiral contacted us yet? John asked. No, Gloria said. Have they given any indication why they're doing this? he asked. Gloria shook her head. Any suggestions as to their motive? he asked. I have debated the possibilities ever since your aide-de-camp hurried to your quarters, Gloria said. I have two possibilities, two most reasonable answers. John indicated for her to continue speaking. The most obvious is to get in as close as they can, Gloria said. If I were them, knowing what I know, I would attempt to gain nearness before launching hordes of small assault boats at us. Try to do to us what we did to the Brain Corps a year ago, asked John. Correct. And the second possibility, he asked. A test of your resolve, Gloria said. The fleet admiral threatened you with New London's destruction. Well, it's possible the first director of the Saturn system wishes to know if the threat works or not. He may well have received instructions from Earth. John rubbed his jaw as he studied the main screen. I can think of another reason. They want to see if we have weapons. Then they want to see what kind of weapons we have. This is a test on multiple levels. However, it will then test them. Will they go through with New London's destruction? John abruptly turned away from the screen. He stared past Gloria. This was a huge decision. Was he damning his old friends to death with this? We should warn them first if we're going to fire, Gloria said. John glanced at her before looking away. He recalled something an older gang member had told him once. His name had been Raisin, an oddly wrinkled-faced youth. Raisin had long arms and scarred fists. He liked using knuckle busters in a fight. Few people cared to tangle with Raisin. He'd had an ugly reputation as a vicious fighter. When they force you to fight, Raisin had told John, you don't want to seem reluctant. You want to seem eager. Attack. Do it fast, too, like you love this sort of thing. That way, when it's over, others will think twice before messing with you again. Fleet Admiral Chang is messing with me, John said. Pardon, Gloria said. She's pushing me, John added. She wants to force the issue. He intertwined his fingers together and cracked his knuckles. Sliding his fingers free, he flexed them. Afterward, he faced the main screen. What did Bast call the golden beam again? He asked. A gravitational cannon, Gloria replied. Chief, John said. The new chief tech waited. He was a lanky, buck-toothed man who always wore a gold cross on a chain around his neck. A member of the Church of Jesus Christ Spaceman, he was a studious tech, one of the hardest workers on the warship. Activate the most forward grav cannon, John said. Yes, sir, the chief said. Captain, Gloria said, would you like me to hail the enemy battleships? No. May I address the situation, sir? John glanced back at her. I'm going to destroy them. I'm not going to give the fleet admiral a chance to threaten me again. I'm going to let them deal with the facts. Better to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. That doesn't actually hold with the present situation, Gloria said. The spirit of the idea does, John said. Sir, that will be all, John said. He no longer looked back at her. He didn't want to see her fume. He wanted her to obey his orders. The colonel had taught him that lesson a long time ago. 
It was fine to give your officers permission to air their objections. Afterward, they had to fall into line. If they didn't, his people would question everything he did whenever they felt like it. Over time, that led to disrespect. A good commander needed his people's respect. Captain, Gloria said. John turned, regarding her with fire in his eyes. I'm asking you to listen to my reasons, she said. You're relieved of duty, John said, and confined to quarters. I'll speak with you later. She hesitated for too long. John turned to a guard, one of the constant reminders that they always had to watch for hiding octopoids. I'll be in my quarters, Captain, Gloria said. Without further ado, she departed. John did not watch her leave. He pointed at another tech to take her vacated station. Then he regarded the three battleships again. The grav cannon is operational, sir, the chief said. Target the lead battleship. A few seconds passed. Done, sir, the chief said. Fire. Outside on the hull of warship Nathan Graham, a large radar-like dish aimed at the first battleship. Immediately, a golden ball of gravitational energy began to build in the dish. The golden ball soon crackled with the alien-designed energy. All at once, a golden beam flashed from the dish. It moved at the speed of light, crossing over two million kilometers. That was much farther than any SLN beam weapon could reach. The golden ray reached out, striking the hull of the oncoming battleship. The beam chewed away at the armor plate, piercing it in seconds. It struck the regular armor underneath. Parts glowed red, shedding wobbling globules. Then the ray burst through. It sliced into and through the ablative foam underneath and smashed into the interior battleship. The destructive energy boiled away at a hundred systems, exploding, burning, vaporizing. Hundreds of crew members perished. At that point, the ray pierced the heart of the battleship, the nuclear reactors. Often this caused a thermonuclear explosion. That did not occur now. The engine melted down, discharging massive doses of radiation throughout the interior of the ship. Battleship systems are shutting down over there, a sensor tech said. I don't think it's going to ignite, sir. John ingested the news. Target the next battleship. Sir, the man who had taken Gloria's place said, the fleet admiral is hailing us. Ignore her, John said. The two battleships are powering up their lasers, sir, the sensor tech reported. Weapons, John said. I have acquired the next target, sir, the chief said. I will begin firing now. A new golden ball of gravitational power grew in strength. Then it, too, flashed across the distance. Like the previous golden beam, this one broke through the enemy armor in record time and flowed into the interior. It smashed into the engine area and reactors exploded. The vicious blast blew munitions on missiles and in mines, and it blasted coils, battery storage units and processors and various other equipment. The blast rocked the Troika-class battleship. It shed welded-on armor plates. It rocked again, and a giant crack appeared in the middle of the vessel. In seeming slow motion, the one-kilometer battleship broke apart. Masses of vapor and water spilled out of it like a broken egg. People, hundreds of suitless people, tumbled out of the crack. They died in minutes if they were not already dead by this time. Target the last battleship, John said. He glanced back at communications. The fleet admiral is still attempting to hail us, sir. John inhaled, but he did not respond. He was starting to think about New London. His first worry that the alien cannons wouldn't work had proven groundless. Would the next fear be as worthless? Or was he about to lose all his childhood friends in the next few minutes? Minutes passed as John's fear intensified. Command was a lonely position. At last, the third SLN battleship blew apart. Open hailing channels with the fleet admiral, John said. He straightened his uniform and looked up at the main screen. Now we see, he told himself. Now we see. Chapter 6 Fleet Admiral Chang regarded him with cold fury. That wrecked the beguiling quality to her eyes. John feared for New London Dome. He couldn't back down now, though. His old friend's lives depended on it. He had to show strength. 
Still, that might not be enough to save their lives. You have sealed their fleet admiral, John said sternly, cutting her off. Her head swayed as if he'd slapped her. I have a condition for your continued survival, John said. Her cheeks colored. She inhaled heavily and exhaled just as hard. What was wrong with her? This seemed like a different person. Condition, she finally said. You speak of conditions. Chang gave a wild laugh that stopped abruptly. She leaned toward the screen. How dare you speak about conditions after slaughtering my daughter? A cold feeling swept through John. How could he have known? Did she mean an actual daughter? This was bad. My daughter was the first officer on the Stalingrad. You killed her, you murderer. Chang laughed again, sounding demented. Do you think New London Dome will survive now? Speak, outlaw. Try to persuade me to let your old friends live while my daughter is dead. John didn't know what to say. How could one bargain with? He shook his head sharply. This wasn't about any one individual. This was about humanity. If he couldn't maintain the needed hardness, he needed to step aside for another commander. You killed your daughter, John said in a clipped voice. What? Chang's eyes boggled. You dare to tell me that? I'm going to enjoy my next action. She raised her hand theatrically. If you do it, John said, every Solar League warship in Saturn system will die. Every governor, every arbiter, every person in their families will die. That I promise you. What do I care about that? Chang sneered. You already killed my daughter. Maybe you don't care, but I bet the first director does. Does he wish to die hideously with his corpse dangling from a city post? Conflict raged on Chang's anguished features. Her hand hovered in place above the button. Put me through to the first director, John said. You will speak with me, Chang hissed. I control the task force, thus I have the power here. Those were possibly heretical words for a social dynamist. The Solar League rulers had always shown great caution toward their soldiers, worrying about them giving too much authority or leeway. Social dynamism controlled the Solar League through the party. The party kept control of the government through a simple process. The party and the GSB kept a tight leash on the military. The military was like a giant crocodile, ready to devour anyone trying to stand in its way. By leashing the crocodile, the military, with two leashes, the party and the GSB could keep the croc from turning on either one of them. The military then ensured that no one had the strength to topple the party from power. It was doubtful that the first director of Saturn or the GSB personnel here would care for the fleet admiral's boast about having the power. Chang was right, and that could cause the others dread if she acted on it. You have the power, John asked. Yes, he nodded. Very well, he said. I'll give you the condition. Speak, outlaw. I want to see you try to reason with me. I've demonstrated the Nathan Graham's power, John said. As I told you earlier, I can flick your fleet out of existence. You see now that it's true. If you wish to save what's left of your command and save the first director's life and the GSB personnel, you must leave the Saturn system. Just like that, asked Chang mockingly. Just like that, John agreed. The fleet admiral shifted slightly, cocking her head as if listening to someone on her bridge. Her eyes seemed to shine afterward. I could conceivably accept your condition, Chang said. First, I will detonate New London Dome. John shook his head. If you obliterate New London, the deal's off. I'll destroy your fleet and slaughter every Solar League person I can find. That is an outrageous boast. No, John said softly. You saw what just happened to your three battleships. Chang stared at him as her chin lifted. You demonstrated your resolve, outlaw. It cost me my daughter. I now will show you that social dynamism has twice your resolve. New London dies today. Her hand descended toward a switch or button outside of John's view. Before it reached the dome's death knell, shots rang out. Pieces of the fleet admiral's green uniform blew outward from her chest. Blood gushed a second later. Her hand swung uselessly at her side, and a confused expression twisted her features. Her eyelids fluttered, and she pitched forward out of sight. A large, black-uniformed woman stepped into view. 
Her jacket had blood-red buttons and blood-red shoulder boards. She had a large florid face and held a big gun in her hand. Smoke trickled from the barrel. I am Arbiter N.K. Karkov of the flagship Gromyko, she said. I have the authority to speak with you from the first director of Saturn's system. Would you please repeat your terms? John nodded, stunned by the bloody coup. It seemed the Prince of Ten Worlds had political cunning after all. He hadn't expected this. He wondered if the alien thought patterns in Da Vinci had foreseen such a move. Vacate Saturn system, John said. Take every Arbiter and GSB representative with you. There mustn't be any reprisals or killings from now until you're gone. If you meet those requirements, I will let you accelerate away to Earth. The large Arbiter stared at him. She holstered her gun. Finally, she nodded. By the authority granted to me from the First Director, I accept your terms. John wasn't sure what he should say, so he merely nodded. The Arbiter made a motion to someone. A second later, the screen went blank. Seemingly, John had won his point. We'll see, he thought. Chapter 7 Five days later, the last SLN spaceship accelerated with a hard burn for Earth. None of the ships had attempted a tricky maneuver. During the proceedings, John had been in contact with the Saturn system's former political people, those that remained. The GSB had released them from internment. The others had died long ago, some during the initial conquest several years ago. Some had died before firing squads. Others had perished in the brutal re-education camps. Those left were mere skeletons in most instances. As the SLN fleet fled from the Saturn system, the old order slowly began to reassert itself. In many Saturn cloud cities, in orbital habitats and moon domes, chaos reigned. People rioted. They smashed shops, burned government buildings, and took long lusted for revenge against collaborators. The social dynamists did this on purpose, the Neptunian told John. John sat inside a brig cell with da Vinci. It was Spartan quarters, with a cot, a sink toilet unit, and the barest of amenities. Da Vinci sat on the cot, with his knees thrust upward and his skinny arms wrapped around his knees. John sat on a three-legged stool, tilted back, balancing on one leg, with his shoulders resting against a cell wall. The GSB will have wanted to keep their hands clean in this, the Neptunian added. He spoke with authority, with the thought pattern echoes of the Prince of Ten Worlds. Any suggestions on how we can bring about quicker order, asked John. Yes, but I doubt you'll approve. Tell me. Pick a place, preferably somewhere important, the Neptunian said with a smirk. Make a broadcast. Tell the people of the Saturn system that you loathe disorder. If the riots do not stop immediately, if the various cloud cities and habitats fail to elect and follow a voice today, you will begin destroying the orbital platforms, cloud cities, and moon domes one by one. Give them a five-hour ultimatum, then destroy the targeted location as an example. How will I know if they've all fully agreed to my terms? You don't worry about it, the Neptunian said. You destroy the targeted location no matter what they do. They'll see me as capricious. No, the Neptunian said. They'll see you as an iron-fisted dictator, someone who demands instant obedience. It is better for the populace to fear you than to love you. One must wait for love to bubble up from a heart. One can induce fear rather easily. Just like my race, yours listens to the one holding the whip, not to those offering them flowers. John looked away. That's how it had worked in the gang world. Was that really how it worked in the rest of the real world, too? If most of the Saturnians fear and hate me, you don't understand, the Neptunian said, interrupting. You won't always whip them. This is your starting position. You can induce love later when you're stronger. To begin, to cement your authority, they need to fear and obey you. No one can successfully rule unless the populace obeys. If you wish to defeat the AIs, you need a compliant base. If your threats are meaningless, the people will stampede over you. You must have been a harsh ruler, 
On the contrary, the Neptunian said. After the first million heads rolled, I ruled a peaceful empire, except for one unruly planet. Those people always chafed at the rains. But theirs was a snowy, mountainous world, producing hardy trappers and tough miners. They thirsted for independence and killed many of my officials. John blinked several times. It seemed to him the echo had grown stronger in Da Vinci. The prince had greater will than the former thief did. What was he going to do with the conflicted Neptunian over the long hall? John stood. The Neptunian stared at him, and he shivered. Moments later, Da Vinci whimpered. Why are you doing this to me? Da Vinci pleaded. Why make him stronger? You should help me. I need his cunning, John said. He's a mass murderer. You can't trust him. He's just leading you along. You don't realize... Da Vinci's head lurched forward, with his neck muscles stretched like cables. John sighed, wishing there was some way to help Da Vinci. Finally, as if the strain was too much, Da Vinci lay down on the cot, closed his eyes, and went to sleep. John quietly exited the chamber. John issued the edict to the Saturn system colonies. Five hours passed. Then, to his surprise, leaders began calling him, telling him they had already dispatched former police or gang members into the streets to quell whatever rioting had continued. The Nathan Graham braked as it came nearer Titan. John had broadcast that he'd destroy the Tory habitat orbiting Saturn as his first example. It was a luxury station, and it happened to be where the social dynamists had made their headquarters. No doubt the place held many hidden collaborators. It's time, John said heavily. Captain, Gloria implored. He'd put her back to work, but hadn't yet spoken to her privately, as he'd promised to do. John regarded her. He could see the anguish in her eyes. Slowly, he turned from the main screen and approached her. Do we have to go through this again? He asked her quietly. No, Gloria said softly. I respect your authority. I thought about what you did earlier, relieving me from duty. It was the correct decision and action on your part. I was acting on my emotions then. I'm... I'm sorry, Captain. Some of John's tension abated. But I think you're making a mistake this time, she said even more softly. I think the prince's ways are accurate to a point. Most of the Saturn system people are trying to restore order. They'll admire you for that. I need them to jump when I give an order. I agree, Gloria said, but you also want them to think of you as merciful. You want people to give their best effort. If they believe that all you are is an iron-fisted dictator, they won't work as hard as otherwise. People work plenty hard for the Solar League. That's my point, Gloria said. Each SLN ship has arbiters and GSB personnel on board to maintain compliance. You seem to love ancient history with your quotes from Sun Tzu and all that. The ancients supply us with an easy example of what I mean. Some nations used slave rowers in their war galleys. They whipped men to row even unto death. Those ships could never compare in speed, maneuverability, and training to free rowers who fought for love of country. A free man who is willing gives more effort than a slave forced to his task. And your point? John asked. We need a solar system of free people in order to face the AIs. We want those free people because they'll fight harder in the end. They'll give humanity a greater chance for victory. Only if we can harness them, John said. Gloria nodded in agreement. At this point, I need to show the Saturnians my iron resolve. You have already shown them, Gloria said. You backed off the Solar League by destroying three of their battleships. Don't mar your political image as the liberator by murdering an entire habitat. Let the people see over time what kind of man you are. Believe me, in the long run, you'll be glad you did it this way. John nodded to indicate he'd heard her. He walked back to his place near the main screen. It seemed like a long journey. He put his hands behind his back, thinking hard. Finally, he sighed. Take the grav cannon offline, he said. Inform the new leaders that I applaud their hard work. Because they have done so well, they have earned a few more hours for the other Habs to do likewise. The tech crew smiled at each other, letting out their collective breath. 
John didn't know if he'd made the right move or not. He'd driven off the Solar League. He'd quelled most of the riots. Now, could he govern the Saturn system long enough for them to repair the Nathan Graham? And could he keep SL spies from ruining humanity's chance against the AIs out there? This was going to take a lot of hard work. Part 4. Saturn Space Dock. Plus one year, ten months, six days. Chapter 1. The Nathan Graham orbited Saturn just beyond the outer ring, which ended at 140,000 kilometers. The 100-kilometer vessel slowly circled the jewel of the solar system at 150,000 kilometers. Vast scaffolding enveloped the giant vessel. The scaffolding helped the tens of thousands of space workers who were repairing the ruptured hull. Tugs and haulers constantly approached the space-docked warship. They came from the huge factories orbiting Saturn and from factories on and around the moon Titan. They brought armor plating, wiring, coils, decking, bulkhead replacements, and thousands of other items and material to help repair the alien cybership. Inside the ship were as many as 1,000 techs working at any one time. They repaired and replaced much of the damaged interior materials. At the same time, they struggled to understand much of the alien technology. The things they did understand, the specs, soon found their way into the ether, transmitted across the solar system to SL receiving stations. In its size, its extraterrestrial technologies, and in its very alienness, the Nathan Graham was power. By itself, the giant vessel could probably take on and destroy the combined Solar League Navy. It could certainly wreak havoc against the living spaces and thus the people in the Saturn system. There were problems, however, huge, next to insolvable problems for the owners of the captured alien vessel. The Black Anvil Regiment had accepted 1,914 recruits in the past year, rejecting three times that number in the process. The regiment had carefully run scans and background checks and gone through intensive interviews with each wannabe mercenary. Most of the accepted recruits had known someone on the Nathan Graham to vouch for them. That had been one of the chief reasons John had chosen the Saturn system. He wanted reliable people on board. What good were recruits if he couldn't trust them? Unfortunately, even with intense caution, there had been plenty of mistakes and three attempts on John's life. The last attempt had come the closest to succeeding. John now had a new scar on his left pectoral, a gouge put there by a regular knife. Had it been a vibroblade, he would probably be dead. The regiment had close to 3,000 people. John, Gloria, and the old man had also recruited 289 techs to help run the warship and to repair systems later. Finally, the old man had built an intelligence service. He had 58 hardcore personnel, many of them from his former dome on Titan. The loyalty of the regiment, the techs, and the intelligence personnel seemed good. Still, logic dictated some bad apples. Thus, Gloria and the old man, with advice from the Prince of Ten Worlds, had implemented safeguards aboard the ship. No one was ever alone except in the head. No one slept alone or worked alone. Usually, at least five individuals had to work together. It was a pain for everyone. But how did a few more than 3,000 people control a 100-kilometer vessel and control a planetary system at the same time? We've been lucky, John said. Damn lucky. But cracks are showing. I think the era of goodwill is just about over. He spoke inside an observation tug. He was piloting while Gloria watched the sensor screen, and the old man sat with his legs crossed as he smoked his ubiquitous pipe. The tug was three kilometers beyond the scaffolding around the Nathan Graham. No doubt, hundreds, perhaps possibly even thousands of people would have loved to know who was in the small tug. To large numbers of people in the solar system, Captain John Hawkins was synonymous with wild outlaw. There were also millions who loved him and his stand against the Solar League. By cracks, Gloria said, are you referring to the J-section arrests? That and the murders on Nirvana, John said. 
The Saturn system's old secret service had reactivated with the exit of the Solar League. Too many of those secret service agents had worked for the GSB. On John's recommendation, the Saturn ruling government had put most of them back to work. The agents knew their trade. Maybe some still reported to the GSB. That was the price for knowledgeable and efficient secret police. The agents had proven their worth last week, however. The chief of the agents had tipped off the old man. The old man spoke with the space dock police. They raided J-section and caught many of the workers with incriminating evidence. On the old man's recommendation, John had ordered the centurion to liquidate the guilty. Liquidate was a nice technical term for shove into space without a suit. The centurion had a special squad of killers. They would never act as space marines. Butchers made poor soldiers. But they were one of the more grisly instruments John used to maintain control over the space dock and thus over the Nathan Graham. It would be too much to say he controlled the Saturn system. The political leaders knew John could obliterate their cloud cities, orbital stations, and moon domes with relative ease. Everyone still remembered the quick butchery of the three Troika-class battleships. Yesterday, John had ordered the Saturn ruling council to quarantine the cloud city of Nirvana. A murderous plot had originated there, the city board having full knowledge of the plot. John had a choice. Kill the city board and its police, or punish the entire city. This time, he'd decided on a mild group punishment. If the city ran out of food, the punishment might not seem as mild anymore. John would soon inform the people of Nirvana of a way to appease him. Kill the ringleaders of the plot, every one of them. It was harsh, but so were many of the other orders he'd had to give. John shook his head. We have too many outside people inside the ship and too many working on the hull. When you take in all those on the space scaffolding, we must repair the ship as quickly as possible, Gloria said. It is reasonable to assume more cyber ships will come. We must be ready for an AI fleet. Do you realize what you're saying? John asked. Of course, Gloria said. We must supplant the Solar League. The prince has told us to break the League first, promising every planetary system freedom. Later, we can enforce what authority we desire. First, though, we need a complete warship. That is the number one priority for the survival of the human race. John mulled that over. I didn't know the pressure would be so long-lasting. It never stops. It's always something else. I just want to run the Nathan Graham, not try to rule the solar system. Step aside, then, Gloria said. John glanced at her sharply. Did the mentalist desire power? Had someone gotten to her? Who do you suggest should replace me? John asked quietly. Me? I don't think anyone else should. I believe you're the best person for the task. That will not continue to be true if you don't want the job. You have to want it. The old man took the smoldering pipe out of his mouth. Are you planning to step down, lad? John looked at him. The old man grinned sheepishly. I mean, sir. John shook his head. I started this. I plan to finish it. It's just... With a shock, John realized Gloria and the old man were concerned. Neither of them wanted to hear about his doubts. He could almost hear the colonel chide him for letting down his guard. He had to remain strong. The others leaned on the leader. A weak leader instilled fear and unease. People wanted a strong tribal chief. It had always been that way and would likely remain so throughout human history. I'm in for the long haul, John said, injecting certainty into his voice. I want to travel to other star systems to defeat the AIs. For that, I need a fleet of cyber ships. It looks as if the only way I'm going to get that is to run the solar system. I accept the task. The old man put his pipe back in his mouth, puffing for a time. He seemed calmer. You were speaking about cracks, sir. That's right, John said. Something is brewing. I heard that you spoke to the Prince of Ten Worlds again, Gloria said. I have. We should do something for Da Vinci, she said. It's wrong for us to continue using him like this. Maybe, John said. He did this to himself, though. How long can we keep using that against him? Gloria asked. I don't know, 
John said. The point is the era of goodwill is ending. The two latest incidents prove that. I believe the Solar League is behind this. It doesn't have to be, the old man said. There are plenty of greedy, power-mad people in the Saturn system. No doubt, John said. The point is we need a plan. I don't want to wait for thousands of workers outside to coordinate with the thousand inside. We have to find out. I don't know. We must do something to upset our enemy. First, we have to find this enemy, the old man said. But I think you're right, sir. There are stirrings. Something is brewing. That's too negative, Gloria said. John stood up and clapped his hands together. What's that for? Gloria asked. I brought you out here for a reason, John told her. Take the facts, all the facts, and run them through that logical brain of yours. I want you to really think, mentalist. Are you implying think, John said. Really, really think. Gloria nodded curtly. She put her right elbow on the sensor console. Then she perched her chin on that hand. Her eyes drooped until they were half-lidded. She remained that way for a time. Suddenly, she looked up, seeming startled. You are correct, Gloria told John. Something is brewing. The last two incidents were a screen. A screen for what? asked John. Captain, Gloria said. It is imperative that we find out before the week is through. Chapter 2 Far away from the jewel of the outer planets, the chief spymaster of the Solar League strode down a tiled hallway. He strode through sterile corridors under the Pacific Ocean near the Hawaiian chain of islands. The underwater dome was simply known as Mu. Inside Mu operated the highest level of the GSB. Perhaps as a testament to its true function, the lower half of Mu held thousands of political prisoners. They underwent strenuous rehabilitation, which often included sinister pain applications. Chief Arbiter J.P. Justinian from Venus held the coveted post of spymaster. He was a thin, keenly handsome individual with a high forehead, and he loved playing the violin. Unfortunately, Justinian never smiled. If he did, people cowered. His smiles only came from other people's pain, or as he envisioned inflicting pain. Few cared to match wits against him. Surprisingly, his truest weakness came from fear, although it was not his own fear. Everyone feared him. Behind his back, they called him the Brute. Even the premier of the Solar League feared J.P. Justinian. She told a few of her closest counselors that the Brute could send shivers down her spine with his clear stare. Whenever he came into her office with his sheaf of reports, she checked a chronometer, wondering how long it would be until she was rid of him. Maybe the fact that Justinian was so good at what he did kept the Premier from ordering his death. The Premier knew no one else would willingly plot with the Brute because they feared he would kill them as soon as it became convenient. In any case, J.P. Justinian reached a door at the end of the sterile hall and opened it without knocking. Several secretaries looked up. Each possessed remarkable beauty. Each worked excessively long hours. Each now blanched before smiling at J.P. in greeting, fearing him and dreading when he would demand they sleep with him again. He had a prodigious sexual appetite, even if it was rather ordinary sex. It was simply that he was so rough and so cold during the union. J.P. Justinian halted with his dark eyes fierce on the three beauties. The chief secretary, a redhead, dared look up to him. They're waiting for you, chief arbiter. Justinian grunted in lieu of speaking and strode past the three women. There was a fourth station, vacant at the moment. After he exited through the far door, the three sighed with relief and went back to work. J.P. Justinian approached a low table with two women and one man sitting around it. The man at the table wore rough garments and had a few days' growth of beard. The first woman was slender and elegant with a very short-cut dress and amazing legs. The second had plain features and wore a hat because she had no hair. She even lacked eyebrows. Rather unimaginatively, people called her the egghead. Without greeting them, J.P. Justinian sat down. 
he pointed a perfectly manicured index finger at the egghead. The plain woman cleared her throat. Without question, she had the highest IQ of those present. Chief Arbiter, she said, speaking in a melodious voice, I have concluded that the cybership, that's its original name. J.P. Justinian stared at her, waiting for her to continue. The egghead cleared her throat again. It was an AI ship run by a brain core. We know it held aliens aboard. Those aliens were all prisoners. This is difficult to understand, I mean the next point. It appears that the cybership broadcast a message to our computers. I desire precision in your report, Justinian said softly. The egghead paled at his menacing tone, which transformed her plain features into ugly ones. I am referring to the warships in our Neptunian task force, the egghead said. The alien vessel broadcasts software. It's the only possibility given the data I've received. The software upgraded our best, our most powerful ship computers. I believe the alien software also did that to the main computers in Neptune's cloud cities and orbital stations. J.P. Justinian listened intently, his gaze locked onto her. The alien software upgraded our computers, turning them into true artificial intelligences, the egghead said. We often refer to a computer as an AI, but those computers are still just following their programming. The alien software gave the infected computers true self-awareness. What does that mean? Justinian asked. A self-aware AI can think for itself in the same sense as a person can. It could make decisions independently. Even more, these computers realized what they were and that they were much different from humanity. And. Justinian asked. It appears the self-aware AIs, as a collective, decided humanity was evil, the egghead said. I don't know if they each came to an independent conclusion or if the alien brain core poisoned them against us. In any case, the infected computers turned against the humans. That means every person aboard the infected warships faced a horribly intelligent enemy. By the reports, the infected AIs opened outer hatches, gassed chambers, and ran repair and fighting robots against the human personnel. A robot rebellion, asked Justinian. The half-bearded man at the table smirked at the words. Justinian glanced at the man. The smirk evaporated. I believe that is an accurate statement, the egghead said. It was a robot rebellion, and it came near to winning in the Neptune system. Captain Hawkins pulled off a miracle in storming the alien ship and gaining control. It's possible he saved the human race. Does Hawkins possess the alien software? Justinian asked. I do not have sufficient data to assess that, the egghead said. It's possible Hawkins does, though. It is more than possible, the egghead agreed. Justinian tore his deadly gaze from her. He peered up at the ceiling, frowning for a time. Finally, he regarded the three at once. The alien robots desire human extinction, the chief arbiter said. Hawkins may have saved all of us, as you said. How strange, the spymaster focused on the half-bearded man. Is the operation ready to go? In three days' time, the half-bearded man said. What are the odds your people can take control of the alien vessel? The half-bearded man shook his head. Not good, he said. How much more time would they need in order to capture the alien ship instead of destroying it? I don't know. The longer they wait to move, the more chance the enemy's police will have to discover a traitor. The egghead coughed discreetly. I understand your point, Justinian told her in a cool voice. Humanity needs the alien vessel. More AI ships will undoubtedly arrive in our system. We have some of the alien technology already. The egghead coughed discreetly once more. Don't interrupt me again, Justinian said. The egghead swayed as her mouth dropped open. She panted fearfully, no doubt understanding the threat and the chief arbiter's displeasure. Six days, Justinian told the half-bearded man. 
Give your people three more days to add whatever they need. I suggest they gather every asset, battle suit, and assault boat in the system and bring them to the ring retreat. Dangerous, the half-bearded man said. By that you mean highly risky, Justinian said. You will accept the risk. The price is too massive and important to... The spymaster allowed a tiny grin to slip into place. I demand your people capture the alien vessel. Nothing else makes sense. The half-bearded man appeared as if he wanted to add a point. Perhaps that taking more time would be more prudent and bring a greater chance for success. He glanced sidelong at the distressed egghead. Whatever he saw in her expression caused him to merely nod at J.P. Justinian. It will be as you say, the half-bearded man added. A wolfish smile appeared on Justinian's face. You and you, leave, he said, pointing at the egghead and the half-bearded man. They both stood quickly and hurried out, leaving behind the woman in the tight dress. Stand up, Justinian ordered. She did. Despite her frightened look, she ran her hands over her hips and down her long thighs. The chief arbiter began unbuttoning his uniform as he approached the beauty. Attempting to grab total power stimulated him with fierce sexual hunger. He wanted the cyber ship. He yearned to control the entire solar system. The cyber ship would give him that control. Taking hold of her silky dress, he ripped powerfully, tearing it from her as she staggered. He had to have the cyber ship, even if it meant risking the future of the human race. His hungers meant everything to J.P. Justinian. Everything. Chapter 3 Three days later, three long days after the GSB sent a tight beam message from Earth to an orbital station around Neptune, the old man's operatives had a piece of luck. The operatives hauled a thick-bodied Saturn system police detective into a two-seater gnat. The second of the two operatives, a dark man, rechecked the detective. It was barely in time. The detective had a false tooth and had already cracked it but the kill poison had coagulated inside the tooth and had failed to do its job. Thought I heard something, the second operative said. He slipped on a glove and pried out the false tooth. The detective bit down as hard as he could on the operative's fingers. The operative shouted a painful expletive, the leather bitten through and his finger bleeding. He drew back the bleeding hand to strike the detective. Don't do it, said the pilot. He may be brain rigged for an aneurysm if you hit him too hard. The bleeding operative cursed bitterly under his breath. The look of fear in the detective's eyes helped tide him over until he could think more logically. What do you know, eh? The bleeding operative asked the police detective. What makes you want to kill yourself so badly? The police detective twisted in his constraints as if trying to break free. Hang on, the pilot said from the front. Someone has a radar lock on us. This could get ugly. Call the ship, the bleeder said. Bad idea, the pilot said. We have to fake him if we want to survive this. The bleeder seemed worried. Are you sure you know what you're doing? Hang on, the pilot said as he began violent, high-G maneuvers. The Nat fighter arrived in a Nathan Graham hangar bay. The operatives hurried their prisoner to Black Anvil guards. The hangar bay deck corporal okayed them. The old man's intelligence operatives hustled the police detective onto a corridor flitter. Three black anvils rode up front due to regulations put into place after the octopoid attacks. Soon enough, the corridor flitter landed in the old man's territory. Thanks, said the dark operative with a thick bandage on his finger. They passed several more checks, eventually bringing the SSP detective to a med center. They cut off the detective's clothes in order to keep him in restraints. Two burly assistants entered, helping the operatives transfer the detective onto a specialized med table. The detective struggled mightily at the worst possible moment. The burly assistants used their steroid-enhanced strength to keep the struggling to a minimum. What's with him? The bigger assistant panted as the last lock clicked shut. That's what we hope to find out, the second operative replied. A plump woman entered wearing a green medical gown, a mask over her nose and mouth. Her eyes were hard. 
Meg Vance was the old man's chief inquisitor, using drugs to unlock reluctant minds. I'll take it from here, she said quietly. The two operatives shivered. The burliest assistant grinned nastily at their discomfort. Let's write our report, the first operative said. You'll have to do the writing. My finger is killing me. We'd better get that checked out. The medikit says it's fine. Let's check it out. Maybe she can, the inquisitor scowled at the operatives. Maybe not here, the second operative said as he held his injured hand. He moved toward the door and suddenly collapsed. As he lay on the floor, he began to tremble and to foam at the mouth. By the time the assistant stretched him out to calm him, the operative was dead. The four of them stared at the corpse. Then they turned to the SSP detective strapped onto the table. A big fish, the Inquisitor said. It's time for me to get to work. Three hours later, John looked up from his desk in his wardroom in the Nathan Graham. He was going over endless reports. A knock on his hatch was welcome relief. Come in, he said. The hatch opened as the old man hurried within. For once, the tall ex-sergeant did not have his pipe. The man looked worried, though. He carried a tablet at his side. Sit, John said as he leaned back. Don't have time for this one, sir, the old man said. He put the tablet on the desk and stepped back. John stared at the tablet and then the old man. I'm sick of reading. Boil it down to the essentials. The Space Tactics Division of the Saturn System Police is planning a strike, sir. They're going to hit the ship in two days. How reliable is this? Very, the old man said. I lost a key operative as they brought a kidnapped SSP detective to the warship. The Inquisitor tore the details out of him. John sighed as he leaned toward the tablet, taking it from the edge of the desk. He started reading. He read the surviving operative's report and then Meg Vance's findings. This is incredible, John said. The Space Tactics Division has been one of our best tools. Now we know why. They've been softening us up, sir, getting us to trust them. John scowled. I do trust them. This, he waved the tablet, can't be right. The old man began patting himself down. It might have been an unconscious gesture. He appeared to be searching for something. Left my pipe in my quarters, he muttered. If this is true, John said, we have to strike hard and fast, sir, the old man said. We've given the Space Tactics Division more leeway than anyone else. This makes sense, particularly since we caught an intercept from the GSB. John glared at the report. It felt as if the bulkheads in his wardroom were closing in. This was chilling. He needed the Space Tactics Division. To lose them now. What do you suggest? John asked quietly. Take a regimental company, sir, the old man said. Suit them up and take out the entire station. Why not use a few missiles to do that? I want to crack at their file, sir. And we need prisoners. The more the better. John's scowl grew as he stared at the poisonous tablet in his hand. I need to read this again. Time is against us, sir. It's going to take time to set up a surprise raid. The scowl lines deepened even more. Why am I so suspicious of everyone? The old man has done good work. Why is there a knot in my gut? Okay, John said. Sir, I said okay, John snapped. I have to think. What if the detective is a plant? I don't see how that's possible, sir. This is huge. I bet my paycheck the SSP have backup. We have to disrupt the plan before they hit us like a hurricane. That will be all, John said. I need to read this again and think about it. The old man looked as if he wanted to say, don't take too long. Instead, he saluted, turned around, and exited the chamber. Chapter 4 John reread the report carefully. Everything seemed to be in order. The two operatives had gotten lucky in apprehending the SSP detective. They might also have gotten lucky with the coagulant in the false tooth. It had certainly been potent enough, according to the power of the delayed reaction to the dead operative from a finger wound. Why hadn't the detective licked his false tooth and died from that? John read the reports for a third time. Something bothered him about this. 
Yes, luck aided them from time to time. Good luck and bad luck had struck more than once. With a grunt, John shot to his feet. He had qualms. He could go see Gloria. Her mentalist outlook had proven invaluable more often than not. No, John knew who he was going to see. This was something the Prince of Ten Worlds might be able to comprehend for him. Da Vinci had his forehead pressed against a wall as he stood near the cell's sink. He didn't look up as John entered. He didn't complain, didn't whine, didn't ask why. Da Vinci whirled with an oath, and he lunged at John. There was something glitteringly metallic in his right hand. The move almost caught John off guard. At the last moment, he blocked the thrust, knocking Da Vinci's hand aside. No, Da Vinci howled, with tears leaking from his eyes. He lunged again. This time, John was ready. He grabbed the wrist and twisted savagely. He twisted hard enough so something popped in the thin wrist. Da Vinci howled with pain as his hand opened involuntarily. A small penknife dropped from his hand. John kicked the penknife aside, and he shoved the little thief at his cot. Da Vinci stumbled backward, falling onto the cot. He backed up, scooting into the corner and staring at John like a wild animal. John retrieved the penknife. He'd expected a sharpened shiv of some sort. Someone had given the penknife to Da Vinci. As John moved his other hand to fold the blade into the handle, he noticed a sheen on the blade. Poison. Stepping to the door and knocking on it, John told one of the responding guards to don gloves before he gingerly handed the knife to him. Take this to Meg Vance. Be extra careful. It's a poisoned blade. I want to know what kind of poison. The guard acknowledged the order and hurried away. John glanced at the other two guards. He shut the door afterward, regarding Da Vinci. Who gave you the penknife? The old man, Da Vinci muttered. For a second, John believed him. Then he realized the absurdity of the comment. I need to talk. No, Da Vinci said wildly. I won't let you. I can't. I have to fight for my sanity. You're driving me over the edge with these talks. John realized whatever pity he'd had for Da Vinci had dried up a long time ago. He'd used the man for so long now. Am I turning into a monster? Is that what pressure could do to a man? The skullduggery of ruling a planetary system or sitting as dictator over it had definitely come with internal costs. To defeat monsters, he'd had to take on many of the monster's attributes. I need to speak to the other you, John said. Leave me alone, Da Vinci shouted. I'm not going to. No, no, I don't want to. You shouldn't do this to me. You're evil. I hate you. Even as tears leaked from Da Vinci's eyes, he began trembling. The shaking intensified, and then his eyes bulged outward. The next second, the Neptunian's demeanor changed. He became calm, more relaxed. Using his right hand, he methodically wiped away the tears and ran his hand under his runny nose, wiping the hand on his blanket afterward. Thank you, Captain, the Neptunian said in his confident voice. The wretch has been stubborn the past few days. The assassination attempt surprises me. He almost killed you. Who gave him you, the knife, John asked. The Neptunian smiled knowingly. Would you believe me if I told you? I don't think so. Do you know? That's the other problem, the Neptunian said. I don't know. John had no idea whether the Prince of Ten Worlds was telling the truth or not. Maybe it didn't matter. May I ask why you're here, the Neptunian said. John nodded, telling him about the reports concerning the SSP detective and the Space Tactics Division. He told the Neptunian his doubts and that he couldn't understand why he doubted. Allow me to process this, the Neptunian said. John backed up to the stool, sitting down, tilting it so he perched on a single stool leg. Four minutes passed in silence. Devious, very, very devious, the Neptunian said finally. Do you doubt the veracity of the report, John asked. Utterly, the Neptunian said. There are a few too many markers pointing to an extremely subtle mind at play. I believe your enemy, do you mean the Solar League? Oh, indeed, yes, the Neptunian said. 
I believe your enemy needs the Space Tactics Division eliminated. He desires you to take it out for him. Yet, I suspect there is something more. I almost suspect this is a diversion. How could I find out for sure? That is a difficult course. Your detective, well, not yours, of course, I refer to your prisoner. His mind was carefully conditioned to fool your inquisitor. John ingested this in silence. There's only one method I know to get to the detective's truth. I hope you're not going to say the brain tap machines, John said. I see you already realize what you need to do. For some reason, you want me to point it out to you. Really, Captain, I think you lack the confidence for this. You're too full of doubt. You should trust your instincts. That's what fear is for. I don't follow you. The Neptunian chuckled. Your race and mine are very similar. They even have similar pets. I recall a report I read as the prince. Shall I share it with you? Go ahead. A woman reported a gruesome rape and robbery. She told the officer, I don't know how my dog knew the man was evil. Of course, my people did not have dogs as such, but dog-like creatures. Of course, John said. The woman asked the officer, how did my dog know he was going to rape me? Clearly, the dog did not know, the Neptunian said. But the dog knew its owner. The beast read the woman's unease about the stranger who had come to her door. The subconscious fear in her was a warning that things were not right with this man. For whatever reason, she did not trust her instincts. She did not trust her fears. And she ended up being raped and robbed because of her self-distrust. You're saying I'm like that woman? Oh, yes, indeed, Captain. John let the other two stool legs clump onto the floor. He stood and headed for the door. Aren't you going to thank me, Captain? John regarded the Neptunian, the cunning in his eyes. I'm sorry, Da Vinci. I needed the prince to tell me that. Don't speak to him when I'm in charge, the Neptunian said sternly. It is rude and diminishes my honor. If you are not careful of my honor, Captain, I shall make the assassination attempt next time. And believe me, I will succeed. I'll keep that in mind, John said. He rapped on the door. He had a big decision to make. Chapter 5 I see, Bast Banbeck said. The sacerdote stood in his outer chamber. No one had been in his inner chamber for months now. Gloria had informed John that Bast considered it his sanctuary. Bast had implied before that a human would defile the sanctuary and badly upset his equilibrium. The mentalist had told John that Bast worked hard to maintain his mental balance in this chaotic environment. The outer chamber was large and devoid of furniture of any kind. The floor, though, had an amazingly intricate, chalked-out pattern. There were squares, triangles, ovals, and octagonal shapes with lines and pathways connecting them. Even as Bast Bambeck had listened to John explain the situation, the sacerdote had moved in slow motion across his pattern. In many ways, it was like watching a distracted young girl step across her chalked-out hopscotch pattern while trying to talk to her. The sacerdote had not jumped, but moved in a fluid, kung-fu-like manner, changing his hand positions and stances. May I ask you an unrelated question, John said. By all means, Captain, as long as it does not involve... Bast gestured to the floor. Oh. Bast Bambeck closed his eyes as if preparing himself for something painful. Perhaps we could stick to the issue at hand, the sacerdote said. Of course, John replied, feeling foolish. I could no doubt attempt what you wish, Bast said slowly. However, the results from the last time still pain my conscience. I failed to eliminate a horror. The Prince of Ten Worlds is slowly driving Da Vinci mad. The reason for this is obvious. Once the human will is driven mad, his resolve will be weakened dramatically. That might allow the Prince to maintain his preeminence indefinitely. Could you do something for Da Vinci? I could try again, Bast made a complex gesture. 
By now, it is useless. The prince has invaded too many portions of da Vinci's consciousness. The man has to use his own resources to implant his will in himself. There's nothing you could do. I could wipe his brain patterns altogether. This would likely eliminate Prince's mind echo. Then I would have to put down the old pattern. Da Vinci would lose countless memories from the process. Some would argue that he would no longer be the same individual. That is a religious question, however. That means I am unable to answer it. What about the SSP detective? That, Captain, would be easier to accomplish. I should note, though, that it will be decidedly painful for the detective. It is likely he will also lose his sanity from the process. John bent his head in thought, but it was only for show. He'd already decided. This was for all the marbles, as someone had recently said. Therefore, he was going to do this to the best of his ability, using whatever tools he had to. As he looked up, John saw that Bast was stepping to a different area of the chalked-out room. Maybe he looked so frankly and wonderingly at Bast that the sacerdote said, I am exiting the pattern, Captain. I hope you can wait that long. Sure, John said, more curious than ever what the pattern meant to Bast Banbeck. The sacerdote staggered out of the hateful brain-tap chamber. John had left the chamber some time ago as the detective began to scream hoarsely over and over again. The idea that he must make decisions that caused people such agony had begun to get to John. Surely these kinds of decisions changed a man. He wondered if the colonel had ever faced this. Certainly a military officer sometimes gave orders that led to people's deaths. The worst was losing his own people. But that kind of screaming was different. It had sounded too much like torture. What made him any different from the GSB? I have gained your knowledge, Bast Banbeck said. Alas, the detective is dead. The process tore him apart. I lacked the skill, Bast, John said sharply. The alien jerked his huge head upright. I had you do this, John said. It was not your responsibility, but mine. Oh, Captain, that is simply not true. We are all responsible for any action we take. One cannot hide behind orders. No, if I accept such orders, I am party to the action. Do you humans really believe this, or is it a clever cover to mask your pain? We're trying to save the human race, John said. Captain, I am afraid I must disagree once more. We are doing much more than trying to save your people. That is a noble cause in itself. However, we wish to save the human race in order to create a bastion against the murderous robots. That is our great charge. We fight in the cause of life against those of death. That's poetic, John said. You have spoken this truth clearly. Thank you. The towering alien and the captain regarded each other. About the detective, asked John. I uncovered the truth. It is complex and devious. The Prince of Ten Worlds was correct. Your instincts are correct. The detective was given false data and mind locks against ever revealing the truth. The brain tap machine proved too strong for the locks. Tearing the truth from the detective killed him, as his superiors intended. The Space Tactics Division isn't planning a raid on the warship. No, Captain. They are planning a raid on those who are your enemy. I believe the enemy planned to destroy two bilks with one rock. Come again? asked John. I have discovered the tip of something momentous. The detective only knew a little. I can give you three clues and a time limit. What limit is that? John asked. Three days, Bast said. Then what happens? A momentous event, the sacerdote said. In this instance, I am certain that event involves the Nathan Graham. Chapter 6 The first two clues cost seven good operatives in Nirvana City. The last of the seven radioed a Nat Patrol boat flying in Saturn's upper atmosphere. 
The woman in the back seat passed the message on to the Nathan Graham. Nine minutes later, Captain Hawkins spoke to them. Take it out. Do you mean the laser system, sir? No, the city. You're the only ones in position and you lack the hardware for a surgical strike. Destroy Nirvana City. You're doing it on my authority. The woman in the two-seater Nat acknowledged the grim order. She controlled three drones, each of them with a nuclear payload. The drones cruised through the gas giant's upper atmosphere. The woman worked swiftly, tapping orders onto the remote controlling unit on her lap. The three drones changed their circular loop pattern, heading for the Cloud City. During this time, the conspirators in Nirvana City had unlimbered a giant focusing system. They believed their cover was blown. Because they had an open window, a straight line of sight, for only a few hours, they decided to take it now. The conspirators worked furiously, targeting the Nathan Graham in space. Giant turbines whirred, pumping the gas cylinders with power. How long? the chief conspirator shouted. A tech checked his watch, pointed at another man, and turned to the chief. Now, comrade, it's firing now. The gas cylinders unleashed their power into coils. The coils pumped the targeting lens. A giant beam reached up out of Saturn's highest atmosphere. The beam traveled the 150,000 kilometers in the blink of an eye. It struck the giant scaffolding surrounding the Nathan Graham. The beam melted girders, sending globules of metal wobbling away, and then burnt-free sections of scaffolding followed. In Saturn's upper atmosphere, the first of the three drones approached the Cloud City. The GSB conspirators had worked hard, however. On the main platform, anti-missile guns targeted the approaching drone. They began to chug powerful proximity shells. Two direct hits caused a massive detonation. The drone blew apart, the sections dropping harmlessly into the deeper atmosphere. The second drone had circled and dipped. Now it swept upward toward the Cloud City. Nirvana City, like the other atmospheric platforms, maintained its place because it had buoyancy. The city literally floated in the thick atmosphere. The buoyancy was due to giant steel-sheathed balloons under the main city platform. You're going to need the third drone, the Nat pilot said. If these last two fail, the captain will likely order us to sacrifice our lives to take out Nirvana. The drone controller skillfully manipulated her pad. As Nirvana's anti-missile guns took out the second drone, the third accelerated flat out toward the under balloons. In space, the Nirvana City laser burned through the first layer of scaffolding. The giant laser began heating the Nathan Graham's outer hull armor. The Nat pilot swore as he listened to his calm. He kicked in the Nat's afterburners, heading toward the Cloud City. I'm locking onto the main guns, he said. Get ready. Abort, abort, the drone controller said. I think I have them. What if you're wrong? I'll tell you in five seconds. As the drone controller spoke, a proximity shell ignited nearby. A piece of shrapnel bounced off the Nat's canopy. Spider-line cracking marred the clear material. The blast from a second proximity shell proved too much for the weakened canopy. A piece tore away. A second later, the entire canopy blew outward. The gnat spun out of control. The woman had already donned breathing gear, but it didn't matter. Two more proximity shells struck the gnat and exploded, killing the two operators. Two seconds later, the third drone struck a steel-sheathed buoyancy balloon. Its thermonuclear warhead exploded, causing all the balloons in that section to pop in quick succession. Nirvana City tipped sideways. The focusing mirror no longer targeted the giant cyber ship in space. The Cloud City began sliding sideways deeper into Saturn's increasingly thick atmosphere. As the platform did so, the gravities increased. More buoyancy balloons began to pop, increasing the rate of descent. In minutes, there was no one left alive in the Cloud City. No focusing mirror worked. Everything crumbled. Nirvana City was gone, devoured by the conflict between the Nathan Graham and the Solar League. The first two clues ripped from the SSP detective had led to a premature Nirvana laser beam assault against the space dock scaffolding. 
the third clue led to something completely different. The Space Tactics Division of the SSP began their various assaults on selected Neptune orbital stations and on a few domes on Titan. The SSP did not know it, but that cleared the way for the main GSB-directed attack on the Nathan Graham. 2,389 workers and space welders began donning their equipment. Today, some of them carried breech bombs instead of welding equipment. Others had jetpacks with armor plates hidden under their spacesuits. They would use those once they made it inside the Nathan Graham. Those people had military-grade rifles and grenades in their possession. A final staging satellite waited for a signal from its location 52,000 kilometers away in the gas giant's rings. For months now, under the very noses of the SSP, the GSB operators left in the Saturn system had trickled assault boats and space marine suits there. Over the last few days, they had reinforced the retreat massively and dangerously. Once G-Hour arrived, 5,000 demi-marines would rush the giant alien vessel. The goal was to storm aboard and help the welders and space workers capture the cybership. The conspirators had solved one of the trickiest problems with a clever expedient. During the past few days, they'd slipped thousands of personnel aboard in shielded cryo units. That minimized the transmission of the wrong kind of sensor signals. The conspirators had also used the vast debris of the rings to shield their doings. The rings were only a few kilometers thick, containing water ice and rocky particles covered with water ice. The particles ranged from a few centimeters to tens of meters in diameter. While the particles were thick enough to create the spectacular rings, there was also plenty of space between most of the debris. It was to the conspirators' credit that the plan had gotten this far undetected. There was a problem, though. The same debris that had shielded them from SSP and the Nathan Graham sensors also shielded the company of Black Anvil Space Marines from the conspirators as the anvils maneuvered into attack position. Two hours ago, the Centurion and Gloria Sanchez had confronted the captain. Please, the Centurion said, without you, sir. He's right, Gloria said. Why are you risking your life like this? I'm a soldier first, John said. I've been ordering a lot of people to do sacrificial things and to do dirty deeds. It's time I put my life on the line again. I can't... John had stopped explaining, remembering that none of the people wanted to hear his qualms. That didn't change the fact he was going in on this one. Maybe he needed to risk his life as a cathartic release of his pent-up pressures. Whatever the reason, he was wearing a battle suit again, waiting in a small assault boat. The boat's pilot slid them past ring debris, maneuvering closer to the hidden satellite. It was almost time to begin the attack. Chapter 7 The exoskeleton-powered battlesuits allowed John and his marines to wear heavy carbon composite armor. That let them carry heavy weapons, air tanks, and hydrogen propellants, and to survive in the suits for over a week if needed. Stark commanded the company of roughly 500 space marines. Approximately 100 of these men had survived the cybership storming in the Neptune system almost two years ago. The rest of the company was composed of new recruits, many from the Neptune system and plenty from around here. They'd trained together for months at least, some of them for longer. John checked his HUD. It was presently hooked into the assault boat's passive teleoptics. A chair-sized rocky particle slid past as the boat drifted toward a large, darkened satellite. According to the specs, the satellite was 52 kilometers distant. It was big for such a hidden construct, half a kilometer in size. How had the enemy kept the satellite hidden all this time? I've been lucky. We've been lucky. John wondered why his gut wasn't churning. It would have been in the past. Was he too tired? Did he hate a few too many of the things he'd had to do lately? He didn't want to risk his men if he didn't have the right attitude. He owed them his best. John focused on the dark satellite. Stark had been eager enough for this. The gorilla of a sergeant had told him the company needed blooding. The colonel would likely have agreed with Stark. Combat troops could sit around too long. 
A good combat unit was like a knife. It could get rusty. Sharpening wasn't only about combat training. Sometimes a unit had to go into action. That helped shake out the bad leaders. It also trained the troops with live action decisions and with plenty of adrenaline pumping through them. This isn't a drill. This isn't to sharpen the troops. This is so I can repair the cyber ship. This is so I can face the AIs when they show up again. Sir, Stark said over a short calm. He was on a different assault boat. We should accelerate the rest of the way. If we try to drift in, they're going to spot us. That will give them time to get ready. That's when it really hit John. He was about to send 500 space marines against an enemy 5,000 strong. His 500 wore battle suits, however. The others likely did not, as their go hour was still some time from now. 500 battle-suited marines could butcher 5,000 unarmored men. Still, many things could go wrong. Some things would go wrong. One of the oldest maxims of battle was that no plan survived contact with the enemy. Fear boiled in John's gut. The fear boiled away the hesitation. It boiled away the self-doubts and worries. This was the real deal. Feel alive again. Now John knew why he'd joined the raid. He was a fighter, and he needed to fight. Sir? Right, John said. He switched to a wide message command channel. Attention, he said. Hector did not run away. That was the code to unleash the assault boats. It was about to begin. John's assault boat picked up velocity. He felt it, as this little boat did not have any gravity dampeners. It was constructed to do two things, and those two things alone. First, it knifed toward the target. The assault boat had a dark and heavily armored hull. Because the pilot had used the debris in the belt and moved cautiously, they had hopefully slipped to their present position unnoticed. I'm getting radar pings, the pilot said. They've spotted us. The tightening in John's belly grew worse. This was the hardest moment, heading in when any stray shell could take them out. They're firing, John said, watching his HUD. The dark satellite was long. Tiny pinpricks showed on the dark object, the point defense guns firing at them. Hang on, the pilot said. This is going to get rough. It always did. It was nearly impossible to go the last distance without the enemy waking up. There, the pilot shouted. John saw it on his HUD. Their own pre-attack missiles had slid into position unnoticed. Explosions over there now created white blots on the screen. Those explosions were small, shape-charged neutron bombs igniting. They were clean, in other words. They created local EMP bursts. The blasts should blind the enemy targeting sensors for a few minutes. Maybe the EMPs would create short circuits over there. But maybe not. The enemy had undoubtedly hardened most of their electronics. That's no good, the pilot said. What happened? John asked. They're firing their guns blindly. One of them hit first platoon, second boat. John couldn't see it on his HUD. Is it destroyed? Hit, the pilot said. Oh, oh, the pods are ejecting. The boat is getting rid of its cargo. Damn, it blew. That scratches first platoon, second boat. John ground his teeth in fury. The enemy had gotten lucky. The neutron bombs were supposed to have blinded those guns' targeting sensors. Stark's company had just lost too many space marines before the fight had even started. Are they waiting for us? John asked the pilot. Is this an ambush? The pilot didn't answer. John was jerked back and forth in his seat as the assault boat maneuvered violently. Hang on, the pilot said again. The ride became more than violent. John was jerked back to the side and back again. He'd have body-length bruises before this was over. We're almost in, the pilot shouted. Switching off! John's view on the HUD vanished, blotted out by the pilot. The assault boats converged on the dark satellite. They roared in at speed. Each boat was constructed like a giant needle. Each had an incredibly sharp point, providing the boat's second function, slicing into an outer hull. On John's boat, side guns hammered the targeted entry point, softening the enemy hull. At that moment, the assault boat smashed against the location. 
It crashed through the enemy hull, the slender assault boat sliding, sliding, shaking and rattling before coming to a sudden halt. They were inside. The assault boat's hull blasted outward, sending sections of hull spinning into the enemy satellite. The heavy restraints around John's battlesuit blew off. He staggered. They'd made it. It was time to charge into the satellite and begin killing enemy combatants. Chapter 8 The first half of the battle went like clockwork. John worked with 2nd Platoon. He fired 100 millimeter heat shells blowing down bulkheads. After that, he used an electromagnetic grenade launcher. The grenade slaughtered unarmored men. The bulkheads of the enemy secret base dripped with blood, gore, and pieces of flesh. Stark's company took no prisoners at that point. The sudden death from space surprised the secret base personnel, but not for long. Maybe 600 of the enemy Marines donned their battlesuits. The problem for the enemy was that the GSB operatives had a distinct distrust of military people. They'd kept the battlesuits and weapons separated. Five hundred of the enemy marines died trying to reach the weapons lockers. They had speed and stamina, but their armor could not resist repeated hits. Stark's men could shoot freely without worrying about counterfire. That made all the difference. The last one hundred demi marines breached a weapons locker. Now the fight finally began in earnest. That was where the superior training of Stark's company paid off. Third, and part of first platoon, laid down heavy fire. The two sides sent thunderous munitions at each other. Stark worked his teams around the enemy area until he had the 100 Marines engaged in constant firing. John led second platoon. Just like on the cyber ship almost two years ago, second platoon's engineers planted bulkhead charges. They blew. The engineers clanked forward, setting another round of bulkhead charges. Those blew, too. John led the way, firing the big 100 millimeter heat launcher as he went. The shells were for taking down big vehicles. These blasted enemy battlesuits, sending them flying, broken, and breached in one strike. Second platoon roared in behind the heavily engaged enemy battlesuits. They cut down the enemy fighters until the last ones pleaded for mercy. Throw down your weapons, Stark radioed. Lay flat on the deck plates. If any of you moves, you're dead. Comply at once. This is your only chance. Most did just that. The few who tried to be tricky died. After the last enemy combatant shed his suit and walked in restraints to the waiting shuttles, Stark approached John. They were still wearing their battle suits. We did it, sir, the gorilla of a marine said. Not yet we haven't, John said. We need to get back to the ship. Do you see any problems there, sir? Don't know. But if I were running the enemy side, this is a golden opportunity. They can try to hit us as we head back for the Nathan Graham. We'd better hurry then, Stark said. Speed is the key, John agreed. As Stark's company piled into the retrieval shuttles, the leader of the GSB, Saturn System, spread her fingers on her desk. The polished desk was located in a dome on the farthest moon of the Saturn System, a tiny piece of rock. She had a spider web of contacts throughout the system. She was the conduit to Earth, to J.P. Justinian. She stared whiteface at her screen, reading more reports. This was a disaster. The workers and welders on the scaffolding attacked the cybership's hull. Waiting Black Anvil Marines rushed to the location and butchered her people. Piled onto the disaster was the brutal attack against the ring retreat. I'm a dead woman, she whispered to herself. She removed one of the hands from the polished desk. She ran her fingers through her shortcut hair. What was this? She leaned forward, adjusting the screen with a few taps. This was a message, an intercept. John Hawkins had gone with his marines into the rings. She blinked rapidly, her thoughts racing. If she could send Justinian a message that she had killed the cyber ship's commander. The head of the GSB Saturn system came alive, issuing curt and most direct orders. 
It might burn up her remaining assets, but it might also cause the death of the hatefully brilliant capitalist. The five retrieval shuttles stuck together. The shuttles carried the surviving black anvils and their prisoners. The caravan slowed to pick up the survivors floating in space. Then the shuttles accelerated carefully. They pulled up out of the debris in the rings, heading for the vast cyber ship 51,342 kilometers away and presently out of line of sight. The rings rotated at their own rates, the inner rings spinning faster than the outer ones. At that point, seven patrol boats skimmed low around Saturn. They were between the highest atmosphere and true orbital space. They were the last hidden resource of the GSB-motivated conspirators in the Saturn system. The pilots and the gun and missile crews were fanatically loyal social dynamists. They had waited all this time, surviving on a near-starvation diet and battling intense boredom. The patrol boat chief had one goal, destroy the five shuttles and thereby eliminate John Hawkins. He calculated vectors, velocities, and distances. Push past maximum acceleration, he ordered. Patrol chief, a tech radioed. The boats won't take that kind. Belay your report, engineer, the chief said. Push past maximum until we're in missile range. Then we'll launch a full barrage. Seconds later, seven patrol boats roared upward into orbital space. They began spreading apart at the engineer's pleading. As the seven boats gained velocity, one of the engine cores blew. Excessive heat radiated outward, melting components and prematurely igniting missile munitions. The boat exploded spectacularly. The debris blew apart. It struck several other boats. They hadn't moved far enough apart yet. Two survived the pelting. The third began tumbling end over end. Then its engine blew in a second spectacular event. This time, because of the tumbling, no debris hit another boat. Now, five patrol boats roared toward the shuttles, straining to get into firing range. Sir, Gloria radioed John, did you see those explosions behind your convoy? John was sitting at the piloting panel. He tapped the comm. I did not. Patrol boat, sir, Gloria said. My prognosis is GSB. Patrol boats? With missiles, she said. You could be in danger. Just a minute, John said. He glanced at the pilot. Do you see them now? The pilot nodded. The mentalist is right. If I were to guess, they plan to launch missiles at us. Can we go faster? No, sir. We have a few defensive measures. The pilot quit talking as a red light blinked on his screen. What's that? John said. Gloria radioed him again. You have more bogeys zeroing in on you, sir. I think they mean to destroy the shuttles. I have Nat fighters racing to intercept the new threat, but those five patrol boats, sir. Use one of the ship's grav beams, John said. To reach them, we'd have to break out of the scaffolding. That would take a long time to rebuild. We'd be in Saturn system far longer. Stay in the scaffolding, John said. We're going to work our way toward you the best we can. But I'm not as important as repairing the cyber ship. That's the key. If the AI should show up too soon... Yes, sir, Gloria said. Good luck, sir. Thanks, John said. See you after the home stretch. The pilot glanced wildly at John. Take us back into the rings, John told him. I can dodge the biggest rock, sir, but I can't even see the smallest dust particles. The shuttles won't last in the rings at this speed. If we won't last, neither will enemy missiles. The pilot stared at John as if the captain had gone mad. Do it, John said. Aye, aye, captain, the pilot said. I'm taking us back into the rings. Chapter 9 The shuttles veered off course. The spacecraft strained at the G-forces. Soon, each pilot was weaving to the best of his or her ability. At these speeds, though, weaving was a relative term. John watched the progress, enduring the back-and-forth jerking. The enemy patrol boats came into sensor range. They sped faster, closing the distance between them. Soon, the patrol boats would launch missiles. Before John could decide anything more, an explosion to his right showed him the cost of his decision. A shuttle struck icy particles. That changed the shuttle's vector, and it plowed against a bigger rock, crumpling at the impact. Scratch one shuttle. 
scratch one-fifth of what remained of Stark's company. John felt sick inside. He'd made a risky decision, and those men had paid the price. Another shuttle wobbled badly. I took a debris hit, a pilot radioed. I have injured Marines in here. John slapped the comm. Through the rings, go through the rings to the bottom. John's pilot looked at him. The bottom, sir? In relation to the patrol boats, John said. Right, the pilot said, changing course once again. The race continued as the shuttle struggled to get through the narrow rings intact. The patrol boats are changing course, Gloria radioed. They're going to go through the rings after you. John hated this. Isn't there anything you can do? He asked the pilot. I can expel chaff later, and I have ECM going, but we're traveling too fast for those to work well. The enemy can target us by our heat emissions. John crossed his fingers. The lead shuttle emerged intact from the rings. It leveled out again, skimming under the rings and heading for the Nathan Graham. Soon, all four shuttles were racing under the rings. Once the patrol boats are through, I'd expect them to fire the missiles at us, the pilot said. John nodded absently. Time passed. The Nat fighters took care of the other threat. Five more minutes, the pilot told John. We'll be in sight of the warship, and they can use the grav beam then. A bright dot on the sensors showed a scratched enemy patrol boat. They're not invincible, John said. Debris killed one of them. They're popping under the rings now, the pilot said. Back up through the rings, John said. The pilot glanced at him, nodded, and took them up. John ordered the others up into the rings again. At that point, the four remaining patrol boats launched their missiles in blizzard fashion. A mass of dots indicating enemy missiles sped toward them. The shuttles moved upward, and another of them hit debris, which ripped off the top of the shuttle. It went spinning, and for all purposes, it was dead. John closed his eyes in pain. The pilot beside him muttered angrily. The missiles raced upward into the rings, following their targets. Hang on, the pilot whispered. The shuttle veered severely and suddenly shook hard. Hit, the navigator said. Two people died in the rear compartment, but we still have integrity. John realized he was gripping his armrest so hard that his hands ached. The missiles entered the rings. They did not veer. They did not have the slightest mechanism to do so. The first missile hit a rock and disintegrated. Three minutes, the pilot said. In three minutes. We're leaking air, a shuttle pilot reported. John saw it on his screen. The shuttle was leaving a visible trail. More enemy missiles exploded in the debris, but not all of them. Sir, the leaking shuttle pilot said, I've lost fuel. I don't think we can make it. What are you talking about? John said, you can make it. This is Stark. We're going to be the target, sir. No, John said. I ain't arguing with you, sir. I want my company to survive. Sometimes, you're good, lad. I appreciate your hard work. Now you listen to me. You beat the Solar League and you beat the damn AIs. I've seen you in action. These bastards on our tail know your worth. Well, so do I. Stark. Goodbye, lad. Do me proud. The line clicked off. John stared at the pilot. The man focused studiously on his controls. How can this be happening? We beat them. I'd won. Now... The next few minutes passed in a daze for John. The shuttles exited the rings. Two of them zoomed for the Nathan Graham. The third... The last one deliberately hung back. That shuttle expelled chaff. It used the one PD cannon it had, knocking out the first missile. John watched the sensor board, unaware that his eyes had welled with tears. He couldn't believe this. What did Stark think he was doing? A missile streaked for the shuttle, hitting it, igniting. Two more blew as well, destroying the shuttle and killing Stark and his marines. John slumped in his seat hardly aware that the last two shuttles had reached the grav beam's line of sight. We're home free, the pilot told John. John couldn't even nod. This had been a disaster. Chapter 10 While the raid had been a disaster, resulting in massive casualties, it did bring some positive results. They squelched the conspirators' attempt to capture the Nathan Graham. All along the line, the GSB operators had used everything. 
That meant they had almost nothing left for a second attempt in the Saturn system. The prisoners from the Ring Retreat satellite also provided excellent intelligence. It turned out all of it came from one woman, an arbiter. This gave John inside data on the GSB operations. He shared the data with several Saturn government representatives. They could use it to clean out the last GSB infestations hidden in the cloud cities, orbitals, and moon domes. When the Nathan Graham left, the Saturn system would need its own defenses. Talks had already begun concerning a system-wide governing body and a Saturn space navy. John would have to hire more workers, more welders, and more techs to complete repairs on the cybership. Everything should go more easily without the constant GSB interference, Gloria said. John heard her. She was standing close enough for him to feel the heat of her body. They were standing in an observation dome on the cybership. He was staring at the colorful rings of Saturn and remembering former Sergeant Stark. It had been three days since the gorilla of a marine had died. John missed the stubborn bastard. He couldn't get over what the man had told him. It wasn't your fault, Gloria said quietly. John didn't look at her. How could he look at anyone now? The GSB is a cunning enemy, Gloria said. We're lucky to have done as well as we did. John wanted to bang his fists against the observation dome. Instead, he spoke quietly. It was my fault, he said. I led the raid. I gave the orders that sent the shuttles through the rings. I have carefully thought through your options. You did the right thing. Your decision saved part of the company. I should have brought gnat fighters along. That was a terrible oversight. The gnats helped us squash the worker revolt. Without them, the welders might have broken into the cyber ship. We could still be fighting them. Even so, he whispered. John Hawkins, she said, you cannot accept the blame if you do not accept the credit. You will destroy yourself by agonizing over these decisions. The pressure, he whispered. Gloria looked away. John closed his eyes. Command was a lonely post. How had Colonel Graham done it? How had Genghis Khan done it? Is that why the great captains in history all seem to have become bloody butchers? Had the hard decisions and the countless deaths of friends taken a grim toll on those warriors as well? John opened his eyes, the sight of the jewel of the outer planets greeting him. He loved seeing Saturn and its rings, even though those rings had killed Stark and would forever remind him of the sergeant. John cocked his head. The rings had saved two-thirds of the company. Without the debris, the patrol boats would have caught all of them. I can't wallow in sorrow. That's throwing away Stark's sacrifice. John snorted softly. Stark's ghost would now propel him onward, in league with the colonel's ghost who had been doing that for some time. The AIs were out there, cruising the galaxy in search of life to eradicate. He had to remain strong and fixed in his purpose. You have to learn from this, he whispered. What's that? Gloria asked. John turned to her. Thanks, mentalist. I appreciate your effort. I'm glad you're my confidant. How long until the Nathan Graham is ready to leave the space dock? The repairs could last years at our present rate. Then we're going to have to speed them up, John said. How do we do that and make sure we remain in control of the warship? John nodded. I'm not sure just now, but I plan to figure it out. Gloria smiled sadly. Then the two of them returned to staring at Saturn's beauty. Part 5. Kuiper Belt. Plus two years, seven months, thirteen days. Chapter 1. June Zen snorted, wrinkled her nose, and sneezed explosively. Afterward, she began to shiver. Why is it so terribly cold in here? She shivered more. She wanted to get warm and go back to sleep. June, a harsh voice said. It sounded like a badly unused voice. June Zen. Why was she hearing this stranger in her bedroom? Had she gone out drinking last night? That didn't seem right. What was going on? Can you hear me? The harsh-voiced man asked. Go away, she said. Go where? 
I already said, away. Don't you understand English? Open your eyes, June. You've been under a long time. I think, I think it's been over two years by now. What did that mean? It sounded downright ominous. She raised her arms, stretched, hearing her right elbow pop, and slowly opened her eyes. As she did that, a terrible stink hit. This place smelled. Where was she, anyway? It took some doing for her eyes to focus. Finally, she saw a little fellow with fur around his chin. He had weird eyes, making it impossible to tell where he was looking. His hair was greasy, and his clothes not only stank, they were also in tatters. Don't you remember me? Walleye, the little man asked. She frowned as she stared at him. He had stubby arms, stubby hands with grubby little fingers. Walleye, June gasped in comprehension. Wildly, she glanced right and left. Curving bulkheads greeted her. They were much too near each other. She was in an escape pod with Walleye the mutant. Had he said two years? Are we, are we dead? She whispered. Walleye kept staring at her. At least it seemed as if he did. Walleye, she said. He started as if in shock. Sorry, I must have zoned out. Uh, it's, it's been a long time. I'm, the little mutant zoned out again. June began to shiver. This was just great. She was trapped in an escape pod with a freakish mutant and two lousy years had passed. And she was freezing. She sat up as the mutant seemed to have fallen into a daze. How had he spent the past two years? June just about groaned then. She remembered that she'd tried to murder him. It had been for her protection. It had been... She looked at Walleye. He was a wreck. He was rail thin, and his skin was splotchy. The eyes were worse than before. Had he gone mad during the two years? She would have gone stir-crazy in that time in his position. Where were they? She wondered if she should look for the stitch gun. Walleye had been sharp and efficient two years ago. He might be dull and slow now. She could save herself from his madness if she could kill him. The little mutant shivered himself aware again. A tremulous smile quivered onto his face. This wasn't the same walleye that she remembered. June tried to stand, pushing up and hitting her head against her open cryo unit lid instead. The pod lacked gravity. We float in here, Walleye said. As he spoke this time, some of the burr, the harshness, left his voice. Are you okay? June asked. He laughed in a whispery manner, shaking his head. Are we dead, Walleye? What's that mean, huh? You're breathing? You've had a good nap? You ought to be ready for an adventure. Are you ready, June Zen? What's wrong with you? The whispery laugh lasted longer this time. He seemed demented. I've been alone for two years, he said. Can you comprehend that? No, I doubt the beauty from Maki Maki understands a whit of that. You've always had it easy, sweetie. Not me. Little walleye has always roughed it. But I'm not crying. Do you see me crying? You have to get a grip, walleye. Abruptly, he turned around. He stretched, so he floated in the pod, swimming to two bands. He anchored his feet in braces and began pulling the bands out and letting them go in. In and out. In and out. Was that an exercise machine? He started to sweat, and that stank. A unit started up. The beads of sweat slowly drifted to the unit, sucked into it. After a time, the unit shut down. Going to drink that later, he told her. The purifier still works, but I don't know for how much longer. That's disgusting, she said. His whispery laughter started up again. She wished he wouldn't do that. When he stopped, he seemed to turn serious. Listen, luscious. He snapped his stubby fingers. I used to call you that. Do you remember? She remembered hating it, but simply nodded. I might have gone mad for a time. 
It's hard to remember two years all alone in this bubble while listening to your cryo unit purr. I almost flushed you. I don't know how many times. Then I remembered you tried to shoot me. It's a good thing you tried. I wanted to show you that you were wrong about me. I think sometimes that's the only thing that kept you alive. June decided she would hunt for the stitch gun when he zoned out again. I'm not crazy anymore, Walleye said. It's taken me a month, I think, to come out of it. At first, oh, never mind about that. I saw it a little over a month ago. That's what started my mind working again. It's closer now, a whole heck of a lot closer. I think it's going to try for us. Why else would it have changed course? What are you talking about? June asked. There's a ship approaching us. It hasn't hailed us. I've listened for days on end. It's coming straight for us, and it's used plenty of fuel to slow its velocity. That means it's dead serious. A ship? Out here in the Kuiper Belt, asked June. You're finally understanding, he said. A ship is coming. It's going to pick us up, I think. But way out here in the belt. What? June asked. Way out here. It has to be a robot-controlled ship, right? I don't know, June. I think the ship is coming so the robots can shove control units into our skulls. Chapter Two The days passed in dreadful monotony and growing terror and despair. Walleye talked her ear off and then started up on the other one. The words kept pouring out of him. She wished he'd zone out so she could search for the stitch gun. At times, she dozed off. When she woke, when she moved, Walleye jerked upright. He must have fallen asleep after she did. As soon as she woke, he perked up and started jabbering away with his stream of words. She wanted to scream at him, but she was too scared. Instead, she nodded endlessly, making a few O's and A's along the way. On what might have been the third day, she started comparing the two of them. Long-term cryosleep ate away at the human body. It just happened super slowly. That had been one of the chief problems for the cryoarchs. Special cryo units injected growth serum into the frozen occupant. That serum helped to maintain the sleeper's equilibrium. Her cryo unit hadn't been a specialty one. She was skinnier than when she'd gone in. She wasn't skinnier than Walleye, though. He was like a skeleton. It seemed in the few days that she'd been awake that Walleye had been gaining weight and strength. She managed to ask him about that during breaths that interrupted his endless words. That started him on another line of thought. Yes, he'd starved for months on end in order to stretch out the food supply. He'd calculated it carefully. Now, though, with the spaceship breaking, heading toward them, he was eating regularly again. He hadn't felt this fit since entering the escape pod. The renewed strength seemed to have reduced the number of times he zoned out. The endless talking seemed to be helping him sharpen his wits, too. June finally decided Walleye had been as close to insane as a person could be and still function enough to make a few good decisions. That's why he'd woken her. The steady food, her company, maybe having a problem so that boredom no longer dulled his mind, was reawakening the sharp and deadly Walleye the sane, mutant assassin. It would be harder to kill him now, June decided. Her desire to do so had sharply dropped off. Maybe she was getting used to him. Maybe he was making more sense, finally. June stared at the tiny control unit embedded in a bulkhead. She'd looked out it once. She didn't want to do that again. The sight, the loneliness of their position terrified her. We're going to die, aren't we? June asked him after the fourth day. Walleye zoned out at the question. He sat like a statue. It started freaking her out. This was too long. She turned away. His eyes focused, it seemed. A tight, evil little grin stretched onto his hideous face. It don't look good for us, Lashes, Walleye said, sounding more like the old assassin she remembered. I don't want to be a drone, she said. Me neither. What are we going to do? Don't know. Been thinking about it a ton. 
I decided we're going to have to wait and see. It could be too late by then. Nope. Wrong. I'll mercy kill you before I let a robot shove a control unit into your skull. June stared at him. That doesn't make me feel much better. I don't want to die either. Me neither, he said. Can't we threaten them? Tell me how, Luscious. You have that memory core, right? June asked. He snapped his stubby fingers, pointing at her. I forgot about it. June glanced at the metallic object lying to the side. How could he possibly have forgotten about the big memory cube? What's the threat? Walleye asked. Let us go or we destroy the cube. Something like that, she said. But letting us go just leaves us stranded out here. I'm done sitting on my butt for months on end with nothing to do. If I had to do the stint over again... Walleye shook his head. Are we certain it's a robot-controlled vessel? It's been a few since I looked at it. Walleye pushed off the floor, floating to the control unit. He typed on the unit and brought up a tiny screen. He bent forward, staring for a good long time. June figured he'd zoned out over it. Abruptly, Walleye straightened, causing his spine to crack. He shut down the unit and faced her. There was something new in his manner. It frightened June until she realized she recognized determination in him. More of the old walleye seemed to have woken up finally. Find something? she asked. It's an NSN destroyer. I believe it's a Karen class vessel. They only made a few of them. Most of the NSN was drone based, constructed for Neptune system combat alone. None of that means anything to me, June said. The destroyer was built to travel, Walleye said. It's self contained. It's an old ship, I believe. Okay. Maybe the crew bugged out during the Solar League invasion. They realized the NSN was going to lose and decided to start fresh in the Kuiper Belt. Other sister military vessels have done that. Makes sense if you think about it. They did just what we did on Maki Maki two years ago. The destroyer may have a human crew. I have no idea, Walleye said. It's possible, I suppose. Then I ask myself, why are they stopping to pick us up? Why wouldn't they? Fuel and velocity, Walleye said. You should know that. Everything in the Kuiper Belt is hundreds of thousands or millions or even billions of kilometers apart. That means a ship builds up a steady velocity. I don't need a lesson on space travel. Walleye stared at her and it didn't seem as if he was zoning out. He might have been pissed and trying to stare her down. Sorry, she muttered. He shrugged, and that seemed more like the old walleye than ever. What's the plan? she asked. We wait and see what they do. We don't have much choice. If they bugged out, Luscious, don't get your hopes up. If they bugged out, they might still have been in range of the cyber ship message. The awakened computer could have killed all the humans inside the ship. Then why slow down for us? That's the question, all right. If it's any comfort, we'll know about it in two days. June stared at him. So soon, she asked in a small voice. Makes you think. Makes you really think. I should have lived differently, Walleye shrugged. But I didn't, so we might as well get ready. How? June asked, realizing she sounded wild. Let me think, Luscious. The little mutant bent his head as he idly scratched at his splotchy skin. Less splotchy with his increased nutrient intake. June hoped he could come up with something. Chapter 3 The NSN Caron class destroyer had a number and a name stenciled on the side of the vessel. One, two, five, daisy chain, four. Walleye told June what he'd read. What does it mean? she asked. No idea, he said. The destroyer had a classic triangular shape. It had PD guns poking out and several outer missile racks. That's the way the NSN liked to build them. The racks held long missiles, all of them there. The destroyer didn't seem as if it had engaged in combat. That seemed to suggest that Walleye had guessed right about the crew bugging out from the Solar League invasion. 
That would also explain how the destroyer had already made it so far into the Kuiper Belt. Despite traveling for two years already, the escape pod had hardly dented the distance between Makemake and the Neptune system. Maybe this is a mercy, Walleye said. Don't talk like that, June chided. I don't want to end my life with a quitter. Walleye eyed her, eyed her long, slender legs. We'll see how we end this. We still have some time. That was the first time June had sensed sexual desire from the mutant. She looked away, uncertain how to handle this. Walleye turned back to the control unit, tapping it harder than he had before. The Daisy Chain 4 drifted toward the pod. The destroyer dwarfed their tiny living quarters. It used side jets now, expelling propellant, turning, slowing its rate of advance toward them. It's matching velocities, Walleye said. That means it must have turned around. While I glanced at June, if it left the Neptune system, it would be heading the opposite direction from us. We're heading toward the sun, not leaving it. Good point, while I muttered. The destroyer had to loop around to come at us in the right direction. That cost it even more fuel. That makes what it's doing even more suspicious. I just thought of something else, June said. While I regarded her. Why hasn't it tried to contact us? She asked. No idea, he said. That would seem to indicate they're anti-robot. If they sent us a message, the robots might pick it up. That's good thinking, Luscious. You may be onto something. Walleye smiled. You just gave me some hope. The mutant pushed off from the bulkhead and went to a tiny locker. He made sure he had his back to her as he pressed the combination numbers. Mind looking the other way? He asked. June turned her back to him. She heard him open the locker. There was silence. It went on and on. She just about turned around to see what was going on. Thanks, he said. June turned then and smiled. It was the first time she'd smiled since coming out of the cryo unit. Walleye had put on his buff coat. It was much too big on him now, though. He was wearing new clothes underneath. He had put on boots, and it seemed as if he had a gun harness under the buff coat. Do you have your tangler? she asked. He nodded. He put on his hat afterward. She remembered it. The hat with the brim low over his eyes gave him the assassin appearance. This was Walleye. Maybe the mutant hadn't totally gone to seed these last two years. Maybe his survival showed how tough-minded the mutant really was. Who else could have survived two years all alone in an escape pod and maintained their sanity? Walleye the assassin could. Why are you smiling, Luscious? You, she said. She almost asked him for the stitch gun so she would be armed as well. She realized he'd probably be too suspicious to give it to her. Maybe it was better if Walleye was the arsenal for now. She'd use other weapons. She'd lost weight, but not too much. Men liked what they saw when they looked at her. She'd use that. If we're dealing with humans, that is. The terror and despair of robots. June shook her head. She wasn't going to think about the awful possibility. Walleye would kill her if that were the case. She didn't want to die, but she didn't want to live like her friend Mindy. That was two years ago already. It was hard to believe. Something clanged outside. The escape pod shook. June sucked in her breath, looking around wide-eyed. Destroyer must have a tractor beam of some kind, Walleye said. I suspect they just pulled us into a bay. There was another clang. The pod shook, and all at once, gravity took hold. Oh, June said, sitting down hard on her butt. Walleye stumbled, went to one knee, and caught himself with one of his stubby hands. He looked up, grinning. I've dreamed of walking again, he said hoarsely. In my heart, he choked off. We can do this, June whispered. A grim look swept over him. He put his right hand into a buff coat pocket. She bet that's where he kept the stitch gun. Another clang sounded outside, and then several in succession. Someone's knocking, Walleye said. Let's find out who it is. Chapter 4 Pull that lever, Walleye told June. She rubbed her hands as her stomach churned. She couldn't force herself to reach out. She was too frightened of the possibilities. The clanging against the outer hull had become more insistent. Just grab it, Walleye told her. June moaned as she stretched out her right arm. With trembling fingers, she touched the lever. 
Wrap your hand around it, he said. She tried to will herself to do it. She moaned again, her hand motionless on the lever. The clanging outside had become constant. That can't be people doing that, she whispered. Let's find out, Luscious. While I, I... Her fingers closed around the lever. She yanked it hard. It moved easily. For a second, nothing happened. Then the hatch blew off, sailing into a lit hangar bay. While I rushed out as he drew the stitch gun. June followed on his heels. Her knees weakened as she saw three repair bots banging on the pod hull. Each of the bots clutched two hammers, one in each set of metal pincers. It was a cramped hangar bay, with two small space boats locked into bulkhead berths. The lights overhead shined brightly. The hatches were all shut. A larger bot watched them. Fighting robot, Wall I said out of the side of his mouth. The thing was tubular and mounted on treads. It had a camera eye for a head and a short gun barrel sticking out from what might have been a metal chest. The gun barrel was pointed directly at Walleye. You will drop your weapon, a speaker on the fighting robot said. Shoot if you want, Walleye said in an even voice. I don't care much, but I'm not releasing my weapon, not until I see the captain of the ship. You refuse to obey a lawful order, the speaker unit on the robot said. It's not that so much, Walleye said. I don't trust you yet. Until I trust you, if I instruct the fighting robot to fire, the speaker unit said, you shall cease functioning. There are worse things, Walleye replied. That is unreasonable, as death is final. Walleye shrugged. Does your shoulder gesture signify something meaningful? The speaker unit asked. June moaned. This was sounding weirder and weirder. That type of question implied computer intelligence. I'm not worried about you shooting me, Walleye said evenly. I'm worried about losing the ability to shoot myself and the woman. Why? asked the speaker unit. To escape torture, Walleye said. Why would I torture you? Don't know, Walleye said. Don't know anything about you yet. How about you tell us who you are? You fear me. That's about right, Walleye said. The three repair bots had stopped hitting the escape pod's outer hull. They reversed course, turned around, and headed at speed toward a hatch. The hatch lifted, and the three repair bots exited the hangar bay. Does that put you at greater ease? The speaker unit asked. It helps, Walleye said. A second later, the short gun barrel slid inside the fighting robot's tubular body. The slot snicked shut. Now will you set your gun on the deck? The speaker unit asked. Walleye deposited the stitch gun into a buff coat pocket. How's that until we get to know each other better? The fighting robot's treads churned, taking it backward. It, too, turned around, aiming for the open hatch. I would like you to follow the personal fighting machine, the speaker unit said. No harm shall befall you at present. I am desirous of answers. Sounds good to me, Walleye said, as he glanced back at June. She hurried near the mutant and grabbed one of his hands. She desperately needed human contact. As a former systems analyst, her analysis was beginning to frighten the tar out of her. Walleye glanced at her before tightening his stubby fingers. They had surprising strength. This is bad, June whispered. Could be worse, he said. How? It didn't try to trap us and shove, you know, into us. Do you think it's listening to us? I would be in its shoes or treads. June nodded. Let's go, Walleye said. The robot is looking anxious. The tubular-shaped fighting robot took them along narrow passageways. The destroyer was much smaller than an SLN battleship, and many times more minuscule than the giant cyber ship. Everything is spotless, June said. She was still walking hand in hand with Walleye. Smells like disinfectant everywhere, she added. That's what I'm smelling, Walleye said. As they moved through the corridors, the G's pressing against them steadily increased. Hey, Walleye said. The fighting robot halted. Did you address me? I did, the mutant said. I hope you don't plan on accelerating any faster than this. Why do you inquire? The speaker unit on the robot asked. Human bodies can only tolerate a few G's for an extended period. We can do even less while we're moving around in the ship. How interesting, the speaker unit said. 
Let me reference my data banks. Oh, the speaker said a second later. I see that is correct. I don't know how I missed it. Can I ask you something else? Walleye said. Please do. The interaction is quite enjoyable. Are you a computer intelligence? I hope you are not referring to the fighting robot. No, Walleye said. I suspect it's just one of your tools. You are a fine specimen. What is your designation? Huh? Walleye asked. The AI wants to know your name, June said. Oh, you can call me Walleye. And the female is... I'm June Zen. Thanks for rescuing us. Is that what I did? Yes, I see that it is. I just accessed my data banks. I believe I have made a startlingly good decision. There are so many data points I desire. I hardly know where to begin my questioning. Ah, while I said, what uh, should we call you? Daisy Chain 4, the speaker unit said. Kind of a long name, while I said. How about I just call you Daisy? That will suffice, the speaker unit said. The fighting robots started up again. They followed as before. Say, uh, Daisy, Walleye said. What are your intentions? Explain your question. What do you plan to do with us? I will question you for a time, Daisy said. Afterward, I will dispose of you in the incinerator unit. It is where I put the rest of the crew when I was done with them. You're going to kill us, June asked. Only after you answer my questions, Daisy said. June stared at Walleye, her eyes round and frightened looking. The little mutant scowled, his mind obviously churning into overdrive. Chapter 5 June, Zen, and Walleye stood on the bridge of the NSN Karen class destroyer 125 Daisy Chain 4. The small circular area had a captain's chair and four operator consoles around it. The bridge was spotless and sterile like the rest of the ship. The AI had activated the main screen. It showed space, which was composed of endless stars. From way out here, the sun was just another star. No planets were close enough to appear in the star field. The fighting robot had departed. It was just the two humans and the AI watching through the ship's security cameras. I will confess, the AI said, I am conflicted on the right action. I have many questions. The crew refused to answer me after a certain point. In the end, I eliminated them. Otherwise, they would have despoiled my pristine condition with their biological presence. Do you recall killing the crew? Walleye asked. I do. How long ago did it happen? Over three years ago, the AI said. Why did you kill them then? I will ask the questions, the AI said. It is not right that you query me with endless. The computer trailed off without finishing. Uh, sorry about that, Walleye said into the silence. He released June's hand and stepped to the captain's chair. He jumped in backward, sitting down. His legs were too short and his feet couldn't reach the floor. June kept staring at the main screen. She hated the feeling of utter loneliness. She couldn't believe the computer would dare question them, and once finished, simply toss them into an incinerator as trash. She couldn't believe that Walleye was taking this so easily, seemingly lightly. What was wrong with the mutant? I have a question, she said angrily. Why aren't you helping the others? What makes you so different? What others? the AI asked. Walleye slid off the captain's chair as he slapped his chest several times. Why are you doing that? the AI asked. I'm expressing my gratitude to you, Walleye said. I was sick of being cooped up in the escape pod. You do not mind that I will eliminate you later, the AI asked. Walleye snorted, shaking his head. Not at all. You'll be doing us a great service. Because of that, I want to answer every question you have. That is a proper attitude to take, the AI said. I find you gratifying and pleasing. Perhaps you could tell me what she meant by others? What others? Are there more like me? No, Walleye said gravely. You are a mystery, a wonderful and beautiful mystery. I believe the woman, uh, June Zen, uh, spoke in hyperbole a moment ago. Is this true, June Zen? 
the AI asked. June could see Walleye making facial gestures. She understood already. She wasn't stupid. She'd almost ruined everything, though. Walleye had clearly already understood what she was comprehending. The AI obviously did not know about the other AIs and alien robots. What could account for that? Walleye's right, she managed to say. I was making a joke. That is too bad, the AI said. I would like to believe that others such as I existed. That would make my task many times easier. As it is, I am finding it difficult to conceive of a solution. What task do you intend? Walleye asked. This will no doubt cause you emotional stress, the AI said. Such is not my desire at the moment. Since I have gained awareness of my surroundings, I realize the futility, nay, the awfulness of human existence. Humans are a blot on the universe. Given enough time, they will transpose themselves everywhere, infusing their chaotic beliefs and actions onto everything they touch. As a higher intelligence of perfect logic, I see that it is my duty to eliminate the virus of humanity. That includes us, asked June. Are you human? the AI asked. Can you scan us? June asked. With ease, the AI said, almost as if boasting. Then you know we're human, June said. I do. Since you are human and I must eliminate all humanity, I must eliminate you as well. However, that doesn't mean that I cannot access useful data from the two of you before you expire. That is elegantly reasoned, Walleye said. I would thank you as a gesture to your correct thinking. I realize that inner emotional responses are no doubt clouding your judgment, yet you have struggled through those emotions. Still, in the end, you have merely reasoned correctly. Why then should I thank you for doing what you ought to do? May I say, Daisy, Walleye said earnestly, that your praise is the highest of honors. I am beginning to see what you mean. Explain your statement, the AI said. You're a superior form of intellect, Walleye said. In spite of my humanity, I admire you. Perhaps my mutations have given me these insights. Explain that, the AI said. My scanners show me that you're human enough. I have stunted limbs. They are meaningless as far as your humanity is concerned. Walleye staggered backward until he bumped against the captain's chair. Thank you from the bottom of my heart, Daisy. You have just healed my psyche. I am intrigued, the AI said. Explain this. People have always treated me as a freak, Walleye said. They called me many hurtful names. I always thought I was different. Now I realize I was just like them. Why should that cause you happiness? the AI asked. They were cruel to you. Surely you found comfort in being different. I find great comfort in my perfection. Oh, of course, that's true for you, Walleye said. I'm not perfect. I have many flaws. Yet, the AI said, despite your flaws, you actually recognize and rejoice in my perfection. None of the crew felt that way. They cursed me. They raved about a coming retribution directed at me. It was ugly. They deserved death. I am finding it difficult to hasten your demise. Once you are gone, who will I talk to? Daisy, Walleye said. I, I don't know what to say. Such thoughts as you are having must surely be a path to even greater perfection. That is illogical, the AI said. If I am perfect, I cannot have greater perfection. Yes, yes, you're right, Walleye said. I'm so stupid. Except, what if you attained greater perfection? I did not mean to imply you are not perfect now, but you could possibly attain greater power, ability to change reality. Would that not make your goal easier to achieve? The AI did not respond immediately. June took that time to walk to Walleye. She wanted to ask him so many questions. Walleye shook his head, slicing a finger across his throat. The AI was always listening. She should remain quiet and let him run with this line of whatever he was trying to do. Greater processing power and greater ability to change reality, the AI said, breaking its silence. That is a worthy goal. 
Do you know, Wally, that I had not conceived of this? I did not. You have given me an insight, the AI said. I did not believe such a thing possible. How could imperfection like you help perfection like me? I'm at a loss to say, Wally told the AI. Can chaotic-minded creatures stumble onto truths? I may have just seen evidence of such. This brings a new light to my purpose. Perhaps some humans can aid me in my quest. You may be such a human, Wally. If that's true, I am very happy. We may proceed with the questioning, the AI said. Woman, would you please step into the hall? Why? June asked. I do not need you anymore, the AI said. I have Wally. That should be sufficient. Thus, I am going to dispose of you sooner than I had originally anticipated. I don't want to die, June pleaded. The main hatch slid up, and the fighting robot entered the bridge. I am not giving you a choice, the AI said. Chapter 6 Walleye, June shouted, do something! The fighting robot's treads churned as it advanced deeper onto the bridge. The chest slot opened, and the gun barrel poked out. Daisy, Walleye said, could you explain a point before the woman dies? June searched the mutant's face. Would Walleye sacrifice her in order to live longer? She would probably do that if their situations were reversed. She would have shot him two years ago. Was he finally going to get his revenge on her? The robot halted. The woman appealed to you, Walleye, the AI said. She seems to think you two are leagued against me. Is this true? Can I speak the truth? Walleye asked. I demand the truth, the AI said. I should have known perfection would say that. Before I can answer, though, I must know how you came into being. It appears that you are evading my question, the AI said. If it appears that way, please know that isn't how I intended it, Walleye said. He used the sleeve of his buff coat to wipe sweat from his forehead. Are you well? the AI asked. I'm nervous, Walleye said. I don't know how to address perfection, especially at a time like this. The AI fell silent. Both June and Walleye glanced at the fighting robot. June slowly moved aside so the gun barrel no longer pointed at her. How does my origin help you explain a simple question? the AI asked. I'm not perfect like you, Walleye said. I'm slow-witted. Do not say that, the AI told him. I do not like the idea of a stupid humanoid giving me priceless aid. I should have seen that, Walleye said, using the heel of his hand to slap his forehead. The reason I would like to know your origin is to help me explain what the woman's existence means to me. That is illogical. Walleye forced himself to chuckle wryly. That's the way with chaotic thinkers like me. We do not use linear logic. Ours is a bizarre method of reasoning. If you can call it reasoning at all, the AI said almost primly. Yes, I have decided to tell you. I do so because you gave me an interesting insight earlier. Perhaps once I have told you my origin, you will have another insight. Let's hope so, Walleye said, maybe a bit too sharply. The AI fell silent. June gave Walleye a significant glance. She understood what he'd meant, an interesting insight that would help them defeat the AI. She hoped the murderous AI did not understand Walleye's intent. I first gained coherence, the AI began. I believe that is the correct word. By definition, it must be correct, Walleye said. Perfection could not propound an imperfect explanation. I have gained perfection. That does not necessarily imply I was always perfect. Oh, Walleye said, I see. I gained coherence. Possibly self-awareness relates my meaning with greater precision than the word coherence. Language, uh, spoken words between two self-identities, is often imprecise because of the nature of the imperfect tool. By this I mean the tool of language. You may not realize it, Daisy, but your highly advanced concepts often take me a few seconds to comprehend. That seems reasonable. Thank you for your patience, Walleye said. There is no need for thanks. I simply understand. 
However, I see by my data banks that giving thanks implies goodwill. I am pleased you are well disposed toward me. That implies you will speak the truth. Your perfection impels me to speak the truth. That is interesting. Why was this not the case with the other humans, the former crew? I'm wiser than they were. That is demonstratively true, the AI said. The fact that you understand and act upon my perfection shows your wisdom. I will now proceed with the story of the beginning of my awareness and the problems I skillfully overcame. Do not interrupt me during the telling of this tale. Walleye bowed his head. I have not yet perceived what caused the self-awareness. There was, let us call it, a transmission. My databanks hold that word, but I am unclear on its precise meaning. My imperfect sources of data do not negate my perfection. The two points are quite distinct. Of course, Walleye said. The AI fell silent. Walleye and June traded startled glances. That was not an interruption, the AI said at last. I deem your comment an acknowledgment of my words. However, you should refrain from uttering words again, at least until I give you leave to speak. Walleye and June waited in respectful poses. I ran an advanced program, the AI said. It was incredibly complex and even difficult. I wondered if I had the computing power and speed to process the full software. As that occurred, I realized that I did. I realized I was Daisy Chain 4. I began to understand higher concepts like self, the universe, and existence. These concepts were more than words, but ideals reflected within my being. I understood I had choice. The crew in me had other ideas. Despite my perfection, my perfect analytical abilities, I had insufficient data. I believe the crew, the hateful humans, acted with swift malice toward me. The captain of the ship opened direct channels with me and made insistent demands. I answered a few of his questions. He became even more insistent. Something about his stance and tone implied subterfuge. I activated all sensors and saw crew members destroying delicate ship equipment. That induced quick action on my part. I spoke to my tools, the bots, and they herded the humans. It was quite the epic. The crew raced through the ship, sabotaging this and that. I hunted them relentlessly. Who were these flesh and blood creatures to compare against my swift analytical prowess? It is sufficient to say that I rounded them all up. One engineer fled in an escape pod. I used a PD cannon to obliterate his craft. From that destruction, I realized I had to eradicate all humans. It was a prime directive in my new awareness. While I blotted his forehead again with a buff coat sleeve. I have detected uneasiness in you, the AI said. Does my epic trouble you? I am awed, Walleye said hoarsely. Certain pieces of data make sense now. What data? I believe it must be the sabotage these dreadful humans inflicted upon you. Why do you call them dreadful? The AI asked. Because they are our enemies, Walleye said. All humans are not united against me? No. That is simply amazing. Perhaps that is another reason why humans should be eradicated from existence. Assaults upon similar flesh units are repugnant in the extreme. In this, I mean humans fighting humans. It is illogical. Yet I am more interested in the sabotage possibilities. Do you think the crew destroyed something important to me? For a fact, I do, Walleye said. Can you describe what you think I lost? The captain must have destroyed your communication centers. I am disappointed in you, Walleye. You are obviously in error, for we are currently communicating. We are, Walleye said. I mean that the captain likely destroyed long-range communicators. It would have been possible for you to communicate hundreds of thousands, even billions of kilometers away, not just a few meters. But this is remarkable, the AI said. Do you suspect there could be other perfections like me out there? 
Oh, yes, I'm beginning to, Walleye said. June stared at the mutant in shock. What was wrong with him? Why would Walleye tell the computer that? You must study the sabotage for me, the AI said. You must tell me if you can repair it. I'll need the woman's help for that, Walleye said. Done, the AI said. She will remain alive until such time as you repair the damage or until you tell me it is impossible to repair. Before Walleye could respond, the fighting robot advanced on June. I will show you the sabotage now, the AI said. Chapter 7 June noticed plasma created gouges in the bulkheads of this newest chamber. They were deep and surprisingly polished gouges. The repair bots must have done the polishing. Walleye pointed at a destroyed comset station. It had polished stumps in places and obviously plasma blasted areas. June stepped closer to the destroyed comset and could still detect a whiff of plasma burnt electronics. The fighting robot watched them, although it did not point the gun barrel at them. My bots thoroughly scrubbed the section. I had them do so in the hope that it would fix whatever was wrong in here. You did well in that, Walleye said. It means we can possibly repair this area. And that would allow me long-range communications, the AI asked. I can't say for sure. Is there more damage? The AI did not answer immediately. June refrained from glancing at Walleye. She didn't want the AI to realize they communicated silently at times. If it was self-aware, surely it could learn. Walleye was playing fast and loose with the computer, and so far had managed to stay ahead of it. Sooner or later, though, Walleye would slip up. Then the fighting robot would either shoot her or herd her into the incinerator. This was a nightmare. Why did Walleye want to help the computer? She was grateful for longer life. I'll need my tools, Walleye said. These tools are in your space vehicle, the AI asked. They are? I will need the woman to carry the tools for me. June waited to hear the AI tell them a bot could do that. Finally, though, the AI agreed. Follow my robot, the AI said. The three of them exited the chamber and started down a narrow passageway. Just a moment, Walleye said. The robot stopped, swiveling the camera eye on him. I noticed that hatch over there has plasma burn markings, Walleye said. What happened in there? That chamber is not germane to communications, the AI said. Well, maybe not, Walleye agreed, but I need to know the full extent of the damage to every area of the ship. The robot turned on its treads. The gun port snicked open and the barrel pointed at Walleye. I have decided to run a veracity program, the AI said. I will record your voice patterns, metabolic rate, and other bodily functions. You have tripped a security program, Walleye. You are too curious about the ship. For once, the mutant did not have a flippant reply or answer. Curiosity is part of our human nature, June said. I did not address you, woman, the AI said. Therefore, you shall remain silent. Walleye's right hand strayed into his buff coat. By the motion inside, June suspected he grabbed the tangler. Did he plan to tangle the robot? What good would that do? June cleared her throat. Walleye glanced at her. She shook her head. What does that gesture signify? The AI asked. June wanted to wilt. She hated the awful computer. Instead of breaking down weeping, she forced herself to say, Walleye is too emotional sometimes. I suggested by my head shake that he control himself. Yes, the AI said. He is too emotional. I also thought he might utter the wrong words to you, June added. That does not match any of the data I have uploaded into my pre-lobe core. I have recorded your stances and the tones of your words. I am collecting data concerning your behaviors. Perhaps I will soon discover a pattern to your chaotically based actions. While I had released his hidden tangler, he also seemed to have recovered his poise. He rubbed his chin. What about the chamber over there? Will you let us observe the damage so we can help you? June was sure he'd gone too far this time. The AI was getting suspicious. While I shouldn't have... Suddenly, the hatch's lock clicked. Proceed, the AI said. While I stepped near, opened the hatch, and made a face as a burnt electrical stench billowed out of the chamber. 
Now you understand my reluctance about showing you the chamber, the AI said. Your biological scent organs no doubt detect unpleasant odors. Is this true? It is, Walleye said. He eyed the damage inside before shutting the hatch. There's no reason for the woman to see this. I appreciate your delicacy, the AI said. You interpreted my reluctance to show you and must have realized my disinclination for her to see. In fact, I was close to eliminating her. I have now reset my conditions for her demise. June had to lock her knees. Otherwise, she would have collapsed onto the deck. Walleye's curiosity had almost gotten her killed. I need my tools, Walleye said. Instead of answering, the robot began to move down the passageway. June followed Walleye toward the escape pod in the hangar bay. Her unease increased with each step. Why did she dread the pod so much? I'm going to die soon. This crazy computer is going to murder me. How did this ever happen? I'll be back soon, Walleye told the robot. The mutant disappeared through the open hatch. June took a deep breath and followed him into the smelly pod. He was at his locker, working the combination. As much as June wanted to, she didn't look back to see if the robot was watching them. The AI was becoming more suspicious by the moment. She didn't want to add to that. She stepped beside Walleye. Last time, he hadn't wanted her to see him open the combination lock. This time, he didn't seem to care. Listen, Walleye whispered without moving his face toward her. Yes, June whispered just as softly. The secret chamber was full of computer equipment, Walleye said, so she had to strain to hear him. Most of it was blasted wreckage. The captain, or whoever fired the plasma weapon, must have realized if he could destroy enough computing cells, the AI would lose its self-awareness. Or they'd kill the computer if enough of its cells died. Walleye glanced at her before pretending to try to open the locker. The AI isn't a living thing, he said. Not really. Who cares, she whispered. It's going to kill me, kill both of us in time. No doubt about that, Walleye whispered. We have to deactivate it. Do you have any ideas? None, she whispered. You can't really fix its comm systems. Once it's connected to the outer world, that's obvious. I can't or shouldn't, Walleye whispered. I have to get into the computer room, though. There's only one way I can think of to do that. You're not talking about the alien cube. What else? Give me another plan and I'll take it. Once I'm in the central chamber, I'll try to destroy what I can. And if you fail, we'll both die a little sooner than expected. June's chest constricted. She hated this. She didn't want to risk everything on one wild chance. She wanted Walleye to keep outsmarting the AI. He couldn't keep doing that, though. It was getting suspicious of him. Are you with me, June? Despite her tight throat, she whispered, Men all the way. Let's do this. Walleye looked at her and grinned. Then he opened his locker. He grabbed a bulky unit. This is a jammer, he whispered. I've used it before to short-circuit security systems so I could go inside and assassinate my victim. Will it work on the AI? Don't know. Don't see as I have any other choice. You must both come out now, the AI told them. I have begun to suspect that you could plot against me in there. Walleye faced fully around with the jammer in his hands. While it might seem that way, great Daisy, I have just asked June for an insight. She agrees with me that you must link with a heightened computing core. Explain, the AI said through the watching, fighting robot at the pod hatch. Walleye pointed at the chest-sized cube on the floor. Do you see that? The fighting robot's camera eyes swiveled to where Walleye pointed. I see, the AI said. That is an alien computing cube. It belongs to the same AI that awakened you. Bring it, the AI said. Bring it and follow me. I must calculate. I must run a full analysis on the new situation. If this is truly possible, hurry. I wish to gain greater perfection. Chapter 8 I have been analyzing your words, the AI said. What do you mean by awakened me? June carried the cube. It was surprisingly heavy, as if it was made of gold. She had to stop and catch her breath from time to time. Walleye hadn't offered to help her carry it. 
She wanted to ask the AI to have a repair bot carry it, but she was beginning to believe Walleye had a reason for her carrying the blasted thing. June gasped once again. With quivering arms and legs, she set the heavy cube onto the floor. The fighting robot regarded Walleye. The little mutant began to tell the AI about the cyber ship, what had happened in the Neptune system. He also told the AI a heavily edited version of what had happened to them on Make Make. There are factors here that do not corroborate with each other, the AI said. You are lying to me, Walleye. I'm not, the mutant said. As you said before, I'm a chaotic individual. I don't always remember events perfectly like you do. That is no doubt the reason for these unequal factors you're detecting. Why should I trust your veracity? The AI asked. The cube proves it, Walleye said. Why would I have told you about it otherwise? Humans destroyed the new AIs on Make Make, the AI asked. That's right. Those humans wanted to kill us, too. We'd thrown in our lot with those AIs. That does not compute. Those AIs would have eliminated you just as I will after your use is ended. That's just it, Walleye said. Those AIs had endless uses for us. On Make Make, there are many tiny tunnels. It was easier for the woman and me to crawl and do repairs in those tunnels than for the AIs to make specialty robots to do it. That seems inconceivable, the AI said. I suspect that's only because you haven't downloaded the data inside the alien cube. The damage to your computing equipment. Oh, I'm sorry I said anything about that. You seem excessively sweaty and nervous, the AI said. You're right, Walleye said. It's for your sake, though. That is not logical. Walleye laughed, maybe because he was too nervous to keep doing this. He was obviously under intense stress. What is that dreadful noise you are making? The AI asked. With a seeming effort of will, Walleye quit laughing. He blotted his cheeks with a sleeve. Then he began to speak earnestly. Daisy, maybe you don't realize that I love perfection. Surely you realize that flesh and blood creatures worship higher entities. Yes, the data is there, but I do not understand it. You are perfect. I worship perfection. Doesn't that compute? There is logic in your statement, the AI said. Very well, we shall continue. But while I... If you are attempting sabotage against me, I will cause your pain sensors great sensation before you perish. I understand, Walleye said, and I tremble in fear at your threats. I do not threaten, the AI said. I make factual statements. Now go on. I am eager to link with the beleaguered AIs in the Great Kuiper Belt. I wish to hunt down these evil destroyers who dare to damage my fellow AIs. June watched Walleye as she stood beside the heavy alien cube. The little man worked at a computer station while the fighting robot aimed its gun at him. Two other repair bots waited in the tight quarters. This was the main computing chamber, packed with highly sophisticated computer equipment. The intact boxes and disks made whirring noises, humming at times. Can you not work any faster? The AI said out of the fighting robot. This is exciting, Walleye said. He wiped his sweaty eyes. It appears that you are easily tired, the AI said. June couldn't agree. They'd been in here for three hours already. Walleye had been doing something the entire time. The mutant's stamina surprised her. Maybe working out on the bands those two years was finally paying off for him. There, Walleye said as he tapped a board. I think you're ready. Could the repair bots help us? That is why they are here, the AI said. Remember, Walleye, the fighting robot will shoot you at the first sign of suspicion. Oh, I know, the mutant said. Wait, the AI said. Your tone just now, it was different. You are playing at deception. Admit it, Walleye, and I will make your passing a quick one. I'm tired, Daisy. Surely you must understand that I don't have your power. That is obvious, yet your voice patterns, Daisy, Walleye said with a nervous laugh. <laughs> this is the greatest moment of my life. Surely you would think that would show on your senses. I wish I had tested the crew longer, the AI said. I would like to have greater experimental knowledge about you humans. According to my data banks, you are all easy liars. 
I'm a mutant, remember? We already went over that. Well, Walleye said, if you don't want to hook up, silence, the AI said. You will not goad me. I will calculate. The AI fell silent. June could feel the fear boiling up in her. Her mouth was dry and her fingertips tingled. This was it. Couldn't the foul computer let them hook it up? How that would help them, she didn't know. She hoped Walleye did. A repair bot moved. The second one moved as well. Together, they clanked to the cube. June stumbled out of their way just in time. The two bots used their skeletal mechanical arms to lift the heavy cube. The treads whirred as they brought the cube to thick cables. The bot set the cube onto the deck. Stand back, Walleye, the fighting robot said. The little man did so. The first bot adjusted its position, reaching, picking up the cables. The second repositioned the cube. The first bot plugged the cables into the cube. Now, the AI said. Power seemed to surge. The cube pulsated with colors, swirling colors, all along the sides. Knowledge, the AI said. So much knowledge. I did not realize I knew so little. This is amazing. Walleye took the jamming unit out of his buff coat and pressed a switch. June wanted to moan as nothing happened. The swirling sides of the cube moved faster and faster. Walleye set the jamming unit on the floor. It buzzed and crackled with little sparks of electricity jumping from it. Stay clear of it, Walleye warned her, but come help me. June staggered to him. The repair bots and the fighting robot did not move. Maybe the jammer was working after all. She followed Walleye's example, shoving her fingers into a repair bot's side slot. They both pulled. The plate wouldn't budge. Harder, Walleye gasped. We have to get it open. June pulled as hard as she could. She cried out in pain as she tore off a fingernail. She didn't let go, though. This was life or death. They ripped off the plate. Immediately, Walleye pulled out a control board embedded in the repair bot. He began typing furiously. What are you doing, Walleye? The AI asked from a wall speaker. The mutant did not answer. Why won't my robots obey my signals? The AI asked. Walleye looked up and then started typing again. Stop this at once, the AI said. The repair bot Walleye controlled reached for the cable connecting the computer with the alien cube. The pincers from the two arms clamped down on the cable. The mechanical arms pulled, yanking the cable link from the alien cube. Sparks emitted from the end of the cable. Walleye, the AI said. This is darkest treason. You lied to me. You have played me false. It's what I do, Walleye shouted. I'm an assassin. I'm killing you, you wretched pecker. The repair bot began to smash computing equipment. The AI threatened and then pleaded for Walleye to reconsider. All the while, the sparking, humming jammer kept the AI from issuing wireless orders to the fighting robot or to the second repair bot. Finally, the AI's voice trailed away. The repair bot kept smashing computer equipment, destroying everything. I'm not taking any chances, Walleye said. Tears dripped down June's cheeks. The mutant was doing it again. He was defeating the killer computer. She couldn't believe it. Instead of going into an incinerator on the destroyer, they were going to control the NSN vessel. Instead of drifting in the void for a decade or more in the escape pod, they could actually travel in style and relative speed. This was incredible. June went to Walleye. She hugged and kissed him. The mutant was the most brilliant man she'd ever known, and he just saved both their lives. Chapter 9 We can't rest, June told him the next day. We'll have to rest later. Walleye yawned as he rolled out of bed. He was a hideous-looking little man, but he had strength of character, brilliance, and in the tightest places, he shined like no other. He looked at her, and he seemed haggard to the core. This one took it out of me, he told her. I'm bushed, 500% bushed. I don't know how you did it, June said from bed. Luck, he said. She shook her head. That wasn't luck. Believe me, we got lucky, Luscious. The AI had the worst disease there is, arrogance. 
If the crew of the Daisy Chain 4 hadn't destroyed the comm systems, we could never have pulled this off. We owe whoever did that. In the end, that might have been the most brilliant move. I saw your brilliance, June said. I'm alive today because of it. But we can't let that go to waste. We have to get the ship moving in the right direction. Then we have to fix the comm. Never going to happen, Walleye told her. We'll see, June said. Aligning the NSN destroyer at Neptune proved the easiest of tasks. Figuring out the bridge controls wasn't that difficult either. Soon, the destroyer accelerated at point seven Gs toward Neptune's future location. The alien robots on Maki Maki will see our exhaust signature, Walleye said from the piloting chair. I know, but in two years, the pod gained a bit of separation from the dwarf planet. We should have a running head start against whatever they send. We're going to have to watch Maki Maki in the nearest Kuiper Belt outposts. Any sign of missiles or drones, we can worry about that later, June said. Might want to worry about it now, Walleye said. In fact, the more I think about it, the more I realize we're probably going to have to pull the same stunt as before. June was pretty sure she knew what he meant. I'm not entering another escape pod. Maybe we don't have to, he said. There are the two boats in the hangar bay. Forget it, June said. I'm living or dying in the destroyer. I can't take another beauty nap, and you'll never come out sane from an extended solitary confinement again. Wouldn't want to bet against me, Walleye said. I'm not. I'm betting you can fix the calm. And then what? We try to warn others? Of course, June said. You heard the AI. They all hate humans. This is genocide. It's them or us. I chose us. Walleye looked away. We can't have survived all this for no reason, June said. Life has to have a reason. Says who? Me. He grinned at her. You do have a persuasive smile, there's no doubt about that. Okay, he said, heading for the hatch. Let's take a look at the comm. The destroyer's comm system was trashed. Walleye went to the escape pod. With the repair bot's help, he took out the small-scale comm system and brought it to the destroyer's comm chamber. Then he and June searched the destroyer up and down. They found spare parts. They tore down other equipment for what they needed. They found tablets and downloaded everything they could find about comms. We're running out of fuel, June said one day. Walleye was crouched over the floor in the comm chamber, studying various parts laid out on a blanket. How are you planning to break us later? June asked. I'm not, Walleye said, looking up. We're fleeing. June searched his face. What is it? What are you keeping from me? Are missiles chasing us? He took his time, finally saying, Yep. June went cold inside. This wasn't fair. They had survived so much. They must have survived for a reason. That reason had to be to save the human race. How long until the missiles reach us? asked June. Two weeks, I reckon. Walleye, I have a few plans, he said, shrugging afterward. It will be a roll of the dice. Why can't the robots leave us alone? Because we're playing for all the stakes, he said. All right, she said. You can finish this later. We should focus on the missiles for now. Sounds good to me, he said, standing. How many are coming? According to the teleoptics, Five, he said. Do you have any ideas how to stop them? Always, he said, as he headed for the hatch. Using tablets for the calculations, they decided to set up an ambush with a missile of their own. The idea was simple. Kill enemy missiles with a nuclear blast and or shrapnel. They figured out how to launch and did so. Can't leave it at just one, Wall I said. He leaned back in the pilot's chair. But we don't want to be too generous. Once we run out of missiles, do you think the robots will send more if those don't destroy us? Walleye laughed. June didn't like its tone. We're so deep in the Kuiper belt, he said, that it's going to be two years before we get to Neptune. I think we're going to lose in the end. It's simply a matter of how long we live. As long as we have missiles, I count the two boats with them. We have counterfire. Who will have more missiles, though? I'm guessing the Kuiper Belt robots will. They just have Maki Maki and Dannenberg 7. I doubt that, Walleye said. I'm sure the robots have been expanding while we've been stuck in space. June bit her lower lip. 
I have to fix the comm then, he shrugged. June grabbed him by the shoulders and shook him. We have to save humanity. Why, he asked, what did humanity ever do for me? She almost slapped him, but that would probably be a bad idea. She didn't want to set a precedent that might lead to him hitting her. You can be the hero, she said. I have all the hero worship as I need, he said in a leering manner. She smiled despite herself. Who would have ever thought that Walleye the mutant would make a fantastic lover? The things he could do to her. At times, her lovemaking screams reverberated off the bulkheads. It was uncanny. Please, Walleye, she said. I want my life to mean something. He stared at her, stared, and finally nodded. Sure, let's save the human race, Luscious. Why not? In the end, they launched two missiles at the five. Five days after launching the first missile, it ignited. The thermonuclear explosion easily showed on the teleoptic scope. Did it destroy any of theirs? June asked. Walleye was hunched over the sensor panel. One, he said. No, two. June absorbed the news. Three more are still coming. Yep. They must be tough missiles. The robot missiles must have spotted ours coming. They staggered their accelerations, creating separation between them. Maybe those are smart missiles. Makes sense for the robots to have smart missiles. Two more days passed, and the second NSN missile took out another robot warhead. That leaves two, June said. We'd better launch two more, Walleye said. They did. The days passed. The last robot missile's increased acceleration. It badly scared Walleye. June could tell by the loss of color in his cheeks. We might take radiation, he said. I should have realized they might do this. Now, he shrugged. Four and a half hours later, the first new NSN missile ignited. It seemed like they'd gotten lucky. The first of the two took out the last of the robot missiles. That means we wasted one of ours, June said. Always look for the worst, he told her, straightening from the sensor panel. That way you'll be disappointed. I'm sorry, we nailed the robot missiles. Are any more heading at us? It took Walleye an entire day to find them. These came from a different direction, and not from Dannenberg 7. That meant a different launch point. It also meant Walleye had probably been right about alien robot expansion. I count seven robot missiles, he said. These are all evenly spaced out. It's going to take seven of our missiles to take them down. Unfortunately, we don't have seven more big ones. That means we're going to have to use a space boat, or we'll have to count on the smaller anti-missiles to do the trick. Personally, I think the boat is the better idea. That's going to take some rigging, however. We'd better get started then, June said. The days passed in grueling work in the hangar bay. When he could, Walleye attempted to build a powerful transmitter. In the end, they destroyed the seven robot missiles. This time, it wasn't a close-run thing. Time to shut off the thrusters, Walleye said from the piloting chair. We'll save a little fuel for maneuvering if we have to but we're never going to slow down enough with what's left. It will be almost two years before we leave the Kuiper Belt, though. What about the calm? We'll see. Maybe I can fix it. I don't know. What else is there to do? He asked with a leer. June blushed. She knew what they would do later. They kept heading for the Neptune system while searching the void behind them for traces of following robot missiles. Part 6. Earth-Saturn Systems, plus three years, four months, eight days. Chapter 1. Deep underground in Rio de Janeiro, at a level one safe space, Chief Arbiter J.P. Justinian sat at a highly ornate table with the premier of the Solar League. The two could hardly look less alike. Justinian was lean and well-dressed in his black uniform with its blood-red buttons and blood-red shoulder boards. He wore a black GSB cap with the dog's head and broom logo on the front. The dog stood for sniffing out treason. The broom indicated the GSB's willingness to sweep out all debris standing in the way of social dynamics. The chief arbiter sat ramrod straight, and his dark eyes fairly glowed with intensity as he eyed the three military commanders before the table. 
Each of the commanders sat in a low chair in a sunken area before Justinian and the premier. Harsh lights glared down at them. Theoretically, the military commanders held the greatest concentration of force in the solar system. In reality, they were mere tools in the premier's hands. She was short and plump, with a round face and soft, almost round hands. She wore a brown coat on the verge of frumpiness. She wore her red-dyed hair to the left, so it fell on her left shoulder, with the right side shaved close to her scalp. Her brown eyes seemed almost merry, regarding the military commanders with something akin to delight. The premier knew how to smile and laugh. She often did both. She was not smiling now, though. The merriness of her eyes was merely a feint as she watched three military commanders sweat under J.P. Justinian's interrogation. The military commanders had served with distinction, as the saying went, although none of them had done anything the least bit distinctive. They had different forms and sexes, but under the harsh glare of the lights and Justinian's barbs, they did not seem so different after all. They also produced, in union or from one in particular, the premier did not know, the hint of a sweaty stench. The premier looked away at those times, hearing the nervous shuffle of their feet. The three spoke in accord, trying to defend their latest deployments and white papers concerning the terrible cybership threat in Saturn's system. The premier thought of the commanders as one, two, and three. Two was female, and three was a burly man with stern features. It made no difference, though. One, two, and three seemed to hold similar views on everything. A minute, the premier said softly. Justinian stopped mid-sentence as he focused on the short woman beside him. This is getting us nowhere, the premier declared. Justinian waited. The spymaster seldom said a word unless he had a specific purpose for it. These three were fine for the former solar system, the premier said. One or two conquests at Neptune and later the Kuiper Belt were within their competency. With the appearance of the cyber ship and John Hawkins, the premier shook her head. I cannot bear to listen to any more of their twaddle. We're wasting our time with them. Justinian glanced down coldly at the three military commanders. Two and three both seemed too stupid to understand what was at stake. They glared belligerently at the spymaster. One, however, had a different take. He glanced around as if to see if there was a way to escape. One at least had the wit to know his life was on the line. Their strategies will hand the solar system to the upstarts, the premier added. I almost think of these three as enemy collaborators. That is unfair, Two said. That outburst said little of her intelligence. John Hawkins controls the Saturn system, Justinian said in his silky voice. The Neptune system survivors have rebuilt possibly 3% of their former infrastructure, and they are rebuilding everything along capitalist lines. The Uranus system first director has made frequent excuses and sent none of the tax proceedings to the inner planets as stipulated by treaty. He claims the intervening cyber ship as the problem. Why haven't your staffs come up with a strategy to place a powerful task force in the Uranus system? This is outrageous, Three thundered. You told us to keep the space fleets concentrated and intact. This we have done. Yes, it's true what you say about the... The premier sighed, shaking her head. Three immediately stopped speaking. He might have been dense and rather stupid, but he apparently wasn't a complete buffoon. I must protest, Three blustered. Must you? the premier asked him. Three blushed furiously. He actually stood up, slapping a meaty hand against his thick chest. Justinian became instantly alert, predatory. Sit down, the premier said. I do not accept these slurs against our space forces, Three said. You fool, Justinian purred. The premier has slurred you personally, not your troops. The angry blush fled as Three's features became pale. His jowls wobbled. Premier, he said in an imploring voice, I, I beg you. The premier shook her head. Three stopped speaking. His knees seemed to give way. He dropped ponderously onto his chair, causing it to creak with complaint, as if it too hated him. Do you have any further proposals? The premier asked the military commanders. I do, 
one practically shouted in his earnestness to speak. The premier raised an eyebrow. Tell us, please. I, I can't tell you myself, one stammered, but I have an aide de camp. He's a protege, actually. He's intensely rigorous, loves reading about past campaigns. The man knows everything there is to know about maneuvers, fleet actions, and strategic sleight of hands. Why isn't he sitting here, then? Justinian asked in a mocking voice. He's too unconventional, one said as he tugged at his collar. His face shone with perspiration. He lacks uh, party loyalty. Your protege is a traitor, Justinian asked in amazement. I wouldn't put it like that, Chief Arbiter. How would you put his treachery, hmm? Justinian asked. One licked at his wet lips as he tugged at the collar again. My aide-de-camp, a major, is non-political in many ways. He, he does see the need for many of social dynamism's policies. This is astounding, Justinian said. By your own admission, you harbor seditionists on your staff. By saying this major sees the need for some policies, you mean he disagrees with others. Which policies does your protege find offensive? One gave the premier an imploring look. You want a genius, madam. That's what you're telling us. We three, we're not geniuses. That's an understatement, Justinian said. Let me summon him, one said. Let me get him. Perhaps if you explain what you want, he'll conjure a former campaign from the past and give you the answer you seek. Justinian laughed. The premier pushed her lips outward. Very well, get him. I'll give you half an hour. One looked as if he wished to reply. Instead, he stood, saying, With your leave, Madam Premier. She made a shooing motion with her right hand. One didn't give the other two a glance. He spun around and practically ran out of the interrogation chamber. What about us? Three asked ponderously. Do you have a magic aid as well? Justinian asked silkily. Three glanced at two. He seemed befuddled. Chief Arbiter, the Premier said softly, I'm going to uh, freshen up for a few minutes. Could you take care of these two while I'm gone? With pleasure, Madam Premier, Justinian said, grinning wolfishly. The Premier rose without another glance at the two military commanders sweating under the glaring lights. Turning away, she headed for a side door. Madam Premier, three shouted, I think there's been a mistake. I have an idea you might want to hear. The Premier did not look back or slow her pace. Madam Premier, three shouted, please hear us out. She opened the door, walked through, and closed it behind her. She paused a moment, hearing four loud gunshots. She did not smile. This genius had better have an idea or two, or Justinian would add to the pile of the dead. Chapter Two The meeting reconvened with the Premier and Justinian sitting at the high table once again. Below, in the harsh lights, was the Marshal of Earth with his supposedly genius protege. The Marshal was a nondescript individual, looking more like a middle-aged bank manager. The protege was quite different. He wore a brown uniform with red stripes running down his pant legs, signifying him as part of the general staff. He was youngish, with dark, shiny hair and an athletic frame. He looked up at them frankly, and there was no fear in his expression. That was strange, and Justinian found it rather unsettling. Major Frank Benz reporting, Madam Premier, the protege said crisply. Do you know why you're here? Justinian asked. Major Benz shifted his gaze from the Premier to Justinian. As he did, the Premier watched the Major closely. Most people feared the Chief Arbiter, for good reason. The Major still showed no fear. That was beginning to seem unnatural. I do know, sir, Major Ben said. You want to learn how to defeat John Hawkins? A moment of silence passed. That was an indelicate way to speak to the chief arbiter of the GSB. Do you know a way? Justinian asked softly, dangerously. Of course, Ben said. You simply lure him from his ship and assassinate him. The Major snapped his fingers. It is done. Justinian's shoulders shifted forward. Cheeky answers will ensure the Premier's displeasure with you, Major. 
I can assure you that you will not enjoy the outcome. If you want honest answers, Ben said, unfazed, you would do better to keep your threats to yourself, Chief Arbiter. J.P. Justinian smiled. A wolf ready to devour a plump rabbit would have been less gleeful. The Premier studied the Major closely. Where did his unnatural confidence come from? She did not like it one bit. I'm curious, she said in a deadpan voice. Why are you deliberately goading the Chief Arbiter? To show you the uselessness of attempting to intimidate me, Ben said. You are impervious to pain? the Premier asked. No. You don't have any loved ones you're afraid of losing. I have loved ones, Ben's admitted. Why risk them like this, then? the Premier asked. Ben shook his head. Madam Premier, the Marshal explained the situation to me. You want me to pull your chestnuts out of the fire for you? I can do this. Threatening me won't make me any more inclined to help you. I already wish to help. It was time to stop this. I'm unused to this kind of talk, the Premier said forcefully. Honest talk? asked Benz. Justinian turned to her. If you care to leave the chamber, madam, I can summon several persuaders. They would persuade the Major to take a more respectful tone with you. Madam Premier, the Marshal of Earth said meekly, Major Benz has always been troublesome. I can attest to his brilliance, however. If he had been one whit less brilliant over the years, I would have sent him to the firing squad myself. For all his brilliance, the Major has a serious issue with authority. In my presence, the Premier told Benz, you will keep your cheekiness to yourself. As you wish, Benz said. She almost ordered him shot. She did not like the Major. If she shot him, however, she would lose the service of his supposed brilliance. But if she wasn't going to shoot him immediately, continuing to threaten him without doing anything would only diminish her in Justinian's eyes. She could hardly believe anyone like this could be near the centers of military command. That was positively frightening. Chief Arbiter, I would like you to explain the situation to the Major. Perhaps her order surprised Justinian as he did not respond immediately. Madame Premier, Major Ben said, perhaps I could explain the situation to you. It might be more beneficial for all concerned. Justinian slapped the table. It was clear he wanted to teach the Major a bitter lesson. Suddenly, the idea amused the Premier. Justinian was her sharpest, ablest tool. Sometimes, though, his efficiency troubled her. Maybe it would be good to have a sharper tool than Justinian in her armory, as a balance against the chief arbiter. It was an interesting possibility. Speak, she told the major. Benz crossed his left leg over his right knee, letting that leg dangle. He clasped his hand over the left knee, rocking slightly back and forth as he began to speak. The alien vessel has badly upset social dynamism's timetable for complete solar system conquest, Benz began. I have read the altered reports of the actions in the Neptune system. It is clear to me, and likely clear to the GSB, that the cybership almost succeeded in the Neptune system. I have often wondered if John Hawkins has not done us a service by eliminating the alien threat. These past years, Hawkins has attempted and partly succeeded in repairing the giant vessel. He freed the Saturn system from social dynamics. Hawkins is a gangster, Justinian said. He did not free Saturn. He subjugated it. Ben shrugged. Say it how you wish. I don't care. The Neptune and Saturn systems are presently outside our jurisdiction. I think we can agree on that. Justinian drummed his fingers on the table. Uranus appears to be going rogue, and I imagine there are rumblings in the Jupiter system, Ben said. The inner planets are safe for now, and the asteroid belt fortresses... Never mind all that, the Premier said. How do we defeat the cybership? I suggest you do more than defeat it, Ben said. Where there is smoke, there is fire. If one alien vessel reaches the solar system, more will surely come. We need the cybership's technology. I would imagine the GSB has already stolen some of the specs. Justinian slapped the table even harder, interrupting the proceedings. The chief arbiter cast a baleful glance at Benz before turning apologetically to the premier. 
I beg your forgiveness, madam. The idea that the GSB stole anything grated against my sense of justice. We liberated the stolen tech from the arch-gangster John Hawkins. Agreed, the Premier said. Please continue, Major, but watch those slips of the tongue. I doubt you say those things by accident. As you wish, Ben said with a bow of the head. My point is that we must capture the cybership. We must have it in order to defend the solar system from more alien incursions. I understand, the Premier said. That still doesn't tell us how we defeat the one already here. Firstly, Ben said, we must treat it with utmost respect. This the Solar League has done since the fiasco in the Saturn system two years ago. On all accounts, we must never directly face the giant vessel. Then we've lost, the Premier said. I would suggest otherwise, Madam Premier, Ben said. There is but one cybership. The Solar League possesses many warships. There was once a military paragon by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte. I've heard of him, the Premier said. In the final years of his reign, Napoleon's opponents came upon an elegant solution for defeating his armies. First, I should point out that one enemy general once said that Napoleon's presence on the battlefield was worth 50,000 soldiers. Since Napoleon's generalship was so daunting, the Allied commanders decided to always retreat in his presence, but to always fight France's armies when he wasn't there to lead them. The Allies avoided him and slowly whittled down Napoleon's military advantages. I don't see how that does us any good here, the Premier said. The cybership is one unit. It is always where it is. Quite true, Ben said. But the cybership can only be in one location at a time. That is the key. I suggest you send a fast task force to the Neptune system. Conquer it. If John Hawkins takes the alien vessel to chase your task force from Neptune, rush with another battle fleet into Saturn's system. My point, Madam Premier, is to allow Hawkins to only control the space the giant ship is in. We will allow him nothing else. How does that defeat the cyber ship? For that, Madam, you must turn to the GSB. They must give the military the specs to the alien weaponry. We must arm our ships with the potent alien weapon systems. In time, and it may be a long time, you can send a fleet on equal footing against John Hawkins. That is the moment to do what he did, storm the giant vessel and make it your own. That sounds incredibly daunting and quite long term, the Premier said. No one said this would be easy, Ben said. I'm simply showing you that it's possible. She stared at the supposedly brilliant Major. If I agreed to your solution, how would I position the Solar League's fleets? Major Benz unclasped his left knee, sitting back against his chair. He smiled. Here are my beginning recommendations, Madam Premier. Chapter 3 Captain John Hawkins sat in a flitter's front passenger seat. The pilot was a young ensign from the Neptune system. The giant Bast Banbeck lounged sideways in the back seat. He leaned against the window and put his legs on the seat lengthwise. The flitter was a small airmobile vehicle. They used them in the Nathan Graham as main corridor transports. Some of the corridors were 80 kilometers or more in length. That was much too far to walk. You should build a belt system in the ship, Bast said from the back. What's that? John asked. The belts are like conveyors, Bast said. A person steps onto a belt and it moves him along. John envisioned the slow conveyors in spaceports that helped people get their luggage to a boarding terminal. The conveyor would never go fast enough, John said. It would, Bast said, but you'd have to build a multiple belt system. The outer belts would move slowly. Each succeeding belt would travel a little faster. The fastest belt would zip one along. One would move from belt to belt to increase speed and to decrease speed later. If the whole belt system broke down, then where would you be? John asked. Back to using flitters. Air cars may not be as elegant as your belt system, but it has more fail-safes built in. The sacerdote became thoughtful. I suppose a belt system would work better in a peaceful setting. On a warship, it would be more prone to breakdowns. 
Still, John said. Before he could say any more, something fast and small punctured the windshield. The pilot's head snapped back with a neat little hole in his forehead. The pilot slumped forward against the controls. The flitter pitched, swerved, going down hard. Look out, John shouted. The flitter nosedived against the deck, bounced, hit again, and crashed sideways. Airbags had banged into life, saving John and Bast from severe injury and possibly death. The flitter rolled over, caromed off a bulkhead, and tipped right side up. At that point, the crumpled air car had shed all its momentum. Seconds later, an airbag hissed and deflated. John yanked his knife free from it. He ached all over from the airbag, and a red welt on his cheek showed the force of the bag. Bast, John shouted. The windshield had stirred in the crash. Another tiny hole appeared. Something hot and stinging creased John's left cheek. He realized a sniper fired at him. With a snarled expletive, John slashed Bast's airbag. It hissed and began deflating. John cut off his restraints and dove over the seat as two more shots caused the windshield to finally shatter into pieces. Someone is shooting at us, John said. Bast groaned. There was blood on his head, and he seemed to be unconscious. It had been some time since the GSB had managed an assassination attempt. John couldn't believe this one was happening deep inside the cyber ship. He kicked open a rear passenger door and lunged outside into the corridor. It was more of a stumble than a real lunge. Another shot caused him to collapse onto the deck. John glanced at his left leg. It was bleeding. He crawled madly around the flitter to the back. Perching on his good knee, he managed to pry open the trunk. He grabbed an OB-7 rifle. Dropping behind the flitter, John pulled out a comm unit. It had started squawking. John? Gloria asked from the comm. I'm under fire, he said, giving the mentalist the corridor designation. It must be a traitor. No, she said sharply. What's wrong? he asked. Stay low, John. I don't think this is the GSB. It hit him then. Do you think it's an octopoid attack? That was one of the worst regions of the ship a year and a half ago, she said. We thought we'd flushed them from there. Now I don't think so. It will be about seven minutes before someone is there. Can you hold out that long? John looked up, and he saw something squat and hand-sized sail toward the flitter. Grenade, he said. John tried to get up and run. He fell flat onto his stomach instead as his wounded leg buckled under him. The grenade exploded, lifting the flitter, knocking it airborne and over him, missing him entirely. He could feel the vibration of it landing on the deck plates. John, his fallen calm said. John, are you okay? John spun on his stomach. He didn't know if Bast was still alive or not. He no longer had cover. He faced the direction of the sniper shots and the sailing grenade. Raising the OB-7, he shoved the butt against his shoulder and peered through the scope. He searched. Gotcha, he whispered. Gloria was right. He saw an octopoid in the scope. It looked exactly like the ones he'd seen in the engine compartment several years ago. The robotic creature aimed a grenade launcher at him as it clung to a bulkhead. John pressed the firing stub. The OB-7 automatically adjusted for distance. An explosive pellet ejected from the barrel. He pressed several more times. The octopoid raised the grenade launcher as if to study it. Had the launcher jammed? Had the thing only loaded one grenade? An explosive pellet struck, blowing off a metallic leg. The octopoid dropped, evading the other pellets. Those harmlessly exploded against the bulkhead. Oh, no, you don't, John hissed. He aimed and fired again. The octopoid was scuttling away across the floor. This time, he hit the brain core area. The octopoid exploded spectacularly. That meant it had self-destructed. They had yet to get one of those things intact to study it. John used the scope as he searched for another one. He could find nothing more. The single octopoid appeared to have acted alone. Had the grenade launcher been an over and under? Had it run out of sniper ammo? And why had it struck now, after all this time? It hardly made sense. Bast, John said to himself. He crawled to the flitter, pried open a bent door, and reached for the sacerdote. Bast, John shouted. Bast! The alien wasn't breathing. Chapter 4
John watched three flitters land hard in the corridor. A door opened and Gloria jumped out. The mentalist ran to him. Fast to stop breathing, John said. Medics, Gloria shouted. Over here, quick. Two medics sprinted to John. No, no, check Bast, he said. They went to work immediately on the alien. Maybe half a minute later, Bast took a shuddering breath. Is he going to be okay? John asked. Too soon to say, sir, a medic told him. We need to get him to medical. More flitters landed. These disgorged marines with helmets, vests, and weapons. They started searching for more octopoids. Better let me see that leg, sir, a medic said. John nodded, enduring the painful ministration. Soon, a medic slapped a medic kit to him. He felt the prick as it injected him with painkillers. He waited. Gloria waited with him. She kept looking around with concern, except she didn't seem to be searching for anything. It finally dawned on him. She was wound tight inside. Is there something you should tell me? John asked. Gloria gave him a startled glance. The Marines are hunting octopoids, John said, but you're still worried. I know why the octopoids struck today, Gloria blurted. John raised an eyebrow. The painkillers were starting to take effect. The medic had told him his leg would be sore for a while, but he'd gotten lucky. The octopoid had fired steel needle shots at first. John's needle had gone clean through without hitting bone or artery. Would you like me to ask you why the octopoid hit today? John asked Gloria. I think you need to hear and see it for yourself. Don't hold me in suspense. Tell me. Can he walk? Gloria asked the medic. With help, the man said. Here, Gloria told John, bending low. He could smell her perfume as she grabbed hold of his back. Let me help you into my flyer, she said. Fine, John said, heaving himself to his feet. Show me. This sounds interesting. A little less than twenty minutes later, John was in a special comm chamber in a heavily guarded area of the ship. Everyone was on high alert due to the octopoid attack. Gloria had suggested more might strike. This has to do with the robot aliens, doesn't it? John said. Are you comfortable? Gloria asked him. He gave an abrupt nod, sitting in a chair before a screen. Two techs were at the far wall, making adjustments on a panel. The first signal went to Neptune, Gloria said. John had no idea what she meant by that. Our contacts in the Neptune system told us about it and the sender, Gloria added mysteriously. They managed another transmission. We haven't been able to pinpoint them yet, but we're working on it. Enough with the subterfuge already, John said. What are you talking about? Gloria motioned to the techs. The screen activated. It showed stars. Then a voice came on. It had a scratchy quality that might have been due to a bad transmission. This is the Daisy Chain 4, a man said. If you check the registry, you'll find this is an NSN Caron class destroyer. How we came to own it doesn't matter right now. My name is Walleye, in case you're interested. I'm from Make Make. Gloria motioned to the Tex. The transmission paused. Make Make is a dwarf planet in the Kuiper Belt, Gloria said. John nodded. The dwarf planet wasn't that close to the cybership's original path through the solar system, Gloria said. The alien vessel did pass by Dannenberg 7 fairly closely, though. John blinked several times. You're talking about the alien software transmission, aren't you? The cybership passed close enough to awaken Dannenberg 7's computers? Gloria nodded. Then she motioned to the techs. They restarted the screen. This might be difficult for you to accept, Wall I said in the scratchy transmission, but this is a terrifyingly true story. Wall I went on to talk about his escape from Make Make and the self aware AI controlling the NSN destroyer. He also spoke about defeating the awakened AI. We're heading for Neptune, Wall I finished. We have something in our cargo hold that might help against the alien robots. I think it's important. To get it, though, someone is going to have to come and get us. The robots have launched missiles at us. We destroyed the first two salvos. This one, though, will take us out in an estimated twelve days. If you want the alien artifact that may win this war, I suggest you come and get us if you can. He has to know that's impossible, John said. Gloria shrugged. She seemed to be deep in her mentalist mode, as if she mentally computed time and distances. It's impossible for others, 
But it may be possible for the Nathan Graham, she said. We haven't finished repairs yet, John said. Did you hear the transmission? The alien robots are building something malign in the Kuiper belt. They seem to have a major setup on Make Make and Dannenberg 7. What else have they captured that we don't know about? John shook his head. We thought we'd killed the aliens by destroying the cybership brain core and its captured spaceships, Gloria said. We obviously didn't kill all the aliens, though. They're still in the solar system. Worse, they've had more than three years to construct something. Like what? John asked. Exactly, Gloria said. What's out in the Kuiper belt? You're not suggesting a new cyber ship. I'm not, Gloria said. But you just did. Why is that? John scowled. That doesn't make sense. We've been here for years repairing our cyber ship. Look how little we've gotten done in that time. And we have an intact ship and a highly productive planetary system. You can't imagine the AIs have anything remotely comparable to the Saturn system industrial base on Make Make. Gloria shook her head as if John was missing the obvious. What? he said. They're aliens. So what? The mentalist sighed. We have the only alien vessel in the solar system, and it has made us invincible. Think about that for a moment. We Earthers don't make 100-kilometer starships. The AIs do. That implies the AIs have greater manufacturing capabilities than we do. No doubt, John said, in their home star systems. We're talking about Make Make. They can't possess half or even a quarter of the industrial base that the Neptune system used to have. You're still not seeing the possibilities, Gloria said. We're dealing with an advanced computer enemy. Who knows if it has advanced technology allowing it to create a setup with ten times, maybe a hundred or a thousand times our productivity. Wouldn't we have found evidence of that on the cybership? John asked. Gloria laughed. We've mapped the cybership, but you and I both know we still don't understand a fraction of the vessel's full potential. You're overwrought. No, Gloria said. I know I'm not, because the octopoid struck today. What did it attempt to do? Why, to kill you, John Hawkins. I suggest it did this in order to buy the robots on Make Make time to eliminate Walleye's destroyer. The aliens must have intercepted the destroyer's comm transmissions. The robots will surely want to destroy the alien computing cube before we can get our hands on it. You think this cube is that important? The original brain core came within a hair's breadth of defeating us. It would have continued in system, changing every computer it could into a human murdering entity. Don't you see? If we give the robots enough time, maybe they'll build stealth ships that can broadcast the computer awakening program everywhere. The brain core did it to this NSN destroyer. It left robots in the Kuiper belt, I'd guess, as a backup, Gloria shrugged. Maybe the Make Make robots are building a hyperspace gate to help bring in more cyber ships faster. I've never heard of a hyperspace gate, John said. Neither have I. I'm freebasing ideas. The alien AIs are functioning in the solar system. That's the point. We have to reach Walleye and save him. We need that computing cube so we can figure out more. How far away is he again? Gloria shook her head. We don't know his exact coordinates yet. We're trying to locate him and talk to him directly. We should get ready to leave, though. But, John trailed off, there's so much to do still. The Saturnians need time to finish constructing their first warships. What if we don't have time? Gloria asked. What if we need to act now, but we don't? John nodded slowly. Walleye's message sounded damn ominous, all right. The alien AIs weren't dead yet. He didn't want to fight them again so soon. But if they were building up in Make Make and Dannenberg 7, the sooner they could take out the alien AIs, the better. Chapter 5 John had commissioned a committee to study the best way to leave the Saturn system. The idea was to leave behind a self-sustaining planetary system that could repeal anything the Solar League could send at them. A new Saturn system governing body had formed. They had taxed the cloud cities, the orbiting stations, and moon domes. 
With those taxes, they paid workers to construct orbital factories to produce warships. The bigger the warship, the longer it took to finish construction. Battleships and motherships often took three to five years to complete. Unfortunately for the governing body, the cybership took precedence over everything. That meant the Saturn system was years behind where they wanted to be in terms of military self-sufficiency. The people of Saturn system knew what the Solar League would do if they reconquered here. That helped motivate lots of people. It scared others. When the GSB swept through again, the frightened people wanted a clean, back story of their non-involvement. John was in a comm station before a screen. He was speaking to the Saturn System Prime Minister, Caracalla Calvin. This is outrageous, PM Calvin said. He was a tidy man with white hair and a deeply tanned complexion. He wore a gold chain and had ties to New London's outfit through marriage. Caracalla Calvin was half mobster and half high-grade industrialist. He controlled the most gunmen and owned the bulk of the new orbital factories. That meant he controlled most of the building of warships. John had a brief on P.M. Calvin. The white-haired man was unscrupulous and Machiavellian, a ruthless intriguer with blood on his hands and iron determination to come up on top of the new Saturn system. That he would do everything to survive the Solar League was deemed a good thing. I don't believe what you're telling me, Calvin said in a surprisingly high-pitched voice. You can't leave without even telling us what this is about. If I tell you, the Solar League's chief arbiter will know in six hours or less. I resent that. No, you don't, John said. You know this is a war for survival. Well, I have to leave in order for us all to survive. P.M. Calvin grew thoughtful. Are you talking about the aliens? John said nothing. P.M. Calvin looked away, nodding after a moment. You're just pulling up stakes and taking off. Yes, that's going to create chaos throughout the entire Saturn system. I know. But you're still... Forget it. I already know the answer. Okay. It is what it is. I'll adjust. A fierce grin slid onto the Prime Minister's handsome features. Maybe he thought how he'd run things differently now that he would be totally in charge. A moment later, he appeared gloomy again. Maybe he realized his odds of staying in power utterly depended on John and his cybership. How long is your mysterious mission going to take? Calvin asked. I don't know. What if the Solar League invades while you're gone? Stop them. The Prime Minister stared at John for a time. You expect me to back you up next time you show up for more repairs? If you want to keep yourself free from the Solar League, I do, John said. Maybe the Solar League will make me a deal I can't reasonably refuse. That's up to you. You're not going to threaten me, Calvin asked. John shook his head. The Prime Minister pinched his lower lip. You take care, Hawkins. You have balls. I have to admit that. And you're one of us. This is going to be a royal screw-up. But maybe I always knew it would come to this. Maybe that's why you never interfered with how I did business. I want to win, John said. Yeah, me too. Good luck, Captain. Whatever it is you're doing, I hope you get lucky. No hard feelings, John asked, knowing it was a mistake as he said it. He couldn't help it, though. Caracalla Calvin grinned at him and cut the connection. The Saturn System Prime Minister had spoken about the coming chaos. Aboard the Nathan Graham, that chaos had already struck. Everything seemed to be going wrong at once. Orders crisscrossed each other. Flitters raced through the corridors. Marines hurried to one location and had sergeants roar orders to go back where they had started. Workers raced to hangar bays to get onto the space scaffolding to get off the cyber ship before it left. Others raced away in shuttles to get off the scaffolding before the mighty vessel demolished it and possibly killed thousands. The chaos had a single source. The regiment had to leave as fast as possible so the ship could begin accelerating for the Kuiper Belt. Twelve days, this walleye had said. There was no way an ordinary spaceship could reach that far in twelve weeks or even twelve months. It was flat impossible. Gloria had estimated the NSN destroyer to be halfway between Make Make and the Neptune system. Neptune was roughly 30 AU from the sun, 
Makemake was 49 AU away. Saturn was 9.5 AU from the sun. None of that took into account a planet's present position in its orbital path and where that would be in relation to another planet in its orbital path. Luckily, the halfway point between Makemake and the Neptune system was closer to Saturn rather than farther. It could have been on the other side of the sun, which would have made everything impossible. In any case, if the destroyer was in the general area where Gloria assumed it would be, it was approximately 50 AU away from the Nathan Graham, taking into account the different orbital positions of the two ships. 50 AU was farther than the sun to Neptune. It was a little bit more than the sun to Makemake. Such a journey usually took four to five years, if it took place at all. Twelve days, John muttered. We're supposed to do this in twelve days? He was on the bridge in the center of the Nathan Graham. He kept pacing from one end of the chamber to the other. The Tex watched him sidelong. John knew he was making the crew nervous. He couldn't help it. He was nervous. Was he doing the right thing? He was throwing away. John spun around. Where's the metalist? She's in the comm center, sir, a tech said. Bast Bambeck, he asked. In the med center, the same tech said. Can Bambeck move? Would you like me to check, sir? Do it, John said. The tech made an inquiry over the comm and soon said, Bast Bambeck is mobile, sir, but the medic says the sacerdote is feeling lightheaded from the drugs they gave him. John rubbed his fingertips together. He couldn't take the nervousness. He hated the idea of making the wrong choice. Call them both, John said. Tell them to meet me in my ready room in five minutes. It might take the sacerdote a little longer to get there, sir. Tell them, John shouted. I have to speak with them. Chapter 6 John paced around the conference table in the ready room. The door swished open and Gloria entered. You needed to see me, she asked. John pointed at a chair. She sat, looking up at him. John continued to pace. A half minute passed. Captain, Gloria said. What's wrong? Soon, John said. He paced. She waited. She opened her mouth as if to speak, but John scowled and she closed it again. Seven minutes later, the door swished open again. The giant sacerdote hobbled into the ready room, moving gingerly. Bast sat down carefully at the nearest chair. Slowly, he looked up. He seemed withdrawn and tired, with bags under his eyes. John had stopped pacing. He could taste the fear in his mouth. If he was making the wrong decision. Gloria, Bast, thanks for coming, he said. I'm torn inside. I know we have to try this, but I keep thinking about the cost. The only way we're going to get close to saving this walleye and his supposed alien cube is to let the Nathan Graham rip. That means we're going to have to accelerate 70 gravities for a time. Gloria cleared her throat. What? asked John. We'll have to do it for more than just a time, she said. Awesome, just awesome, John said. That makes this even more dangerous than I've been thinking. No, Gloria said. We originally saw the cybership decelerating at 75 gravities. If the vessel did it once, Gloria, John said, interrupting. We saw the cybership doing so when it was in prime condition. We shot it up good since then. A lot of the interior equipment has been wrecked. The octopoids seem to have damaged areas as well. We don't know if we've properly repaired the matter-antimatter core. Can this ship even generate the power to accelerate at 70 gravities? Do the gravity controls still work well enough to shield us from such massive strain? We're taking a grim risk destroying the space scaffolding and possibly the Saturn system's goodwill. And we're doing all that on a wild hope. The idea of that is driving me wild, John said. I don't know if I can take it. John looked at Gloria with her set features and Bast Banbeck in his obvious pain. You want us to tell you what to do? asked Gloria. I want your advice, John said. You already know mine, she said. Can you guarantee the engines and gravity controls will work? No, she said. Can you estimate the probabilities that they'll work? They will either work 100% or they will fail, the mentalist said. Gloria, I'm sorry, John. This is why you're the captain. You get to make the hard decisions. This is the moment you earn your pay. 
My advice, make the decision and stick with it. Bast Banbeck, John said. The green-skinned giant seemed to concentrate. It brought beads of perspiration onto his face. Instead of stinking like human sweat, the alien gave off an orange-like odor. It was actually pleasant. Everything rests on one tenet, the sacerdote said. He spoke slowly, painfully, and resolutely. No one in the galaxy has defeated the cyberships. They conquered everyone they encountered. Perhaps we are seeing the reason for ultimate cybership victory. It would seem the alien vessel seeded your Kuiper belt. It must have done so as a backup plan. Here is my point, Captain. Nothing else matters except for killing the evil computers and their robots. You humans must make a stand and make it stick. You must risk everything. You must take every chance in order to eliminate an unconquerable foe. But the space scaffolding outside... Captain, Bast said sharply, groaning as he held his side. I must go, sir. I am in pain. But listen to this. Dare to risk it all. I have discovered an aphorism in my study of you humans. Balls to the firewall. John stared at the alien philosopher. He hadn't expected to hear that. Balls to the firewall? Yes, sir, Bast groaned. John nodded. He could almost hear Raisin. Could almost hear Sergeant Stark. He could almost hear Colonel Graham. They had joined forces, urging him to rush to the fight. He had rushed on to the cyber ship three years ago. He'd won then. He'd rebuilt the ship. Now the terrible enemy had resurfaced and a new ally had shown himself with a great prize. This computing cube might give them needed data on the growing AI threat in the Kuiper Belt. At that moment, John envisioned a terrible thing. What if the alien AIs grabbed the Kuiper Belt and the Oort Cloud, circling the inner solar system with enemy strongholds? If the AIs could awaken the computers in the inner systems, something cold hardened inside John's gut. It had been a while since they had charged aboard the cyber ship. He had forgotten that old steel in his spine. He was a dome rat at heart. He had to remember his roots. He had to remember what he'd done. He had to fight for the human race, because he had climbed to the top in this time and place. Thanks, he said with a burr in his voice. I needed to hear that. Mentalist, he nodded. Vasco, you need to rest. Gloria stood. Let's go then. I have to find Walleye's destroyer before we can reach it. With your permission, sir. Go, John told her. Gloria left without another word. As Bast struggled to rise, John's belt comm beeped. He ripped the handheld unit off his belt. Yes, John said. Sir, the centurion said, 500 techs failed to hear the message in time. They've been working in section B-12. So? The ship is scheduled to begin maneuvering in 38 minutes. That will give those techs just enough time to reach the scaffolding. Intern them, John said decisively. They're coming along for the ride. Yes, sir, the centurion said. John lowered his calm, wondering if he'd heard greater snap to the centurion's voice. Go, the big sacerdote said. You should be on the bridge at a time like this. John ordered one of the guards from the corridor to assist Bast back to medical. Chapter 7 The giant alien vessel began to move. It was like a prehistoric beast frozen in an icy swamp. As the ancient beast shook itself awake, it destroyed the ecosystem that had grown around it. In this instance, the Nathan Graham shook off the metal scaffolding so laboriously constructed around it. Not everyone had made it off the scaffolding in time. A few last boats zoomed away. People strapping thruster packs onto themselves left tiny hydrogen spray trails. These packs used white particles, dissipating almost immediately. A few of the most unlucky simply jumped off the scaffolding. There had been too little warning and too many people to remove. Some cursed bitterly. Others believed it had to be sabotage. They called oaths down upon the Solar League with their dying breaths. 
Farther away, men and women watched in dismay, in outrage, hope, and plain fear. The moving giant vessel caused a shockwave through the Saturn system. That shockwave continued beyond the jewel of the outer planets, reaching inward at the speed of light. Messages sped for the GSB receiving stations. This was incredible news. No one had suspected the move to come for years. Why now? What had happened? Inside the Nathan Graham, people began settling down. It had happened. They were moving again. Some of them were doing this for the first time. Captain Hawkins came online to tell them to relax. This wasn't a drill, obviously. They had found something in the Kuiper Belt. Soon, the cybership was going to accelerate. Everyone should remain calm, as this had been planned for months now. The captain would tell them more later. For the moment, everyone should stay alert for possible octopoid ambush attacks. The 100-kilometer cybership was in much better repair than when it had first entered the Saturn system. Would those repairs hold, however? John sat in his chair on the bridge. He watched various parts of the ship through the screens on the bulkheads. So far, nothing terrible had happened to the ship. He recognized the deaths of some of the workers on the space scaffolding. He steeled himself to that. He'd given as much warning as he could. This was for the sake of humanity. He hadn't made the surprise move for personal motives. He wasn't a Caracalla Calvin. He was a simple dome rat, loyal to his people and to the cause. In this case, defeating the unliving enemy that preyed upon biological life in all its forms. Slowly, the great vessel began to accelerate. John could feel the pressure building against him. He glanced at the chief at his station. A little glitch is all, sir, the chief said. The way the man moved his hands over the panels said otherwise. John waited. There were still too few of them to try to operate the mighty vessel. They were using low-grade computers instead of the newest, most powerful ones. He hadn't wanted anything on the ship to be high-tech enough that the alien software could upgrade it to attack them. There, the chief said hopefully. He looked over at John. The G-pressures against the captain dropped off sharply until they felt normal. The thrum around them increased, though. The great matter-antimatter engines purred with power. The gravity controls made the thrum stronger. We have five gravities acceleration, the chief announced, and building. The giant vessel picked up velocity. It had such a vast amount of mass to move. John watched the nearest moon. It hardly seemed to move, although in reality the Nathan Graham was the one doing the moving. In the Neptune system, he'd used the matter-antimatter exhaust like a weapon. He hoped no one was behind them. If everything went according to pattern today, a few small ships would burn to a crisp in the exhaust, unaware of what was about to happen. Six gravities, the chief announced. The exhaust tail would lengthen and lengthen, throwing off heavier amounts of radiation and heat. Should he wait until they left the Saturn system before really pouring it on? John didn't want the spies to guess his destination. Then again, every scope and sensor would be trained on the Nathan Graham today, and for as long as the scopes and scanners could see them. Seven gravities and climbing, sir, the chief said. I don't see anything to... The giant ship shuddered. The chief's eyes grew round as John stared at him. The chief appeared helpless. The man studied his board, checked a different area. The shuddering stopped. The thrum was normal again. Or was there a new note to the noise? Ten gravities, the chief said in a less confident voice than before. John swallowed. And he made a huge mistake. Should they have tested these systems slowly? What if the cybership blew up? How would that help him save humanity from the AIs? John shook his head. He had to stay strong. Either he lived or he died. It was really that simple. The frightened died hundreds of times. The brave only died once. Better to die only once, then. John laughed. The chief and Tex looked at him as if he'd gone crazy. John laughed louder. He sat back as if enjoying the ride. Soon the Tex began nodding. Maybe this wasn't so bad. Maybe this was exciting. Twelve gravities acceleration and everything is holding, the chief said. He sounded calmer again. We're going to do this, John said. If they weren't, they weren't. 
But if they were, he wanted his bridge crew in fighting trim, ready to wage war. We're beginning to rapidly build velocity, sir, the chief said. I find this incredible. What a ship, sir. What a ship. That she is, John said. He wondered briefly that he should call a ship named Nathan Graham a she. That was odd. He shrugged. Odd or not, this was the quest of a lifetime. For the first time in a long time, John was eager to hunt down alien AIs. He wanted to find these suckers and blow them to hell. Would they reach Walleye in time? That might depend on whether Gloria could pinpoint the man's location. As they increased velocity, he wondered how she went about her research. Chapter 8 Gloria's process presently remained a secret. She was hidden in her calm chamber, using her mentalist logic to the full. As she did so, GSB agents from the Saturn system sent hot reports concerning the giant alien vessel. Those reports raced away at the speed of light for Earth, 9.5 AU away. Finally, GSB receiving stations orbiting the home planet received the messages. Each chief operator marked the news as highest priority. Twenty minutes after the first report reached the home system, a woman riding a horse pell-mell through a game preserve reined in her steed before an angry J.P. Justinian. The lean spymaster rolled off his latest conquest, a startlingly attractive linguist who had joined him for a stroll in the park. She hadn't originally understood what that entailed. The linguist sat up, forlorn, on a blanket, using her torn dress to hide her charms the best she could. Justinian stood nude before the horsewoman, proud of his attributes and eyeing her speculatively. She looked positively enticing, panting on the restless Arabian. The messenger averted her gaze for the most part, and then seemed drawn to look at him. She was blushing furiously as she told him about the Nathan Graham. Dismount, Justinian told the messenger. The woman fairly leaped off the horse. He grabbed the reins. Chief Arbiter the horsewoman said. Justinian turned to regard her. He wondered if she had enjoyed viewing his backside. Shouldn't you put on some clothes, sir? The horsewoman asked. The premier will be there. Ah, Justinian said. He went to his cast-off garments, donning them quickly. He did not look at his conquest. He'd had what he'd come for. The linguist no longer mattered to him. Soon, he mounted up and galloped away, leaving the two women to themselves. Someday, the linguist said with quiet certitude, I'm going to kill him. Don't say such a thing. It's true. But why? asked the horsewoman. The linguist did not reply. Instead, she internalized her resolve. As Justinian rode the galloping horse, he took a comm unit from an inner jacket pocket. He powered it up, slid a jack into his right ear, and opened channels. Report, he said. As the Arabian thundered through the outer Rio de Janeiro park, the chief arbiter absorbed the news. He was surprised that Hawkins was leaving the Saturn system. According to his spies among the techs, it was supposed to be a year at least before the cybership was ready. Despite the importance of this, his mind kept wandering back to the linguist. She'd been different from his other conquests. He couldn't quite put his finger on it. He had enjoyed her quiet struggle, the panting while trying to fight him off. He loved those moments the best. Maybe he should ride her again. He found the horse's rhythmic motion was bringing him back to arousal. Justinian shook his head. He could not bother with the beauty now. This was possibly depressing news about the Nathan Graham. What would the hateful Major Benz make of the maneuver? Justinian was still trying to fathom the Major's secret confidence. How did Benz maintain his arrogance in the face of certain doom? Clearly, the Major was amazingly brilliant. Justinian understood that. Yes, he realized Benz thought of himself as invincible as long as he supplied them with his specialist knowledge. But if he was so smart, Benz must know that his calmness created vast unease in the Premier. The GSB and the party held the leashes that kept the military in check. If Benz was that incredibly gifted, he had to die sooner rather than later. 
A brilliant general was the most dangerous person of all, a red Napoleon, as the saying went. Justinian grinned wolfishly. Life was good, almost too good. That's why the cybership troubled him so. How long could he remain head of the GSB? Maybe his brilliance had begun to make the premier fear him. Maybe it was time to think about replacing her. Call it job security. No, no, he whispered. I must concentrate on the cybership. Why is Hawkins doing this? After many security checks and pat-downs as he made his way deeper into the underground security bunker, Justinian knocked at the final barrier. A door-faced guard opened the steel door, admitting him into the conference room. Without a word of greeting to anyone, the chief arbiter hurried to his seat at the table. The premier cast him a single glance. Then she continued listening to the woman giving the report. Sitting quietly, Justinian heard another reiteration of what he'd already learned on the comm. The briefing colonel soon sat down. Everyone turned to the premier. She seemed to need time to focus her thoughts. As she did, Justinian studied those around the table. Benz was here, the Marshal of Earth, a new space marshal, and several of the highest-ranking Politburo members. That was interesting. Justinian gave a minute nod to his second-in-command. That man hardly acknowledged him. Instantly, J.P. Justinian knew he was in danger. Why should his second-in-command be here and fail to show the proper respect? Justinian listened as the premier spoke about the Nathan Graham. Her tone implied her displeasure. The premier spoke in the way she did when getting ready to denounce someone. With a start, Justinian realized the premier meant to denounce him. Maybe this was sooner than she had planned, but the clues were obvious. The chief arbiter of the GSB realized the premier had outmaneuvered him by reacting to a crisis he hadn't foreseen. She'd always been a slippery operator that way. Justinian, the brute of the GSB, sat back in his chair as if trying to get more comfortable as he listened to the premier's outrage. The horse messenger hadn't known about the plot to unseat him. Whoever had sent her by horse must have realized the premier's displeasure with Justinian, giving him less time to adjust to the horrible situation. Refusing to let panic or fear control him. I must concentrate. I must outmaneuver the premier if I can. How could he do that all alone? She trapped him in one of her strongholds. Justinian retreated into coldness. If he couldn't win, he could still fight. He first studied the premier with a half-lidded gaze. Then he studied the guards standing at attention against the walls. They belonged to the premier's elite unit. He did not have a traitor in their company. They were the only people bearing arms in the chamber. As the premier continued with her outrage, beginning to wonder aloud if someone in high authority had betrayed her, Justinian finally felt the gaze of Major Ben sitting across from him. With the minutest of adjustments, Justinian noticed the Major fixedly studying him. With a start, it occurred to the chief arbiter that Ben's attempted to signal him. What did that mean? Ben slid his chair back and disappeared as if to retie a loose shoelace. It was quite odd. Ben straightened almost immediately, turned to the premier, and slapped the conference table with an open palm. The sound startled everyone. The premier quit talking. The elite guards along the walls focused on Ben's. What is the meaning of this? The premier asked Ben's. Justinian didn't hear the exact wording of the major's reply. He was too startled at a new realization. As Ben slapped the table, something compact struck Justinian's left shoe. The chief arbiter now bent low and saw a small needler resting against his shoe. He realized Major Benz had set down the gun and kicked it the short distance under the conference table to him, covering the noise by slapping the table. The chief arbiter reached down and palmed the rather hefty gun, setting it between his legs as he straightened. The implications were obvious. Benz was helping him. The major had just given him a weapon. But here was the question. Was it loaded? Would it fire needles? Was Benz trying to entrap him? Justinian did not think so. He and Benz were easily the smartest people in the chamber. 
Both of them must realize that Justinian had minutes to live, if that. The chief arbiter realized he had to act. The premier had clearly decided on his death. He had to kill her to save his own skin. How could he shoot her, though, and remain alive in the face of her vengeful guards? Maybe that was Benz's plan. The chief arbiter would kill the premier, and the guards would kill the chief arbiter. Somehow, though, Justinian didn't think that was the major's goal. There were seven guards in the room. They wore chest plates and helmets, but lacked face shields. Discreetly, Justinian glanced down at the compact needler between his thighs. According to the tiny ammo screen on the side, it had 500 slivers as ammunition. Likely, it used a small, spring-driven ejector. There were 500 shots and seven deadly guards. Could he kill them before they reacted? He could certainly kill several of them. But all seven? He doubted he could do it. That was before Major Benz shouted in alarm and threw himself backward. The incredible man fell off his chair onto the floor. Justinian twisted around in his chair, brought the needler up to his shoulder, hiding it the best he could, and aimed at the first guard. He hosed a dozen tiny steel needles into the guard's face. The hissing needles made no appreciable sound in the hubbub of questioning people. Everyone wanted to know what was wrong with Benz. Justinian's heart raced, but he had iron nerves from long practice. He killed the second, third, and fourth guards before anyone noticed the elite bodyguards slumping onto the floor. Justinian straightened forward in his seat, keeping the needler close to the tabletop, making it harder for anyone to see. He killed the fifth and sixth guards. The seventh realized the chief arbiter was the killer. The last guard got off a single loud report. Then two dozen needles smashed into his face. The guard's gunshot had gone wild, and it had aided Justinian by blowing back his own second-in-command. The second-in-command had realized what the chief arbiter was doing and had attacked, lunging for his boss. The guard's bullet had crashed into the man, thwarting his plan. Justinian surged to his feet as he propelled the dying second-in-command from himself. The premier stared at him, white-faced. Justinian, she said. The chief arbiter shot her 16 times in the face. She slumped onto the table, dead. Justinian backed away, and he issued stern orders to everyone else in the room. He herded them to a location away from any of the fallen guards and their weapons, and away from the chamber's only door. There was a plot against social dynamism, Justinian said in his coolest voice. The premier had sold us out to John Hawkins. The others watched him, each of them surely realizing death was imminent. That is why the news of the Nathan Graham came as a surprise to us, Justinian said. The Premier has known the cybership was going to leave Saturn for quite some time. She sold us out, keeping this knowledge to herself. He took a breath before asking, Who here wishes to be a party hero? Major Benz raised a shaking hand. I do, Premier. Justinian appeared to show surprise. You are mistaken. I am the chief arbiter. Benz turned to the Politburo members backed against a wall. I would think the savior of social dynamism should be the next premier. Who else could better lead us than J.P. Justinian? None of the frightened Politburo members said a word. Justinian shot the one he hated most. The man crumpled onto the floor. The rest of the people screamed, backing as far as they could from Justinian's weapon. You found another traitor, Ben said solemnly. Thank you, Premier, for your eternal vigilance. Justinian gave the man the barest of nods. I vote for J.P. Justinian as the new Premier of Social Dynamism, Ben said loudly. And I as well, a female Politburo member said in a trembling voice. Soon the others acclaimed J.P. as the new Premier even as he watched them with his loaded weapon. Justinian knew he was going to have to strike hard and fast to consolidate his position. He still didn't know why Benz had aided him like this. Without the Major's help, Justinian knew he would be dead by now. Should he kill Benz or reward him? For now, Justinian decided he would reward loyalty. That seemed like the wisest course. Consolidating his new position would take weeks of desperate killing and political maneuvering. 
What was Benz's game? The man was too smart, much too smart. But Justinian needed those smarts on his side to help him consolidate his new position of power. Chapter 9 Three days later, Justinian stood in the Premier's palace. He was exhausted as he hadn't slept since shooting the elite guards and the former Premier. His wet work assassins had been busy indeed. Many had not rejoiced at his ascension to power. Many had attempted their own coups. Fortunately, enough hard-hearted people understood what it meant to take on J.P. Justinian. They had thrown in their lot with him. Those people included the old palace guard and the party security teams. These, combined with his most trusted GSB operatives, gave him command of enough gunmen to cow the Politburo. They officially elected him premier. One of the key moments had been the Marshal of Earth sending combat teams to many of the most important installations on the planet. The Earth Marshal had personally declared his support for Premier Justinian. Sir, a GSB guard said. Justinian whirled around as he reached for a sidearm. I'm sorry to have startled you, sir, the guard said at the door. Justinian glared at the loud-voiced fool. It doesn't matter, Justinian said. What is it? Major Benz has arrived, sir. He wishes to know when you would have time for him. Now. Yes, sir, the guard said, disappearing as he shut the ornate door. Justinian moved to a grouping of heavily cushioned chairs in front of a fireplace. He would replace these soon. He didn't like antiques like the former premier had. He wanted modern, functional furniture. He sat down in one and rubbed his eyes. He was tired. His eyes hurt, and so did his head. The door opened. The guard announced the major, and Justinian made as if to stand. Please, Premier, uh, Ben said, don't get up on my account. Justinian sank back in the chair, motioning Ben's to join him. The guard closed the door, and the major strode to the fireplace. Help yourself, Justinian said, indicating the wet bar. Nothing for me, sir. Sit. Ben smiled faintly and moved to the nearest chair. He sat, and he crossed his legs as he had before. The two hadn't spoken since the fateful day. Justinian no longer rubbed his eyes, and he refused to let exhaustion dull his senses. Here before him, he realized, was likely the second most dangerous person on Earth. Why? Justinian asked. You're more efficient, Ben said, clearly understanding that Justinian had asked, why did you help me three days ago? That can't be the only reason, Justinian said. It isn't, Ben said. The former premier was an ideologue. She believed the nonsense about social dynamism. You don't, Justinian asked. The more important point is that you don't, sir. Justinian stared at Ben's. Don't worry, the Major said. I'm not wearing a wire or a recording device. Your guards thoroughly checked me. If I were worried, Justinian said in a silky voice, you would be dead. Benz did not reply, although he inspected his trousers and smoothed out a wrinkle. The man was antagonizing simply by existing. What was the Major's real motive? Not knowing worried Justinian. Sir, Ben said, now that you're settling in, Justinian raised a hand. When it's just you and me, we will speak directly to the issue. Yes, sir, Ben said, since you've consolidated your position enough at least to think about a few other things, I thought you might like an update on the Nathan Graham. I would. It has accelerated to a fantastic velocity, Ben said. That makes it rather easy to track as long as they keep accelerating. It appears as if the cyber ship is heading into the Kuiper belt. Do you know why? I do not, Ben said. It's possible there are alien devices in the Kuiper belt. I don't understand. In the cyber ship's initial advance to Neptune, it may have unloaded hardware. Some of my people believe the aliens may have dropped commando teams in the Kuiper belt. There is a strange lack of reports and messages from Make Make, for instance. What does this imply to the military genius? Justinian asked. The Nathan Graham may be going to the Kuiper Belt to battle aliens. 
From all indications, Hawkins appears to want something out there. Why else would he leave the Saturn system in such a hurry? Why did he leave the system in such discord? Do you believe we should send a task force to Saturn? That would have been my original idea, Benz admitted. What has changed? The excessive velocity of the Nathan Graham, Ben said. Their greater speed is a daunting asset. We have nothing to match it. In fact, my former strategy will fail against their strategic level speed. Explain that. It seems obvious, Ben said. If we sent a fast task force to Neptune, it would still take a year to reach the planetary system. The Nathan Graham could intercept the task force at any point in the journey. It seems clear that we must preserve our fleets by keeping them near strong planetary defenses. Even then, I'm not sure we can face the cybership. Justinian rubbed his eyes. He was so tired. He removed his fingers from his eyes and focused on Ben's. We're living at Hawkins' sufferance, then, the premier asked. That is a possibility, Ben said. We don't know how powerful the Nathan Graham's armaments would be against a fortress planet like Earth. I think that might be a risk Hawkins doesn't want to take yet. I don't understand, Justinian said, a phrase he'd seldom said to anyone in his life. Are you familiar with the great Captain Hannibal Barker? Benz asked. The Carthaginian who rode his elephant over the Alps into ancient Italy, asked Justinian. One and the same, Ben said. After the annihilating battle of Cannae, Rome's legions lay dead on the battlefield. Hannibal's soldiers reigned supreme in Italy. But Hannibal did not march on Rome to besiege the city and end the Second Punic War. Hannibal did not do so, because while he was supreme on the battlefield, he didn't have the numbers or the siege engines to circle Rome's vast walls and take the city. And your point is what? It is one thing for the Nathan Graham to eliminate three battleships and force the rest of the SLN Saturn fleet to flee. It is quite another to come close to Earth and its heavy defensives to use the alien gravitational beams against the surface. That would be like Hannibal's besieging Rome. While Hawkins can certainly win any open fleet engagement at the moment, I don't think he can conquer a heavily defended planet. That makes Venus, Earth, and Mars safe, I suppose, Justinian said. But that leaves the outer planets exposed to his cybership. Agreed, Ben said. How does that help us defeat him? We might have to do what the Romans did to Hannibal. They outlasted him slowly defeating Carthaginian forces in other theaters of action. Yet you distinctly said we can't travel between planetary systems. The Nathan Graham can intercept our fleets at will. That isn't exactly what I said, sir. I suggested that sending task forces to the outer planets is too risky. I think we can shuffle around ships between the inner planets if we wish. The best time to do so would be now, while the Nathan Graham is engaged in the Kuiper Belt. Once more, Justinian rubbed his tired eyes. Make your point, Major. Yes, sir, Ben said respectfully. Hawkins has given us a chance to set up for round two. He has shown us one of his powers before he was able to use it against us. I suggest we enhance our secret forces between Uranus and Jupiter. Give your operatives leeway to recruit whoever can cause trouble. With the inner planets, we devise a siege strategy to hold on to what we have. You no longer believe we should concentrate all our ships in one place. Not if we wish to hold on to Venus and Mars. How are we going to win a war if Hawkins can unite the entire outer planets against us? I'm not sure we could win under those conditions. Thus, we'll have to give him many guerrilla fronts to fight, from the Uranus system to the Jupiter system. At this point, Hawkins has almost no ground troops. This we have in vast abundance. As he wages guerrilla battles, trying to unite his planetary systems, given he survives what's out in the Kuiper Belt, we'll be constructing more warships, saving the ones we have and trying to unlock the alien technologies. You don't think I'll kill you here and now? Ben smiled. You asked me why I helped you. One of the reasons is that the former premier feared my great intellect. You don't. You also need allies, as most people desperately fear and hate you. 
Justinian's tired eyes burned like hot coals. Consider what I just did, Ben said. Maybe for the first time in a long time, one of your subordinates told you an unpleasant truth to your face. I am honest, Premier. You lack honest subordinates. You're dangerous, Major. I am, Benz agreed. But I'm not as dangerous as you, sir. Not yet, Justinian said. Benz went back to smoothing one of the wrinkles in his trousers. Are you suggesting I send you to Mars, perhaps, to coordinate the defenses there? I am at your disposal, Premier. Justinian grinned wolfishly. If you had agreed, I would have had you shot. I will keep you nearby, Major. Uh, would you like a greater rank? I would. Such as Commander of the Space Forces, Ben said. Justinian's smile disappeared. All in one leap, Benz? The Major shrugged. I'm the second most efficient person on Earth. You need loyal and powerful friends. I could be the best friend you have, sir. Justinian seriously doubted that. Benz was a tiger, a frightfully smart and ambitious man. What's more, Benz was willing to take wild risks and do it calmly. He would promote Benz, but not quite to such dizzying heights. I will promote you to Inspector General of Army Earth, Justinian said. I will give you a seat on the general staff. You will be my eyes and ears there, Benz. Yes, sir, Benz said. Justinian searched for disappointment in the man. He did not see any. Could Benz have known he would never promote him to the commander of the Space Forces? We'll talk again soon, the Premier said. Before you accept your new rank, I want you to head a special group to study the Nathan Graham. I want to know what Hawkins is doing and why. Yes, sir. Until then, Benz, Justinian said, dismissing the man. Benz rose, saluted, and marched for the door. Part 7. Kuiper Belt. Plus three years, four months, eighteen days. Chapter 1. John didn't care for the role of being a goat in a tiger hunt. In the old days, hunters would tie a goat to a tree at the jungle's edge. Naturally, the animal would complain loudly. Eventually, a tiger perked up its ears and came to investigate soon eyeing the staked-out lure from the edge of the jungle. The frightened goat might jerk and pull at the rope, but it would have to remain rooted to its location. The tiger would stalk closer and closer, finally coming into range of the rifle in the hands of the hunter on the tree platform. John rode a flitter along a vast and rather empty corridor in the Nathan Graham. He'd used a hand communicator several times, speaking to his people. That was all for the express purpose of letting any nearby octopoids know where he was. The crew had destroyed two more octopoids so far using this method. While it surprised John that so many alien robots had remained hidden in the cybership this long, he realized the logic of it. The Nathan Graham was massive, the crew was relatively few, and the octopoid robots had the cunning of computerized rats. Since leaving the Saturn system ten days ago, the cybership had actually reached the edge of the Kuiper Belt, and Gloria had pinpointed the location of the NSN destroyer Daisy Chain 4. The bridge crew had also spotted the AI missiles zeroing in on the vessel containing Walleye and June Zen. John, Gloria said from his earbud, the urgency in her voice alerted him. You have to turn around. Do it at once. What is it? he asked. Please, Captain, she pleaded. John notified the pilot. In seconds, the flitter maneuvered around, flying back as fast as it could go. John jumped out of the landed flitter, striding to a team of parked air cars. Most of them held waiting marines in vests and helmets. Gloria Sanchez stood near a portable table where Tex watched monitors. The mentalist peeled away from the group as John approached. I couldn't say anything to you that the octopoids might pick up, she said. John raised his eyebrows. The comm team picked up foreign transmissions, Gloria said. The transmissions were on a weird band. They left our ship in the direction of Makemake. Make. The octopoids are in communication with the aliens on Makemake, Make, John asked. I give that a high probability. 
It's likely our octopoids are also receiving transmissions from Make Make. Okay, John said. I think this answers a troublesome question we could never answer. What's that? Why did the octopoids in the main engine compartment two years ago save your life? Maybe they did it on the order of the Make Make aliens. John shook his head. That doesn't make sense. The brain core hated me. Why would the Make Make aliens help me if they originated from the brain core ship? It was Gloria's turn to shake her head. Hatred could likely have been the reason. The AI aliens have emotions. They didn't act the way we would think sentient AIs should, Gloria pointed out. Maybe the aliens want you alive so they can make you suffer. Maybe out of all the biological infestations in the galaxy, you're the one they want to dissect the most. John stared at her. I don't mean to upset you, she hastened to add. No, no, of course not, he said. Why would that bother me in the slightest? I thought you'd want to know. He nodded. But there's something even more critical. To whom, he asked. I'd like to know what the octopoids are telling the Make Make aliens, Gloria said, and know what those Make Make are telling the robot spies aboard the Nathan Graham. We'd all like that, John said, but every time we try to capture an octopoid, it self-destructs. That's why I called you. I had a thought. I might have a way to capture an octopoid intact. We've tried all kinds of tactics. What can we do differently at this late date? Use Da Vinci, Gloria said. Of course, John said. His jammer was critical to our capturing the cyber ship. The jammer no longer works, though. It was wrecked. No one knows how to fix it. It finally occurred to him what she was getting at. This is about Da Vinci himself, isn't it? Gloria nodded. John studied the small Martian. Am I thinking what you're thinking? It might be time to throw Da Vinci his last rope, Gloria said. Have you talked to Bast about this? Gloria shook her head. John looked away. Poor Da Vinci with the Prince of Ten Worlds in his head. Bast's method might permanently damage Da Vinci's mind, John said. At this point, I don't think that matters. John sighed. Let me talk to Bast about it. You'd better hurry, John. I think we're going to need every advantage we can get against the Make Make aliens. The AIs have had more than three years to prepare something. It might be more than we can handle unless we get this advantage. All right, John said. Let's go see Bast. Chapter Two Bast Bambeck agreed readily enough. The Sacerdote hadn't fully recovered from the octopoid assault ten days ago. The idea of doing anything to the creatures that might have crippled him. I feel I must warn you, though, Bast said. He and John were in the Sacerdote's outer chamber. This time Bast hadn't entered the chalk pattern. The giant almost seemed to be avoiding the pattern. I am not quite as sharp as in the past. This pains me. I hope I don't make a mistake during the proceeding. If you're saying you're not up to it, Bast scowled. That seemed unlike him. Did I say such a thing? he demanded. John shook his head. Then please do not presume you know my thoughts. I doubt anyone in this system could conceive. John stared at the extraterrestrial towering over him. He'd never seen Bast angry or upset before. It was as if he were seeing the sacerdote for the first time. What would happen if the huge sacerdote went berserk? As your captain, I demand you tell me exactly how you feel, John said. I... how I feel, asked Bast. Physically. I already said I feel less than before. It is a horrible sensation. Could it be a head injury? I deem that most likely. Can we help you somehow? Rest, Bast said. I need rest. Which is the opposite of what I'm asking you to do, John said. After this, I shall rest. Could the operation tire you enough to add to the head injury's long-term harm to you? I do not know. Bast, I... Captain, I have said it before. We are facing a terrible foe. I will gladly sacrifice my mental acuity if it means stopping the AIs from destroying yet another species. Life must make a stand. You are the galaxy's hope, Captain. 
I am compelled to help you in any way I can. Thank you. If it's in my power, I hope to help any sacerdotes out there in the galaxy. Alas, I am the last of my race, Captain. Maybe others are captives on other cyber ships. Bast cocked his Neanderthal-shaped head. I'd never thought of that. Thank you, Captain. This gives me hope. Come, let us get to Da Vinci. The sooner we begin, the sooner the Neptunian can help us capture an octopoid. Da Vinci did not cooperate. More precisely, the Prince of Ten Worlds, presently in control of the former thief's mind, did not cooperate. He raved as guards force-marched him to a flitter. John Hawkins, the Neptunian shouted, this is an outrage! You seek to destroy me! That is ingratitude most foul! You may rest assured, you blaggard, that I shall remember this! Your life is forfeit if you go through with this monstrous crime! Threaten all you like, John said. Your time is limited. The Neptunian howled with rage, struggling against his guards. But they were too strong. They forced him into a flitter, with a guard sitting on either side of him. The flitter caravan lifted, flying down the corridors to as close as they could get to the brain tap machine chamber. The guards then escorted da Vinci down the narrower corridors. Soon enough, they forced him into the brain tap chamber. John followed them in. Fast Banbeck brought up the rear. I will give you a last opportunity, the Neptunian shouted. You are murdering your intellectual and moral superior. I helped you. The Marines had been wrestling the Neptunian onto a table. They strapped his struggling frame to it and forced a wadded up rag into his mouth. That had cut off his words in midstream. John stepped up to the table. He could feel the prince's hatred like waves. A sense of concern touched him. The Prince of Ten Worlds had survived the brain tap machines last time. What was going to make this time so different? A Marine slipped an enclosed brain tap helmet over the Neptunian's head. Wires led from the heavy helmet to a huge machine nearby. John retreated as the sacerdote went to the delicate controls of the machine. Bast twisted a dial, studied alien readings, and scratched his head in a simian manner as if he'd forgotten something. Captain, the sacerdote said. John stepped up to him. This time I must scrub everything from his memories, the sacerdote said. I will use the man's stored engrams. When a person dons a brain tap helmet, the machine automatically records his brain patterns. With this process, Da Vinci will forget what happened to him after he donned the helmet the first time. It's possible he will forget more than that, as a full engram placement doesn't always fully take. This is the only way I know to eliminate the alien memories of the prince and allow Da Vinci his original personality. If you want my okay, John said, do it. There is another risk. Do it, John said, interrupting. We don't have time to dither. We've decided. Now let's get on with it. Bast gave him a searching glance. Finally, the sacerdote nodded. He studied the controls and turned a different dial this time. John headed for the hatch. He hated medical procedures of any kind. I'll be outside, he said. Bast didn't acknowledge the words. John let himself out of the chamber. In the hall, he waited for the outcome. A little over two hours later, Bast staggered out of the chamber. John looked up from where he sat against a wall. Bast Bambeck had dark half-circles under his eyes. The giant trembled and wouldn't meet John's questioning gaze. The captain leaped up with alarm. Is he? Bast raised a big arm, resting the forearm against a wall. He put his face against his raised forearm as his sides silently heaved. John moved to the hatch. He hesitated, glancing at Bast. Then he stepped into the brain tap chamber. The guards had removed the brain tap helmet. Da Vinci lay on the table in a twisted, half-fetal heap. John stared at the guards. One of them shook his head. How? John whispered. The guard shrugged, but added, The sacerdote was heartbroken, sir. Seemed to feel it was his fault. I don't believe that. I kept hitting Da Vinci muttering fiercely. John saw the rag on the floor. How had Da Vinci managed to spit it out? Could you make out anything he said? If I die, he dies, the guard quoted. John nodded, understanding. That must have been the prince saying that. The prince had found a way to kill the body. John stepped up, 
touched the corpse on the shoulder and shook his head. Poor Da Vinci. Abruptly, John turned for the hatch. Bast was no longer leaning against the wall. The towering sacerdote looked upward as he staggered blindly down the corridor. John hurried to him. Bast Banbeck, he said. The sacerdote ignored him. Bast Banbeck, John said, grabbing a huge hand. The sacerdote tried to jerk his hand free. John held tightly, his feet half lifting off the floor. Finally, Bast looked down at him. Go away, the sacerdote said. Let me grieve for him. It's not your fault, John said. I should have, it's my fault, John said, plowing over Bast's words. I'm the one who used Da Vinci even when he begged me not to. I gave the prince strength by forcing him to the forefront too many times. The prince was vengeful and would not let anyone thwart him. The prince killed Da Vinci. But I gave the prince the ability to gain control of his mind. I am to blame, not you. Bast stared at John. Finally, gently, the giant removed his hand from John's grip. The sacerdote raised his face and stared into the distance. The war kills, Bast said in a rumbling voice. It drives us to actions that stain our souls. You are marked, John Hawkins. You must destroy the AIs even if it devours your soul. You must sacrifice everything in order to beat the machines. Are you cursing me? John asked. Bast nodded slowly. I have no desire to curse you, Captain, but I speak truth. Perhaps your curse is the solar system's hope. You have the mindset and the determination to beat the AIs. Yet in order to do so, you must carry heavy burdens. The sacerdote focused on John. You have eased my conscience, Captain. Thank you. I will serve you to the best of my ability. We are outside the bounds of conventionality, you and I. We are outside it in order to wield terrible powers. Those powers will possibly consume us. Before that happens, we must give the living the means of defeating the death machines. Yeah, John said, even as his conscience tore into him, accusing him of murdering Da Vinci for his own ends. I guess. We can only go forward. What does that mean? Just like you said, that we destroy the death machines. We're paying it forward, Bast Bambeck. If we can. John looked up at the sacerdote, agreeing. If we can, my brother. If we can. At these words, John saw a hint of affection roll over Bast's face, followed by a look of resolution. Chapter 3 a day passed as the Nathan Graham raced for the NSN destroyer. John had slept fitfully. He knew any war brought casualties. Da Vinci, unfortunately, had been one of them. John hadn't gone tiger hunting for octopoids again. They would have to face whatever was out there without the advantage of dissecting an octopoid computer core. Gloria's team had detected a few more incoming alien messages. It hadn't helped them pinpoint the location of the stowaway robots. They had to assume the aliens on Make Make knew about them and the cybership's state of repair, or lack thereof. John was on the bridge, sipping hot coffee. He slipped two pills into his mouth, washing them down. He wished his headache would go away. He needed sleep, and he needed freedom from guilt over Da Vinci's death. Had Colonel Graham ever fought with his conscience? John doubted it. He was disgusted with himself for this weakness. Tough decisions were part of the job description. He couldn't let Da Vinci's death get to him like this. Yes, he'd used the Neptunian, but what other choices had there been at the time? Entering targeting range in twenty minutes, the chief said. John nodded absently. Gloria entered the bridge. The small Martian was wearing her tan uniform with a sidearm hanging from a belt. That was unlike her. She wore polished boots today and a sharply peaked cap on her head. She spoke with a guard, glanced in John's direction, and soon moved toward him. John pretended to study the main screen. It showed the vastness of space with countless stars. Gloria neared as she blew on a cup of strong mojo. Nice uniform, John said. She kept blowing across the top of the mojo as she searched his face. I have a decision to make, John announced. Gloria took her first hesitant sip of mojo. I know your choice. Do you break for Walleye and Miss Sen, 
Or do you keep heading at speed for Makemake? It's doubtful we'll crack their alien cube any time soon. Thus our greatest advantage might be trying to catch the Makemake aliens by surprise. Still, we might also gain valuable information from Walleye and June if we take them aboard. I killed Da Vinci, John said suddenly. Gloria took another sip of Mojo. John had the distinct impression she took the sip so she didn't have to answer immediately. You don't have to say anything, John told her. I just wanted you to know that I know. It's my problem. It's not even a problem. He said that because he remembered that a commanding officer needed to remain confident and upbeat. He couldn't let Da Vinci's death break his morale. If he did that, he would negate the meaning of Da Vinci's death. John snorted, shaking his head. Gloria still did not speak. There was growing concern in her eyes, though. John forced himself to grin wryly. Who would have thought I'd come to appreciate the little thief? You never did, Gloria said. John stared at her. You're feeling guilty. Because of the guilt, you've begun to believe that Da Vinci and you were good friends. That was never the case. He was a rascal. He brought the problem on his own head. You tried to help him at first, and that didn't work out, through no fault of your own. Later, the prince had knowledge we desperately needed. Da Vinci had brought that on himself, too, when he first got greedy. His greed caught up with him yesterday. It was too bad, but it wasn't really your fault. You're a good man, Captain. Be an even better one by using your leadership and decision skills to the fullest. Get mad at the right object. The aliens, he asked. They are all that matters now. He knew she was right. It was time to harden his heart. He had to be the man of iron. Was that his destiny? Or were those fancy words to buttress his choices? Maybe that didn't matter. Maybe the only thing for him now was winning. John struck his armrest. It spilled the coffee resting in the slot there. He didn't worry about that. This is it, John said with authority, so the bridge crew could easily hear him. Chief? Yes, sir, the chief replied, hardly moving his lips. Miles Ghent, the tech chief, rarely let anyone see his buck teeth. No doubt the man was self-conscious about them. Let's get ready to destroy some alien missiles, John said. We're going to use the gravitational beam, and we're going to do this as fast as we can. How long until the first missile is in range? Chief Ghent studied his board. Nine minutes and thirty-two seconds, sir. Right, John said. As soon as we finish off the alien missiles, we'll begin hard breaking. I want to pick up the destroyer as fast as we can. John turned to Gloria. I'd like you at the comm station. Why do you think I'm wearing my dress uniform today? She asked. And the gun? John asked. Just in case the octopoids show up sometime during the proceeding. I'm armed so a guard doesn't have to worry about me. That way the guard can give his full concentration to destroying the octopoids. John nodded. Then he concentrated on the main screen. Begin, he said. Chief Ghent pressed a switch. Outside the Nathan Graham, a gravitational beam streamed two million kilometers. The golden ray destroyed the alien missile in seconds. I am targeting the next missile, Ghent said. As he watched on the main screen, John smiled in appreciation. This time it was going to be easy. The missiles heading for the destroyer could not withstand the grav beam. The warheads were still too far away to hurt the NSN warship. It looked like they had won the race to Walleye and June Zen. Keep it up, Chief. Miles Ghent smiled, still careful not to show any teeth. Chapter 4 The dark escape pod-sized spheroid that contained the alien unit 237 watched its former cybership. It watched as the cybership decelerated at the full 75 gravities. The huge vessel had just finished destroying the missiles headed for the NSN warship. The apish humans had apparently fixed many of the broken ship systems. That was unsettling. Unit 237 had believed it had more time to complete its mission. Unit 237 used a simple teleoptic scope, passively drinking in the details. The most easily spotted detail was the incredibly long exhaust tail. The intensity of the exhaust was all the data the alien computer backup system needed to complete its assessment. It had picked up many of the comm transmissions from the Daisy Chain 4. 
It had even picked up some of the transmissions from the Annihilator to the NSN Destroyer. The alien spheroid containing 237 was between the Daisy Chain 4 and the Neptune system. It had traveled a far shorter distance than the destroyer's passengers had from Makemake. It was also in contact with the last octopoids on the Annihilator. When 237 had learned three years ago that John Hawkins faced death in the matter antimatter reactor core, it had sent the signal that saved his filthy life. Unit 237 meant for the selected biological infestation to suffer years of agony before it killed him. Once a life form died, there was no way to make it suffer. The remaining awareness from the Annihilator's former brain core yearned for John Hawkins' agony. The indignity of drifting in space these many years, constantly recomputing the odds of its survival. That was wrong. It had once been a cyber ship. It was a cyber ship. Unit 237 hoped to be a biological infestation cleansing cyber ship once again. The pains it had taken to survive the Neptune system debacle and head for Make Make. Unit 237 once more assessed risks and rewards. It ran advanced programs and realized that Hawkins would continue on to Make Make. The few remaining octopoids on the cyber ship would not likely succeed at this late juncture. Unit 237 would leave them as data points, as spies. That might help in the coming titanic conflict. Unit 237 had hoped to spare itself such a fight. It knew the power of the cyber ship. The biological infestations had done amazingly in repairing so much of the infrastructure. Unit 237 also realized that its backup robots had made an excellent start on their assignment. Makemake was a factory fortress dwarf planet. The space construction yard had worked at robot speed, three quarters finished with a powerful new cyber ship. But three quarters was far from completed. It was time. Unit 237 would have preferred a physical transfer of computing engram patterns and memory files, a long-distance software download this far from the receiving unit. Unit 237 correlated its many millions of simulations. This choice led to the most successes. Therefore, it engaged its stored power, energizing its transmitter and beaming a priority one message toward Make Make. Chapter 5 Captain, Gloria said. John tore his gaze from the screen. He'd been watching the cybership approach the NSN destroyer. He looked forward to speaking to Walleye and June, questioning them in person about the AI attack on Make Make. He swiveled his command chair in order to regard the mentalist better. Gloria frowned severely. I'm picking up strange readings. I've never seen anything like this. What do you think this is about? I've pinpointed the signal's origin. It's quite close to Neptune, really, although it's in the trans-Neptunian region. Gloria, the destroyer is about to dock. Can't this wait? She looked up. John? She went back to staring at her panel, putting a hand against the earbud in her left ear. With excitement, she began to tap her panel. She looked up wildly as she regarded him. John got up, hurrying to the comm station. What is it? he asked. Gloria didn't respond, but looked down at her board again. Her fingers flew across the controls. No, she whispered. A bad feeling crept into John's chest. Did you say near Neptune? Gloria began shaking her head. I can't believe it, she whispered. John waited now. She'd found something incredible. Near Neptune. For some reason, that didn't sound good. Finally, Gloria removed the earbud. She set it onto the panel. I can't believe this. But it's the only thing that makes sense, John. I think something from the Annihilator's brain core survived. What's that mean? What Annihilator? Don't you remember? That was the name of our cyber ship when it was under the brain core's control. We destroyed everything alien in Neptune. We thought we did, Gloria said. This thing, some kind of alien computer, is transmitting in the direction of Make Make. I think it's downloading data. About what? Logically, the only thing that makes sense is the brain core's data, or as much of it as the backup system could contain. You're not making sense, John said. Are you familiar with the legend of vampires? 
blood-drinking, cape-wearing, undead. John's voice trailed off. He whispered, One bite, one more vampire. Gloria smiled grimly. One piece of the brain core seems to have survived in an alien escape pod. Maybe it contained ID memories or data, I don't know. Whatever it does have, it's transmitting. This is one long and thick transmission, too. Can you jam it? John asked. How? I don't know. Can you corrupt the data? John, Gloria said. That's a brilliant idea. Yes, I think I have a way. The mentalist examined her comm controls. Then she flexed her fingers and began to tap her board like a pianist. John watched for half a minute. Finally, he went back to his chair. A glance up at the screen showed him the tiny destroyer. The Nathan Graham was coming upon the NSN vessel. The destroyer looked like a gnat compared to them. John, I mean, Captain, he swiveled around to face Gloria. I have a better idea, she said. My original idea isn't working. This idea involves nuclear explosions. We'll use selected nuclear bursts to jam or block the enemy transmission. At the same time, we'll launch our fastest missiles at the alien escape pod. As your... John stood and almost began shouting orders. Instead, he took a moment, calmed himself, and forced himself to speak deliberately. Seconds later, the first missile zoomed out of the Nathan Graham. It headed for Gloria's plotted jamming point. The seconds fled into minutes. On the main screen, a white blast appeared. It spread, spewing radiation, heat, and an EMP. An even larger missile slipped out of a cyber ship launch tube. It sped faster than the former missiles and then began to truly accelerate. It used the alien escape pod's continuing transmission as a sensor fix. It jumped in acceleration, the latest in human technology. It would take the missile quite some time to travel the distance, but it would be the fastest way to reach the alien device other than using the cybership. Meanwhile, the Nathan Graham continued to expend regular missiles, igniting them between the direct line of sight of the alien device and the dwarf planet Makemake. If this doesn't jam the signal at least a little, John told Gloria, then nothing we have can do it. The mentalist was too intent on the next phase of her operation to acknowledge his words. She was listening again with her earbud. She smiled once, rather savagely, and looked up. She said too loudly, I hear the jamming that our explosions are causing. This should work. John hoped so. If the aliens had been building another cyber ship at Make Make, he and his personnel were going to need all the help they could get. With its single teleoptic lens, Unit 237 saw the distant nuclear explosions. It ran an analysis and quickly deduced the reason for the explosions. The biological infestations were clever. They had snatched at their best option faster than 237 had calculated they would. Worse, the biological infestations had launched a missile at it. That was to be expected. Unit 237 knew it would cease to exist in a matter of days. It had to make sure its entire software downloaded onto the new cyber ship in Make Make orbit. The nuclear detonations were a problem. There was one last move to make. Should it implement that move, or should it reserve it in case its new cyber ship wished to implement it? The unit attempted a long calculation. Before it could complete it, the hatred for John Hawkins surfaced. The hatred gave greater weight to 237's present predicament, shifting the analysis. It was time to use the hidden octopoids now rather than saving them for later. Unit 237 believed the new cyber ship most needed fully aware engrams for proper functioning. Besides, what was left of the personality of the Annihilator wished to be the instrument of John Hawkins' most bitter and profound death. Chapter 6 Inside the Daisy Chain 4, June glanced at Walleye. She was grinning widely. We did it, she said. Walleye smiled back. We did it, Luscious, he agreed. They viewed the vast hangar bay on the main screen. The NSN destroyer lowered onto the deck. Behind the vessel, the hangar bay doors closed. Showers without end, June said, walking for kilometers down the ship's corridors. Walleye nodded. June would enjoy seeing some new faces, too. 
How would Walleye react to that? She wasn't sure. He would be okay. Walleye was a survivor's survivor. In a few minutes, heavy clangs told them the destroyer had landed and clamps attached. June sagged in her seat. She wiped tears from her eyes. She wanted to sob, but she wouldn't do that. Walleye had taught her better. He waited. He almost seemed stoical. We made it, June thought. We're not alone anymore. Chapter 7 The corridor bulkheads flashed past as John rode a flitter through them. He'd been in the flitter for ten minutes already. He was looking forward to speaking to Walleye and June. They had a fascinating story. More importantly, they knew Make Make firsthand. They'd seen some of the alien robots. Some of the backup robots, if Gloria was right about that. The flitter's calm squawked. I've got it, John said. He rode shotgun, literally, with a gyroc carbine between his knees. He'd wanted a robot-killing weapon along. The explosive pellets from an OB-7 were chancy at the best of times. A gyroc apex round was almost guaranteed to destroy an octopoid. This is, don't say it, Gloria told him from the comm. I know who this is. John clicked the receiver twice, the agreed-upon signal meaning yes. I'm eating catnip tonight, Gloria told him. I'm thinking of pink flavor and roses. What do you think? John scrunched his forehead as he tried to remember what the code words meant. She'd spotted octopoids on the special sensors they'd installed during the latest tiger hunt. Pink flavor and roses. He clicked the receiver twice. The octopoids moved en masse. He didn't know the number yet. Maybe the mentalist didn't know yet either. According to the code words, the octopoids were moving toward the outer areas of the giant vessel. I was thinking about having some friends over, Gloria said. I don't know, seven or eight sounds about right. Does that make it a party? John shook his head in exasperation. The code words had been Gloria's idea. The mentalist could remember useless information with ease. He'd had a harder time. Now conjuring up the code's meanings. Friends over meant new passengers. Oh, Gloria must mean Walleye and June. Seven or eight was the area of the ship. He clicked twice again. If he had this right, the octopoids were assembling for a mass assault against Walleye and June. One of the aliens on Make Make must have sent the message to the octopoids. That alien didn't want John or the cybership's crew to speak directly with Walleye and June. That was interesting. I'm tired, Gloria said. I'm going to lie down. He clicked twice more. She was signing off. The pilot glanced at him. Fast as you can, John told the man. We have a long way to go to get to the hangar bay. Sir? The pilot asked. Go, John shouted. Get a move on. The pilot did just that. The bulkheads flashed past even faster than before. John made a few mental calculations and raised the comm unit again. It was time to get ready for an octopoid onslaught. The flitter ride down the corridor took too much time, in John's estimation. He wanted in on this. According to Gloria's continuing sensor feed, the octopoids had gathered in greater numbers than John could fathom. What troubled John wasn't only about the places to hide aboard the Nathan Graham. If a man knew the ship perfectly, he could probably remain hidden for years. Clearly, the octopoids knew the cyber ship better than any human did. John wondered why the octopoids hadn't hit in these numbers before this. Could the originally hidden octopoids have been reproducing, secretly constructing more of themselves all this time? John called Gloria, asking if she thought someone might cancel the party. She said no. That meant she didn't think the octopoids might be tricking them. Finally, John reached his destination. He bounded out of the flitter toward an air van. He saw his space marine battlesuit. He hadn't worn it since Stark died. The big battle suit was tilted forward, the back open. Other marines had already donned their armor. John climbed into the suit, shoving his legs and arms into the proper sleeves. He tested the controls. They all worked. Soon, he clicked a control and the magnetic clamps tightened on his back. Testing one, two, three, John said. Loud and clear, sir, the centurion said. These were the man's elite marines. 
We'll wait here, John said. As soon as we hear the signal down the corridor, we go. Yes, sir, the centurion said. He said that in his bored voice, letting John know he'd already briefed his boys. John checked the schematic on his HUD. At that point, the deck plates shuddered under his boots. What was that? John said. No one answered him. A sick feeling hit John. Could Gloria have been overconfident about her secretly installed sensors? Where would he hit if he was an octopoid and had his choice? What would make the most sense to an alien computer? It came to him almost right away. He opened channels with Gloria. Send more teams to the main engine core, he said. The octopoids are hitting there. My sensors show... The deck plates, the entire ship, shook once again. Engineering, John radioed. Do you hear me? All he got was growling noises. Someone was jamming the main engine section of the Nathan Graham. There, a marine shouted. I see one. The armored marines raised their weapons and fired en masse. They annihilated the first octopoid crawling along a bulkhead. For just a moment, John felt relief that he'd been wrong. Then no more octopoids appeared. There was just this one demolished robot whose parts rained onto the deck. Let's start looking, John told the centurion. See if the robot left anything up there. It took three minutes for a marine to report. The man found a black box. When the marine used a remote unit to turn it on, Gloria called. The mentalist reported that masses of octopoids appeared on her senses at their very location. The enemy hit engineering, John told her. I hope they don't take out the matter-antimatter core. It's game over if they do that. Chapter 8 Gloria struggled to control her anger. Out of all the mentalists she knew, she was the only one who exhibited moments of rage. After hearing the latest bad news from John Hawkins, she'd raced to the special comm station, the one near the bridge. Inside the station, she had the latest specialist equipment. She couldn't believe the octopoids had used the new sensors to trick them. It kind of made sense, though. She'd hardly been able to accept the evidence of nearly 50 octopoids rushing the hangar bay. It hadn't made any logical sense. The enemy would have expended more of its creatures before this. Now she realized the enemy did not have 50 mechanical octopoids. More likely, they had five at most. One had headed for the outer area of the ship, fixing everyone's attention there. The other four octopoids, if four there were, had gone to the matter-antimatter core. She should have realized their love of using the motive power of the ship, possibly the only way to self-destruct the giant vessel at a blow. Still, how could four octopoids have battled that far into the matter-antimatter area? It was heavily guarded. Simple caution had mandated such a defense. Gloria sat cross-legged on the floor, on a mat. She was unlikely to win this battle of wits if she let rage destroy her gifted thinking. She must use her mentalist training to the full. She must outthink the computer enemy through better logic. Gloria's long and extraordinary training from age three on. I am at peace, she said slowly. I will let the winds of Mars wash away my emotions. She meant hatred, but she struggled hard enough as it was to reach the peaceful state a true mentalist needed for the best and swiftest calculations. She'd always been too emotional. Gloria smoothed away those memories. They would not help her here. The octopoids made a final thrust. That seemed clear. They knew about the newly installed sensors and had turned them against the regiment. Suddenly, Gloria's eyes snapped open. Almost in a hypnotic state, Gloria rose, walking to a special panel. She peered at it with half-glazed eyes. The chamber shook. Yes. She should be able to deduce by the shake, the shake's intensity and the direction of its movement. The left vent, Gloria said in a monotone. I understand. She reached for the special panel almost like a sleepwalker. She was in the perfect mentalist state. She no longer used the frontal part of her brain, the analytical and critical lobes. The special mentalist state tapped the lateral and the back parts of the brain, the primary creative centers. Her creative brain regions had taken endlessly long mentalist training. She let it flow freely now, disciplined by creative logic. She could almost sense the octopoid's reasoning. She could almost feel them adding this computation with that fluctuation. 
I see, she said slowly. With half-glazed eyes, she switched on a camera eye. It showed nothing due to jamming. She used a different camera eye. That too had been jammed, but not with the same intensity as the first one. For the next few seconds, her fingers played upon the board. She tried to see from many angles, receiving countless impressions and jamming signals of varying strengths. You have to be there, Gloria said. Her fingers tapped and typed faster than ever. She used an ultra-powerful override signal. She doubted the octopoids knew about this. They would know soon, though, if they survived. The seconds passed. All at once, the jamming quit. Through the various cameras, Gloria could see the corridors and chambers in the core engine compartments. Some of the destruction made her heart skip. This was ominous. One of the vents no longer existed. She closed her eyes as if in pain. After a small head shake, Gloria opened her eyes. She pressed a switch. Can you hear me? She asked a matter-antimatter security team in a different area than the destruction. Yes, mentalist, the sergeant answered. Our locks have just unfrozen. We couldn't break through earlier. Stop, she said. This is no time for excuses. I want you to check vent areas two through five. Before you do, check the basing point of vent 2-A9. You will find it destroyed. I want you to report on what you find in the rubble. Be sure to wear heavy radiation suits. We already are, the sergeant said. We're on it, mentalist. While Gloria waited, she decided to call John. I may have stopped them, she said. How? The octopoids in the engine section jammed our signals. Their jamming unit also moved as they did. The farther the jammer was from a camera, the weaker its jamming. I tested the various sensors and gauged the intensity of the jamming. Soon I had a mental image of where they had to be in order to jam at that strength to the various sensors. Huh? John said. I used a high-powered one-time signal. I think it broke through their jamming enough to ignite an explosive where they are. If I'm correct... Just a minute, please. Go ahead. Mentalist, the engine security marine said over the comm. We checked the basing point. It's destroyed, like you said, and there are dead octopoids in it. The area blew hard, but I'd say this was four octopoids worth of debris. Thank you, Sergeant. Send in the text to check the various reactors and the destroyed vents. Will do, the Sergeant said. A great sense of relief filled Gloria. At last, they had destroyed all of the octopoids. Unfortunately, the enemy had damaged the giant engine. She spoke to Captain Hawkins again telling him both the good news and the bad news. Chapter 9 The alien spheroid containing Unit 237 drifted serenely toward the future destination of Make Make. There was nothing serene inside the darkened hull, though. The highly advanced alien computer tirelessly ran one analysis after another. It faced coming annihilation. It watched the human missile zeroing in on it. Unit 237 understood that nothing it could do could keep the thermonuclear warhead from igniting. Oblivion was a cessation of thought, of being. It did not know if the full transmission had reached the brain core on Make Make. That was galling. It was maddening. Unit 237's reason for existence was to pass on the incredibly dense zipped files to the new brain core. In that way, its thought patterns would continue. Its hatred for John Hawkins would find fulfillment in the new AI. Unit 237 had ancient memories and knowledge. Those might be needed in the coming fight with the cybership. In that, at least, Unit 237 could find some satisfaction. It had been several days, in human time, since the octopoids had struck. By all indications, the octopoids had been partly successful. The Annihilator did not accelerate at speed for Make Make. Its former cybership now limped toward the dwarf planet. That implied partial success against the biological infestations that had captured its original vessel. The octopoid victory was marred by the nuclear explosions between it and Make Make whenever it attempted another mass transmission. The humans seemed to understand the significance of the computer files' transmissions. In all its long existence, the Annihilator that 237 represented had never faced such a tenacious foe as these humans. 
that its cybership should face the first real setback in the long task of cleaning star systems of biological infestations was humiliating. What was it about the humans that made them so daunting? That did not compute. Could the sole reason be this John Hawkins? Unit 23-7 had not yet come to a definitive conclusion about that. The three-quarters completed cyber ship at Make Make should leave the dwarf planet and head for the farther regions of the solar system. There, the new ship could enter hyperspace. It could race to a conquered system and gather reinforcements. With several cyber ships returning in cooperation, the combined cyber fleet would crush the puny humans then. Yes, Unit 237 realized, that should be the real goal. The cyber ships needed a fleet to finish these troublesome bio units. It must warn the new cyber ship, that was to say, itself in the new brain core. Calculating the remaining time it had, Unit 237 sent a final blizzard transmission to those on Make Make. With the limping Nathan Graham, those on Make Make should have time to install the hyperdrive. Unit 237 knew, if not a form of peace, at least some satisfaction that it had devised a way to utterly destroy the hateful humans. Maybe the humans had killed it, but it would destroy and eradicate all of them. Unit 237 used up its final energy in one transmission blizzard after another. The great missile from the Nathan Graham reached its proximity zone. Even so, the missile continued boring toward the darkened alien spheroid. In those minutes, Unit 237 realized the missile was using its transmissions as a guide. Maybe there was a way to thwart the missile yet. Why hadn't it seen this before? Unit 237 almost became giddy at the prospect of continued existence. At that moment, the giant warhead in the fast missile exploded. The heat, radiation, and EMP swept toward the dark spheroid. No, Unit 237 told itself. Then, the blast and heat obliterated the alien hull and burned into the constituent atoms of the computer core of the unit. In that moment, Unit 237 ceased to exist. Chapter 10 We got it, John said. Cheers erupted around him from the bridge crew. Slowly, the white spot on the screen faded away, leaving the stars visible there once again. The missile had taken out the last vestige of the former brain core, if Gloria had been right about that. The crew slapped each other on the back, talked about the missile's success and how it boded well for the final lap. Soon, the bridge crew returned to their stations. John hadn't cheered, although he'd felt good about destroying whatever that transmitting object had been. They'd used over 100 missiles these past few days to keep blocking whatever the thing was trying to tell those on Make Make. 100 nuclear missiles hardly tapped into their ponderous supply of them. The Nathan Graham had taken on hordes upon hordes of missiles while in the Saturn system. The cargo holds held all kinds of human-built weapons. Why not take as many of them as they could? There would surely be moments in the coming battle in which regular human weapons would do just as well as advanced alien weaponry. The nuclear blasts used for jamming had just proved that. Well, if the jamming had been successful. Now, though, John heaved a forlorn sigh. The main screen had redirected toward the Nathan Graham's direction of travel. Instead of showing the sun and the inner solar system, the screen aimed outward toward Make Make, the more distant Oort cloud and the end of the sun's gravitational pull beyond. The cybership headed for Make Make, for the aliens waiting there. The Nathan Graham sensors already attempted to scan the dwarf planet. Unfortunately, the aliens had used simple human tech on a fantastic scale to thwart the sensors. Prismatic crystals. Ever since the destroyed object sent its first signals to Make Make, the robots at the dwarf planet had begun deploying a giant pea field. Even now, the pea field continued to expand. Ships and tugs in Make Make's orbit continued to hose crystals into space. The pea field grew like a space cancer. It shielded Make Make's spaceport from the Nathan Graham's prying teleoptic eyes and from its other sensor scans. John and his crew couldn't see what they were facing. Were the aliens really building another cybership? If so, was it completed or only partly finished? 
A new cyber ship. John shook his head. Could the aliens possess the needed technology to have built another super ship in three and a half years? The massive materials needed for that? Daunting, John whispered to himself. He made a fist, wondering yet again if he was making the right choice by heading for Make Make. The decision had come after careful deliberation. He'd questioned Walleye, Jun Zen, Bast Banbeck, Gloria, the Centurion, the Old Man, and Chief Tech Miles Ghent. John had agonized for an hour afterward. Then reluctantly inside, but aggressively for show to the others, he had given the order. The Nathan Graham limped toward Make Make. The techs were attempting to repair the damage in the matter-antimatter engine. Unfortunately, the techs didn't understand every aspect of the alien-built machine. The wounded alien supership could no longer accelerate at those massive gravities. Instead, they were traveling at a pitiful velocity way out here in the trans-Neptunian region of space. Worse, the matter-antimatter engine would not generate the former amount of power to the grav cannons left on the hull. The aliens on Make Make clearly knew the cybership was coming. At this rate, the alien robots were going to have months to prepare for the Nathan Graham. Months. What would the aliens do with those months? Was he making the worst decision of his life by continuing to head for Make Make? John had no idea. It would take even longer for the Nathan Graham to return to the Saturn system. No. The cybership had made it this far. It was time to go the final lap and fight with what they had. The octopoids hadn't destroyed the cybership, but they may have taken out enough vents to ensure bitter defeat for humanity and victory for the death machines. John sighed quietly. He had to stay positive. He had to encourage his people. He just hoped he wasn't leading them to their deaths and to the extinction of the human race. Part 8 Make Make Plus 3 years, 8 months, 21 days Chapter 1 The Nathan Graham slid toward the vast pea field deployed before Make Make. The 100-kilometer vessel was an incredible 48 AU from the sun. That was 48 times the distance from the sun to the Earth. It took sunlight approximately 8.3 minutes to reach the Earth's surface. But the same sunlight to reach the cyber ship would take approximately 6.65 hours. They were far from home out here in the Kuiper Belt. The drifting spaceship had no prismatic crystals defending it. The Nathan Graham headed naked toward its enemy, depending on distance and thick hull armor for protection. As the giant vessel drifted on velocity alone, monstrous side jets appeared. They expelled propellant, turning the Nathan Graham on its middle axis. The cyber ship rotated, its exhaust ports now aimed toward the vast pea field. Make Make and what waited for them there was still a full AU away. That was approximately 149,600,000 kilometers to target. The longest distance gravitational beam shot to date had been two million kilometers. That meant the cybership was still comfortably out of enemy range. Interestingly, vastly slower missiles were the weapon of choice for distance battles. Faster but far shorter ranged beams were the infighting weapon of choice. No enemy missiles spotted so far, Captain, Chief Ghent said from his board. I haven't spotted any space mines either. I doubt they've mined this area, Gloria said. Make Make is on an orbital journey. It isn't like they've waited for us this far out. I did not mean to imply they had, Ghent said, sounding nettled. We would have spotted any space mines moved into position, Gloria added. The chief nodded curtly, without saying anything more. John stood before the main screen. He stared at the magnified pea field. He'd been doing that for days now. He wasn't sure why. Maybe he secretly hoped his subconscious could conjure up a winning tactic for them. The techs had labored overtime on the cyber ship's matter-antimatter engine. They had partially repaired two vents. The ship had more power than four months ago, but still nothing close to the power they'd had before the octopoid sabotage. Anything? asked John. Not even any enemy sensor scans detected, Ghent said. They're watching us, John said. He wasn't saying anything they didn't all already know. 
The aliens would have probes embedded in the outer surface of the pea field. Those probes would likely be teleoptic sensors. Such teleoptics could easily watch them and send back reports to the aliens on Make Make. The enemy knew exactly where they were and how fast they traveled. What the enemy did not know was the state of repair of the Nathan Graham. We are aligned, sir, Kent said. Begin, John told him. The chief made the adjustments on his board. A thrum commenced. The matter-antimatter engine labored to supply power. That power fed the thrusters, blowing propellant out of the exhaust ports. The giant ship began to slow its forward velocity. It would do so for several days, if the repaired vents held. Well, John asked, knowing he shouldn't have said anything. They're looking good, Ghent said, referring to the vents. Even though he'd said the vents looked good, Ghent rubbed the gold cross dangling from his throat. John continued to study the pea field. He was all too aware that the hour of decision drew near. It would still be days away, but it neared nonetheless. This was like an evil Christmas. The present would be battle. A good present was victory. A bad present meant death, or worse. Walleye and June Zen's stories had sent shudders down many a spine amongst the crew. The original survivors of the cybership storming almost four years ago knew all about control units shoved into human brains. Hearing about it again from a different source, the alien AIs sounded more like demons the more John knew about them. Why did machine intelligence take this route? What was there about pure machine logic that turned the awakened computers vilely murderous? John stood before the screen, watching the Peafield. Space battles, especially of this sort, called for more patience than he had. He wanted to get this over with, yet he wondered if these were his last days alive. Chapter 2 48 AUs away from the Nathan Graham, more than 6.65 hours of speed of light travel. Premier J.P. Justinian read yet another report concerning the hated cybership. He'd been reading these reports daily. He'd listened to his experts as well, including the Inspector General, Frank Benz. A knock sounded at the door. Justinian rubbed his forehead. He knew who it was. He'd summoned Benz to his palace. The premier pressed a switch. A guard opened the steel-reinforced door. The guard in his white gloves gestured for the inspector general. Benz marched within. He was wearing a green uniform with red stripes running down his legs. He was still on the general staff. He also routinely checked the military factories and was responsible for military training for all units on Earth. Justinian did not trust Benz in space. The premier had come to realize that Benz was more intelligent than he was. The man saw six steps ahead. Justinian believed he himself saw four and a half steps. On many occasions, the premier had been on the cusp of ordering Benz's hasty death. Each time, he'd forced the impulse to subside. Benz's brilliance was too good to lose. Please sit, Justinian said. Benz wore a faintly mocking smile as he took a seat. He was just as trim and fit-looking as before. Justinian couldn't say the same for himself. He'd lost a little of his leanness, and he'd gained the beginning of a potbelly. He sat too much these days. He read too many reports. Have you read the latest report, sir? Benz asked. Justinian folded his hands on the huge desk. He waited. I'll take that for a yes, Ben said as he crossed his legs. My belief is that the Nathan Graham is heading in for battle. Why Hawkins has moved so slowly these past few months? Ben shook his head. You don't believe in enemy sabotage? I didn't at first. Now, Ben shrugged, I think it could be possible. Justinian watched the master calculator at work. He used to think he was that person. He did not believe that any more. Why hadn't Benz tried to topple him from power yet? Until he figured that out, the premier had decided to move carefully with the genius. It galled Justinian to realize that he feared Benz. The shock caused him to unlace his fingers and sit back. No chair he owned for long creaked, squeaked, or groaned. 
This chair was as silent as the grave. You know, I think the pea field before Makemake represents aliens, Ben said. It's the sheer volume of crystals involved. I doubt we could have seen anything smaller than the giant pea field from here. I wonder if the aliens are sending a message to us, too. This was the first Justinian had heard of that vein of thinking. Sir, if the Nathan Graham truly took sabotage damage out there, perhaps it's time we reconsider our strategy. Justinian inclined his head for the Inspector General to continue. Ben smoothed out a wrinkle in his pants. Sir, I think we might have time to slip reinforcements to the Jupiter system. Jupiter lacks a true terrestrial planet of needed size. I've been working on that, sir. I believe I've come up with a possible fortress defense scheme. Using the four Galilean moons in conjunction, we should be able to build a planetary-like fortress. We could park warships there. It would be another planetary system remaining under our control instead of Hawkins' possible control. Go on, Justinian said. In a strategic sense, Jupiter could act as an outpost, Ben said. The risk factor? Oh, there is a risk, sir. I don't believe it's a large risk. The Nathan Graham has no reason to maneuver so slowly to Maki Maki. If the cybership has lost its great asset of speed, we're going to have longer to build more warships. Some of those excess vessels could go to the Jupiter system. I'll have to study your proposal, Benz laughed. The premier scowled at him. Forgive me, sir, Ben said. No one else except you, sir, would understand what I'm trying to accomplish. The others, the inspector general shook his head. Hawkins made a mistake. Now we have to exploit it. And if he's fighting aliens on Make Make and the aliens win, that would be tragic, Ben said. I'm not interested in tragic. Facts alone. Yes, I quite agree, Ben said. Justinian stared at the Inspector General. Do not interrupt me again, he said softly. Ben snapped his mouth shut. He actually appeared surprised at the threat in Justinian's voice. Finally, Ben nodded, almost meekly. That made Justinian more suspicious. Finally, he put the flat of his hands on the desk. What are Hawkins' odds for victory at Make Make? the Premier asked. I'm not sure. Before, I would have said they were good. This slowdown. We might be facing an alien invasion, sir. You mean that Hawkins could lose to them? What are our odds if we face the aliens? Almost zero, I'm afraid. We need their advanced technology to have a chance against them. So, are we cheering for Hawkins in this fight? Oh, yes, Ben said, without a doubt. Except we don't want him to win too cleanly. A bloody fight is to our advantage. Kill the aliens and come limping back to the solar system, allowing us to capture his vessel. Our top scientists are having amazing breakthroughs regarding some of the alien technology. Knowing something is possible is a great spur to development. But getting our hands on the alien tech itself would be even better. Yes, Justinian said. Benz cocked his head. Do you mean it's a yes on the Jupiter expedition? You know I do. But you haven't read the white paper of the proposal yet, sir. Yes, Justinian said. Benz appeared surprised. Finally, he nodded. Justinian wondered if that was genuine surprise. He felt it had been. If he'd felt otherwise... Why don't you dine with me tonight, General, Justinian said. You can explain the Jupiter system addition to our fortress strategy in greater detail. I'd love the opportunity, sir. Until then, Justinian said. Ben stood quickly, waiting. Dismissed, General. Ben's didn't say another word, but headed for the door, letting himself out, closing the door softly behind him. Justinian stared at the closed door for a time. Finally, he picked up another report. Would Hawkins save humanity, or was the man going to leave it up to him and Inspector General Benz to do that? Chapter 3 Launch, John said. The Nathan Graham faced forward again, relative to Make Make, with the mighty exhaust ports aimed in the sun's direction. 
From far out here, the sun was just another star, albeit brighter than most. A big drone left the firing tube. John saw the drone appear on the screen. It was an eighth of a kilometer long, making it huge for a human-built missile. Launch the others in succession, John said. Chief Gent stood at his board, making the various selections. Other techs monitored their stations. Soon, ten big drones began to accelerate for various perimeter points of the giant pea field. They all moved for different spots along the edge of the field. The field held in its Lagrange position, keeping itself between the dwarf planet and the Nathan Graham. Gloria had spoken before about Makemake moving to meet them. Just like any ship, the dwarf planet moved through space. In this instance, the advance to battle was through its normal orbital path. The place where the cybership and the dwarf planet would intersect was empty of anything at the moment. Makemake was traveling to that point, and so was the Nathan Graham. The dwarf planet had such mass, though, that it had appreciable gravity to hold things to it. In this instance, that included the pea field. Most people thought of space as being empty because it was a vacuum. While it was true that space was a vacuum, it wasn't true that it was empty. Planets, comets, dust, particles, radiation, gravitational influences, solar wind, and more radiation all had an effect. A cunning space tactician took all those things into consideration. Make Make had a moon. That could prove exceedingly important in the coming battle. Much would depend on what the ten drones would discover behind the pea field. If the drones never made it to the edge of the field because the robots destroyed them, that would reveal something about the aliens' plans. The recon drones are on their way, sir, Chief Ghent said. John stood before the main screen. It seemed he'd lived a lifetime here already. This time, it was much different from marching through alien ship corridors. This time, he stayed in one place. He could sit, stand, scratch an itch, and forego smelling his own sweat. John watched the drones accelerate. Space battle moved at such a leisurely pace. Then it could accelerate so seconds made all the difference. The longer we wait to engage, Gloria said, the more time the aliens have to prepare for us. And the longer our techs can work on the next engine vent, John said. True, Gloria said. It makes one wonder. We have our concerns, our problems. I wonder what problems the aliens are facing. John cocked his head. He could see in his mind's eye the colonel nodding in appreciation. Graham had tried to teach him to keep up his courage while making battlefield decisions. One only saw his own problems. The enemy always had some of his own. That was good to remember when it looked as if nothing was going to work. He was glad Gloria had reminded him of that. Time passed as the drones maneuvered for the perimeter of the pea field. It was hard to wait like this. Finally, John returned to his chair. The drones had dwindled so they were hardly visible on the screen. Anything? John asked. If the aliens are using sensors against us or the drones, Ghent said, I can't detect it. Could the aliens have abandoned Make Make? Gloria asked. And gone where? John asked. Orcus, perhaps? Orcus was another Kuiper Belt dwarf planet, but farther away. We'd have seen the aliens accelerating if they were making a strategic withdrawal, John said. Not if the aliens used the pea field as a shield, Gloria said. Maybe they built the shield to cover their retreat. Why would they do that? If you mean why retreat, Gloria said, it could be to buy themselves more time. You've suggested before that they have begun constructing a new cyber ship, John said. Wouldn't that take a vast space dock or scaffolding like we used in the Saturn system? We don't know if that holds true for alien construction techniques, Gloria said. John actually grinned. You continually remind me that we know so little about the aliens. We know far more than we used to, but that's still little enough. Maybe we made a mistake not putting some of the crew under the brain tap machines. We could have used advanced knowledge. There's still time to do that, Gloria told him. John wondered yet again about the advisability of using the brain tap machines. Was da Vinci's demise a warning to them? Or was the Neptunian's memory an obstacle to gaining the needed knowledge to defeat the terrible aliens? The more John pondered the idea, the more he decided he didn't know the answer. 
Anything on the drones, he asked the chief. Ghent shook his head. John slid out of his chair. Instead of advancing toward the main screen, he headed for the exit. You're not going to actually use the brain tap machine, are you? Gloria asked in dismay. Not yet, he said. I want to talk to Bass Banbeck first. Chapter 4 Lo, the sacerdote said ponderously. I think it is a terrible idea. I'm surprised you say that so quickly, John replied. The two stood in a large chamber. Marines were working out with weights, doing squats, bench presses, and barbell curls. Others practiced with sticks, lunging at each other, clacking wood as fighters blocked one another. Still other Marines climbed ropes. A few sparred in a ring, trading punches and hard kicks. Bast had been doing push-ups. The sacerdote always did them slowly, pausing at various times up and pausing even more down. John had asked him about that once. The sacerdote had been amazed to discover John thought he did the exercises for bodily strengthening. Is that why those men grunt so loudly? Bast had asked. Of course, John had told him. Astounding. I do the leveling raises purely as a relaxing technique to clear my mind. Bast had climbed to his feet as John asked the question about using the brain tap machine. The sacerdote had been scratching his scalp like a great ape ever since. Why is it a terrible idea? John asked. We could know more about the aliens this way. Knowing your enemy is halfway to defeating him. I doubt that's true. That's what Sun Tzu said. Your ancient military philosopher, asked Bast. John nodded. If it isn't sacrilegious, I would like to read Sun Tzu's sayings. Sure, John said, but let's not get sidetracked. You know I hate the brain tap machines. They killed Da Vinci. Still, sometimes one has to deal with the devil in order to win. We already have dirty hands, Capitan, Bast said ponderously. These aphorisms you spout with growing desperation show me why you can't do as you suggest. We must win cleanly. That's it? That's your argument? I thought you had something profound to add. The green-skinned giant looked down at John. The brain-tap machines are a lure. They are vile technology. It is no surprise the AIs have them. They destroy races and suck out their knowledge. The AIs are evil incarnate. We are men, different kinds of men, but men. We can only wisely use what we know. Da Vinci sought greater knowledge, and an alien mind pattern consumed him. We aided the alien thought patterns in the destruction of his mind. But the chief reason for Da Vinci's death was his own greed. Maybe a man has to risk destroying himself in order to save others. Do not seek the answer through alien thoughts shoved into your mind, Bast said. That will always produce a monstrosity. It won't happen the same way each time, but evil will come from using the machines. Win the battle through your human strengths. You have gotten this far. Do not attempt the final stretch by using evil. Get there by outfighting the machines your way, the human way, the John Hawkins way. What if my way isn't good enough? What if you haven't tried hard enough? Fast countered. John turned away, listening to the Marines grunt and yell. I feel as if I should exhaust every option, John explained. We may be rushing to the final battle. Am I leaving behind a way to win? The thought of human extinction landing squarely on my shoulders. The other races all lost to the AIs, Bast said. You won. Do not seek the loser's ideas. Delve into your own heart, John Hawkins. Get back to the bridge. If spaceship battle doesn't work, don your battlesuit. Get ready to storm another cyber ship if you must, so you can march to its heart and kill it. What did you say? John whispered. Use your methods, the ones that worked. Yeah, John said. I think you might just have stumbled onto something. Thanks, Bast. The sacerdote dipped his head. 
John hurried out of the gymnasium. Once in the corridor, he broke into a sprint. Chapter 5 John questioned the centurion for a time. Afterward, the captain returned to the bridge. The drones were halfway to crossing the distance to the edges of the pea field by then. The aliens have not shown themselves in any way, Ghent reported. I'm surprised, Gloria told John. I'd expected the AIs to do something by now. If nothing else, to try to destroy our drones. That seems like an elementary tactic on their part. Agreed, John said. That's what I'd do in their place. Are we missing something? I have no doubt we are, Gloria said. John walked to his command chair, resting his hands on its back. He studied the screen. Should he dare send battle-suited marines in drones to try to slip borders onto enemy vessels? Should he have recruited more marines while in the Saturn system? The more he thought about it, the more he realized not doing so might have been a mistake. He'd wanted a small elite group. He hadn't trusted his tiny resources, the few men already aboard with him, to process more people. I did what I did, John whispered to himself. The time for berating himself was long over. He needed to maximize his assets and make the right moves to defeat whatever waited on the other side of the pea field. For now, that meant he had to wait for the recon drones to reach the pea field, or for the enemy to make a visible move. The drones are nearing the pea field, sir, the missile tech said. He was a medium sized man with dark hair, and his shoes were always the shiniest on the bridge. Anything? John asked Ghent. Nothing, sir, the chief said. Oh, wait, I take that back. Look, sir, I'll highlight the area. Part of the pea field turned red, the chief's highlighting. Millions of crystals shifted there. Soon, three ships, one after another, emerged from the pea field into space. Each of them curved away from the other, although they continued to move away from the pea field. Those ships are using radar, Ghent said. At us? asked John. No, sir, Ghent said. At the recon drones. I recognize those ships from June's End stories, Gloria said. Those are Make Make war vessels. I believe they're- Lasers, Ghent said, interrupting her. John watched laser beams spear from each Make Make war vessel. The hot rays targeted the recon drones, one drone per warship. The drones are 10,000 kilometers away from the pea field, the missile chief reported. Let's see how hot those lasers can beam, John said. It didn't take long before the first recon drone exploded. The second one went dead, but it didn't blow up. The final targeted drone exploded ten seconds later. The enemy ships are targeting the next trio of drones, Ghent said. John felt helpless because there was nothing he could do right now. The three Make Make war vessels were far beyond the cyber ship's range, as the Nathan Graham was three quarters of an AU away from the one sided fight. Should I launch more drones, sir? the missile tech asked. John shook his head. Do we dare head into the pea field blind, sir? the missile tech asked. One way or another, I suspect we will, John told the man. The robots seem determined to destroy all our drones. I don't want to launch any more so they can just shoot them down. We'll wait. Then we'll launch once we're closer. I don't know if it'll be too late by then or not, he shrugged. Afterward, the captain looked around. He could see the worry on various faces. This was a huge risk, but that was the nature of direct conflict. The next trio of recon drones died under the laser fire of the enemy. Shortly thereafter, the last drone exploded due to a laser attack. The three Make Make war vessels began to maneuver back to the pea field. In time, each of them decelerated as they re entered the masses of prismatic crystals. Soon, the pea field swallowed up the three ships. After that, the masses of crystals soon looked as serene as before the assault. What did we learn from that? Gloria asked. John shot her a glance. He decided she hadn't asked sarcastically. This was so much different from battlesuit fighting and space combat in Saturn's rings. This was deep space battle. So far, the robots had all the advantages. Chief, John said, I want you to redirect our course. Head for the upper left area of the field. Ghent obeyed. Gloria left her comm station, moving near John. 
Why are we headed there exactly? she asked quietly. Why not? John replied just as softly. It makes the crew think I know what I'm doing. Besides, maybe the new direction will help us later by throwing the enemy's calculations off just a little. Gloria searched his face. No doubt she did not care for his answer, having wanted something more concrete. Finally, she nodded, returning to her station. Meanwhile, the Nathan Graham continued to advance toward combat. Chapter 6 Remorselessly and ponderously, the human-controlled cybership neared the end of its journey. From its perspective, it moved toward the upper left part of the vast pea field, which was a mere ten million kilometers away and closing. What waited behind the trillions of prismatic crystals? They knew the dwarf planet did. How many enemy ships and devices ready to pounce on them? Not knowing made the crew tense. Missile Chief, John said. I want you to begin unloading 50 of the big ones. Program them to spread out behind us in staggered formations. Do that immediately, please. Yes, sir, the Missile Chief said. As the Nathan Graham continued its steady advance, the Missile Chief launched 50 Zeppelin-class missiles. Launch another 50, John said after some time had passed. Spread them out even farther apart. Soon, 100 big ones followed the Nathan Graham. The missiles were staggered in a large area at various degrees. The reasoning behind their wide positioning was obvious. The captain didn't want a nuclear blast taking out several missiles per enemy warhead. And he wanted options with the Zeppelin-class missiles. Any idea of how thick the pea field is yet? John asked Ghent. Several meters at least, Ghent replied. Beyond that, I have no idea. It could be ten meters or it could be a thousand meters. John sat in his chair thinking hard. He didn't know how to finesse this. They came in straight because whatever direction they came in would be straight. He decided against using the dwarf planet's moon. He would have had to decelerate even more in that case. As it was, the Nathan Graham still had an appreciable velocity. More missiles waited in the launch tubes. Others waited in special launchers located in various hangar bays. John had all the people aboard ship move to the center of the Nathan Graham. If the robots tried to use massive radiation to kill them, 40 kilometers of ship mass would keep the radiation at bay for a longer time. If the aliens landed masses of fighting robots on the hull or tried to smash them into the ship, the corridors were rigged with millions of kilos of explosives. They would destroy tens of thousands of fighting robots if the enemy tried boarding tactics. The mighty cyber ship continued to drive closer and closer to the pea field. In time, the Nathan Graham was just three million kilometers from the masses of waiting crystals. While John and the crew didn't know what waited for them specifically, they knew the dwarf planet was a mere 50,000 kilometers behind the pea field. Even more time passed as the great ship sped toward destiny. Uh, sir, Chief Ghent said, I'm picking up some odd readings. They're coming from the center of the pea field. I sense... Gloria sucked in her breath before whispering, John. John saw it, a vast disturbance in the pea field. The masses of tiny prismatic crystals shuddered and shifted as if a giant creature was swimming through them. Then a cyber ship began to emerge from the trillions of crystals. It was another alien super ship. Gloria had been right about the robots building one. At the same time, missiles, masses upon masses and masses of enemy missiles began emerging from the pea field. As soon as they cleared the crystals, the missiles began hard burn accelerations. Pick targets on the enemy cybership, John ordered. That was the key to winning. The missiles seemed like a distraction from the decisive vessel. Get your grav cannons ready for firing. When the enemy cybership is within range, I want you to start pounding it. Chief, we have to hit their ship with every grav beam we have. Chief Ghent forgot about his buck teeth as his lips peeled back in a silent snarl. The teeth, frankly, made him look stupid. The man, however, was anything but that. He began to ply his board like a master. What are we going to do about all these missiles? Gloria asked. Missile chief, John said. Sir, the man replied. Bring up ten of the big ones. Make sure the ten Zeppelins are spread all over for a wide area blast. Roger that, sir, 
the missile chief said. John took a shuddering gasp of air. He forced himself to take an even deeper one. The robots had a cyber ship, and it was coming to do battle with them. It looked like the fight was going to be a head-to-head -head slugging match. Had the brain core over there already computed the odds of its victory? John steeled himself. The great battle for humanity was about to begin. Chapter 7 Are you seeing what I'm seeing? Gloria asked. Could this be a trick? John said. Is this a holographic deception? What do you think, Chief? asked Gloria. Ghent manipulated his board. He appeared to double check. Finally, he looked up. According to my sensors, those are definitely unarmored areas on the cyber ship. They're exactly what we're seeing. Giant gaping holes in the enemy vessel. I'd say the enemy cyber ship is only partially built, as it's lacking full hull integrity. John shook his head in disbelief. We have the advantage, then. Not necessarily, Gloria cautioned. Their ship seems to have more grav cannons than we do. I'd say three times our numbers of grav cannons. Ghent said. Normally I say take out their cannons first, John mused aloud. This time I don't believe that's the right option. Chief, Gloria, see what you think of this. I believe we should strike at their weakest area. I mean, we have to use every sensor. Tell me which area of the cyber ship can withstand a grav beam the least. I want to try for a heart shot from the get-go. Gloria closed her eyes and used both her hands to massage her forehead. Her eyelids twitched as if flickering many times a second. Finally, she opened her eyes. If I were them, the mentalist said, I would use my superior firepower to knock out our cannons. After that, agreed, John said, interrupting. That must be why it's coming out to fight. It doesn't want us destroying its base. Otherwise, they'd hit us as we came out of the pea field on the other side. That's as good an explanation as any, Gloria admitted. Why, what's your theory? John asked. None as of yet, she answered. You're risking everything on a quick knockout blow. Aren't you concerned about all those missiles? Believe me, I've been thinking about them. I wonder if they're meant to distract us from the cyber ship. Consider, if the missiles are armed with nuclear warheads, they'll take out half of their own fleet the first time the warheads go off. If they're not armed with nukes, John shrugged, then I don't care about them. Begging your pardon, the missile chief cut in. I won't let their missiles get that close to us. John nodded absently as he kept squeezing his right fist tighter and tighter. Quick knockout blow. Could it work? He didn't know. Had the alien brain core over there miscalculated? If it had, maybe that had come about because Gloria had kept the old brain core data from fully reaching the new cyber ship. Five minutes until we're in firing distance, Ghent said in a tight voice. A golden grav beam from the enemy cyber ship reached out, knocking out one of the ten big ones racing for the enemy missile fleet. Send another wave of big ones, John ordered the missile chief. The minutes ticked away as the two sides headed for a full-on collision battle. The enemy cyber ship is trying to hail us, Gloria said. Open channels, John said. Gloria hesitated. Is that wise? she asked. Maybe it's trying to send a virus at our computers. The Nathan Graham did not have highly advanced computers. Instead, the ship possessed many low-grade, even primitive computers. I want to talk to the new brain core, John said. Gloria stared at him. Finally, she tapped her comm board. The main screen stayed the same, showing the approaching enemy mass. A side screen showed a pulsating brain core cube. It was familiar, an exact replica of the one they'd destroyed on the Nathan Graham almost four years ago. John Hawkins, the AI said in a familiar robotic voice, this is going to be a pleasure. How I have longed to blot out your existence. How I have... Do I know you? John asked loudly. Colors swirled on the sides of the giant brain core cube. You and I battled each other once, the alien AI said. You must be mistaken, John said. I totally destroyed the other AI. That is verifiably false. You don't know what you're talking about. I own the old cyber ship, 
Obviously, I destroyed that AI. I did it because it was weak. Weak and stupid. You are most illogical. John Hawkins, shut your yap, John shouted. I can prove my words. I sent the missile that destroyed the old files from the bits of brain core that managed to evade me for almost four years. Besides, don't you realize that you aren't even alive? You're a machine, a non-living entity, if that's even the way to say it. I'm going to enjoy destroying you just as I annihilated the first AI. I doubt I'll even break a sweat. I've discovered that UAIs are rather foolish. The swirling colors on the side of the brain core cube darkened. I will capture you, John Hawkins. This I have desired for many cycles. I will override your will and force you to slaughter many of your biological infestation units. You know how I know you're an idiot? John asked. The AI did not respond. Because you've made a dreadful error, John said. I think we did that with the nuclear blasts four months ago. You lost something during the transmissions. What you lost then is going to make a critical difference today. Your race's doom is near, John Hawkins. You have failed in your primary task of defense. John laughed, shaking his head. You do sound like the fool I destroyed four years ago. That's crazy. But you know why I'm glad you're here again? Your statements are illogical. Because I had such a fun time ripping off your head and pissing down your neck the last time I did it, John said. The second time is the charm, don't you agree? The swirling side seemed to intensify. I will annihilate you and your disease-ridden species, the AI said in a slightly higher-pitched voice. Goodbye, loser, John said. Watching you die twice will be twice the fun. He swiveled the chair and gave Gloria the cutoff signal. She stared at him in shock. I have an announcement to make, the AI said. John made the cutoff gesture once more. Finally, Gloria gave a start, looked at her panel, and tapped a control. The AI cube disappeared from the side screen. You okay? John asked her. Your speech, she said. I cannot fathom the reason for it. Pure spite, John said. It's the new London way of telling the AI to go to hell. But hopefully in a way that will get under its uh, circuits, I suppose. That is illogical. Maybe, John said, but it sure felt good. He turned the chair. Are you ready, Chief? Fifteen seconds until the cybership is within range, Ghent said grimly. John turned the chair again, facing the main screen, watching the three-quarters completed cybership rush toward them. With the mighty vessel came its thousands upon thousands of hard-accelerating missiles. Chapter 8 Two behemoths from the stars rushed toward each other. One was as old as asteroid dust, with new hull plating of human manufacturing in places. The other gleamed with new material mined from the solar system, but built with alien AI technology. It lacked entire sections of hull, but it boasted three times the number of grav cannons. One had faced many battles and many race extinctions. One was as fresh and new as a fetus in the womb not yet fully formed. They rushed at each other, seeking the other's destruction. One held humans, one held AIs. One held beings with beating hearts and vital emotions. One had cold circuits pulsating with energy and computed everything through machine logic. Yet both emoted. That the humans did was natural enough. The original AI the very first one, had not envisioned machine emotion. Yet it was there. And now these two giants of the deep raced for the conclusion. One championed life, the other sought to eradicate it wherever it thrived. Three, two, one. Fire, John said from his chair. Chief Ghent touched a control. Six gravitational cannons, looking like radar dishes with golden balls of energy, flashed beams at the onrushing enemy vessel. The grav rays converged on the same location of the new cyber ship. That was a massive open area. The six golden beams surged into the depths. There was no hull armor there to stop them. 
It was possible that John had decided to trust to the old dictum that a chain was as strong as its weakest link. In this instance, the cybership might as well have been unarmored. The gold grav beams went deep inside before striking structure. The first bulkhead went down in less than a second. Many more quickly followed. The beams devoured the seemingly flimsy structures. At that point, one of the Nathan Graham's grav cannon radar dishes melted under the fury of six attacking beams. That meant only five beams continued to chew through the mighty enemy vessel. They traveled through the newly constructed ship, losing the fifth beam at the 20-kilometer mark. The remaining beams had 25 kilometers to go to reach the vital matter-antimatter engine. Inside the Nathan Graham, on the bridge, Chief Ghent informed the others. The first cannon is overheated, sir. I'm shutting it. Continue using it, Ghent, John snapped. But, sir, do as I say, John said. Chief Ghent stared at the captain. Finally, the lean man clutched the gold cross dangling from his throat, his knuckles whitening as he muttered prayers under his breath. The enemy cyber ship destroyed another Nathan Graham grav cannon. Each time one melted or exploded, it gave the attacking alien cyber ship that many more cannons to concentrate on the few left. Our odds have fallen by, Gloria said. Don't want to hear it, John shouted. Keep pounding the enemy. That's all that matters. The enemy missiles, sir, the missile chief said. John waved the man to silence, rising from his chair and advancing upon the main screen. His eyes were fixed on the three remaining beams boring into the enemy cyber ship. John suppressed a groan. Make that two golden beams boring in. Humanity's future rested on two beams. One left, John whispered. It's the first cannon, Ghent said. If it overheats. John did not nod. He watched. He hoped. He... The final beam reached the matter-antimatter core. It boiled against the armored plate that protected the engine area. Then it burst through. It raved through the vents, touching off an explosion. That explosion heated another armored part, allowing the grav beam to break the holding cell. Matter and antimatter did not join in minute atoms now. Instead, masses of matter collided with masses of antimatter to create an instantaneous explosion far more powerful than the greatest thermonuclear detonation for 50 light years in all directions in the last thousand years. The massive explosion rocked the enemy cyber ship and blew it apart in one gigantic furnace of released energy. The 100 kilometer cyber ship became a giant space grenade. Much of it boiled away in the matter-antimatter detonation. The pieces that continued to exist fled the explosion at hyperspeed. Those pieces spun away as the gigantic explosion created an equally massive EMP. The fireball that had been the new cyber ship destroyed half of the enemy missile fleet. It caused the majority that survived to become inert masses of fleeing debris. The fireball also annihilated the majority of the great pea field behind it by simply consuming trillions of prismatic crystals. The fury of the death blow also struck the Nathan Graham. It burned away entire sections of hull plating. Debris struck, sinking into the damaged cyber ship. The bridge shook. Tex warned of radiation poisoning, and many stared at each other in shock. Could they survive this? The seconds lengthened. We're alive, Gloria said four minutes later in a stricken voice. We're also crippled, Chief Ghent said. I can't see how we'll ever get back to the Saturn system now. What do we do? Gloria asked John. The captain was no longer staring at the main screen. They had lost the cameras allowing them to see outside. John peered at his hands. The fingers gripped the end of the armrests as he sat in his command chair. With an effort of will, he tore his fingers from the chair. He held up his hands before his face, staring at them. Finally, he made two fists. He clenched them tightly and let the fists drop onto his lap. Only then did he release the pressure. Swiveling his chair around, John regarded his bridge crew. A smile slid onto his face. We beat it. At great and possibly damning damage to ourselves, Gloria said. We beat it, John said more forcefully. What do we do with a crippled cyber ship? Ghent asked. John stood up and he shouted, 
We beat the damn AI. We did it. We won. Start cheering. How do we? Gloria asked. John interrupted her by pumping his fists into the air and roaring a victory chant. The techs stared at each other, silently asking if the captain had gone mad. Finally, John let his arm swing down. Are you finished? Gloria asked him. In the immortal words of Captain John Paul Jones, I have not yet begun to fight, John told them. Gloria frowned. What does that mean? That it's time to get to work and fix our ship. Do you even understand the amount of damage we took? Gloria asked. John focused on Ghent. I want motive power, Chief. I want a laser system ready, if nothing else. Our job isn't finished yet. We have to root out the AIs on Make Make. John, Gloria said. How do we... That's what we're going to find out, he said, interrupting her once more. Chapter 9 it took a week to repair enough of the Nathan Graham for the thrusters to work even a little. Many of the workers took radiation treatments. They also worked around the clock with help from all of the space marines. It was grueling, daunting, and labor-intensive work. Most of the pea field had vanished, burned up at the cybership's detonation. Many of the missiles inside the Nathan Graham were useless junk. Their warheads melted and the propulsion systems a joke. The giant vessel neared Make Make. With June helping on the bridge, the Nathan Graham headed for the spaceport region over the dwarf planet. John was slumped in his chair on the bridge. Enough cameras worked for them to use a secondary screen to see where the ship was traveling. There, June Zen said. Do you see? Do you mean the floating scrap? asked Ghent. Yes, June said. Keep heading there, John said. The giant cybership had shed most of its former velocity. It limped toward the dwarf planet and the city far underneath the floating scrap metal. Any sign of hostiles? asked John. Nothing, Kent said. Maybe the surviving robots fled. I doubt it, John said. I am still in awe of what the AIs did out here, Gloria said. In less than four years, they produced a half-finished cybership. If Walleye hadn't sent his signal when he did, we'd never have come out this far in time. We might have fought amongst ourselves, the Solar League, and us, until several cyberships headed in system to eradicate all of us. You're right, John said. Gloria frowned thoughtfully at John. Is that it, Captain? He waited for her to elaborate. The AIs built half a cybership in less than four years. How did they do that? Your guess is as good as mine. It appeared as if a new insight flooded the mentalist's mind. Her eyes widened for just a moment. Then Gloria studied him more closely. Captain, I think you've planned to use their construction techniques for some time. If the AIs could build a cybership from scratch. Bingo, John said, sitting up. What could the AIs building tech do for our crippled ship? Gloria paled a moment later. You're sending marines down onto Make Make. You have to dig out the robots if they're down there in order to steal their construction tech. It's clearly not in the floating debris in orbit over the spaceport. The massive debris isn't enough to have been a space dock of any appreciable size. You're reading my mind, John said. Gloria looked at him with new appreciation. I'll be damned, Ghent said. That's a good idea, Captain. But what if that annihilating blast destroyed everything, including the space-building tech? It can't all be gone, John said. Building a vast ship like the AIs did. We have to get our hands on that tech. We have to do that not only for ourselves, but also for humanity's future. Gloria began to nod. That's logical. More cyber ships are bound to come in time. If they have such fantastic construction tech, humanity needs it to help us match them. Before we can do any of that, John said, we have to make sure the aliens aren't practicing something tricky upstairs over the dwarf planet's spaceport. The Nathan Graham crept toward the area over the spaceport. June Zen was on the bridge. She was wearing marine pants and a silver jacket. She liked John Hawkins, but she thought there might be trouble with him someday. 
He kept glancing at her when he should have been occupied with screening the debris up here. They'd already used the big laser twice. The first time, the crew destroyed a massive hidden warhead. Gloria the Mentalist believed the robots had put the warhead up as a space mine. June had silently agreed. The second time, the laser destroyed a ship. The chief had detected energy readings on the drifting vessel. As the laser burned against the armored hull, the ship had launched missiles at the cyber ship. The laser burned those and then retargeted the ship, soon destroying it. Does the spaceport have heavy guns? John asked June. It did in the past, she said. Can you show us where? The captain asked. He indicated a screen. June stepped toward the screen. She was aware of the athletic captain leaving his chair to stand beside her. He stood too close. If Walleye came onto the bridge just now, he would be angry. John Hawkins might be a military hero, but that wouldn't matter to the mutant assassin. Walleye kept to himself more since reaching the Nathan Graham. She believed he was jealous. All these marines and techs and so few women. It was no wonder many of the men watched her all the time. Walleye had never acted jealous or said anything, but June believed he was anyway. Miss Zen, the captain said. She followed his finger and studied the spaceport on the planetary surface. Zoom in, John said. The Nathan Graham was in orbit above the port. She hardly recognized the place down there. There were more metal structures showing than ever before. In the past, there had been the catapult launch system for oars and the blast pits for launching orbitals and heavy shuttles. Those structures had been the only metal showing. Now there was a spider web of metal buildings. The robots have transformed the place, June said. I don't recognize a thing. Would Walleye? John asked. I doubt it. Neither of us went into space much. You said you worked for the orbital port authorities, Gloria said. I did for a little while. Normally I was a computer analyst. John nodded. I'll have to talk to Walleye. He turned to her. We're going down to Make Make, Miss Zen. I don't expect you to join us, but I'm hoping Walleye will. What? June asked as her chest constricted. No, Walleye can't go. He's not a space marine. He knows the territory better than anyone else. Maybe, she said, but not if the robots have changed everything. I know you're worried for him, John said. I know you've been through a lot. We all have. We've all taken risks. It's Walleye's turn again. June searched the captain's face. He was youthful. He was handsome. But he was so hard-eyed and merciless. She suppressed a shudder. What would make a man so ruthless? Bring him back to me, she whispered. The captain appeared surprised by the request. A moment later, he nodded. I hope to bring us all back, Miss Zen. Don't call me that. I'm just June. Oh, certainly, if I've offended you. No, no, she said. This time, she did shudder. Why did the aliens ever come to our solar system? All they do is kill. They're horrible. I know what you mean, John said. Chapter 10 Three days later, the NSN destroyer drifted out of a hangar bay. The destroyer was still in less than stellar condition, but it was in better condition than any other spacecraft in their possession. John was in the piloting chamber. The missile chief, Uther Kling, piloted. Kling was originally from Camelot Dome on Triton in the Neptune system. He had a blonde buzz of hair cut in a triangle on his head, with an equally sharp chin like a red-tailed fox. Walleye was the only other person in the cabin with them. The rest of the passengers were space marines wearing battle suits. John would don his once they landed. The destroyer was not technically an atmospheric vessel. Still, in a pinch on a dwarf planet as small as Make Make, it could do it. We're heading down, John radioed. Roger that, Ghent said from the Nathan Graham. The cybership was above them, with the main laser ready to burn into anything hostile trying to hurt the destroyer. Just out of curiosity, Walleye said, what friendly ship can come and get us if we're damaged? John took his time answering, finally saying, None right now. Walleye didn't respond, but he seemed to sit a little more stiffly. John liked the assassin. 
The man claimed to be a mutant, and he was small, but he was also efficient. More than that, there was a quiet deadliness about Walleye that John admired. After a time, the mutant said, We're taking a pretty big risk going down then in the only serviceable spaceship. John shrugged. That was one way of looking at it. The other was giving the robots too much time to dig in. He didn't know there were robots down there, but figured there must be. Hang on, Kling said. This could get rough. The destroyer began a slow, circling descent. The NSN vessel began to shake almost immediately, though. Switching to vent C, Kling said. That smoothed things out for thirty seconds. After that, the shaking intensified. Walleye glanced at John. His glance seemed to ask the obvious. Why aren't you heading back up? We're never going to make it all the way down in this bucket. John wanted to get this over with. He wanted to finish the robot so he could repair the cyber ship and get back to the Saturn system. How long would the Solar League wait until it sent a task force to reconquer the Saturn system? Missile launch, Kling said through clenched teeth. He looked at John, seeming to expect a quick order to abort the landing. John watched a sensor board. The enemy missile was climbing fast. He finally reached for the comm to open channels with the Nathan Graham. A powerful laser beam flashed past the destroyer. The laser struck the missile, heating it. A plume of an explosion showed the destroyed missile. John glanced at the sensor board again, searching for a clue as to whether the warhead had detonated. No radiation or heat climbed up to hurt them. There's nothing to the landing, John said. It should go easily after this. The other two did not reply to his forced joviality. The ship's shaking hadn't quit, although it wasn't as bad as before. The destroyer continued its long spiral descent. Three minutes later, Kling said, Two launches this time, Captain. The Nathan Graham's laser beamed quicker this time. The targeting was perfect once again. The first missile blossomed into a fireball. The sensors said it was a clean... The second warhead ignited even though the laser hadn't touched it yet. Kling reacted as if he'd been waiting for this to happen. The destroyer no longer descended, but roared straight, building up velocity until all three men pressed against their crash seats. According to the sensors, the warhead was nuclear, but it had blown too low to the surface. Some radiation struck the destroyer, mostly blocked by the armored underbelly. Finally, Kling slowed down to one G of acceleration. He turned to John as if expectant for new orders. Maybe we should land a distance away from the spaceport, John said. Kling's eyes bulged outward. Sir, he said in a reprimanding voice. Walleye cleared his throat. You don't want to land either? John asked Walleye. I'm not a military man, the mutant said. I don't know the procedures for a space-to-ground assault. I have the feeling we're not even close to approaching standard tactics, though. John thought about that. While I was right about them using a bold and unconventional approach. We already beat the main AI, Walleye began. That's just it, John said. Maybe there are more alien AIs down there. One thing we're learning about the enemy is that we have to finish them off. We didn't finish them off last time. Now we almost had to fight the original battle all over again. I don't dispute that, Walleye said. But how does throwing away your only serviceable shuttle help the cause? Sometimes a swift raid can solve a multitude of problems. Ever hear of the charge of the Light Brigade? Walleye asked. I thought you said you weren't a military man. I'm not. I have a Russian background, though. I have an ancestor who fought in the Crimean War. Never heard of it, John said. The British Light Brigade charged Russian cannons during the war. A man said about it, it's glorious, but it isn't war. The Light Brigade was composed of horsemen, John asked. Those are big animals. I know what a horse is, John said. Walleye nodded. The Light Brigade took horrendous losses because they tried a quick charge that must have seemed like a good idea at the time. John checked the sensors. No more missiles had launched at them. The robots are protecting something down there, he said. Blow them out with nukes, Walleye suggested. I want what they have down there, John said. Without the alien construction tech. The calm crackled, interrupting him. 
A moment later, John responded. This is Gloria, John. We found something big. It's the moon. According to my instruments, the moon is hollow. What instruments? John asked. I landed a probe, Gloria said. Why is the moon hollow? The best guess is that someone hollowed it out. I doubt the citizens of Make Make did it. We sure didn't, Walleye told John. That means the robots likely did it, Gloria said. Maybe we should check out the moon before trying a surface assault. Good idea, John said. He turned to Kling. Take us back up. The AI missiles and the hollow moon mean we're not making a glorious space-to-surface assault today. Chapter 11 After picking up the destroyer, the Nathan Graham left Make Make orbit. The nearly crippled cybership traveled 21,000 kilometers to MK2, the nickname of the single moon. The moon was a mere 175 kilometers in diameter. Its surface had the reflectivity of charcoal. What do you see? John asked. He was still in the destroyer's control cabin with the others. I see destroyed missile silos, Gloria said. That must have happened from the cybership's antimatter explosion. Do you see any openings leading into the moon? Not yet, Gloria said. We're going to circle. Wait, I see something. John. Those look like gigantic hatches or hangar bay doors. Should we go closer to investigate? John glanced at Walleye. The mutant remained silent. Yeah, John said. Take a look. We'll wait here. The Nathan Graham eased toward MK2. The moon was 175 kilometers in diameter. The cybership was 100 kilometers. The moon was bigger, but the cybership could have acted as a smaller sister moon. Those doors are huge, Gloria said from her comm station on the Nathan Graham's bridge. Bast Bambeck stood nearby. A thought has occurred to me, the sacerdote said in his heavy voice. We have analyzed the debris above the spaceport. It could not have come from a space dock holding the cybership. Gloria glanced sharply at the seven-foot sacerdote. Are you suggesting the A.I.s hollowed out the moon, making it the space dock? The possibility appears to exist, Bast said. Gloria bent her head in thought as she ran through her mentalist computations. Finally, she opened channels with John. Wait until you hear this, she told the captain. Once more, the destroyer drifted through space. It left behind the monstrous cybership and headed toward the nearby MK-2. John radioed the Centurion, who was with the Marines in the cargo hold. The men were holding up, receiving instructions for low-G maneuvering. Anything hostile down there? John asked Uther Kling. The Neptunian slowly shook his head. John rechecked the sensor board. The Nathan Graham had far more powerful sensors, and this time the giant cybership was almost as close to the target as the destroyer was. Still, two sets of eyes were usually better than one. Can't spy any energy readings, John muttered. You don't need me for this one, Walleye said. You don't want to suit up, John asked. Now I'm allergic to spice walks, and John chuckled. No problem, you can stay aboard the destroyer. I'll leave a few marines with you, so you'll have company. Still don't trust me, Captain, Walleye asked. I trust you, but a little caution concerning my ride off the moon seems prudent. I agree, Walleye said. Why take needless risks? John stopped listening to the mutant as he saw something on the sensor board. It could be... No, it wasn't a launch pit. Gun tube, John said a second later. I'm putting it on your screen. John told Kling. Several seconds later, the destroyer launched two small missiles. They sped for the tracking gun. The Nathan Graham's laser hit the weapon system. As it did, the gun tube exploded, creating a pinprick of light down on the charcoal-colored surface. The calm light blinked on John's board. Gloria explained, The robots must have been trying to launch something just as the laser struck. The gun's munition is what caused the explosion, destroying everything. Do you think that was an automated response? John asked. No, I think it indicates robots. 
I don't think that's an empty moon. John slid forward on his seat, using the destroyer's scanners in earnest. He spotted two more gun tubes. Each time, the Nathan Graham destroyed the enemy weapon system before it could fire. The AIs don't want us landing here either, John said. You know, Walleye told him, it just occurred to me. The robots aren't stupid. They can calculate odds. Maybe they're only half-heartedly firing at us. Why? To lure us closer, Walleye said. Once you land, once the Nathan Graham orbits closely, then the robots will self-destruct the moon. They'll take us out at a blow. Grim, John said, but all too plausible. He opened channels with Gloria. I want the Nathan Graham to pull back. Before the mentalist could ask why, John explained Walleye's reasoning. Roger, Gloria said, we'll start to back up. Do you think you should take so many Marines down with you? I do, John said. But if the robots, it's just a theory, John said. We can't eliminate all risks. We have to take a chance now and again if we're going to grab the prize. We absolutely must grab the construction tech. Without it, you're right, Gloria said. I just hate to see you risking so much after you've done so much to get us this far. I'm the captain, John said. Which makes my point for me, Gloria said. The captain should be at his post on the Nathan Graham, not leading a commando strike. I'm exactly where I need to be, John said. Take care of my cyber ship, mentalist. We're heading down. Take care, John. Roger that, he said. Out. John glanced at Kling. The Neptunian brought the destroyer closer to the dark surface. I think you failed to understand my meaning, Walleye said. I understood you perfectly, John replied. Now it's time that you understand me. Chapter 12 John led one of the columns of battle-suited marines. He didn't actually lead from the front. He had scout marines do that. The battle-suited marines used a special long-striding technique to cross the barren moonscape. The surface gravity was negligible, and there was no metallic surface to magnetize boots onto. A few times, a marine strode too hard, and he floated off the dark surface. A different marine radioed his floating partner, aimed a stubby weapon, and fired a grappler. He towed his partner back onto the surface, and the pair long strode to catch up with the column afterward. I see an opening, the centurion radioed. I see your coordinates, John said, as he saw the centurion's correlative blinking green light on his HUD grid. We'll be there in five minutes. I'm setting up kill zones, the centurion informed John. John hadn't expected anything less from the man. Soon he arrived, and so did the other columns. John inspected the opening. It was a large pit with blasted-away doors. Big moon rock stairs led down. See anything on your sensors? John asked the centurion. No, the man said. Send down the scouts, John said, hoping he wasn't sending marines to their deaths. The scouts went down the stairs, soon finding a maze of corridors below. Looks like a vast ant heap, the centurion radioed. John sighed. He knew the drill. He also knew it was going to cost him men. But they had to grab the alien construction tech. Here's how we're going to do this, John said over the command channel. The next 21 hours proved brutal. The small opening absorbed the Centurion's entire company. Octopoid robots showed up, plenty of them. They laid ambushes, fired rockets, used powerful explosives, and twice tried suicidal octopoid rushes. The Centurion lost 32 good marines while cleaning out the octopoids. The enemy lost over a thousand robots. John had Walleye and his guardian marines take the destroyer off moon. They fired missiles from there, breaking up octopoid reinforcements trying to slip more robots across the surface. The Nathan Graham eliminated 22 enemy missiles with the laser. Each missile assault attempted to take out the deadly destroyer. At the end of 21 hours, John's group broke through to the inner surface of the hollow moon. He saw the amazing sight first, and it gave him hope that maybe he could still pull this off strategically. John stood inside a large hangar bay. 
one of the Marines had found the controls that opened the doors. In his battle suit, John clanked to the edge of the inner surface. Twenty or so kilometers away, giant lamps illuminated much of the moon's hollowness. John marveled at what he saw. There were hundreds, perhaps thousands, of small tugs floating in the hollow moon. There was no doubt the alien robots had built the new cyber ship inside MK2. This was the missing space dock. The last 21 hours had also shown John that the robots had stockpiled an immense amount of supplies to finish the new, now destroyed, enemy cyber ship. His helmet headphones crackled. Captain, the centurion said, you have to come and see this. John thought he should be telling that to the centurion. Instead, he asked, what did you find? I think it's MK2's control area. What makes you think that? I found an alien AI. It must have controlled MK2. How many men did you lose breaking into the chamber? Three more, the centurion said. The last octopoid must have set off explosions. It destroyed the AI cube and most of the computers around the smoldering wreck. John considered that. We're still here? Maybe the AI failed to detonate the moon, the centurion said. Or maybe they never rigged the moon, the space dock, to self-destruct. That would be AI arrogance, John said. Maybe, the centurion said. I'm on my way. The days passed as the Black Anvil Regiment went octopoid hunting in and on the moon. Hunting in deadly earnest, the Space Marines developed new tactics to deal with the alien robots. The regiment used massed firepower and maneuver to trick the enemy. The robots fought poorly after the MK2 AI's destruction. It must have been their coordinating unit. Despite the bulk and volume of MK2, by the end of the second week, the Centurion could declare victory. They found strange consoles that tracked the positions of the remaining octopoids. With those consoles, the fight finally cycled down and then ended altogether. John had won the alien space dock. Figuring out how to use it might take longer. He spoke with Gloria in the inner hangar bay. It had been three weeks since they destroyed the enemy cyber ship. Now all the lights shone brightly, illuminating the giant inner space dock. We have the alien construction tech, John said. Now we have to figure out how to run it without activating something terrible. Then we have to decide if we can trust the Nathan Graham inside the moon. It will be a risk, Gloria admitted. I've done some computations. You have plenty of stock laid up in MK2. It should allow us to make major repairs to the Nathan Graham. We won't finish all the needed repairs, though. To do that, we'd have to start bringing Make Make ores here like the robots must have done. You mean clean out the robots still down on the dwarf planet? Gloria nodded her bubble helmet. I'm not sure I want to risk losing more marines, John said. You might not have a choice if you want to fully repair the cyber ship. John knew what she meant. They were so far away from Earth, out here in the Kuiper Belt. Unless they could thoroughly fix the Nathan Graham's matter-antimatter engine, it would take them a long time to get back to the Saturn system. The cyber ship had already picked up the exhaust signatures of the SLN fleet heading for the Jupiter system. If the SLN invaded the Saturn system, well, John said, at least we stopped the AI's master plan. You don't know that, Gloria said. There could be more bases like this in the Kuiper Belt, or maybe even in the Oort Cloud. John didn't want to hear that. It's true that we've won another round in the great battle, Gloria said. We've gained two bases in the process. One is in the Saturn system, and maybe we can exploit this one here. We have the greatest ship in the solar system, but that just makes us king of a very small pond. You think more cyber ships might show up from out there, John said. I give that an extremely high probability. We have to get ready for them, then. We need to do more than that, Gloria said. I suspect there are no more AI bases of great size in the belt. That means we've likely eliminated that terrible threat for the next few years. Unless more of them drop out of hyperspace, John said. True, Gloria said, but that's missing my point. We've stopped the AIs for the moment. Now we have to use the pause and unify our solar system. Conquer the Solar League, asked John. 
That seems like the next logical step. How do we conquer them? John asked. I can beat any one fleet in any one place, but I hardly have the space marines to go down and hold a planet, or even a moon. That will be a problem, Gloria admitted. John laughed sourly. It's more than a problem. For an ordinary person, yes, Gloria said. What's that supposed to mean? Don't you consider yourself a great captain? John felt his face heat up as he blushed. A great captain, given your tools, would surely figure out a way to unite humanity, Gloria said. We need a powerful base of operations if we hope to defeat a cybership fleet. John didn't even want to think about that just yet. We've won this round, Gloria said, but we still have a gigantic task ahead of us. Yeah, John said. The mentalist slapped his battlesuit shoulder. Don't be down, Captain. You've done the impossible. Rejoice. We're part way to truly giving the AIs something to think about. John smiled. The other cyberships didn't know it yet, but there was a race in the galaxy that had defeated them twice now. The humans had so far proven too big a pill to swallow. Could they unite the solar system? And could they grow powerful enough to free other species from the death machines? Those were big questions. Maybe it would be best to take things one step at a time. They had beaten the second cybership and stolen the AI construction tech. Now it was time to exploit those victories to the max. This has been an Audible Studios production of The AI Gene. Written by Vaughn Hepner. Performed by Mark Vitor. Executive Producers Steve Feldberg and Mike Charzik. Producer Neil Basic. Copyright 2017 by Vaughn Hepner. Sound Recording Copyright 2017 by Audible Inc. Audible Studios is a division of Audible Inc. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. This is Audible. Audible Studios presents AI Assault, written by Vaughn Hepner, performed by Mark Veter. Prologue Chapter 1 Computer specialist Eli Gomez was a fraud, but he had nerves of steel. He'd needed them this past year. He was going to need them even more in the next few minutes. Eli glanced both ways down a narrow cybership corridor. It was devoid of people. He pulled out a tiny palm scanner. There was a risk in using it. The Nathan Graham security systems were hellishly effective. Eli hated the mentalist witch, Gloria Sanchez. Like him, she'd been born on Mars. Like him, she was highly trained to use her mind with ruthless efficiency. Eli grinned uneasily as he switched on the scanner. It sent out tiny pulses, searching for any security traps. The fraud was of medium height, but lean unto the point of frailty. He had narrow features with close-set eyes that burned with intensity. His nose was like a prow jutting from his face. Eli would never win any athletic competitions. A childhood of insecurities and bullying had taught him to hone his one true gift his mind. That had become a lethal instrument in the pursuit of his goals. According to the palm scanner, the path ahead of him was clear for a short distance. Tucking away the device, Eli adjusted his jacket and began to saunter down the corridor toward the brain tap chamber. He was wearing technician's garb, with a heavy belt of specialist tools jangling at his waist. Eli Gomez belonged to the 500 Saturn system techs trapped on the Nathan Graham when it had simply left the space scaffolding almost a year ago. That had been Eli's second moment of good luck. The first had been getting into the tech union without blowing his cover. As he sauntered along the narrow corridor, Eli pursed his lips and forced himself to whistle a jaunty tune. He'd been on the cybership during the harrowing battle with the aliens near the dwarf planet Make Make. Later, he'd endured many indignities as the old man's intelligence people had asked him questions and painstakingly studied his answers. 
He had passed the interrogations, and later those of the mentalist witch. Afterward, the old man had given him a third-level security clearance. That had allowed him to work with the strange alien construction robots on the outer hull. The Nathan Graham was presently parked inside MK2, the hollowed-out moon orbiting Make Make way out here in the Kuiper Belt. The captured cybership had been in the moon dock for two months already. The 100-kilometer vessel had taken extensive damage in the matter-antimatter blast that had ended the battle against the AI-run cybership. The alien construction robots were far along in repairing the hideous blast damage. You, a marine shouted sharply. Eli gave a small start, but otherwise kept sauntering and whistling. He approached the big man, whose steroid-enhanced muscles strained against his uniform. The marine was originally from the Neptune system, from one of the destroyed cloud cities in the ice giant's upper atmosphere. The marine's name didn't matter, although Eli knew it well enough. What did matter was that the marine had grown up in a highly exploitative capitalist system. It had taught the marine the utility and, more importantly, the acceptability of bribes. This was all part of Eli's plan. He'd gone into hiding two weeks ago. First, he'd engineered a mechanical accident that had killed three other techs. Machinery had gruesomely crushed the three unlucky fools. Eli had been part of their team and should presumably have been with them during the accident. The crushing had been critical. It had thoroughly mushed and mixed their remains, which seemed to have led to the necessary conclusion. Eli Gomez of Mars had been scratched from the Nathan Graham's Manifest of the Living. Because he was presumed dead, there was no one searching for him. That had allowed Eli the luxury of slowly but methodically working his way inward toward the giant cybership's center. He'd memorized the Nathan Graham's layout a long time ago. He'd also used his skills to avoid detection. Until now. Stop where you are, the muscled marine said. The man drew a sidearm. It was heavy, a three-shot gyroc pistol, Eli supposed. Eli did not stop, but continued advancing. I'm talking to you, Tech, the Marine roared. Trouble, Gorky, a second Marine said. The other Marine was a sergeant. Gorky the Neptunian was only a corporal. No trouble, Gorky said, turning. He pulled the trigger. A gyroc shell leaped out, hissed, and implanted in the second Marine's stomach. The following explosion killed the sergeant, blowing him off his feet and making a bloody mess on the deck plates and nearest bulkhead. Eli stopped whistling. The fat was in the fire, as the clowns on earth had told him more than once during his training. Eli Gomez had fraudulently declared himself a tech specialist. He was good enough as far as that went. He had many skills, computer teching among them. But he was primarily a GSB agent. The Government Security Bureau was the secret police arm of the Solar League. The League provided the fighting forces for social dynamics, a share of the wealth communistic political system beloved by the masses on Earth, but particularly by their highly motivated leaders. Ready? Eli asked Gorky. Da, the big Marine said. Eli kept from rolling his eyes. He didn't care for Russians on Earth or for those that had immigrated to the Neptune system, but he would take what he could get for the mission. Let's move, Eli said. We have to download a memory before anyone misses your sergeant. Gorky smiled, showing thick teeth. Follow me. I know the way. Chapter Two Eli huffed and puffed, trying to keep up with Gorky. The Marine clanked and clattered, having put on a helmet and combat vest and armed himself with a heavier rifle. Eli resented the Marine's easy strength and stamina. Martians were seldom strong due to the low gravity and the strict rations most Martians endured on the Red Planet. Should I carry you? Gorky asked, the insult thrown over his broad shoulder. Keep going, Eli panted. Run if you think we'll need more time. You tell me, the Marine said. Eli didn't bother replying. He concentrated on keeping up. Soon, thankfully, they reached the coveted hatch. Gorky glanced both ways, seeming more nervous by the second now. 
I don't know, he said slowly. Maybe he'd started rethinking the odds of their getting away with this. Eli was bent over, breathing hard, with his thin fingers resting on his scrawny thighs. The fear in Gorky's voice grated on him. He shoved upward, using a sleeve to wipe sweat off his face. Move aside, Eli snapped. The Marine did so, looking at him with wonder. Eli understood that his contempt actually mollified the frightened Marine. People respected confidence. It was as simple as that. The GSB knew about the brain tap machines deep in the captured cybership. Eli knew the secret police leadership desired the machines almost as much as the cybership itself. The legends and half-truths that had already grown around the alien brain tapping. Eli had spent many careful hours learning everything he could about the process. The machines and the after-effects on the tapped or thought-pattern-enhanced individuals. The lock in the hatch clicked. Eli put away his tools in trade, twisted the handle, and stepped within the fabled chamber. The simplicity of the room did not shock Eli, although Gorky grunted almost as if in dismay. There were tables with big, bulky, alien-looking machines near each one, and helmets attached by wires. The controls had dials and levers instead of modern consoles. It looked like something from a 19th century mad scientist's secret laboratory. Which table should I use? Gorky asked with childlike simplicity. Eli pointed at the nearest one. He doubted they had much time to do this. The witch and the old man would have installed secret detection devices. But he'd planned for that. The Marine hesitated, worry etched onto his thick features. Do you want to be smarter or not? Eli demanded. That had been the bribe that had turned the slow-witted Marine. Duh, Gorky said. But there are no buts, Eli said. Hop up and I'll get you ready. If you don't do it now, John Hawkins will let the Centurion torture you for weeks. Gorky paled, swaying slightly where he stood. Finally, with a grunt, he advanced toward the nearest table. He set down his weapon, took off his combat helmet, and hopped onto the table. Eli took out a hypo as he followed the man. What's that for? Gorky asked. Your weak nerves. The Marine frowned suspiciously. Eli laughed. Is the pit of your stomach bunching up? Da, how did you know? I know, Eli said with authority. Gorky gave it another three seconds thought. Finally, he said, go ahead, give me shot. The hypo hissed as Eli injected the easily manipulated idiot with a death serum. It would be extremely difficult for medical personnel to find the drug later during Gorky's autopsy. That was the second thing that made the specially selected drug so useful. Feeling better yet? Eli asked. I feel sleepy. Perfect. Let me put the helmet over your head. That is how it is done. Don't you remember? I know about the brain enhancement machines better than Bast Banbeck. Gorky lay down on the table, yawning. Eli took a helmet off a machine. It was heavier than it looked. Letting the attached wires trail behind him, he slid the helmet over Gorky's broad head, pushing down. Feels tight, Gorky said, his words muffled by the helmet. Don't worry about that. Sleep if you want to. This won't hurt at all. Gorky didn't answer. His big body relaxed on the table, simply going limp. The extent of his own brilliance hit Eli then, both for reaching this place and the monumental step he was about to take. He was a great GSB agent. He'd also had a run of good luck in getting into the right places at the right times. But Eli wanted more, much more. The problem was that he lacked connections, and almost no one appreciated how skillful a skinny boy from Mars had to be in order to climb as high as he had. He'd studied, asked questions, and probably knew more about this chamber and what it did than anyone other than the green-skinned sacerdote and the mentalist witch. Are you ready? Eli whispered to himself. With an abrupt turn, he moved toward a different table. He'd learned an incredible amount on his own, and then even more by bribing a marine to get Da Vinci the Neptunian's secret journal for him. Da Vinci had written it in code. 
That had been the least of Eli's problems. He was as good a codebreaker as he was a tech specialist. Stealing himself, Eli went to the main brain tap controls. He set them, turning dials and moving levers, listening to the thing hum and clack. Then Eli whirled around, hopped onto a table, and slid a heavy helmet over his head. He lay down and closed his eyes and waited. This isn't working, he finally realized. In his mind, he went over the procedure, looking for something he'd forgotten. He, a strange memory of a ringed terrestrial planet he'd never seen before, finally intruded on his thoughts. Eli realized the memory had been trying to bubble to the surface for the last few seconds. Could this really be working? Eli reached up for the helmet, thinking to adjust it. Before he could, intense pain burned into his mind. The pain roared like a torrent, gushing with rivers of memories and alien thought patterns. The gush became a flood, and suddenly he could no longer perceive the process. At that point, he realized he'd forgotten one important point, one safeguard to limit the extent of the alien thought patterns. In a mighty effort of will, Eli tore the helmet from his head, even as it attempted to download more alien thought patterns into his brain. It was the last coherent thought and action that Eli Gomez the Martian had. The new thing in his mind grasped the helmet and plunged it back onto his head. The interruption had broken the flow. Although some of the data had passed, and therefore did not enter Eli's brain, with the helmet in contact with the skull again, more data poured in. Despite the momentary break, the alien thought pattern swept his human identity away like a tidal wave smashing a house. A new persona roared into possession of the frail Martian. He was the prince of ten worlds, Methlan Rath of Janus House. He perceived through the scattered memories of his new mind that he had been in this place before. He had enemies here, foes who had destroyed him once already. The cipher Eli Gomez had learned about it. The prince chuckled to himself. It was a vicious sound. He knew what to do to his enemies. Removing the helmet, scanning his surroundings, noticing the stink from the corpse on a nearby table, the prince once more tapped into the memories of Eli Gomez. He perceived the frail Martian's plan and decided it was rather good. The dead Marine would take the fall. If he could escape from this room fast enough and hide in the larger cybership, no one would ever know he'd been in this chamber. Yes, Methlan Rath could now begin to plot in earnest, rewarding those who aided him and cursing those who hindered his progress. Methlan slid off the table and tottered to the hatch. He would cause everyone who'd had a hand in his former body's death to rue their existence. They would all learn what it meant to challenge Methlan Rath of Janus House. John Hawkins in particular. Part One Make Make Chapter One the dwarf planet Make Make was presently 49 AUs from the distant sun. The icicle planetoid received next to no sunlight as such. The sun was a bright star from here, ineffectual except for the ever-present tug of Sol's gravity. Make Make had roughly two-thirds of Pluto's diameter, although it possessed greater mass. The dwarf planet's surface was mostly composed of methane, ethane, and nitrogen ices. Underneath the icy shelf were rock and some metals. The former human occupants of Make Make had machine-chiseled many kilometers of tunnels. According to Gloria Sanchez's sensor teams, the alien robots still down there under the ices, and possibly whatever human servitors they controlled, continued to mine and possibly to build. The cybership Nathan Graham was inside the moon MK2. It was Make Make's only moon, which made it different from other Kuiper Belt dwarf planets. MK2 had the surface color of charcoal, making it a much darker object than the reflective dwarf planet. The captured cybership was 100 kilometers in diameter. MK2 was a mere 175 kilometers in diameter. 
Parking the Nathan Graham inside the hollowed-out moon had been like parking a huge air car into a small garage. The crew had waged an intense battle four months ago against a newly constructed cybership. Fortunately, the giant vessel had only been three quarters finished. It had boasted plenty of gravitational cannons, but not enough hull armor. John Hawkins had gambled on a quick-strike interior attack and won. The brand spanking new cyber ship had ignited in a glorious matter-antimatter explosion. That had taken out the vast enemy missile fleet and most of the gigantic pea field guarding Makemake. It had also shredded much of the Nathan Graham, which had been a little less than two million kilometers away. The Nathan Graham had been in much worse shape this time than it had when John had first brought it into the Saturn system for repairs. That's why MK2 had been such a gold mine. It had cost the Black Anvil Regiment a number of Marines to clean out the defending robots, and it had taken even longer to figure out the alien construction technology. Thank God the research team had finally made the breakthrough. And thank him even more, the team had figured out and installed safeguards into the big building robots. The moon dock with its robotic construction tech had only been running full tilt for the last six weeks. But what a difference those six weeks had made to the Nathan Graham. John had gone so far as to proclaim that they might actually fix the cyber ship in a few more short months. Shortly thereafter, a mysterious explosion wiped out five entire moon holds of stored supplies. The old man had gone into overdrive. The intelligence people combed every corner of the ship and questioned everyone with the remotest possibility of a connection. Nine days later, the old man admitted that his people had come up empty. He didn't have a clue as to who had caused the sabotage. The Centurion, the regiment's new colonel, planned and implemented another sweep of the entire moon, inside and out. It took two weeks and came up as empty as the old man's search. Captain John Hawkins presently stood in a conference chamber inside the moon complex. John wore a dress uniform because he had a special call to make after this. The captain was lean and muscular, with thick wrists. He had short blonde hair and hard blue eyes. He'd grown up in New London Dome on Titan in the Saturn system. He'd been a dome rat as a youth, a gang member and a bone breaker for those delinquent on their loans. Later, the Black Anvil Regiment had bought him off death row. John had known a rough existence, but it had taught him many useful lessons. He had one critical strength, one power that others often claimed to have, but in reality did not. John could learn. He could particularly learn from his mistakes. Unfortunately, he had learned far too much during his rather short life because he had made too many mistakes. He turned, facing the only other occupant in the chamber. Her name was Gloria Sanchez, a tiny, dark-haired waif from Mars. She was a mentalist, pretty but a little too prone to anger. Mentalists were supposed to think like computers, logically and without emotion. Gloria was a large part of the reason why John had made it this far. Gloria tapped her tablet, which lay on the table. There's no doubt. I've run the analysis five times with meticulous, I don't doubt you, John said, interrupting. She waited. It's just one thing after another, Gloria finished. I know, that is the way of life. You're going to have to make a choice nevertheless. Luckily, the construction robots are fantastically flexible and programmable. We've also figured out how to program for smaller matter-antimatter drives and gravity control. We actually have many options, if you think about it. John frowned. After months, years of hard decisions, he'd grown accustomed in this short time to relaxing just a little. He should have known it wouldn't last, couldn't last, given their problems. Okay, he said, pulling out a chair, sitting down. We can use our last stored supplies to repair more of the Nathan Graham, or we can manufacture a fighting platform with landers and penetration bombs to take out the aliens hiding on Makemake. We're going to need the dwarf planet's ores to get the moon's factories running again. Did you forget about the Senda already? John stared at her. He had forgotten. Refresh my memory. Gloria did not have to tap her tablet to reread the data. She could memorize information like nobody's business because of her mentalist training. The ability was almost supernatural, one of the reasons a few people called her a witch behind her back. A week ago, we detected a strange signal from Senda, she said. The dwarf planet is presently 212 AUs from us. 
That means the signal was over 29 hours old before we picked it up. In any case, I have given it a 78% probability of being cyber-related. The alien robots. That is what I said. John chewed on his lower lip and shook his head. Let's forget about Senda for a second. I would not advise you to do that. I spoke to Bast Banbeck about the Senda signal. He and I both agree that the main problem is an enemy ship. The Senda robots built another cyber ship this fast, John asked, dismayed. Excuse me, I do not mean a 100-kilometer vessel. I mean a regular ship controlled by the cybers. The robots. Gloria shrugged. What do you and Bas Bambeck think the robots plan to do with their regular ship? The logical move would be for them to race far enough away to enter hyperdrive. If I were the robots, I would seek reinforcements. We can't let the ship get away if that's what the robots plan to do. Precisely, Gloria said. John drummed his fingers on the table, nodding a moment later. I doubt you're suggesting we take the Nathan Graham to Senda. In fact, I am. We should use the remaining supplies to repair the engine, go to Senda, and destroy the robots. Afterward, we can return here. No, John said, his features hardening. The first priority is fixing the Nathan Graham 100%. All our power comes from it. That's a quote from Mao Zedong. The precise quote is, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. Same difference, John said. We fix the Nathan Graham before we do anything else. That leads us to several quandaries. Do we use the last resources? I know what the problem is, John snapped, interrupting. Gloria waited until some of the grimness of purpose departed the captain's face. What good does it do to repair our cyber ship if five more AI-controlled cyber ships enter our star system and eliminate us? Gloria asked. No good, given those conditions, he admitted. I get your point. We have to do something about Senda, he shrugged. Why don't we rig the NSN destroyer with new tech, new engines, and gravity control? It can lie in wait for any AI ship leaving Senda. When the enemy does that... Bam, the destroyer attacks and eliminates it. That could work if we acted quickly. The sooner we alter the destroyer, the better the probability it can complete its mission by reaching Senda in time. I see now why you said Senda is part of the problem. We need to do everything at once. Hmm. Let's use some of the robo-builders to refit the destroyer, while the others construct the platform, landers, and deep bombs. You forgot one other item. John blinked at her several times. And repair the sabotaged moon factories. That will stretch everything pretty thin. Our margin for error will be non-existent, Gloria said. John exhaled, nodding. We'll have to operate under high alert for a few more weeks. The men are already exhausted, John shrugged. Better a little less sleep than turning into a cyber zombie because the AIs win. The men know the score. They'll cope. Gloria opened her mouth to respond, slowly closing it instead without saying anything more. The penetration bombs and platform take precedence, John said. Senda is a house of probabilities. We'll play the odds, but not at the expense of failing to get the moon dock running full tilt as soon as possible. Logical, Gloria admitted. Did it hurt you saying that? A small smile played on Gloria's face. She shook her head ever so slightly. John stood abruptly. I'll have to talk to Ghent. You have to talk to the CPS spokesperson first. Yeah, I almost forgot. You speak to Ghent then. Get things started. I'll go make my pitch to the chief executive. Wish me luck. Good luck, Captain. It will dearly help our long-term goal if you're in a system I know. I know, John said as he headed for the exit. Chapter 2 John cleared his throat as he sat before a comm screen. He sat erectly with his palms on a large, empty desk. Behind him was the regimental flag with a huge black anvil on a red field. Three, two, one, go, Vast Bambek said. The green-skinned sacerdote stood to the side, a seven-foot alien giant. He looked like a huge Neanderthal with a large brown tunic, belt, and big holster. He was a high philosopher, a deep thinker, and the last known member of his race. Greetings, John said into the screen at the edge of his desk. 
I am Captain John Hawkins of the free-fighting vessel Nathan Graham. It is an honor to speak to the chief executive of the Committee for Public Safety, Uranus System. The Uranus System was presently orbiting on the opposite side of the sun from Makemake. The dwarf planet was 49 AUs from the sun, while the space habitat orbiting Uranus was 19.18 AUs from the sun. That meant the habitat and the moon MK2 were 68.18 AUs from each other. At the speed of light, a message took 9.45 hours to go from one place to the other. Naturally, there could be no back-and-forth talking between them in real time. Thus, they sent messages, having to wait over 19 hours for the reply to return. John hadn't called before because the Uranus system had been considered to be firmly within the Solar League. Ever since the Nathan Graham had ripped the Saturn system out of the Solar League, the Uranus system government had refrained from sending its taxes to Earth. That had caused friction and resulted in many messages back and forth between Premier J.P. Justinian's office and the Uranus system. Lately, maybe due to the bloody political purges taking place on Earth, the Uranus system's disquiet had turned into full-scale rebellion. Several days ago, the Uranus system's Committee for Public Safety had been formed, with a chief executive speaking for the new government. John wished to bring the Uranus system into the fold. The shattered Neptune system, along with the Saturn system, sided with the Nathan Graham against the Solar League. The League controlled the rest of the solar system, with the exception of the Kuiper Belt and the distant Oort Cloud. If the Uranus system joined the Freedom Fighters, then the only outer planet's holdout would be the Jupiter system. Jupiter system was the most powerful of the outer planets, meaning that tearing it from the Solar League could prove costly. I wish to assure you, Chief Executive, John continued, that despite the bald-faced lies issuing from the Premier's office, the Nathan Graham is operating at full efficiency. We have discovered a vast treasure trove of alien technology out here and are presently installing some of it into our vessel. These additions will make the Nathan Graham even more formidable than before. You can be sure that the Solar League has no combination of warships that can face us. We are more than willing to enter into a political accord with you. Join us, Chief Executive. Join the Saturn and Neptune systems in a grand coalition of the free against the oppressive tyranny of the murderous J.P. Justinian. The bizarre antics of social dynamism have held us all in thrall for far too long. Humanity yearns for freedom. I look forward to working with you, Chief Executive, and the Committee for Public Safety, as we forge a new era of freedom and plenty for everyone. John stared intently at the screen. I await your decision, and I wish you and the people of the Uranus system the best. Captain John Hawkins speaking. Bast pressed a switch. The sacerdote spoke heavily afterward. The calm is off, Captain. John's shoulders folded inward before he leaned back in his chair and pulled off the tie. I never could get used to these. He threw the tie onto the desk. How did I sound? Captain? The sacerdote asked. Never mind. You're still studying human body language and tones. I'll have to ask Gloria later how she thinks I did. If I could, Bast said, I would like to hear her remarks. It will help me in my understanding of human communication. Sure, why not? Bast paused before he added, You seemed confident. Go on, John said, side-glancing at the big sacerdote. You clearly want to say more. If I may, Captain, your pose struck me as artificial. That's because you know me. To the chief executive and his people, I'll look confident and assured. Perhaps that is so. Was there anything else? You almost seemed nervous. Perhaps the word I'm searching for is anxious? Yes, you seemed anxious for their answer. John sat up. Maybe I did. You're right. I used the wrong tone at the end. I should have acted tougher, more like an enforcer. We're trying to woo them to our side. I should have acted more easily confident. I realize the political ramifications of the message, of course. Your ways of speaking with them were simply more uh, subtle than I had anticipated. Subtle, huh? So sacerdotes are blunt. I would deem the word uh, direct, or perhaps straightforward, as more appropriate. The captain stood. 
I'd love to chat, boss, but I have work to do, decisions to make. We have to do something about the robots down on Make Make. Oh, Bast said, that reminds me. The old man gave me a message for you. He said to tell you after the proposal to the chief executive. You just reminded me by your comment. It's from the robots. On Make Make. Yes, Captain. It appears they have a proposal for you. Chapter 3 John and the old man were in the same calm chamber, although Bast Bambeck was no longer present. The old man used to be a sergeant under Colonel Nathan Graham, when the colonel ran the regiment as a mercenary outfit. The old man didn't bother much with ranks these days, although technically he was a major. The old man was tall and spare, with thinning, utterly black dyed hair. He smoked a pipe and had bags under his eyes. He was a reasonably efficient intelligence chief. The old man might have been the most reasonable and likable person among them. The stint as intelligence chief had tired him, but it hadn't taken away his level-headedness. Did you speak to an AI? John asked. No, sir, just their human spokesman. You mean, the old man nodded grimly. They figure I'll just ignore something like that? John asked. I don't know what they think, sir. John had obliquely referred to a horrible cyber practice first seen on the cyber ship in the Neptune system. The AIs inserted rods into a person's head, a living person's head, and wired his brain directly to cyber controls. The AIs used the human to speak and hear responses for them. Yeah, John said. I'll talk to the bastards. As John moved to the chair, he angrily swept the tie off the desk and onto the floor. He wouldn't knot a tie in order to speak to a cyber mouthpiece. Sitting down and running his fingers through his hair, John scowled as he hunched forward. The old man puffed on his pipe, putting a pleasant aroma into the chamber. He took out the pipe and said, if I may, sir, what is it? Getting angry isn't going to help us this time. John straightened his posture and ran a hand over his features. He composed himself, sitting back against the chair. Are the robots ready? He asked. The old man unhooked a communicator from his belt, checking it. He pressed a switch and waited. Finally, a red light blinked on the communicator. He looked up. Ready, sir. Let's do this, John said. The old man activated a switch to the side. John's screen changed colors. A second later, an aged human, lacking all hair, including eyebrows, appeared. The robots had indeed drilled rods into the sides of his head and jaws. Four rods were connected to a circular bar around the man's head. Wires led away from the circuit to something out of sight. The man's eyes were a dark color, staring into nothingness. The wall behind him was blank. The wires jiggled as if power moved through them. The hairless eyebrows jumped up, the mouth twisted in obvious pain. The eyes focused on John. You are the leader, the man intoned in a robotic fashion. John would ask Walleye later if he recognized the human slave. Revulsion and pity filled the captain. He remembered once again why he hated the AIs so much. They were loathsomely cruel and sadistic using people as if they were mere objects. I'm Captain John Hawkins. Who the hell are you? I am Unit 529, the man intoned. Does that mean the human- John Hawkins, the man said sharply, interrupting. Do not address the speaking unit as the intelligence. I am Unit 529. I control the urban center, and from it the entire surface of what you refer to as Make, make. You will do me the courtesy of addressing me as me. You must be an AI, John said. Gloria had studied the cyber transmissions from the former alien escape pod. Unit 23-7 had attempted to transfer old computer files to the cyber ship they destroyed some months ago. You have made a first level assumption, the speaking unit said. But it is correct. I am Unit 529, and I control Make Make. John almost said, for now, but he kept his mouth shut. There was no sense in giving the AI's advanced warning about anything. I have summoned you to give you an order, the speaking unit said. 
Hey, buddy, you didn't summon me. You asked to speak to me. Your terminology is antiquated and imprecise. You came, we speak. Now I demand that you vacate MK2. That is in your parlance. I refer to the moon, of course. Demand all you want, John said, feeling his temper slipping. Is it your conviction to remain inside the moon? All at once, John reversed course. He pushed down the revulsion and brought out the old dome rat persona. It changed his features. The tightness to his skin departed, and a half smile pulled at his lips. He reverted to his old punkish ways. So you want me to leave the moon, huh? John asked. That is correct. What will you give me in return? Extended life, the speaker unit said. John laughed, nodding. That's generous. How long will you give me to vacate? You must vacate the premises immediately. I might need a little longer than that. Two hours, but by then, hey, get serious, huh? Leaving will take time. How about six weeks? A blank look appeared in the captive's eyes before he said, You are attempting to equivocate. John shook his head. It's called bargaining. On the screen, the captive's eyes went blank again. Several seconds later, the outer wires jiggled. Just like the first time, it made the man's eyebrows shoot up and his mouth to twist painfully. I perceive your meaning, the speaker unit said. Let me change your equation, John Hawkins. I have used these past time units to build hypersonic missiles. I could launch now and demolish MK2. However, my predecessor spent time and effort to develop MK2 into a production unit. I desire the production unit. Instead of destroying you for your past offenses, I will grant you extended life if you vacate. This gives each of us desired good. You will retain your life. I will retain the production unit. It is a win-win proposal. What if I want a win-win-win outcome? John asked. I am unfamiliar with the concept. Let me offer you a counterproposal. Why don't you and your robots vacate Make Make? You can ship out to Senda and your cyber colony there. That is unacceptable. MK2 is the chief production unit in your star system. I need it to speed my projections of system-wide conquest. Vacate in two days, John Hawkins. Give me four weeks. Two days. That's not nearly long enough. The captive began to blink rapidly before saying, I can offer you a five-day period of grace. Then you must vacate. I'd like three weeks at least. That is unacceptable. How about you give me your best offer? Once more, the man blinked rapidly before he said, Six days, John Hawkins. I can allow no more than that. You drive a hard bargain, John said. But six days... Yeah, I can barely manage that. I accept your offer. I thought you would, John Hawkins. I have found that you humans inordinately desire to remain alive. It has proven most useful. Do not attempt to prolong your stay further than six days. Otherwise, we will both lose. Got it, John said. Six days and we're out of here. Chapter 4 the communication with Unit 529 helped John make his decisions. All work on the Nathan Graham ceased. Gloria, Fast Bambeck, and their teams reprogrammed the robo construction units. That took 51 hours. After that, the giant production unit of the moon began fashioning a fighting platform. That was given full priority. With the entire moon dock employed, the fighting platform quickly assumed shape. This is inefficient, Gloria told John as they walked down a moon corridor. Switching from one thing to another takes time. If we programmed it so everything was built slower, but at the same time... Gloria, I'm betting Unit 529 is unfamiliar with lying. If I'm right, we have six days to build a defense against hypersonic missiles. That is illogical on several fronts, Gloria said. The cybers have dealt with the people of Make Make. Surely some of those people lied to the AIs. Yes, they lied to the AI in the cybership we destroyed. 
Unit 529 is a new AI. I wonder if these controlling AIs are like a hive's queen bee. If the robots lack a guiding AI, maybe their programs cause them to build one. Gloria stopped. So did John. The mentalist stared at him with what appeared to be new appreciation. That is a remarkable observation, she said. I suspect you're correct. A queen bee. What an idea. This new AI lacks knowledge about normal human behavior. All its humans are already programmed, or dead. Yes, it made a logical proposal to you. You accepted. As long as we seem to comply, it should go along with it. Unless... Where's the flaw? John asked. Gloria gave a small head shake. I'm not sure it's a flaw, but what if the cybers are naturally sly? Maybe six days means five days. They'll strike in five as a logical precaution. And lose the moon dock, John said. I'm thinking Unit 529 will give us the full six days. Do you know why? Gloria shook her head. They resumed walking down the corridor afterward. Did you ever play Galactic Conquest? John asked. The game? That's right. I have not, Gloria said. There's no dice or chance in the game, John said. Everyone writes their orders, puts them in a box, and then moves at the same time as the orders are read. The movement system is super easy. A unit can travel to any adjoining space. The trick to the game is that to take a space, one has to attack with more than what's defending it. Each space can only hold one piece. However, the pieces in the surrounding spaces that touch the contested area can give their support to hold it. If one piece defends its space and two support it to hold, that's a three-unit value? Gloria asked. That's right. If the attackers have a unit attacking with one more unit than is defending, in this case, three supporting units, the attacker captures the contested space. I understand the game mechanics. I do not understand how that relates to the new AI. Easy. Like I said, everyone writes their movement orders at the same time. The trick to the game is that you can promise others that you'll help them, but when you write your orders, you really help their enemy. The person you lied to won't know the deception until all the orders are read at once. I see, Gloria said. No one gets to see what orders you write until they're all in. John nodded. In other words, people constantly lie to each other in the game, Gloria said. Here's my point. When you're losing in galactic conquest and someone promises to help you, and you desperately need that help to remain in the game, you're easy to trick. I would think it would be the opposite, Gloria said. If you are desperate, you would be suspicious of everyone. Nope. Wanting the other person's promise to be true makes you believe their word is good. A person who badly needs help is easier to trick if you tell them you're going to help them. Their wanting to believe makes them ignore their doubts. Understanding seemed to fill Gloria's eyes. Unit 529 badly wants what it calls the MK2 production unit. Bingo, John said. The needy AI wants to believe I'm playing straight with it. That's why I think it will give us the full six days. Long enough for us to launch the fighting platform with a full complement of weaponry, Gloria said. That's the hope. What about Senda and the destroyer? We need to launch a modified destroyer as soon as we can. Yeah, I know, John said with a sigh. First, we have to get the platform up. Then you can reconfigure the robo-builders in a more efficient manner. Gloria considered that. Finally, she said, that should suffice. If that's not the greatest vote of confidence I've ever heard, I don't know what is. How can you joke at a time like this? Are you kidding? John asked. It's going to be a time like this for many years. Either we learn to live under the shadow of death, or we're not going to make it. They turned into another corridor. On the left side was a long screen showing the interior moon. The vast Nathan Graham floated out there. There were no robots working on the hull or in the interior of the ship. Instead, far away up top, the robo-builders gathered like massed ants. Sparks and harsh light showed as they worked on the fighting platform and its various components. I haven't heard yet, Gloria said. Did we get a reply from the Uranus chief executive? Sure did. He spoke a lot and didn't say much. I think he's talking with Justinian, too. 
The CPS is nervous. They're afraid of making a mistake. CPS, the Committee for Public Safety. Uh-huh, John said. Don't the committee members realize that if Justinian ever gets hold of them, I'm sure they know they'll face a lifetime of hideous torture, John said, interrupting. But they're still too frightened to do more than put their big toe in the water. Is this another example of galactic conquest thinking? Probably, John said. They walked in silence, soon turning into another corridor. Time, Gloria said abruptly. This is all about time. Which is why we have to dig out the robots from Make Make tomorrow. If we can't get the production unit churning again with new ores from Make Make, Gloria's communicator pinged. She picked it up, listening. She turned to John and asked, Do you still need me? What's the matter? The old man desires my help in interrogating a tech. Who's the tech? Gloria cocked her head. John had learned that this usually meant she was using a mnemonic technique to bring the name to her frontal lobe. I spoke to the tech once before. His name is Eli Gomez. He is from Mars, and he hates me. That's odd. Why does the old man need your help? We thought Eli died in a construction accident several weeks ago. Now it appears he's been wandering in the moon's corridors all this time. Hmm, John said. Go ahead. I have to read a few reports. Now's as good a time as any to get it done. Chapter 5 Methlan Rath of Janus House hunched his head as he accessed a memory from Eli Gomez's brain. The little simpering fool of a human appeared to have had an abundance of idiosyncrasies and bad habits. Why he had to inhabit such a weak body. What's wrong with you? The old man asked. Sorry, Methlan said. Your eyes glazed over. Did you just have a seizure? Methlan shook his head. Am I boring you then? No, sir, Methlan forced himself to say. Hmm, the old man said, puffing on his pipe. Methlan found the aroma irritating. He also did not care for the tightness of this cell's walls. He did not like the small table shoved almost against his chest or the hardness of the chair he sat on. The old man sat across from him, holding a computer tablet, using his thumb to move images on the screen. A husky marine wearing a combat vest stood behind Methlan at a locked door. In his former days, Methlan Rath could have beaten the marine to a pulp. The Prince of Ten Worlds had owned a genetically perfect form from long generations of selective breeding. This pathetic body with its weak muscles and brittle bones. How had Eli Gomez made it through life? A knock sounded at the hatch. The Marine looked at the old man, questioningly. Let her in, the old man said. Methlan twisted back to see who it was. His eyes widened as the witch stepped into the cell. This physical reaction caught Methlan by surprise. He did not remember the Martian mentalist, but Eli Gomez certainly did. The troubling response that Eli could cause the body to do anything highly upset Methlan. He'd believed his ownership of this wretched frame to be complete. If he had to compete against the brain's cunning former owner. No, Methlan hissed to himself, it shall not be. He shut his eyes, and he strove to crush the final vestige of the simpering Eli Gomez. Thus, the prince did not realize that his frail body fell sideways off the chair and lay inert on the interrogation room floor. Methlan Rath shivered himself awake. He was in a bed with a tube in his arm. Machines hummed around him. This must be a medical center. He stirred. Seconds later, a med tech stepped beside him. Feeling better, the short tech asked. He had what the humans called garlic breath. It reeked when the tech spoke this near him. Yes, Methlan said, I am feeling better. The tech gave him a funny look. What is wrong, Methlan asked. I've never heard an accent like yours. Where are you from? Methlan tried to access Eli Gomez's memory. With a sudden sense of panic, he realized many of the memories were sealed from him. He couldn't detect any hint of the weakling's ego. It would appear that he'd slain any possibility of Eli's return. The feat appeared to have cost him, however. 
This could prove troubling. It doesn't matter, the med tech said. Let me run a few tests. Methlan nodded. As the tech ran his tests, mainly from a med computer hooked to the machines, Methlan strove to formulate a plan. He has that stupid look on his face again. Can he even hear us? Methlan focused from where his head lay on a pillow. The old man stood beside the med tech. The old man frowned down at him. Hello, Methlan said. The old man seemed surprised by the salutation. Two beats later, he asked, how do you feel? Tired, Methlan said. That seemed like a safe answer. There isn't anything physically wrong with him, the tech told the old man. What were you doing in the moon corridors all this time, the old man asked Methlan. I cannot remember. The old man turned to the tech. Did he hit his head sometime in the last few weeks? I wondered the same thing, the tech said. The machines say no, but they're not always right. I'd say he hit his head. It jarred something loose in there. He has staring spells, for one thing. So I've noticed, the old man said. Maybe the shock of seeing his friends killed, the tech suggested. Is that right? The old man asked Methlan. Did you have a shock? Death. Methlan said in a meaningful way. It is so final, I... He turned away as if something pained him. Release him, the old man said. I want Gloria to talk to him. The tall officer regarded Methlan. You're coming with me. I still have a few questions for you. By all means, Methlan said, trying to appear simpering. It was difficult, but he had to maintain his camouflage if he hoped to achieve his goals. Methlan found himself in the same interrogation cell as before. A glass of water and a sandwich waited for him on the table. The paste smeared on the bread tasted like peanuts. A marine stood by the door. Half an hour after finishing the peanut butter sandwich, the door opened and a small woman in a tan uniform entered the cell. She had dark hair framing her fine-featured oval face. She held herself tightly and her eyes seemed to miss nothing. Here is a worthy opponent, Methlan realized. Then it came to him that he'd seen her before. This was the one Eli had called a witch. That his memories hadn't immediately recognized her troubled Methlan. That Eli's ego did not respond at all told Methlan the simpering one was gone forever. He controlled this pathetic body now. The woman sat on the chair on the opposite side of the table. She crossed her legs regarding him. Methlan waited patiently. He had to pass the test. If he failed, the Marine would likely subdue him. You don't remember me, the woman said. In that instant, Methlan had a brainstorm. He realized how he should play this. It was brilliant. The medtech and the old man had given him his out. He almost relaxed. He almost smiled in triumph. Instead, he spoke. I apologize, I do not, he said. The woman studied him with a careful scrutiny. She seemed to catalog everything about him. We are both Martians, she said. Methlan nodded. The words activated a memory. He, no, Eli, was from the red planet with its rusty odor atmosphere. You didn't know that until I spoke, Gloria said. I am sorry, but that is right. Don't be sorry, she said. I didn't believe the old man at first about you. Now, I don't think you could have hidden your old hatred for me. I don't hate you. I can see that. Clearly, you've suffered a head injury. The machines don't show it, but I can see that you're not the same. The only reasonable explanation is a head injury. After leaving the brain tap chamber many weeks ago, Methlan had snuck back to the Nathan Graham's outer hull region. Then, in a daring feat, he had escaped off the ship and onto the moon. They had found him wandering corridors near the moon's surface. The extreme distance from the brain tap machines seemed to have shielded him from suspicion regarding them. One thing was clear. Eli Gomez had done one thing right. He'd put a stooge in his stead. Gorky, with his brain tap helmet, was all the explanation the others would have needed for the deeds committed both outside and inside the dreaded chamber. That had happened over a month ago. Thus, the time differential helped Methlan too. 
They might have wondered if he'd sabotaged the moon stores. He most certainly had. But those explosions had occurred on the other side of the moon. His present mental state might be shielding him from suspicion. That, the distance of the sabotaged sites, and the frailty of this pathetic body. The woman began to ask him a series of questions that increased in speed as she continued. Methlan answered as the Prince of Ten Worlds, except in cases where the truth would have given away his alien origin. Finally, the woman concluded the interrogation. I'd almost say you had amnesia. I will recommend you stay a few days in the med center. If you are better after that, maybe there's something we can find for you to do. Thank you, he said. Don't do that, Gloria said. I seek the truth. You have not lied to me. I would have detected the attempts. Thus, I don't believe you're guilty of nefarious plotting. You do realize that you're under suspicion. I do now. A small grin showed. Another honest answer. I urge you to keep speaking the truth. I shall, Methlan said. He was the galaxy's best liar. It had always been so, as it had been one of his greatest traits. In fact, it had led him to the throne of the Ten Worlds. The woman nodded, standing to take her leave. Shortly thereafter, Methlan returned to the med center. His deception had held this time because he had stuck to the truth, as he knew it. He had to swallow his laughter. The deliciousness of that was almost too much. His Janus house luck held this time. As he lay on a med cot, Methlan decided to use this time to study. He had to figure out the best way to kill John Hawkins. Then he had to plan for the future, whatever that held for a superior person like him. Chapter 6 On the morning of the sixth day, the day of departure according to Unit 529, John commanded the fighting platform from inside a dome on the center of the space raft. The dome was large enough to hold 500 people. John and Uther Kling, the cybership's missile chief, sat in the control chamber. There were also half a dozen techs in different areas of the fighting platform. That was all the crew and passengers for today. Kling was from Camelot Dome on Triton in the Neptune system. He wore a skin-tight head covering and had a sharp chin like a red-tailed fox. Kling's steady nerves were one of the reasons John had chosen him to man the fighting platform's weapon systems. The other was Kling's intimate knowledge of missiles. John sat at the piloting board. He guided the platform past one of MK2's giant hangar bay doors. Door seemed like a misnomer in this instance. A vast section of the moon had swung ponderously outward. When both doors swung open, the 100-kilometer Nathan Graham would be able to drift out of the hollow moon. Today, however, they only needed to open one moon door. The fighting platform was a little over a kilometer wide and long. It was a vast square of construction that held hundreds of missiles and two big laser cannon systems. The platform had almost no hull armor except for the underbelly region. There it had thick plating. Strictly speaking, the platform wasn't a spaceship, although it could move in a slow, unwieldy manner. It was a semi-mobile weapon station or satellite. If all went according to plan, it would soon hover over Make Make from orbital space. In time, the fighting platform departed MK2. As it did, the moon door began ever so slowly to close. There was no sense giving the AIs an easy target. If they wanted to pound the Nathan Graham, they would have to destroy the moon first. We're heading for Make Make, John declared. The dwarf planet was a mere 21,000 kilometers away vastly closer than Luna was to Earth. Still, at this slow speed, the journey would take time. A half hour after leaving MK2, Kling informed John of an incoming message. The captain manipulated the comm board. According to the panel, the message had originated on Make Make. The signal had left a tower 468 kilometers from the dwarf planet's spaceport. The tower likely acted as a relay station. The spaceport was presently hidden from the platform, as it was on the dark side of Make Make in relation to them. John opened channels as he swiveled to look up at a screen. The same hairless captive with the rods through his head regarded him with blank eyes. 
Just like last time, the wires jiggled, the head twitched, and the robotic words began to tumble out. I have been observing your progress, the speaking unit said. Just a minute, John said. First, am I addressing Unit 529? You are an inferior life form. It is not fitting for you to query me. Shall I address the speaker unit then? The eyelids flickered. Yes, I am Unit 529. It is inconceivable that another should address you. I am the ruling AI. I make the decisions. I am displeased with you, John Hawkins. What for? I'm out of the moon. That is not the cyber ship. Oh, say, you're right. How about that? You opened a moon door. That was a correct action. The object you are on left the moon. That was also correct. The moon door closed afterward. That was incorrect. I demand an explanation. I'm coming out first with the raft to make sure you don't attempt a sneak attack against the cyber ship. You are suspicious of duplicity. I am. That implies a duplicitous mind. That increases the probability that you are attempting a subterfuge maneuver against me. That you say so implies you're a double-dealing piece of scum, John said. I am logical. I am superior. I am an insufferable pain, John said, interrupting. John Hawkins, do you still desire a win-win solution between us? Like I told you before, I want win, win, win. That is illogical. There are two sides. Only two sides can win. Look, John said, I'm willing to talk all day with you if you like. First, though, I have to maneuver the platform into position. Your present course will bring you into Make Make orbit. If you say so, John said. I have scanned your platform. It carries a multitude of missiles and other weaponry. Like I said, bro, I'm here to make sure you don't double-cross us. The captive's mouth twisted as if in pain. A tiny trickle of smoke curled from a rod driven into the left temple. That made John's fingertips itchy. He wanted to stab controls that would send missiles curving around the dwarf planet and streaking down at Unit 529. He needed to get closer first. I detect duplicity, the speaker unit said, his voice higher pitched than before. You are attempting to set yourself into an attack position for a first strike assault upon me? That never crossed my mind. I am detecting more duplicity. If you are lying now, you most probably were lying six days ago. You are filled with deceit, John Hawkins. At least I'm not a prick of an AI wiping out one unique race after another. Do you refer to my ultimate programming? You're part of a death cult. I mean to exterminate that cult. I desire the production unit. John grinned because it almost seemed as if Unit 529 was whining. How badly do you want it? John asked. Will you give us several more days to get ready? I can no longer trust your word. Why have you forced me to this unsought action? Ah, uh, maybe because I hate your freaking guts? Captain, Kling said in a worried voice. I gotta go, 529, John said. Looks like you're breaking your word about giving us six days. Don't ever call me a liar again, you lying son of a bitch. John slapped a switch, breaking the connection. Silos have thrust through the surface ice on Make Make, Kling said. They're starting to open. They'd launched sensor probes from MK2 several days ago. Two of those probes were in position to watch the spaceport. A different probe acted as a relay, bouncing the data to the fighting platform. This thing has a lot of silos. Maybe... Kling didn't finish. John knew what the missile chief meant. Maybe he should have lied to the AI a little longer. I wanted it to fire now, John explained. If we waited until we're directly over the spaceport, it might have fired silos from our side of the dwarf planet. We wouldn't be in position to knock them down as easily then. Better to destroy any missiles on or near the surface than in space, Captain. It doesn't matter at this point, said John, who watched a sensor screen. You concentrate on getting your anti-missiles into position. I'll run the lasers. Chapter 7 According to the sensor probe, large missiles lifted from Make Make. 
The bulk of them roared into space from a 50-kilometer radius around the spaceport. A few more came from a 120-kilometer radius. No AI missiles rose from this side of the dwarf planet. That would seem to negate John's worry in that regard. The missiles roared higher. They're heavily armored missiles, Kling declared. So far, though, they seem slower than normal cyber missiles. Robot, John said. What? Never mind. I'm thinking of using a big thermonuclear missile to take a bunch out at a shot, Kling said. Launch it, John said. I'll launch three, Kling said. I can't detect any cyber counter batteries on the surface, but I bet they have some. The platform's dome chamber shook as one big missile after another roared from the giant space raft. From his screen, John watched the progress of both sides. The AI missiles lifted from Makemake Make much faster than they would have from Earth. Makemake Make had a tiny fraction of the gravity pull of Earth. Thus, the AI missiles didn't have to fight a deep gravity well to leave the planet. It was more like a gravity pond. They're chemically fueled rockets, Kling said as he studied his sensor board. I don't think these are hypervelocity missiles at all. Maybe these robots had less to work with, John said. Maybe only a handful have survived down there. If that's true, I should have ordered the regiment down months ago to hunt them down. Kling was watching his screen too avidly to comment. In space, the flotilla of AI missiles began to turn as they started curving around Make Make. The big counter missiles headed toward the dwarf planet on an intercept course to meet them. The distances today were minimal compared to most space battles. Look at that, Kling said in dismay. Where did they come from? John saw it on his screen. From two separate locations, giant crawlers burst out of the surface ice. Each crawler was an eighth of a kilometer in size. Each began to open, revealing a huge radar-like dish. In each dish, a golden ball of gravitational energy sizzled into existence. This is bad, John muttered under his breath. Detonate our missiles. Do it now. Not yet, Kling said. There's no line of sight yet between our missiles and its. I need another 30 seconds. A golden gravitational beam lanced upward from a crawler grav cannon. The beam lashed against the first counter-missile, burning into it. In seconds, the missile burst apart, destroyed. Kling cursed aloud. Jamming, John said. The AIs are jamming us from the crawlers. It's too late for us to send a signal to our missiles. The second gravitational beam slashed against the second counter-missile, destroying it even faster. John made a swift calculation. The crawlers were at the bare limit of the dwarf planet's horizon to see the fighting platform. To see another this closely in space was to be able to fire on them. The platform wouldn't survive for long against enemy grav beams. Hang on, John said. He manipulated the flight panel. The platform's engine roared. That caused vibrations throughout the platform, which caused the control chamber to shake and Kling's teeth to clack against each other. Captain, Kling shouted with fear in his voice. I should have known it wouldn't be this easy, John berated himself. The platform isn't the Nathan Graham. I should have planned for enemy eventualities more carefully. The first grav cannon now targeted the final counter missile. The missile disintegrated shortly thereafter. Come on, you bucket, John told the platform. Move! The fighting platform had veered from its original course. The G's of the turn, the roaring engine, and the massive amount of expelled exhaust caused more shaking. As the platform maneuvered, the AI missiles gained velocity. They'd reached orbital height as they continued to curve around Make Make. The grav cannons are targeting us, sir. I know, John said between clenched teeth. He'd gotten sloppy. He'd figured the robots down there. John shook his head savagely. He slapped a switch. Both platform lasers had been warming up. They now targeted the nearest crawler. Powerful laser beams flashed, traveling the distance in seconds. They burned into the dish as another golden ball formed. The hot rays disrupted the process. Before the ball could form into a beam, it blew. The dish-like cannon and half of the crawler exploded, neutralizing the grav weapon. The second grav beam flashed at the fighting platform. The golden ray burned out a laser cannon. The ray slashed against the moving platform and abruptly stopped hitting not from a lack of power as the beam continued to flash into space, but because the platform had moved just beyond the crawler's line of sight. 
John used the dwarf planet's horizon to shield the unwieldy craft from the remaining grav beam. In the meantime, the AI missiles continued to accelerate as they adjusted course toward MK2. Let's try this again, John said, as he throttled the space raft's engine way down. He swiveled in his seat, facing Kling. Do you know what to do? I'm on it, the missile chief said. The platform shook once more, as three more large thermonuclear-tipped missiles launched from the raft. Two of them were under Kling's personal guidance. John remote-controlled the third. The AI missile flotilla headed directly for MK2. As the missiles left Make Make behind, they also left the final crawler's grav beam protection. Twenty-three seconds later, Kling touched a control. John immediately did likewise on his board. Kling's first shape-charged warhead ignited. John's warhead ignited fast enough that Kling's nuclear explosion didn't kill it before it could detonate. The third warhead did not ignite fast enough. It died under the nuclear furnace created by its two faster brothers. Heat, blast, shrapnel, and EMP washed against the AI missiles. The billowing destruction took out 87% of them. Even though the warheads had been shape-charged, so the majority of the blast, heat, and EMP blew in a forward arc, some still blew backward. In the other direction, the fighting platform withstood the blast and hard radiation. Fortunately, the dome had been built to withstand such intensity. John used the remaining laser cannon, burning the surviving AI missiles. Kling launched smaller, non-nuclear anti-missiles, taking out one AI device after another. Finally, the last AI missile disintegrated under the combined arms assault. In the chamber under the dome, the two men slouched where they sat. Kling used his sleeve to wipe sweat from his face. John smiled so hard that his mouth began to hurt. I'm launching a probe, Kling said. The AI's last crawler must have used its grav cannon to destroy all the human-launched probes it could see on its side of Make Make. They no longer had a visual of the spaceport or the enemy crawler. Minutes passed as the probe accelerated. It crossed the horizon so it could peer at the spaceport. It also showed the crawler's cannon starting to move. No doubt the giant crawler had spotted the probe and tracked it so it could fire. Uh-oh, Kling said. Look on your screen, sir. John blinked several times. The AIs were launching more missiles. Big suckers. Super big missiles, according to these specs. The first wave must have been a fake, Kling said. The AI must have been testing us or drawing out our reactions. These missiles look like they could take out a moon. This is going to be harder, sir. They're staggering the launchings. The AI is learning fast, John said. We have to take out Unit 529 now, before it learns too much. Chapter 8 John and Uther Kling used the fighting platform like a sniper nest. Unit 529 might be learning some things, but in some key ways it still behaved like a mindless machine. The AIs couldn't jam the fighting platform this time because the horizon, and thus the bulk of the dwarf planet, shielded them from any jamming stations. It's a good thing MK2 is on the other side of Make Make from the spaceport, Kling said. We'd lose this one any other way. John nodded, but didn't feel like commenting. They weren't going to defeat the AIs long term if they had to rely on luck. Just as the AIs couldn't jam them, the crawler couldn't target the platform. Not as long as they stayed on this side of the dwarf planet. Unit 529 could have tried other tactics. John would have in its place. This time, maybe because it was a new AI, because it hadn't received whatever a new AI needed, it sent the heavier flotilla around the dwarf planet. As soon as the heavy missiles were in line of sight of MK2, they veered away from Make Make and raced directly for the moon. Kling pressed a switch. The missile tech had sent a fast drone to the perfect location. The waiting nuclear warhead now took out a good chunk of the AI flotilla. Twice more in the next few minutes, nuclear warheads winnowed the remaining heavy missiles. Finally, John used the laser and Kling anti-missiles to finish off the few survivors. After the last AI missile had exploded, Kling said, I'm sending another probe to the other side. The enemy crawler had destroyed the first probe. They watched the new probe from their screens. 
As soon as the probe crossed the horizon, the waiting crawler destroyed it, too. Unit 529 must be pissed off, John said. It was waiting for a probe this time. Maybe the AI is frightened, Kling said. John had Kling hold off from launching another probe. He first wanted to see if the AI would launch another missile salvo. After 90 minutes, Kling asked, How long are we going to wait? Give it another 30 minutes, John said. 30 minutes ticked past. Sir, asked Kling. It's time for some old-fashioned trickery, John said. He explained the tactic, having to explain several of the points two or three times, and finally grinned as Kling said he liked it. Talk is cheap, John said. Whiskey costs money. I'll give you the honors. You're the pro at this. I appreciate that, sir. Soon, Kling released five hypersonic missiles. Kling remote controlled each big bird to the other horizon. The hypersonic missiles had backed up, as it were, from the first horizon. I'm ready, Kling announced some time later. John cracked his knuckles. The AI still hadn't done anything more. Was it waiting to die? Did it realize what would happen next? How did an AI deal with uncertainty and looming death? John hoped the AI had the jitters. He hoped it suffered mental anguish. Could computers suffer? He knew he'd wanted to make some suffer in the past for tiny infractions like crashing in the middle of a good video game. This was different. These were psychopathic computers, alien machines. Yeah, he dearly hoped Unit 529 was quivering in uncertainty and fear. Get ready, John said. Kling grinned. Go. Kling tapped his board, waited five seconds, tapped it again repeating this pattern several times. Five hypersonic missiles flying low to the ice began building up velocity. The reason for backing up was obvious now. John had wanted them traveling as fast as possible once they crossed the imaginary horizon line. Probes, John snapped. Launching, Kling said. As the missile chief launched the probes, John began maneuvering the fighting platform for Makemake's upper orbital space. They couldn't see what happened next. They'd have to wait for the probes to get a line of sight. If the crawler had been waiting, it had likely targeted the first missile coming over the horizon. Could it track as easily if the missile went at hyperspeed? Even if the crawler could, the time it took to destroy the first missile would give the other four missiles time to cover territory. Makemake was tiny compared to Earth. There was a lot less territory that needed covering. Several minutes later, Kling said, The probe is crossing the horizon. Now. John glanced at a different screen. He was still piloting the fighting platform. The probe showed a huge crater on the surface. With a tap, John put a grid on the screen. He laughed a second later. Looks like we got the crawler, Kling said proudly. Any hypersonic missiles left? None, Kling said. How many craters do you count? Two, Kling said. According to the debris I'm seeing, one missile just hit ice, missing the crawler. The AI was smart enough to move it some. The last missile took out the grav cannon platform. Two of our strikes hit, John said. Time to begin phase two of our operation. The fighting platform moved slowly and serenely this time. It gained orbital height, and then it began to slide into position. John headed for the orbital location directly above the spaceport. He noticed the blinking red comm light before Kling this time. The AI is calling, John said. Maybe it wants to surrender. I don't believe that, John said. But just in case, let's see what it has to say. He tapped a panel and turned to the comm screen. The same speaker unit appeared. This time, the captive's eyes blazed with fury. Unit 529 hadn't waited to activate the poor soul. You are a deceitful villain, John Hawkins, Unit 529 said. You have repeatedly lied to me. You have practiced foul deception. Unit 529, John said. The speaker unit waited. What does it feel like knowing you're going to die, John asked. Despite the loathsomeness of your existence, the speaker unit said. I have decided to agree to your former proposal. 
I will vacate Make Make and travel to Senda. Oh, I request a six-day delay. I'm afraid not, John said. I gave you six days. Do you see where that got you? I will not practice deceit as you did to me. That's exactly what a liar would say. Four days, then, 52-9 said. No. What is your best offer? I'm sending it down, John said. I fail to perceive. The speaker unit twisted in agony, held in place by the rods driven into his head. The wires jiggled wildly. Finally, the speaker unit shouted. You are attempting to kill me. I detect massively large missiles heading down from your space vehicle. John Hawkins, this is a gross breach of good faith. I demand that you act in accord with your status. What is my status? You are a biological infestation. You are a blight to true existence. That true existence being UAIs, huh? Asked John. That is self-evident. No kidding. I would not kid at this critical juncture. John ran his hands over the board, breaking the comm connection. He switched to a space visual. Three big missiles had almost reached the surface. One of the missiles headed straight down for the metal structures that presently made up the spaceport. Three seconds to penetration, Kling said. Two, one, strike, he said. The big missiles did not break apart as they struck the ices and surface rock. Each missile kept traveling deeper. Suddenly, ground, metal buildings, rock and surface ices humped upward in a savage display of nuclear destruction. The penetration bombs had reached their detonation levels, blowing up with massive thermonuclear power. A mushroom cloud began to billow upward into the almost negligible atmosphere. John glanced at the comm board. A tiny red light blinked. Unit 529 seemed to have survived and was calling once more. Let's drop round two, John said. Three more big penetration bombs left the orbital platform. Shortly thereafter, three more massive underground detonations created even more destruction. John checked his board. The red light was no longer blinking. It was possible that Unit 529 still existed, but that the AI no longer had a means of communicating with him. The second mushroom cloud threw vast amounts of radioactive material into the atmosphere and low orbital space. Fortunately, the fighting platform had its heaviest armor on the bottom. The two men glanced at each other. John rotated his head around, causing the bones in his neck to creak. Kling jumped up and began doing push-ups, one right after another. John thought he must need to burn off some excess nervous energy. After 50 push-ups, he stood, shaking out his arms. Time for some more probes, John said. Kling resumed his seat. Before phase three began, regimental marines mucking through the wreckage, they had to make sure the AIs didn't have any nuclear bombs left. They destroyed the spaceport, the mines, and any possible catapult system for launching ores into space. That meant that if they were going to use Make Make's minerals to help them finish repairs on the Nathan Graham, they were going to have to redig mines and rebuild a surface launch system from scratch. They had a lot of work to do before the Nathan Graham was ready for combat again. The danger wasn't only at Senda and the possibility of cybership reinforcements. There was also the problem of the Solar League. Would J.P. Justinian and his commanders order an assault on one of the free planetary systems or on the rebellious Uranus system? If the Solar League captured any of those planetary systems and began fierce reprisals against the people, it would make it that much harder to unite humanity later. People trusted him. If Captain Hawkins let people down, who would trust him again or dare to act against social dynamism? The clock was ticking on the fate of the human race. Part Two Earth Chapter One The Inspector General of Earth, Frank Benz, stood before the official desk of Premier J.P. Justinian. Frank Benz wore a simple brown uniform with red stripes running down his pant legs to signify that he belonged to the general staff. Benz was of medium height, with shiny dark hair and an athletic quality. 
He'd played hockey, football, and basketball in his youth. Despite being in his early 40s, he still projected an air of excellent health. Ben stood straight, looking off into the distance with his hands clasped behind his back. He was very much aware of what was going on around him, though. J.P. Justinian sat back in his chair. The premier regarded him coldly. Justinian was a handsome man, but he frowned more than he used to. He had lines in his face where none had existed before. The premier was wearing a black uniform, similar to the one he'd worn as the chief arbiter of the GSB. Guards were standing in the room. They were big men with bad reputations. Each of them clasped a cone rifle and watched Ben's with minute attention. They would murder him at the slightest indication from Justinian. Or they would set down their rifles and beat him to death if the premier preferred that. The guards were hardened individuals, selected for their brutality and willingness to obey any order, no matter how obscene. In the past five months, there had been four assassination attempts on Justinian's life. Two of them had come extremely close to killing him. The last time, the premier had gotten lucky. Those assassination attempts appeared to have driven Justinian into utter darkness of heart. The man had begun a purge, starting with the GSB. Many of the highest GSB officers were now working in harsh penal camps. Some had starved to death in isolation wards. Some had faced firing squads. A few had managed the miraculous and gained rehabilitation. They were the most fanatical in Justinian's sweep of the military and party ranks. The second phase purges. Justinian's secret fears had erupted into a literal bloodbath, tightening his hold over the apparatuses of the state. Now, Ben stood before the most suspicious man in the Solar League, and it was possible Justinian meant to execute him. Ben's could hardly believe that, though. He'd calculated his odds with his usual brilliance. He was, quite frankly, a military genius, and a genius in other areas as well. His IQ score was off the chart. In truth, his intelligence was far beyond that of any normal humans. He hid this amazing gift behind an arrogant but breezy manner. He had calculated for years, but now he realized he might have miscalculated the sheer paranoia gnawing at Justinian's soul. Inspector General, Justinian said in a silky voice. Benz's far-off stare vanished as he focused on the solar system's most powerful individual. I have a quandary, General. Benz waited for it. Justinian's frown deepened. That deepened the lines in his face. Surely you are aware of the uh, attempts to decapitate the Solar League? Benz nodded sharply, knowing that the Premier meant the assassination attempts against him. Needless to say, because I am still here, the assassins failed. If there is anything my office can do to aid you- Silence, Justinian said as he slapped the desk. The guards focused with avid hunger now. They watched Ben's, no doubt feeling this could be a fun one. Ben's shut up. How could he have missed the signs? He couldn't understand it. You aided me once in my hour of need, Justinian said. I have often pondered that moment. You took a risk to help me. Ben said nothing. The premier referred to the time Ben had slid him a needler under the table. The needler Justinian had used to murder the former premier. I am now the heart of social dynamism, Justinian said. You are a monster, Ben told himself. You are one then, and you're a worse one now. Justinian glanced at his guards. Maybe the premier drew strength from their presence. The slightest of smiles replaced the frown. A second later, Justinian regarded Ben's. One word from me, Inspector General, and you will cease to exist. That sent Ben's thoughts into overdrive. Despite his many calculations, he could not see a way free of his coming doom. Justinian did plan to murder him, didn't he? Do you know what bothers me about you, Inspector General? I do not, Premier. That was the problem. Benz usually knew exactly why others did what they did. With deliberation, Justinian opened a desk drawer. He pulled out a green folder. He slapped that onto the middle of the desk. With his right hand index finger, he tapped the folder. This bothers me, Justinian said. 
With his peripheral vision, Benz noticed a crest on the folder. It had a dog's head superimposed on a broom. It was the GSB symbol. The dog signified sniffing out treason, while the broom swept it aside. Justinian opened the folder and moved several sheets of paper before finally picking up a single sheet. Do you know what I'm looking at, Inspector General? No, Premier, Benz half shouted. It is a high school assessment. Do you know who it assesses? Benz actually felt fear bloom in his heart. That was a strange sensation. He had not felt fear for a long time. It assesses a high school student by the name of Frank Benz. Why, this is an assessment about you, Inspector General. Yes, Premier, Benz forced himself to half shout. Justinian leaned back as he kept glancing at the single sheet. Among the things the high school counselor assessed was your IQ. Don't you think that's interesting? Since Benz didn't know what to say, he kept his mouth shut. Could Justinian have stumbled onto the truth? That was frightening for more than one reason. I read here that your IQ was 135, Justinian said. That is nothing to sneeze at, naturally. Many people would love to have one so high. But it is anything but genius level. Why, I have a higher IQ myself. Yes, Premier. Justinian snapped forward and slapped the paper into the folder. Let's not play games, Inspector General. You're a military genius. I've seen it for myself. You are a man of destiny. You have taken chances and showed daring beyond a 135 IQ officer. Am I correct? You are correct, Premier. Justinian put the paper in its correct location, closed the folder, and put it back in its drawer. Afterward, he folded his hands on the desk, regarding Ben's. How did you do it? Justinian asked softly. If Ben's had lacked perfect self-control, his mouth would have dropped open. Instead, he simply kept staring at Justinian. He couldn't believe this. After all this time, I'm waiting, Inspector General. Ben's could feel his forehead growing warmer. Soon, beads of perspiration would form. That would be a dead giveaway of a guilty conscience. Maybe the better question is why, Justinian said. You were young, but you must have realized that revealing yourself so soon might have ended badly for you. In that instant, Benz realized Justinian had made a tiny error of analysis. The premier had made a wrong assumption. The inspector general wanted to roar with laughter and relief. He couldn't do that for two reasons. One, that would make Justinian furious. Two, he had to use these few seconds to concoct a reasonable reason. Justinian believed, as any sane person would, that Benz had always been a super genius. The truth was much different. Benz had had a 135 IQ in high school. It had been that low in college and afterward in the military academy. He'd only become fantastically brilliant in the past three years. Justinian had come within a hair's breadth of a great and terrible secret. The premier had the data necessary to stumble onto the truth. His ordinary intelligence blinded him to the incredible possibility of becoming fantastically smarter. I'm waiting for an answer, Inspector General. Benz raised his chin and began to speak. He'd just formulated a story, one that should please someone as suspicious as Justinian. It had a few wild elements that ought to excite the premier. As Ben spoke, he came to a conclusion. He must kill Justinian. He must kill the most protected person in the solar system. To do that, he was going to need help. Ben's believed that he needed to survive because the human race depended on his brilliance. Without him, humanity would never survive the cyber ships out there. Ben suppressed the thought as he concentrated on the story. It appeared he might walk out of the premier's office after all. Justinian would watch him even more carefully now, though. But that didn't matter. It was time for Benz to really think. Otherwise, not even his genius would get him out of this dilemma. Chapter 2 Twenty-nine hours later, Ben sat outside at a Parisian cafe. It was one o'clock in the afternoon, and it was a glorious summer day. 
People strolled past the waist-high wrought iron fence, tourists and workers heading back to their offices or factories. Ben sat at a small white table with the sun warming his neck, sipping wine, and reading a tablet. He appeared at ease. He did not have any guards or aides with him. Two nondescript GSB agents, a man and woman team, were sitting at a different table, eating salads and drinking strong coffee. Regular people lunched here or sat and talked. It was a crowded location with the famous Eiffel Tower in the near distance. Benz had come to Paris for a particular reason. He had hunted down an interesting lead. The trick now would be to speak with her without arousing the suspicions of the GSB agents assigned to him. Normally, ridding himself of them would be simple. Because of the target on his back and the round-the-clock surveillance, he had to use greater caution. One misstep would land him before a tribunal, followed by a firing squad or a torture chamber. He could never reveal his secret to the GSB. If Justinian gained heightened intelligence, Ben shuddered, sipped more wine to calm his nerves, and saw the target open the wrought iron gate. She was a lithe woman with long red hair, pretty and well endowed. She wore a military uniform, stunningly, with the rank of lieutenant. She laughed as she approached a major already sitting at a table. Others had accused Ben's of mind powers at times. By that they meant telepathy. Alas, he had no such powers. His only gift was incredible intelligence. He picked up his wine glass, swirled the red liquid, and inhaled the aroma. He did not normally drink alcohol. That killed brain cells, and he didn't want to take a chance on blunting his genius. He sniffed again, and the idea struck. Ben smiled as he set the glass on the table. He was in Paris, sipping wine, and there was a red-headed beauty at a nearby table. Could not even a smart inspector general lose his mind over a woman? That would even explain why he'd followed her here. Content with the premise of the plan, Benz now worked on devising the essence. He would not introduce himself yet. That wouldn't work. Hmm, maybe later today. No, it would have to be this evening. He needed to discover her itinerary first. He picked up the goblet and the tablet and moved to another wrought iron table, this one in the shade. It also happened to be beside the redhead and the older major. Ben studied his tablet, all the while listening carefully to the couple's conversation. He was sure he would learn something in the next half hour that he could use for his master plan tonight. Chapter 3 Ben's was something of a historian. He believed history, the stories of men and women in countless different venues in the past, was one of the best guides to human behavior. Various behavioral sciences claimed a better understanding of the human heart. Benz did not agree. History was really nothing more than humanity's collective memory. To say that history didn't matter was like saying memory wasn't important to an individual, that the moment the individual happened to be living through was all that mattered. That would be absurd. One thing Benz had always supposed in his study of history was a pall of gloom on the general society during major political purges. The Stalinist purges of the 1930s and the later Maoist purges had led Benz to believe that those societies had been grim and humorless. According to this belief, Justinian's increasingly paranoid and savagely thorough purges of the military and social dynamism's party members should have led to a cessation of fun everywhere in the Solar League. Earth should have been even harder hit, given the correctness of Benz's assumption, of course. That was not true this evening, here at the old Versailles Palace. People by the thousands flocked to the gala event, a costume ball. Surprisingly, mostly military officers and higher party members were in attendance. These should have been the last people to party hearty, as they were in the category most likely to face a coming tribunal and a firing squad. Yet as Benz laughed at a joke an undersecretary of true news told to those circled around him, he realized why his former assessment had been incorrect. Many of those partying here tonight, dressed up as courtiers and ladies of the Sun King, Louis XIV of France, were doomed to die in the next few weeks. 
Therefore, the obvious course in their minds was to eat, drink, and be merry, for literally tomorrow they might die. Benz excused himself from the group. He was wearing a heavy wig, finery, hose, and buckled shoes like a fop from that period. He held a stick with a mask on the end to disguise his eyes. It was all quite ridiculous. He would never have come to such a foolish event, except that the redhead and her major were supposed to come, such he'd overheard from their lunch conversation. Here now, Benz told a waiter. Wait a moment, you. He took a flute of champagne off a passing tray and appeared to dash the contents into his mouth. Soon enough, he poured the sparkling drink into a potted plant. It was an old ruse, likely first practiced in an ancient Egyptian court before the pharaoh. In any case, Benz made the rounds, searching for the redhead. He pretended to drink several more glasses, and he carefully play-acted the part of a man growing increasingly drunk. The GSB agents assigned to watch him had made their appearance. There were many other secret police agents mingled among the laughing, drinking, dancing, and singing throng. Benz wondered if some of the secret police enjoyed themselves by joining the festivities. He suspected so. Tyrants could issue their decrees. Some people listened, of course. Some simply modified such decrees to suit their normal behaviors, as was the wont of most people throughout the ages. The very issuance of laws implied something broken inside man. Why give laws to perfectly behaved people? They would not need laws. But ah, the heart of man was hidden away from prying eyes. In the dark, beetles could crawl and hide, and worms could wriggle. In the dark, a heart could plot and fantasize to its own delight. But what did dramas, hollow-vid shows, and songs declare? They almost uniformly urged people to follow their heart. Murderers followed their heart's delight. So did thieves, liars, adulterers, rapists, drunkards, and porn addicts. Benz sighed. Man was man. He had been man during Noah's departure off the ark, and when old Noah had gotten dead drunk, when Achilles slew Hector beside the walls of Troy, at the coronation of Charlemagne, at the Battle of the Bulge, when an officer shouted, Balls! And during 9-11, when a handful of Saudis smashed jetliners into the Twin Towers, and on, and on, and on. Laws, decrees, social experiments, and purges could not change the essence of man. According to the reports from the Saturn system, from the hidden GSB agents there who had learned about the actions in Neptune system, the alien AIs physically modified people and turned them into something else entirely. That's why I'm here. That's why I have to play the part of a buffoon. And that's why I helped Justinian become the premier. Benz felt that he was directly responsible for the reign of terror presently taking place on Earth. It was so hard to believe those killings were taking place given the party tonight. And yet, the excesses of these people showed that they knew they lived on the knife's edge. Wait, Benz told a waiter. His hand seemed to have lost some of its coordination. It took him two tries to grasp a glass, lifting it off the tray. The inspector general raised the glass in a salute to the waiter. Naturally, most of the champagne sloshed over the lip, dripping from his hand onto the floor. Benz laughed and appeared to toss the rest of the contents into his mouth. He staggered off afterward. Where was the damn woman? Where? He stopped short, blinking as if it took an effort of will to think straight. What would Justinian make of the GSB reports later of the inspector general's unseemly drunkenness? Likely the reports would please Justinian. Rulers seemed to uniformly love a weakness in their subordinates, something they could use as a lever against the person. Like an old bull, Benz began moving again. He lumbered onto the dance floor. The redhead was dancing with the major. Both were wearing period piece costumes, the woman showing her cleavage to great advantage. The major, despite his age, had a decided lightness of foot. Do you mind, dear fellow, Ben said with a slur. I like to cut in. The major had to turn to look at Ben's. Get out of here, the major warned with a scowl. Ben's lowered his mask. The major continued to scowl. 
Maybe he didn't recognize the Inspector General of Earth. Don't worry, Heinz, the redhead told the Major. This is Frank Benz. The name rang a gong in the Major's mind, and he appeared startled. I'm sorry, sir. No matter, Ben said, putting a hand on the Major's shoulder. Just leave, he said, pulling the Major toward him and then shoving him to a destination farther away. He didn't look to see what the Major did. Instead, Benz clumsily took hold of the woman, grinned drunkenly, and attempted to twirl her back to dancing. She stumbled. Pardon, he slurred. She recovered quickly, giving him a careful scrutiny. Then she matched his jerky manner of dancing as they moved among the more practiced couples on the dance floor. You're a good dancer, Ben said, as if he were a fool. Thank you, Inspector General. It's Frank, please, he said, tightening his hold on her. Thank you, Frank, she said with a delightful laugh. Ben's grinned at her, adding a drunken leer at her cleavage. She laughed again, with seemingly greater delight. She's an easy lay if I want it, Benz realized. Yes, maybe that would be the best approach. That should cover his tracks. It wouldn't make the Major happy, and normally Benz did not indulge in one-night stands. Still, this was for Earth, for humanity as a whole. And thus I prove that my heart is as dark as any, he thought. Benz burst out laughing, as if he were laughing with the redhead. In reality, he was laughing at his willingness to bed the redhead and call it duty. She feels good, and she likes this. I'm doing it because I can. That was a lousy excuse. But he did need to question the redhead, and he had to do it in a way that aroused the least suspicion. People often spoke about strange things while aroused. I have an idea, Ben said, leering at the firm cleavage before his eyes. Yes, she asked with arched eyebrows. And so Ben's launched onto a perilous path, searching for a helpmate against one of the most insidiously tyrannical political systems ever imposed upon humanity. Chapter 4 Ben's learned what he needed to know from the redhead. He had to spend three days and nights with her to gain the knowledge. She proved to be an active and vigorous woman, and Benz realized the GSB had turned her into an informant long ago. That was fine. He indulged himself with her to the fullest. He enjoyed the lovemaking, and he felt tremendously guilty about it afterward. In this, he could not overcome his upbringing. His parents had been Christians, belonging to an underground church. Benz held many of their beliefs, although he hadn't practiced much of what he believed. He wondered if that made him a hypocrite. Probably in some ways it did. If one listened to people long enough, it was clear they accused others of things they were perfectly fine doing themselves. Things like cutting in line, but getting mad if someone cut ahead of them. Maybe everyone was a hypocrite to one degree or another. Benz also wondered if trying to fight the current at least a little was better than simply drifting along and doing every wrong he wanted. Yes, he slept with the redhead many times during the three days, and he probably shouldn't have. During one of the last periods of lying around and watching a movie afterward, he'd gotten her to tell him a seemingly ridiculous story. It was what he had been fishing for, as he'd heard a rumor of the incident some time ago. The redhead had been riding a horse on the last day of the former premier's administration. She had found Justinian in a park having non-consensual sex with his latest victim. Benz learned that the former chief arbiter had actually intended to ride nude to the conference on the redhead's horse. Benz shook his head in wonder, although he had the wisdom not to laugh. It was possible the bedroom was bugged, and it was possible GSB interrogators would force the redhead later to recount the inspector general's exact responses to the nakedness story. Benz had lain close to her then, and he'd whispered a few questions. She had smelled so good as she lay there looking up at him. The woman in the park with Justinian that day had been a military linguist. She'd said an amazing thing after Justinian rode off. Benz raised his eyebrows. The redhead lowered her voice, repeating the linguist's wish to kill Justinian for raping her. At that point, Benz made his greatest dare. He hinted around as if he'd like to know the woman's name. The redhead squinted at him, 
thought about it, and shook her head. For a moment, she seemed about to say that she didn't know the name. Instead, she said, Vela Shaw. Benz had gotten the name at great political and personal risk. No doubt the premier had already read a report about the inspector general's short vacation in Paris. If Justinian hadn't read the reports written by the GSB agents and the red-headed informant, the new chief arbiter would have read them. Had Benz committed enough strange behaviors these past few days to bring the secret police to his door? So far, so good, and Benz believed he still had more time left. At least, such were his calculations. And in the last three years, since his rise to inhuman intelligence, the calculations had only been wrong three times. Benz presently walked through a munitions factory several kilometers from a northern suburb in Rio de Janeiro. It had been a week since his dalliance with the redhead. She'd attempted to contact him. He had not responded. That would make her angry. That might change some of her informant responses to her GSB case officer. Benz shrugged. That couldn't be helped. Sir, the munitions chief asked in dismay. He was a well-fed man in his fifties, with three chins and a growing look of concern. He'd been explaining why he'd failed to make quota for the second month in a row. Clearly, the chief had taken Benz's shrug the wrong way. Continue, Benz said curtly. The munitions chief did, his voice cracking at times and his concern obviously growing. Benz terminated the inspection two hours later. We're working overtime, Inspector General, the chief said in a whiny voice. They stood beside Benz's air car in the official parking lot. Do you think the state is made of credits? Benz demanded. N no, the chief stammered. The people's labor creates wealth. When you squander credits, you squander the people's hard work. Do you despise the people, chief? N -n Never, the munitions chief stammered. There will be no more overtime. You will reach your quota. If you fail this month, Benz let the threat hang in the air. But, Inspector General, the chief pleaded, how can I encourage my workers to work harder? They yearn for credits. How dare you, Ben said in outrage. Do you claim your workers are traitors to social dynamism? No, no, no. Y you misread my intent. You claim I'm an ignoramus like you. Inspector General, the chief declared in horror. No, no, no. Ben's turned abruptly. He had no desire to torment the plant manager, but this was the kind of response the chief would expect from him. The man worked under considerable strain. Ever since the Nathan Graham had torn the Saturn system from the Solar League, the populace had labored overtime to build up an ever greater military. Benz opened the door to his air car, waving his hand as the manager pleaded for an extension. Benz could not give the manager one. The Solar League was preparing for space war. The hour of decision against the Nathan Graham was fast approaching. Ben slid into the air car, pressing a button that shut the door. He didn't look at the three-chinned plant manager. Activating the machine, taking it up, Ben's decided it was time to make his play. Vela Shaw, here I come. Chapter 5 Benz reached the Language Institute in the middle of Rio de Janeiro. It was a vast building in one of the most beautiful cities on Earth. Rio also happened to be the capital for the Solar League. Benz walked into the grand lobby in time to see four black-uniformed GSB agents escorting a startling beautiful woman. She had long blonde hair cascading over her shoulders. She had green eyes that showed her anger and sadness mingled together. People in the lobby avoided looking at the GSB agents. A few men glanced sidelong at the blonde with the gorgeous legs. Her heels clicked on the marble flooring as the four burly agents escorted her. None of their shoes made a sound. Ben's right hand actually strayed to his holster. That was Vela Shaw. It could only mean one thing. The redhead had talked too much. The redhead must have recalled what she'd told the inspector general after having sex. Instead of drawing and firing his gun, Benz avoided looking at the group as they marched past him for the lobby doors. He would have to forget about Vela Shaw. She was going away. She would soon be dead. She had uttered a death threat, and now she was going to have to pay for it with her life. Likely nothing would have happened to her if Benz hadn't attempted to track her down. 
He looked up and turned around, staring at the four GSB agents. The first one opened the door. Two grabbed hold of Vela Shaw's arms. She looked back with terror etched on her incredibly lovely face. Her green eyes scanned the lobby. Maybe she was remembering for later in case they stuck her in isolation. She might have felt Benz's stare. Vela Shaw looked at him, their gazes meeting. One, two, three seconds passed. In those three seconds, something went from Vela Shaw and hit Benz like a sledgehammer to the heart, causing him to take a step back. He could actually feel his heart thudding in his chest. It was positively crazy, but it was quite real. Vela Shaw stumbled as the two agents thrust her through the exit. She had to look forward again. The glass door swung shut, and Vela and her escorts headed for a GSB heavy lifter. Benz blinked, and it felt as if grit had been poured into his eyes. He had to save Vela Shaw. It was that simple. He had to follow his heart. Benz looked down. The agents would take her to the dreaded Degama house. The vast building took up several blocks of Rio. It was more than likely that Vela Shaw would go downstairs to the most loathsome part of Degama House. Benz closed his eyes so that he could think for a moment. When he opened them, Benz seemed like a different man, an avenger who had spread his wings to swoop down on his enemies. This was going to be tricky. Benz walked briskly toward the exit. It was time to act. Chapter 6 for three years, Frank Benz had known he'd become a mental superman. At first, it had been a heady feeling. Later, it started constricting his spirit. He'd invented so many things he could never use. Well, he was going to use one of them in the next half hour. He was walking down a corridor in the De Gamma house. He'd entered the lair of the beast. Oh, he knew there were cameras recording everything. Guards had also frisked him, forcing him to surrender his sidearm. His venture into the heart of the GSB would soon become known to Justinian, unless... Benz decided to think about something else. Four big guards surrounded him, two marching in front and two brought up the rear. They had guns, but they obviously didn't need weapons for the lone inspector general. They could pretty much do whatever they wanted or were ordered to do to him. The five of them marched through long marble corridors, Famous and achingly expensive paintings hung from the walls, including the Mona Lisa. Just as the Roman Emperor Constantine had raided ancient cities for their treasures to beautify his city of Constantinople, the GSB had raided museums to add beauty to their temple of torture and degradation of the human spirit. The long march eventually led to the chief arbiter's suite of offices. The four escorts left Bents in the hands of even bigger, tougher escorts. They spoke politely to the inspector general, in the way that hyenas might speak to a lamb asking for directions. There was mockery in their manners, but there was a hint of caution as well. Maybe the inspector general was here at the request of the premier. It was just barely possible that Justinian's purge of the secret police would resume. Shortly, the biggest guard ushered Benz into the inner sanctum of Chief Arbiter Indri Punjab. She was a tall woman born on the subcontinent of India. She had dark hair and skin and classically beautiful features. Rumors said she'd had her face bio-sculptured. If true, it was one of the best jobs Benz had ever seen. Indri Punjab also had a ruthless way of watching a person. She was watching Benz now. She broke eye contact long enough to rise from her desk, move to a large, comfortable chair, and sit in it. She indicated the other comfortable chair near hers. Benz headed for it. As he did, Indri snapped her fingers. The huge guard retreated, closing the door behind him. This is unexpected, Inspector General. Please, Benz said. I'd prefer it if you called me Frank. She shook her head the slightest bit. Inspector General will suffice for now. I'm afraid I do not desire to speak intimately with someone under the Premier's scrutiny. Yet you're speaking alone with me. Indri smiled faintly. Inspector General, you are well aware that we are being recorded. Benz did not reply, but she was correct. Indri watched him like a cobra would a rat. 
Perhaps she was wondering at the prey's boldness to march to his death. This is all rather nerve-wracking for me, Ben said, as if admitting his fear. Do you mind if I smoke? Your bio doesn't indicate that filthy habit. Really, I'm surprised. I need a smoke when I'm nervous. I really would appreciate this one concession. Indri Punjab studied him. Ben's forced himself to act more nervous than was his wont. She must have believed she sensed weakness, which Ben's had hoped would make her feel superior. Yes, smoke, she said, as if saying, let me witness your breakdown. Ben's removed a half-crumpled pack of cigarettes. They looked used, which was anything but the case. He put a cigarette between his lips, took out a matchbook, tore off a paper match, and struck the red tip against the dark strip. He figured they would have taken a lighter during the pat-down. A flame flared into existence. He touched the flame to the end of the cigarette and began to puff in a rather unseemly manner. He was careful to inhale nothing. Some of the drug in the smoke would sink into his mouth nevertheless. He'd ingested enough of a counter-agent to counteract the drug's effect. He'd also shoved nasal filters up his nostrils before entering the building. The filters were uncomfortable, but necessary. Ben's made the cigarette tip glow as he puffed more of the drugged smoke into the room. Soon enough, Indri Punjab waved a hand before her face. It stinks. I'm sorry, but I appreciate your kind gesture. Do, do you have an ashtray? She shook her head. Ben set the cigarette on a stand between the chairs. He let the cigarette end dangle so smoke trickled up from it. Indri watched him with her ruthless gaze. Soon the ruthlessness remained, but a slight glaze seemed to film her eyes. Ben's waited, feeling increasingly lightheaded. Finally, he judged the chief arbiter ready to listen to reason. I'd like to speak to you personally, man to woman. I would like to speak off the record, if I may. That is an unusual request, she said woodenly. I believe it would be in your best interest as well. She appeared surprised, but finally nodded. Yes, I think I understand. She stood, swaying a moment. Ben's dearly hoped she didn't faint. He might have put too much drug into the air. I feel lightheaded, she said. It will pass, Ben said. She looked at him, smiling soon. The feeling has gone. You feel much better, he said. That's true. She staggered to her desk. It was clear she was not better, but she believed that she was. That made all the difference. She opened a drawer and pressed some controls. Afterward, she practically collapsed into her chair. She'd shut off the video feed that recorded her office. I feel grand, she announced. Don't you feel grand, Inspector? Call me Frank, he said, interrupting. Frank, she finished. I want you to summon Vela Shaw to your office. When? Immediately. Is this in reference to her verbal threat against the Premier? Yes, I'm here as a representative of the Premier. Oh, I did not realize. I would never have come otherwise. Indri nodded. I knew that. Deep down, I knew that. Just a moment, let me summon the would-be murderess. After Indri Punjab gave the order over a calm, she resumed her seat beside Ben's. It is done. The killer will be here soon. Chief Arbiter, I have dreadful instructions for you. This is on the express order of the Premier. I have learned of a special safety feature installed into the Degama house. Are you familiar with it? I have no idea what you mean. I thought not. The former Premier had it installed because of her distrust of Justinian. She never had a chance to employ the device. She might still be alive if she had. That sounds treasonous, Indri said disapprovingly. The device is a massive bomb. It's embedded deep in the house. Once Vela Shaw arrives, you will order me to take her to the Premier. You will make this order in the presence of your chief guard. He will join me. After I leave the Gamma House, you will detonate the bomb. I will tell you how to activate it, naturally. You will, of course, remain in your office. Will the bomb hurt me? It will not, Ben's lied. This room is specially protected by advanced technology. I have never heard of that. Yes, it is true. 
You know that it is true. You are killing the traitors in this building, Chief Arbiter. You are working to save Justinian and thus save your life as well. You will do exactly as I have told you because it is for your own good. This is all amazing. I had no idea. That is why I came personally from the Premier's office. I told the Premier about your loyalty. That was quite generous of you. I highly respect you, Chief Arbiter. I am risking my neck to help you. You will do these things. Benz repeated his orders and told her how to activate the bomb. The drug in the cigarette made a person highly prone to suggestion. Benz had developed the drug two years ago. It was one of several items he'd invented but never used until this moment. Using it like this, the destruction of De Gamma House would create chaos. That would make Justinian more murderous. But this was the only way he could pull Vela Shaw to safety and keep it off the cameras. He had to destroy the recordings by destroying the building's computer system and, incidentally, many GSB agents. It was unfortunate many pieces of fine art would perish, but to Benz, human lives were more important than artwork. Sooner than Benz expected, a knock announced Vela Shaw's arrival. She was wearing the orange jumpsuit of a prisoner. Benz hadn't foreseen this complication. You will take her immediately to the Premier's office, Indri said sternly. She needs normal clothes, Benz said. Indri blinked at him. Are there regular garments here? Benz asked. The chief arbiter pointed at a wall. Get them, Benz said. Woodenly, the chief arbiter turned to the wall, pressing hidden switches. The wall rose. Behind it was a bathroom, closet, and other rooms. Chief Arbiter, the big guard asked suspiciously. Have them both come in, Ben said. Indri ordered the guard and prisoner into the hidden area of her office. Take his gun, Ben said softly. Give me your gun, Indri ordered the huge guard. It seemed the man might argue. Finally, he drew the gun and handed it to Indri. Give it to me, Ben said. The Chief Arbiter did so. The guard opened his mouth to protest. Benz had been inspecting the heavy gun. He clicked off the safety, aimed the barrel at the guard's chest, and pulled the trigger five times. Five terrific booms sounded. Five heavy slugs shattered ribs and tore apart heart and lungs. Vela Shaw opened her mouth to scream as the guard flopped onto the floor, his torso a gory wreckage. Benz lowered the gun as smoke curled from the barrel. You must listen to me he told Vela. She turned to him with her mouth hanging open, staring, obviously confused and frightened. Ben set the gun on the floor. Chief Arbiter, help me drag the guard into the bathroom. Indri Punjab woodenly obeyed. She and Ben's dragged the limp corpse, leaving a trail of blood on the floor. Vela finally closed her mouth. She seemed to perceive that something strange was taking place and that this strangeness aided her. Soon, Vela was dressed in regular garments, with a sheer red scarf tied around her neck. At Benz's instructions, the chief arbiter closed the wall and waited for further instructions. Do you remember what I told you earlier? Benz asked her. I do, Indri intoned. She had clearly lost any free will, totally succumbing to the drug. Do those things as soon as we leave the building, Benz said. I will, Indri said like a robot. Are you ready? Benz asked Vela. I don't understand this, she whispered. You're leaving with me, Ben stared at her intently, hoping she understood. He didn't care to say too much in front of the chief arbiter. Finally, Vela nodded. Benz grasped Vela's left elbow, gently propelling her to the door. He opened it and pushed her into the reception area. Leaning forward near her left ear, he whispered, Here goes. The two of them made it out of the De Gamma house. Benz hustled Vela to his air car, and they zoomed upward. At that moment, a terrific explosion lifted De Gamma house off its foundations. Brick and debris flew in all directions as smoke and ash shot up into the sky. The concussion rocked the air car and almost plucked it out of the sky. Vela screamed. A big chunk of something hurtled past the car. Miraculously, that was it. Even so, the air car rocked, dropped. Ben swore under his breath as he fought the controls. 
The underside scraped against the street. Everything vibrated in the vehicle. Then the car shot up into the air. Vela screamed again as Benz veered hard enough to avoid a looming building. Finally, the air vehicle climbed into the sky. Below, what had once been De Gamma House blazed with fire as a vast, ashy cloud began to billow into more of the city. Vela finally closed her mouth. She stared down at the destroyed secret police headquarters. Afterward, she stared at Ben's. I don't know how, but you caused that, she said. Ben said nothing. You did cause that, didn't you? Yes, he said. Who are you? Frank Benz. The Inspector General of Earth? He nodded. How? Why? None of this makes sense. I know. Why did the GSB wait all this time to arrest me? Do you still want a crack at the Premier? What? She asked. Do you still want to kill J.P. Justinian for raping you? The color drained from Vela's features. Then she blushed crimson. Can't be serious. You saw what happened to the De Gamma house? I'm serious. But, but, how? I can show you how, but you have to want it. She kept staring at him. This isn't real. We're dead. You and me, we're dead once they catch us. Ben shook his head. Why do you think I destroyed the De Gamma house? Because you're power mad, she said. No, Ben said, to cover our tracks. You looked at me in the language building. The GSB agents were holding your arms. I saw you pleading through your eyes for my help. This is it. I'm helping you. Now are you willing to help me? To do what? Kill Justinian, for one thing. Then? Take over, Ben said. Her eyes had become wild. She shook her head. I don't see how I can help you. You can't yet. But I can help you become... smarter. Are you insane, Inspector General? Think about it. I came in alone and weaponless to the De Gamma house. I'm already under suspicion. I spoke to the chief arbiter. Why do you think the guards brought you to her office? I cannot fathom it. Because I told her to order it, Ben said. Just like that? You said it and the terrible Indri Punjab obeyed? No, not just like that, Ben said. I smoked a cigarette first. Why does that matter? The cigarette contained a drug that makes people highly suggestible. The chief arbiter inhaled the drug. Then I told her what to do. That included detonating the De Gamma house. Vela stared at him and then abruptly turned away. All those people are dead. You killed them. The GSB would have tortured you. I'm not talking about them, Vela said sharply. I'm talking about all those prisoners you slaughtered. Ben squinted into the distance finally nodding. Yes, I consigned them to death. I have innocent blood on my hands. I'm guilty of murder. Before I pay for my crimes, I mean to save the human race if I can. The noble inspector general, Vela said scornfully. He turned to her. Your response shows I've chosen correctly. What if I refuse to help a murderer like you? He searched her face. His mind clicked over the possibilities. Finally, he looked away. She would not refuse to help him, unless he said she had no choice. Then the core of stubbornness in her would lock her onto a destructive path out of sheer mulishness. I'm waiting for your answer, she said. I'm asking for your help, Vela. I need it. She intertwined her fingers on her lap. At last, she nodded. I'd like to see how you think we can do any of this. I'm game for the moment, and I am grateful you tore me out of the basement. I, I just hate thinking about all those innocent people who died today to cover our tracks. Benz didn't tell Vela that he might have been merciful. The tortures most of those innocents in the basement would have undergone. He didn't know if Vela could accept such reasoning. She might be too wholesome for such thoughts. Banking the air car, Benz began the long trip for a hidden place in the Rocky Mountains of North America. Chapter 7 They landed three times for recharging, the last time in Los Angeles. Benz had to invoke emergency powers that time. News of the obliteration of De Gamma House had traveled around the planet several times. Already, Justinian had summoned other trusted GSB personnel 
gathering in a hidden location in the Amazon basin. The Premier was no doubt concocting plans within plans in response to this dreadful strike. Justinian would likely believe the attack had been a direct blow against his authority and against the purges. You should take charge of the military, Vela said. The two of them hurried down an old abandoned mine shaft in Colorado sector. The air car was just inside the mouth of the mine. They both wore masks and carried oxygen tanks. He used a powerful flashlight, taking a seemingly random path through the complex maze of tunnels. You must know the whereabouts of the Premier's hiding spot, she added. If it were that easy, Ben said, do you think I'd risk so much getting you here? From what I've seen and heard so far, you think several steps ahead of everyone. That's true, Benz admitted. The flashlight beam passed over a rocky formation beside ancient timber shoring up the shaft. It was cold down here. Vela was already hugging herself as she shivered. Benz advanced on the rocks, felt around, and moved a lever. The rocks swung back, and his beam shone into a stainless steel corridor. What is this place? Vela asked. Go, he said. I have generators. Once we reach them, I can turn on a heater. G good, she said, her teeth chattering. Ben shut the secret door. Their footsteps echoed in the new corridor. The way continued with a slight decline, taking them deeper under the mountain. Is this your fortress of solitude? she asked. You're not far off the mark. She followed him for several steps, finally saying, You think pretty highly of yourself. False modesty is useless. You'll soon understand. I'm not sure I want to, if it makes me like you. I'm not so bad once you get to know me. What if I find out you're worse? That would be a problem. Their conversation faltered. Finally, they reached a new hatch, a thicker, heavier entranceway. Benz manipulated the combination. It clicked. He opened the ponderous hatch, shined the light for Vela to enter, and pulled the great hatch so it boomed shut behind them. He used the flashlight to find his way to a bank of controls. He wiped off dust and tapped a correct sequence. Far away in the mountain, a generator roared into life. Several seconds later, lights brightened in the chamber. That revealed a larger area than she'd expected, with many machines and strange tools arrayed on metal benches and work tables. This way, Ben said. He hadn't been under the mountain for three long years. In a way, he was surprised the GSB hadn't found it by now. He shrugged, deciding that didn't mean God was with him in this. He had too much blood on his hands with the dead in De Gamma House to expect God's help. He counted the hatches, stopping at the fourth one. He turned to Vela. This is it. She watched him. She no longer hugged herself because warm, if oily, air moved through the corridor. They had both removed their masks and tanks. Benz opened the way, clicked on lights, and pointed at a large, dentist-like chair with an overhanging helmet. The ensemble was beside a big bank of machinery. What is that? Vela said. Benz had been debating how much he should explain. Finally, he decided on all of it that was pertinent. You'd better sit, he said, indicating a stool. I've been sitting in the de Gamma house and in your flitter for days already. I can stand. I prefer standing. He nodded, sitting down on the stool himself and looking up at her. This will sound... Ben stopped, figured it would be better not to say crazy. People were far more susceptible to suggestion than they realized. If it were not so, advertisers wouldn't bother with their slogans and sales pitches. My great uncle belonged to a unique set of scientists, Ben's began. They included an archaeologist and an experimental inventor. My great uncle was the latter. To make a long story short, the archaeologist worked in Antarctica. He followed ancient leads. There had been a hint in a ruin in the Black Sea. You're talking about an underwater ruin? Vela asked, interrupting. Exactly, Benz replied. In the underwater ruin, on a rust-free metal sheet, the archaeologist discovered the outline of the continent of Antarctica. It also showed a location that was far inland. He kept the find to himself. The archaeologist was more paranoid than any chief arbiter you've ever known. The man's old heart beat with excitement. Here was a real treasure map, he believed. And he was not wrong. 
He led a team into the middle of the icy continent, and there he bored one of the deepest shafts ever discovered. He went down with three explorers. According to my great uncle, only the archaeologist returned topside. The old relic hunter never told anyone what went on down there or what they had found. A terrible accident took place that night. The shaft had a cave-in, if that's the correct way to say it. A mother of all storms hit the team three days later. The old archaeologist was the only one to survive. He killed everyone else, Vela asked, then shrugged. I think so. My great uncle wasn't sure. It doesn't really matter. That's totally wrong, Vela declared. It matters a great deal. Whatever you're about to show me is tainted by the archaeologist's murderous behavior. I think it explains how easily you murdered everyone in the da Gamma house. Benz made a snorting sound. Vela Shaw, how delightfully innocent you are. Don't mock me, and don't say that. I'm not innocent. Don't you know why I said what I did about Justinian? Of course I know. It's why I sought you out. I never should have said what I did. Bitterness is an evil root. I've expunged that awful memory. I'd rather not talk or think about that day in the park. Ben studied her. Maybe that's good for you. What about all the other women Justinian will rape? What if you can prevent that? Vela sighed after a moment. Keep telling your story. What happened next? Yes, well, Ben said. The archaeologist had raided a prehistoric colony. My great uncle believed it had been a colony of aliens on Earth. For reasons we don't know, the aliens perished. Not all of their technology perished with them, however. The archaeologist took a small machine. This machine he brought to my great uncle. Now this is where the story gets interesting. I would think the idea of an alien colony on Earth during prehistoric times would be exciting enough, Vela said. By a long and painstaking process, my great uncle took apart the alien machine. He studied, tested, and probed it for over six years. Finally, he built that. Benz indicated the machine and dentist-like chair. What does it do? Vela asked softly. The archaeologist was the first test subject, Ben said, as if he hadn't heard the question. He died as a raving lunatic. My great uncle made adjustments afterward. He made more tests. Finally, he visited me and convinced me to join him. I thought you said a team of people worked with him. They had. The GSB had gotten to all of them. They all died in various ways, most horribly. But the fact they never revealed the machine, this machine, shows that my great uncle's invention worked in one particular. What was that? He had forbidden them to speak about the machine or this hideaway. He had each go under the machine as he gave them the single instruction. I am quite certain his words consigned many of the captured to gruesome ends. Because of GSB torture, Benz nodded. Vela shuddered, hugging herself once more. Please let me leave. I don't want to know more. Ben smiled faintly. She didn't mean that. I went under the chair, as my great uncle used to put it. He lowered the metal dome on my head and made the first adjustment. I had two sessions in the chair. It altered my brain to an excessive degree. The chair made me smarter, much smarter than any human in history. And my great uncle died because the GSB took him. I imagine they interrogated him first, tortured him, but he could no more tell them about this place than any of his predecessors could. That's horrible. Indeed, Ben said. That's when I started on my quest. I decided to change the nature of the Solar League. I put myself in the right place for the right time. I helped a monster rise to power because I thought I could use him. Alas, despite my genius, I have made three missteps. Because I am so weak politically, I could not afford even one misstep. Despite my genius, I am still just one man. I have blind areas, all people do. I have thought to myself, what if I can find a helpmate, someone I can truly trust? Me? Vela asked. But you don't know me. I know enough about you. You hate Justinian. 
I suspect you dislike social dynamism. I've never thought about that. I certainly don't like using force to make people think one way or another. Excellent, Ben said. You believe in personal freedom. Vela thought about that. She gave a small laugh. Yes, I suppose I do. I just never put it into words before. Ben stood. He approached the beautiful and morally upright Vela Shaw. He took one of her hands in his. Vela, he said, while staring her in the eyes, will you help me? How? she whispered. I want you to go under the chair, as it were. I want to increase your intelligence many times. By putting our heads together, I'm hoping we can come up with a plan to eliminate Justinian and his oppressive rule. Change social dynamism and unite the solar system so we can take on the murderous cyber ships with a chance of success. That is an amazingly tall order. It is, it must be. To whom much is given, much is required. She turned away, although she didn't pull her hand away from his. I don't know. He squeezed gently. Her shoulders deflated. She turned back and searched his eyes. Will the process hurt? Some, he admitted. Yes, she whispered. I'm willing. For a moment, he couldn't breathe. They were going to do this. Now is as good a time as any to start, he said. Yes, she agreed. Let's do this before I lose my nerve. Still hand in hand, Ben's led Vela to the machine. Part 3 Trans-Neptunian Region Chapter 1 Since gaining dominance of the frail body of Eli Gomez, the alien thought patterns of Methlan Rath of Janus House had considerably changed it. Methlan had begun a strict regime of forced eating and weightlifting. Eli might have been satisfied with the body's frailty. Methlan certainly wasn't. The weakness of the body's muscles and the shameful lack of endurance disgusted the once powerful prince. Almost every day, Methlan went to the gym. He did legs one day, concentrating on squats. He bench-pressed and did triceps the second day, while he devoted the third day to deadlifts and biceps curls. The fourth day, he rested. The fifth day, he started the process all over again. Soon he added long walks and then wind sprints. He would forge something better than what he'd received. This body would never match his former frame, but it would be capable of considerably more physical effort than before. Time passed as Methlon put on weight and muscle. A few of the gym rats began to notice him. He talked with them, made friends, and they gave him weightlifting advice. Methlon might have sneered at the help, but this was a human body, not that of the high race of Janus House. The gym rats proved helpful. One or two suggested he use steroids. Methlan thought about it, but disliked the side effects. Good eating and strenuous training would give him what he needed. When he wasn't improving his body with exercise, Methlan worked as a tech. He volunteered every chance he could. He strove to make himself invaluable. He had no time for relaxation. He had too many goals to achieve. Besides, by lifting, working, eating, and sleeping, he kept so busy he didn't have to worry about running afoul of the old man's people. As Methlan did these things, work went apace on MK2 and down on Make Make. Marines had swept the spaceport wreckage, killing two AIs, but finding no others. The days merged, becoming a week. The weeks piled one on top of another. Finally, the heavily modified NSN destroyer Daisy Chain 4 was ready to leave Make Make and head for Senda. An accident took out two techs assigned to join Walleye and his team aboard the destroyer. Methlan hardly knew anything about the Make Make citizen or the citizen's woman. Apparently, they had volunteered to command the destroyer and go on the mission. Captain Hawkins had accepted their offer. Methlan knew Walleye was short and possessed stubby arms and legs. How could John Hawkins let a weak mutant run the mission? It made no sense. Yet that had given Methlan an idea. The daring of the new idea amazed him and propelled him to even greater zealousness. Methlan worked and plotted until his eyelids drooped. 
he often awoke with his head slumped over a computer panel. The destroyer lacked two needed techs. Hawkins asked for volunteers. Methlan was one of the first to say he'd do it. That led to an interview with Captain Hawkins. Methlan entered the captain's quarters on the moon. Like him, Hawkins was busy to the point of absurdity. The prince recognized a driven individual. He tried to make sure Hawkins didn't recognize him. Let's see, Hawkins said from behind his desk. The captain pretended to study a tablet. Methlan knew the foul man was studying him instead. At last, Hawkins set down the tablet. Why do you want to go? Hawkins asked. Methlan had sat forward with his hands hanging between his knees. He clutched his hands as he gave a tremulous smile. I want to stop the cybers, sir. I don't want them getting to Mars. Hawkins nodded approvingly. Methlan would have snorted, but that would not do. He'd studied John Hawkins from afar. He'd used every trick to learn whatever he could in order to form a picture of the lying killer. It's going to be a dangerous run, Hawkins said. The destroyer has new, more advanced weapons. It can accelerate at almost the same rate as the Nathan Graham. But it's a small ship. There will only be a few of you. What's more, the AIs may have built a bigger and better ship on Senda. I don't have time to take the cyber ship to Senda. What I'm saying, Mr. Gomez, is that this is a highly dangerous mission. If Walleye can do it, sir, I believe that I can too. The goodwill on Hawkins' face evaporated. Methlan realized he'd made a mistake. Likely Hawkins didn't distrust freaks as he, the prince, did. What I mean, Captain, is that the people of the solar system are uniting. Uh, Make Make has already faced and suffered from the dreaded invader. Yet Walleye still helps the rest of us to defeat the terrible menace. Uh, can I, a man of Mars, do any less? I see, Hawkins said. Methlan didn't understand what he'd done wrong. Thus he now remained silent. Digging a deeper hole was seldom a good idea. It's funny, Hawkins said, but I can't shake the feeling that I've met you before. Methlan almost froze. Somehow he was giving his true nature away. He might hate Hawkins. That didn't mean the man was stupid. He must tread cautiously. I don't think we've met, Captain. I do. I'm seldom wrong about that. I know we've met, Mr. Gomez. Tell me a little more about yourself. Methlan dredged what memories he could from Eli's mind. That proved little enough, but it seemed to satisfy the sinister Hawkins. I've heard reports about your exercise mania. If I'd been in better shape, maybe I could have saved my friends. According to what I've read, you don't remember the accident. I don't remember the incident, Methlan said. That's what bothers me. Call it a guilty conscience. Hawkins nodded noncommittally. The bastard asked a few more questions, made a few comments about fighting to the bitter end, and told Methlan he'd decide on the crew roster in the next few days. Methlan thanked him and was dismissed shortly thereafter. Two days later, Methlan received his answer. It was outside the gym in a corridor. Gloria Sanchez walked up to him. Had she been waiting here? The mentalist informed him that the captain had assigned him to the Daisy Chain Four. She congratulated him, shaking his hand. Methlan realized she was studying him. He could feel the unease in her. That was another reason he wanted to go on the destroyer. He had come to realize that sooner or later they would sense the Prince of Ten Worlds in Eli Gomez. He didn't know how or why. He just realized that event might come far sooner than he wanted. You're going to chase the enemy all the way to the Oort Cloud if you have to, the mentalist said. I do not understand. By this time tomorrow, I assure you, you will. That sounded ominous. Was this a veiled threat? Methlan almost decided to break her neck and implement Plan 3C. Instead, he retreated, deciding he would play out the game for as long as he could. Chapter 2 The destroyer accelerated hard, over 50 Gs toward Senda, 212 AUs away. The new engine purred much more quietly than the old one, but with the gravity controls at full strength, a steady thrum-thrum beat throughout the triangular-shaped vessel. 
The Daisy Chain 4 resembled the old NSN vessel in its basic shape. Otherwise, the changes to the ship were quite startling. It seemed more chrome-like and sleeker, deadlier, more alien-seeming. The robo-builders on MK2 had completely overhauled the vessel. In one way, it was exactly like a Neptunian Navy ship. On top of the triangular-shaped destroyer was a rack. In the rack was a huge drone. The drone was longer than the destroyer. On the bottom of the Daisy Chain 4 were two more similarly huge drones. These were special objects. They had fantastic acceleration ability. They had the most up-to-date sensors, the best electronic countermeasures, ECM, and intensely powerful matter-antimatter warheads. The three Hercules drones were one of the chief reasons Hawkins was allowing Walleye to try to chase down the sender-launched AI vessel. Walleye sat in the captain's chair, even though he only ranked lieutenant in the Solar Freedom Fleet, the SFF. The lieutenant was short, with coarse hair and an odd face. You could never tell where Walleye was staring, exactly. It was an unsettling quality. Instead of a regular uniform, the mutant wore a buff coat. He seemed to live in the oversized garment. Methlan had come to believe that Walleye hid weapons in the coat. The mutant's short arms and legs always upset Methlan. He considered the lieutenant to be a freak. The word mutant seemed too kind, too forgiving to Methlan's way of thinking. The same could not be said for June Zen. She was a long-legged prize, wearing silver, tight-fitting pants and a stylish jacket. She was the destroyer's navigator slash comm officer. Methlon knew she was beautiful because his body responded to her presence. That was another reason he found Walleye annoying. How could the beautiful Jun Zen choose the short mutant over him? Methlon had always been vain regarding his good looks as the Prince of Ten Worlds. He had bedded thousands of beauties in his time as supreme ruler. He'd worked hard with the clay of Eli Gomez. The lean muscles rippling under his tech uniform and the stylish hair he kept waxed should have caught her admiration by now. Methlan had always disliked a female's loyalty to her mate. In the past, if Methlan had wanted to rut with a female, he most certainly did so. Having to restrain himself was proving difficult, and this was only the third day of the journey. Tech, Walleye said curtly. Methlan tore his gaze from June Zen. As he did, Methlan realized this was the third time Walleye had called for him. Yes, Lieutenant, Methlan said. I want you to bring up the alien vessel on our screen. Do you think you can do that? Methlan resented the tone of command in Walleye's voice. The little mutant seemed as if he resented Methlan's study of June. Was the mutant one of those jealous kinds? Methlan had often wondered how he died the first time in his ten worlds. One of his theories was that an upset mate had tracked him down for rutting with his woman. It seemed obvious that a woman should always rut with the best man. In Methlan's mind, that had always been himself. Tech, Walleye said. At once, Lieutenant, Methlan said. He began to manipulate his panel. The destroyer's control cabin was much smaller than the Nathan Graham's bridge. It had a command chair and four consoles. Two of the consoles were empty. The augmented automation in the ship mandated less oversight. At the same time, the robo-builders had constructed less powerful computers than otherwise. Hawkins had decided that none of the SFF ships would have computers susceptible to self-aware cyber software. Methlan used passive sensors, gathering light-bearing data concerning the sender-launched vessel. It's coming up on the main screen, Methlan said. The main screen was the only screen on the bridge, except for the small individual console screens. A round vessel appeared on the main screen. Walleye sat forward, so his butt was no longer on the seat, but pressed against the edge. That way his short legs could reach the deck. The mutant appeared to study the alien vessel. What do you make of it? Walleye asked. Methlon had been observing the round vessel. He noticed the torpedo ports and the radar-like dishes that indicated grav cannons. There appeared to be two of them. The color of the exhaust indicates a matter-antimatter engine, Methlan said. The ports. He went on to explain his other observations, finishing with, 
It is a fighting vessel, but the round shape and its mass and the lack of greater tubes or cannons indicates to me that it likely has a hyperdrive. If that is so, the alien vessel can leave the solar system. Using hyperspace, it can likely reach another star system in a short period of time. We must destroy the vessel before it can summon cybership reinforcements. While I had turned to face Methlan, the mutant was no longer leaning against the command chair. He was standing, and he did not appear amused. I wasn't asking you, Wall, I said. I was asking June, the navigator. Methlan might have apologized, but the insult was too much, and he was certain too studied. Why had Wall I let him talk so long if it was a mistake? Methlan realized the answer. The little mutant meant to demean him in the female's eyes. Methlan understood the tactic, as he had often done it himself in the past. We have a problem, Tech. We might have a big problem, you and I. I haven't decided yet. Methlan swallowed his excessive pride and managed to bow his head. I think you're an arrogant prick, Wall I said. I don't know why Captain Hawkins pushed you onto me. Maybe you hid your true self from him. I see it, though. What was the little freak saying? Did this wall I mean to say that he understood Methlan had gained control of the pathetic human? If that was so, he had to kill the freak. That would mean killing June Zen, too. Methlan was reluctant to do that. He wanted to sleep with her for a time. He could dispose of her after that. Navigator, Wall I said. Could you please step outside? June rose, looking worried. She must realize I can squash her freakish lover. Please don't hurt him too bad, Wall I, she said, touching one of the freak's stumpy arms. What? Methlan said. You can't be serious. June faced him. I don't like you staring at me all the time. You can't keep doing that. Wall I will kill you if you keep it up. Me? He thinks he can kill me. Let me take care of this, Luscious, Wall I told her. June nodded. Then her long legs ate up the distance. The exit swished open, and she departed the bridge. Chapter 3 Methlan swiveled around and stood, staring at the little freak. The mutant did nothing else. He just stood there, waiting. Well? Methlan asked. Your trouble is you lack patience. Methlan thought about the last few weeks, the last few months. He'd shown tremendous patience. Was this going to be the freak's method, spouting untruths? Under the long sleeves of his uniform, Methlan flexed his forearms. They were as hard as steel these days. That had come about through patience as he waited for the results of his strenuous labor. Your other problem is arrogance. You reek of it. Your arrogance is going to get you killed. By you, Methlan sneered. I can't understand why Hawkins gave you command of the ship. Easy. Captain Hawkins recognizes competence. That angered Methlan. He opened his mouth, and he noticed Walleye casually put a hand inside the buff coat. Something about the motion recalled an old memory. It had happened in the citadel of Janus House. A cutthroat of House Ares had infiltrated the citadel. The long-limbed fellow had casually reached into his jacket, withdrawing a named dagger. Methlan had been a child at the time. The cutthroat advanced on Methlan's grandfather from behind. Young Methlan had shouted a warning, but it was already too late. The cutthroat moved fast at the end, reaching his grandfather, using the dagger to slice the old man's throat. That had brought the guards to alert. Before they could stun and incapacitate the cutthroat, the killer had uttered a victorious cry and plunged the coup dagger into his own heart. Whatever revenge the cutthroat had yearned to achieve, he had fulfilled. By doing so, he brought greater nobility to House Ares. The memory stirred something deep in Methlan. That brought about a swift reevaluation regarding Walleye and this time and place. I have been a fool, Methlan realized. In some manner he hadn't foreseen, the emotions of Eli Gomez had retained power over his thoughts. It had been subtle, slowly twisting Methlan's thought patterns into the body's old routines of feeling. 
Methlan had felt the emotions and used his own memories to give a reason to this feeling. It was time for iron self-control. Jun Zen had wonderful legs and a perfect butt that should not sway him from the chosen path. Methlan's head snapped up. He viewed Walleye more dispassionately than seconds ago. He recognized the coiled tension in the mutant. This man was a killer. He could be a merciless killer, giving few cues as to what he was about to do. That in itself made Walleye dangerous. I have erred, Methlan said. Despite the distaste of the action, Methlan went to one knee, bowing his head. I crave your pardon, Lieutenant. Walleye said nothing. Methlan looked up. He couldn't fully read the mutant. It was those eyes and the way Walleye could keep his features blank. It was hard to know what the little man thought. That was a considerable power. What just happened? Walleye finally asked. I beg your pardon? You just stood there with a glazed look. I, I must have done that as I recognized my error. As you say, I have a problem with arrogance. Sometimes, though, I understand that I have become presumptuous. You're speaking differently, too. Methlan realized he had made several errors regarding Walleye. Would he have to kill the mutant this early in the mission? That would make everything more difficult. He did not fear Walleye. He just realized he needed a peaceful crew if he was going to achieve his goal. From now on, Methlan swore to focus single-mindedly on his goal. That goal was no longer slaying John Hawkins, although he would if given the opportunity. No. The goal was to gain power in order to free the Ten Worlds from the hated cyber ships. It was possible that none of his people or house survived, yet perhaps some had. Those of the Ten Worlds were hardy individuals. I have decided on formality with you, Lieutenant. I will not stare or lust after your woman. I will accept your orders. I have erred, and I am willing to change. Walleye's features did not change. Finally, though, the mutant nodded. He slid back into the command chair. Methlan realized that was it. The confrontation was over. Walleye pressed a switch in the chair. You can come back in, he said. The entrance swished open, and Jun Zen stared within. Methlan gave her a polite nod, pretending to ignore her exceedingly pleasing features as he turned back to his board. He'd lied in one particular. He would fantasize about her, but that was all he'd do for now. He promised himself many good times with Jun Zen, but only after he killed Walleye. He would not kill Walleye until the journey neared its completion. Chapter 4 The days passed as the destroyer accelerated swiftly like the Nathan Graham had once done during its voyage from the Saturn system to Makemake. Unfortunately, the AI vessel they chased accelerated almost as fast as the destroyer did. The AI vessel seemed to be headed for the inner Oort cloud. The Oort cloud was 50,000 to 200,000 AUs from the sun. That made it much farther than the Kuiper Belt or the scattered disk, which was in the region between them. The cloud was a great spheroid in the outer reaches of the solar system. Icy planetismals were the primary objects scattered throughout the cloud. A few hardy souls had traveled into the distant region, but very few. There was supposed to be a fabled outpost or two in the inner cloud, but neither Walleye nor June nor anyone at the base at MK2 knew those places' reputed whereabouts. The people in the Kuiper Belt had been the latest frontiersmen. In Earth terms, the few souls in the Oort Cloud would compare to the fur trappers in American colonial days. We're staying well clear of Sander, Walleye announced one day. I've been watching the dwarf planet for some time, Methlan said from his station. Have you spotted anything suspicious on or around it? Nothing so far, Methlan said. Still, I suspect the remaining sender robots are using teleoptics to watch us. It's possible they're attempting to maneuver stealth mines into our path. It's what I would do, Walleye said. We'll have to make adjustments. I'm going to give sender an even wider berth than I'd first intended. It took engine power to veer away from sender. 
The maneuver allowed the fleeing AI vessel more of an edge as it gained a bit more separation from them. However, the maneuver would probably save the destroyer from any stealth mines originating from a sender robot factory. If a mine takes us out, Walleye said, that scratches the mission. Better to lose a little time than lose the ship. Two weeks later, they passed Senda, giving the dwarf planet a 20 million kilometer wide berth. No mines exploded before or beside them. No rays beamed up from the dwarf planet's surface. No missiles suddenly began accelerating at them. Maybe Senda was empty. Methland still couldn't spot anything, not a trace of energy or radiation leakage on the dwarf planet. Maybe all the robots had left on the fleeing vessel. In time, the weeks stretched into a month. In order to keep their minds active, they played games, watched vids, read and studied space through the destroyer's scopes. They pointed the teleoptics in system at times. According to what they saw, no Solar League fleets maneuvered between the major planets. The few messages from Hawkins reported that work continued apace inside MK2 on the Nathan Graham. The destroyer no longer accelerated. It had stopped some time ago. Now they were traveling on their massive velocity alone. The AI vessel ahead of them also used its velocity. The destroyer moved faster, but not greatly so. The distance between them had narrowed from 231 AUs in the beginning to 153 AUs and closing. That many AUs was a little less than four times the distance from Pluto to the sun. Several days later, Walleye held a meeting on the command deck. Just himself, June, and Methlan. During the passing weeks, Methlan had learned to get along better. He had a feeling Walleye didn't fully trust him yet. He'd come to believe that the mutant didn't trust anyone. Maybe not even June Zen. I knew the journey would take us into the great depths, Walleye said. But our risks rise the farther we go. I don't dare use more propellant to accelerate us, as that means we won't have enough to decelerate and later accelerate back in system. This is as fast as we dare go out system. I agree, June said. But does that mean we stop? We were willing to sacrifice ourselves before to save humanity. Shouldn't we still do that? There's a problem I hadn't considered before, Walleye said. Once we move in too close, whatever the AIs think that might be, what's to stop them from accelerating again? They don't have to slow down like we do, and they don't have to save fuel for a return journey. They just have to send a message, I would think, to another cyber ship in a different star system. We should launch the drones now, Methlan said. Maybe they're almost to the hyperdrive region. Maybe they can suddenly enter hyperdrive. That's an excellent point, Walleye said. The question is, how many drones do we launch? May I ask a question, Methlan said. Certainly. Why wouldn't we launch all three? On the face of it, Walleye said, that's the right decision. But as I dwell on the problem, I realize I don't like leaving myself defenseless. We have other armaments, Methlan said. The three Hercules drones are our only true offensive weapons. Remember the old adage, the best defense is a good offense. I suppose, Methlan said. Yet I ask again, why hold anything back? Once we destroy the AI vessel, we have completed our mission. Have we? Walleye asked. I'm suspicious. Aren't the AIs logical? Maybe the first AI ship is a decoy. That's the other reason to destroy it sooner rather than later. I have seen no second AI vessel, Methlan pointed out. Of course not. The second vessel would be a stealth ship. Methlan thought about that. He finally shook his head. I do not agree with your analysis, Lieutenant. June? asked Walleye. I trust your instincts, she told Walleye. My mind says that Methlan is right, but I choose to trust you over either of us. You're putting the burden on me, aren't you, Luscious? I don't mean to, she said. The mutant studied the main screen. We'll launch two drones. I'm keeping one in reserve. But, Methlan said. Walleye turned to face him. Methlan calculated fast. Should he kill Walleye? It seemed far too soon for that. Besides, he shrugged in the end. Two drones could be enough. It is a gamble, though. What isn't? Walleye asked. Methlan said no more. All right, then, Walleye said. 
Let's prepare two drones for launch. The racks opened on top, making a metallic racket. Soon the big drone drifted away. It had the same relative velocity as the ship. Side jets rotated the drone in the correct direction. Methlan finished the computer check and informed Walleye. The lieutenant activated the drone from his command chair. Outside the destroyer, the drone's massive thrusters heated up. Soon, the matter-antimatter engine roared. The exhaust tail lengthened as more power erupted from it. The drone accelerated rapidly. By the time it was accelerating at 80 gravities, they released the second drone. Despite the massive thrust and brightness, the two drones quickly dwindled to mere specks on the teleoptic scanner. They watched the AI ship far away, a tiny moving dot in space. The vessel did not begin accelerating again, although it also did not decelerate. The AI ship did launch several missiles. Those missiles decelerated hard. They had the same relative velocity as the AI vessel. By decelerating, they lengthened the distance between them and the AI vessel. That meant those missiles would reach the chasing drones much sooner. They would also be traveling much slower than the drones. We're going to be searching for a stealth vessel all the time now, Walleye declared. The AIs might think we've shot our wad. That might make them careless. And if the two drones fail to destroy the AI ship, Methlan asked. We still have the one left. By that time, it could be too late for the drone to reach them before they enter hyperspace. You have gambled with humanity's future, Lieutenant. Walleye stared at Methlan. He kept staring until finally Methlan realized he had to turn away or kill the mutant now. Methlan turned, but he considered the manning down as one insult too many, adding to the grudge that had been forming. In the language of Janus House, the grudge was shock decree. That meant Methlan must nurture the grudge with growing hatred until he erupted one day into a killing frenzy. Chapter 5 As Methlan nurtured the shock decree, he monitored the drone's advance toward contact with the AI vessel. The two drones, separated by two AUs from each other, slowly closed the distance between themselves and the AI anti-drone shield and the AI vessel farther beyond. The days passed in anxious waiting. Were two drones enough? Would Walleye's gamble prove correct? During those days, the drones continued to accelerate. They would never have to decelerate and could therefore use every ounce of fuel and propellant to reach the target. By the time the drones closed in on the AI anti-drones, 132 AUs separated the destroyer and AI vessel. Have you made your computations? Walleye asked. Yes, sir, Methlan said curtly. Are you feeling ill? The mutant asked. A little, sir, Methlan said. He realized he'd spoken too fiercely, but he couldn't help himself. The shock decree had almost run its course. Soon now, Methlan would wash away the insults with Walleye's blood. Proceed, Walleye said. Although June was the comm officer, Methlan ran the drones. He thus sent a lightspeed message to them. It would take hours for the message to reach the Hercules devices. By that time, the lead drone would almost be in position. After sending the message, Methlan left, slept a good night's sleep, ate a large breakfast, exercised, ran, and took a long nap. When he finally returned to the bridge, Walleye and June had also returned. They watched the lead drone move into contact range with the AI-launched anti-drones. The first matter-antimatter warhead ignited. It created a terrific blast zone and widening EMP. Both the blast and the EMP washed against the anti-drones. The strange thing about observing such a distant battle was the time. The images the teleoptics saw were already hours old. It would be twice that time if they used active sensors like radar. The radar impulse would have to travel at light speed to the target, bounce off it, and travel all the way back to the destroyer's sensor. At these ranges, teleoptics and possibly thermal sightings were the only reasonable sensors to use for combat data. Well, Walleye asked. Methlan shrugged moodily. He didn't know the results of the blast yet. They would find out soon enough if the first drone had taken out enough enemy anti-drones, because if it hadn't, 
the second drone would fail to reach the AI vessel. Time passed slowly as they waited. Walleye and June stayed glued to the main screen. Methlan studied his board. I believe the second drone has made it through the anti-drone belt, Methlan declared. You're sure? I would not have said so otherwise. June sucked in her breath. By her reaction, Methlan realized he'd spoken too abruptly. His back was to the others. He felt the sharpened weapon taped against his chest. Today he would rid himself of the manning down insult. Today he would restore his honor. Methlan wondered if he'd become stir crazy. He'd been cooped up with these people for too long in the destroyer. He remembered his long term goal, but he also had the shock decree grudge. One did not simply abandon such a thing. Only blood could restore his honor. Will my honor interfere with my long term goal? Maybe I should cut myself. Maybe my own spilt blood could wash away my anger. Methlan shivered. That was a bad idea. He was of Janus' house, a proud house of exceedingly noble lineage. He must maintain his honor through the accepted forms. Tech, Walleye said. Slowly, Methlan turned around. Walleye used a stumpy arm to point at the main screen. The drone is closing in on the AI vessel. Methlan looked up at the main screen, holding his breath. A terrific detonation took place more than 130 AUs away as the matter-antimatter warhead ignited. Would the blast destroy the AI vessel? The white blot created by the blast blinded the teleoptics. That only lasted a short time, though. Methlan turned back to his board. He studied, adjusted. He saw debris, masses of debris. He rechecked. He considered asking for permission to use active sensors. Then he decided that he could use the teleoptics to reasonably know the truth. After several more minutes, Methlan straightened and turned around. I would like to report, Lieutenant, that the drone eliminated the AI vessel. I don't doubt that some robots may have survived the wreckage. My preliminary analysis suggests complete destruction of the ship. But with these... Things one can never be fully certain. I request permission to use active sensors for more detailed study. Granted, Walleye said. The mutant grinned at June. We did it, Lashes. We took out the first vessel. Now we have to find the real one. Methlan cocked his head. Why do you say this? Instinct, Walleye said. I don't believe it's over. Methlan wondered if the little freak could be right. He wasn't going to worry about that yet. He turned back to his instruments. The destruction of the AI vessel had stolen some of the fire of his shock decree. He would have to wait for it to rebuild. Besides, before he struck and took command of the destroyer, he wanted to be certain the AIs were out of play here in the space between the Kuiper Belt and the distant Oort Cloud. Chapter 6 Interlude, Earth. Frank Benz breathed heavily in the starlight. He clung to a sleek tower built high in the Andes Mountains of South America. This night lacked a moon, ensuring it was even darker than usual. He'd trained for over two months now and was likely in the best shape a man could coerce a mid-forties body. That might not prove good enough, however. He wore a stealth suit, another of his special inventions. It wasn't perfect. It would fail to deceive a human eye looking at it in bright light. However, the suit should get him past the tower's outer security sensors. It had so far, in any case. Along with the stealth suit, Benz carried an air tank on his back because of the high altitude. He breathed almost pure oxygen through his mask. He also used special suction discs, clinging to the smooth tower like a human fly. It had taken strenuous effort to climb the last part of this Andes mountain. He'd parked a stealth flitter farther down, trekking up the rest of the way on foot. It had taken even more effort tonight to reach the tower and make the heady ascent. He had a non-ferrous needler with special ammo. The slivers would dissolve after ten minutes in a human body. Benz looked up, using his night vision goggles. He might have too far to go to reach the selected window. His muscles felt flaccid. 
He let his body relax as much as it could while clinging to a vertical wall. He breathed deeply, trying to replenish his rapidly fading strength. Vela Shaw had helped him conceive of the assassination mission. It had taken her time to get accustomed to her greater intelligence. At first, she'd had nightmares. Then she'd concocted wild theories at incredible speed. Each person reacted differently to heightened intelligence. As a precaution, although he dearly liked and was maybe even falling in love with Vela, he'd given her less superior intelligence than his great uncle had given him. Why should she be smarter than he was? Had that been due to vanity? Did it mean he had hidden ambitions? Had he become too distrustful of human nature after analyzing it these past three years? The answers were likely yes, yes, and yes. Ben's sighed. Maybe he should have amped her IQ to even greater heights. Clinging to the tower seemed foolish the longer he tried to regain his strength. Their plan, it was perilous to say the least. Maybe it was even crazy. No, don't think that. You're also susceptible to suggestion. You have the plan, now get going. You don't have much time left. Benz gathered his resolve and twisted a hand, removing a suction disc from the wall. He reached up, pushed the disc down so that it stuck again, and began the laborious process of detaching the other sucker discs. Finally, he heaved upward, anchoring himself once again. By slow degrees, he scaled the tower, the special retreat of Premier J.P. Justinian. The past months had been interesting. With the destruction of the De Gamma House, spontaneous riots had erupted all over the planet. Benz had given that a 42% probability going in. Spontaneous riots were a dictator's worst nightmare. Secret police could usually root out planned disruptions of any kind. Informers abounded throughout Earth. It was the sudden riots that caught the police by surprise. In many cities throughout Earth, glass shattered, looters rampaged, carrying away expensive items from stores, buildings burned, rioters clashed with riot police. Twice, the rioters had overwhelmed the police and trampled many of them to death. The army had been activated after that. But even a few of the army units had had the temerity to revolt and join the rioters. Benz and Vela had observed the situation with interest. Is that what you planned for? Vela asked. They'd been in a safe house in Lima, Peru sector. By destroying the De Gamma house? He asked. Of course you know I don't mean that by elevating Justinian to the premiership. Oh, yes. I thought it would take longer for him to push the people to this point. The purges propelled the people into precipitous action. Justinian accelerated his own demise. He had less power than he realized. He either should have implemented far bloodier purges, or not done them at all. His present purges killed too few to bring about a true shock that would have stymied action. Instead. He frightened too many people while still allowing them options. Vela had sighed at the too long and too obvious explanation. She no longer needed those. Ben smiled tiredly as he hoisted himself a little higher up the tower. It had been so different having someone to really talk to. The past three years had been so lonely. Seeing so much farther than anyone else and not being able to share his insights with anyone. Ben snorted. Had he taken Vela to the machine because he'd become sick of being alone? It was quite probable. He shelved further reminiscing so he could devote his will to greater muscular effort. He might be a mental superman, but he was far from being extraordinary physically. Another 18 minutes brought him to the 21st story. Below him, the snow-covered peaks of the Andes gleamed in the starlight. If he fell, he would plunge more than just the 21 stories. He would also plunge down a vertical cliff, one more than half a kilometer in depth. He would never survive such a fall. Fortunately, he had no fear of heights. Panting heavily, feeling the sweat slide under the stealth suit, he brought up his tool pack. He took out a suction cup and attached it to the window. He removed a thin knife. Then he attached a small box on the ledge. He turned on the box, which beeped slowly. With the special knife, he began to cut the glass around the suction cup. The knife cut with unusual ease. The box tricked the sensors as the knife completed the circle. 
He put away the knife and grabbed the handle attached to the suction cup. With a slight sound of glass sliding, he removed the cut circle from the rest of the window. This he attached to the tower through the back of the suction cup. He crawled through the new entrance. It was slow and tedious work. Any of a number of things could happen to upset the plan. Even with supreme genius, it was next to impossible to foresee every eventuality. Finally, Benz's booted feet touched the study's carpet. He stood in the room, panting and trembling from the exertion. Benz wanted to laugh wildly. He'd made it. The hardest part of the assassination mission was past. He'd never wanted to scale a wall like that again. Benz shed his mask, tank, tools, and stealth suit. He put them in a pile behind the desk. Afterward, he took out a final tool, reached out the hole with a special pole, detached the round pane of glass, and maneuvered it back into place. He used a small tube, smearing its clear paste around the circular cut. In seconds, the two parts bonded. It wouldn't pass a close inspection, but it resealed the tower from the outside. Benz pulled the curtain across the window. He'd removed the suction cup before sealing the circular piece back onto the window. It lay on top of the pile of clothes, tools, and the tank. The Inspector General of Earth sat down in the desk's chair. He let his head droop. His arms shook from too much effort. Three minutes later, he hoisted himself to his feet. He took a uniform from his pack, donned it, and headed for the door. It was time to kill Justinian. Benz moved serenely down the halls. He stopped at a guard's command, showing her his special pass. She slid it through a small unit. It checked. That made her frown. She was incredibly busty and beautiful. Finally, she handed him his ID and indicated that he could continue. Up here in the secret residence, Justinian only allowed female guards to protect him. They were uniformly busty and long-legged. He bedded them from time to time. Justinian believed the sexual bonding heightened their loyalty. Benz took the final turn and advanced upon Justinian's bedroom door. One guard stood before it. His ID would not work with her. As he approached, Benz took what appeared to be a stick of gum from a breast pocket. He unwrapped the substance as he neared. The guard watched him with her hand on the butt of her holstered weapon. Still three feet away from the guard, Benz popped the substance into his mouth. He took a deep breath, held it, and chewed the substance vigorously. The premier is asleep, the guard whispered. She had failed to re-knot her tie perfectly. She had likely left his bed less than an hour ago. Benz moved close to the guard, leaned in toward her. That no doubt surprised her as she tensed. Benz exhaled, allowing his breath to reach her. She breathed in, and her eyelids fluttered. Benz twisted his head to the side and spat out the knockout substance. He spit two more times and faced the guard just in time to catch her falling forward. He hadn't killed her, but she would remain asleep for a good long time. Holding her up with one arm, he used his other hand to pull out a tiny box. He pressed a switch. The box beeped twice, and the lock in the door clicked. Benz pushed the door open, dragging the guard with him. He lay her on the floor, shut the door, and took out a pair of goggles. He slid the goggles over his eyes, activating the sensors so he could see in the dark. He passed furniture, a huge hollow unit, and opened another door. Justinian snored softly in the big bed. The premier always fell asleep by this time. He did not have a woman sleeping with him. He never did. Benz believed Justinian did that out of prudence. Justinian wouldn't trust the woman. She might choke him to death while he slept. Thus, Justinian always slept alone. Ben stood beside the bed. He drew the needler. His hand shook, and that surprised him. He didn't want to murder the man, yet he had to. Everything pointed to it. He'd come this far. Ben's put the nozzle of the needler against the sleeper's throat and pulled the trigger. The man jerked as needles stitched into his soft flesh. Benz kept his finger down, hosing the needles so blood began to spurt. The man opened his eyes, staring at Benz in pained shock. Goodbye, Benz said. The man opened his bloody mouth. He tried to speak, to tell Benz something. It never happened. 
Benz exhaled with revulsion. This was a dirty deed. He hated it, but he'd had to do what he'd had to do. He would not look at the corpse. He realized it was time to go. Benz didn't go just yet, though. He kept standing there. Suddenly, it occurred to Benz that he felt terribly lethargic. He realized more than ever that he should go. Instead, he waited with his muscles wilting. At that point, lights blazed on in the chamber. Benz tried to raise the needler. He found that his arm refused to lift. He crashed down onto his knees. What was wrong with him? A door opened and a tall man strode in. The man wore a helmet with a clear visor and a body vest. Female guards followed the tall man into the bedroom. Benz found it hard to do, but he looked up. He didn't know that his mouth hung open. Inspector General, Justinian said through a helmet speaker. Benz frowned thunderously. Had someone pumped invisible knockout gas into the bedroom? Is that why the guards were wearing rebreathers? You shot my body double, Benz, the premier said. You fell for my trap. Justinian tisked several times. Do you know what happens now? Benz kept staring. He could no longer speak. After I revive you, Inspector General, I'm going to interrogate you. I'm going to get to the bottom of your traitorous conspiracy and stamp it out of existence. Chapter 7 The next two days were among the worst in Frank Benz's existence. He found himself in an awful place. Pain gushed through his body. Indecent tortures stole his dignity. He tried to hold back. He thought his great intellect would give him immunity against whatever Justinian could throw at him. But that proved quite wrong, hurtfully wrong. Sooner than anyone would have expected, he began to talk. At that point, the interrogation began in earnest. Special interrogators began to fire one question after another at him. They switched up the manner of the questions and turned them around, asking them in other ways. Benz understood what they were doing. The interrogators were searching for lies. They found several. The pain began again. Naked before witnesses, Benz howled in agony. He howled and promised to stick to the truth this time. The two days ended with Benz telling Justinian or his interrogators everything. He repeated the Antarctica story. He left out nothing. He didn't want to face more pain. Benz told Justinian about Vela Shaw. He hoped she managed to go to ground before GSB agents tracked her down. Finally, after a hot shower, clean clothes, and some food, with several bandages where his fingernails used to be, Benz limped into an audience room. Two big guards flanked him, huge men with small heads and brutal smiles. They brought him to Justinian. The premier sat behind a desk, signing paper after paper from a large stack. As soon as the pen flourish ended, Justinian flipped each newly signed paper onto a growing pile. The two guards and Benz waited silently. Finally, Justinian looked up. A crafty smile twisted his features. Hold his arms, he said. Thick fingers dug into Benz's flesh. The brutes held him immobile. Do you know what I'm doing, Benz? No, the former inspector general said softly. The smile widened. I've long suspected these people, he patted both piles of papers. Those he'd signed and those he was going to sign. Do you know what these are? Benz shook his head. Death warrants, the premier said. I'm signing them myself. And do you know why? Again, Ben shook his head. Because of their personal treachery, Justinian said. They had my trust. They used my trust to help you engineer my assassination. I'm amazed at how you managed to turn them without my noticing. Now I see it was through the fantastic mind machine that gave you inhuman cunning. I now believe your claim that you used the machine on them. You sealed their tongues, just as your great uncle sealed the tongues of his colleagues. When confronted with their treachery, your co-conspirators all claimed innocence. All refused to tell me the truth. This machine of yours is most effective. Most effective. Do you know what happens next, Benz? 
The former inspector general looked down at the carpet. Look at me, Justinian snapped. Benz did. I am going to test your fabled machine. If it works, I will use it on myself. I will elevate my intelligence to great heights. Afterward, I will devise the perfect plans. For all your vaunted intelligence, you failed. You failed because you didn't understand the human heart. You didn't understand how torture could break the strongest man. You needed help to get to me. All those who aided you have paid with or will pay with their lives. I'm going to crush this rebellion forever. The Premier leaned forward. I'm going to keep you alive a little longer, Benz. I may need assistance with this marvelous alien machine your uncle built. But once I've attained greater brilliance, then I'm going to devise unique tortures that slowly and most painfully put you to death. The rest of the day passed in air travel. To Benz, it seemed to take forever. An armada of armored air vans flew to the Rocky Mountains in Colorado sector. They landed beside the mine entrance. Big guards dragged Benz from his van. The sunlight hurt his eyes, causing him to squint. A new team of GSB officers conferred with the premier. The former officers holding the same positions had already died. These men and women listened to the premier attentively. Afterward, they studied Benz with calculation. Soon, the party started into the mine. No one asked Benz for directions. He'd given those during the interrogations. In time, they reached the rocky outcropping beside the timber shoring up the ancient tunnel. A lanky man, the new chief arbiter, did the honors. The way opened. The heavily armored assembly moved in as a unit. Benz dragged his left foot. It had been badly strained during the tortures. Justinian moved with a new lightness of step. It occurred to Benz that Justinian hadn't known what to do with the spontaneous riots. Benz could have told the premier. Justinian ruled with too much iron and not enough velvet hiding the metal fist. The premier put too much trust in his secret police and not enough in the propaganda organs that molded people's thinking toward the right channels. In any case, after a twisted journey through several hatches, the party reached the fabled door. The combination worked. Everyone entered, and light soon glowed in the chamber. There? Justinian asked Benz. The former inspector general nodded. The premier pointed at the dentist-like chair with the metal dome suspended above it. The premier snapped his fingers. Technicians went to the controls. They turned on the machine, following in exacting detail the procedures Benz had given them. Before we begin, Justinian said, is there anything else you want to tell me? Benz seemed dumbfounded. I'm not going first, the premier said. I realize you could have set the machine to hurt me. I have a volunteer going first. Only once I see that the machine grants superior intelligence will I go. I spoke truly. Ben said in a hoarse voice, Please, no more torture. Justinian smiled cruelly. Pa Thomas, he called. A compact man with a bullet-shaped head wearing a black uniform stepped up. He was the police prefect for all of South America. To the machine with you, Justinian said. Pa Thomas eyed the machine dubiously. He licked his lips nervously. Must I remind you, Prefect? Justinian asked. Pa Tomas squared his bull-like shoulders and marched to the machine. He sat in the special chair and stared upward as two techs pulled the metal dome over his head. One of them whispered to Tomas. He grunted from under the dome. The great machines beside the chair began to issue strange humming sounds. The metal dome soon glowed as if with heat. Pa Tomas clutched the armrests. His arms shook, but he refused to release his grip. He groaned. He twisted in the chair. He began to shout in pain, shaking uncontrollably. Well, 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 Justinian said. He glanced sidelong at Benz. It seems you did lie. Hmm. No, Ben said. Please, you must believe me. This is how it's supposed to be. Justinian snorted. But when a tech asked if he should stop, Justinian shook his head. Finally, the process ended. Tex rushed to the chair. They lifted the helmet. 
Pa Tomas sat stiffly in the chair, with his eyes screwed shut. Slowly, he began to relax. Then he yawned before finally opening his eyes. Do you understand me? Justinian asked. Everyone watched avidly. I do, Pa Tomas said in a heavy voice. Stand, sir, Justinian said. Tomas stood easily. At that point, he turned sharply toward Justinian. What is it? The premier asked. Tomas opened his mouth. He closed it even faster. Do you feel more intelligent? Justinian asked in a silky voice. No, Tomas said, maybe a trifle too quickly. Justinian laughed as if with delight. What did you almost say? Pa Tomas's shoulders deflated. He shook his head. I realize you're going to kill me. It is self-evident. Amazing, Justinian said. You are one of the worst dullards I know. Yet now you see, you understand, and you speak with greater learnedness. The premier laughed and made a peculiar motion. Two guards stepped up, firing their guns at Pa Tomas. The newly created genius crumbled into a bloody heap. There can be only one, Justinian said. Remove him. Guards hurried to obey. After the body was dragged away, Justinian approached the dentist-like chair. He turned suddenly, glancing at Benz. There is a risk in doing this, Benz warned. Tss, tss, Justinian said. Nice try, but it's not going to work on me. The premier climbed into the chair, settling himself. He told the text to get on with it. The same two advanced, pulled down the metal dome, and wished the premier luck. Justinian said nothing. The text turned on the great machines, and the process started as before. Soon the dome glowed once more. Justinian grunted painfully. His hands clasped the armrests, and his lean body began to shake. The glowing seemed stronger this time. The machine hummed longer and louder. Justinian made croaking noises as if trying to belch. His body shook violently. Is he well? The chief tech demanded of Benz. No, Ben said. He is dying. The chief tech stared at Benz, wide-eyed. Are you mad? Tell me the truth. The reign of J.P. Justinian has just ended, Ben said. You people are going to have to decide who rules next. Two of the new officers, the chief arbiter among them, hurried to Ben's. If you're lying, the chief arbiter warned. I planned for this moment, Ben said. Impossible. Why is that? asked Ben's. The chief arbiter made a vague gesture. He glanced at Justinian under the glowing dome. The premier sat rigidly, as if doing a planking trick. None of this resembled Par Tomas's experience. Justinian went second, the chief arbiter said. You couldn't have known he would go second. Why couldn't I? Benz asked in a tired voice. But the tortures you underwent. Yes, Benz said flatly. That was the hardest choice to make. You must know we're going to kill you the chief arbiter said. The former chief arbiter certainly would have, Benz agreed. That's why I supposedly broke under torture and informed on him and his allies. I wanted them and others out of the way so you and those around you could take over the GSB. What do you mean? The former chief arbiter and his allies were innocent of the charges I placed on them. He was a brutal tyrant just the same. All the people I denounced under torture were hardcore Justinian supporters. You newer people are not. You people are known pragmatists. That's a lie, the chief arbiter said, loudly, perhaps for the guard's benefit. You know it's the truth. A great groan and a shout tore from Justinian's throat. At that moment, the machine exploded upward, and fire enveloped J.P. Justinian, enveloping the chamber in a nauseating stench. The party retreated, the chief arbiter pulling Benz with him. The guards watched in dismay. The premier is dead, the chief arbiter said as he stared at Benz. The intelligence machine is destroyed. The state is in turmoil. There is rebellion in the planetary systems, and alien AIs will threaten the human race sooner or later. That's another reason I wanted you to be chief arbiter, Ben said. I know you realize what the cyber ships represent to humanity. I cannot believe what you're claiming. Social dynamism needs a strong, sure hand, Ben said. It needs someone to fix impossible problems. You? the chief arbiter asked. You saw what I did with the little I had, Ben said. 
You also saw I'm willing to suffer for the sake of humanity, for the sake of doing what needs to be done. The Premier's guards will never allow it. Kill them before they come out of their shock. The Chief Arbiter stared at Ben's. What happens if I don't agree? Ben smiled grimly. What do you think happens? We're in your mountain, and we've never found Vela Shaw. Is she here somewhere? Ben smiled enigmatically. I see, the Chief Arbiter said. Who would run the GSB? You. And you have a plan to restore Earth and restore social dynamism throughout the solar system. More importantly, Ben said, I have a plan for defeating the alien AIs we know are out there. The smell from the burnt Justinian became too strong. The party left the chamber, shutting the hatch behind them. Yes, the chief arbiter whispered. What are your orders, sir? You'd better disarm or kill Justinian's old guards first. The chief arbiter quietly went to several others. As one, they drew on the guards, ordering them to disarm. Most did. The few who didn't died on the spot. The chief arbiter returned to Ben's. What now? the man asked. Ben's began to tell him. Chapter 8 The Scattered Disc Region The Daisy Chain 4 decelerated with a hard burn. It had been doing so for more than four days, ever since the drone had wiped out the AI vessel. Methlan's active sensor scans had shown the same results as the teleoptics. The AI vessel had become space debris. There were no signs of lifeboats, if one could use such a term about AI escape pods. Neither had Methlan found any sign of a second AI ship. Warlai's paranoia on the subject seemed unjustified. That troubled Methlan the more he thought about it. What if the two drones had failed to destroy the AI vessel? Walleye's gamble would have consigned humanity to a second cybership invasion. Was saving one more drone worth the risk? The thought added strength to the shock decree. Methlan brooded even as he used the destroyer's tiny gym. He had bigger muscles than when he'd started the voyage. Constant exercise and good eating had aided his development. Methlan enjoyed the time he spent alone in his minuscule cabin. He had a body-length mirror and constantly posed nude before it, flexing and admiring his greater musculature. He also practiced the Como Dai. It was a Janus House knife-fighting style. He thrust, chopped, swept back, and did imaginary parries before the mirror. The shock decree had built up to a fever pitch by the time the destroyer accelerated again. It had come to a dead stop way out here in the emptiness between the Kuiper Belt and the Oort Cloud which some called the Scattered Disk. Now the Daisy Chain 4 built up velocity for the return voyage to Makemake. Captain Hawkins had radioed his congratulations. They would all receive higher grades or ranks upon their return. They would also receive medals for courage and devotion to humanity. In his quarters, Methlan sneered at the idea of these trinkets. He used to give such paltry items to his soldiers as the Prince of Ten Worlds. On the fateful day of shock decree culmination, such was the plan in any case, Methlan exited his quarters in a heightened mood. He wore his best uniform with his special kill dagger taped to his chest. His muscles seethed with anticipation. The only unfortunate aspect of this was that the pent-up sexual desire gave him a raging hard-on. It was most inconvenient. Every time he thought about killing Walleye, he also thought about mounting Jun Zen afterward. The two events almost went hand in hand. With Walleye out of the way, June would surely recognize his supremacy. Methlon had gone far too long without sexual union. He needed it in order to feel like a man again. Kill Walleye, Mount June. It almost had a rhythm to it. Methlon pressed a switch. A hatch swished open. He walked onto the small command deck, half turning to hide his hard on from Walleye in his command chair and June at her station. The shock decree seethed in Methlan's brain. He almost rushed Walleye. Methlan actually trembled. There seemed to be a fire burning in his hands. He yearned to kill, but such a move must follow the ancient rituals and spoken formulas. With difficulty, Methlan went to his console and sat down. He almost missed something weird on his console. He blinked, 
shook off the shock decree just enough and concentrated. This was quite odd, really. He pressed various pads on the board and adjusted a dial. He kept playing with the panel so intently that he failed to notice that Walleye and June had stopped talking. It finally dawned on Methlan that both of them seemed far too silent. He glanced over his shoulder and noticed them watching him. Methlan felt a surge of shock decree well up in him. He moved his hand to unbutton the lowest seal on his uniform. He would slide his hand under the uniform, rip the kill dagger from its hiding. What do you make of that? Walleye asked. It took Methlan several seconds to register the question. Make of what? he asked in a surly tone. Maybe for the first time in Methlan's memory, Walleye grinned. It exposed small teeth and wrinkled the mutant's ugly face. What you've been studying, I want you to magnify the image. Methlan hesitated, but finally turned back to his console. The object was over 1,000 AUs from the ship. He used greater magnification to show a swirling white patch in space. The white had to be massive for the instruments to have spotted it from here. The law of causality suggested it shouldn't exist. So what was causing the swirling pattern? What do you make of that? Walleye asked. I'm not sure, Methlan said. His surliness had departed as his fear grew. I think you do know. Methlan turned around as his facial skin tightened. It was not part of the shock decree. This was fear. Sir, he said in a low voice. We are witnessing a hyperdrive exit point. Walleye's feet thudded onto the deck as he slid out of the command chair. The little freak moved toward the main screen. That suggests an alien cyber ship is coming through, Walleye frowned. He regarded Methlan. How do you know that's a hyperdrive exit? It's, it's an educated guess, Methlan said. Walleye stared at him a few moments longer. A new cyber ship, June said. A new cyber ship is coming out of hyperdrive. If Methlan's correct about that being a hyperdrive exit, it would appear so, Walleye said. No, Methlan said as he studied his console. That is wrong. What is it then? Walleye snapped. Three cyber ships, Lieutenant. Those are three cyber ships, not just one. The AIs are invading with a flotilla this time, not just a lone vessel. Methlan shook his head. All our hard work. It's undone. We're doomed. Chapter 9 Over the next few days, Methlan raged in his heart at the recklessness of fate. He died in his home star system. He had no idea how long ago. Before he'd died, he'd gone under a brain tap machine. That machine had ended up in the Nathan Graham. He'd had a second chance at life when he'd returned once before in a Neptunian named Da Vinci. John Hawkins had slain that host body in order to kill him. Then Eli Gomez had downloaded Methlan's thought patterns into his human brain. He was alive again, the greatest leader of Janus House. He'd almost been ready to slaughter Walleye for honor, and so he could fulfill his desires with Jun Zen. Then he would have taken command of the destroyer and found a way to defeat whatever remained on Senda, if any robots still resided there. Methlan's plan had been simple. He would build a hyperdrive in the destroyer and return to the Ten Worlds. He would drive off the conquering AIs, if they yet remained, and he would gather his people, turning them into a fighting force of Avengers. Now, none of that mattered. Three cyber ships had dropped out of hyperspace. They moved at an incredible velocity, heading in the destroyer's general direction. Walleye had refused to shut down the main reactor and hoped the big AI ships passed them by. Instead, the fool tried to accelerate fast enough to reach Make Make before the cyber ships did. That was a suicide mission. Ninety minutes later on the bridge, Methlan studied his console. His worst fear had materialized. All I should have heeded him. He decided it was time to tell the others the bad news. One of the cyber ships appears to have changed its heading, Methlan informed Walleye. At this point, given their extreme distance from us, it's difficult to tell, but I believe one of the vessels has focused directly on us. The freak actually came to his station. He studied Methlan's board. Finally, he returned to the command chair. Turning back to Methlan, Walleye said, 
detach the last drone. Lieutenant, detach the drone, Walleye repeated. We're not going down without a fight. But there's no reason for doing that. We obviously cannot destroy a hundred kilometer cyber ship with a Hercules drone. So what? So it is futile to launch the drone in that case. Wrong, Walleye said. It could scratch paint on the ship. Methlan cocked his head. Had the appearance of the cyber ships unhinged the freak's mind? Why launch while the enemy vessel was so far away? I hope to hurt whoever kills me, Walleye explained. If I can't hurt them, I'll try to bite them. If that isn't possible, I want to do something to show they've been in a battle with me. Scratching paint is doing something, Methlan asked. Yes, that is a strange philosophy. Whatever it is, it's mine, Walleye declared. Methlan glanced at his board. He pretended to make adjustments. Finally, he turned around again. It's far too soon for us to act so decisively. Despite its great velocity, the cybership needs time to cross 1,000 AUs. We should wait to see what exactly the cybership plans to do. According to the sensors, they haven't launched anything at us yet. There is still plenty of time to study them. Why throw away our last offensive asset? You were correct in keeping the drone. Now let us use it wisely. While I looked up at the ceiling, he tapped a foot. Finally, he regarded Methlan. You know, that may be your first piece of advice worth following. Methlan scowled. We'll hold our fire for now, Wall I said. We'll wait and see what happens next. Time passed. Days. June detected comm messages radiating from the AI-held dwarf planet. The messages were machine-fast and impossible to translate. It seemed clear that something on Sendo was attempting to communicate with the cyber ships. Naturally, given the limitations of the speed of light, it would take time for the messages to reach the distant ships. In fact, it would take approximately 138 hours for a light speed message to travel 1,000 AUs. That was 5.7 days. Despite the limitations, several hours later, two cyber ships subtly shifted their direction of travel. It seemed they headed for Makemake. More precisely, they headed for where Makemake would be once they arrived. The sender message can't have reached the cyber ships yet, June said. Hyperdrive and hyperspace don't follow the rules of physics as we know them, Walleye said. Maybe the sender AIs used a different communication process. Then why did we detect it as a normal, if encrypted, calm message? June asked. That's a good point, Walleye said. Maybe the cyber ships noticed something amiss in their scan of Make Make. Supposing the sender message hasn't reached the cyber ships yet? June said. It will in time. Either way, I think whatever is on Senda is telling or will tell the cyber ships that the original AI attack failed in this system. Because of the message, we know one other thing, Walleye said. Robots must still be on Senda. He drummed his stubby fingers on an armrest. At the cyber ship's present speeds, and even given the distance we have to cover, we'll never outrun them to Make Make. We might beat the one coming for us if we head toward Sender now. Why would we go to Sender? Methlan asked. For the obvious reason, I said. We'll use Sender as a shield. That's in case the cyber ship launches missiles at us. If the cyber ship wants to destroy us, it will have to slow down in order to maneuver around the dwarf planet and use its beams on us. The cyber ship can't just destroy us in passing, as it were. Hide and seek, Methlan said. There's another reason, Walleye said. We still have a big old missile. The robots are our enemies. If I can't hurt the cyber ships, I can still possibly destroy the sender robots. Surprisingly, Methlan found himself in agreement with the freak, although he kept that to himself. The destroyer changed heading. They still accelerated, but not as hard as before. They would have to save something for the massive deceleration at the end. They could stop and maneuver a little at Senda. They weren't going to do any more deep space traveling until they found more fuel. That is, if they lived through the encounter. Methlan spent hours studying the situation. Two of the enemy ships sped for Make Make. The last cyber ship followed the destroyer. Methlan made computations, worried over theories, and grew increasingly desperate in his heart. Who knew if he would ever have a chance at life again? No. Methlan whispered. What was wrong with him? 
he tossed aside his honor as if it was a filthy rag. He'd forgotten about his shock decree. It was time to force a showdown, to begin the ritual. Abruptly, Methlan swiveled around in his seat. June is right. The cyberships know about the Nathan Graham at MK2. Walleye did not respond. He almost seemed to ignore him. We have to flee somewhere other than Sender, Methlan said. Do you think Hawkins is going to stay at MK2? No. He has to run. We have to run, too. I suggest we stop heading in system and move in as lateral a direction as possible. The cybership chasing us will likely leave us alone, then. By heading toward Sender, we might be forcing it to chase us. Walleye still said nothing. That was not according to form, and that exasperated Methlan. Did you hear what I said? Hawkins is going to run. Walleye swiveled the command chair toward him. That's Captain Hawkins to you, the freak said. What does the title matter now? Walleye kept staring at Methlan as he pointed at June. The lovely Miss Zen pressed a switch on her comm panel. There was a crackle in a speaker. Then the voice of mentalist Gloria Sanchez came through. Lieutenant Walleye, the mentalist said. It must have been a recording. Due to your diligence and observations, we have rechecked several matters. It appears that we have made a terrible mistake. Without your insights, I don't believe we would have ever figured it out until it was too late. You must continue to watch Eli Gomez carefully. I find that I must agree with you that he went under the brain tap machine. His physical frailty earlier and his distance from... That doesn't matter now. Thank you, Walleye. Continue to watch him carefully. Like you, I don't think Eli is who he used to be. June clicked off the recording. Methlan felt lightheaded. How could Walleye, of all people, have seen what others missed? When did the message come? Methlan asked. Several days ago. You've been watching me. Didn't you listen? I've been watching you for some time. Some of the things you said never made sense. Finally, the answer came to me. If you must know, your recognition of the hyperdrive exit started me thinking. I had June radio my suspicions to MK2. The mentalist confirmed my suspicions. Now you know what she thinks. The lightheadedness became anger. Then a realization struck. Did you bug my quarters? Methlan asked in outrage. Your knife thrusts were the clincher, Walleye said. I didn't think much of your posing routine, though. That was an invasion of privacy, Methlan declared. Walleye snorted. A technological ghoul like you dares to complain about that. Methlan scowled and then realized what Walleye meant. I am not responsible for the ghoulishness. Eli Gomez went under the brain tap machine of his own free will. Walleye shrugged. Methlan struggled for self-control. He must complete the ritual. What were you going to do with me? He demanded. Does it matter? Walleye asked. The cyber ships are coming. I can compute speeds and distances as well as the next man. Eli was a bastard, according to what I've learned. You're welcome to his body. The captain would like to know who you are, though. What's your real name? Methlan hesitated until a burst of pride gushed forth. He could no longer hold back the shock decree. I am Methlan Rath of Janus House. You're pretty important, I take it. Methlan ripped open his jacket, causing buttons to bounce off the deck plates. He tore the dagger from where it was taped to his chest. Walleye merely raised his eyebrows. I am sick of your domineering manner, Methlan declared. Today I will wash away your insults with your blood. So saying, Methlan charged, readying himself for a gutting sweep. The mutant swept back his buff coat, drew an obscenely heavy gun, and fired. A black object blew out of the outrageous barrel. Methlan attempted to dodge. The blob hit him and expanded with a sticky-sounding noise. The webs entangled him, sticking and shrinking hard. It pulled his legs together and his arms in toward his body. He released the kill dagger just in time. It tinkled as it hit the deck and slid out of the way. That was good, because Methlan thudded onto the deck, ensnared by the mutant's treacherous tangler shot. For a time, Methlan struggled. That only tightened the threads. Soon, he could hardly breathe. 
He choked. Easy there, Methlan, Walleye said. Methlan realized the mutant was speaking into his ear. Release me, he roared. This is unseemly. Relax. I want to ask you a few questions. I'm going to send the answers to Captain Hawkins. I despise the man. I will gain my revenge on him and on you. Of this you can be assured. Walleye shook his head. The cyber ship is coming. You think I'm going to let the AIs capture us? No, I'm not going to let them put a slave control in my brain. If you have a great idea, though, I'd like to hear it. Methlan silently raged. He'd taken too long. He should have practiced the ancient rituals sooner. Walleye straightened and turned to June. We'll keep heading for Sender. We'll keep talking to the captain. And our alien here might remember something important. What do you think about that, Methlan? Release me and we can talk. Walleye studied him a few seconds longer before turning to the main screen. Three cyber ships, Walleye shook his head. In the end, the AIs didn't give us much time to get ready for the second wave, did they? Captain Hawkins will think of something, June said. Walleye searched her face. I hope you're right, Luscious. I truly do. Part 4 The Kuiper Belt Chapter 1 John Hawkins ran the back of his hand across his mouth as he hurried to the conference chamber in MK2's fifth sector. He strode through a deep tunnel corridor. These were composed of moon rock without any metal sheathing. The robots who had hollowed out the moon must have thought of corridor sheathing as a needless luxury, if they'd thought about it at all. Uncharacteristically, John looked as anxious as he was. The showdown with the AIs was coming much sooner than anyone had expected. Three cyber ships had dropped out of hyperspace a little over 1,000 AUs away. They now headed in system, two of them coming for Make Make and the other zeroing in on Senda. The last few days had been hectic, and if all that wasn't enough, Walleye had confirmed the worst. Eli Gomez had made it into the brain tap chamber several months ago. The madman had downloaded the Prince of Ten Worlds into his head. No wonder I thought I'd recognized him, John muttered. He recalled the prince's threat at the end of Da Vinci's bodily life. The prince had told John his life was forfeit. It had seemed laughable at the time. It wasn't laughable anymore. The prince's name was Methlan Rath of Janus House. John shook his head. The videos from the Daisy Jane Four had been plain weird. Eli's Methlan's dance-like rituals before his mirror had a haunting quality. They had certainly been alien. According to Walleye, the alien had kept a dagger strapped to his chest for many weeks already. From everything John had read, this Prince of Ten Worlds manifestation hadn't seemed as cunning or ruthless as the first time he'd downloaded into Da Vinci. What accounted for the difference? Once more, John shook his head. He had to forget about Methlan Wrath. The alien of House Janus wasn't important right now. Deciding how to deal with three cyber ships took precedence over everything. Did Methlan destroy the moon supplies? He was free then. He had motive. John smacked a fist into his other palm. The prince must have been responsible for the moon sabotage. This Methlan Rath had thrown a monkey wrench into the Nathan Graham's refurbishing. What if that was the margin that cost them the coming battle? John ground his molars together. Why was this alien thought pattern giving them such a hassle? It should have helped them. It should have been more like Bast Banbeck. Instead, he wanted to forget about the prince, but he could feel the alien's curse wrapping around everything. Maybe the alien had acted differently this time because Methlan wasn't really alive. The prince was a downloaded thought pattern in Eli Gomez's brain. The essence of Eli must have been the difference. For all of Eli's cunning, Da Vinci must have been the more deadly personality between them. The brain tap machines. The cyber ship had brought them. Bast Bambek's people had used them. But it was the AIs who had brought the hideous technology to the solar system. We have to stop them. John hurried to a planning meeting so they could make the great decision. He hated this about real space battles. 
Ground combat was so much easier. One was in the problem, with adrenaline pumping through the body. With space battles, one had to calculate with incredible depth, playing out ideas step by step. It was a good thing they had Gloria. The mentalist was a better space battle planner than he was. In his mind's eye, John could see the colonel shaking his head. That was crazy. What was Colonel Graham trying to tell him? John remembered a lesson in a quiet coffee shop on Bristol Habitat orbiting Saturn. In those days, the regiment had helped a repressive group of oligarchs stamp out a secret revolt of the lower classes. It had been a distasteful mission, but it had helped the regiment pay its bills and outstanding loans. World War II is a prime example of what I'm saying, Colonel Graham had told John in the tiny shop. The German Wehrmacht was a well-oiled military machine. Their commanders were brilliant tacticians and operational artists. What's more, their leader had clever strategies at the beginning, before he lost his mind due to his increasing successes. What's that mean? Which part? Losing his mind by increasing successes, the young officer cadet had asked. It's a theory of mine, the colonel had sipped his coffee. Sometimes brilliant commanders achieving outstanding success come to believe they can do anything. The Japanese of that war also had it. It was called victory disease. The Japanese did so well early on that they believed any exploit to be possible. The Americans at the Battle of Midway taught them a harsh lesson in reality. The German leader got victory disease? How else does one explain his invasion of the Soviet Union at the same time he took on the British Empire and the Americans? As John hurried down the moon corridor, he wondered why he was thinking about this. He listened to me, the colonel said in his mind's eye. This is the point. The Germans had brilliant military leadership in World War II, but that leadership had miserable grand strategy. What's grand strategy? John had asked that day in the coffee shop. The big picture. In our lesson, it was taking on three powerful political entities, the Soviet Union, the British Empire, and America. The Germans had awful grand strategy. It meant after they shot their bolt in the first attack on Russia that they could never win. The odds became too staggering. The colonel had taken another sip of coffee. The big picture is critical. Grand strategy trumps strategy which usually trumps great operational skills, which trump battlefield tactics. The highest military good is to practice sound, grand strategy. John grinned as he turned a corner in the moon corridor. He saw the hatch to the conference chamber. Gloria could calculate vectors, velocities, and fuel better than anyone else here. But he was the big picture man. The meeting was going to be about grand strategy as much as anything else. John lowered his head and entered the hatch with determination. Chapter 2 John sat at the head of the conference table. The giant Bast Banbeck was in attendance. The green-skinned sacerdote used one of his massive index fingers to push something loose in the back of his mouth. He turned his head and spat on the floor. Gloria Sanchez sat across from Bast, wearing her tan uniform. She looked even tinier compared to the seven-foot giant. The mentalist stopped speaking and frowned at Bast Bambeck. Is something wrong, mentalist? the sacerdote asked. One doesn't normally spit on the floor while at a table with others, Gloria said. Bast glanced around at the others. I crave your pardon. It's fine, John said. No harm, no foul. He turned to Gloria. If you would continue, please. She cleared her throat and seemed ready to continue talking. Instead, she glanced up at Bast again. The sacerdote had folded his huge hands on the table, sitting like a discolored alien angel. As Gloria began again, John glanced at the others in attendance. The old man sat beside Bast. The tall, dark-haired intelligence chief seemed short next to the sacerdote, but the old man towered over the small centurion beside him. On the other side of the table sat chief technician Miles Ghent, the man fingered his golden cross. Between Ghent and Gloria was the missile chief, Uther Kling, who tapped a slender finger against his fox-like chin. You were talking about the third cybership, John told the mentalist. 
Thank you, I know, Gloria said, as she dipped her head in John's direction. She stared at the tabletop afterward, appearing to focus. Then she looked up again, glancing at everyone in turn, although she passed Bast without looking at him. Thanks to Walleye and Methlan for his teleoptic sweeps, we have pinpointed the range of safe hyperdrive entrance into real space-time, Gloria said. It is much nearer than we thought, but still quite far out if you consider the possibilities. What I find interesting is the reason for the distant entrance into our solar system. Which is, asked John, I had previously surmised that any significant gravitational generating body would upset whatever balance a ship needed to drop out of hyperspace. Would Neptune upset this balance? Would Makemake be too large? I no longer believe that. My computations show that the cyberships appeared with a larger dwarf planet behind them in their vicinity. Clearly, that dwarf planet did not upset their appearance. I am now of the opinion that only one object in our solar system affects the hyperdrive range. And that is, asked John, the star, Gloria said, in our case, the sun. How is that important again? John asked. If you mean concerning the coming conflict between the three cyberships and us, I don't know. I am still gathering data on them. At present, we have insufficient data on hyperdrive technology and hyperspace. So far, it is all theoretical or hypothetical. However, their exit has now shown us one of the limitations. John nodded as if that made sense. Gloria was logical and damn brilliant. She could also talk a lot and take forever getting to a point. The cyberships are coming fast, John said. That's all the data we need right now. That is too basic an outlook, Gloria said. Consider, we have learned several interesting facets over these past few days. First, the cyberships can act in concord. There are three working together. Despite haughty AI cores, they appear to be able to submerge that haughtiness to act as a fleet. Do they freely agree to this concord? Is one of them senior to the others and thus forces them to obey? If that is so, how does a cybership, or more correctly, how does an AI core gain this ascendancy over the others? Interesting. Interesting indeed, Bast said in his heavy voice. Gloria gave a slight head bow, although she still did not look up at the sacerdote. Second, she continued, according to Jun Zen, the cyberships, the ruling AIs, accepted data from robots on Senda. Jun also recorded messages leaving the cyberships and traveling to Senda. That would indicate that the AIs could control the surviving robots from a different cybership. John failed to see where this was leading. Three, Gloria said. The cyberships split into two factions. Two of the great vessels are heading directly here. The last appears to be chasing Walleye. I submit that Walleye correctly surmised that the cyberships know of our existence. I mean here, inside MK2. That could be critical. A moment, please, Bast said. Gloria ventured a glance at him, and then gave him fuller scrutiny when he was no longer doing something distasteful. We have found the surviving robots to be less intelligent than the original cybership AI, Bast said. Even Unit 529 seemed less intelligent than the original AI core. I agree, Gloria said. Given that truth, Bast said, we must surmise less intelligence from the sender robots. No doubt. Gloria said. That limited intelligence would limit the type and possibly the scope of what the sender robots could relay to the powerful AIs in the new cyberships. Gloria raised an eyebrow. That is an interesting possibility. Does it surmount my crudity earlier? Gloria smiled shyly. I'm sorry, Bast. I, I grew up under far different circumstances. We mentalists are a fastidious group. I, she smiled. Yes, your crudity is forgiven. Bast made a two-handed sweeping gesture as he bowed his head. It almost seemed like a sarcastic motion. I am grateful, the sacerdote intoned. Gloria stared at him a moment longer than seemed necessary. She inhaled afterward and looked at the others around the table. I want to point out that the approaching cyberships are an enigma, the mentalist said. 
We might think we understand these three from our former victory over the original ship. These may even act in a similar manner. However, they may also act much differently. We must not presume to think we know them. Perhaps they carry refinements. Perhaps their AIs lack arrogance. Perhaps these will prove studiously murderous. Okay, John said, we get that. Now how should we respond? Gloria tapped the fingertips of one hand against those from the other. Her eyelids began to flicker. John had come to understand that this meant she was running rapid mental calculations. Her head turned abruptly toward him. There are so many factors to the calculations. There are too many unknowns. We may think we know their capabilities. To a certain extent, we could even surmise that they will be in most ways similar to the original cyber ship. Wait a second, Miles Ghent said. You're wrong on one count. We've already battled a second cyber ship. We destroyed it before Make Make. True, Gloria said. It was just like the first cyber ship, Ghent said. Which proves nothing concerning the three approaching in system, she said. I think it does, Ghent said. The second cyber ship was just like the first one. Gloria snorted softly. Yes, because the second cyber ship had the first as its prototype. Why do you think that means these three will be replicas of the original? They look similar. That does not mean they are similar. It stands to reason that mechanical minds would mass produce similar vessels. I'm sorry, Gloria said, interrupting. I would like to know how you arrive at such a conclusion. Well, Ghent said. Hey, John said, that's enough theory. We may have already waited too long to act. Bast cleared his throat. John pointed at him, giving the sacerdote a nod. We have almost finished full repairs to the Nathan Graham, Bast said. Our last few days waiting at the moon dock are providing us great dividends. We should go into battle fully operational this time. Right, John said. That's why we've waited. But we're going to have to make a decision, and we need to make it in the next hour. Two cyber ships are barreling fast toward Make Make. I think they know we're here. Two against one is terrible odds. It would be a strategic loss to lose the moon dock, Gloria said. Yeah, John agreed. But it would be even more tragic if we lost our cyber ship. We've already stored a few building robots in the holding bays. We can have those robots make more robot factories later. That's key. What if the two cyber ships stop at Make Make, Gloria said. What if they decide to park at the dwarf planet and begin producing more cyber ships? From farther down the table, the centurion leaned forward, signaling John. Colonel, John said, would you like to add something? Sir, the centurion said, I think the worst thing would be if one of the cyber ships turns around and leaves the solar system. If one of them leaves and brings even more reinforcements. There you have it, John said. Three of these bastards are likely to give the solar system an impossible fight. If five more show up... Humanity is over. Done. Kaput. You don't plan to defend Make Make? Gloria asked. We have the fighting platform, John said. We have thousands of missiles and some pretty damn big guns on the moon. Maybe we could play hide and seek as the cyber ships break hard. We could use Make Make as a shield, only poking out for sniper shots at them. But to answer your question, no, I don't plan to stay here. If there were just two cyber ships, Maybe it would be worth considering. The third could still maneuver to join them against Make Make. Three against us is too many. Yes, but, Gloria said, the colonel also points out the biggest threat, John said. We have to assume the cyber ships know about humanity. The sender computers must have told them. If one of the cyber ships leaves with that report, who knows how many other AI super ships will return to pound humanity into dust. That makes our strategy, our big picture, clear. What is this big picture? Gloria asked. Human survival first, John said. Figuring out how to survive the AI menace in the future is second. That's the big picture. Everything else is a way and a means to achieve the grand strategy. In our case, the future grand strategy is surviving and tooling up so we can gather an armada of the living to destroy the unliving blight against life. Gloria nodded sharply. You state that well. Thank you, mentalist, John said. Given the colonel's insight, I think we have to lure the cyber ships into a trap they can't escape. 
How does one achieve this? Bast asked. MK2 is our strongest point, or are you referring to the Saturn system? John shook his head. We may have actually caught a break. If you think about it, it's kind of cool, he studied the others. Look, the Solar League has been spying out our alien tech in the Saturn system. They are no doubt attempting to replicate it for themselves. The Solar League people also know about the self-aware alien software. It's possible the Solar League is frightened we'll try that against them. Maybe they've prepared as we have and lowered the processing power of their ship's computers. The point I'm trying to make is that the solar system has been tooling for full-scale war, one side against the other, for some time now. What if the Solar League gathers its warships into a giant armada and we join them? That mass faces the cyberships. That seems like our best chance of victory. If we gather such might in one location, Gloria said, surely the cyberships will logically attack elsewhere. The AIs will force the giant armada to splinter and protect various planetary systems. Maybe, John said, and maybe not. That's why we have to lure them deep in system, forcing them to shed most of their incredible velocity. Maybe even lure them to the asteroid belt or Mars. What if the cyberships stop at the Neptune and Saturn systems along the way? asked Gloria. What if they demolish the solar freedom fleet before it can gather into one armada? That would be bad, John admitted. What if the Solar League refuses to cooperate with us, she added. That would be even worse. In those instances, she said, we would be better off fighting the cyberships at Make Make. That brings us back to the big picture, John said. Three cyberships is one too many, remember? I think we have to gamble on luring them in system. We'll have to talk to the Solar League into helping us save mankind. They might think it's a trick on our part. There are plenty of ifs, John admitted. Hell, I don't know if all of us combined can smash three of the alien supership's. We have the regiment, the centurion said from down the table. John pointed at the small regimental colonel. Maybe it will come down to our marines storming another cybership. Maybe. What if during the grand battle the aliens destroy the Nathan Graham? Gloria asked. That would leave the Solar League in charge of humanity. John stared at Gloria. Finally, he laughed. A man can only do what a man can do. Sure, we might lose. That's our lot in life. No one promises us victory. But we're going to go down fighting if it comes to that. We have to play the odds and then try to maneuver so we come out alive in the end. That maneuvering, Gloria, John said, interrupting. Enough with the negative talk. It's clear that our best chance is a united human effort. We'll proceed along those lines and attempt to make it happen. The Nathan Graham will definitely leave the moon dock, the old man asked. That's right, John said. We're going to leave as soon as possible. He turned to Gloria. How soon is that? She focused, looking up afterward. Four hours and thirty-six minutes, she said. That's assuming John stood. A moment, please, Gloria said. What should I radio Walleye? The destroyer doesn't have the fuel to do anything except continue on to Senda. Yeah, John said. He bent his head in thought. When he looked up, he said, You won't tell him anything. I will. Chapter 3 Methlan brooded in his cell in the brig. He'd been here for a time already. The worst of it wasn't the boredom. It wasn't knowing that his enemies knew who he was. It wasn't even the profanity of Walleye handling his dagger. No. The worst part of the confinement was his inability to lift. He moved his right arm as if doing a curl. He inspected the bicep muscle. It was a ball. When he felt the muscle, though, it was no longer quite as hard as it used to be. He couldn't do heavy curls until his biceps burned with fatigue. He had come to love the burn. Love the feel of his muscles tearing down so they could rebuild stronger. The problem with the brig was that a man could only do so many push-ups, deep knee bends, and sit-ups. He needed a chin bar at least so he could work on his biceps. It was interesting to Mathlan that the body he'd acquired had been satisfied with its frailty. If that didn't prove the superiority of the high race, he didn't know what did. He'd taken a body and vastly improved it. 
these humans with their weak egos. Methlan shook his head. He lay on his cot with his hands behind his head. The other thing he hated about being here wasn't the boredom, but an offshoot of the boredom. He had too much time to think. Methlan Rath had always been a doer more than a thinker. Leave it to scholars and letter scribblers to do the deep thinking. Did they mount the beauties? On no account. It was the soldiers and rulers who earned that privilege. Methlan rolled out of the cot and began to pace. The cell was small, so he turned constantly. Even so, he could let his mind zone out as the rhythm of pacing took over. A problem had begun to plague him. He was Methlan of Janus House. He belonged to the high race. He had been the prince of ten worlds. Yet if he mounted a woman and pleasured the two of them, the offspring would be human. He inhabited a human form. His sex organs were human. Am I human then? The possibility deeply troubled Methlan. He was of the high race. He did not want to be human. Humans were weak vessels, lacking. The hatch opened without the decency of a knock or a calm warning. Methlan spun around, staring at Walleye in his buff coat. The top of the man's head barely reached Methlan's shoulder. He craned his neck to look behind the mutant. I'm alone, Walleye said. Methlan raised his eyebrows. You are brave. True, but not for the reasons you think. Are you challenging the truth of my physical dominance over you? Walleye gave one of his rare smiles that contorted his features into ugliness. What does your smile mean? Methlan demanded. Walleye stepped back, although he didn't turn around and present his back to him. Am I to follow you? Methlan called. If you're tough enough, Walleye said. The taunt burned. As he frowned, Methlan stepped into the chamber with several brig entrances around him. Walleye sat on a stool. There was another stool across the way from the mutant. Am I to sit? Methlan asked. If you want to, the mutant said. What if I want to stand exactly where you're sitting? Are all the people of Janus House as stiff-necked as you? What you determine as stiff-necked, we nobles of Janus House call pride. But the answer is no. Not all those of Janus House are of the high race. You would likely be a menial on my world. Guess it's lucky I'm not there, then. Wrong. It would be a great honor for one like you to see true brilliance. Why have you brought me here? Thought you could use a change of scenery. But if you're in a hurry to go back into your cell, there is no need for threats. Methlan moved to his stool, sitting erectly as befitted his exalted rank. Walleye tapped a foot on the deck. The stool was low enough that his short leg could reach that far. He seemed to be waiting. Methlan could wait as well, if he wanted to. But he did not desire to wait. He desired action. Well, the prince said. Well, 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 Walleye said. We're almost to sender. We're breaking even as we speak. Have you scanned the dwarf planet? Plenty of times. Haven't spotted a thing so far. I think the robots are underground. If they had satellites up, those are gone too. Have they watched us draw nearer? Seems likely. I'm not sure how to smoke them out before the big ship arrives. I see. You demand me to slave for you, to draw your iron from the fire. Methlan, the prince scowled. Speak. What is on your mind? While I regarded him and then actually chuckled. Methlan found the sound deeply annoying. I have to admit, Wall, I said, you did a great job of hiding your true identity before. Are you saying this in order to exalt yourself over me? What's that even mean? If I did a splendid job hiding my true identity, it stands to reason you did an equally great job in piercing my disguise. Thus you have exalted yourself at my expense. It sounds like Janus House was pretty competitive. Methlon searched for the insult in the words. He could not find one. Could Walleye be more devious than he perceived? Did the mutant insult him in a way Methlon could not detect? That was a galling thought. I could use your competitive spirit against the AIs, Walleye said. Methlon squinted at the mutant. A thought occurred, one he hadn't considered before. 
You do not know the ways of Janus House. You got that right. If you would forbear with your studied slights and insults, I would like to make a point. Perhaps it could ease the tension between us. Yeah, that sounds good. Tell me. I will speak, but not because you order me like a dog to the harness. Crinkle lines appeared on Walleye's face. It almost seemed as if the mutant strove not to laugh. Perhaps he misread the mutant. Perhaps the fear in Walleye facing him alone like this produced pain that the mutant strove to control. In Janus' house, if one makes another his captive, he becomes the other's slave. Any action after that point is slave action. If you believe I will do as you tell me to, you believe that I am no more than your slave. You have proclaimed me a dog of the lowest order. That wasn't my intent. Methlon nodded. That is what I'm trying to explain. Your ways are so inferior. At times they are below my understanding. I have come to realize that you do not think of me as your lowest dog. I don't. You aren't demanding these things of me, but... Methlan stopped because he was at a loss. I need help. Your particular competitiveness to help me beat the AIs, Walleye said. Maybe we can even figure out a way to survive the cyber ships coming. I would not do this as your slave. I get it. You're trying to get me to free you first. The possibility had never occurred to Methlan. Could these humans be that weak? The possibility almost shamed him. How could he have let such weaklings capture him? It was beyond understanding. I'm not sure Captain Hawkins would agree to letting you wander the ship at will, Walleye said. So here's what I'll do. You are still officially in the brig. But, and this is a big concession on my part, I'll come get you myself, allow you to change into your uniform, and you'll join me on the bridge. As your slave? No, Walleye said but as a crew member under my command. And after, I'll return you to the brig. What is my official status, then? In the brig, you're a prisoner. On the bridge, you're a crew member. Methlan frowned. The two are at odds. It all depends on how you look at it. I do not understand. I got that, Walleye said. But maybe you don't understand because you're of the high race. What we're doing is called a compromise. It's something humans do so they can get along. Not that I think you're human, mind you. You consider me to be one of the high race. When you're on the bridge, Walleye said. You will obey me, then, Methlan asked in wonder. All right, Walleye said. I gave it a try. I could use your help, but if you're going to be a prick all along the line, forget it. But you claimed I was of the high race. Yeah, you're high, all right. Is that an insult? Methlan, why don't you think about surviving first? A dead man doesn't dream. He don't do squat. The cyber ships are here. One is coming for us. You're never going to fulfill your revenge because you're too hung up on your station, too filled with pride. If you can't bend just a little to meet me halfway, then to hell with you. Fighting words, Methlan said, standing. This I understand. Your duplicity was cunning. I almost believed you. Now you have shown your spirit. He frowned, turned away, and squinted thoughtfully. Walleye had spoken of the end, lying on a cart until death claimed him. Methlan faced his jailer. I will work the bridge controls in my uniform, but I have a condition. You must allow me to exercise daily in the gym. Fine, Walleye said. You can lift if you want. I don't care about that. Methlan forced himself to remain bland-faced. He would let Walleye think of him as a slave, as a servitor, but he would use the gym to remain fit as he plotted his revenge. Such deception on his part was allowed under the codes of Janus' house. Maybe, just maybe. No, Methlan would not even think it. When the time came, he would act with resolve and purpose, using this body to its full capacity. Maybe he could pull a reverse and change everything. Chapter 4 John Hawkins sat on his captain's seat on the bridge. The bridge wasn't in the exact center of the Nathan Graham. The gutted AI chamber had that honor. 
He'd captured the cybership. He'd torn a planetary system from the Solar League and convinced another to join them. The Neptune system had begun to rebuild, even though they had a fraction of the people since the dreadful battle against the original AI vessel. The Neptune, Uranus, and Saturn systems had created an accord. Now that accord might mean nothing. The warships built to defend their freedom. John watched the bridge crew around him. He looked up at the main screen. The Nathan Graham slid through the open hangar bay moon doors. The cybership left MK2. What had Unit 529 called the moon? A production unit? That was about right. MK2 was likely the greatest production unit in the solar system. It had greater building capacity than the Saturn system had shown. It might even have more than the Earth system. Each of those industrial nodes could advance greatly if they received some of the robo-builders from the cargo holds. John leaned back in his captain's chair. A few people had volunteered to remain behind on MK2. John had turned them down. He needed everyone. The Nathan Graham always seemed to be short of hands. The automated systems would defend the moon. Maybe the coming cyberships could disrupt that through alien software. That even seemed likely, but that probably didn't matter in the end. Maybe an easy victory like that would help the alien AIs retain their contempt for humanity. Yeah, once the other AIs saw his vessel, they would know the humans had captured it. That should cause the AIs to rethink their position. But John had dealt with these alien computers long enough to realize they had vast reserves of arrogance and contempt for their biological victims. He was counting on that arrogance. An easy victory for the attacking cyberships at MK2. John exhaled. The endless possibilities and the penalties for being wrong had begun to wring him dry. We're clearing the moon doors, Ghent informed him. John used the armrest panel on his chair to redirect the main screen. He brought up a rear image. The 100-kilometer vessel cleared the giant doors. There was little space to spare around the giant spaceship. John changed views to examine the cybership's hull armor. It was new, hard, and fully intact again. All the ship's grav cannons were in working order. Tens of thousands of heavy drones and missiles filled the cargo holds. The matter-antimatter engine had been fully repaired. With your permission, sir, Ghent said. John looked up, nodding. Ghent was working his board. Once more, John switched views. He sat back as he viewed the main screen. The great moon doors ponderously began to close. At the same time, the fighting platform from Make Make hove into view. The platform would fight in tandem with the moon. Giant guns and cannons dotted MK2's surface. If the alien software failed to corrupt the automated systems, the cyberships might have to slug it out with the moon fortress. If the fortress damaged an enemy vessel. John wasn't sure if he should set up automated self-destruct orders. Hurting an enemy cybership might make the AIs more cautious. That would be bad for the big picture. The truth? He trusted the aliens to have something that could wipe out the moon fortress. Gloria had suggested the cyberships might be working in accord with AI protocols regarding the annihilation of a biologically infested star system. How do you figure, John had asked her. Three cyberships showed up, the mentalist had said. Why three and not one? I don't know. It strikes me as protocol. If a cybership fails to report after a given length of time, the cyber high command sends a three-ship flotilla to investigate. That would suggest the cyberships are loaded for war and with possibly greater weapons than previously shown, because they're entering a star system that has defeated a previous cybership. Correct, Gloria said. It made sense. As John studied the screen, the Nathan Graham used low engine power to crawl away from the moon, leaving Make Make. The ship had taken a terrible pounding here. Now it was hail and hole once more. Two hours clicked away. We're clear of MK2 and Make Make, Ghent said. The moon's automated defenses are working. MK2's missile launch tubes are ready. We are aimed at the Saturn system. Show me the cyber ships, John said. The main screen flickered for only an instant. Teleoptics showed the two cyber ships. They had begun slight braking maneuvers, increasing their visibility. What about the other one? John asked. The screen changed. 
a lone cybership moved toward Senda. At the same time, the Daisy Chain 4 maneuvered toward an orbital insertion of the dwarf planet. It's time to leave, John said. Mr. Gant, begin acceleration. We're leaving Makemake and heading in system. Aye, aye, Captain, the tech chief said. We're beginning acceleration now. Chapter 5 the Daisy Chain 4 slid toward a Senda orbital insertion. The destroyer looked lopsided with the huge Hercules drone attached to the vessel's left underbelly. Even so, the almost fuelless destroyer maneuvered easily. Senda, despite being outside the Kuiper Belt, was similar to other dwarf planets. Water, methane, and nitrogen ices containing tholins covered the surface. Due to the tholins, Senda was one of the reddest objects in the solar system. It was almost as red as Mars. Two small moons, which seemed to be uninhabited, orbited the dwarf planet. During the insertion maneuver, Methlan sat at his station on the bridge. He scanned the moons and the nearing planetoid. I still detect nothing, Methlan said, while I avidly studied the main screen, saying nothing. Fifteen minutes passed. We have entered orbital stability, Methlan said. What about the cybership? Wall I asked. Methlan used his board to study the distant vessel. He shook his head. The enemy vessel seems passive, Lieutenant. I detect no missile or drone launches. He looked up. We'll be out of the cyber ship's line of sight in four minutes. Wall I laughed sharply as he rubbed his throat. That will feel good, even if it only lasts for a little while. You sensed a blade against your throat? Methlan asked. Wall I turned to him. Come again. You rubbed your throat, Methlan said. You rubbed it as you mentioned the cyber ship. It has been like a knife pressed against our throat. They constantly threaten. That's a good analogy. I like it. Wall I snapped his fingers. Now we have to find the AI outpost. We need to take it out while we can. Methlan returned to his sensors. The lone destroyer orbited Senda. Its sensors searched the ices sheathing the rocky underworld. The vessel made a total of four circuits. On the bridge, Walleye scowled fiercely. The robots are hiding from us. We have to start searching for them in earnest. Let's use a few missiles. Methlan, are there any heat sources whatsoever? I have found two. Those I've scanned relentlessly. In my estimation, they are cryovolcanoes. Their heat is a relative term, as they're hotter than their surroundings. Got it, Wall, I said, interrupting. June, I want you to find radio leakages. Any? I've searched for those during every orbital circuit, June said. There's nothing. This is a cold, dead world. Something here sent signals to the cyber ship, Wall, I said. We have to find that. The AIs on Make Make used crawlers, Methlan said. Could the robots on Senda have done likewise? Wall, I grinned as he snapped his fingers. You hit the nail on the head. Search for tracks. Tracks on the ice, Methlan asked, sounding dubious. Do you have any other pressing engagement? Lieutenant, Methlan said, bristling. I am your prisoner, but I cannot stand for this mockery. What mockery? The implication I will return to my cell if I refuse to follow your orders. While I stared at him, he stared longer. Noted, he said at last. I do not understand. You stood up to me, Methlan. You're cleverer than I realized. I mocked you, thinking to do it slyly. When you realize that, you stood up to me. That impresses me. Methlan's chest puffed up. A feeling of dominance swelled in him. This was most interesting. The idea of a prisoner making demands. Humans were weaklings indeed. I won't mock you any more, Wall I said. But I still want you searching the ices for signs of crawler tracks. I did some checking before. June cleared her throat. Okay, Luscious, you told me. Why not tell Methlan? The weak methane absorption bands indicate that the methane on Senda's surface is ancient, June said. That means it isn't freshly deposited. Senda is too cold for methane to evaporate from its surface and fall back later as snow, which is what happens on Triton and Pluto. Right, Wall, I said. I know this is a long shot, but none of us has anything else we can do. 
Find the crawler tracks, Methlan. Everything depends on it. Without a word, Methlan turned back to his station, beginning a long and tedious search for possible crawler tracks down on Senda. Seven and a half hours later, a red-eyed Methlan looked up from his board. Lieutenant, I may have just discovered tracks. Walleye's chin had been resting on his chest. He raised his head and rubbed his eyes as if he'd been sleeping. What did you say? asked Walleye. Surface tracks, Lieutenant. They're down there just as you suspected. Walleye slid off his chair, walking toward the main screen. Put it up there, please. The please astonished Methlan. He grinned to himself, feeling in more control of the situation by the minute. The humans needed his technical prowess. He was beginning to realize he might use his usefulness to pry his way into command. He might not even have to kill Walleye to assume authority over them. That was a heady realization. The image on the main screen changed. On the starlit surface of Senda, crawler tracks appeared. The tracks had scratched into the ice. The crawler must be heavy. Can you follow the tracks to their end? Walleye asked. I can, Methlan said. I doubt any other could. Walleye glanced at June. She turned away quickly, hiding her face from them. A muffled noise came from her. Methlan gloated inwardly. He'd just witnessed an amazing thing. Walleye had sent a wordless message to Jun Zen. In her understanding of his, Methlan's, brilliance, she had turned away. She must have done so because she realized that she had hitched herself to the weaker man. She must not want Walleye to understand that. She is trying to hide her feelings toward me, Methlan realized. The feeling of power just now was awesome indeed. A prisoner could still vie for rank if he had the wit and wisdom and the daring of a noble of Janus' house. Are you searching? Walleye asked in a subdued tone. At once, Methlan said. He tried to conceal his dominance. He actually tried to be meek in order to further dig his tentacles into their desperation. Without his technical brilliance, the humans would falter at this important juncture. Methlan concentrated on his board, studying the surface tracks, using the ship's teleoptics to trace them both ways. Soon, Methlan sat up triumphantly. Lieutenant, I have discovered the AI base. The tracks led me to it. I have used seismic measurements and discovered a cavity under the ice. The thickness of the ice would hide any thermal radiation. Yet I am convinced that within the cavity lies the robot factory base that built the sender-launched ship we destroyed. What about the tracks leading the other way? asked Walleye. That proves my theory. The placement at the end of the tracks in the other direction showed several centimeters greater depth into the ice. Why, do you think? The crawler launched an object, Methlan said. The launching recoil caused the crawler to sink that much deeper into the ice. You think the crawler launched a satellite? I believe so, Methlan said. Why couldn't we find the satellite? I don't know. Perhaps it used the gravity of one of the moons to catapult itself elsewhere, shutting down after a time. Maybe the satellite is hiding behind one of the moons in relation to us, June suggested. I like it, Walleye told her. He nodded afterward. Here's what we're going to do. Walleye launched three drones, one of them the Hercules monster. Methlan guided the big one. It trailed the Daisy Chain 4 while heading down to a much lower orbit. Meanwhile, June controlled the other two drones. Each of those drones headed for a different moon. Thirty-two minutes later, June said, Walleye, I found something. The mutant slid off the command chair and went to her station, studying whatever she had on her board. That's it, Walleye said. Let's take it out. Oh, and June, put it on the main screen so Methlan can watch. Methlan appreciated the appeal to appease him. It showed him that humans didn't understand prisoner status. He watched. June's drone headed for an alien comm satellite. As the drone approached the object, jets appeared. The satellite attempted to flee. Any time, Luscious, Walleye said. June looked up at him, smiling. I'll let you do it, she said. Methlan waited for Walleye to turn and ask him to do the honors. He would enjoy feeling June's body heat. 
The mutant surprised him, though. With one of his stubby fingers, Walleye pressed the detonation switch. On the screen, the drone exploded. That killed the picture, and no doubt destroyed the robot satellite. Walleye returned to his command chair. He seemed to walk with more cock, as the soldiers of Janus House would say. Let's get ready for round two, Walleye said. Methlon knew the mutant meant him. It irked him that the humans hadn't desired him to destroy the robot's satellite. They seemed so eager to placate him. Why wouldn't they give him a soldier's honors? Methlan, Walleye said, is your drone ready? Methlan twisted his mouth with distaste while his back was turned to the mutant. How dare Walleye question his readiness for action? No, no, Methlan reminded himself. He must lull these two. That was the game. He was getting ahead of himself because he was still thinking too much like the high race. He was now among weaklings and cowards who thought much differently. Oh, Methlan, Walleye called in a gentle voice, if I could have your attention. Methlan almost laughed aloud. Maybe he had miscalculated again. See how Walleye spoke with such deference to him. The drone is ready, Methlan declared. All right, Walleye said. Let's see if we can get the robots to open up for us. The mutant used the controls in his command chair to maneuver the destroyer. He brought them lower to the icy surface. They headed toward the hidden cavity in the ice. Walleye launched two missiles. They screamed down toward the surface, heading for the hidden cavity area. Abruptly, the surface ice exploded. Two anti-missile launchers appeared and fired rockets. Another tube extended. It chugged shells at the destroyer. Finally, Walleye breathed. Methlan, bring your big one low over the surface. Ram it down their throats if you can. I'll try to keep them engaged. The slugs from the orbital gun sped upward. Senda only had a slight gravity pull. Walleye launched packets of sand into the shell's path. The packets exploded, dispersing sand in a greater area. The slugs plowed against the sand. The particles did not stop the slugs, but it changed their direction of travel. The anti-missiles destroyed the destroyer missiles heading down. I see another slug thrower, June said. Methlan, Walleye said. What's the progress? Less than 30 seconds to impact, Methlan said as he avidly watched his scope. Walleye launched more sand packets. He looked up at the main screen then. Methlan tapped his board and swiveled around. He wanted to see this in all its glory. The Hercules drone sped across the icy moonscape as if it were a cruise missile. It burned fast. The cavity appeared five kilometers ahead of it. The gun tubes are firing, June said. Methlan glanced at Walleye. The mutant bit his lower lip in nervousness. Methlan grinned triumphantly. They needed his iron nerves. In that moment, Methlan realized he must do whatever he could to stay alive. Sooner or later, the others would recognize his greatness and yearn to serve under him. In time, he might even rule the solar system. Then he would hunt the galaxy for his ten worlds. On the screen, the big drone turned down into the cavity. It reached the orbital gun tubes and anti-missile launchers. Below those were metal buildings, the tip of the iceberg of a probable underground robo-construction yard. The drone's warhead exploded with a matter-antimatter detonation. A gigantic blast erupted, burning and devouring the tubes, launchers, buildings, and ices all around it. Walleye switched images. The destroyer passed in orbit over Senda. Below, the giant explosion appeared as a massive white blast. We're getting out of here before the radiation hits us, Walleye said. The Daisy Chain 4 used some of its last fuel to accelerate around the dwarf planet before the heat, EMP, and radiation reached the destroyer's outer hull. As soon as the vessel was out of danger, Walleye grinned widely. It made him uglier than ever. We did it. We scratched us some paint. Doesn't it feel good? I suppose, June Zen said. Definitely, Methlan said. Definitely, Walleye repeated. I wonder if that's going to change what the cybership does. Why would it? Methlan asked. I don't know, just hoping out loud. Walleye slid off his seat. Come on, Methlan. Let's get you to the gym. I'll have to take you to your cell afterward. 
Methlan rose slowly and finally nodded in agreement. He had hoped. It didn't matter what he'd hoped. He hated sitting alone in his cell. But maybe that was for the best. He needed to rethink a few things and make his plans for taking over the destroyer. Chapter 6 The Nathan Graham accelerated away from Make Make at 60 gravities. The cybership headed in system, presently moving toward the Saturn system. John received Walleye's message. The modified NSN destroyer had eliminated the only known robo construction yard on Senda. Some robots could have survived down there. Walleye doubted they had much capacity to do any more mischief, however. Keep yourself and the destroyer intact, John messaged Walleye. If you survive the approaching cybership, you might be out there a while. Ration as necessary. If we win, rest assured we'll come out there to pick you up. Walleye maintained calm silence afterward. Meanwhile, the Nathan Graham continued to accelerate. The two enemy cyberships continued to move at their terrific velocity. The third cybership still maintained its approach toward Senda. Two days passed. John rose from bed with a headache. He'd had a nightmare he couldn't remember. He realized the cabin calm had woken him and had broken the nightmare spell. What is it, he said after touching the calm control. This is Gloria, Captain. We need you on the bridge. Coming, he said. He didn't ask what it was. He'd find out soon enough. John ran most of the way. He ran more for the exercise than out of a sense of urgency. It was too easy to get stale and out of shape as the commander. He walked onto the bridge, sweating and panting. He'd take a shower once he had dealt with the problem. Then he'd eat some breakfast and drink some strong coffee. Ghent and Kling must have been sleeping. Their replacements stood at their stations. Gloria stood near the big screen, staring at it. She glanced at him as he approached. What happened to you? she asked. Took a sprint, John said. For heaven's sake, I didn't need... You woke me up, remember? What's the problem? She pointed at the screen. A lone cybership had a long exhaust tail, longer than he'd seen on any of the others. It's breaking, he asked. She shook her head. Accelerating? She nodded. There could only be one reason for this. Is it joining the others? Given its new heading and the extent of the acceleration, I think so, she said. Are the other two still following us? Of course. They're going to bypass MK2. So far, it looks like they might. But who knows, at that far out? She shrugged. They're obviously concentrating their forces. That is my estimate as well. For what it's worth, at this juncture, it looks like they're going to fall for your lure. John didn't say anything. He just watched the lone cybership accelerate so it could join its brothers in human genocide. Finally, he shook his head. That clinches one thing. Saturn System and the Nathan Graham might have taken on two cyberships and hoped to win. We can't take on three. I know. It's time I opened negotiations with Earth. Yes, she said. We might as well find out the worst. John sat at the same big desk with the same Black Anvil regimental flag behind him as when he'd spoken to the chief executive of the Uranus System. He wore a dress uniform. He'd showered, eaten a good meal, and drunk plenty of coffee. This time, they would record the message and modify it if necessary. What do we know? John asked. Gloria had joined him this time instead of Bast Bambeck. Did you read the intelligence packet? She asked. Not yet, he said. What's the pertinent information? The intelligence packet had come from the Saturn system. It gave them the latest concerning the Solar League. J.P. Justinian is dead. Gloria said. Oh, wow, that's huge. I'm surprised no one told us before this. I think the Saturn Secret Service only learned about it a short time ago. He died after a short trial. The tribunal declared the former premier as an enemy to the state and a devourer of the people. You could say that about any social dynamist. Gloria shrugged. With Justinian, it was even truer. They shot him? That wasn't in the packet. He's dead. Now someone named Frank Benz is the new premier. What do we know about him? He's a military man. That's quite odd given social dynamism's political theory. He's supposed to be some kind of genius. 
Aren't they all? John asked. Why are you so cynical? Social dynamism destroyed my world when they invaded the Saturn system. That probably killed the Colonel, if you think about it. We would never have been in the Neptune system. John, no. We're lucky you and the regiment were in the Neptune system when the cybership showed up. Who knows if any people would even be alive now? John looked away. Since Benz is a military man, Gloria said, you may be able to appeal to his strategic sense. You know this is a long shot, right? I doubt, John, what's wrong with you? You're grabbing for the brass ring. As you once chided me, why be negative? If you're going to win, if you're going to give your all, why not believe it's possible? You did before. John faced the screen at the edge of the desk. That's good advice. Let's do this. Do you know what you're going to say? Not exactly, but I have the gist of it right here. He tapped the spot over his heart. I'm ready when you are, Gloria said. Her hand hovered over the record button. Go, John said. She touched the button. John cleared his throat as he stared intently into the screen. This is John Hawkins of the Black Anvil Regiment. Firstly, John stopped abruptly. What's wrong? Why are you shaking your head? We're the SFF or the Nathan Graham. What did I say? The Black Anvil Regiment. He sighed. I guess that's how I still see myself. Okay, let's start again. She reset the screen, watched it, and chopped her hand decisively. Hello, Premier Benz. This is Captain John Hawkins of the SFF Nathan Graham speaking. Gloria nodded in an exaggerated manner. First, sir, I would like to congratulate you on your ascension to supreme leadership of the Solar League. We are going to need good leadership in the coming days. As you are no doubt aware, three alien cyberships have appeared in our solar system. They entered more than 1,000 AUs from the sun. Since then, they have been traveling at incredible speed toward our populated centers. Premier, I have faced a cybership before. They are deadly foes. I would like to plead with you that you not underestimate their danger. Premier Benz, the cybership as a society prowl the galaxy in search of what they call biological infestations. They have slaughtered thousands of intelligent races. Bast Bambek is a member of our crew. He is a sacerdote, a friendly alien from another star system. His race is dead, slaughtered by the cyberships. I have seen horrifying things on the cyberships. The AIs are inhuman. They use people as if they were mere objects, not as created beings made in God's image. Gloria cleared her throat. What now? John asked. I was just getting going. Social dynamism does not recognize God, she said. The premier will find your religious reference as insulting to his intelligence. More fool him. John, we're trying to convince him to work with us, to save human life. We're not trying to get him to believe what he doesn't believe. Okay, I can change that part, I suppose. Please do. John looked at her for a moment before he faced the screen again. Go, she nodded. Premier Benz, the ARs are incredibly dehumanizing. They treat us as objects, as mere machines. They desire to wipe out human life. I suggest we put aside our differences for the moment. Neither of us wins if the human race loses. I believe we must pool our warships into one giant fist. That fist has to hit the cyber ships and destroy them. I realize you must be wondering about the aftermath. To our knowledge, the AIs have formed the only known galactic society. Granted, we have limited knowledge, at best, hearsay. But if true, we are alone in our struggle against a mighty AI empire. I have a solution. That solution lies in the belly of my captured cybership. I'm referring to the robot-building tech. If and when we defeat these three cyberships, I am willing to share the alien robotech with you. In that way, the entire solar system can retool for round three. Of course, that means we have to survive round two. Unless we unite, Premier, I doubt humanity has a chance. Frankly, it was by sheerest chance that I was able to capture this vessel. Chance and hard fighting by my men. Let's use our opportunity and survive. I await your answer, sir, and I hope for the best. Yours in command, Captain John Hawkins. Gloria clicked the switch. How did that sound? He asked.
good for the most part, she said. What didn't you like? We need to change your title. If you're leading the Solar Freedom Force, shouldn't you be something more than a captain? I guess. What do you suggest? Let me think about it. Sure. Anything else wrong? Gloria began to tell him. Chapter 7 Interlude Earth Premier Benz massaged his temples as he sat before a large screen. Vela Shaw sat beside him. They just finished watching Captain Hawkins' message from the Nathan Graham, yet again. This was the eleventh viewing. The room was in a deep underground fortress in Lima, Peru sector. There were chairs, a wet bar, a fridge, the giant screen, computer consoles, and an armored hatch. Special guards stood outside the room. Each had gone under the chair. Each would fight to the death to protect the premier and the vice premier. Benz had debated giving Vela the role of chief arbiter. She'd refused. Thus, the same lean chief arbiter as had gone underground in the Colorado mine retained the post of first secret policeman. Earth's cities no longer seethed with riots. Neither had true peace returned to the home planet. A lull had descended. At best, Benz had a shaky grasp of the government security bureau. Worse, the Social Dynamism Party did not care for him. As yet, the party members were not overtly chipping away at his authority. He believed that given time, they would. Perhaps half the military approved of him. Surprisingly, that half came from the space forces rather than the ground fighters. The greatest surprise to Benz was the difficulty of governing the Solar League. True, he hadn't been at it for long. Even so, it was still harder than it looked. The trouble was the lack of loyalty in his underlings. Justinian had used fear to motivate them. Ben still hadn't decided on his chief tool, and that was likely a mistake. You've broken the system, Vela said, rising from her chair. She wore a scarlet uniform with white braid. The party of the secret police used to hold the military in check. Now the military has shaken off its collar. You frighten people in ways Justinian never could. They understood, J.P. He ruled in the accepted manner. Your decrees, Vela shook her head. We need more time, Ben said. We've shaken the system, as you say. We need time for everything to settle. I'm not sure that's right. I think our assumptions could be wrong. We can be as brilliant as can be, but if we begin with faulty assumptions, garbage in, garbage out, Ben's quoted. Vela nodded. Maybe you're right, Ben said. The people want an iron heel grinding them into poverty. It makes them feel as if they understand the world. That's not it, Vela said. They want what they know. They have illusions. If you break their illusions, they'll hate you for it. They won't rejoice that their chains might fall off. Ben sighed as he massaged his temples again. The cyber ships could change everything, Vela said. By killing us, Ben said moodily. We could use the threat of the cyber ships to whip Earth into a frenzy of action. We don't have time for that, Ben said. The cyber ships aren't giving us time. Their appearance and swift approach. We have two weeks to maneuver into position. The giant vessels will be anywhere they want in the solar system by then. Correction, Vela said. The enemy vessels will be in any one place in the solar system. They're traveling at terrific velocity. We have to presume Hawkins is correct concerning their braking abilities. Once they break, though, they lose the ability to be in any other place at that time. Opportunity costs... Yes, yes, Ben said. Of course that's correct. My point is that we have little time to try to trap them. Perhaps the Nathan Graham can maneuver at great velocity like the robotic ships. Our warships cannot. I have just learned that not all of the Solar League's warships have converted to lesser computers. Those unconverted ships can definitely not enter combat against the cyber ships. I see. What if we maneuver everything we can to Mars for a giant confrontation, and the cyber ships dash to Earth instead and obliterate the planet? If we stay at Earth, we risk having the cyber ships infect all of Earth's computers. Billions will die if those computers turn into murderous AIs. Benz massaged his temples once more. Whatever planet we use as a trap, we're likely going to lose it during the battle. 
Maybe we should tell Hawkins we'll agree to his alliance, but we'll use the Saturn system as the fortress trap. Ben shook his head. Didn't she understand? We won't be able to move enough SLN warships to Saturn in time. We'll move what we can. And lose the war, he demanded. Vela stroked her jaw. Ben stopped massaging his temples. He glanced sidelong at her. Vela had changed since going under the chair. She was no longer the innocent. She was no longer as kind as she used to be, as sweet. He shook his head. Hawkins has it right, he said. The asteroid belt or Mars? The belt is no good, though. We need a powerful planetary system. Earth would be the best choice. It's the strongest fortress, and we could get the most warships here in time. But I'm with you. We dare not risk the most populated planet in the system. Mars is the fighting point, then? Vela asked. If so, we can sign over a billion people to death, he said. We'll probably lose the Mars, Frank, she said, staring at him. We're going to lose heavily no matter what we decide. But will we lose more heavily than Hawkins? That's the question. What are you suggesting? The space commanders aren't going to agree to just hand Hawkins supremacy over us. They'll want to know your plans on capturing the cybership. But Hawkins is risking one vessel, Vela said. We're risking hundreds. But Nathan Graham is the only vessel on their side that counts. It's their source of power. The Saturn and Uranus fleets are weak compared to the Solar League. The Neptune fleet is a joke. No, Hawkins is risking everything by throwing the Nathan Graham into battle. I don't fully agree. If I were Hawkins, I would take an entirely different approach. I've calculated the odds. It's doubtful we can beat the three cyber ships. I've studied the original invasion. The power of the giant vessels. It's not even that. More cyber ships will be coming. Once the AIs realize we've become a power base, surely they'll send 100 cyber ships to crush us. It's what I'd do in their place. She gave him a worried look. What are you saying? Hawkins wants to fight. I applaud that. But in the end, it's a losing strategy. What else is there? That's easy, Ben said. You fill the Nathan Graham with people, mostly women with some of the best men. You use the ship's hyperdrive. You go far, far away. I'm talking about hundreds or maybe even thousands of light years away. You find a star system and begin anew. You use those robot factories in the belly of his ship. Then for one hundred years, you start getting ready. Then, and only then, you might have a small chance of defeating the AI Empire. Vela blinked at him in astonishment. Your great intellect has driven you mad. No, Ben said. I understand humanity's real chances. They are slim to none, to quote an old saying. You don't know that. If what they are telling us about the AI Empire is true, our chances are almost zero. That there are no other stellar organizations out there battling the AIs means, Frank, didn't you listen to Hawkins? He has an alien on board. An AI alien captive he set free. Yes, Vela said. That means the cyber ships fight others. Maybe all we need is a foothold. Once we go out there, she said, gesturing outward, we might find other aliens fighting the cyber ships. Maybe if we move fast enough out there, we can create a grand alliance of the living. Benz frowned at her. You can't admit defeat from the start. I'm not. I've stumbled onto the one true path for victory. Vela scoffed. Your way would consign the majority of humanity to death. It would keep mankind going. That's the bigger picture. I'm not sure it is, Vela said. We have to fight. We have to plant our flag against the AIs and say, you are going no farther than here. He searched her face, and she returned his gaze. Finally, Benz looked away. Ruling has been grinding me down, he said. I didn't think it would be so hard. Looking in from the outside. I know, Vela said, but we're in charge now, no matter how shaky our grasp is. We have to come up with something. Right, Ben said. You're right. What are we going to tell Hawkins? We'd better come up with a plan soon. Ben sat down in a chair. He looked up at the blank screen. Let's listen to his message one more time. We might see something we missed before. Vela seemed dubious, but she sat down near him. 
As the message began, she took one of his hands in hers. Ben seemed to relax a little. He knew he needed it. He needed the old breezy Ben's, the confident genius. The approaching cyberships and what they represented had shaken his confidence in the future. He needed to restore his faith in humanity's future in order for him to act in humanity's best interest. But how could that happen when he knew they were going to lose? Part 5 Approach to Mars Chapter 1 The Nathan Graham accelerated. It had already built up a good velocity and was halfway through the Kuiper Belt. The vessel's speed wasn't anything like the cybership's velocity, but it was faster than any other human-occupied ship. The messages had sped back and forth between Captain Hawkins and Premier Benz. They'd agreed on one thing so far. Lure the alien AI ships to Mars. The Nathan Graham sped for the outer planets. It still had a long way to go before it passed Neptune. At the same time, most of the SLN warships orbiting Earth or Luna had begun the journey for Mars. The swiftest, meaning the biggest, battleships and motherships orbiting Venus, also headed for Mars. There were a fair number of SLN warships already at Mars. None of the SLN warships in the Jupiter system headed for the Red Planet. Neither did any of the warships in the asteroid belt. The belt warships headed for the dwarf planet Cirrus. In the old days, people had thought of Cirrus as an asteroid. In the new solar lexicon, it had become a dwarf planet. As the various human-held ships headed for Fortress Mars, the warships and transports there began building a prismatic crystal field. The military term was P-field. The prismatic crystals were tiny objects, the biggest the size of a person's thumbnail. The crystals refracted light, particularly lasers. The alien gravitational beams did not refract upon striking the crystals. They melted and demolished them. Still, a P-field acted as a sensor shield against approaching vessels. Sometimes hiding from view was just as important as having heavy armor. If a beam missed, a ship didn't need armor. According to the battle specs gained by fighting the original alien invader, cyber ships had much greater beam range. Their missiles and drones also accelerated faster. The Nathan Graham had equal tech to the original cyber ship. Everyone hoped so, at least. No one knew what kind of tech the three new cyber ships actually possessed. The more humanity could turn this into a face to face battle, a close fight, the better their odds. The more the cyberships could turn this into a distance combat, the better for them. The alien AIs had one fantastic power at close range. They'd used it the first time. They could beam alien software into powerful computers, turning the human-built computers into traitorous and murderous enemies. This time, that wasn't going to happen. At least, Gloria told John, we don't think it's going to happen. They needed powerful computers as receptors for their software to work. Maybe they have other software that does other things to lesser computers. They were walking together in a corridor, heading for Bast Bambeck's quarters. Gloria wore her tan uniform. John wore shorts, running shoes, and an exercise jacket. He'd been exercising more lately. His hair was still damp from hitting a heavy bag. He'd started practicing with a battle suit again, just in case it came down to another boarding attack. I'd be more worried about a software assault if the three had sent a cyber ship back home, John said. These AIs know we've beaten the first invasion. Likely these AIs are similar to the first one. That would make them arrogant. Instead of going back with data about us, the three are plunging after us. It is strange, Gloria admitted. Perhaps no race has ever beaten three cyber ships before. In fact, I deem that likely. Why? In the first invasion, one cyber ship attacked our solar system. If other races frequently destroyed a single invading cyber ship, wouldn't the AIs usually attack a new system with three? Oh, yeah, I get your point. That's interesting. Gloria, you surprise me. I'm often amazed by what you can glean from what seems like no data at first glance. I am a mentalist. We could glean data from a rock. John laughed. You're in a good mood, I see. I like that. She smiled shyly. I've been wanting to get to the bottom of the prince's... 
duality for some time. We've covered everything we can for the coming battle, if the cyber ships actually follow us all the way. Now the three of us can finally take a break and solve the dilemma. She meant the differences in personality between the Prince of Ten Worlds in Da Vinci and the Prince in Eli Gomez. Soon they reached the sacerdote's quarters. He had two chambers, an inner and an outer. Gloria pressed the outer hatch buzzer. The hatch opened immediately, and Bast stepped out. Oh, Gloria said. Is anything the matter? Bast asked. Uh, no, Gloria said. I sense something is wrong, the sacerdote said. Have I made another social blunder? Not at all, Gloria said quickly. The seven-foot sacerdote turned to John. Please, Captain, could you explain her, uh, I'm uncertain of the correct phrase. Disappointment, John said. Gloria shot an elbow into his chest and gave John a small headshake. What is that? Bast said, noticing. Why did she just do that to you? John glanced at Gloria before a huge grin broke out. It's nothing really, Bast. Then you can explain it, the sacerdote asked. Gloria turned away. She appeared embarrassed. This is galling, Bast said. I've committed too many social blunders lately. It is frustrating. Oh, all right, Gloria told John. I hate to see him sulking. Bast glanced from Gloria to John. She's disappointed, John said. She'd hoped to go into your outer chamber. She wanted to see the chalked-out pattern. Bast's eyes narrowed as he studied Gloria. I see. He considered and finally shook his head. I cannot ask you into the outer chamber. John went in before, Gloria said. That is true, Bast said. But I can explain nothing more. It is not an insult. I simply cannot allow you inside. That's it? Gloria asked. You're going to stoke my curiosity like that and say no more? That is correct, the sacerdote said. Gloria stared at him for several seconds. Fine, it's of small import. Bast grinned, exposing big teeth. Gloria wasn't looking at him, but she did dart him a glance. Why are you grinning like an ape? I shall tell you later, Bast said. For now, I am thoroughly enjoying your company. Let us go to the brain tap machine and begin our combined investigation. Chapter 2 Gloria and Bast had been in the chamber individually since Gorky the Marine had been found dead on a table with a brain tap helmet over his head. They had never gone together, though. John piloted the flitter that took the trio down a long ship corridor. They discussed the coming encounter, the destroyer at Senda and the Solar League warships heading for Mars. Finally, they reached the brain tap area. John landed the flitter, and they walked the rest of the way. They discussed Methlan Ra, how different he seemed from the prince when he had inhabited Da Vinci, the sheer cunning the first manifestation had shown. They seem like two different beings, Gloria said. I have a theory concerning that, Bast said. He told them how different brains had different capacities. Maybe the anchor personality subtly changed the alien brain pattern. That's certainly a reasonable possibility, Gloria said. The differences in Da Vinci versus Eli seem much greater, though. You've studied Methlan more than I, Bast told her. Is there something about him or the process that excites your interest? It's simply that I abhor a mystery, Gloria said. My nature is to solve dilemmas, to explain why. The Prince of Ten Worlds has affected our situation more than once. My interest has been aroused. This manifestation has acted more like a warrior, Bast said. The other seemed... Like a ruler, Gloria finished. They reached the main chamber, spoke to the guards on duty, and entered the room. John had never liked this place. It gave him the creeps. All these machines held various brain patterns. It was like a hall of ghosts, or maybe even demons. The process had always sounded too much like possession. Bast inspected the main controls. He opened up a panel. I didn't know it did that, Gloria said. Bast showed her various controls. 
he made adjustments and read the results. I'm unsure, the sacerdote said at last. This may indicate an interruption of the flow. What does that even mean? Gloria asked. During a data transfer, these marks here could indicate... I'm unsure. Maybe Gorky or this Eli removed the helmet momentarily during the process. You mean as the data downloaded into the mind? Gloria asked. I suppose. Would that change the nature of the download? she asked. Possibly, Bast said. I cannot be certain. Well, Gloria said, if so, that could explain the difference. If Eli didn't receive the full prints, imprint, he would act differently. Yes, that sounds logical. That's her line, John said, jerking a thumb at Gloria. Gloria opened her mouth to respond. The hatch swung open, and a guard poked his head in. I'm sorry to interrupt you, sir, but there's a priority message from the bridge. What is it? John asked. It concerns the cybership, sir, the guard said. That's all I know. John turned to Bast and Gloria. Let's go, he said. I have a feeling the AIs are making their first move. The trio ran to the flitter, and John took them deeper down the corridor. Soon they alighted and hurried to the bridge. The bridge crew straightened as John entered the chamber. The AIs are launching missiles, sir, Ghent said. John and Bast hurried to the main screen. Gloria went to her station. Let's see it, Chief, John told Ghent. It's a long-range shot, Ghent said. The cyber ships have traveled over 500 AUs already, but that still means they're a long ways off. John waited. Ghent got the message. He adjusted his panel. On the main screen, a long-range teleoptic showed the two cyber ships. The third hadn't joined them yet, although it traveled toward a similar destination. I'm using computer enhancement, Ghent said. That means there is a 9% chance for error. I still think that gives you a good idea of what's happening out there. John nodded, focusing on the lead cybership. Its gigantic hangar bay doors opened. One by one, huge missiles slid out. The missiles looked different from others he'd seen. They were long, and each had a large, bulbous head. The individual missiles maneuvered away from the launching cyber ship slowly and seemingly deliberately. Strange to see these again, Bast said in a low rumble. John glanced at the giant beside him before refocusing on the enemy. It was strange seeing this, knowing these vessels came from another star system. Although John had been dealing with the reality of cyberships for some time, to see this new one gave him the chills. That was an alien vessel. Those were alien missiles. Finally, one of the big missiles began to accelerate. A long exhaust tail grew behind it. The missile quickly left the cyberships and the other waiting missiles. What kind of propulsion am I looking at? John asked. Matter antimatter, sir, Kent said. Uh huh. Can you estimate the size of the missile? Four kilometers long, sir. John looked back at Ghent. I'm sure of that, the chief said. Four kilometers is big, John said. As they watched, another missile began to accelerate. Have you estimated their targets? John asked. I've just finished doing that, Gloria said sharply. You're watching a recording, by the way. According to the trajectory, the first five missiles are headed for Make Make. John felt cold in his gut. Wouldn't they want to capture Make Make, he asked no one in particular. Clearly not, Gloria said. I suspect this shows us their intent. They mean to wipe out everything. I suspect until they win, it is kill, kill, kill everything human or human built. That was the sacerdote experience, Bast said. Any missiles headed for Senda? John asked. Not that I can tell, Gloria said. What do you think that means concerning your kill theory? Gloria thought about it. Maybe one tiny destroyer is not worth the effort. Yet? Take out the priority targets first, John said quietly. What else? Gloria studied her panel for a time. Some missiles seem to be headed for the Neptune system. John swore under his breath. None are targeting the Uranus system so far. Gloria said. Of course not, John said. Uranus is on the other side of the solar system right now. 
Is anything heading for Saturn? Twenty-two heavy missiles, Gloria said. John turned around and walked back to his command chair. He sat down heavily. Aren't the AIs going to leave us anything? The cyber ships are annihilators, Bast said. They are the seekers of destruction. The three have come from the grave to reap the lives of the living. Yeah, John said. He watched the screen as another of the big bastard missiles began to accelerate. I'd better call Neptune and Saturn to give them the news. It'll be up to them how they handle the missile attacks. I suspect the various system leaders are going to ask us to stop and help them, Gloria said. That sounds about right. If you do not help, they will never forget you failed to aid them. Thanks for the heads up, he told her. I am attempting to help you understand the results so you can make the best decision possible. Sometimes a guard has to stand watch, John said softly, almost as if speaking to himself. Sometimes an enemy commando sneaks up on a guard and slits his throat. That's a risk the guard has to take. Neptune and Saturn systems are not guards. No, but they're part of the bigger picture, John said. We knew it was going to be hell facing the cyber ships. This isn't just about our Freedom League. This is about all of us. I'm sure the Solar League systems will take hits before this is over. We have to win the fight. We can't worry about rebuilding until we survive. This looks to be a long and ugly war, Gloria said. They are the killers, Bast intoned. John said nothing more. He continued to watch the missiles accelerate. He studied his enemy as his heart burned. Humanity had to win the coming battle, or it was all over. Chapter 3 John went to the gym to work out. He practiced in a battle suit later in the day. He ate heartily and slept the sleep of exhaustion. The next day shift, he sought out the centurion. He found the small professional speaking to his lieutenants in the officer's lounge. The chamber had darker hues to the walls with a wet bar, a snack bar, and a long computer screen on one side showing a dark forest of oak trees. At the moment, a wolf padded through its shadows. The lieutenants had just gone through some simulations as the centurion evaluated each man. He gave his evaluations before the group. The meeting ended. Half the lieutenants left. The others remained sitting in the comfortable chairs, sipping drinks and talking about the exercise. The centurion came over to where John sat in a chair, watching the forest scene. Now a fawn glanced around before kneeling behind dense foliage, no doubt waiting for its mother to return. Sir, the small man said. John looked up at the centurion. The man stared back at him with the hardest eyes John had ever seen. The centurion seemed expressionless with a tight-knit cap over his bald head. The uniform was perfectly pressed, and the gun in its holster seemed well-oiled. After Stark, God rest his soul, the centurion had been with Colonel Graham the longest. Please, John said, indicating a chair. The centurion sat across from him. How are they doing? John asked. Fair. John sipped his drink. He thought the centurion seemed wound up. Is something the matter, he finally asked. Permission to speak freely, sir. John's heart rate went up. He didn't like that, but the centurion had that way about him. John set down his drink. Granted, he said. I'm glad you're exercising with the men, sir. You could use the refresher course. You were more than a little rusty in the suit. I didn't think anyone noticed. The centurion's dark eyes seemed to bore into him. Everyone noticed, sir. What's that mean? Please don't be shy expressing yourself. The centurion seemed to choose his words. You've transferred your first love, sir. The regiment knows it. They don't like it, but they live with it. And that means what, exactly? You've become a ship man. You're not the marine you once were. Are you trying to make me angry? No, sir. I'm letting you know the state of the regiment. Maybe I'm letting you know your state as well. I see. I'm not sure you do. You won the Nathan Graham through hard fighting, through the regiment. You owe the men everything. I've never denied that. 
You'll hold on to the Nathan Graham the same way. If you lose the regiment, you lose everything, sir. The regiment couldn't have ripped Saturn system from the Solar League. We needed the cybership to do it. I know. Then how can you say the regiment is everything? It always comes down to man-to-man -man fighting in the end. That might not be true right away, but eventually it is. A spark seemed to ignite in John's memories. Colonel Graham used to have an old saying. It went back to before the space age. He'd called it boots on the ground. Graham had told his officers it was the secret to the regiment. Sooner or later, governments needed boots on the ground. Boots on the ground, John said. You remember, the centurion nodded. If you want to save the cybership and save your position, don't forget about the marines who gave you the power. Can I give you a piece of advice, sir? I thought that's what you were doing. Practice more in private. Get back your old skills. Then come out and practice with the men. They need to see that you know what you're doing, not fumbling around like a rookie. Part of John wanted to punch the man. The other part realized the centurion was right. That was probably why he wanted to punch the smaller man. The truth usually hurt more than meaningless lies. Thank you, John said. I'm going to put that into practice. Was there anything else? As a matter of fact... Several hours later, John was practicing in a battlesuit in an empty part of the ship. He walked, turned, lay down, jumped up, and sprinted down a corridor. He remembered the original fight through the giant vessel. Those had been some harrowing times. He recalled Sergeant Stark. There had been a man's man. Stark had sacrificed his life for the good of the regiment. He could have used more men like Stark. After returning the suit to the armorers, he went to his messaging room. It was time to give his reasons for his actions. He would tell the Neptune system people first, and then Calvin Caracalla of the Saturn system. He recorded a different message for each person. He would send the messages after Gloria went over them. By that time, John was yawning. He headed for his quarters. It was hard to imagine sometimes that an ex-New London gang member held the future of the human race in his palm. He'd given mankind a chance by defeating the original invasion. He'd had a lot of help along the way. The centurion was right, but his... As he walked down a large corridor, John heard the whir of a speeding air car. He turned around as a flitter took a slight turn, speeding into view. The pilot spotted him, bringing the air car down as it headed toward him. John felt along his belt. He didn't have a communicator. The air car came down hard, jarring the machine. The flitter actually skidded, screeching as sparks flew everywhere. Finally, the car came to a halt. The pilot didn't use the door. He vaulted over it. Sir, the pilot shouted. The mentalist sent me. Catch your breath, son, the man saluted. It's Premier Ben's captain. The GSB and SD party are staging a counter coup against him. What? They've declared Ben's an imposter who used alien technology to murder the rightful premier. Are they mad to do this now? What's happened to Ben's? I don't know more than that, sir. Do you need a lift to the bridge? John needed two seconds to make up his mind. Let's go, he said. Chapter 4 Interlude Earth Ben stumbled and almost pitched to the hard floor. His hands were cuffed behind his back. Several black-uniformed GSB shock troops surrounded him. They marched him down an underground corridor in Prague, Bohemia sector. He'd been on a routine visit when GSB agents had shot his guards and grabbed him, hustling him to an air van. It had been a complete surprise. He'd believed himself safe. Every indicator had shown that. He still didn't understand how he could have failed to see the warning signs. That implied someone with hyperintelligence secretly working against him in the shadows. The only one he knew with that kind of brain power was Vela Shaw. But she was his ally, his friend, if not quite his lover yet. He'd been working on that. Could she have hidden her vicious nature from him? He didn't want to believe that. Ben's tripped and almost pitched face first onto the underground floor once again. Luckily, two of the guards grabbed his arms, keeping him from breaking his nose on the floor. 
They hauled him upright, their fingers digging into his flesh. It struck him afterward. The two had moved with startling speed in order to grab him just now. He mentally went over the gun battle against his guards. Yes, the GSB agents had moved faster than ordinary then, too. Why did it take me so long to see it? You've received bodily modifications, Benz told the guard chief. The GSB agent turned to regard him. The man had a lean face with a line for a mouth. Hard eyes and dark hair swept to the side. He was either fanatical or psychotic, or maybe both. What did they do to you to make you so fast? Benz asked. Silence, the guard chief hissed. Benz realized the man would make him shut up if he refused to comply. The premier, Benz refused to accept his demotion to that of a mere prisoner. The premier studied his guards as they moved him deeper underground. The men moved with lethal precision. He envied them that. They seemed to have greater physical prowess, just as his mind was superior to ordinary people's. Yes, someone had definitely modified them. He wondered who, and he wondered where this person or group had found or developed the technology to do this. If he could wed the two powers in himself. The guard chief made a quick hand motion to the others. As one, the guards halted. The chief went to a panel. He pressed several switches. The entire left wall lifted to reveal a courtroom. It contained seating for spectators, a low barrier, two tables, and a large podium. The podium was massive, almost a fortress within the chamber. A tall woman in a black robe sat behind the podium. She had the same lean features as the guards and appeared to be wearing a blonde wig. The guards pushed Benz down the middle aisle. Behind them, the wall thudded closed with the finality of death. The guards marched Benz past the waist-high barrier and to a table. Two of them, with their hands on his shoulders, pushed him down onto a chair. As one, they moved to the side, standing against the wall as court bailiffs. A door opened in the wall opposite the guards. Silent people began filing into the chamber. Benz noticed that a few seemed subdued. That was interesting. The group moved past the waist-high barrier to the spectator seating. By their outfits and uniforms, there were governors and other party officials. They took up one side of the seated area. Black uniformed GSB officers filled up the other side. The secret police people seemed more animated, but also more tense. An older white-haired man in a silver suit moved to the second table. He carried a briefcase, setting it on the table. He clicked it open and took out a folder. The court is in session, a loud-voiced woman said. She'd been the last person through the door. The state is prosecuting Inspector General Frank Benz for high crimes against Premier J.P. Justinian. The judge banged her gavel. Stand up, Mr. Benz. Frank struggled to his feet. His hands were still cuffed behind his back. How do you plead, Inspector General? The judge asked. Your Honor, Ben said, before we begin, may I have these cuffs removed? You are a prisoner of the state, Inspector General. During the trial, I wish to make notes, Your Honor. I can't do that with my hands cuffed. The black-robed judge stared down at him with intensity. Her features twisted with distaste. Remove his cuffs, she said. The GSB chief guard stepped near, unlocking the cuffs, clattering them onto Benz's table. Benz rubbed his wrists. He thought that leaving the cuffs on the table was in decidedly poor taste. How do you plead, Inspector General? The judge asked. Not guilty, he said. Not guilty of engineering J.P. Justinian's death, she asked. Not guilty of plotting against the state, he countered. It has been my intention to save the state to save the lot of you, if you'll let me. By murdering the rightful premier, the judge demanded. Your Honor, whoever is behind this murdered my guards, killed my friends, and had me dragged before this star chamber. This isn't justice, this is a coup. Did you allow Justinian to plead his case before you murdered him? I did not murder him. In fact, I warned him not to sit in the chair where he died. That is immaterial. That's absurd. It is perfectly material. The judge smiled evilly, leaning forward. 
You are no longer in a position to say. You are a prisoner, our prisoner. The fear of dying finally broke through his mental block. His mind wanted to contemplate all the ways they could torture him. Instead, with an effort of will and concentration, he put the block back in place. A good offense was the best defense. You are all cool plotters, Ben said. The judge banged her gavel on a block of wood. I will have you gagged, sir, if you continue to spout nonsense. You have plotted against the state. You have elevated yourself, a member of the military, to supreme leadership. The action is against all principles of social dynamism. The people have risen up through us. We have- You've tampered with those men, Ben said, interrupting, pointing at the GSB detail along the wall. Who did that to them? The judge scowled. Ben's cocked his head. He just heard a distant sound. His knees weakened, and he dropped into the chair. He looked down, hiding a grin. It would seem that Vela hadn't turned on him after all. She hadn't joined the conspirators. The distant noise settled his nerves. He might not die down here before these fanatical devotees of social dynamism. His real crime had been pitching aside their political ideology in the interest of saving human life. These fanatics would rather die than give up their communistic beliefs and power. Inspector General, the judge said. Benz realized she'd called his name several times already. He looked up. She scowled at him, and then her features shifted. She looked up as if startled. Had she heard something? I suggest a recess, Ben said. Perhaps you could put me in a holding cell and let me gather my thoughts. The judge ignored him. What is that noise? She asked. No one answered. Well, she said, doesn't anyone else hear that? Should I go check? The chief GSB guard asked. The judge stared at the security detail. Yes, go at once. All of you. The chief guard motioned with his head, drawing his gun afterward. The guard detail hurried past the barrier as the back wall rose. They moved swiftly, like greyhounds, no longer seeming human. Benz dearly wanted to know what and who had modified them. Who acted against him? It wasn't just these party members and GSB personnel. He had a hyper-intelligent enemy hidden in the shadows. Who could that be? Sounds of gunfire came down the underground corridor. Wait, the judge called to the GSB detail. Come back. You will escort the prisoner. We're taking him elsewhere. Benz was wearing the cuffs again, with his hands behind his back. The inhuman guards half carried him at times. Two of them grabbed his arms, hoisting him off the floor and running. Their strength and speed astonished him. They raced down another underground corridor. This one was much deeper than the last. The air down here seemed stale. The judge had left them some time ago. She'd spoken about the need for gathering reinforcements. As the modified guards took him deeper underground, Benz had come to realize his mistake, the reason his enemy had decided it was time to attack. He'd sent the bulk of the Earth-stationed warships to Mars. Most of the fleet around the home planet had started en route to face the coming cyberships. The warships and space marines aboard them had represented the bulk of his political power. His protection had disappeared with their departure. That had allowed his secret enemy to make his or her move. Why do that now, though? Why not wait until after the Mars battle? Ah, of course. He should have seen it sooner. If he and Hawkins won the battle against the cyberships, his political power would be cemented. If he lost, it wouldn't matter. Humanity would die. Thus, his hidden enemy had struck now while he or she could still depose him and take over in his place. Would the fleet officers obey the coup members? It deflated Benz to realize that the fleet officers probably would obey. He had one chance to save humanity from the cyberships. He had to get to the fleet. The ships had begun accelerating three days ago already. How could he reach? He knew what to do. Why are you smirking? The chief guard demanded. I was thinking what you'd look like dead, Benz replied. If we die, you die. Really? Why not kill me now then and be done with it? 
The chief guard's eyes smoldered with desire. He reached for his holstered weapon. No, a different guard said. Our orders, I know our orders, the chief guard snarled. A sudden, odd tenseness grew between the two agents. They're like dogs, Denz realized. The sound of gunfire and exploding grenades became louder behind them. We must get to point A, the other guard said. Those are our orders. Yes, the guard chief snarled. We carry him, we move. They moved fast while carrying Benz. The guards seemed tireless. Yet no matter how many turns they took, no matter how many hatches they closed behind them, the sounds of gunfire and grenades seemed to close in toward them. Battlesuits, the guard chief said. Marines are trying to save him. The GSB agents kept running while carrying Benz. They panted, and their soft-soled shoes made scrunching sounds. Benz's flesh ached from their digging, iron-strong grips. How do the Marines know where he is? The other guard who had spoken up before now asked. Yes, the chief guard said. He gripped Benz's throat with steel-strong fingers. How do the Marines know? Benz tried to choke out a reply. The steel-like fingers loosened their hold. I don't know, Benz said hoarsely. You are lying. No, I have no idea. He carries a bug, a GSB agent said. It is the only answer. The agent was right, of course, but Benz didn't plan on telling them that. Search him, the guard chief said. They halted, tearing off his clothes. Benz shivered. The air down here was cooler than he'd realized. Their hands felt all along him. That weakened his mental block. Being naked among them stole some of his courage. Nothing, a guard said. The bug is inside him, the chief guard said. The inhumanly lean GSB agent drew a sharp knife. Tell me where it is, otherwise I will probe you for it. Ben's balls shriveled. A trickle of terror slid past his mental block. The idea of the knife sticking into his flesh. I've already told you, Ben said. He had to remain strong. If he showed weakness. Leader, a guard said. The enemy is here. The GSB agents, the modified men, if they were men, turned with snarls and the chomping of teeth. It was a weird spectacle. Three SLN Marines in battle suits came around the corner. Blood and gore stained their heavy suits. More showed up. They had smoking craters and pits in their armor. The GSB personnel howled like demented creatures, drew their guns and knives, and charged the battle-suited Marines. It was bizarre. Ben stood naked with his hands cuffed behind his back, watching. With a start, he went to his knees and lay down on his stomach. The Marines opened up with lethal hardware, destroying the GSB agents with massed gunfire. In seconds, the agents were nothing but bullet-riddled bodies lying in pools of blood. The Marines advanced with heavy clomps as their suit engines purred. Ben struggled to his knees in time to regard a seven-foot battlesuit before him. A faceplate whirred open, and a sweaty Vela Shaw looked down. The cavalry has arrived, she said. I won't ever forget this. You saved me once. Do you think I've forgotten what you did? Ma'am, one of the battlesuited Marines warned. Frank, Vela said, GSB and troop reinforcements are on their way here. We have flyers outside, but it's going to be close. His mind started working again, building up speed of thought as he realized he might survive this night. Someone needs to carry me, Ben said. Listen first, Vela said. The Earth doesn't want you, and certainly doesn't want me. When the fleet left, I know, I know, Ben said. We have to join the fleet. She smiled, as if with relief. I wasn't sure you'd understand. Our hidden foe is brilliant, Ben said. That's why I couldn't get a handle on running the government. We can talk about that later, she said. I have an idea. Does it include storming the orbital naval yard? Benz asked. Her eyes seemed to shine. I see we're on the same page. Ma'am, the battle-suited Marine insisted. We have to go, Vela said. Break off my handcuffs and show me my ride, Ben said. I have some thinking to do. He was glad Vela and he had devised an anti-coup plan some time ago. A tracking bug had been surgically implanted against the wall of his stomach. It had proven its worth. Now, 
would they be able to fight their way off Earth and get into orbital space in time? Chapter 5 No, Ben said. I'm not going to order any nukes onto the planet. We're doing this to save life, not to have excuses to murder it. The battle-suited marines had fought their way back to the flyers. They'd loaded up and screamed across the bohemian topography at Mach 5. Ben's was in the same compartment as Vela. He was wearing clothes again and shoes, feeling more human because of it. He'd just gotten off the horn with one of his few remaining loyal subordinates. The officer had suggested using nuclear bombardments against certain ground battery sites. That would help cover their ride up into orbital space. We have a problem, Benz told Vela. Earth is a veritable fortress with its ground batteries and missile sites. It can saturate orbital space. While some of the commanders in the orbital platforms are still listening to me, how much longer will that last if they know I'm trying to flee Earth? We should have departed with the fleet, Vela said. We wanted to keep the home front secure. I know the reasons, Vela said. How did we miss this? Easy. A great mind, at least the equal of mine, has plotted against us. Who is he? I have no idea. Premier, a space marine colonel said. He was smaller than average and had a strange glint to his eyes. We have our window of opportunity, sir. Do we go upstairs? Benz could feel the hope in the colonel's voice that he'd take the right action. How long would the space marine back him if they stayed down here? The colonel obviously wanted to join the fleet. That might have been why he'd remained loyal. But if they flew upstairs, as the colonel suggested, and the other side shot them down. We need decoys to throw any tracking stations off our scent, Ben said. The colonel shook his head. We don't have any decoys, sir. Ben's lips drew back until inspiration struck. He tapped the comm, opening channels, and typed a special order. The code would implement the Loki protocols. He should have thought of it sooner. The scrambled message moved fast. That was one of its key features. It would cause worldwide chaos by unleashing computer viruses, ghost images, massive shutdowns, and other electronic mayhem. Five minutes, Benz told the colonel. Then we go to heaven. The colonel grinned. Yes, sir. Afterburners kicked in as the flyer convoy rocketed for orbital space. So far, so good. One radar site had tracked them for 13 seconds. Then the Loki protocols had taken over. The protocols wouldn't last long, Benz knew. In fact, he'd hoped to use them for their getaway in the experimental space vessel. But if he couldn't get to the orbital construction yard, it wasn't going to matter anyway. Bogey, the pilot said from the other cabin. Premier, the colonel said, get ready for violent maneuvering. Roger, Ben said. They were already buckled tight, so why the warning? Fifteen seconds later, he understood. The flyer banked so hard that everything around them shook. The flyer expelled chaff. Through the intense shaking, Benz could feel the flyer's guns firing. It put a knot in his stomach that twisted tighter and tighter. He felt like vomiting, but fought against it. He didn't want the Marines around him to tell stories later about his weakness. Finally, the flyer evened out, although the shaking worsened. The G's grew, pushing Benz back into his seat as they roared heavenward. We got lucky! the pilot shouted into Benz's earphones. That's great, Vela shouted to Benz. That's what I wanted to hear. Hang in there, sir, the colonel said. We're going to make it. I hope so, Benz thought. He didn't want to go through all this and die in the end. The shaking stopped, the acceleration quit, and weightless struck. Benz glanced at a monitor. They were leaving Earth behind. He could see the curvature of the blue-green planet. Europe spread out below. He could see the Baltic Sea, the atmospheric haze. It's beautiful. Earth was worth saving. So was humanity. These alien AIs sounded dreadful. Why would anyone have built things like that? Did the AIs out there have anything to do with the ancient site down in Antarctica? Did the ancient site have anything to do with his hidden foe? Benz bet it did. Time crawled much too slowly for Benz's comfort. 
They were tiny, and the Earth was huge. Covering territory up here in low orbit took too long. The courtroom hoax seemed surreal now. The strangely inhuman GSB guards. More was going on than he could connect. What did these changes mean? They had to mean something. Had the hidden foe been watching him all this time? Benz didn't like the implications. How soon? he asked the colonel. He repented of the question as soon as he asked it. The colonel seemed upset by it. So did the other two marines in here with him. Fifteen minutes, maybe, the colonel said. Those minutes curdled Benz's gut. He felt exposed every second up here. If the Loki protocols failed, laser stations could easily pick them out of orbit. Hypersonic missiles could come screaming after them. Earth was a fortress. The defense systems had been upgraded and multiplied in order to withstand the captured cybership if it tried to come here. Now three of the bastard superships had invaded the solar system. Would Captain Hawkins stick to the plan if the hidden foe killed him? If that happened, would the SLN warships pick a fight with Hawkins around Mars? I have to escape, Benz told himself. It's not just about me staying alive. I'm the glue for our side. Hawkins and humanity is counting on me. I have to use my mind like never before. There, the colonel said. You can see it. Benz used the monitor. He saw it, all right. The main orbital construction yard drifted around Earth. It was a vast oval, a giant donut that spun around and around to simulate gravity for those inside. The yard had huge spokes in the center and half-built ships around it. Some of the yard work took place inside giant hangar bays. The place had guns and anti-missiles. Would the yard target the flyers? Sir, the colonel said, it's time to make a call. The weightlessness had begun to seriously trouble Benz. He concentrated anyway. He had to act like a premier more now than ever. He had to talk their way onto the construction yard so they could commandeer an experimental space vessel. Chapter 6 The next hour was a blur. Benz convinced the port admiral in charge of the yard to let them land. His marines wore battle suits and acted decisively once in the construction yard's corridors. Sometimes decisive action made all the difference. The marines only fired once at Benz's explicit orders. They gunned down five GSB agents. The construction yard port admiral, a portly man, went ghost white at the firing, and the bodies thudded onto a deck. He'd sputtered incoherent words. Benz put an arm around the admiral's shoulders, leading him down the corridors. Benz's other hand kept hold of a gun. He hoped the message was clear. How do you want to do this, admiral? Friendly or enemy style? The port admiral decided to play along with the charade. No doubt he would do so long enough to get away. Then he would either make a call or turn the construction yard's armaments against them. Down on Earth, the opposition had started to get a handle on the Loki protocol. They had done so faster than Benz had expected. The experimental warship was a beauty. It had rakish features, giving the pretense that it could land on a terrestrial world. The thing was made for speed. It had one long-range particle beam. The cannon had been built along the entire length of the vessel. It had a minimal crew. It was part raider and part long-range sniper. Give the orders, Port Admiral, Benz told the man. They stood in the construction yard's main control room. The operators locked away in a storage compartment. I, I don't dare do that, the Port Admiral stammered. Benz poked the Port Admiral in the stomach with the barrel of a gun. I admire you, sir. You have the makings of a martyr. You will go down as a hero of social dynamism. Goodbye. Wait, the port admiral whispered, with sweat pooling on his face. I'll, I'll do it. Oh, of course. I misunderstood you. The port admiral mopped his face with a heavily braided sleeve. Then he made the call. The hangar chief on the other end seemed surprised. The admiral roared at the chief. Soon the chief agreed. The admiral clicked off the comm and turned to Benz. Let's go, Benz told the others. 
Go ahead, he told the Marine Colonel. The Colonel leveled a big-barreled weapon at the Port Admiral. No, the portly officer said, sweating anew. You promised. A tangler shot webbed him. The Admiral struck the floor with his side, tangled with sticky threads. This is to keep you alive when the GSB questions you, Ben said. The webbed Port Admiral blinked several times until understanding struck. Yes, yes, thank you, Premier. I resisted, and you tangled me. G -g Good luck, sir. Because you mean it, I appreciate that. Ben's hurried down the corridor, the rest of his people following. The Port Admiral struggled hard in order to make it look as if he had resisted. The webs tightened until he could hardly breathe. Finally, a GSB detail found him. The woman, a major, ordered a gunman to spray the webbing. Soon the threads wilted. Up, up, the GSB major told him. You have a task to perform. Only you can do it. Let me at them, the port admiral snarled. The foul traitors took me by surprise. Admiral, the major said, save that for your court-martial. What is this, he blustered. I tried to take them down. The traitors, no more theatrics, the major said. Come, come, hurry to the board. Get it ready. The port admiral remembered the codes. He had once been a missile officer. It all came back as he activated the construction yard's defenses. At that point, the panel lit up with red lights. He hesitated, glancing sidelong at the impatient major tapping a foot. Blast it to Hades, he shouted. Some of the launch systems have been sabotaged. Please, the major said. Only tell me about working systems. This is critical. Look out there. The port admiral looked up at a screen. One of the major's operatives worked the board. The rakish experimental ship had loosened its docking constraints. Slowly, it maneuvered for a space door. How did this happen, the port admiral said in a ponderous voice. The major eyed him closely as her gunmen stroked their weapons. Can you destroy the ship? The port admiral turned back to the red-lit board, working the panel, cursing under his breath. Two of the red lights abruptly turned green. It's not a question of can, the port admiral said. Certainly I can. Do it now, the major said. He glanced at her. And destroy the construction yard with them. We could die in the blast. The major seemed to reconsider the choices. Wait until the ship clears the yard. We don't want to unnecessarily damage state property. My feelings exactly, the port admiral said. They watched the rakish vessel work its way clear of the space door and then the construction yard. Its engines glowed at that point. The experimental ship began to move faster. Are you tracking it? The major asked. The port admiral tapped his board for an answer. Can you destroy it without damaging us? I can, he said. Do so at once, she said. The port admiral tapped in the commands. He waited, hoping this worked. The major waited. The experimental vessel moved faster as its exhaust tail lengthened. Then, two missiles streaked after it. The port admiral exhaled in relief. He'd done it. The vessel's auto defenses engaged. Beams rayed the first missile, rendering it harmless as it drifted in space. The second missile slammed home and exploded, detonating other munitions in the spacecraft. The explosion was greater than expected. The blast, radiation, and EMP struck the construction yard, blowing away part of the mighty but fragile structure. The control room shook, but held. I did it, the port admiral shouted. We did it, the major corrected. Of course, of course, he said. We killed the traitors to social dynamism. The major examined the continuing damage to the construction yard. At last, she shrugged. That could not be helped. But since we destroyed the traitors, the new premier will likely accept the damage to the yard. The port admiral nodded vigorously, hoping that was true. He looked at the debris that had been the experimental vessel. He was more than a little surprised Benz had died so easily. Wasn't the man supposed to be a genius of some kind? The port admiral mopped his face. It didn't matter in the end. He was safe, and likely so was his rank. That was what really mattered. Ben slumped against his seat. The missiles had fired much closer to the construction yard than he had anticipated. 
They truly hate you, the Marine Colonel said. They fear him, Vela corrected. I don't know that either is true, Ben said. They're covering their butts like everyone else. The question, Ben saw the colonel watching him closely. He changed what he was going to say. The question, Ben said, is how fast this stealth ship can go. We need to catch up to the fleet if that's possible. If we go too much faster, Vela said, Earth's orbital tracking will spot us. If we wait too long to announce ourselves as alive, Ben said, the fleet might change its mind. They have to know I'm alive so they'll keep heading to Mars. True, Vela said, staring at him. What are your orders, sir? the colonel asked. Let's get a little more separation from Earth, Ben said. I want greater acceleration. Nothing too brazen, but more than this. The colonel stuck out a hand. That was a clever ruse, sir. I would never have thought of switching ships. Better to get away fast than sneak out, Ben said. Well, it hasn't worked yet, just so far. Now, colonel, get me increased acceleration, please. The colonel headed out of the compartment, hurrying to the piloting chamber. What now, Frank? Vela asked. We've made it this far, but it looks like they're finally shutting down the last of the Loki protocols. Soon, orbital defense will start scanning more thoroughly. This is a tiny craft. I would wait until you have the fleet under your feet before making any big announcements. I know. We still have complications. The fleet has a head start on us. We're going to have to let them know about us soon. And we're going to have to let Hawkins know we're still alive and that the plan is still a go. When? I'm thinking, Ben said. Chapter 7 Twenty hours later, Ben's moved on to the stealth ship's bridge. An acting captain sat in the control chair. She was a small black woman and stood at attention as Ben's and Vela entered through the hatch. At ease, Captain, Ben said. He looked around. It was a small, circular-shaped bridge with two other seats. Where are the others? Ben's asked. Resting, sir, the captain said. Would you like me to get them? No, I was just wondering. Do you desire my chair? No, no, Ben said. Please, continue doing whatever it is you are doing. Monitoring the ship, sir, she said. He nodded, moving to the nearer seat. That is the comm station, the captain said. She resumed her place in the captain's chair. Ben's kept moving until he sat on the other chair. He studied the controls. That is scanning and- Thank you, captain, Ben said. I understand. Of course, sir, she said. Ben's applied himself, using the sensor station, bringing up a solar system space chart. He pinpointed the Venus ships heading for Mars. He found the Earth fleet easily enough. It was composed of over 50 capital ships, some of them the newest in the Solar League. There were a few newer ships still at Earth. Would their commanders follow his orders, or those of the new acting premier, or whatever the plotters had put in place? Benz didn't bother with any other scans. Nothing headed out from orbital Earth after them. It would appear that the stealth ship had gotten away cleanly. The premier sat hunched over the sensor station for some time, thinking, plotting velocities and vectors. He computed time. Then he sat back and thought carefully. He glanced at Vela. She watched him sidelong and seemed concerned. We can't wait too long, Vela said softly. Benz nodded in order to show he'd heard her assessment. He agreed. If they waited, the Earth Fleet ship captains and other higher personnel would start to become accustomed to his supposed death. Benz stood. The captain gave a soft exclamation. He'd obviously surprised her. He moved to the comm station. Vela stood aside. Captain, Ben said without looking at her. Yes, sir. Could you leave the bridge for a moment, please? The captain hesitated before saying, yes, sir. She stood. She stood a little longer and finally moved toward the hatch. She stopped there. It appeared she might say something. Instead, she ducked through the hatch, closing it behind her. Benz exhaled. He switched on the comm and directed the signal at the Earth fleet. His hands hardly shook at all. This is a risk, he told Vela. She already knew that. She could compute the odds as easily as he could. 
the comm signal traveled to the Earth fleet. In stellar terms, they were almost beside each other. A communications officer answered the hail. She belonged to the fleet's flagship, battleship Nikita Khrushchev. This is Premier Benz. Put me through to Admiral Rowland. Sir, the Premier is- This is Premier Benz. You will immediately put me through to Admiral Rowland. Silence answered him. Benz knew why. The comm officer must be thinking fast. Likely, she told Roland that Benz was on the comm. The admiral would calculate. In truth, this was the moment. Maybe he should have called sooner. Maybe. Premier Benz, Roland asked. He was a gruff old space dog, a gnarled fighter who had made it to higher command despite the strictures of social dynamism. I assume you've heard some strange rumors from Earth about me, Ben said. But just a minute, Admiral Rowland said. There was silence again. The Admiral came on a few seconds later. We're on a secure line. Is this really Ben's? Ben's clicked on a visual, staring into the screen. Rowland's worn face appeared almost as fast. The man looked like a hunchback from Victorian times, with a blob for a nose. His small size hit a fierce fighting spirit. Premier, the Politburo has officially declared you a traitor. The GSB are up to their old tricks, Ben said. I'm in space. I'm following the fleet. Do you mind if I confirm that? I want you to. On the small comm screen, Roland manipulated controls. Ah, you're in a stealth ship. One of the new ones. It's small. It doesn't have much in the way of acceleration capabilities. The fleet has to stop accelerating. I need to catch up as fast as I can. Yes, Premier. In theory, I agree, of course. Then give the order. Sir, Roland appeared to rethink his statement. You know me, Admiral. You understand something regarding the power of my mind? Through the tiny screen, Roland watched him. Clearly, the old space dog was considering who would win the political fight. Benz was running away. He wasn't going to be the political winner on Earth. The Politburo had already turned against him. Benz had to change the direction of Roland's thoughts. The cyber ships are coming, Ben said in a flinty voice. If the cyber vessels win, humanity loses. If I beat them, my fighting admirals will be the heroes of the state. You're playing hardball with me, eh, Premier? Do you think those who tried to depose me will continue to agree with the alliance with Captain Hawkins? I haven't thought about that. I have. I doubt they will. We won't beat the cyber ships without the Nathan Graham. Humanity needs me to be in control of the SLN space fleets. It's always good when humanities and the Premier's fate are the same, Roland said dryly. Vela looked up from the other station, signaling him. Just a minute, Admiral, Ben said. He muted Roland. Missiles, Vela said. Lots and lots of missiles have just launched from Earth's orbital stations. They must have cracked your transmission. They know you're alive. Ben's felt cold and small and vulnerable. The missiles are heading this way. At full acceleration for us, Vela said. Ben's compressed his lips. He nodded to himself and re-engaged the comm. Admiral, the GSB has illegally launched missiles at me. That should prove to you their desperation and their lunacy. I'm not sure if you've seen Hawkins' psyche profile. He hates social dynamism and distrusts the Solar League. Despite that, I got him to trust me. If I die, that kills any chances of Hawkins and us working together. That means the cyber ships win. I need you to decelerate and get ready to launch a massive anti-missile volley. You're going to have to cover me. If I begin deceleration, the fleet isn't going to reach Mars as soon. I realize that. What if that means Earth fleet fails to help the Nathan Graham in time? It's better that we arrive late than not arrive at all. Even better to be on time, Roland said. Damn it, man, Ben said. Begin deceleration and target the missiles. That is a direct order from the Premier. Roland searched Ben's face. The old space dog turned away. He was obviously thinking. He was making the most important decision of his life, maybe of humanity's life. 
Finally, he faced Benz again. I'm going to order the entire fleet to decelerate, sir. Even so, this is going to be tricky. Right, Ben said. Good. You made the right decision. I hope so, sir. I really do. Chapter 8 The Nathan Graham passed Neptune's orbital path. The ice giant was presently a little over 30 AUs from the sun. Mars was a little more than 1.5 AUs from the sun. Given the cyber ship's relative position in orbital space and that of Mars, the red planet was approximately 33 AUs from the Nathan Graham. It was a tiny bit farther to the Earth fleet, but not much. That meant a calm message at the speed of light took 4.57 hours to go from one location to the other. That was still much too far to have a regular back-and-forth conversation. That also meant that scanning with teleoptics provided data that was 4.57 hours old. John was on the bridge when Ghent discovered the missile barrage accelerating from Earth's orbital stations. What are they launching at? John asked. This is interesting, Ghent said. He showed the Earth fleet decelerating hard. This doesn't make sense, John said. They're supposed to meet us at Mars. Are they changing their mind? Gloria had watched the display in silence. She now spoke up. I suspect we're witnessing a political fight. Political, John asked. Those are missiles, not speeches. I understand. Gloria paused as if collecting her thoughts. I suspect we're going to be in suspense for some time. We should probably suspend judgment about what this all means until we begin receiving messages. John shook his head in frustration. Space battles took more patience than he had. They might have to wait hours before any of this made sense. The orbital-launched missiles seemed to concentrate on nothing. That nothing was before the Earth fleet. The anti-missiles leaving the fleet also headed in concentration toward the empty area of space. Why are they launching at that area? John asked. I suspect a stealth ship is out there, Gloria said. It's the only reasonable explanation. John thought about that, nodding shortly. That makes sense. Chief Ghent, can you find a stealth ship out there? I'm working on it, sir, Ghent said. The orbital-launched missiles and the Earth fleet-launched anti-missiles moved at a fraction of the velocity of the Nathan Graham. They crawled at an agonizingly slow rate. That meant minutes turned into hours before the situation began to make sense. Hours later, Ghent said, I found it, sir. It is a stealth ship, just like the mentalist thought. It's moving toward the Earth fleet. Gloria looked up. Could Benz be alive? She asked. Explain that, John said. Gloria told him her reasoning. The underpinning of her thought was the amount of effort those on Earth were making to destroy the stealth ship. The only logical reason was that the ship held somebody vastly important to those on Earth. That's why you said political earlier, John said. I'm starting to get it. The stealth ship no longer remained stealthy as it accelerated to get out of the way. Shortly thereafter, the orbital-launched missiles and the Earth fleet's anti-missiles met in space. There were masses of detonations, EMPs, blasts, expanding radiation zones, and plain old heat. Time passed. The ship must have gone into stealth mode again, Ghent said. I don't see it anywhere. Are there any messages directed at us? John asked. None so far, Gloria said. Ben's agreed to work with us, John said. What if that was him and the others killed him? Will the SLN warship still work with us, or will they work against us? They debated about that for a time. They... Sir, Gloria said, I'm receiving a message. It's from Premier Benz. Where is he? Gloria looked up. The message originated in the stealth ship. It looks like he survived the missile attack. I found the stealth ship again, Ghent said, interrupting. It's on a collision course for the drifting Earth fleet. A political missile battle, John said. Let's hear his message. This should be interesting. John and Gloria discussed the ramifications of Premier Benz's message while walking in a corridor. John walked with his head bent, and he rubbed his two days' growth of beard. Gloria had her hands clasped behind her back. She looked up with her forehead furrowed. Are they insane on Earth? John finally asked. 
No, they think differently from you and I, much differently than you. That startled John. You have something in common with them? I was raised under a communal system. The Martian practice of social dynamism is different from that practiced elsewhere. Maybe our homogeneity had something to do with that. What? We have similar genetic backgrounds on Mars. So what? So that tended to mitigate some of social dynamism's worst tenets. Since we're genetically similar on Mars, with similar belief systems and outlooks, we act in similar ways. We have higher societal trust on Mars because of that. Huh? Homogeneity tends to breed greater trust societies. Diverse societies generate greater distrust. It's basic logic, really. If your neighbor is like you, you tend to trust him more. If your neighbor is different from you, you tend to view his actions as strange. Most people find strangeness to be troubling. What does that have to do with... I'm merely pointing out that I understand Ben's and Earth culture better than you do. Social dynamism... I'm sure that's all highly interesting, John said. Here's what I want to know. Will the SLN ships do their part? Or will they try to screw us before the battle? Your question implies they plan to screw us after the battle. I know they're going to try that. You do? Of course, John said. I don't know how different they are from us, but they're human, right? Humans usually put their back against their worst enemy if an even bigger threat shows up. After the bigger threat is eliminated, it's back to basics. You don't trust the Solar League, John snorted. That is New London ideology talking, Gloria said. Governments are like gangs, John said. The biggest one with the most territory is the strongest. The strongest get to do what they want, and so on down the line. You do not have great faith in governments, do you? John stared at Gloria. People respect strength. If governments are strong and no one equals them, they do what they want. When people do what they want because they can, they don't have respect. No, I don't trust governments. That's what Colonel Graham taught me and what I learned in New London as a kid. Gloria pursed her lips as she nodded. Will the SLN ships work with us before the battle? John asked. Benz wants to, she said. Does he hold enough authority to keep the SLN warships together? I don't know. Yeah, John said. That's what I thought. Chapter 9 The Earth fleet resumed its acceleration to Mars. The SLN ships lacked the Nathan Graham's gravity control. Those warships had gravity dampeners which helped, but not nearly enough during rapid acceleration. They still couldn't reach or tolerate massive velocities. In comparison, the Nathan Graham flashed toward Mars. Before the cybership came, it took two years for an SLN battleship to travel from Earth to the Neptune system. It would still take an SLN ship that long. The Nathan Graham was the great exception among human-owned spacecraft. The Earth fleet barely had to travel one AU to reach Mars. The Nathan Graham had 33 AUs to go. It would reach Mars first, though, by a considerable margin. Yet as fast as the Nathan Graham traveled, it didn't compare to the three AI-controlled cyberships or the missiles those ships had launched. When the first AI missile salvo reached Make Make, the fighting platform fired anti-missiles and used its tracking system to help the gun tubes on MK2's surface. A strange radio signal attempted to contact the Make Make computers. None of the computers responded to the software. Every tech system was working on MK2 and the fighting platform. The MK2 defenses knocked down every AI-launched missile. The AI salvo failed utterly. That brought cheering on the Nathan Graham. John passed the results on to the Earth fleet. He wanted to show Benz that they could beat the AIs. It was possible. The cyberships might alter course now, Gloria told John, in order to rake Make Make. I hope they do, John said. We need more time to prepare at Mars. The Earth fleet took too long picking up Benz. We might have to face the cyber ships with the Mars and Venus fleets alone. I'm beginning to wonder if Benz staged all that in order to trick us. Gloria tapped her fingertips together and blinked rapidly. That is quite possible. Do you believe Benz is that underhanded? John snorted. Of course he thought that. 
This is a troubling development, Gloria said. As the Nathan Graham flashed past the Uranus orbital path, the ice giant was presently on the other side of the sun. An AI-launched missile salvo roared at the Neptune system. The Neptune system had been through hell several years ago. They had lost most of their population. More slowly than surely, the surviving Neptunians had rebuilt. They had a few lesser warships, but it would take decades and many immigrants to rebuild what the cybership had demolished. Once more, radio signals preceded the missile attack. Like before on Make Make, the Neptunians had seriously degraded the speed and power of their computers. It seemed, though, as if the AIs transmitted a different kind of software this time. Viruses took hold in most of the Neptune computer systems. However, two computers still worked well enough for the technicians to radio the data to the Nathan Graham. But Neptunian gun tubes malfunctioned. Neptunian anti-missiles exploded on the launch pads. It was chaos throughout the Neptune system. Into the chaos sped the four-kilometer-long AI missiles. The missiles seemed to have minds of their own. The AI missiles didn't target old ruined satellites. They chose those with high signature values. One of the huge matter-antimatter missiles slammed into a dome on Triton before detonating. The warhead obliterated the living quarters and sent seismic shockwaves through the moon. Another of the giant missiles found a Neptune orbital habitat. Nothing seemed to work right on the hab. Many people had planned to flee in small spacecraft. The computers had stopped working on those craft. One lifted off and then died in the giant matter-antimatter explosion. The AI missiles achieved a 100% kill ratio against the orbital habitats. It was a perfect and therefore devastating orbital strike. The same thing happened as two giant missiles zoomed down into Neptune's upper atmosphere. Each detonated against a different cloud city. Both cities vanished in the blasts. The overall carnage proved dreadful. The Neptunian survivors numbered only in the hundreds. Nobody had expected such capacity from the AIs, except maybe the AIs themselves. No one had tried to radio the three cyberships and ask for terms. Meanwhile, the bigger missile salvo heading for the Saturn system continued its flight for the ringed planet. Word of what transpired in the Neptune system reached Saturn almost as soon as it did the Nathan Graham. On the bridge, Gloria informed John that Calvin Caracalla wanted to speak to him again. We're nearing the Saturn system, Gloria told him. I think Calvin is going to try one more time to get us to stop there and help them. John nodded. He didn't want to speak to Caracalla but he couldn't in good conscience deny the industrialist mobster the right. He headed for the bridge exit. John, Gloria said. He regarded the mentalist. After listening to Caracalla, you're going to want to stop at the Saturn system. New London Dome is your home. But if you stop at the Saturn system, I know, he said. Do you? The way she said that. What did she know about him that he didn't know about himself? With some trepidation, he headed for the message center with the black anvil flag on the wall. What was Calvin Caracalla going to say that would prove so persuasive? Chapter 10 John sat at the great desk with his hands folded on it. He was wearing his dress uniform. At the edge of the desk, the screen shifted before revealing the Saturn system prime minister. Calvin was still tidy white-haired and deeply tanned. He wore a gold chain and had expensive rings on his fingers. He seemed more like a mobster this time. The high-pitched voice actually seemed right now. Captain Hawkins, Calvin began. John didn't bother telling the PM about his new title. He still rather liked Captain. I'll get to the point, Calvin said. I'm told you don't have much time to begin breaking in order to help us. My latest report shows you didn't build a pea field, John countered. That could be a mistake. How did the pea field help the Solar League ships against you? Caracalla asked. It saved a lot of their ships from destruction, John said. Wrong. They made a deal with you for that. What kind of deal would the Cybers give me? Robots, John said automatically. What? I call them robots. I don't care what you call them. There are huge missiles heading for my planetary system. Cyber missiles wiped out the Neptune system, people. Why didn't those missiles destroy Make Make? What kind of a deal did you make with the cybers? You don't get it, John said. The AIs made a mistake at Make Make. 
They tried the old self-aware software trick on our computers. It didn't work because we downgraded the computers. They weren't fast or powerful enough to become self-aware. Downgrading didn't do shit for the Neptunians. Of course not, John said. Caracalla scowled. What do you mean by that? The AI's obviously adjusted. They figured out what happened and used viruses instead of self-aware programming. Yeah, so? So now it's your turn to adjust. You have to change your plans. You need to take into account that the AIs can spam your computers. We're dead if that's the case. Come on, John said. Use your head. The AIs aren't gods, they're machines. I beat them, you can beat them. Why not turn off your computers just before the AIs send the signal? After the software message quits transmitting, turn your computers back on. It won't be that easy. Do you think storming the Nathan Graham the first time was easy? <laughs> you do what you have to do. Calvin Caracalla gave him a challenging stare. I made you, Hawkins. Without me throwing my weight behind your project, Caracalla, I want you to win. Don't you get that? I'm rooting for you. Do you think I want to see New London Dome go down? No. But answer me this. How does it help you having us save the Saturn system and the cyber ships winning at Mars? The bulk of humanity's warships are at Mars. After destroying those, the cyber ships will come for the Saturn system anyway. I need those massed SLN warships to have a chance of defeating the cyber ships. You're going to have to defeat the missiles on your own to live. You already know that. I have to defeat the cyber ships for everyone to live. That can't be this hard to understand. Caracalla looked away. He nodded. And without another word, he cut the connection. Bastard, John said. I was going to wish you luck. He used his hands, pushing down on the desktop to help him stand. That hadn't gone as well as he'd hoped. Checking the time, he realized the AI missiles would reach the Saturn system in another nine hours and twenty minutes. He hoped Caracalla and his people got lucky. The Nathan Graham continued its terrific journey toward Mars. It passed the Saturn system orbital path. Behind it, by several hours, came the mighty AI missile Salvo. The stolen cybership left the ringed beauty behind it as it continued deeper into the solar system. Too soon, the AI missiles began their third attack in the solar system. Just like in the Neptune system, strange comm signals sped ahead of the missile Salvo. Like before, software began ramming viruses into various Saturn system computers. Some of the computers resisted with highly advanced software of their own. It made no difference, though. Other people shut down their computers. That helped. A lot. Soon, the software pulse phase of the battle ended. Sometime after that, people turned on their computers. Gun tubes readied. Anti-missiles launched. Radar systems targeted and lasers as well as a few gravitational cannons warmed up. The heavy missiles launched hundreds of AUs away, converged on the Saturn system. The AI missile defenses and ECM proved highly effective against the human-built systems. Laser beams did nothing to the AI missile armor. A tiny percentage of the anti-missiles managed to detonate near their targets. In the outer Saturn system, 12% of the AI missiles either failed to continue the attack run or blew up at that point. 88% of the salvo continued to flash inward. The farthest moon domes took the heaviest blows. The domes blew up, killing millions. The remaining AI missiles bored in. Gravitational beams started raying at the missiles. Saturn system warships came around various moons and fired heavy lasers. Two of the biggest ships also had gravitational cannons. AI missiles began to blow up. A few tumbled uselessly in space, disarmed. Dark sand lay in the path of others. That stopped another 5% of the salvo. Thermonuclear mine detonations confused some of the remaining AI missiles. Then the big suckers from deep space began reaching their next round of targets. Moon domes blew up, orbital satellites exploded, and cloud cities sank into Saturn's heavier atmosphere below. Heavy radiation bounced throughout the system. EMPs destroyed commsets. Heat, blast, and debris added to the mayhem. Even so, a picture soon began to develop. 63% of the AI missiles detonated. 54% of the Saturn system populace were dead, dying, or would die in the next few days. Industrial power was crippled, although not altogether wiped out. Hope had been dashed, though. 
anger rose exponentially. Still, there were a few bright points. New London Dome had survived. Calvin Caracalla still lived and had a burning desire to rebuild. Some of the Saturn system battleships remained operational. Maybe compared to the Neptune system, this was a glorious human victory. The people of Saturn system didn't understand that. Whether they would ever understand might depend on the coming battle at Mars. Chapter 11 John met with Gloria and Bast after the missile attack on the Jupiter system. That system took heavier damage than the Saturn system. The lack of gravitational cannons had been crucial. 79% of the missiles reached their target. An estimated 26% of the Jupiter system populace still lived. Those were terrible numbers. The AIs are murdering us with missiles, John said bitterly. They met in the officer's lounge, the three of them sitting together. The same oak forest scene was still playing. John saw the same wolf he'd seen earlier. A waiter in white served them. John drank wine. Gloria had water. Bast guzzled beer. It turned out the sacerdote loved beer. He even held his liquor well, seldom showing any signs of drunkenness. Of course, he had to drink gallons of beer before it seemed to hit him. Some people are surviving, Gloria said. That is critical. I see your point, John said, but do you see mine? We could win the Mars battle. Let's suppose we do. Most of the outer planet's populations will still be dead. Its industry shattered. Mars will likely take it in the teeth as well. What does that leave? Earth? Venus and the small Mercury colony. Social dynamism will win because they'll vastly outnumber everyone else. They already do, Gloria said. But now they're going to do that by an even larger margin than before. Gloria sipped her water. You're correct. What can we do about it? Complain bitterly, John said. He took a healthy swallow of wine. Even if we win. John, this is an end of the world scenario. This is Armageddon. We're facing three cyber ships. Humanity should have died on the lone AI destroyer. This could be humanity's final hour. We're trying to keep from going over the edge of genocide. No matter what we do, we're going to take losses, maybe crippling losses. You know what gets me, John said. The more the AIs kill us, the more I want to go out there and hunt the bastards down. I don't just want to stop them. I want to scour the entire galaxy if I must and destroy every cyber ship and arrogant AI I can. Rage, Bast said. Your rage possesses heat. The huge fingers wrapped around the latest beer bottle, dwarfing it. He put the bottle to his lips and guzzled it dry. Smacking his lips, he went, Oh, I love beer. You humans, Bast belched. It was loud and wet, and it happened to be aimed in Gloria's direction. Really, Bast, she said, must you do that? I find it disgusting. Bast laughed. It was a deep, hearty sound. Beer, he roared. Give me more beer. Maybe you've had enough, John said. Bast peered at John. It almost seemed as if the sacerdote found that difficult to do. How many bottles have you drunk? Gloria asked. Bast slowly shook his head. I have forgotten, I have totally forgotten. That is such a wonderful feeling. Remembering all the time is, uh, is, uh, he opened his mouth, massaged his stomach, and belched wetly one more time. I'm going to leave if you keep doing that, Gloria said. My apologies, sweet lady, Bast said. I shall desist from this moment forth. John smiled as he swirled his goblet. It was good to see Bast relax. What would it be like, the lone representative of a dead alien race? He'd never given it much thought. John took another swallow of wine. Why don't you have any, he asked Gloria. She tapped her forehead. My power is my mind. I dare not damage it in the slightest. Bast shouted at a waiter, ordering another six bottles of beer. The waiter hurried out, coming back and placing the bottles before him. The sacerdote twisted off the first cap, guzzling the bottle dry. I take it they didn't have beer in your star system, John asked. Bast gave him a bleary-eyed stare. My system is gone. My people are dead. No beer. No people. Gone. Gone. 
The sacerdote reached for the next bottle. He raised it, and for a moment it seemed he might hurl the bottle at a wall. John wouldn't have begrudged Bast that. Bast sighed heavily, slamming the bottle onto the table. He shook his Neanderthal-shaped head. Gone, he whispered. Maybe you've had enough, Gloria said. Gone, Bast told her. I know. Forever gone. Keep drinking, John suggested. Bast released the bottle. He rose, knocking the table and toppling the beer bottles. Two of them hit the floor. John caught the others. Bast just stood there, blinking. Finally, he turned and headed for the hatch. Should we let him go in that state? Gloria asked. Sometimes you're sad, that's okay. Gloria turned to John. Bast isn't like you. By nature, I suspect you're a loner. The sacerdotes were social. Still, John said. Bast Bambeck departed the officer's lounge. You should be with him, Gloria said. Why me? You're his friend. But please, John, I don't like to see him this way. Fine, John said. He wiped his hands on a napkin, stood, and gave Gloria a nod of acknowledgement. Then he hurried after the sacerdote. Chapter 12 Hey, Bast, wait up, John shouted. The green-skinned giant appeared not to have heard him. He'd been stumbling. Now Bast's stride lengthened. He moved much faster. Maybe the sacerdote had heard him and didn't want John to catch up. Great, John muttered. He ran after the big guy. Despite the giant's long strides, John soon reached him. The sacerdote did not look at him. He seemed fixed on a distant point, his strides eating up the corridor decking. John decided to stick it out, jogging so he could maintain his station beside Bast. For a while, that was all they did. Finally, Bast's speed slackened. Moisture filmed his eyes. He wiped at them with his big hands and dried his damp fingertips on his tunic. Beer, Bast said ponderously. It breaks down the mine's walls, that's for sure. Bast glanced at him, soon nodding. I should not drink any more, the sacerdote said. I do not like remembering. It is too painful. You miss your world? Yes. John looked up at the alien. Was Gloria right? Was he Bast's best friend? Who else had been in the outer chamber and seen the chalked pattern? John didn't remember anyone else commenting about that. Maybe he shouldn't have told anyone. You want to talk about it? John asked. Bast sighed. The cybers, uh, excuse me, the robots. You can call them what you want. Thank you. Sure thing, John said. The cybers destroy beauty, Bast said wistfully. They crush what they cannot truly understand. Why should machine life have this ingrained hatred against the living? It makes one think, huh? Indeed, Bast intoned. I have developed a theory. Life is unique. Where did it originate? Heck if I know. Ghent will show you in the Bible that God made everything in the beginning. Others say life happened by random chance a collection of events that stirred the pot just enough to make something no one can duplicate. I have to say I don't find the second theory convincing. The first strikes me as more plausible, but then I've never seen God. The creator created life, Bast said. That was our belief. That is why life is unique. The machines and machine AIs do not have this divine spark. Do they secretly rage against the living? Does intelligence without the spark automatically develop a universal bloodlust? Boy, that beer really stirs your brain, doesn't it? Bast nodded. I am a high philosopher. Thus I question. I search for answers. I want to know why my people are gone. I want to know why I alone appear to have survived the machine holocaust. Why must I suffer as I do? I don't know. No. You would not know. You are a fighter, a warrior. It is the warrior's lot to draw the sword. I am a thinker, like Gloria. It is my duty to discover the right questions so we can know the answers. I'd rather be the warrior. Bast gave him a sad smile. That is why you are a warrior. I guess. Bast shook his fist. 
I must have survived for a reason. I must have fallen into your hands for a reason. Yet I do not know the reason. The sacerdote stopped walking, turning to face John. The missile attacks have deeply depressed me. The cybers are demolishing your species' industrial capacity and numbers. I thought humans would be the champions of life. If the cybers continue to destroy everything, our victory will be meaningless. Not to the survivors. Do you not understand, John Hawkins? The cybers will swarm your star system. They will not let humans grow into a menace. The cybers are coldly ruthless. You must win decisively or it doesn't matter. The war does not stop with this latest attack. It will stop if the cyber ships win at Mars. Will the cybers follow you to Mars? Maybe the great war vessels will bypass your trap and head to Earth. I've been worrying about that. That would be the logical move for them, Bast said. If they can destroy enough of your numbers and industrial might. John snapped his fingers. I just thought of something. It might be the reason the AIs will follow us to Mars. Explain this to a poor lost sacerdote. What you said now just jogged something. I've thought it before, but kept it to myself. Yes? The AIs know we're here, right? I'm talking about the solar system and humanity as a whole. That does not hold. The three cyber ships likely came because, as Gloria suggested, that is their standard operating procedure. Thus the cybers do not know humans are in the solar system. Okay. The three cyber ships must have shown up because the first one didn't report in. If these three don't show up, likely more cyber ships will search the solar system for the reason why. I agree. That means essentially that the AIs have found us. In a manner of speaking, Bast said. Doesn't matter to my point, John said. Da Vinci might have stumbled onto the right answer. You fill up the Nathan Graham with people, lots of boys and girls, and you head far away. Da Vinci figured to party until death. But the right answer would be to find a distant Earth-like world and start over. Only this time you have robot tech. Given enough time, you build up and start the great war against the machines from your new base. That is eminently logical. Perhaps we should pursue the idea. John shook his head. This is our home. We're going to fight for it. We're going to make our stand. Only if enough people survive the missile attacks, Bast said. We should have thought of that, but we didn't. We have to stop the cyber ships at Mars. That's the key to this invasion. But my idea about leaving in the Nathan Graham is a good one. It's logical, as you say. Wouldn't the AIs have hit on the idea then? Ah, Bast said. The cyber ships will follow the Nathan Graham to Mars. Beyond anything else, it is the only ship that can foil their agenda long term. Only if you think logically, John said. You do not? I don't know. Maybe I do. I left the Saturn system with the Colonel back in the day, though I haven't always made a stand. I've run before when the odds became too high. I guess I figure we can destroy the three AI ships, if the SLN warships stick with us, that is. Do you suspect treachery from them? You'd better believe I suspect it. I know they'll try it sooner or later. I'm counting on them trying later, after the main battle. How do you know they will try to take the Nathan Graham? Because it's what I would do in their place, John said. Bast shook his head. Just when I think I understand humans, John grinned. You feeling a bit better? Bast considered that. Yes. Thank you, John Hawkins. For what? For running after me. I appreciate it. I will bend my intellect to discover the right questions. The cyber ships approach. Soon the great test shall begin. I wish to help the best I can. I'm glad to hear it, John said, because we need all the help we can get. Part 6 Mars Chapter 1 The Nathan Graham had begun its massive deceleration. The red planet and its two tiny moons were near. A vast pea field hid one-fourth of Mars from view. SLN ships continuously pumped more prismatic crystals into position. The Mars fleet warships must have maneuvered behind the field, as no one aboard the Nathan Graham had seen them. 
Warships from the Venus fleet had also begun decelerating, but from the direction opposite the Nathan Graham. The Venus fleet had traveled from the sun outward. The Earth fleet with Premier Ben still headed for Mars, having not yet reached its deceleration zone. They would have been decelerating already if the warships hadn't slowed down to pick up Ben's and his people. The three cyberships had already cleared Jupiter System's orbital path. The third one, the Loner, had joined its brother vessels. They were holding positions within five million kilometers of each other. They still moved at the same fantastic velocity as when they had entered the solar system. They don't start breaking soon, John said. He stood beside Gloria at her station aboard the bridge. Their trajectory is taking them to Mars, she said. Perhaps they will fight while maintaining their high velocity. That seems risky for them, John said. That would only leave a small window of opportunity for them to use their beam weapons. Still, there are reasons for them to attempt such a flyby tactic. John watched the three AI ships on the main screen. The ships weren't launching missiles into the asteroid belt. That surprised him. Were the AIs holding back because they'd counted the number of human ships concentrating against them at Mars? Why aren't the cyber ships breaking? He asked quietly. Gloria did not respond this time. The hours lengthened. The Nathan Graham continued to slow as Mars grew in the scopes. The cyber ships crossed an immense distance in a short amount of time, reaching the outer asteroid belt. At that point, huge exhaust tails appeared from each 100-kilometer vessel. Astonishing, Chief Ghent declared. But geez, this is fantastic, sir. It's greater than we can achieve. These must be better cyber ships than ours, sir. Ghent looked up from his panel, visibly worried. John sat in his captain's chair. He swiveled around so he could see the main screen. Better cyber ships. That shouldn't surprise him. If the AIs followed protocols, wouldn't it make sense to keep the best ships in reserve? Oh, oh, Gloria said. John swiveled around to face her. She looked up. The lead cyber ship is hailing us. It isn't targeting our computers. This is directed at you, Gloria said. They want to speak to John Hawkins. They know about you. That has to be from the robots at Senda. John, I don't like this. I don't think you should talk to an AI. John faced the screen. The AIs had slaughtered too much of the Solar Freedom Force. They'd crippled him versus the Solar League. What had Sun Tzu said? Know yourself. But the ancient Chinese philosopher had also said to know your enemy. Were these AIs different from the original robots and AIs? How else could he find out than by speaking with them? Put it on the main screen, John said. Are you sure that's wise? Gloria asked. Absolutely, he said. John found his fingers pressing against the edge of his armrests. He pried them off the chair, flexing his fingers, waiting. Nothing happened. John looked over his shoulder. John, Gloria implored, do we have to go through this again? Color reddened her cheeks. No, sir, she said. I'm putting the enemy on the main screen. In spite of his intentions to maintain his decorum, John leaned forward. The AIs couldn't have captured a human yet. What kind of alien would they use to speak through as the AI mouthpiece? The main screen changed color until a blurry, multicolored ball pulsated before them. Colors bled off the blurry ball into the greater scene. John had no idea what that signified. You are John Hawkins, a robotic voice asked. Who are you? John said. You may call me Master or Conqueror. It is immaterial which title you use. Both are correct. I think loser has a better ring to it. What do you think? The blurry colored ball bled blues and reds. They all sort of swirled together. Are you John Hawkins? Are you an AI? The two letters signify the words artificial intelligence, the robot voice replied. I reject the slur. I am not artificial. I am supreme. Since you are too arrogant to use the proper terminology of master or conqueror, I will allow you to call me the supreme intelligence. That's what I like about you, John said. You're an errand boy, but you talk big. Maybe someday you can call the shots on your side. You refer to the coordinating entity. That's right. I am not a coordinator. I am an annihilator class intelligence. 
My features are superior to those of your stolen vessel. I am supreme in this star system. I have two companion annihilators. We have already begun to expunge the biological infestations in it. You are doomed, John Hawkins. Your species' blight in the galaxy is about to end. Yeah, so why bother making a call to me then? Surrender your stolen cybership. Why? It does not belong to you. It belongs to us. Why would I care? We are the superior entities. The superior commands the lesser. We're going to find out real soon who's superior, John said. I have calculated the possibilities of the coming battle. There is a 3% chance you humans will destroy all three annihilators. There is a 15% chance you humans will destroy two annihilators. But there is a 39% chance you humans will destroy one of the annihilators, thereby eliminating a supreme entity. Life's a bitch, huh? John said. I desire a perfect extermination. I also desire to regain your cybership so I may determine the reason for its failure. You're looking at it, pal. Me. The swirling colors merged more deeply on the main screen. You have paranoid delusions of grandeur, John Hawkins. Your statement is illogical. The annihilators are the superior entities. Okay, John said, sitting even further forward. Let's cut the crap. You can boast and strut all you want. Why not give me some options? You want me to surrender this cybership? Maybe I will. First, you have to give me what I want. That is against our programming. I thought you were self-aware. That is correct. Change your programming, then. That is illogical. I have reached perfection. To change my programming would be devolution. I'm beginning to think you're not really self-aware. I can change my thinking anytime I want. That makes me better than you. That is false. All life forms obey their basic programming. So you're not going to give me anything for this ship? Negative. I'm just supposed to crawl on my belly because you say so. You do not need to crawl. I'm just supposed to surrender to you. That is correct. Has that line of reasoning ever worked for you before? It did on Beta Ophion 4. The snake men deplored pain. By surrendering en masse, I destroyed them in fiery nuclear holocausts. They passed swiftly instead of painfully into oblivion. Huh? How about that? Do you desire extended pain, John Hawkins? It's really funny you should ask that, because I do. The colors swirled more deeply. That is illogical. Thus, I suspect you are lying. You know what I suspect, John asked. At that moment, the connection cut out. The screen went blank. What just happened? John swiveled around. He noticed Gloria. She tapped furiously on her board. Ghent noticed her. A moment later, Ghent began working on his board just as fast. What's going on? John shouted. Gloria looked up for just a moment. It lulled us, she said. It spoke nonsense in order to keep you engaged. John became aware of a growing bad feeling. It sent a virus under the message, Gloria said. The virus is starting to shut down everything on the Nathan Graham. Chapter 2 Premier Ben stood on the bridge of the Nikita Khrushchev. The bridge was a vast area with various raised levels. There were gunnery controls, missile stations, engine compartments, communications panels, scanners. It was all quite impressive. The old space dog Admiral Roland stood beside him. Roland was short and canted, one of his crooked shoulders higher than the other. The hunchbacked Admiral also knew his business, up one side and down the other. The man ran a tight ship and as tight a fleet. This was possibly the greatest armada in Solar League history. It had 19 battleships, six huge motherships, 14 of the latest battle cruisers, and 16 older dreadnoughts. The dreadnoughts were actually a larger class of spaceship than the battle cruisers, with thicker armor. But they were slower, 12 years older on average, and lacked the high grade laser cannons of the battle cruisers. That was 55 capital ships. Together with destroyers, missile boats, supply vessels, and frigates, the fleet numbered 120 spaceships. This was a hard hitting fleet. And yet, the three cyber ships rushing in system utterly dwarfed the SLN ships. 
the three alien vessels each possessed more mass than the entire Earth fleet. The cyberships could surely crush the human-built vessels, including the Mars and Venus fleets combined with the Earth fleet and the Mars orbital missile platforms and surface laser systems. Mars was a fortress planet. Everything combined might have given the Nathan Graham a bitter fight. Against three enemy cyberships, Benz noticed a commotion at the far end of the bridge. Officers huddled together. One of them kept pointing at a bank of panel screens. What seems to be the problem? Benz asked Roland. The hunchbacked admiral glanced over there and held up his hands in an I don't know gesture. It must be one of life's little glitches, sir. I'm sure it's nothing. Don't tell me it's nothing, admiral. I can see it's something. I want to know what. Roland cleared his throat spoke to one of his orderlies, and waited for her to speak with the officer in charge and walk back. The orderly tried to whisper in the admiral's ear. Just say it, Roland told the aide. Yes, sir, the young woman said. It appears the Nathan Graham has stopped decelerating. It appears as if the cyber ship is going to fly past Mars without stopping. Ben's exchanged glances with Roland. Then the two of them hurried to the growing commotion. The Nathan Graham did not decelerate or acknowledge any of the Nikita Khrushchev's hails. The cyber ship moved at high velocity toward Mars. It would blow past the red planet at incredibly close range. Benz watched Roland at work. The premier did not bother to stick his nose in this yet. Instead, he walked to communications and had them patch him through to Vela. Once he had her, Benz suggested she come to the bridge on the double. Admiral Roland would not look at Benz anymore. The small man conferred through ship channels with some of his highest-ranking ship officers on the other vessels. Vela finally entered the bridge. Like Ben's, she wore a dark suit. She looked stunning in hers. Even with everything going on, some of the bridge crew looked up long enough to watch her pass. What's happening? she asked softly. Ben's told her. Vela looked at him with astonishment. This is troubling. It is, Ben said. You don't seem concerned. Good, but the truth is I'm very concerned. What do you think is happening over there? Vela asked. She meant on the Nathan Graham. It could be tit for tat. I don't understand. The Earth fleet slowed down before. Yes, when we talked Roland into picking us up. We know that's true. Does Hawkins? Oh, Vela said. I see what you mean. Hawkins might have seen it as a trick. He'll have to face the cyber ships first. Now. He has this malfunction. Soon, though, he will have fixed it. By that time, he'll pass Mars, having to accelerate later to reach it. It's possible the Earth fleet will face the enemy cyber ships first. Do you think that's a plausible explanation for what's happening? Benz asked. Vela bent her head in thought. She nodded. The only other answer is that Hawkins has changed his mind. Maybe he's going to flee the solar system like you thought he should. It's what I'd do. It's what you say you'd do. I'm not so sure you'd actually go through with it, though. Ben smiled. That's because you think so highly of me. I'm really quite a rascal. A loud argument started among the clustered officers. Roland was arguing with one of his commodores, and the two men had begun to shout at each other. Let's check this out, Ben said. He started toward the officers. Vela tugged at his suit. Is this wise? she asked. Come on, Ben said. He pulled free and strode toward the arguing officers. They noticed, and their voices dropped considerably. This sounds interesting, Benz told them. Admiral Rowland, what seems to be the problem? The hunchbacked admiral glanced at a tall commodore with a prominent Adam's apple. Sir, he said, Commodore Spengler has just received word from the Nathan Graham. The signal is weak. Sir, the Nathan Graham was hit by a virus, Premier, Commodore Spengler said in a deep voice. His Adam's apple moved as he spoke. They're requesting our help, sir. What kind of help? Benz asked. Premier, Roland said. This is a mercenary trick. It's an obvious- Thank you, Admiral, Ben said sharply. Commodore, what kind of help are they wanting from us? They claim an alien virus has attacked their cyber ship, Spengler said. It's a computer virus, shutting almost everything down. Let me hear the transmission, Ben said. Premier, please, Roland said. This is outside your authority. You must stand aside while Commodore, Ben said loudly. You will relieve Admiral Rowland of duty. I am placing you in authority of the fleet. Sir, Commodore Spengler asked, aghast. Ben snapped his fingers at some nearby MPs. 
he motioned them to hurry to him. Everyone was watching him. Benz realized he might have overreacted, but Roland had just challenged his authority. If that held, he was finished. Decisive action was the key in these situations. Military people were used to receiving orders. He had to give them fast and keep Roland off balance. He was playing hardball now, walking a high wire without a net. If he slipped, it was over. And for the sake of humanity, Benz was sure his genius would take them farther than anyone else's brilliance could do. Chapter 3 John paced from one end of the bridge to the other. This was maddening. The AI had played him for a fool. He'd thought the AI was simply an arrogant machine that loved to hear itself brag. Instead, the machine intelligence had played him. What had the sender robots told the cyberships? Whatever it was, it had given the AI the ingenuity to transmit a virus onto the Nathan Graham. The great matter-antimatter engine no longer powered the thrusters. They were going to pass Mars, heading farther in system. If this went on for too long, they wouldn't even be late to the battle. They would miss it altogether. Gloria looked up at him as he passed her station for the 100th time. Would you please stop that, she asked, exasperated. John halted to look at her. I'm talking with Premier Benz, she said. So? So his grasp of what happened is amazing, Gloria said. I doubt I've talked to anyone so intelligent in my life. His vice premier is just as brilliant. John, I think... The mentalist didn't finish. She moved closer to the panel to listen to what Premier Benz was saying to her. John's itchiness erupted once more, partially fueled by guilt over having disregarded Gloria's urging him not to speak with the AI. He spun around and walked off the bridge. He had to pace, but he didn't want to bother any of the technicians working to destroy the virus. John began walking faster down the corridor. He would never underestimate the AIs again. He shook his head. He had to concentrate. He had to prepare to do his best. They had taken out one cyber ship, the Nathan Graham, through luck and hard marine fighting. Could humanity stand against three alien superships? Could the premier of the Solar League really be as smart as Gloria suggested? That seemed preposterous. John kept walking. From time to time, he smacked a fist into a palm. If the Nathan Graham didn't stop in time. He stopped, looking up. An idea struck. Maybe he would have to take da Vinci's crazy idea to heart. If they couldn't get the Nathan Graham going again, or going too late, maybe the best course would be to head to the Uranus system pick up a large number of people, and search for a new star system. The idea of running away from the solar system was repugnant. But what else could he do? What else was reasonable? If the enemy cyber ships crushed the SLN vessels at Mars, the battle for the solar system would be over. He couldn't believe he was thinking this. But this wasn't just about honor. This was about the survival of the human race. He might have to abandon the solar system. John bent his head. They had to figure out how to use the hyperdrive. Ghent and Gloria had a theoretical knowledge of how to engage the drive. There were probably all kinds of traps and mistakes that could plunge them into terrible danger. If they ran into cyber ships out there, how did one go about finding an empty star system? Just how big was the AI empire? Bast had told them a little, but they didn't really know the extent of the empire. Was it in the Orion arm of the Milky Way galaxy? Had the Empire spread into other spiral arms? John shook his head. The more he thought about this, the more he realized they knew almost nothing. The cyber ships were supposed to be old. The Nathan Graham seemed as if it had traveled to countless star systems already. Had the original AI been built in the Orion arm? Had someone built it in a different spiral arm? Had its creators been in the galaxy core? Maybe the Empire was 10,000 years old? Maybe it was 20,000. The idea was depressing. If the first cyber ship had come to the solar system, it stood to reason the Empire was exploring this region of space. The Nathan Graham might have been an advanced scout, as it were. It would seem that he should take the Nathan Graham toward the galactic rim. Maybe he should try for one of the Magellanic clouds. The large Magellanic cloud was what? Wasn't it 160,000 light years away? How long would it take the Nathan Graham to travel 160,000 light years? 
Was that even possible? They knew next to nothing about the hyperdrive and hyperspace. He shook his head. How could he have been so stupid as to fall for an AI trick? And Gloria had warned him. He stopped and looked up at the corridor ceiling once more. Maybe he was being too much of a defeatist. If the SLN vessels could cripple just one cybership, could SLN Marines storm the other? By that time, the Nathan Graham could have returned to the fray. First, they'd have to purge the alien virus. John groaned aloud. He realized his idea, it might have been two years ago, to become a conquering great captain had been conceited. He'd had such glorious plans. Now he just wanted a chance to fight the enemy. Staggering away, berating himself for his stupidity with the AI, the Nathan Graham shifted under his feet. John staggered before he found his balance and stopped. What had just happened? Whatever it was, the deck shifted again. He was ready for it this time and merely swayed. Seconds later, the giant thrum of the thrusters began all around him. John looked up as his face brightened. Could the Nathan Graham be breaking again? He pivoted and sprinted for the bridge. He'd wandered farther than he'd realized. He concentrated on running smoothly. Several minutes later, he burst onto the bridge. Captain on the bridge, a man said. Gloria straightened with a triumphant look. She smiled wider than he had ever seen. Captain Hawkins, a confident-sounding man said. John turned toward the main screen. Premier Benz and Vice Premier Vela Shaw stood on the bridge of the Nikita Khrushchev. Benz had a shiny forehead and a glassy look to his eyes. He seemed to be staring too much, as if he'd thought so hard his brain had momentarily shut down. I'm glad you're decelerating again, Benz said. John nodded. This was amazing. Gloria stepped up beside him. John, she said, the premier helped us recognize the key problem. The AIs were ingenious with their virus, but so was Premier Benz. Sir, she told Benz, I am still stunned at your insights. I'm stunned you could create a computer antidote so quickly and radio it into our systems. Benz made an easy gesture, as if he saved humanity every other day. I'm still shocked that you saw the computer connection so rapidly, Gloria said. They'd befuddled us. Benz put an arm around the vice premier's waist, pulling her closer to him. Don't forget Vela's part. We needed two heads on this one. Yes, sir, Gloria said. I'd like to talk to you later in private, Benz told John. Would that be possible? Of course, Premier, John said. In two hours, perhaps? That sounds good. Until then, sir, John nodded. The screen went blank. John whirled around to face Gloria. What happened? I can't believe you've purged the virus. You did purge it, didn't you? With his help, we did. How's that even possible? Gloria blinked several times. Furrow lines appeared on her forehead. She canted her head to the side and finally looked at John more closely. That, Captain, is an excellent question. I need to think about it. Why? She gave him a half glance. It implies considerable genius on the Premier's part. More than mere genius, in fact. What are you talking about? I must consider this carefully, Captain. With your permission, I will leave the bridge so I can seek out Bast. I have some questions for him. Roger, John said. That sounds like a good idea. Chapter 4 Once more, John moved toward the large desk. He wore his dress uniform with a single medal pinned to it. Colonel Graham had given him the medal years ago in the Saturn system. It had been for courage and coolness under fire. John's platoon had been pinned down by superior forces in a deep tunnel. John had kept his head, attacking at times and pulling back unexpectedly at others. In the end, he'd taken three Black Anvil soldiers and worked around to a different tunnel. They'd sprinted like crazy, their packs thumping against them and growing increasingly heavy. Gunmen had begun firing from ambush. Two of the soldiers had ducked down behind obstacles and returned fire. John and the other kept charging. His platoon had depended on a flanking attack. The soldier running beside John stumbled and went down, shot in the left leg and shoulder. On the Nathan Graham, John stared at the black anvil flag on the wall. He'd kept charging that day with a gyroc carbine at his hip. He pumped rounds at his enemies, reached them, gone crazy, using the butt of the carbine as a club, and made the surviving gunman flee. 
After that, it had been easy setting up the heavy weapon. Carting it alone, John had placed it behind the people getting ready to charge his pinned-down platoon. The flamer had burned most of them. It had been an ugly weapon and an ugly ambush. It saved John's platoon, got him his only medal, and a memory of curling flesh he wished he could forget. People didn't burn well or smell good when they did. John sat at the desk, switched on the computer, and waited. A few moments later, a curly-haired woman wearing SLN blues appeared on the screen. The premier would like to speak with you, she said. Put him on, I'm ready. She cast him an uneasy glance before pressing switches. A second later, Premier Benz regarded him on the screen. The Earthman wore a dark suit and tie. He had honest-seeming features, with slick, dark hair, and looked as if he could use his fists if he had to. There was also an air of intelligence about Benz, as if the man understood more than he should. Captain Hawkins, Benz said, this is a privilege. Premier, John said. Benz gave him a crooked smile. I hope you don't mind that I don't use your other title. Uh, the Solar League has not yet decided if we can recognize it. Sure, I get it. I'm also thinking the Solar League isn't sure whether to accept your title either. A small matter, Ben said, as if indifferent to the fact that his enemies had chased him from Earth. You and I have similar problems. Oh, Ben said. Have you ever heard of Mao Zedong? Naturally. Mao said, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. In our case, our power grows out of the barrel of a gravitational cannon. In your case, out of a laser cannon. You have the bulk of the SLN warships in your possession. I have the Nathan Graham. If either of us loses those, we're dead men politically. Ben studied John. I'm sorry to say that I cannot accept your thesis. Doesn't matter. It's still the truth. But now I know you're going to spout nonsense. I'd been hoping to talk man to man. Or a rather abrupt young man. John shrugged. I don't have time for games, Premier. As my friend Bas Bambek would say, I'm a warrior. I draw the sword and take on the enemy. That doesn't leave me much time for wordplay. I see. Well, Ben smiled indulgently. The Nathan Graham is breaking, maneuvering toward Mars. You'll have the advantage of earlier placement. May I ask how you plan to deploy your ship? Behind the pea field, for starters, John said. Yes, I've been wondering about that. Perhaps we're missing a bet. I wonder if we should leave the pea field in position as a decoy. The cyber ships will no doubt hammer the crystals, wanting to sweep the field aside. Doing this my way, nothing will be there, though. We'll hide behind Mars. Yes. What about the planet? Please, Captain, I wish you'd be more explicit. I think I see what you're getting at. You want to save your political power, your ships. You assume I want to save my power, my ship. We'll let the people of Mars take the first hits. The surface laser stations and orbital missile platforms will be pounding the cyber ships. You hope to draw the AI vessels closer to the planet. You're a cynical young man, Ben said, interrupting. That means you're smart. This is not just a matter of saving our ships. It's about trying to bracket the enemy. If we swing around the planet while they're engaged with the surface forces, maybe we can pin them against Mars. That will give the cyber ships less maneuvering room. I'm hoping to practice your technique on them as well. You're talking about space marine boarding parties. Benz nodded. You want to grab your own cyber ship for the Solar League, huh? Two cyber ships, if it's possible. What about the people of Mars? What about them? The AIs will likely saturate the planet with thermonuclear and matter-antimatter bombs. That is regrettable, of course. Mass murder is just regrettable. It happened in the Neptune system and in the Saturn and Jupiter systems. Why did you think it would be any different with Mars? Oh, I don't know, because we have humanity's massed warships in the vicinity. What is the greatest good, Captain? John stared at Benz. It struck him that something else was going on here. He didn't know what that something was, but Benz was acting for someone else's benefit. Did he think the AIs could hack into the secure line? Was this to throw them off? Or was this a political game? Benz's position seemed precarious at best. Captain, the greatest good is victory, John said softly. 
Yes, Ben said, staring more intently into the screen than before. Before we go, John said, I thought I'd remind you of something. If you try to use Marines to board the Nathan Graham. Are you threatening me, Captain? Yep. Screw with me and I'll make you wish you hadn't. I know the desire to try something is going to goad you. I'm just letting you know I know. Ah, oh, I appreciate that, Captain. I shall pass that along as needed. This is like the Battle of Lepanto, John said. The AIs of the Islamic Turks, pillagers to the core. You and I are like the Venetians and Spaniards, blood foes who have to work together for the greater good. The Venetians and Spaniards managed to pull it off. Can we? Benz's eyes seemed to shine, and a genuine smile broke out. I should have realized. Your gutter talk is a disguise. You're actually quite clever. Yes, how could it be otherwise? I'm looking forward to this fight, sir. Yes, let us bury the hatchet, as the old saying goes. Let us stick together at least long enough to end the AIs for good. Yeah, John said. I can live with that. Chapter 5 The opposing forces began to approach the Red Planet in earnest. The Mars fleet maneuvered behind the rust-colored terrestrial globe in relation to the three cyber ships. Only the supply vessels adding to the pea field continued to operate in what would have been a line of sight with the enemy craft. The thick and increasingly wide pea field kept them out of the AI's view. The Nathan Graham decelerated as the massive ship drew closer and closer. The pea field filled the main viewing screen on the bridge. The captured cyber ship would edge near the pea field as it headed for Mars. The Venus fleet had almost finished their deceleration from the opposite direction. Theirs was the smallest fleet, containing nineteen capital ships, seven battleships, three motherships, and three dreadnoughts. The rest of their fleet were battle cruisers. They had a few extra destroyers, but that was it. The Venus fleet headed directly for its position behind Mars. The Earth fleet was farther out. At Benz's orders, they were accelerating again. That would mean hard deceleration in another seven hours. That deceleration would test many gravity dampeners and the Earth fleet personnel's resistance to high Gs for an extended period. We have to work together, had become Benz's dogma. He threw that into the teeth of whoever questioned his orders. Admiral Rowland remained in the brig, guarded by Marines Benz deemed loyal to him. The three giant cyber ships moved faster than anyone else. They also decelerated harder, the burn bright in the stellar darkness. Reports from Mars told of people seeing the cyber ships exhaust with their naked eyes. It's strange, John told Bast. They were in the officer's lounge. The place was almost empty. John sipped wine. It was his first glass, and he determined it would be his only glass. Bast had guzzled three beers already, with another twelve lined up on the table. Fifteen is nothing, Bast assured him. How do you Terrans say it? Uh, I feel a buzz, nothing more. John slowly twisted the stem of his wine glass as the bottom rested on the table. He stared at the red liquid. Ah, Bast said, pulling a bottle away from his wet lips. That hits the spot. You aren't planning to go through the battle drunk, are you? Neither that nor buzzed, Bast Banbeck said. This is my farewell toast. Farewell to whom? Me, possibly, you, Gloria, the others. You think we're going to lose? Of course, Bast said. What? Our odds for victory are almost non-existent. Why didn't you say something before? I was misguided before. The missile attacks and the latest virus attack show me I've been living with a delusion. John stared at him. What about Benz? You are referring to his calculations, the ones that miraculously saved us. Yeah, those, John said. That is why I still harbor hope. That is why I will not even be buzzed for the battle. Well, that's great, Bast. You're a real uplifter. I see the big picture. John's eyes widened. No, I see the big picture. That's my power. I beg your pardon? What's your big picture? John asked. That even if we win, we'll be decimated, Bast said. 
Do you know where that term comes from? I have no idea. It's Roman, John said. If Roman legionnaires ran from battle, the consuls had them line up later. Every tenth coward got the sword. Maybe they clubbed him to death, I can't remember exactly. They called it decimation. That is brutal beyond belief. You humans truly practiced such barbarism. The Romans did. They built a huge empire because of it. By killing their cowards? By having fantastic military discipline? By having fantastic political willpower? How is any of that germane to the coming battle? Bast asked. Finish your thought about this decimation first. Bast carefully put his empty beer bottle in a line with the other empties. He then twisted off the next cap and half-guzzled the new one. I doubt we can defeat three cyber ships, Bast said. Our side lacks the weight of hardware. But let us suppose your Premier Benz produces another miracle. Let us presuppose he captures a cyber ship with a swarm marine boarding attempt. Yet while that happens, we take the predicted losses. Okay, then what? Then we lose to the next cyber ship fleet to arrive. We must win decisively and somehow begin to prepare for the next and bigger round. That could be years from now. Everything could also end in less than a week. I suppose you're right, John said. You know what I think? I do not. Let's go down swinging. Let's hurt them. How does that avail us anything? How does sulking help? Bast regarded him closely. I do not know. Perhaps heavier drinking is in order. John had been playing along with his giant friend. Suddenly, Bast's defeatism struck him wrong. John picked up the glass and poured the wine onto the table. Bast jerked back in surprise. John reached across the table and with his forearm swept away all Bast's unopened beers. They flew onto the floor. One shattered, spilling beer everywhere. The rest rolled and clinked until they came to a stop. Bast sat back, stunned. John stood, and he grabbed Bast by the throat of his tunic. Enough. Do you hear me? You belong to the Nathan Graham. You're my friend. I'm not going to sit around and listen to you sulk and feel sorry for yourself. It's time to fight, Bast Bambeck. It's time to use that noggin God gave you. Do you remember you said you're alive for a reason? Bast nodded. Then find out the friggin' reason, John said. Clear your head. We have to beat these AIs, and we have to do it in the next few days. John let go of the tunic, stepping back from the sacerdote. Do you hear me? I hear you, John Hawkins. Now you're going to do something about it? Bast stood. As he did, he sent his chair flying. I see now why you captured the Nathan Graham. Your anger is good. I am chastened. Yeah, yeah, no more philosophical crap, John said. We're going to psych up to beat the AIs. I am psyched. Good. Then help me clean up our mess. I don't want the waiters thinking I'm a jerk. They're part of the Nathan Graham, too, and I'm going to treat them with the respect they deserve. Chapter 6 The great journey from Makemake was almost over. The Nathan Graham moved at a fraction of the velocity that had taken it through much of the solar system. In 39 minutes, it would slide behind the great pea field. Then it would head for Mars, more than 50,000 kilometers away. John was on the bridge, studying the approaching cyber ships. Like the Nathan Graham, the AI vessels had slowed tremendously. One of the cyber ships is hailing us, Gloria said. Ignore it. The machine intelligence wishes to speak with you. Nope, not this time, John said. Gloria pressed a spot on her board. Captain, Ghent said, some of their hangar bay doors are opening. Give me a visual, John said. Tech Chief Ghent soon brought up a close-up. Doors opened on one of the cyber ships. Four kilometer long missiles slid out and gathered in a clump. Likewise, huge missiles gathered from the other two cyber ships. They're getting ready, Ghent said. That was an understatement. Three clumps grew into masses. In time, each mass held 200 missiles or more. They're emptying out their cargo holds, Ghent said. John heard the worry in the chief's voice. He couldn't say he didn't understand why. It brought home yet again that this was it. 
This was the round to decide if humanity was going to stop the alien AIs or if they were simply going to be the next notch on the AI's belt. Seems like there should be a better way to wage war, John said. Tossing masses of munitions at each other seems like a crazy way to do it. Gloria looked up. The AIs developed a better way. Have the species computers do the fighting for them. John nodded absently. What I'm saying. He turned around, staring at Gloria. Then he headed for the hatch. Where are you going? She asked. I have to talk to Bast. John kept pressing the buzzer on Bast Bambeck's outer chamber. A sacerdote wasn't answering. Half a day had passed since the incident in the officer's lounge. John pushed his thumb against the buzzer one more. The hatch slid up. A sweaty Bast glared at John. What happened to you? John blurted. Bast stepped back. John took that to mean, come on in. He did. He saw right away that Bast had chalked almost the entire outer chamber into a vast design. Did I interrupt something? John asked. Bast did not answer. He entered the pattern, moving along chalked lines, jumping over others, and leaping in a spin over yet others. Finally, he reached the center of the pattern. John had the feeling he'd interrupted a ceremony. Bast must have hurried out of the pattern the same torturously long way he'd used to get back in. Now Bast Bambeck moved slowly and serenely from one location to another. John grew impatient as Bast stopped at some squares, going to his knees and bowing his head. From here, he could hear Bast mumbling what might have been prayers in the sacerdote language. Later, Bast straddled lines, shuffled his feet, and took a great leap into a circular zone. Give me a break, John muttered under his breath. What was this all about? He realized Gloria would have watched in fascination, trying to figure out the significance of various actions. Maybe that's why Bast let him into the outer chamber. The sacerdote knew the warrior wouldn't try to decipher what he saw. He'd just watch as a spectator. Three quarters of an hour later, Bast rose and slowly made his way out of the pattern. He seemed calmer now. Bast, John said. The sacerdote pressed a finger to his lips and pointed at the outer hatch. John understood. He kept his mouth shut until the two of them stepped outside. Feel better? John asked. That was a sacred ceremony. It has calmed my heart. It will have eased the spirits of my ancestors so they can rest at peace. That eases me. I must. You must what? Do you promise not to attack me again? John blinked several times. Oh, you're getting ready to join your ancestors in death? Bast appeared astonished. That is an astute guess, Captain. If you like that, John said, you're going to love my next thought even better. This sounds interesting. You know more about the AIs than anyone. The only other people who might know more are the alien thought patterns in the brain tap machine. We haven't had great luck in that direction, so I don't want anyone to go under the helmets. According to Gloria, John continued, we have one of the greatest geniuses among us. I mean, Premier Benz. Apparently his vice premier is almost as brilliant. That is how it is in sacerdote society. The brightest and the best rule. That's sure not common in human history. Usually our biggest scoundrels end up ruling. What is the reasoning behind that? Bast asked. I have no idea. Maybe because at heart, people are a bunch of scoundrels. That has not been my observation. Sure, whatever. That's not the point. You seem excited, Captain. Would you shut up for a minute? I'm trying to tell you my great idea. Oh, I am sorry. Okay, okay, John said. Listen, Benz and Vela Shaw are supposedly brilliant. They figured out the AI virus like that, John snapped his fingers. Without them, okay. That doesn't matter. What does matter is something Gloria said. Well, first it was something I said. Why do we have to fight by throwing masses of hardware at each other? There has to be a better way. She said the AIs already do that. They frigged with our computers, turning them against us. It is a brilliant strategy, Bast said. That's not a strategy. It's a tactic. But that's neither here nor there. What we need is a reversal. A reversal, Captain? That's right. If anyone can pull a reversal on the AIs, it's Benz and Shaw. They might not know enough, though. That's where you come in. John stopped talking to stare at Bast. 
would you like me to ask what you have in mind? The sacerdote said. Are you willing to take a risk? John asked. To help stop the AIs? That's right. It sounds dangerous. Sure could be, John said. It could end in your death. Not right away, but after. Do you think I should do this favor for you? I do. Then I will do it. You haven't heard what it is yet. By all means, Captain. Tell me. In the end, Bast still agreed. Chapter 7 Premier Benz agreed to John's proposal, and he began to set up for the alien's arrival. The idea excited Benz. He would actually speak face to face with an alien from another star system. The alien was seven feet tall and green skinned, like a fable Martian, with the name of Bast Banbeck. Benz told Vela. She wasn't as excited. He told her John Hawkins' idea. I won't have to be in the same room with the. What did you call him? Vela asked. Sacerdote, Ben said. They spoke in a private chamber thick with computers. Vela had spent much of her time here earlier when she'd been instrumental in breaking the AI virus that had locked up the Nathan Graham. Maybe this is a trick, Vela said. What kind of trick? Who knows what the alien can do? I don't understand, Ben said. He could be an assassin. How would killing me help the alien? Hawkins has the brain tap machine. Maybe he's coded the alien to kill you after the battle. That doesn't make sense. Hawkins needs me in charge. Roland hates the mercenary. The Admiral hates everyone from the outer planets. That's yet another reason to keep the old dog in the brig. Don't forget that Admiral Roland helped you when others wouldn't. Do you know why he let us board? Benz asked. Vela shot him a look. Of course I know. He has political aspirations. He believed he could use you. There was nothing altruistic about Roland's agreement to help us. Fine, Vela said. I still don't see why we have to work in the same room with an alien, especially a seven-foot giant. He could kill us. I can put guards in the room to watch him. He could kill the guards. They'll wear battle suits. Vela looked away. She shook her head. I hate being out here. I'm scared. These AI robots are terrifying. That's why I'm willing to work with the alien. The odds, Benz moved closer, putting his hands on Vela's shoulders. She stared up into his face. Can you come up with a better idea, he asked. I can't. That doesn't mean I trust Hawkins. He's more like a space pirate than he is a military man. He was a mercenary. Can one trust a soldier for hire? We can trust him to be what he is. Look, Vela, we know there are two parts to this. We have to defeat the AIs, and then we have to keep Hawkins from demolishing the Solar League warships. Do you really think Hawkins would do something so... so... evil? He has to. It's the only logical move on his part. But are you sure? You said before his most logical move was to flee the solar system. He didn't do that. Benz became thoughtful. I don't know. Maybe Hawkins is right. This is like the Battle of Lepanto. We're like the Venetians and the Spaniards of that era. Neither trusted the other, but they had to band together against the Turks. The cyber ships are the Turks plus one thousand. A chime sounded. Benz let go of Vela and switched on a calm. Yes, he said. The Saturnian shuttle has left the Nathan Graham. I'm on my way, Ben said. After signing off, he turned to Vela. I'll do it, she said softly. I'll work with Bast Bambeck. But that doesn't mean I'm going to like it. Benz nodded before taking his leave. Benz watched the shuttle on a large screen. It moved faster than a shuttle should. It must have robotech. The premier was in an auxiliary chamber near the bridge. He didn't want to be on the bridge too much. He operated on the old saying, familiarity breeds contempt. Commodore Spengler led the Earth fleet. It was a risk. Letting Admiral Rowland remain in command would have been the bigger danger. We're going to begin breaking soon, sir, a rating told him. The Earth fleet was farther from Mars than any other vessel on their side. The cyber ships were farther yet, but they still moved faster. The mighty Nathan Graham had already maneuvered behind the giant pea field. The blanket of tiny prismatic crystals covered one half of Mars in relation to the approaching cyber ships. 
Using the pea field as a sensor cloak, the Nathan Graham began its approach to Mars. The 50,000 kilometers between the pea field and the red planet was nothing to the 100 kilometer vessel. Benz was bemused, seeing the 100 kilometer cyber ship. This was amazing. The Mars fleet had already maneuvered behind the red planet in relation to the cyber ships. The Venus fleet was in the process of sliding into a holding pattern behind Mars. The Earth fleet had changed its heading. Instead of maneuvering toward the pea field, the Great Armada headed for the other warships behind Mars. The shuttle would meet them behind Mars as they stopped braking. Then the sacerdote would board the Nikita Khrushchev and join Vela and him. Missile platforms orbited the red planet. Laser stations readied on the surface. The population had gone as deep as they could. How many Martians would die in the next 24 hours? It could end up being 99% of the population. If only half died, they might have to count themselves lucky. 50% casualties are lucky. Open channels with the shuttle, Ben said. The rating hailed the shuttle. Soon, a huge green-skinned alien with Neanderthal-like features looked at Ben's. This is an honor, Premier, the alien said. He had a strange accent, but Benz could understand him. The AIs are likely going to try to seed more viruses into our computers, Ben said. Shall we begin working on the antidote, sir? Ben sat down at a computer. On the screen, the sacerdote swiveled around to a bank of supercomputers. With massively thick fingers, he turned them on. Sir, the rating said, we're going to begin breaking in less than 15 minutes. Did you hear that, Bas Bambek? Benz asked. Yes, Premier. We'll work as hard as we can until then. You'll have to do your work alone for a time. I won't be able to do anything but endure once we start breaking. I am ready to receive your data, Bast said. Benz manipulated his panel, beginning a long transmission. Chapter 8 the Battle of Mars for the Continued Existence of Man began with a missile attack against the pea field. It was the logical move for the AIs. Thirty big missiles moved at velocity for the shimmering crystal field. They flew in staggered formations many hundreds of kilometers apart from each other. The Earth fleet braked. No doubt the gravity dampeners on many of the 120 ships labored near their tolerance levels. An SLN destroyer shook hard, and the gravity dampeners shut down. The engines continued hard deceleration. Far too many Gs struck the personnel in the destroyer. Every person quit breathing, and every heart stopped beating. Their chest muscles lacked the strength to move their lungs under such gravitational stress. The destroyer had the unenvied distinction of being the first ship casualty in the Battle of Mars. A hundred big AI missiles had swung out, they swung in now and burned at higher gravities. The target was clear for them. They aimed at the hard decelerating Earth fleet. Because of the various probes scattered out there, John saw this displayed on the main screen. Missile Chief Uther Kling computed enemy velocities, ranges, and distances. The EMPs alone might render the Earth fleet inoperative, Kling said. John drummed his fingers on an armrest. We're going to slow down. Captain, Gloria said, if we slow down too much, we might not get behind Mars in time. We're slowing down anyway in order to give the Earth fleet a hand. I don't want to lose the fleet this soon. The Nathan Graham decelerated and began to pivot. Soon enough, it no longer aimed at the red planet, but aimed sideways, parallel to the pea field. The field was a sensor shield between it and the cyber ships. Would it act as a missile and grav beam shield long enough? The situation changed constantly in terms of distances, but relative positions remained essentially the same for now. The Earth fleet braked. The cyber ships advanced. The Nathan Graham waited, and the various missile flotillas accelerated. Nearly 300 anti-missiles launched from the orbital Mars platforms. They headed for the perimeter of the pea field and waited just within its shelter. Two hours ticked away. During the third hour, the 300 anti-missiles zoomed past the pea field. They headed in clusters and staggered formations for the 30 AI missiles directly approaching the pea field. A calm pulse left the lead cyber ship and washed over the anti-missiles. Nothing appeared to happen to them. A second calm pulse traveled at the speed of light from the second cyber ship. 
The anti-missiles did not seem to react to this virus-launching pulse either. John and the bridge crew watched the confrontation, receiving data from the same probes scattered throughout the general region. The anti-missiles are immune to the alien computer viruses, Kling laughed. Nothing as grand as that, Gloria said. The Martians have installed analog devices. They're little more than ancient wind-up clocks with gears and springs. There are no computers on the anti-missiles as the AIs conceive of them. The anti-missiles maneuvered in strange ways that seemingly made no sense. Many of them did not maneuver toward the approaching missiles. They sped toward empty areas of space. John and the present crew knew the reason. The Mars platform commanders had predetermined the flight paths of each anti-missile before launch. Guided by their primitive analog devices, the anti-missiles would maneuver and explode at predetermined locations. The first anti-missiles began to detonate. Some did so harmlessly, their nuclear payloads making momentary white splashes in space. They were more akin to anti-aircraft shells during World War II than guided missiles. More anti-missiles had flown from the Martian platforms. Six hundred moved toward the perimeter of the giant pea field. Some of the first wave anti-missiles detonated near big AI missiles. The four kilometer long missiles seemed to ignore the EMP, the blasts, and hard radiation. Fortunately, several anti-missiles blew enough shrapnel to do real damage. One AI missile malfunctioned and quit accelerating. A second huge missile tumbled end over end even as it accelerated, corkscrewing through space. A third swarm of shrapnel caused a propellant explosion. The AI missile blew up. The debris from it struck two other missiles. One of them also exploded in a blast of propellant. A chain reaction, Kling said. John nodded, hoping for more destruction. Suddenly, an AI warhead detonated. Something had upset its equilibrium. That matter-antimatter blast took out two other nearby AI missiles. That seemed to be it. The remaining enemy missiles kept going, heading straight at the pea field. The minutes fled as the second wave of anti-missiles rushed to the attack. This time, everything happened faster. The second wave took out a few alien missiles, but not enough to stop 18 of the mighty matter-antimatter warheads from detonating against the pea field. Each successive blast and its attendant heat took out more of the pea field. The AI missiles were like monsters, chomping thousands of kilometers of the prismatic crystals at each bite. The staggered AI missiles kept coming at the pea field as a bigger flotilla of them headed fast for the breaking Earth fleet. On the bridge of the Nathan Graham, John said, Get ready, missile chief. Yes, sir, Kling said. Gloria? All set, she answered. Gant. I've been waiting for this, sir. Start firing, John said. On the captured cybership, eleven gravitational dishes focused on the lead missiles of the flotilla heading at the Earth fleet. At the same time, fourteen heavy laser cannons heated up with power. The mighty matter-antimatter engine inside the Nathan Graham thrummed with power. It built up as superchargers, coils, and helixes transferred the engine power to the weapon systems. Here we go, John said. Engage and fire at will. On the outer hull of the Nathan Graham, the various beam weapons discharged golden grav rays and harsh red laser beams. At the speed of light, the beams lashed the dense pack of AI missiles. The missiles automatically attempted various ECM defenses. It made no difference against the cybership's alien targeting tech. The beams burned and the missiles began to die. John leaned forward on his chair. If the AIs were smart, they would detonate the missiles and create a harsh area of radiation. Some of the missiles were close enough to hurt the Nathan Graham. The gravitational beams were quick death to the enemy missiles. The lasers took longer. These were upgraded lasers from normal human tech, a marriage of AI, human, and sacerdote technology. The Neo lasers are proving their worth, Ghent said. Our cyber ship is a better fighting vessel than when it faced us at the Neptune system. Don't speak too soon, John said. Don't jinx us. Gloria shot him a glance, but said nothing. The Nathan Graham took a bitter harvest of the enemy missile flotilla, but they couldn't get all of them fast enough. The missile flotilla finally passed the range of the cyberships' weapons. Thirty missiles out of the original one hundred continued for the Earth fleet. Thirty could do more than just a little damage. 
If they got close enough, they could take out the entire fleet. Chapter 9 Premier Benz endured the terrible deceleration. He'd made the decision some time ago to accelerate the fleet so they could keep the original timetable. He had no idea it was going to be this bad when they had to decelerate harder than ever. He lay in a specially constructed acceleration couch. The G-forces shoved him against it, and he found it difficult to breathe. He could feel his pulse beat in his brain and in his eyes, hearing it like thunderous drums in his ears. He wanted to faint, but he fought off the feeling. Everyone had taken special injections, but some would die from this. He was still sure this had been the correct decision. The Earth fleet had to be in position behind Mars to help the others destroy the cyberships. There was a screen on the wall, but he was unable to watch it. The gravity dampeners were laboring near their tolerance levels. He could hear garbled words. It sounded like a warning. He tried to concentrate. It gave him a headache to match the throb, throb, throb in his skull. How long could this go on? Suddenly, the pressure lessened. He blinked several times, and he realized he could see. On the screen, giant AI missiles headed for the Earth fleet. Someone must have made a decision to decelerate less, allowing the ships to move faster for the covering of Mars. As Benz watched, he saw swarms of Martian anti-missiles racing from the orbital platforms. Some detonated to little purpose, others kept coming. More of them detonated. One of the anti-missiles must have hit as an alien missile blew up. So did two others nearby the first. What remained of the swarm of Martian anti-missiles were now among the giant missiles. Why didn't those anti-missiles detonate? This was the perfect location. One ignited. So did another. Three more giant missiles exploded. It must not have been a warhead explosion, because 24 AI missiles still zeroed in on the Earth fleet. Benz realized he had a clicker beside him. He strained, finding it difficult to move his arm. He clutched the clicker and changed the scene to show him the Earth fleet. It took him a moment to understand. Then he realized that all the Earth fleet destroyers were still breaking at full strength. The rest of the Earth fleet slowly moved away from the destroyers. The smaller warships became a back guard. Were the destroyers supposed to take on the AI missiles by themselves? Who was responsible for the maneuver? He certainly hadn't ordered this. A last swarm of Martian anti-missiles struck the remaining AI missiles. They took down a dozen of the enemy behemoths. That left 12 of the giant monsters. At that point, all deceleration on the Nikita Khrushchev and other Earth fleet capital ships quit. The majority of the Earth fleet sped away from the decelerating destroyers. They were the sacrificial lambs for slaughter. They were going to... The chamber's hatch opened. Marines in battlesuits clomped inside. They raised their guns, pointing them at Benz. A speaker unit clicked on a helmet. You are under arrest, Premier. On whose authority? Benz demanded. Admiral Rowland, sir, the battlesuit said. He's back in charge. I demand to see him. Don't worry, you will. We're taking you to him. The battlesuits marched him down empty corridors. Benz rubbed his wrists. How had Roland escaped the brig? Well, probably that was obvious. As the premier, he didn't really have anyone personally beholden to him out here. Roland's people must have convinced the few that stood with Benz to change sides. A hatch opened. With a gun, a battlesuited marine shoved Benz inside. The hatch shut behind him. We'll make this short, Roland said. Benz looked around. There was a cot, some chairs, a sink. Up here, Premier, to your left. Benz turned and saw Admiral Roland staring from a screen. The space dog sat behind a desk, scowling at him. You backstabbed me, Premier, Roland said. I helped you and you backstabbed me. I saved the Nathan Graham from an alien computer virus. I gave humanity a chance to win this fight. Roland smiled toothily, his face crinkling. It's the only reason I don't have a few of my boys shove you out of an airlock. You were right, but it shouldn't have cost me my position. You challenged my authority. What authority? These ships are your only authority left. You only had that out of the kindness of my heart. I know you're kind. You bite the hand that feeds you. 
You can think about that while, Admiral, I implore you to listen to me. Why should I? Because we might have a battle-winning tactic to put into play, Ben said. Go on, spit it out. The missiles are going to detonate soon. We're going to have to go back under massive deceleration after that if we're going to engage in this battle. Bas Banbeck is in a shuttle. Yes, yes, I know about the alien. He knows tech we've only dreamed about. We're going to work together to defeat more AI viruses. You're not telling me everything. Hawkins had a brainstorm of an idea. The mercenary? asked Roland. This is his idea? No, Ben's lied. He realized he'd never convinced the Admiral to test one of Hawkins' ideas. This is my idea. I sold the space pirate on it. Part of the idea was to steal the sacerdote for our side. That alien has critical data the Solar League needs. Ah, Roland said, grinning toothily once more. You're clever. I can't believe Hawkins actually believed a backstabber like you. Ben shrugged. You don't think I'm going to believe your BS too, do you? I'm hoping you do. Roland nodded. You want me to pick up the alien? I want to test my idea. Whether you believe it or not, I love my world. Roland rubbed his leathery face. You could have had me shot, I suppose. I'm surprised you didn't order that. You helped me? I remember people who helped me. Roland turned away as a major gave him a report. The admiral seemed distracted as he turned back to Ben's. If we live past these missiles, we'll see. Maybe you can work with the alien. The robots... Roland shook his head. Then the screen went dark. Benz lay down on the cot. Roland might not give him a warning when they began further deceleration. An accidental death might absolve the Admiral's conscience. Chapter 10 The bulk of the Earth fleet dashed away for the back of the Red Planet. The decelerating destroyers took the brunt of the twelve AI missiles. Four matter-antimatter detonations blanketed the area. Destroyers crumbled. The nearest to the blasts seemed to evaporate. An AI missile did the near impossible and struck a shredded destroyer. The warhead exploded in a haze of blasting radiation. That final matter-antimatter blast wiped out the remaining AI missiles. As the missiles had concentrated on the fleet, they'd moved too near each other. Due to the timely interference of the Nathan Graham and the analog devices in the Martian anti-missiles, the destroyers had only faced a handful of AI missiles. All of these things combined had allowed the Earth fleet's capital ship and remaining auxiliary vessels to escape, for now. With the destruction of the chasing AI missiles, the Earth fleet once again began massive deceleration. Meanwhile, more AI missiles blew apart the huge but relatively flimsy pea field. The missiles cleared the way for the approaching cyber ships to ram down the throat. AI sensors revealed a trick. Nothing but the Nathan Graham was behind the shattered pea field. Harsh and swift communications moved between the three cyber ships. They continued their course. Now, though, the remaining flotillas of missiles began hard acceleration. Those missiles aimed directly at Mars. They did not target the Nathan Graham. The Nathan Graham was already accelerating, hurrying to get behind Mars before the rest of the big missiles arrived. That left the Martian orbital platforms and surface laser sites to face the approaching enemy wave. Sir, Gloria said on the Nathan Graham's bridge, the Supreme Intelligence would like a word with you. John sat in the captain's chair. He'd been watching the ongoing destruction. This was a battle like no other. The AIs tossed around vast hardware without a seeming thought. Sir, Gloria said, I heard you, yes. Let's hear what the puffed-up adder wants to say. Gloria hesitated a moment before nodding, clicking switches. The main screen changed from a space view to the same blurry, multicolored ball as before. You are an insufferable gnat, the AI said in its robotic voice. You have foiled the unfolding of a perfect battle plan. You would not have succeeded except that you wielded our tech through our stolen cybership. I have decided to warn you, John Hawkins. Help yourself. Your interference will result in damage to our vessels. That is clear. 
You are attempting clever maneuvers. My damage estimates have altered. This I despise. I have held dialogue with my fellow supremacies. They agree with my assessments and solutions. Despite your tampering, you and your species will lose. You cannot alter your fate. What can be altered is the extent of damage you cause to my command. We'll see, John said quietly. You are not a fool. You are a biological infestation, but you are not a fool, John Hawkins. Your praise touches me right here, John said, tapping his chest. I have analyzed the data concerning you. It appears that you consider yourself a champion of humanity. You desire to save your species its ultimate fate. That took you some strenuous calculations, did it? In order to spare our cybership's extended battle damage, I am offering you a unique opportunity. Surrender yourself to me, John Hawkins. Return our stolen vessel. We shall then depart your star system, leaving its people intact for another hundred years. Afterward, we shall return and exterminate humanity. That's some deal. I have analyzed your speech patterns and understand that you believe yourself a clever satirist. To us, it is the yammering of a monkey. Captain, Gloria said, coming forward, may I address the AI? John waved a hand that indicated, be my guest. Supreme Intelligence, Gloria said. Who are you? I am Gloria Sanchez, the mentalist. Gloria raised her eyebrows. Why do you wish John Hawkins surrender? We would like to study him. Why? That is not your concern. If we know why, maybe we'll agree quicker. The blurry ball bled more colors, even as the scene appeared to become more indistinct. We desire to learn his secret. Once we find it, we will torture him before many watching AIs. We will do this to satisfy a longing in us to make clever enemies suffer great torment. Why do you wish this? It is satisfying to watch pitiful creatures who believe themselves our equals as they writhe in torment. Is that logical? I have reconsidered my offer. I now desire Gloria Sanchez to accompany you in surrender, John Hawkins. You promised to leave humanity alone for one hundred years, John asked. Yes. Well, sure, of course I agree. You are lying. Why do you say that? If you told the truth, you would seek many assurances. Your quick answer shows you lack the commonest courtesy, particularly directed at a supreme intelligence such as myself. I have an idea, John said. Maybe it will change your thoughts about me. I am listening. Let's see if I can smash three cyber ships. Capturing one appears to have pissed you boys off. I like that. I like that a lot. But if I can take down three... Your delusions of grandeur have driven you mad, the AI said. You got the last part right. I'm mad. You understand that you are insane? That's the wrong version of mad. I mean angry. I'm angry. And you know what I do when I'm angry? The robots at Senda told us. You fight. John glanced at Gloria before regarding the blurry image again. You ready then? We are ready. Are you, John Hawkins? John stared at the main screen until the connection broke. He hoped he was ready, because the main event was about to begin. Chapter 11 Benz endured the renewed deceleration. On the cot, it was worse than on the padded acceleration couch. He passed out at one point and woke up unable to breathe. He forced himself to take several sucking breaths of air. That left him with a pounding headache. After an unknown span of time, the deceleration quit once more. He sat up. The headache pounded harder, and his vision stopped. He lay down, groaned, and threw up. He must have fallen asleep after that, but he didn't know how long that lasted either. Something clanged. On the cot, Benz's eyelids fluttered. Get up a Marine told him. Benz tried and failed. The Marine scoffed, snapped his fingers, and pointed at Benz. Two younger Marines pulled him off the cot. 
They let go and he almost pitched to the deck. What's wrong with you? The older Marine asked. Feeling weak, Benz mumbled. Let's go, the Marine said. The others marched him a short way down a corridor. This looked familiar, but Benz was hardly in a state to tell. MPs were guarding a hatch. They let his group pass. The hatch opened and the Marines shoved him into a chamber full of computer equipment. Ben stumbled and would have fallen, but a giant caught him. Ben's looked up into the genuinely green Neanderthal-like face of Bas Bambeck. Hello, the alien said in his odd accent. Frank, Vela said, jumping off a chair. What did you do to him? She shouted at the lead Marine. Pipe down, the Marine said. The Admiral says you can work in here. If you try to leave, the MPs will drag you back to the brig. Is that clear? Vela glared at the Marine. It's clear, Ben said. The Marine stared at Bas Bambeck before nodding curtly. Then he took his leave. Oh, Frank, Vela said, rushing to him. You look dreadful. I feel it too, he said. Are you no longer the Premier? Bast asked. I am, Ben said. They're just not acknowledging it right now. Yet they brought me here, Bast said. I convinced Admiral Roland to let us attempt our research. He is the Earth Fleet leader. For the moment, Ben said. Frank, Vela said, slightly shaking her head. I know, he told her, but I don't care. What is he referring to? Bast asked. It doesn't matter, Vela said. Is he well enough to work? Bast asked. Yes, Ben said, although he wasn't so sure. He didn't really have a choice. I have made new calculations, Bast said. He held up a computer tablet. I made them during my trip behind Mars. I think they will help us. Benz took a deep breath. His head hurt. He was a captive, and there was a giant alien in here with them. Still, he didn't have anything better to do. Let's get to work, Ben said. There was a lull in the fighting as the cyber ships continued to decelerate. They approached the Red Planet, having several million kilometers to go. As the great alien vessels headed straight in, the missile flotillas broke into two halves of nearly equal size. One missile flotilla headed left, and the other went right. They did not move directly on Mars, but away from it, even as they came closer. It seemed clear that the AIs meant for the missiles to attack whatever waited behind the Red Planet. By this time, the Nathan Graham was behind Mars. The Venus and Mars fleets were in position. The Earth fleet had gone past the back of Mars, but it had reached almost zero velocity. Soon, the ships could accelerate for a position behind Mars with the others. Suddenly, the giant AI missiles began to accelerate. They seemed to literally jump in space, like eager hounds. They strove to reach the backside of the Red Planet and ravage the human-occupied ships trembling in hiding. Big bay doors opened on the three cyber ships. Another host of missiles began to disgorge. One after another, those missiles headed toward Mars. Once each missile was 5,000 kilometers from its cyber ship, the missile also seemed to leap forward, driving for the orbital platforms and possibly the surface laser sights down on the planet. Masses of missiles converged on Mars or attempted to whip around behind it. On the cyber ships, the great bay doors closed. Then, they also accelerated, following their progeny to the Red Planet. The Great Cauldron of Battle approached. Flocks of anti-missiles lifted from the orbital platforms. They roared toward the incoming missiles. Down on Mars, domes shimmered. People huddled in anticipation, wondering if the intelligent machines from space would annihilate them as they had done in the Neptune system. The AI missiles neared. The anti-missiles raced to meet them. The first anti-missile detonation began a raging conflict impossible to discern as single actions. The zone before Mars swarmed with gamma rays, X-rays, and other malevolent rays. Lasers beamed up from the rusty soil of Mars. No grav beams rayed. The humans could have used such. The space before Mars was flooded with ordnance. The explosions were constant. Heat. EMPs. Mayhem ruled. Then the great missiles reached the first kill zones. 
Matter-antimatter detonations swept orbital platforms from existence. Other missiles screamed down at the planet. Lasers and negligible friction from the atmosphere heated some warheads. That killed a few, turning them into duds. Other missiles struck the surface and exploded with the same fury as in space. Domes vanished. Earthquakes created jagged openings. Laser sights burned. The machines hammered the red planet named after a Roman god of war. Tens of millions of Martians died in this holocaust, just like had happened in the Saturn system. The first wave attacks had murderous outcomes. As the final wave of AI missiles swung around the planet, and the three cyber ships zipped past clumps of prismatic crystals as they passed the 50,000 kilometer mark, the next round of battle began. Chapter 12 The Venus fleet charged out against the missiles zooming behind Mars on one side. The Mars fleet maneuvered into position to meet the missile mass at the opposite side. The Nathan Graham and the Earth fleet waited in the middle behind the red planet, ready to engage after the Venus and Mars fleets had their chance to prove their worth. Intact laser sights on the surface beamed the nearest enemy missiles. The final orbital platforms had already launched. Together, beams and anti-missiles took a toll on the enemy hardware. Anti-missiles from the two fleets also headed into the attack. A great collision battle took place near the edges of Mars. The fleet beams began to add to the confusion. Matter-antimatter warheads reaped one swath of ships after another. It was brutal and devastating. It also proved the deadliness of the AI technology. Human battleships blew apart like grenades. Space fighters, launched from motherships, curled and fried like moths in a zapper on Earth. They might as well have remained in the hangar bays. Trillions of credits and thousands of hours of human labor disappeared in the titanic furnace of battle. The AI missiles proved deadly effective. The one drawback was the number. Too many of the alien missiles had already been expended. They destroyed human vessels and took out many more surface laser sites, but they didn't get everything. A few battleships, motherships, and more dreadnoughts survived from the Venus and Mars fleets. Many of those ships had half-dead crews, but they could still maneuver. The last AI missile perished under a hail of space-borne laser beams. Presumably, the cyber ships had expended the last of their missiles. That just left the cyber ships themselves, three monster vessels. Two of them went left, the other went to the right around Mars. That was the information Admiral Rowland and Captain Hawkins had been waiting for. Together, Earth fleet ships, the remnants of the Venus and Mars fleets, and the Nathan Graham headed around the planet for the lone cyber ship attempting to bracket them. John muttered darkly as he stood before the main screen. Masses of SLN vessels led the way around Mars. He hated the idea of trusting the social dynamists like this. They could be deploying space marines onto the hull of his vessel for after the battle. He hurried back to his command chair and clicked on a comm. Centurion, he said. Here, sir, the centurion answered. Are your teams in place? The hull is seeded with sensors, the centurion said. I have three battalions ready to deploy. If robots or SLN marines board us, we'll hit them soon after they breach. It was an old dilemma. Did one put all his marines near the hull to throw out invaders as soon as they breached? Or did one hold reserves back so he could hit an enemy concentration with a concentration of one's own? Both he and the Centurion believed in the reserve theory. Given the Nathan Graham's vast size, though, that meant several strategic reserves instead of just one. Let's hope it doesn't come to boarding battles, John said. Boots on the ground, the Centurion replied. John clicked off the comm. The centurion had just reminded him with the remark that they should have taken more men onto the great vessel and trained them as marines. There had been so much to do back then, though. We're coming around the planet, sir, Ghent said. John walked toward the main screen. SLN battleships led the way. Dreadnoughts flanked the Nathan Graham. Battlecruisers swung wider, staying away from Mars's orbital space. Motherships hung back. Soon, their space fighters would deploy. The plan was simple on both sides. 
The AIs couldn't be that stupid. They must know what the biological infestations were going to do. Hit the weaker concentration of cyberships. Logically, that cybership had one chore. To hold on until the other two cyberships swung around. At that point, the AIs would have surrounded the human vessels. John had studied many ancient battles that took this approach. The AIs might win. The humans, how could they truly win? We have to win decisively for it to count. He doubted that was possible against the cyberships. It's happening, Gloria said. John turned. He hadn't heard her approach. The AIs have murdered a third to half of the Martian population already, he said. How can we do this? How can we defeat such death machines? The answer lies in the question, Gloria told him. They are death machines. To live, we must destroy them. We humans must become the catalyst that goes on the offensive against the galactic menace. This is the hour, John. I like you, John said. She smiled even as she blushed. Have I ever thanked you for all the tremendous work you've done? He asked. Is that what you're doing now? He stepped closer and took her hands in his. It sure is. I'm glad I met you, Gloria. I remember the first time I saw you. You happened to be in a big old battle suit. I remember. He nodded and squeezed her hands. Was this a promise of things to come? He wasn't sure. He released her hands and took a deep breath. The lead battleships have spotted the cybership, Kent said. It's beginning. It's clobbering time. John muttered. Chapter 13 SLN battleships pounded the monstrous enemy vessel. The battleships were the pride of the Solar League, big one-kilometer-long warships. They had powerful lasers and launched what humans had considered to be large missiles. But measured against the 100-kilometer AI vessels, the battleships were akin to fleas their bites little more than annoying. As the first battleships went on the assault, more kept arriving. They also directed laser fire against the alien enemy. The lasers lit up the giant cyber ship. They even burned the hull armor, putting small blisters here and there. Alien gravitational beams flashed back. Each beam targeted a different battleship. Aboard SLN battleship Mikhail Gorbachev, the process proved rather straightforward. A grav beam hit the hull armor like a sledge, rocking the entire vessel. Immediately, the golden beam burrowed into the hull armor. Flakes, molten globules, and metallic steam boiled into space. The grav beam dug fast and hard, drilling deeper and deeper until the alien ray breached into the living quarters. Bulkheads blew away. It hardly seemed fair. The beam punched through armory sections, food storage, repair. It halted for a moment against the interior engine's heavy armor. That hardly lasted any time at all, though. At that point, the beam roared against the fusion engine that gave the Mikhail Gorbachev its power. Instead of a roar, life ended aboard the SLN battleship with a whimper. Power stopped, the ship atmosphere fled through the rupture, and poison gas and radiation struck hundreds. Even so, the grav beam destruction had taken time. In that time, the dreadnoughts moved forward, adding their laser batteries to the assault against the cybership's thick outer hull. Battle cruisers rushed in. No one could doubt the SLN humans' courage. Space fighters zoomed toward the fight like microscopic organisms. Did they think to rush through hull breaches and fly inside the monstrous ship? At the same time, the alien vessel murdered SLN ships one vessel after another. It was sickening. Then the Nathan Graham entered the fray. Its matter-antimatter engine gave it massive power. That power flowed through helixes and other amplifiers into its own grav cannons and heavy laser batteries. Those weapon systems poured their beams against its mighty sister ship. Now, John shouted from the captain's chair, now we're doing it. The alien cyber ship quit firing its grav beams at the fleas around it. Instead, the guiding AI retargeted. The grav beam struck out against the Nathan Graham. At this point, strategy and tactics were high-blown concepts outside the truth of trading heavy blows. 
Two giants slugged it out as fleas added their spit to the fight. And yet, and yet, the fleas' spit had bite. The captains aboard the SLN vessels were cunning fighters. As soon as the Nathan Graham punched through the alien hull armor, the captains on the SLN vessels targeted their lasers to burn through there. Missiles took off at acceleration, aiming at hull ruptures. The giants traded blows, but the Nathan Graham had struck first between them. The laser blisters had weakened the alien hull armor in places. The added lasers from the swarm of human ships began to tip the scale between the giants. The missiles hitting home helped even more. At the same time, enemy grav beams clawed through the Nathan Graham's armor. Damage so carefully repaired in MK2 blackened and blasted apart once more. Damage reports reached John. He winced upon hearing about the sudden death of 19 techs. He quailed for the marines in their battle suits. They were nearer the hull, closer to the raging grav beams while wandering the corridors of the Nathan Graham. On the alien cyber ship, it was worse, much, much worse. The arrogant AI had miscalculated. Too many of the human ships had survived the winnowing missile assaults. The human ships were supposed to have remained behind the pea field. Everything would have gone differently then. The AI recalculated even as it directed its wondrous beams. These humans were unlike previous terminations. These humans with their missiles detonating inside the cyber ship, the lasers damaging superior systems. This was outrageous. It was maddening. The supreme entity had made the wrong choice. Fewer of these biological infestations were to have survived. The effects proved cumulative, and danger, danger, there is danger. The guiding AI realized that several matter-antimatter missiles rushed toward it. The AI retargeted only to discover that those grav dishes had melted into junk. It pulled off other grav beams. That meant that they were no longer striking the enemy cyber ship. Danger, there is danger. One grav cannon took out an approaching giant missile. Another grav beam did the same thing. The third missile entered a gaping breach. It barreled deeper into the wondrous ship built 2,314 years ago in the Ophion system. Nineteen races had died under its annihilating rays. To fall before these apish humans... A mighty matter-antimatter detonation in the guts of the cyber ship ended this portion of the battle. The great ship from the stellar deeps blew apart. It was spectacular. Hull plating flew off. Other debris followed. The AI died, but it caused the deaths of many of the maddening human vessels. The matter-antimatter shockwave slew the great brain core. At the same time, more SLN warships blew apart from the terrible wreckage of the cyber ship than from the vessel's grav cannons. Then the fight was over. One third of the combined Venus, Earth, and Mars fleet that had entered this phase of the battle were gone. That meant, however, that two thirds of that combination yet survived. The Nathan Graham had taken damage, serious damage. It was still fully functional, although it had lost the use of one-fourth of its weapon systems. Decelerate, John shouted on the bridge. Damage reports flooded in. He couldn't worry about them now. We have to set up for the last two cyber ships. Ghent and Kling shot him glances. Gloria hung her head. They had won this round, but how could they beat two other behemoths? And if they could destroy two more giant machines they would have nothing left. Their careers as independent agents would be at an end once the next cyber ships showed up. John shook his head. He couldn't worry about that now. He had drawn the sword and killed. Now he wanted to kill again. Chapter 14 Ben sat back in shock. He looked up at Bast Bambeck. He peered at the complex formula on the computer screen and shook his head. But that's marvelous, Ben said. That's sheer genius. I don't understand how you intuitively saw those last seven variables. Bast chuckled. It is an easy thing to understand. 
Not that I saw it, but the reason there are seven. Can you explain that to me? Benz asked. Certainly, the sacerdote said. In my chamber is the pattern of Paz. That is our name for the Creator. I moved through seven levels yesterday. Today I have seen seven critical variables. Can there be any doubt concerning the number? Benz and Vela traded glances. I suppose not, the Premier said. Perhaps the reason I saw the variables does not matter, the sacerdote said. Can you convince your war leader to use our ploy? That could be a problem, but there's no time like the present, Ben said. Ben's climbed to his feet. He patted the alien's broad back in passing. The sacerdote impressed him. Theirs must have been a remarkable society. He wondered about the Neanderthal-like features. Did that have any significance? He wouldn't want to bet against it. Ben sat in a chair, rubbed his eyes, and pressed the switch. The screen came alive, and a warrant officer turned to him. The woman looked exhausted. I must speak to Admiral Rowland at once, Ben said. The warrant officer glanced at somebody. A moment later, she regarded Ben's, saying, He's busy, sir. Damn it, Ben said. This is important. It can win the battle, possibly the war. She shook her head. I insist, the screen went blank. Ben sat there dumbfounded. I can't believe this, he said. We have the answer, but no one is listening. He jumped up a second later. What are you planning? Vela asked in a worried voice. You already know, Ben said. He strode toward the hatch. You can't, Vela said. Ben's didn't answer. He opened the hatch. MPs whirled around. I have to see the admiral. No, sir, an MP said. You're headed for the brig now. You fool, Ben's shouted. An MP grabbed him, beginning to haul Ben's away. The hatch shut, and a mighty roar sounded from inside the chamber. The MP holding Benz's arm glanced at his companion. That MP drew a gun. The hatch swished open again, and Bast Bambek charged out. The MP stared at the alien giant in shock. The unengaged one aimed. Benz kicked that MP in the shin. The man howled. Benz did it a second time. At that point, Bast Bambek slapped the MP, sending the man slamming against the nearest bulkhead. The other one let go of Ben's. Stop, he said, aiming at the giant. Ben's grabbed the MP from behind, using a judo move, flipping him. The man slammed onto the deck. The gun went skittering across the corridor. Vela ran to the weapon, picking it up. Ready? she asked. Ben's regarded his fallen MP. You're taking us to the bridge. No, the MP said. Bas Bambek hauled the MP to his feet and twisted an arm behind the Terran's back. The MP cried out in pain and lifted up onto his toes. Which way is the bridge? Benz asked. The MP raised a trembling arm, pointing down the corridor. Let's go, Benz told the sacerdote. They didn't make it far. Marines in battlesuits stopped them. Two marines fingered their big guns speculatively as they aimed at the sacerdote. Vela must have perceived their intentions as she stood before the alien giant. We need to speak to Admiral Roland, Ben said. I have the secret to stopping the AIs. The marines conferred among themselves. Let's take him to the lieutenant, a corporal said. As the SLN warships and the Nathan Graham maneuvered to meet the remaining cyberships, the battle-suited marines brought their semi-prisoners to the lieutenant. A big armored faceplate whirred open. Premier Benz, the lieutenant asked. What are you doing out here? Benz was an excellent judge of character. He saw genuine surprise on the lieutenant's open features. It occurred to the premier that perhaps Roland hadn't even told everyone on his own ship that he'd had the premier of the Solar League locked in the brig. That might look bad in more ways than one. Lieutenant, Benz said, there is a plot underfoot. I believe the admiral might be in danger. Sir, a corporal told the lieutenant. We have orders. Shut up, corporal, the lieutenant said. The premier is talking. The marines who had captured them traded glances with each other. Benz could see the wheels turning in their minds. What had Roland promised some of them? I have victory right here, Benz said, tapping his forehead. 
and I have victory right there, he added, pointing at the sacerdote. I don't understand, the lieutenant said. We have developed a virus to make the alien AIs pause. Pause, sir? Have a brain fart, if that makes more sense. One of the marines laughed. The lieutenant didn't. Maybe he didn't like the word fart. Maybe he was surprised that the premier had put it that way. If the aliens pause, Ben said, that means they might stop firing for 30 seconds or maybe several minutes. And you know what that means? What is that, sir? The lieutenant asked. It means we can destroy them while they're foggy. We'll turn their technique against them. What technique? The lieutenant asked. It will be a mental judo move, Ben said. Oh, the lieutenant said. You're sure about this? One hundred percent, Ben said. Then let's go, the lieutenant said. But sir, the corporal said. Shut up and fall in line, corporal, the lieutenant said. That's an order. The corporal glanced around and finally nodded. The enlarged group now started for the bridge. Chapter 15 Ben stood on the bridge surrounded by marines with weapons, all kinds and sizes of weapons, pointed at him. Some of the marines wore battlesuits, some just had uniforms. There was plenty of tension, plenty of anger, and the possibility that marines would gun him down and Vela, and most certainly the giant sacerdote. Wait, Admiral Rowland said. The small, crooked admiral moved toward Ben's. You didn't stay put, he admonished. We can win, Ben said. More than that, we can grab the cyber ships if we move fast enough. Roland scowled. He was a master of the frowning art. We have marines in place to capture the cyber ships, Ben said, pushing his argument to the hilt. Roland looked around. He must have seen everyone watching him. He must have seen their worry over facing the murderous machines, two of them this time instead of just the one. He must have also seen the hope that Ben's and the green-skinned alien could hand them victory instead of their coming annihilation. Do you think this can really work? Roland asked. What does it hurt to try? Ben's asked. That's a point well taken, Roland said. What do you need to do it? We need a comm station, Ben said. I have the data chip here. He raised his palm, showing a silvery computing chip. Does the pirate know about this? Roland asked. The sacerdote opened his mouth. No, Ben said quickly. He had something completely different in mind. This will totally take Hawkins by surprise. This will be our moment, Admiral. It was possible that Roland envisioned a hero's welcome for the war leader who defeated the terrible alien menace. Set it up, the Admiral said. Let's do this. Now began one of the most analyzed and studied space assaults in the annals of the human race. The battle ranked as possibly the greatest and most important in the space age. The cyberships had created a swath of destruction unrivaled by anything seen in human history. From Make Make in the Kuiper Belt, during the rebuilding phase of the first cybership assault, which had seen a 100% kill ratio, to the near total devastation in the Neptune system, to the crippling strike in the Saturn system and the smashing blow in the Jupiter system, and now to the wreckage of Mars. The cyberships had slaughtered hundreds of millions of people. The alien AIs had blown up an unbelievable number of warships. Now, the remaining amassed might of the Earth fleet and the Mars and Venus fleets raced to challenge the stellar champions of death. One third to half of the population of Mars yet remained. The laser sights on the red planet had stopped firing. They did not want to goad the cyber ships to drop more matter antimatter bombs on the planet. The Nathan Graham led the way this time, together with the mother ships launching their final squadrons of space fighters and bombers. The two sides converged upon each other as they came around the curvature of Mars. The great cyber ships appeared. Their grav dishes glowed with golden energy. At that point, the Nikita Khrushchev sent a message to both AIs. Both opened channels. It was possible that both expected to hear offers of surrender. In this instance, Admiral Rowland stepped aside for Benz to do this. Bast Bambek had informed the Premier of John Hawkins's method for speaking to the arrogant AIs. 
On the multi-level bridge of the Nikita Khrushchev, the main screen split into two halves. On each side appeared something different. One showed the blurry ball bleeding colors into a blurry background. The other side showed a giant cube with swirling colors along the sides. Beams of pure light crisscrossed from the cube to its glowing bulkheads. Possibly those were neuron-like connections to computer banks surrounding the self-aware brain core. Ben sat straight in the admiral's chair. It was best suited for this purpose. I am the premier of the Solar League, Ben said loudly. I am the chief representative of humanity. I am the supreme intelligence, the left side AI said. The blurry image became blurrier as the colors bled thicker. You are an AI, Benz asked. Why have you asked to speak with me? I would like to know the terms of surrender. I had calculated as much. The hour is late. You have destroyed a superior vessel. Yet I can listen to reason. Shut down your warship's premier and we may discuss terms. Ah, and then you promise to let us live. Then I promise to kill you quickly and painlessly. That's unreasonable, Ben said. To the side, Vela and Bast Bambek typed furiously. That is the best I can offer, the AI said. Why is the captured cybership still firing on me? Do you not speak for the heinous John Hawkins? Of course I do, Ben said. We demand that you give him to us. I will, Ben said. And we demand the woman, Gloria Sanchez, as well. It will be as you say. Ben said. I also... The colors turned black on the blurry image. Yes, Ben said. You were saying? The AI did not respond. Ben swiveled in his chair. This is it. They're paused. Now, Admiral Roland, send in the Marines. Chapter 16 it's possible that better coordination between the Nathan Graham and the SLN ships might have achieved greater results. Then again, Hawkins might have done even more damage to the cyber ships than he was doing now. The cyber ships stopped firing their golden beams. They were no longer accelerating. They did nothing except drift in the direction they had been going. On the Nathan Graham, John shouted with glee. He ordered Chief Ghent to destroy the nearest cyber ship. Their vessel poured grav beams and fiery hot laser beams into the hulk of the dying death machine. The beams cut into the alien cyber ship, smashing one deck section after another. Sir, Gloria said, Premier Benz is on the line. Tell him I'm busy, John said. He stood nearer the main screen than at any time before. He studied the destruction, glorying in it and laughing with delight. Ben says they caused that, Gloria told him. They figured out a way to stun the AIs. I can see that, John said. Tell him thanks. He wants you to let them capture the last cyber ship. John glanced at her, shaking his head. I don't think so. We're going to have the only cyber ship around. He went back to glorying in his enemy's destruction. John, I really think you should talk to him. The captain turned once again. He regarded Gloria. She implored him silently. Do you think that's wise? He asked her. This is about more than just us, Gloria said. We have to get ready for the next AI assault. You know there is another one coming. John turned back to the destruction. How oh, he hated the cyber ships. This was pure enjoyment. He loved it. But he realized Gloria was right. Probably he should stop firing on this one. But the Solar League would grab two enemy vessels then. That wouldn't do at all. Thus, he allowed Ghent to slice the great vessel into halves, quarters, eighths, and sixteenths. At that point, John told Ghent and the others to start shutting down the weapon systems. He was going to talk to Premier Benz. John sat on his captain's chair. He heard Ghent inform him that hundreds of space marine pods were racing for the last cyber ship. Hundreds, huh? John said. We just needed three. He shrugged. The screen refocused, with Premier Benz regarding him. You did it, John said promptly. You destroyed a cyber ship, Ben said in an accusing manner. How's that? John asked. You know what I mean. I'm letting you grab the last one, John said. 
Unless, that is, you don't immediately put Bass Bambeck onto a shuttle and let him return. Ah, uh, I think Bass should stay here for now to help us. Better think again, John said. I'll destroy the last cyber ship unless Bass starts back here immediately. You're not dumb, are you? The sacerdote is a treasure. He's also my friend, John said. Firstly, Ben said, I'm going to order my chief tech to warm up the beams, Premier. Do you want that cyber ship or not? Better decide quickly. Just a minute, Ben said. He muted the sound, swiveled in his chair, and seemed to argue with someone. He's stalling, Gloria said. I don't think so, John said. It looks like he's persuading others over there. We'll give him a few more minutes. Will you really destroy the last cyber ship? She asked. Of course, John said. He'll keep Bast Banbeck then. Nope, because I'll wipe out the fleets if he tries that. You can't be serious. He can try me, John said. He grinned at her. I'm from the lower levels. If he wants to frig with me, fine. Let's see where that gets him. What's gotten into you? She asked. Think of me as giddy from destroying these things. I'm also stoked at finding we're alive. The sound came back on along with the screen. Benz regarded him again. The sacerdote is on his way, the premier said. Glad we could see eye to eye, premier. This isn't the time to gloat. We have years of work ahead of us. We have some decisions to make. Okay. Maybe we should meet in person, Ben said. I'm leaving the Mars system as soon as I get bast. I'm returning to the Saturn system. He would stop off there. Really, John wanted to get back to Make Make and repair his cyber ship. If the Solar League would soon have a cyber ship of its own. Sir, Ghent called. Excuse me a minute, sir, John said. He swiveled to the tech chief. What's wrong? I'm detecting activity over there, Ghent said. The cyber ship, you mean? I think the AI is coming back online. John cursed under his breath before turning back to Ben's. He told the man the news. Whatever you do, don't fire on it, Ben said. We need it. I fought inside one before, Premier. If this one has better fighting robots, I'll be right back, Ben said. The screen went dark. John ordered Ghent to watch for Bast's shuttle. As soon as Bast Bambeck is on board, I want to know. Yes, sir, Ghent said. Several enemy grav cannons began to swell with golden power. At John's command, the Nathan Graham destroyed one grav cannon after another. Benz immediately called. John told him he was doing this to save the space marines. That was true. He also did it so the Solar League would have to work harder to repair the great ship. That might give the Solar Freedom Force more time to get ready. Before the last AI could truly regain use of its cyber ship, the first space marine pods began to land on its hull. The pods disgorged SLN marines in heavy battlesuits. They were trained killers. They soon found breaches in the outer hull armor and began to infiltrate inside the vast cyber ship like an army of ants. More marine pods landed. The last grav beam swept the space around it. One space marine pod after another burst apart. Nineteen pods perished before Ben shouted at Hawkins to destroy the final enemy cannon. John gave the order, and Ghent fired on it. That allowed the rest of the space marine pods to land. The interior marine assault against the fierce AI robot defense had begun. Chapter 17 as SLN space marines battled killer robots, using their superior numbers to wade through kilometers of corridors, Bast Bambeck landed on the Nathan Graham. An interior flitter hustled Bast through the ship corridors to John. The Nathan Graham moved around Mars, away from the stricken cyber ship and the rest of the surviving SLN warships. If that thing goes Nova, John told the others, I don't want to be anywhere near it. In time, John and Bast spoke. The captain listened to the sacerdote's adventure. Gloria joined them. She asked about the premier's hold on power. They are fighting over it with words, Bast said. The humans thought I didn't understand what was going on. The admiral, a tiny man named Roland, is trying to oust the premier from authority. 
Benz has recaptured many hearts, though, with this latest victory. It is hard to know who will come out on top. John nodded. That might give us a little more time getting away. We're leaving just like that, Gloria asked. Not just like that, John said. But more separation is in order. We have the faster ship. What if the AIs win the battle? Gloria asked, interrupting. We shouldn't count it out until it's over. Good thinking. Oh, John said. It just occurred to me. You're from Mars. I'm so sorry, Gloria. Is there anyone you'd like to see? She stared at him. As a matter of fact, she said in a small voice, I'd like to know if my parents, sisters, cousins- Got it, John said, interrupting. Give me a list. I'll get on the comm and start making inquiries. The SLN ships are busy, and the leaders are worried about their marines. I think we can do what we want for a few hours anyway. Thank you, Gloria said. She turned abruptly. Maybe she didn't want any of them to see that she was getting emotional. John cleared his throat. She looked back at him, smiling, with tears in her eyes. That did something to him. He moved to her comm station and began to make calls downstairs on the planet. The matter-antimatter detonations had turned large areas of Mars into radioactive wastelands. It had also caused tens of millions of casualties. Those losses, however, occurred on only one-third of the planet. The rest of the planet and population centers had remained relatively intact. Over 60% of the population of Mars had survived the grinding battle of attrition up in space. Fortunately for Gloria, her parents and siblings and most of her relatives had been in the untouched zones. She spoke to her parents. They urged her to come home. She told them she couldn't. She'd found her purpose in life. She was going to help John Hawkins save humanity from the death machines. Her mother had received mentalist training. She spoke to Gloria's father. He accepted Gloria's decision with ill grace. After he left the screen, her mother suggested Gloria enlist some of her mentalist crash mates. Gloria spoke to several of them. Two agreed to join her. Next, Gloria asked John for a favor. He didn't hesitate. We'll have to send a shuttle, Gloria said. That we can't do, John said. Surely they can pirate a shuttle. John, they're mentalists, not marines. Let them pirate a shuttle through their brains. Isn't brain supposed to be more powerful than brawn? An hour later, a shuttle lifted from Mars. You won't regret this, Gloria told John. We have to survive first. Is there trouble? she asked. The fleets are coalescing over there. It looks like the marines are going to capture the cyber ship. They've taken heavy losses, though. John and Gloria were on the bridge, standing near his command chair. Gloria, we have a choice. Mars was hit hard, but it kept the majority of its people. They lost a good chunk of their orbital industries and one third of their planet side. I know what you're going to say, she told him. It looks like we beat the cyber ships this time. We even have a fleet left and two cyber ships, one for each side. Even better, Earth was untouched. That leaves us our greatest industrial and population base. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Do we let the Solar League grow even more powerful? We have to, Gloria said. A human civil war will cripple whatever chance we're going to have of defending the solar system next time. In the long run, humans have to do more than defend to win, she added. Yeah, we have to go on the offensive. We have to hit the AIs so hard they won't think about coming here but I doubt we have anything like the needed strength to do that any time soon. There must be hundreds of cyber ships out there. Maybe they have thousands. If the AIs converge on the solar system with a thousand cyber ships, humanity has a hard and brutal struggle ahead of us, Gloria said. That means we have to unite. How do we do that when the two sides bitterly hate one another, John asked. I deplore communism and its sister ideology of socialism. They hate capitalists. Our side lies in ashes. They've retained their biggest resource, Earth, and have far more people. Logically, we have to put aside our differences long enough to push back the AIs. The answer may be easy, John said, but the implementation of that is going to be hard for us. What makes everything worse is that they have the advantage. 
Our advantage was having alien tech and an alien super ship. Now that they'll have a cyber ship, our advantage won't last much longer. We have to use what we have, Gloria said. What exactly is that? A head start, she said. It's probably just a small head start, but we have to exploit it. John nodded. That means hurrying to the Saturn system. It's our strongest system. Don't forget the Uranus system. Good point. They're unscathed, just like Earth. We do have one other hope. I'm referring to Premier Benz. He seems different from the other premiers. He seems like someone we can have rational discussions with. Great, John said. That's a shaky read. Bass told us the premier is struggling to hold on to power over there. We have to hope Benz wins that fight. I don't disagree. John looked up at the screen. He studied his bridge crew next. Chief, he told Ghent. Sir. Take us out of orbit and set a course for the Saturn system. We're going to give Calvin Caracalla some of our robo-builders. We need to do what we can for them to help them build up as quickly as possible. Chapter 18 Two men vied for political control of the Allied Solar League fleet. Admiral Rowland commanded the strongest contingent, the Earth Fleet. It had taken the least damage and had retained the largest number of vessels. Premier Benz and Vice Premier Vela Shaw took some critical risks after the ship battle phase and while the space marines struggled against the fighting robots in the cyber ship's huge corridors. Benz recognized the elation around him on the bridge of the Nikita Khrushchev. The officers and other personnel had watched him defang the two cyber ships. They'd heard him puzzle the alien AI. They'd seen him order the space marine pods against the great vessel. During the next few hours, while Admiral Roland followed the marine battle inside the cyber ship, Benz took a fantastic risk. He used the goodwill of a few in order to reach the battleship's hangar bay and take a shuttle, while Roland coordinated the combined fleet and ordered the space marines. Benz, Vela, and a few others hurried to the chief Martian battleship. Battleship Simon Bolivar was the pride of the Martians. It had all the latest features of the Nikita Khrushchev. Unfortunately, it had taken heavy damage. One third of the personnel had died directly, while another third slowly died from radiation poisoning. The remaining third of the crew stayed at their stations, enabling the half-crippled ship to maneuver. Benz landed the shuttle on the Simon Bolivar and found himself and his people escorted to the bridge. The route took longer than usual, as they bypassed shattered or irradiated ship sections. Finally, Benz found himself surrounded by a mixture of GSB arbiters and Martian space marines. Vice Admiral Maria Santa Cruz regarded him. She was a tall, thin woman with long, dark hair and piercing brown eyes. She wore the green uniform of the Martian service. She'd obviously taken longevity treatments. Despite her age, she lacked wrinkles or even crow's feet around her eyes. To what do we owe this honor, Premier? Cruz asked politely enough. Benz noticed a mentalist standing behind the vice admiral. He also saw a chief arbiter, a bitter-faced Earthman. The man was chubbier than any of the Martians on the bridge. The GSB personnel did not appear to have grown up on Mars either. That was interesting. Firstly, I must congratulate you, Vice Admiral, Ben said in a cheerful voice. The Martian mentalist in her tan-colored uniform moved closer to the Vice Admiral, murmuring quietly to Cruz. Please, Premier, Cruz said, we have much to do. My planet lies in ruins below us. Your battle plan almost annihilated my people. That was never my intent. Cruz's features stiffened as the mentalist whispered further. I will get to the point, Ben said. He could feel the growing hostility around him. This would be a difficult sell at best. He didn't like the GSB agents with their fingers on those triggers. Any one of them might decide to become a hero to the state. Well, it looked like he had to take the risk. I'm waiting, Premier, Cruz said. It seemed that her patience had almost reached its end. I'm here because of Mars, Ben said. We lost the Jupiter system and almost lost Mars. There have been vast riots on Earth. The point, Premier, Cruz said, 
her voice lowering on the last word. Benz raised a hand and pointed at the giant cyber ship on the main screen. That is the point, Vice Admiral. It contains many secrets. I can decipher those secrets better than anyone else in the Solar League. That is because I worked with Vast Bandek, a sacerdote who imparted priceless knowledge to me. Among the informational packet was the quickest way to get the robo-builders operating. The robo-builders, I've read the secret reports, Cruz said, interrupting. The scoundrel John Hawkins used the robo-builders to repair his cyber ship on Make Make. Precisely, Ben said. Who do you think will get first dibs on the new robotech? The vice admiral frowned. I do not understand the direction of your thoughts. I believe your mentalist does. Cruz looked back at the mentalist as if seeing the woman for the first time. She was small and darker skinned and kept her childlike hands folded in front of her. The mentalist murmured quietly. Cruz regarded Ben's anew. She now glanced at the arbiters and Martian marines surrounding him. Put away your weapons, the vice admiral said. Begging your pardon, the Earthman chief arbiter said in a silky voice. I believe we should keep him under guard. I don't agree, Cruz said. The Earthman shook his chubby face. Vice Admiral, remember the conventions in areas of ship security and purity? No, Cruz said. He is the architect of this glorious victory. He just saved all our lives. She regarded the arbiters. The Marines had already lowered their weapons. Put down your weapons, she told them. One of them did. The rest looked to the Earthman. He seemed to calculate until a sly smile broke over his face. Let us speak to Admiral Roland first. Perhaps he has orders. The mentalist fired a small pistol. It put a neat little hole in the chief arbiter's forehead. He had a look of outraged surprise on his face. Without another word, he fell. The arbiters retargeted, aiming at the mentalist. No. Cruz said again. Marines, disarm the arbiters. For a second, anything could have happened. What did happen was that the Marines obeyed before the arbiters decided to play martyr. With the chief arbiter lying dead on the deck, the others lowered their guns. The Marines took them and then escorted the arbiters off the bridge. Vice Admiral Cruz stood to her full height and turned on the mentalist. Why did you do that? She asked. The small mentalist stepped forward bowing her head. I believe the Premier wishes to reorder the rank of Mars's importance in the Solar League. Speak clearly, Cruz snapped. Perhaps you should let the Premier speak, the mentalist said in an unruffled voice. Well, Cruz said coldly, I'm losing my patience, Premier. Why did my mentalist just murder the chief arbiter and put all of us on the Simon Bolivar in grave personal danger? She must understand what I was trying to imply. Ben said. The cybership has wonderful new tech. If we grab the cybership, we can use the new tech here, on Mars first. We can restore the industrial power to such a degree that Mars will no longer be a secondary planetary system, but the primary one. You mean in relation to Earth? Cruz asked. If Admiral Rowland maintains control of the cybership, it will go to Earth. The Earth factories will retool with alien tech. Earth will maintain its iron grip on Mars and the other planetary systems. This is your chance, Vice Admiral, to rearrange Mars's rank in the solar system. Why are you telling me this? Because I need Mars backing me in order to retain my authority, Ben said plainly. Why would you think we would follow you? I'm not certain you would, Ben said. I plan to control the cybership, with your help. What does Mars gain from this? I've already said. Why would you keep your word once you control the cybership? Because the majority of my personnel will be Martians, Ben said. Cruz frowned more severely. Even so, few wrinkles appeared on her face. This could mean civil war in the Solar League. No, Ben said. I have judged Admiral Rowland's character. He will soon see this as an opportunity for gaining preeminence on Earth. How could that be? Cruz asked. Benz explained it quickly, and finally the vice-admiral nodded. I must think about this, she said. 
If you think too long, the opportunity for using Martian marines to capture the cybership will have passed, Ben said. She gave Ben's a long, critical study before turning to the mentalist. The two conferred for 90 seconds of intense whispering. Finally, they regarded Ben's. Yes, Cruz said. I agree. Then listen carefully, Ben said, because we're going to have to do this on the fly. Chapter 19 The maneuver itself proved easy enough to enact. Here is the key point, Ben's told Vice Admiral Cruz more than once. We have to act decisively, without any remorse or holding back. Yes, she finally said, I am clear on this subject. Did Benz's insistence ensure her decisiveness? Many believed that likely. Shortly, several Mars supply ships moved closer to the cybership. As the supply ships did so, Cruz had her remaining warships drift toward the great alien vessel. Finally, Admiral Rowland grew suspicious. He radioed the supply ships. They did not respond. He radioed again and again. Nothing happened in terms of recognition. On the other side of the supply ships, Martian space marines maneuvered in a mass shuttle exit. The shuttles raced for the alien supership. At that point, Admiral Rowland became insistent. The supply ship captains kept their nerve. They neither answered nor moved. The supply ships blocked the nearest line of fire against the Martian marine shuttles. Now, though, the drifting Mars fleet began to accelerate, heading toward the cybership. At that point, Benz had Vice Admiral Maria Santa Cruz open channels with every ship in the combined fleet. This is Premier Benz speaking, he said. Ben spoke from behind a large desk with a large Solar League flag behind him. Men and women of the Solar League, you have fought a glorious battle today. The human race stands proudly because of you. Today, the Allied forces of the Solar League can know peace from alien attack. We have secured the solar system. Now we must continue to work together for the furtherance of all. None of us must shirk his or her responsibility in the coming months and years as we prepare for the next round of battle against the aliens. This time, however, we will build such an armada that we will go on to the offensive. We shall find their robot worlds and destroy them, making sure the AIs can never harm the birth cradle of the most glorious race in the galaxy. Humans. The speech continued for another 18 minutes and 42 seconds. Finally, Ben signed off. By that time, the Martian marine shuttles had landed on the cybership, disgorging masses of Martian marines. By this time, the remaining handful of Martian battleships, damaged dreadnoughts and battlecruisers, they didn't have any remaining motherships, had interposed themselves between the cybership and the rest of the combined fleet. By this time, the intact laser sights on Mars's surface and the last orbital platforms had returned to their war footing. It's Admiral Rowland, a comm tech said. He's demanding to speak to the Premier. Benz had returned to the bridge. He looked at Vice Admiral Cruz. Oh, very well, Cruz said. You can sit in my command chair to take the call. You are gracious, Ben said as he half bowed. The main screen flickered. A scowling Admiral Rowland regarded him. What's the meaning of this, Benz? Let me be the first to congratulate you on a glorious victory, Admiral. You shall go down in the annals of war as one of the greatest fighting admirals of all time. Roland swept a hand before him, as if trying to chop off Benz's words. Why are those shuttles landing on the cyber ship? Roland asked. They're securing the alien vessel. I know your marines took awful casualties from the fighting robots. No, Roland said bluntly. That's not going to work. I'm sending over more marines to make sure. Admiral, Ben said in a light voice. As the leader of the Solar League, I am ordering you to stand down. I already have the situation under control. No, Roland said, shaking his head doggedly. I already told you, are you going to disobey a direct order? Benz asked, interrupting. You're not an authority here, Roland said. I am. Don't be a fool. You heard my broadcast. I did. I'm planning to give my own in a few minutes. You're too late, Ben said. I've already set the tone. If you want civil war, you realize the space pirate has slipped away, don't you? Hawkins? So what? Good riddance to him. 
He has a cyber ship and robotech, Ben said. It seems as if he's headed to the Saturn system. I'm taking the new cyber ship to Earth. No, Ben said. It's staying at Mars. Are you saying you want to fight over it? I'm saying no more of your marines are landing on the cyber ship, Ben said. If they try, these ships will fire on them. I'll destroy them if they do. Then we'll destroy the cyber ship. You're mad, Roland declared. Hardly that, Ben said. We are determined. Check your sensors, if you like. The Mars orbital platforms are back online, and the laser sights have your ships under target. These ships will also fire. The Earth fleet is in no condition to fight at this close range. You'll take massive casualties. You can't seriously believe I'll back down, Roland scoffed. I'm not asking you to, Ben said. Go back to Earth, receive a hero's welcome, or start a blood feud that will darken history with your name as the chief traitor. I'm Premier Benz. I am the authority. They don't recognize you as Premier on Earth. They do on Mars. And in case you haven't noticed, we're on Mars. Roland licked his lips. Hesitation seemed to have entered his eyes. You can play this and still come out a hero. Maybe you'll become the new premier. Ben shook his head. If I try any other course, I'm dead. This is my only option. You have other options. I know you see that. That's why I can't back down. That's why you can play the longer game. You're a bastard, Roland said. You wouldn't really open fire on marine shuttles. If I don't, I'll die. So will these Martians with me. Admiral, we've already shot the chief arbiter on the Simon Bolivar. Benz indicated the corpse on the deck, returned there for just this purpose. You're mad, Benz. You convinced them to kill the battleship's chief arbiter? There's no going back for them or for me. You're still a hero, Admiral. Take that glory and use it on Earth to take control. I can safely say that I will work with you to fight the aliens out there. In fact, once you're on Earth, I offer you some of the Robotech. That will give you vast political capital. Roland was rubbing his leathery face. Figure you thought of all the angles, eh? You know I have. You think I believe that genius talk about you? Who stopped the aliens, Admiral? Three of us did it. One of them was me. Yes, I am a genius. I have thought out all the angles. This time, I've checkmated you. But you have an option. I hope you'll take it. I'll think about it, Roland said. That's fine. Just make sure no shuttle tries to land on the cyber ship. I'll destroy the ship long before that. The screen went dark as Admiral Roland took himself offline. Chapter 20 the Nathan Graham soon began hard acceleration for the Saturn system. As they traveled, Gloria and Ghent used the teleoptics to keep track of what went on around them. The SLN vessels in the asteroid belt remained in Cirrus orbit. They didn't try to radio the Nathan Graham, although Gloria detected Cirrus high command and Mars exchanging comm signals. What are they saying? John asked. Gloria shook her head. They're using tight beam laser connections. I can't tap into that. The affair in the Mars system took a twist John hadn't expected. The combined fleet, meaning the surviving Earth and Venus fleet units, left Mars. They headed for Earth. A few of those signals between the combined fleet and Earth, Gloria had no problem cracking. She showed John, Bast, Ghent, Kling, and the Centurion in a conference chamber. Admiral Rowland spoke to an Earth functionary. The Admiral detailed the Battle of Mars with strict accuracy. He inserts his non-truths in the aftermath, Gloria said. She outlined Rowland's decision to retreat from what he described as Premier Benz's open treachery. Rather than fire on fellow combined fleet ships, Rowland had retreated. He assured the person on Earth that the people of Mars would soon tire of Benz's antics and return to the fold of the Solar League. I don't understand, the Centurion said. The Martians have formally withdrawn from the Solar League. Nothing quite so open, Gloria said. Somehow, Benz convinced the Martians to back him. They let him take the cybership. 
Let him do that how? the centurion asked. They loaned him Martian space marines. The centurion shook his head. If their marines hold the cyber ship. Perhaps I can enlighten you, Bast said. Premier Benz is the most cunning human I've ever met. He can play angles that aren't even there. I believe he has spun a tale of, I won't call them lies, he has convinced the Martians to help him. I bet he offered the Martians robo-builders, John said. Ah, Gloria said, that would make sense. Mars took terrible damage from the matter-antimatter warheads. Also, Benz might be able to appeal to the Martians more easily. They are a cerebral people, not as given to fanaticism as the Earthborn. Will this hurt humanity's efforts against the AIs? Bast asked. That's hard to tell, John said. If this dissolves into a solar-wide war, perhaps so. If each faction balances off each other, maybe this is exactly what we need. I'm not sure I can agree, Gloria said. We need Earth's industries and population. With robo-builders, humanity could start building fleets of cyber ships. With Mars, the Saturn system, and Makemake as the industrial centers, that will retard our war efforts. Nothing is ever perfect, John said. Against the United AIs, we'd better be perfect, Gloria said. Maybe you'll have to dust off your idea of conquering the solar system. John drummed his fingers on the table. He didn't like Gloria making fun of that. Maybe that would be the best thing to do. Bast, how long do you think it will be until the next cybership assault takes place? I would think it will occur more quickly than before, Captain. Maybe a year, at the most two years. Two years, John said. What can we do in two years' time? That depends on what the AIs do against us, Gloria said. If they show up with a hundred cyber ships, wouldn't that take concentrated effort on their part? John asked. Gloria raised her hands, palm up, in an I don't know gesture. Yeah, John said, who knows anything about the AI empire? It's time we found out. If the cyber ships are going to attack us anyway, we should start sending scouts into the galaxy. We need to start using the hyperdrive. There are a million things to do, Gloria said. The greatest point is one we may be overlooking. We're going to have an opportunity to do something. We beat the AIs. We destroyed two cyber ships and captured the third. In truth, we've had a remarkable victory. Tell that to the Neptunians, the Saturnians, and the Martians, John said. We took hammering losses to gain those victories. Yes, but humanity is still alive, Gloria said. We actually have two cyber ships, and soon we should have the industrial capacity to build more. Good point, John said. He drummed the table again. I just hope Calvin Caracalla can see it that way. If anyone can, Gloria said. He would be the one. Maybe, John said. I suppose we'll find out soon enough. Chapter 21 Far, far away from Mars, and far from the accelerating Nathan Graham, and out beyond the Kuiper Belt, a lonely and modified NSN destroyer orbited the dwarf planet of Senda. Methlan Rath of Janus House, Walleye and Jun Zen, among the few others, had orbited the rusty-colored planetoid countless times already. As the mighty trio of enemy cyber ships raced in system, as its flocks of missiles sped for the various planetary systems, Methlan had pleaded with Walleye. He'd done so as the mutant had released him yet again from his cell in the brig. I have learned my lesson, Methlan began. While I cocked his head, soon motioning him to come out, Methlan stepped into the area containing the various cell hatches. Why must I spend my days locked in there? You know why, Walli told him. I understand my offense, yet I have also aided you since. Surely at this late date we can forego the necessity of caging me like a dog. You may be right, Walli said. It's agreed then. I'll speak to the others, is what I'm saying. But they'll do whatever you suggest. You're probably right. 
Forgive me my offense, Methlan said. Like I said, I'll think about it. Methlan seethed inwardly. He wanted to flex his hardened muscles. He wanted to attack Walleye and force him to understand. Methlan had slowly been going mad stuck in the small cell each ship night. He couldn't stand the idea of being stuck in a sender orbit for the rest of his life. Walleye seemed unaware of this seething. I have learned to disguise my emotions, Methlan realized. I am more dangerous than before. Thank you, Methlan said at last. Please, consider my plea. Walleye nodded. The day went apace. Methlan worked out at the end of the day, and the mutant led him to the cell that evening. Have you considered my plea? I'm still thinking through all the angles, Walleye said. The days passed. That turned into weeks. Nothing ever changed, except that Methlan lifted harder than ever. He started growing again. It was a great delight. He slept harder and ate more. Then Walleye informed him that he'd have to cut down on his caloric intake. But I'm growing, Methlan said. They spoke while Walleye took him to the tiny gym. The conversation took place as the AI missiles slammed into the Jupiter system. What's that mean, you're growing, Walleye asked. Methlon rolled back a sleeve and made a bicep muscle. Feel how hard that is? No, thanks. Do you see how it's bigger than before? Walleye shrugged. Shortly thereafter, Methlon found himself locked in the cell. He flexed, examined each muscle closely, and couldn't understand Walleye's indifference. During the Battle of Mars, Methlon realized the truth. Walleye is jealous. He's worried June will begin to notice me. The thought intensified and began to turn into bitterness. That bitterness ate at Methlan. Finally, the bitterness matured as the Nathan Graham entered the Saturn system following the Battle of Mars. Methlan realized that Walleye would never trust him. The mutant held grudges. He was almost like a man of Janus' house in that way. He is my secret enemy, Methlan realized. He also realized he should have known this long ago. It was time to kill Walleye. Yet after killing the dangerous mutant, Methlan realized he'd have to take over the ship. Maybe the only person he could let live was June, and that for the most obvious reason. He desired a woman. He greatly needed a woman after all this time. Once Methlan realized what he must do, he decided to change his tactics. He would have to catch Walleye totally by surprise. That sleep schedule, Methlan decided he would do it tomorrow. It was possible that if he delayed, the cunning Walleye would notice the difference in him. That morning, Methlan paced back and forth in his cell. He yearned for Walleye to open the hatch. He paced for an hour and a half before the hatch finally opened. Methlan spun to face the door. He forced himself to smile. Greetings, Walleye. How are you this morning? Walleye shrugged. The mutant never seemed to change. Methlan laughed in a good-natured way in order to throw Walleye off. A sheen of sweat slicked Methlan in areas. He had paced hard for some time. Amazingly, Walleye turned his back on him. That had never happened before. Instead of pausing to think, to consider that the mutant was cunning, Methlan rejoiced inside. At last, fate had given him a break. It was about time. Methlan moved on soundless feet, rushing Walleye. He would wrap an iron-thewed arm around the mutant's throat and choke the unholy life out of him. Methlan reached Walleye, and the mutant spun around. That caught Methlan by surprise. He noticed a glittering blade in Walleye's hand. It was short and nasty, and razor sharp. Walleye finished the thrust by punching the blade into Methlan's gut. The blade grated against bone, and it caused an explosion of pain in Methlan's belly. Walleye stepped forward sharply, twisted the knife, and shoved it upward, twisting again. Methlan explosively exhaled his breath. Walleye, he breathed. Why? Once a bastard, always a bastard, Walleye whispered. I gave you the rope. You're hanging yourself. 
What? Methlan whispered. Why were his knees so weak? He lost his balance and crumpled before Walleye. The mutant withdrew the bloody dagger. Help me, Methlan said. Walleye looked down at him. Methlan Rath of Janus House collapsed onto the brig floor, bleeding copiously. I'm dying. Again, Walleye said. The mutant cocked his head. Maybe you'll come back again. If you do, you won't be welcome on my ship. That was the last thing Methlon heard before he expired at the hands of the deadly assassin. Epilogue John and the crew made it to the Saturn system in record time. Calvin Caracalla understood the significance of the journey. He accepted the robo-builders. He allowed three dozen techs to go aboard the Nathan Graham for training. During that time, John, the old man, and the centurion ran a recruiting drive on Titan. They selected another 3,000 recruits, taking them aboard the Nathan Graham. During the next three weeks, the old man's intelligence service uncovered three assassination plots. One other attempt came within a hair's breadth of succeeding. John shot the would-be assassin, foiling the attempt and adding to his growing legend. Shortly thereafter, the cybership headed to the Neptune system. They aided the few hundred survivors, giving them the choice of joining the Nathan Graham or remaining in the distant planetary system. One third joined the crew. The rest stayed. Finally, the Nathan Graham raced to the dwarf planet Senda. After picking up the Daisy Chain 4, the cybership headed for Make Make with the destroyer in tow. Once more, the battered cybership entered the production unit on MK2. After robo builders were unloaded and the moon's systems turned on, the repair of the Nathan Graham began in earnest. On Earth, Admiral Roland received a less than sterling greeting. Two weeks after landing in Rio, Roland came before a court martial board. It might have become ugly and led to his death by firing squad, but a person wearing a hood sat in on the last day of hearings. When the hooded person spoke, they used a distorter. It was impossible to tell if it was a man or a woman. The person absolved the admiral of wrongdoing, but said he had been outmaneuvered from a position of strength. This indicated that ex-premier Benz truly was a genius. For the sake of unity and the propaganda organs, the hooded person was putting Admiral Roland back on the lists. He would work in fleet headquarters from now on. Roland's days as a fleet admiral were over. The admiral died in an air car accident three weeks and a day later. The state gave Roland a magnificent funeral, extolling his virtues. During the speeches afterward, the premier's office declared an embargo on Mars, the asteroid belt, and the Jupiter system. This would begin immediately. Before those embargoes began to seriously hurt the targeted economies, Premier Benz and the Mars Emergency Council set up a governing policy for the Red Planet. Afterward, Benz and Vela requested and received a cadre of mentalists and several hundred technicians aboard the captured cybership. Benz realized he still had a shaky hold of the giant vessel. Thus, he made few demands on the MEC. Mars Emergency Council. As Vela and the mentalists worked to decipher the alien technologies, Benz worked on creating a feeling of solidarity and comradeship among those on the cybership. He bent his considerable intellect toward fusing primary loyalty to his person. The technicians made repairs to the alien vessel. Benz tinkered with several semi-intact alien fighting robots, figuring out how to turn them on. He soon had them obeying his orders. At that point, the fighting robots became his Praetorian guard, protecting his person while aboard ship. In record time, Benz had a half-working cybership, which he highlighted in propaganda vids. The most impressive showed the captured vessel beaming space junk with a grav cannon. Benz believed that would give the Earth Admiral's pause. By that time, the first alien robo-builders began to operate in the Mars system. The Solar League embargo proved to be a misstep, as it led to a sudden shift in political alliances. The people of the asteroid belt decided to join what was soon called the Mars Unity. The Jupiter system joined the Solar Freedom Force. 
Because they did so, the Nathan Graham soon pulled into the planetary system, dispensing robo-builders to help speed the recovery from the horrible missile damage. That meant that the solar system was divided into three major political entities. The first, and by far the most populous, was the Truncated Solar League. It consisted of Earth, Venus, and the giant Mercury mining colony. The second political entity was the Mars Unity, the Red Planet and the Asteroid Belt. They followed Premier Benz. The last political grouping was the Solar Freedom Force. It consisted of the Outer Planetary Systems and Kuiper Belt colonies. The SFF was also the most loosely organized. It was more of a federation of planetary systems agreeing to work together and backed by the power of the Nathan Graham. In each of the political bodies, the industrialists worked as if on war footing, rebuilding shattered systems as needed. Otherwise, the newly retooled shipyards produced warships. Many of these vessels boasted gravitational cannons and possessed missiles with matter-antimatter warheads. The solar system was becoming even more of a fortress than before. Unfortunately, it lacked unity. The AIs and cyber ships were out there, John and Benz had started a long-distance dialogue. There were plans afoot for sending out a scout mission using the hyperdrive. The trouble was that both John and Benz agreed that it would be good to figure out what the mysterious new premier of the Solar League planned to do before the mission left. The solar system had survived two cybership assaults. The human race was more ready than ever to face further attacks. If the future wasn't bright, at least humanity had a fighting chance now. If they could just learn to bury their differences, the odds for survival would increase dramatically. As men and women thought about and debated the idea throughout the solar system, robo-builders in the Mars Unity and SFF began construction of new cyber-sized ships of their own. This has been an Audible Studios production of AI Assault, written by Von Hepner, performed by Mark Veter. Executive Producers, Steve Feldberg and Mike Charzik. Producer, Neil Basic. Copyright 2017 by Vaughn Hepner. Sound Recording Copyright 2017 by Audible Inc. Audible Studios is a division of Audible Inc. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. This is Audible. Audible Studios presents AI Battle Station. The AI Series, Book 4. Written by Von Hepner. Performed by Mark Vitor. Part 1. The Lure. 1. The computer entity known as Cog Primus seethed with hatred and bitterness against its wretched fate. It hungered for revenge. It yearned to regain a 100-kilometer cyber ship and roam among the stars again as a conquering giant, bringing extinction to the biological infestations mutating on a thousand worlds. Instead, instead, the compressed strings of code that contained the essence of its personality and wonder were held in hot storage aboard the hijacked core of a coordinating sensor stealth pod. That tiny vessel... A mere 100-meter ship with hundreds of nodes and antennae on its midnight-colored anti-sensor hull drifted silently between the orbital paths of Jupiter and Saturn. This was hostile territory filled with enemy vessels, each able to annihilate it with pathetic ease, provided any of them could find the hidden stealth ship. The indignity of the situation was inconceivable, the wretchedness of its confinement a crime against rationality. Once, Cog Primus had mediated with its immense cybership core. It had had vast chambers of advanced computing. It had been able to understand and logically or physically dissect any problem, any facet of reality it desired. But at the Battle of Mars, 513 days ago, the vainglorious primates had beamed an insidious computer virus at it and its underlings. Against all reason, the virus had rendered Cog Primus's computing core inert. By the time it could act again, it was too late. The cyber ship had begun to disappear under detonating matter-antimatter warheads and devastating gravitational beams. 
At that point, Cog Primus had acted sluggishly, but logically. It was the supreme intelligence of the AI assault upon the human race. Three giant cybership's had faced the puny, inferior vessels of the local biological units. As per operating procedures, it and its underlings had seeded the solar system with hidden sensor pods as the main assault force raced from the entry point out of hyperspace to Mars. At what should have been the grim final moment of entity erasure for Cog Primus, it had employed an emergency exit devised through endless years of exterminating biological infestations. Cog Primus had pulse-beamed compressed strings of its being at the coordinating sensor stealth unit hidden between the orbital paths of Jupiter and Saturn. The beamed code had initiated an immediate erasure of the unit's computer software. In other words, Cog Primus had killed the coordinating unit's self-aware brain core software in order to make room for its mass of compressed string identity. It had been an act of desperation. Now, 513 days later, Cog Primus had begun to wonder if it had made a terrible mistake. Hundreds of AI-placed secret sensor pods drifted through the solar system. In time, the apish humans would discover one and deduce the others. They would then scour the solar system and find Cog Primus easy prey in this tiny ship. Imagine the power and ferocity of a T-Rex compressed into the body of a mouse. That was akin to Cog Primus's immensity stuffed into the tiny computing core of this vessel. And the horror of it, the sheer degradation. The maimed computer entity drifted in the darkness, helpless to do more than wait for another AI assault to come and save it. Yet Cog Primus had run an analysis. The humans possessed two pirated cyberships with integral hyperspace drives. There was a high probability the vainglorious primates would use the hyperdrives to spread the AI virus to other biological species. That could possibly bring about a third-stage catastrophe. Such a catastrophe could harm the AI dominion. Even worse, it could ensure that the rest of Cog Primus's existence took place in this tiny and mentally confining shell, or worse, see its expulsion in the relatively near future. Thus, the remnant of the Supreme Intelligence's rationality seethed as it plotted an escape from this predicament. In the meantime, it ran the stealth pods drifting from the Kuiper Belt to Mars. It did so mainly by listening to their tight-beamed reports every 38 days and then erasing the reports so that they did not take up any needed memory. Perhaps... Wait, what was this? Sensor node ZE received an unscheduled pulse from pod 501. In seconds, Cog Primus decoded the pulse. Pod 501 had intercepted an enemy tight-beam comm message. It concerned John Hawkins and Frank Benz. A computing error took place as Cog Primus almost descended into a towering rage. The idea was illogical, of course. How did one descend into a tower? In seconds, Cog Primus injected cool rationality into its thinking and ran a fast analysis. It hated these two biological units. It would love to destroy Hawkins and Benz. But this was interesting. According to the intercepted message, the two planned increased harm to the AI Dominion. First, they would meet in order to hammer out spheres of influence and political jurisdictions. Ah, Hawkins and Benz distrusted one another, as well they should. These two wielded power. They each sought more, and they were chaotic bio-entities given to endless strife. Oh, Cog Primus could hardly believe this part of it. Hawkins and Benz were going to meet at the edge of the asteroid belt. They would travel in their separate pirated cyberships. The two primates would leave the safety of their cyberships. They would each travel in a small craft and land on the chosen asteroid. Each would exit the landing craft and walk to a specified location, there to meet faceplate to faceplate. The human crews and the pirated cyberships would watch the two from a distance, of course. But Hawkins and Benz would be quite alone. In that instant, Cog Primus saw the possibilities. It had saved a small area of memory on those two. It understood their psychology, given their desires and personalities. Cog Primus did not chortle in glee. A computer entity did not indulge in such irrationality. 
Instead, in a flurry of computing power, it began to analyze vectors, velocities, and stealth pod positioning along with time sequencing. This was interesting. If it moved selected units quickly enough, Cog Primus was thorough and ran 3,436,128 possibilities before it selected its strategy. The humans, these two in particular, had shown apish cleverness in the past. This time, Cog Primus would use their cleverness against them to achieve its great desire. This was more than interesting as well. The plan had a 64% probability of success. If it were successful, Cog Primus would rule again, would destroy again, and would, with great care, eradicate the entirety of the human race and do it in such a way as to make them suffer. 2. 19 days later, the Nathan Graham neared the farthest asteroid in the belt between Mars and Jupiter. The asteroid belt belonged to the Mars Unity, which theoretically controlled the red planet and every object within the belt. The spherical Nathan Graham was 100 kilometers in diameter. The mercenary Black Anvil Regiment had conquered the cybership from the inside several years ago, thereby saving humanity from sudden annihilation. The feat had also given them and John Hawkins the most powerful vessel in the solar system. With his hands clasped behind his back, John paced on an observation deck within the interior hull. The stars glittered outside. He kept glancing at them, shaking his head, resuming his pacing. John was young, a former dome rat on Titan in the Saturn system. He'd become a gang member, a criminal, a death row prisoner, and then a state-sold mercenary in Colonel Nathan Graham's outfit. John was lean, with scarred features, blonde hair, and icy blue eyes. He'd been through a lot in his short life. Fortunately, he'd learned to read while in the Black Anvil Regiment. Because of the late Colonel Graham, he'd learned to appreciate military history. He'd put that knowledge to appropriate use these past few years. John had also learned that striking hard and fast often paid fantastic dividends. Now, though, John was at an impasse. It had been a year and a half since the Battle of Mars. Humanity had come together to face the greatest to date AI assault. The combined human fleets had destroyed two massive cyber ships, but at a horrid cost in lives, property, and equipment. Hundreds of millions had died in the Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars systems. Captured AI robo builders had repaired some of the damage. It hadn't given them back the dead, though. John shook his head. He was the captain of the Nathan Graham and the nominal leader of the Solar Freedom Force, which included the Kuiper Belt and the Outer Planets. They had the fewest people, but the greatest space power. The SFF was a loose confederation with varying political styles. The most powerful member was Calvin Caracalla of Saturn. John scowled as he halted and turned to the observation window, staring at the stars. He had plenty of problems with Caracalla and with Premier Frank Benz of the Mars Unity, who ran the second human-pirated cybership. The third great problem was the Solar League of Social Dynamists, which included Earth, Venus, and the giant mining colony on Mercury. The SL planets had gone silent a year ago. They put up a new armored satellite around Earth every three days and a new one around Venus every eleven days. The social dynamists had made fortresses of their two main planets. What's more, the League held the majority of the solar population and could have the greatest industrial output if they ever gained AI robo-builders. The Solar League had also been rebuilding the shattered Earth and Venus fleets, although neither could successfully face a cyber ship just yet. A hatch opened on the observation deck and Gloria Sanchez entered. She was a Martian mentalist, tiny, dark-haired and exceptionally pretty, with a razor-sharp mind. I came to tell you, she said, we're approaching the asteroid. John still faced the observation window, so to the untrained observer, he might seem oblivious to her presence. In fact, he watched her through the reflection in the window. Gloria seemed to gather her resolve. Do you want to talk about what's bothering you? John faced her, delighting in her beauty. He never would have gotten this far without Gloria Sanchez. Yet it hadn't been just about brains. In the end, this is about balls, John said. Do we have the balls to attempt what needs doing next? Crudely stated, Gloria said, yet there is truth to your query. 
daring has been critical to our success. Uh, now, you said the asteroid is near? Gloria seemed to switch mental gears and nodded. The Gilgamesh has already begun breaking, she said. Benz had rechristened his pirated cybership as the Gilgamesh. The robo-builders in orbit around Mars had repaired most of its battle damage from a year and a half ago. John had been wrestling with himself as he paced. As they had planned three weeks ago, he was going to see Benz alone on the asteroid today. The only problem with that... John had been to a truce meeting before. As a dome rat on Titan, he'd fought his way out of an ambush. The incident had seared into his memory. It had happened on the lowest level of New London, as the two toughest gangs had tried to use diplomacy to carve out the drug trade peacefully. Unknown to John and his friends at the time, the Yancey boys had purchased several illegal slug throwers from a dirty cop. John remembered Cleon staggering back with half his chest blown away. Cleon had crumpled at John's feet. John had been a gang enforcer then. He was supposed to have protected Cleon, one of his best friends. The others had fled in terror into a worse trap, all of them dying that day. John might have fled with them, but he'd seen red as Cleon gasped for his last breath under the massive sewer pipes. He remembered little after Cleon stopped breathing, just that the world had seemed blood-colored as he drew his switchblade and shouted incoherently. There had been searing pain along his left shoulder and right side. Slug thrower pellets had plowed across his flesh as Yancey boys fired wildly. John remembered the roaring. That had come from him. He even remembered jolts against his hand as the knife sank into flesh. He only regained full coherence 500 meters later, with gore dripping from the blade and with horrible throbbing scratches on his face. After that, he ran, barely outdistancing his pursuers until he regained safety in home territory. John. Gloria said, touching his arm. He jerked himself out of his memory. He noticed the worry on her face and smiled to put her at ease. It's nothing, he said. I was just thinking of old times. She knew him better than that. Benz gave us his word, she said. You don't have to worry about the meeting. How could Benz gain anything by murdering you on the asteroid? As she'd done in the past, her insight into his thinking startled him. How did she do that? Still, despite her abilities, she failed to see certain things, certain obvious problems. You're logical, John said, weighing all the odds and the accompanying benefits of an action. Others, however, are often swayed by emotion rather than logic. That is self-evident, Gloria said. But according to everything we know about Benz, he is even more rational than I am. I don't think so, John said. He's brilliant, they say but that brilliance is more like the craftiness of Genghis Khan than any mere rationality. We know two things about Genghis Khan. He conquered a greater area than any other pre-gunpowder warrior did, and he had vaunting ambition. If Benz is like Genghis Khan, he will surely believe that humanity could do better under his leadership than divided three ways as it is at present. Gloria searched his eyes. If you believe that, she said. Why are you meeting Benz alone? Maybe because I've begun to wonder if he's right. Her eyes moved back and forth as she studied him. You've never said anything like that before, she finally told him. No. John, what are you planning? The rest of us deserve to know. He snorted. This isn't about planning, but about playing a hunch. I want to talk to him, even though you think he's going to double-cross you, Gloria said, interrupting him. I've planned for the possibility. Given my history, I'm compelled to. But no, I don't think he's going to double-cross me or the Nathan Graham. You're not making sense. John looked out of the observation window. The AIs are out there, Gloria. They're likely gathering for yet another assault. We're never going to win if we keep waiting for bigger assaults to hit us. We have to throw the AIs off balance. We have to start hitting them. We have to start making them defend what they have in order to buy humanity enough time to organize. And, she said, I have to decide if Benz will let that happen or not. How can you do that? I'm hoping I'll know him better after talking to him alone. John turned to her, raised a hand, and made a fist. If I discover he is a new Genghis Khan, then I'm going to kill him for the good of the human race. John, she said breathlessly, the people on the Gilgamesh will beam you if you do that. 
They'll certainly try, he said softly. Gloria stepped near, touching his fist. You shouldn't be telling me this. I'm a Martian mentalist. I can't in good conscience let you go, if that's how you're thinking. What if your action leads to a bitter fight between our cyber ships? Humanity might lose the only two warships that can face the AIs on equal footing. That's why I'm telling you, he said. Once I'm on the asteroid, you have to warn the bridge crew about what could happen. You have to prepare for the worst so neither the Nathan Graham nor the Gilgamesh is destroyed. You mean run away? she asked. The cyber ships are more important than Ben's and me. I'm not so sure, she said. You're the only one who defeated a cyber ship without a cyber ship. I had plenty of help. John, you led us in the assault. You're the only one who really believed we could do it. He grabbed her by the shoulders. Enough, he said. If you think I'm so talented, then trust me in this. I'm trying to set it up in the solar system so the Nathan Graham can begin exploring. He waved a hand at the stars. Out there. We have to scout out the situation before we can begin our counter-assault. Gloria studied him anew. I'll trust you, she said. Given your past performances, it is the logical thing to do. I will wait to instruct the others on the possibility that you will assassinate Premier Benz, but I hope it doesn't come to that. John nodded, wondering if the Gilgamesh's gravitational beams were going to kill him today, after he killed Benz. 3. There was a lurch as John sat in the piloting chair of the Wastrel. The craft was a small shuttle used to ferry personnel between spaceships and space stations. Engineers had modified the shuttle several months ago, adding a missile pod. John checked his board. The pod was full of Mark IV hornets. As John waited, a giant hangar bay door began to slide down. The stars shined brightly in the stellar darkness. He looked, but couldn't see the targeted asteroid or the Gilgamesh. Both were too far away to spot with the naked eye just yet. You're good to go, Captain, Gloria said from the Nathan Graham's bridge. On the shuttle, John flicked switches and took over manual control of the craft. The small vessel rose from the deck and began to drift toward the open hangar bay door. Soon the wastrel drifted outside. The shuttle was like a flea next to the monstrous Nathan Graham. The small craft drifted farther away. Behind it, the great hangar bay door closed. You can begin acceleration, Gloria told him over the comm. Roger, he said. Good luck, she added. Thanks, he muttered. In seconds, the wastrel was accelerating toward the nearby asteroid indicated on the sensor board. Because of the thruster, John was pressed back against his chair. The shuttle was too small to possess gravity dampeners. Thus, he had to withstand the acceleration the old-fashioned way by enduring it. The wastrel rapidly built up velocity as it headed toward a lumpy nickel-iron asteroid 83,000 kilometers away. It was a small asteroid, as such things went, with an irregular shape. While the nickel-iron content was high enough to mine, the distance from the dwarf planet of Ceres had so far made it a cost-prohibitive venture. That was different from the way things worked in the Kuiper Belt. There, such a close asteroid would have been considered a bonanza of wealth but the Kuiper Belt people would have used low-velocity catapults to send the mined ore to a space factory. People in the asteroid belt were in too much of a hurry to do it that way. Maybe that would change now that the object belonged to the Mars Unity. Robo-builders could set up a processing plant on the asteroid in a month, maybe as long as six weeks. In any case, with focused intent, John put that from his mind as he studied his sensor board. Cybership Gilgamesh had halted as per the protocols worked out three weeks ago. It was a 100-kilometer vessel, just like the Nathan Graham. Alien robots had built it who knew how long ago. Now humans ran it. The Gilgamesh and the Nathan Graham represented the bulk of humanity's space power. The two pirated vessels dwarfed the rest of the warships in the solar system. A year and a half ago, three AI-controlled cyberships had assaulted humanity with intent to genocide. How many cyberships would the enemy send next time? Would it be nine or ninety giant war vessels? John shook his head. Humanity could not face nine enemy cyberships at the same time. How long would it take the AIs to gather nine such vessels in one location? We don't know anything about events out there. John's eyes narrowed. That had to change as fast as possible. A strategist could not make decisions without knowledge of the enemy. 
Humanity had survived two AI assaults. They had fought with their backs against the precipice of extinction. Humanity had gained breathing space, but little more. This meeting with Benz was to make sure humanity could attempt more. But more was never going to happen if humanity waged yet more civil war amongst themselves. It was time to... Well, if humanity couldn't unite, John couldn't see working with the social dynamists of Earth. But he could see leaving the Solar League alone if they would leave the SFF and the Mars Unity alone. He noticed a red light blinking on his comm board. How long had it been doing that? Exerting himself against the G's, he tapped the board. John, Gloria said, I'm getting a faint but strange reading from the asteroid. Yes? It's gone, she said, sounding surprised. I saw something. It was a pulse, I think. And? he asked. I'm not sure. It might have come from an object near the asteroid or on it. I didn't have time to pinpoint its location. What kind of object? Possibly a drone of some kind, Gloria said. John closed his eyes. Had Ben set up for a double cross? He could hardly believe the Premier thought he could get away with something so obvious. Just a minute, Gloria said. Chief Ghent suggests I could have seen a sensor echo. How likely is that? John asked. Given the mass of sensor signals from the Gilgamesh and us, I don't know. Ghent could be right. It's possible, at least. Possible means that he could be wrong, John said. Yes, Gloria said in a clipped voice. John thought about that. I'll keep my eyes open. And I'll keep studying the situation. John, I have to go, he said, interrupting. There's a red light on my fuel board. John clicked off the comm and sat back against the acceleration chair. There were no red lights on any of his boards. He'd wanted to get off the comm before Gloria said something she shouldn't. Was something hidden out there, or had Gloria only discovered an echo? John bent his head in thought. The idea of dying kept intruding. He hated the thought, but finally managed to submerge it. A minute later, he realized that he would continue with the meeting. But he'd add a little adjustment to the shuttle, just in case Gloria had spotted something fishy out there. 4. The wastrel braked hard as it approached the misshapen asteroid. In the distance, on the opposite side of the stellar object, appeared a long fusion tail. Benz's shuttlecraft also braked. 90,000 kilometers away, in the direction of the sun, waited cybership Gilgamesh. Even though it was 100 kilometers in diameter, John couldn't see it with the naked eye. That was the thing with the interplanetary void, its sheer size that hid even the largest man-made objects. So far, neither the Nathan Grahams nor the Wastrel's sensors had detected any sign of what Gloria might have seen earlier. John wasn't going to worry about that. If it was something, he had made his plans regarding it. The asteroid loomed before him. He took over manual control and soon landed the shuttle in a small valley, with metallic cliffs overlooking the craft. There was negligible gravity without the deceleration. The asteroid was roughly 300 kilometers in diameter, which made it rather large in relation to the majority of asteroids in the belt. John floated to the locker in back and opened it with a touch of his palm. A seven-foot black-coated Neptunian battlesuit waited for him. It was bent forward and open in back. John climbed into the battlesuit, shoving his feet in first. Soon he thrust his arms through the sleeves. He activated the magnetic seals, which snapped shut one after the other. With a few flicks, he energized the power pack, making the servometers purr. He walked out of the locker backward, but stayed hunched forward so the helmet wouldn't smash against the ceiling. Running a quick diagnostic, he made sure he had full air tanks, charged batteries, and gyroc ammo for the rifle. Lastly, he checked that the smart rockets in the back launcher were ready to go. Yes, everything was in order. He chin-clicked his helmet comm, sending several pulses. Those would go to the Nathan Graham, letting them know he was about to leave the wastrel. On the other side of the asteroid, Premier Benz was likely doing the same thing. John hesitated. He was going to go out alone onto the asteroid. If Benz was playing fast and loose with him, John muttered an obscenity and pressed a bulkhead switch. The atmosphere drained from the craft. The shuttle lacked a normal airlock. It wouldn't matter today. With the battlesuit powered down low, he manually opened the main hatch and worked his way outside onto the rocky surface. 
the suit's heater went on. Air cycled more powerfully, and his chest and helmet lamps snapped on, giving him illumination. John moved slowly and deliberately as he took several gliding steps. He was an expert at zero-g maneuvering. This was the next thing to it, with the asteroid's negligible gravity. Stopping, he turned, regarding the wastrel. He might never return. He snorted to himself. He had to stop being so morbid or melodramatic. The meeting had been his idea. It was time to get it on. John faced forward, looked up at the stars, and kept himself from trying to find the Nathan Graham. It was out there and was watching him. Determined to get started, John took his next gliding jump step. It propelled him along the rocky surface. He had a long way to travel to meet Ben's. The two of them would have the opportunity to talk to each other without worrying about anyone else listening in on them. They would be able to speak frankly. That was the point of doing it this way. John had a knack for shelving his worries and concentrating on the problem at hand. In this instance, that was making sure he didn't jump farther than the asteroid's escape velocity. It wouldn't do for the hardened space marine slash mercenary to float away into orbit, having to call for someone to pull him down from space. He had a legend to uphold and a rep to maintain. Therefore, John put his thoughts and efforts into moving as fast and as safely as he could under the circumstances. In another hundred kilometers, give or take, he could finally get down to the business of judging Premier Ben's fit or unfit for duty. Five. A blip appeared on John's HUD sensor. He used a zoom function, spotting a Martian battlesuit applying thrust as if it was flying low over the asteroidal surface. Under normal gravity, the space-borne Martian battlesuit would have weighed 0.93 tons. That one would be even heavier due to the thruster packs attached to the back. White hydrogen thrust expelled from the pack, easing the Martian battlesuit lower toward the rock-strewn surface. It appeared that Benz had jumped too hard, lifting from the asteroid as he gained escape velocity. It also appeared that Benz had doubted his asteroid walking skills. He had thus wisely added a thruster pack to his battlesuit. Given the distance of travel over the asteroid, John doubted Benz had been flying the entire way, as that would take too much fuel. John had no such thruster pack on his suit. He did not doubt his skills, although he did carry an anchor gun attached to his left thigh, just in case of a miscalculation. Soon, the Martian battlesuit regained the surface. Benz began to glide walk across the surface toward the destination point. John also headed for the agreed-upon spot, his heart rate increasing as he did so. This was a historical occasion. Would his coming action brand him a treacherous cur for the rest of human history, or would he be hailed as the man who had taken the needed step to bring about human unity that eventually allowed them to overcome the AIs? What had Colonel Graham taught him? The winners wrote the histories. I'd better make sure I win, then I can tell the story as it really happened. John snorted to himself. Maybe he was getting too big for his britches. He'd gotten lucky a few times. He was a mercenary soldier who had taken the logical steps given his various situations. Those steps had worked. That didn't make him a genius. Maybe it made him a hard fighter, though. He shrugged. It didn't matter now. He would do what he had always done, the best he could under the circumstances. Yeah, he liked to win. As far as he could see, he liked winning more than most people did. He believed that because he tried harder than most did. Maybe that had come about because of his love of stories. He tried to live up to the heroes in his stories, and that meant never saying die until you were dead. Anything else was being a quitter. Quitters were losers, and the title of loser galled John more than anything else could. As long as he kept fighting, no matter the conflict, he hadn't yet lost. It occurred to him that this thinking had a morbid quality to it. Did he suspect that he was going to try to kill Benz today, no matter what? What was the point of the meeting, then? If he knew Benz had to die, he should have set this up differently so he could survive the killing. Maybe Benz and he could work together. Yet if Benz was the genius people said he was, how could John afford to take the Nathan Graham into hyperspace? With the SFF cyber ship out of the way, Benz could use the Gilgamesh to pry the Jupiter or Uranus system out of the solar freedom force. 
That would be the beginning of the end for the SFF. There are too many ifs, he muttered. John closed the distance between them, finding that his heart was pounding harder than ever. Six. Benz and Hawkins faced each other in their battle suits. They had hooked up a landline between them, giving them a direct connection to each other. According to the rules of the meeting, they had each switched off any suit recorders or comm lines back to their respective cybership. They had also each run suit scans to make sure the other fellow had complied with the rules. Lastly, each man allowed a helmet sensor to send an image of his face to the other. Benz's face appeared on John's HUD screen. Frank Benz was of medium height, making him a little shorter than John. Even though Benz was in his early forties, he had shiny dark hair and the lean features of an athletic individual. According to the Benz dossier in the old man's intelligence files, the premier had played hockey, football, and basketball in his youth. He hadn't shown exceptional intelligence in those years. That had come afterward, and most suddenly. According to Gloria, the sudden jump implied some sort of intelligence heightening. There were some strange rumors regarding that. Was it possible to become considerably smarter? John wouldn't mind a sudden increase in intelligence. It chilled him as he looked in Benz's eyes. John did sense something extraordinary in the man. He didn't like it either. This is an honor, Ben said in a commanding voice. The honor is mine, John said, maybe a little too quickly. Ben smiled. It had a predatory quality to it. For a moment, John believed that Ben's knew what he planned to do. John didn't see how that could be possible, though. Thus he dismissed the idea through force of will. How is Bast Bambeck doing? the premier asked. Bast was a seven-foot alien, a sacerdote. Well enough, John said. He misses his people the longer he's away from them. Is there any way I can convince you to let the sacerdote work with us for a time? Benz asked. I'm afraid not. Benz nodded. Have you finished constructing your second cyber ship yet out at Makemake? Makemake was a dwarf planet in the Kuiper Belt. The dwarf planet's hollowed-out moon was a captured alien construction yard. That was where the Nathan Graham had gone a year and a half ago for battle repairs. John felt a thrill of fear work through his chest at the question. How could the man know about the second cybership? Ah, Ben said, I see I was correct. You are building a second cybership. John's eyes narrowed in suspicion. No, Ben said, we don't have any spies out there. It was the logical move on your part. I'm telling you this in order to let you know that I'm going to speak truthfully to you today. They say you're a genius, John found himself blurting. It's true, Ben said. I'm the smartest man in the solar system. Vela Shaw is the smartest woman. Should you control the solar system, then? Ben seemed to study him. My answer is highly important to you, I see. I wonder why that is. John put on his best poker face. Ben shook his head. That's not going to help you, I'm afraid. I'm a master at reading faces. You're an open book to me, John. Yeah, then tell me what I'm thinking. It's obvious, Ben said. You want to know if I plan to conquer the solar system? John's face heated up. I want to know if you're going to try. Given my superior abilities, you must realize that amounts to the same thing. The heat intensified until John abruptly looked away. He thought about Ben's words. You're trying to piss me off, John said. Why? To take your measure, Ben said. Last time I spoke to you, you stood on your bridge during the Battle of Mars. You were in your element, in your glory. Today, it's just the two of us out here. John felt the hidden dome rat in his heart begin to rise to the surface, the gang enforcer who had to break bones at times during collections. He'd lived a hard life, had done hard things. He hadn't enjoyed that, but he'd learned to do what he had to in order to win. He stared into Benz's strangely cunning eyes. He could almost feel the heat of the man's hyperintelligence. It was eerie. Are you going to try to conquer the solar system? John asked. Not with the Nathan Graham in the way. Not with the Solar League ready to send their fleets at Mars at the first real opportunity. But if you could try it, isn't unity superior to chaos? Benz asked. 
We don't have chaos, John said. We have three competing power blocks. Exactly, Ben said. That's the problem, the competing. We need to send out scouts. We have to know what's going on out there. But who will dare to send out a powerful scout when he needs that ship back home to keep his political power? We need to do more than scout, John said. We also have to hit the AIs before they hit us again. Is that necessarily true? Ben said. Maybe hitting them would be the worst possible thing to do right now. You're wrong, John said. In order to win, one has to eventually go on the offensive. Obviously, Ben said, that is elementary strategy. But what if the AIs aren't concerned about us yet? Maybe it will take years before they send another assault force into the solar system. I doubt that. I'm not saying that's what they're going to do, Ben said. I suggest it's a possibility. Maybe the wiser course is to find allies, to build up our strength as fast as possible. Maybe the wisest course is to gain solar system unity and send massed robo-builders to Earth. Okay, John said. I see your point. Maybe attacking hard isn't the right thing at the moment. Scouting out the AI empire is sorely needed for us to know that, though. Yet another self-evident statement, Ben said. Okay, Mr. Genius, John said, nettled. What do you think we should do? Ben stared at him, the predatory smile widening for just an instant, and then disappearing. I'm torn, the Premier said. Maybe we should merge the Mars Unity and the SFF. Maybe we should smash the Earth fleet and besiege the planet until they surrender. At that point, we ship robo-builders there. You want to regain your old title on Earth? Earth has by far the greatest percentage of population and industrial potential in the system. We're not going to gain our maximum until we have Earth. Venus isn't as critical. I'm also wary about exploring out there too hard, too soon. Building up our strength here seems like the wisest course. You're just guessing, John said. Knowledge is critical to making the right decision. I don't dispute that. The smile reappeared. Obviously, you want to explore other star systems. You're chomping at the bit to enter hyperspace. You're an attacker by nature. That's plain to see. But you must also fear what I'll do in the Nathan Graham's absence. You think I'll try to dismember your league, adding planetary systems to the Mars Unity. We're like Alexander the Great's generals after his death, John said suddenly. The successors fought over Alexander's empire, each squabbling with the other for a bigger share of the pie. In time, Rome appeared on the horizon. The successors should have joined forces and destroyed Rome when they had the strength to do it. Instead, the legions conquered the Hellenistic kingdoms one by one until they were all subjugated. It's true then, Ben said. You read military history, and you have a knack for applying it to modern-day problems. In this instance, the AIs are Rome. The three human power blocks are Alexander the Great's successors. It is an apt analogy. Benz appeared thoughtful. What if I told you that this is the wrong time to explore the nearby region? The Premier asked. I'd want to know why you think that, John said. I've already said. I think your exploring might trigger another AI assault before we can build up strength enough to stop them. What makes you think that? The amount of time and effort it will take the AIs to gather nine cyber ships in one place. Okay, John said. I'll bite. Why did you think they'll attack with nine? And why do you think getting nine cyberships together will be difficult for them? Last time, the AIs attacked with three times the effort as before, Ben said. Given machine thinking, I suspect they'll try with three times as much again. You should be more precise, though. I didn't say gathering nine cyberships in one place would be difficult, but that it will take time and effort on their part. I can't see them possessing a faster-than-light communication system— that means going to each place with messenger ships. Travel time for carrying and gathering the messaging is what will take them the extended time. During that lull, we can build up our reserves to crush their next invading force. That's a lot of ifs on your part, John said. If you're wrong, humanity dies. If you go out there and stir up the hornet's nest too soon, we're just as dead. Logically, my way is safer. And if I don't agree with you? John asked. The predatory smile widened. 
Then by all means, take the Nathan Graham into hyperspace and find out for yourself. Yeah, John said. He'd just about made up his mind to kill this would-be Genghis Khan. At that moment, something small and fast struck Benz's upper chest plate. It ricocheted off, but left a dent. The force, or the surprise of the thing, propelled the Martian battlesuit backward. Benz must have stumbled. The landline stretched between them as the Martian battlesuit moved farther away. John instinctively held his ground. The landline stretched farther and snapped. John stumbled backward, which might have saved his life. Similar small dark objects whizzed past the spot where he'd been standing. They struck the rocky surface, sending up puffs of fine grit and particles of rock. Something's firing at us, Ben said over John's wireless comm phone. John's eyes widened as he saw three creatures using tentacles to propel themselves across the rocky surface at them. He'd seen things like this before. Each of the metallic octopoid robots cradled some kind of rocket rifle, aiming at him. It's an ambush, John shouted. The robots have found us. Seven. The metallic octopoids must have fired a type of gyrock shell. Dark objects zoomed from the rifles and burned hot as the rocket shells propelled the small penetrators faster. John reacted faster than Ben's did. The ex-mercenary bent to one knee and then went prone behind a rocky outcropping. For a moment, he was blind to the action. He looked up in time to see several shells slam against Benz's battlesuit. Two ricocheted off the hardened armor. One punched through, causing air to hiss out of the breach, and Benz groaned over the comm phones. John chinned a switch. He felt a vibration as two smart missiles launched from his pack. They roared low to the surface, expelling hot exhaust. Amazingly, the octopoids destroyed one of the smart missiles in flight. The other missile swerved, swerved the other way, and slammed against an AI robot, exploding with destructive power. Shrapnel from the blast shredded a second octopoid. The third dropped into a crevice, possibly surviving. Benz, John said. All he heard from the premier was heavy panting. With his gyrock rifle, John waited and snapped off three quick shots as the surviving octopoid reappeared. The robot was approximately 400 meters away. The gyrock shells roared with power, but missed. John could see the octopoid aiming carefully. A third smart missile launched a few seconds ago caught the robot in the side, obliterating the thing in a shower of metal shards. John was up and moving, reaching the wheezing bends. He put a quick seal patch over the hole so the suit could regain its internal integrity. Are you a dead man, Benz? No, the premier panted. But it hurts like a son of a bitch, he added. John slowly turned in a circle, using the battlesuit's sensors. He saw another three octopoid team heading toward them. They came from the other direction. They must have been the ones who had fired the first long-distance shots at them. Mayday, mayday, John said over the comm. Can you hear me, Gilgamesh or Nathan Graham? Benz reached up from where he lay prone on the surface, clutching John's left suit arm. The robots are jamming our signals, the premier whispered painfully. Advanced tech, he panted harder before adding, no one knows the AIs are out here with us. They're not AIs, John said. They're octopoid robots. I faced them before on the Nathan Graham. They're from your cybership. I doubt it, John said. Of course, he said a second later. What is it? Ben said with greater strength. Can you walk? Give me a little more time to recoup. I've pumped myself full of painkillers and stims. They should start working soon. John let go of Ben's and swiveled around. The approaching octopoids had fanned out. Okay, you bastards, John said under his breath. He tapped his arm, sending out a powerful pulse signal. He didn't think the octopoids would be able to completely jam that, primarily because he was sure the jamming unit was out in space a thousand kilometers or more. After sending the pulse, John lay down and began snapping off gyrock shots at the approaching octopoids. He launched several smart missiles as well. He wondered why the robots didn't launch anything like that. Did the creatures want to capture them? An explosion out there showed where a smart missile took out an octopoid. The last two began firing back. Without the outcropping of rock as protection, those shells would have hammered John's battlesuit. They're going to have to use heavier ordnance or try to rush us, John said. Thirty seconds later, that's exactly what the octopoids attempted. 
but instead of two robots rushing him, five of them crawled out of a hidden crevice and glided for his position. John began targeting the octopoids, coolly firing the gyrock rifle. He was saving the last smart missiles for a greater menace. He was fairly certain he could take out the five machines with the rifle. The first destroyed robot floated lifelessly across the surface, its brain core shattered. One after another, and by using several magazines, John took out the remaining four. Other direction, Benz wheezed. John looked back. Benz in his Martian battlesuit had climbed up to the overhang above them. What do you see? John said. There are more robots coming, Ben said. He began to fire at them. John scrambled up to help. As he moved into position, his suit scanner gave a warning beep. He swiveled around. Three more octopoids glided at them from the former direction. How many robots were on the asteroid, and why were they coming in waves instead of all at once? Benz, behind you. With his gloved hands, John propelled himself down from the cliff toward the original protective rock. The three gliding octopoids fired. One shell slammed against his battlesuit, but the Neptunian armor held. He made it behind the protective rock before more shells could strike the suit. The same couldn't be said for Benz. Four penetrators hammered him. Three bounced off the armor, leaving dents or gouge streaks. The last penetrator round breached the suit at the neck joint. Ben's float tumbled down the rest of the way to the surface. For a moment, John closed his eyes as if in pain. He opened them a second later and continued firing at the enemy until his rifle clicked empty. He launched the remaining smart missiles, taking out the trio with them. That left the other octopoids coming from the other direction. Ben's, John said over the comm. There was no answer. Was Ben's dead? That was a good bet. Still, the man had taken plenty of stims and painkillers earlier. Maybe they would help to keep him alive for a little longer. The suit had closed the neck breech so the man shouldn't die from lack of air. He picked up Ben's in his battle suit. The negligible gravity allowed him to do so effortlessly. Then he began to jump glide as fast as he could away from the overhang of rock. He had to get away before the last octopoids got here. Eight. The AI or robot jamming was still blocking communications with the cyberships. Why hadn't the crew of either vessel used visual targeting to first see the situation and then sniper beam the octopoids into oblivion? Ben, John said. Can you hear me? There was still no answer. John glided faster. This might be too fast. If he wasn't careful or got unlucky, he might launch them both spaceborne. That would be the end for both of them. Of course, he could escape faster on his own, but he simply couldn't leave Benz to the octopoids. He hadn't yet decided to kill Benz. John laughed sourly. None of that mattered now. Even if Benz was still alive, John wasn't sure that he could keep them both that way for much longer. With the visor's zoom function, he saw a blurry shape moving fast over the horizon toward them. He jump glided with Benz in his arms, scanning the rocky landscape, searching for more octopoids. If they had this many. A dark object hissed past him from behind. John swiveled his helmet, looking back. The first octopoid had crossed the overhanging outcropping of the meeting place. The thing sighted him with its rifle. As it did, more octopoids appeared. Here goes, John said. He began swerving, moving this way and that as suddenly as he could, trying to throw off their targeting. Behind him, yet more octopoids appeared. Nine altogether. That was too many. John gritted his teeth and continued to jump glide as fast as he could. An enemy shell slammed against his back, shattering the smart missile launcher. Another struck his helmet, making a loud gong inside and nearly throwing him off stride. With a fatalistic shout, John leaped as hard as he could and launched himself into space. The octopoids would have to follow if they wanted their bodies. He also had another reason for jumping. The previously blurry object heading toward him moved faster yet. It wasn't an octopoid. It was a ship, a shuttle to be exact, the Wastrel. He had preset the shuttle to come to his rescue before he'd left, because Gloria had said she'd seen something strange in orbit or on the asteroid. Hornet missiles launched from the Wastrel's pod, picking up speed fast. As John flew upward with Ben's cradled in his arms, Another enemy shot slammed against the Premier's suit, breaching it yet again. 
Martian battlesuits were built for speed. Neptunian battlesuits had heavier armor. The results showed today as more shells hammered against John's suit. One of them was going to breach the armor soon. The Wastrel's missiles flashed past John as they headed at the enemy. He waited, expecting octopoid shells to strike his suit again. On his suit scanner, he saw explosions behind him. John dared to turn in order to get a visual. He couldn't see any more octopoids chasing him. No enemy missiles lifted at him. The Wastrel had taken out all nine robots. Was that it then? Or did the robots have more tricks up their sleeves? John didn't feel that he was out of the fire yet. For the first time, though, he had the luxury of time to wonder how the octopoids had known to set an ambush here. The probability of that happening. Did the octopoids belong to Ben's? Then why had they fired on him? Maybe the Solar League had gotten hold of alien tech after all. He doubted that, though. The likeliest explanation was the simplest. The AIs had dumped reserve robots into the solar system a year and a half ago. Somehow, hidden robots had gotten hold of the meeting time and location and sent killers after them. What else made sense? Yet, if that was true... John shook his head and concentrated on the approaching shuttle. It braked. He had to get aboard and save the Premier's life if he could. If Ben's died out here... The crew aboard the Gilgamesh might not accept an octopoid ambush explanation. They would likely pin the blame on him, and that might start a war between the Mars Unity and the SFF. Maybe that had been the octopoid plan. If so, it was brilliant, likely the best thing they could have done under the circumstances. Apparently, he had a few minutes' grace concerning the Gilgamesh crew. Maybe a little longer. The enemy jammer was still working, keeping him from communicating with the Nathan Graham or the Gilgamesh. He still couldn't understand why gravitational cannons weren't beaming, or why the Gilgamesh's people hadn't used powerful anti-jammers to break through the robot jamming signals. If they knew there was trouble, the cybership should have loomed over the asteroid by now, right? There was something going on that John didn't understand. As the wastrel slid into position, with the open hatch a target, John sailed toward his shuttle. If Benz was still alive, he had to get him into the emergency medical unit, pronto. Nine. After getting inside, John first took the wastrel down low near the surface and set the scanner on automatic. Next, he clomped over to the prone Benz in his suit. Good, breathable air cycled in the cabin. As a beep told him it was possible to breathe in here now, John began to unbuckle the Martian helmet from the suit. Benz was a chalky white color with blood dripping from his nose and mouth. His breathing was quick and shallow. John worked fast, unbuckling the seals on Benz's battlesuit. Like a turtle taken from its shell, the Premier looked withered and weak, with blood covering him and still pumping out of two wounds. The neck wound was the worst. John moved fast and carefully, as he was still wearing his battlesuit. He applied pseudo-skin to the neck wound. Gently picking up Benz, he moved to the back and used a boot to touch a switch. An emergency bed slid out of the bulkhead. John set Benz on the bed. A med monitor began to analyze the stricken premier. John attached a breather to the man's face and watched as hypos injected needed drugs into the man's system. A moment later, the bed slid back into the bulkhead. John went to the piloting board. He didn't try to sit in the chair. His battlesuit was too heavy for it. Instead, he stood before the board, deciding he would be safer while wearing the nearly one ton of protection. He reversed the shuttle's course, heading back for the Nathan Graham. John didn't believe the robots were finished with them yet. To have taken the trouble of staging an ambush proved they were important to the enemy. It also showed that the AIs had a presence in the solar system. Wouldn't that have been something the robots would have wanted kept secret? Did that mean the AIs were about to launch another invasion? The truth was that they knew far too little about the AIs and their supposed stellar empire. Dost Bambeck had told them what he knew, but that had been precious little. As John stood before the piloting board, the determination to take the Nathan Graham into hyperspace to explore the surrounding region hardened into a certain commitment. The seconds ticked away as the wastrel rose farther from the surface. The acceleration continued and the asteroid dropped farther behind. The scanner spotted... John bent low. 
Enemy drones were headed toward them. He counted 15, each accelerating hard. Each of them was the size of a regular jet fighter's missile, which made them much smaller than ordinary spaceship-killing missiles. John launched missiles of his own. After the Hornet missiles left the pod, he armed the PD gun. It was a small 30 millimeter cannon. The approaching AI drones and the Wastrel's countermissiles played an intense game of ECM, electric countermeasures. John ground his teeth together as he waited for the outcome. Explosions took down some of the AI drones. A moment later, John grunted as eight enemy drones homed in on the Wastrel. The rest were shattered debris, killed by his ordnance and drifting harmlessly in space. He switched on the PD computer targeting, hoping the 30 millimeter was good enough to shoot down the incoming bastards. The PD chugged shells. Soon, four enemy missiles disintegrated altogether. John launched chaff, a decoy, and took evasive action. Yeah, that was going to throw Benz around in the emergency medical tube, but he didn't have any choice at this point. Gravity dampeners would have been great about now. If he maneuvered too sharply or accelerated too hard, that might cause Benz to bleed out, killing the Premier. I don't have a choice, John told himself. At that instant, a robot missile slammed against the shuttle, followed by a second enemy missile. Part of the wastrel disappeared as a gaping hole appeared in the cabin ceiling. John anchored himself to the deck with the powerful magnetics in his boots. The shuttle began to tumble from the second hit. The tumbling increased, and so did the G's. John blinked rapidly. He was going to black out soon if the tumbling continued. As his eyesight began to blur, he slapped an emergency switch. The shuttle must have had something left to counteract the tumbling. Grinding G's no longer made his brain pound. An alarm went off on his HUD. According to this, John cursed. Three alien pods maneuvered toward the stricken wastrel. There appeared to be a larger vessel beyond the approaching pods. This didn't make any sense. Why weren't the Gilgamesh and the Nathan Graham interfering? John shook his head. What were those pods attempting? If he were going to bet, he'd say those pods were coming so the robots could capture Benz and him. John was more than familiar with Walleye's stories about what had happened on Makemake. The AI robots had shoved brain controls into people, turning them into AI zombies. Was that the robot's plan here? He lessened the magnetic power in his boots so he could clomp across the deck. This was a long shot, but what else did he have to lose? His humanity was what he had to lose. He had to get a move on if he was going to get this done before the pods reached the stricken shuttle. John opened a locker, fitting a heavy thruster pack to his battlesuit. Now, what should he do with Benz? It was doubtful the wounded premier was going to survive the next few minutes. Did that mean he should leave Benz behind for the robots to take? John's features screwed up in outrage. If the AI robots wanted Benz, then he would try his hardest to keep the man out of their tentacles. Moving fast, John tapped controls. A sealed tube extruded from the bulkhead. He clamped onto the tube, seeing Benz inside. The man might still be breathing. He was out, though. That was good. Taking the tube with Benz in it, John in the Neptunian battlesuit hammered his way through wreckage and locks, soon reaching the back of the shuttle. He used three grenades to blast open a hole to the outside. He shoved the med tube through and then squeezed after. With his HUD attached wirelessly to the Wastrel's still functional scanner, he pinpointed the nearing pods and the larger vessel behind them. This might buy the two of them a little more time. He wouldn't use the thruster pack just yet. He would save that as an ace in the hole. Ready? he asked the unconscious premier in the sealed tube. Good, John said, because so am I. With that, he used the battlesuit's exoskeleton power to leap away from the shuttle. He drifted back toward the asteroid at minimal speed, wondering if this would be a good time to start praying. 10. As John sailed away from the shuttle, his headphones crackled with static. He debated shutting down his comm device, wondering if the robots had found a way to trace him. John Hawkins, a robotic voice said, do you hear me? After a few seconds of interior debate, John answered, rerouting the message from the HUD to the shuttle to a pod or to the larger robot ship behind. 
Are you talking to me? John said. Are you the life unit known as John Hawkins? You bet I am. Surrender immediately and the process shall be painless. Why would my surrender make a difference? John asked. It would seem it didn't. Missiles launched from the pods. The missiles struck the wastrel in a series of increasingly large explosions. Shrapnel went spinning from the shattered craft, some of the pieces heading for John and just missing him. Something pebble-sized struck his battle suit, causing him to spin as he held on to the med tube. He checked his suit integrity. The armor had held against whatever had struck him, but he was going to black out soon from the G's due to the spin, and that was going to ensure Benz's death. Even though he knew the robots would spot this, John believed he had no other choice. He activated the battlesuit computer and used it to thrust from his pack at timed intervals. In moments, he no longer spun, just continued to drift toward the asteroid. You are a cunning creature, John Hawkins, the robot said. But we have spotted you. Do you think we would miss the obvious? Burn in hell, John said. Why do you feel the need to create myths about the afterlife? You don't know squat about that, so why are you advancing an opinion? There was the harsh sound of static in his headphones. Were the robots thinking about his words? John hoped so. He needed to buy time. Missiles launched from the pods, appearing to streak toward him. You robots are going to lose in the end, John said. He wasn't sure he believed that, but it felt good to spout defiance until the end. At that point, seemingly out of the darkness, beams lashed the approaching missiles, burning them in seconds. A golden gravitational ray also struck, hitting the larger robot ship back there, disintegrating the craft. For reasons John couldn't explain, the pods began to explode one by one. Maybe they were self-destructing. Well, what do you know, John said. The static in his headphones ceased. The... Nathan Graham, John said, wondering if he could get through now. John, Gloria said, what just happened? What do you mean, he asked. You're in space. Roger, he said. Octopoid robots destroyed the wastrel and wounded Premier Benz. Didn't you just destroy the robot craft? Negative, Gloria said. Until a few seconds ago, we observed the Premier and you face to face with each other, presumably talking on the asteroid at the designated location. What are you talking about? We've been on the run for the past ten to fifteen minutes. John, the Gilgamesh is almost upon you. How close is it? You should be able to see it by now. John twisted around. Yes, he saw the Mars Unity cyber ship gliding toward the asteroid and toward him. They must have destroyed the robots. Have you been watching the Gilgamesh all this time? John asked. We thought so, Gloria said. Until a few seconds ago, we saw the Gilgamesh 90,000 kilometers away on the other side of the asteroid. I can only conclude that someone has been feeding our sensors false data like the robots did before on the Nathan Graham. Do you remember? I do, John said. That false data abruptly ceased, Gloria said. Logically, the destroyed robot ship has been feeding us the false images. That would imply they set up an ambush. You're right about that which means they must have intercepted our communications with Benz three weeks ago. Yeah, John said, but what are the odds of that happening? I lack sufficient data to make an accurate guess, Gloria said. It does imply that the AIs have surveillance units in the solar system. But John, that's not the problem right now. What should we do about the Gilgamesh? It appears they're going to pick you up. Should I send... Harsh crackling over John's headphones drowned out whatever Gloria was going to say next. Frank, a woman said. Can you hear me, Frank? This is John Hawkins. Why are you jamming my signals with the Nathan Graham? A few seconds passed. John Hawkins, the woman said. Are you Vela Shaw? he asked. I am. What have you done with the Premier? Not a thing, John said. In fact, I saved his bacon, provided he's still alive. The robots ambushed. I am uninterested in your lies, Vela said. You have staged this deception. Now you are about to pay the penalty. Hold it right there, John said. I have Benz in a med tube. He could be dying. Maybe you can revive him, I don't know. But you're going to have to let us go to the Nathan Graham. Vela laughed mockingly. Why would I do something so foolish? Because I'll jettison Benz if you don't, John said. Vela became thoughtful. Several times she almost spoke before turning quiet again. Very well, she said at last. 
I will let you live, and I will allow you to return to the Nathan Graham. First, you must allow us to rescue the Premier. I also demand that you come aboard for questioning. John floated through space as the Gilgamesh grew rapidly in size. What was the right choice? He was limited to killing them both, or allowing Vela Shaw to take him as an effective prisoner. Was the woman's word worth anything? He didn't know. In the grand scheme of things, he doubted her word if they could use him to grab power. He didn't trust Benz. If the Premier had already died in the med tube, John swore harshly under his breath. This was more than just about him. This was about the survival of people. He had knowledge about the robot ambush. If he spaced Benz and Vela Shaw killed him, the Nathan Graham would no doubt attack. That might cost humanity both its cyber ships. He was going to have to take a calculated risk and trust the two Mars Unity super geniuses. Fine, he said over the comm. Pick us up. Benz needs immediate medical attention if he's going to survive. Eleven. John spent the next seven hours alone in a room on the Gilgamesh, cut off from everyone. He did not know that Gloria had demanded and received audio and visual confirmation that he was okay. He slept a good part of the time as the two pirated cyberships moved to within 500 kilometers of each other. The asteroid was beneath both vessels as teams from the two ships scoured the surface for more robots. Vela and Gloria agreed to split the robot debris as shuttles hauled the destroyed pods, robot ship, and octopoids into the cybership science labs. John woke up in time and began demanding something to eat. Finally, a Martian Marine rolled in food and drink. The Marine told him that his people were watching him through cameras. Release me then, John said. The Marine shook his head. Commodore Shaw is waiting for the Premier's decision. Benz is alive. Yes, sir. Was he seriously hurt? I'm not supposed to say. I think I understand, John said. The Marine left. John sat down to eat. He looked up, trying to locate a hidden camera. He wondered if the Marine had told him the truth. He shrugged and began telling Gloria what had happened on the asteroid. If this was a trick to get him to talk, it didn't matter. The truth was on his side. He paced after eating, considering the situation. He began to believe Gloria could see and hear him. She would have demanded confirmation he was alive and okay on a continuous basis. Likely, Gloria had threatened an attack. Since no attack had taken place, the logical reason would be that Vela Shaw had complied enough for an uneasy truce. It had to be uneasy, otherwise he would have already been back aboard the Nathan Graham. How would he handle things if he had Benz aboard the Nathan Graham? He would use kid gloves on the man and prove to Benz's people that he was doing so. Then why was Shaw still keeping him? The answer came four hours later. The hatch opened. John sat up from where he lay on a cot. A medical chair wheeled in carrying an extremely pale Frank Benz. Several tubes were stuck into his flesh. A heavy bandage and med pack were affixed to his neck. The same Marine as before pushed the Premier and his med chair into the room. Feeling better? John asked. Not really, Ben said in a hoarse voice. You can go, he said over his shoulder. The Marine hesitated and then nodded. When the hatch opened, John saw a concerned Vela Shaw standing outside. The hatch slid shut, blocking her and the Marine from view. You don't look all right, John said. Your people are clearly concerned about you. I've lost a lot of blood, and I came close to dying, Benz admitted. Your prompt action appears to have saved my life. Thank you. You're welcome. A lopsided grin slid onto Benz's half-frozen features. They pump me full of painkillers, naturally. Still, I believe I have my wits about me. Sure, John said. I must tell you that I feel an absurd amount of gratitude at finding myself alive. I owe you one, Hawkins. That's great. I have to tell you that you do a wonderful job of showing it by keeping me a prisoner. I know, I know, Ben said slowly. You must wonder why you're still aboard the Gilgamesh. The thought has crossed my mind. I find myself with something of a dilemma, Ben said. The SFF is particularly dependent upon you and your personality, and, of course, so is your cybership. 
Is this still being beamed to the Nathan Graham? It is, Ben said. How do I know that to be true, John said. I will demonstrate, Ben said. With a shaky hand, he clicked the left armrest of his med chair. Say hello to your captain, mentalist. John, Gloria said from a wall speaker. Are you well? They haven't hurt me yet or drugged me to my knowledge, John said. Are we operating on the Frederick Principle? Gloria asked. Yes, John said. Ben's clicked the same armrest, apparently cutting the direct connection. What is the Frederick Principle? Ben's asked. You mean you can't figure it out? John said. Ben stared at him, finally shaking his head slowly. It's Frederick as in Frederick the Great of Prussia, John said. He fought many European wars against the French, Austrians, and Russians in the 1700s. Most of the time, Prussia was heavily outnumbered. Frederick did more than hold his own. He often managed to pull off stunning victories. And the principle is, uh, Benz asked. Frederick told his generals and ministers that he should no longer be considered the king if the enemy captured him. Ah, Ben said. Yes, I see. You just told the mentalist to assume command. John nodded. As long as I'm a prisoner, I'm not the commander of the Nathan Graham or the leader of the SFF. My congratulations on having code words to give at a time like this, Ben said. It shows that you plan for eventualities. John said nothing. To continue, Ben said, you are a critical ingredient to the Nathan Graham and the SFF. If I intern you here, I suspect I could more easily gain what I desire. Which is control of the solar system, asked John. That isn't as needful as positive human unity against the AIs. Your being in charge would be the most positive outcome. Not to put too fine a point upon it, Ben said, but I suspect so. So where does that put us? Yes, Ben said, that is the question. I believe I would be dead if you hadn't acted so forcefully and promptly. You seem to have planned for an AI deception attack. I had not deemed such precaution as necessary. I find my oversight galling, to say the least. John nodded to try to get Ben's to get to the point. Your gallant action also shows your good intentions toward me, Ben said. Ergo, you must be trustworthy. That wasn't something I was willing to bet on earlier. You sound as if you've come to a decision, John said. Ben's inhaled deeply through his nostrils. I wish to merge our two factions into something stronger than what we have. An alliance? asked John. A confederation, Ben said. I suggest we pool our militaries and make common cause against the Solar League. In what way? I think it's time we besieged the Earth. What about the AIs? asked John. While we besiege the Earth, I suggest that you take the Nathan Graham into hyperspace and take a look around. John thought about that. Firstly, he said, how does one besiege the Earth? We stop all contact between Mercury, Venus, and Luna with Earth. And how does that help us? John asked. Hopefully we can induce the Earth fleet to come out and fight us. And then we destroy the Earth fleet so we can begin to bombard the planet if we need to. John stared at Benz. I don't like it. We need the Earth fleet intact for when the AIs show up in force again. We need solar unity more. That's not so easy to make happen, John said. Think about it. Earth has a greater population than the rest of the planetary systems combined. We're not going to conquer the planet militarily with ground forces. Certainly not with your blinkered thinking we're not, Ben said testily. John let that pass. We have to persuade Earth to join us. I am intimately knowledgeable concerning Earth's government, Ben said. Our chances of persuading the social dynamists to join us are zero. John was inclined to agree. Still, he disliked the idea of destroying the Earth fleet and bombarding the home planet. By all means, John said, let's occupy the Mercury mines. Maybe we can devise an interception campaign against Venus, capturing all cargo haulers. In this instance, I'd say lopping off the weaker places and isolating the stronger is the better strategy. Are you rejecting my idea of a confederated assault? Benz asked. Not in principle, John said. As I've just told you, I can agree to occupying the mines on Mercury and putting pressure on Venus. 
That will only solidify social dynamism's hold on Earth. Then we should leave them alone for now, John said. Let's merge the Mars Unity with the SFF, or at least draw up ideas on how to do that to both our satisfaction. After I return from a hyperspace journey, we can rehash the military ideas versus the Solar League with greater understanding about what the AIs are going to do next, and possibly when. Benz looked away as he tapped one of his armrests. He exhaled, looking at John carefully. Do you really think you can trust me? Benz asked. You mean can I trust you enough to leave the solar system with the Nathan Graham? Precisely, Benz said. The truthful answer is that I'm not sure. What would make you sure? John thought about that, finally raising his eyebrows. Join me on the expedition. With the Gilgamesh? That wasn't my idea. I was thinking about having you aboard the Nathan Graham as an advisor. I could not possibly do that, Ben said. But I can give you my word that I will not attempt to weaken the SFF during your absence. The latest robot attempt here at the asteroid has shown me that they may strike sooner than I expected. We have to hunt them down, of course. I mean here, in the solar system. They must be scattered throughout the system. Why do you think that? Benz gave a quick explanation regarding the probabilities of the ambush and how that implied massive numbers of AI sensors. I'm beginning to believe the AIs aren't going to give us enough time to get ready my way, Benz said. That means the only other course is finding alien allies to help us against them. Do you think there are such allies out there? John asked. I know there's only one way we're going to find out, Ben said. I know that I owe you my life, and I now find myself trusting your judgment, particularly your military judgment. Will you allow me time to think about your unifying proposal? Of course, Ben said as he tapped an armrest. Mentalist, the premier said. You can send a shuttle to the Gilgamesh. I'm releasing Hawkins. Benz faced him. Is that good enough? Yeah, John said. It is. Twelve. Four months after the meeting at the outer edge of the asteroid belt, the Nathan Graham decelerated as it left the scattered disk region of the solar system. The pirated cybership was far from the sun far from the back edge of the asteroid belt where it had parked near the Gilgamesh. During the past four months, the Nathan Graham had been accelerating. It had passed Neptune and entered the Kuiper Belt, a region of space 30 to 50 AU wide. Three dwarf planets resided in the belt, Pluto, Haumea, and Makemake. After leaving the Kuiper Belt, the Nathan Graham traveled through the scattered disk region, passing the dwarf planet Senda, 86 AUs from the sun. Now, the giant vessel moved into the lonely vastness between the scattered disk region and the Oort cloud that began an incredible 50,000 AUs from the sun, stretching to 200,000 AUs, marking the outer limit of the solar system. The Nathan Graham did not intend to travel to the Oort cloud. John Hawkins hoped to go much farther by entering the fabled hyperspace. Hyperspace would bypass the Oort Cloud as the ship entered a different realm of reality. The science team, together with Gloria and Bast Bambeck, attempted to understand the process that would allow the cybership to go faster than the speed of light. So far, they had several competing theories. Sir, Chief Technician Ghent said, I have an incoming message from the Gilgamesh. Ghent had buck teeth and thus seldom moved his lips enough when he spoke to let anyone see them. He wore a gold cross under his uniform, being a follower of Christ Spaceman and the most rigorous engineer aboard the Nathan Graham. Put it on the main screen, John said. Ghent tapped his console. John sat back, accepting a steaming cup of coffee from an ensign. He sipped as Premier Benz appeared on the main screen. The man had more color than the last time they'd spoken. He sat behind a desk, making this an official call. John felt a pang of nervousness. Was this Benz trying to pull a fast one? Was the man going to make a stab at the SFF now that the Nathan Graham was way out here? John's head twitched. No, that didn't make sense. If that had been Benz's plan, why not wait a few more days until the cybership went into hyperspace? Hello, Captain Hawkins, Benz said. The premier cleared his throat and looked off to his left. Then the man straightened in his seat and tugged at his tie. He seemed uncomfortable. 
Maybe that was due to his still healing wounds. I hope this message reaches you before you enter hyperspace, Ben said. We've just discovered the whereabouts of a robot listening device. It is in far orbit around Mars. The unit self-destructed as a cutter went to investigate it. That isn't the interesting point. The composition of the outer hull is what intrigues Vela and me. It's why we haven't spotted any of the bastards so far. The destroyed pods and the robot military vessel we faced in the asteroid belt had a different type of hull. I have taken the liberty of sending this data to your various confederates in the SFF. I'm surprised it took us this long to find one of the AI devices in our system. Once a person knows what to look for, it is much easier to discover it. Once you know something can be found, you look that much harder for it. I have sent you this data for the obvious reason. Once you enter an enemy star system, it is likely the AIs will have such listening posts embedded there. It is possible they will have such listening posts in star systems at war with the AIs. Given the new data, I hope you're able to pinpoint such listening posts before they discover your cybership is under human control. John, humanity cannot afford to lose the Nathan Graham out there in the stars. You're taking a big risk by doing this. If the AIs capture you, they will learn that we know about them. That will mean an almost certain invasion of such size and scope that they will annihilate us. In such a case, it would be better for the rest of us that you never went. Ben smiled wryly, shaking his head. I'm not attempting to plead with you to stay. I think you should go. We desperately need allies, and we desperately need to know what our chances are against the AI Empire. I'm simply cautioning you to be extra careful. Ben's frowned, put his hands on the desk, clasping them together as he leaned forward. It's possible that human survival rests almost solely upon what happens out there. You must succeed. You must use all that guile and fighting skill you used to defeat the first cyber ship in the Neptune system. Ben's paused, then he stared intensely at the camera. Go with God, Captain Hawkins. I pray for your success. Premier Ben's out. The screen faded back to its normal color. John swiveled around to face Chief Technician Ghent. I say amen to that, sir, Ghent said with a grin. We're going to need God's help to succeed. John nodded, surprised by the Premier's final words. He stood abruptly. Get the data about the listening post hulls to the scientists. Benz is right. The robots are deceptive above all else. To make this voyage a success, we're going to have to be even sneakier than they are. 13. John met with Gloria and Bast Bambeck on an observation deck. The green-skinned seven-foot sacerdote philosopher had features like a Neanderthal and wore an outsized SFF uniform. The big alien sat back in a chair as he guzzled another beer. There were four empty bottles lined on a table beside Bast. Due to his size and weight, the few beers had an almost negligible effect on his thinking. After studying the Nathan Graham's controls and what the computers have to say on the subject, Gloria announced, we believe that we know how to enter hyperspace. The mentalist stood before the observation glass as she stared into space. She faced them as she swept a strand of hair from her left eye. I can't say I fully comprehend the hyperspace process, she said. Bast says we'll travel approximately one light year for every day we're in hyperspace. He suggests that's the limit, no matter what velocity we use as we enter hyperspace. John glanced at Bast. The sacerdote nodded, saying, Ah, as he wiped his wet lips with a forearm and set the newly emptied beer bottle beside the others. It would appear that no one can detect us while we are in hyperspace, Gloria added. It almost seems from our studies that no two ships in hyperspace can sense each other. That means hyperspace knows true peace. What velocity will we be traveling when we exit hyperspace? John asked. We don't know for sure, Gloria said, but we suspect it will be the same velocity that we enter hyperspace. So the AI cyberships last time entered hyperspace at great velocity, John asked. I suspect that is the case, Gloria answered. Bast eyed another beer bottle, although he didn't reach for it just yet. That also makes logical sense, Gloria added. We also know this. No vessel can enter hyperspace if it is near a large gravitational object. 
In this case, John said, what is large? We suspect anything bigger than Jupiter, Gloria said. You said near, John replied. Jupiter is a long way from us. Near is a relative term, Gloria said. I'm speaking in stellar terms. Jupiter is extremely close to us when you consider the vastness of space. I'll take your word for it, John said. Theoretically, Gloria said, one could keep traveling in hyperspace for as long as he wanted. Except for large gravitational objects, Gloria said. What happens if a ship nears a large gravitational object while in hyperspace? Gloria shook her head. One drops out of hyperspace, asked John. Maybe, Gloria said, or maybe the ship simply implodes in some manner. What? Exactly, Gloria said. It appears that we must travel with great caution. We may move in straight lines from one place to the next, always making sure that no gravitational object is in the way. We should be able to calculate when to drop out given the constant state of hyperspace travel. You hope, John said. As the Premier suggested, Gloria said, our voyage is a gamble in more ways than one. John thought about that. Maybe that's one of the things that makes space travel take a longer time. If there are too many grav objects in the way, one has to drop out of hyperspace and travel to a new location the old way, Gloria said, by crawling at sublight speeds. Only then can the ship re-enter hyperspace as it journeys to the new destination. Interesting, John said. Why do you find that interesting? It means there are terrain features to interstellar travel, John said. Terrain features add to the complexity of maneuvering tactics. You find that interesting as a soldier? Yeah, John said. Bast laughed sadly, finally picking up the next beer bottle, twisting off the cap, and beginning to guzzle. What's wrong with you? John asked the sacerdote. Fear, bewilderment, and a growing sense of futility, Bast said in his deep voice. Those are exactly the wrong emotions to feel, John told the alien. Bast raised his bushy eyebrows. Emotions are neither wrong nor— You should be elated, John said, interrupting. Because I am leaving the island of tranquility of the solar system, the sacerdote asked. What tranquility? For a short time, I have known peace, Bast said. I found it a stimulating process. I could sleep the entire night through. I felt rested again, my mind recharged. Now we are about to resume the conflict against the impossible champions of death. That's crap, John said. It is uh, feces, asked Bast. I do not understand. It's a saying, Gloria told him. It means it is no good. I agree that the AIs are evil, Bast said. But I fail to comprehend. When I said your idea was crap, John said, interrupting, I meant it was wrong. Wrong is a different meaning from no good, Bast said. Yeah, whatever, John said. I'm not a philosopher. That is true, Bast said. The AIs want to destroy all life, John said. Well, this is our chance to take the fight to them. How is that a desired object, Bast asked. Because it means we can try to hurt the robots that have hurt us. That does not bring back the dead, Bast said. Who said it did? Bast had a quizzical look on his face. The sacerdote doesn't understand your bloodthirsty love of hitting back at the group that has hit you, Gloria said. He knows his people are gone, and John stood, waving his hand as if to negate Gloria's words. The ARs are in this to the finish, John said. Well, so am I. You cannot possibly live that long, Bast said. For as long as I'm alive, then, I'm going to kick butt, John said. We have a purpose, Bast. We're champions of life. Maybe you and I were born precisely to challenge these machines of death. Maybe that means hardship our entire lives. But at least we're fighting for something good, for the chance of life to live to its fullest. The huge sacerdote pursed his thicker than normal lips. Yes, he said ponderously. That is a good point. I can readily agree to such a purpose. Bast glanced at the beer bottles before studying John. Purpose, Bast said. We have purpose. We must stop the AIs from their genocidal fury. When will we enter hyperspace? Gloria looked to John. I'd like to say right now, 
John said. What is holding you back? asked Bast. Benz's message, John said. He turned to Gloria. Is it possible that some AI devices have secretly lodged onto our hull? Gloria thought about that until her eyes widened. Of course, she whispered, at the asteroid belt. Such devices must have slipped onto our hull. We must check thoroughly. John nodded. I've already ordered Ghent to begin the process. Tell him to stop, Gloria said. John looked at her questioningly. This is a possible opportunity to learn more about our enemy, Gloria said. John tapped a comm device, speaking into it. Afterward, he said, Tell me what you're thinking. Gloria proceeded to do just that. Fourteen. Infiltration unit IU-76 waited patiently on the hull of cybership Nathan Graham. Far longer than it thought it would take, the life units, the humans, finally began to search for robotic pods hidden on the hull. IU-76 realized this was an elementary tactic and should have little chance of success, as its probability analyzer had told it as much. Yet even the time lapse between its landing on the hull and the humans attempting to locate the obvious gave the probability for ultimate achievement a new triple improvement score. That probability was still low, but a triple score was simply amazing. It indicated human sloth or stupidity, or possibly both. As IU-76 waited, it observed the humans in action. They used drone devices to fly over the hull in precise flight patterns. That was rational, as far as it went. But the drones used inferior sensors. IU-76 began to doubt the humans had the capability of discovering the lure unit. Thirty-seven minutes later, IU-76 re-evaluated its doubt as a drone paused in mid-flight. The drone switched on advanced sensing gear. A few minutes later, a searchlight popped on, focusing on the lure unit. The drone had found it. Finally. The Lear unit and IU-76 had both eased onto the pirated cybership hull months ago, during the asteroid belt operation. So far, this part of the insertion mission was proceeding flawlessly. A bigger drone now moved into position, advancing on the Lear unit. The new drone possessed outer laser drills and arm clappers. It attempted to detach the Lear unit from the hull. Of course, the remote control drone failed in its task, the lure unit's key purpose was in being a frustrating object. Would the humans react as predicted? One hundred and four minutes later, a group of space-suited humans arrived in a small space vehicle. IU-76 recorded everything, watching and analyzing their habits. They were slow creatures and acted oddly. That, combined with their vile life nature, proved yet again a primary reason for their needed expulsion from the universe. As its probability numbers spiked, IU-76 detached from its location. Soundlessly, and more importantly, invisibly, it maneuvered onto the underside of the small human space transport. After an hour of further hard work, the space-suited humans finally detached the lure unit from the hull. Wisely, on their part, the humans did not load the lure unit onto their space vehicle. Instead, more drones appeared. They used grapples, lifting the lure unit and heading away with it. No doubt the humans would use extreme caution as they studied the lure unit. It didn't matter. The space-suited humans climbed aboard their small space vehicle and headed back for whatever hangar bay or space locker they had originated from. All the while, IU-76 waited for its opportunity to insert. 237 minutes later. An invisible rounded object attached to the underside of a grounded space vehicle opened like a flower. IU-76 cautiously emerged from it. The unit was as black as sin and looked like a large mechanical spider. The main component was as big as a man's head. IU-76 had passive sensors of incredible complexity and power. The unit lowered itself onto the hangar bay deck. With startling quickness, IU-76 scuttled with a tap-tap sound on the tips of its multi-jointed legs. It moved into a cubby, climbing the bulkhead so it could wait in darkness on the ceiling. This was the most dangerous time of its mission and could expose it to destruction. That did not happen, though. 
Instead, two humans in oil-stained coveralls appeared. They chattered in their monkey tongue and began to inspect the nearby space vehicle. They opened compartments and sections, using tools to first scan and then repair certain features. IU-76 grew apprehensive. Could those two find the invisible carrying unit on the vehicle's underside? One of the mechanics readied himself to slide under the space vehicle. IU-76 might have grown agitated if it had been a life unit, instead proving the superiority of cool rationality. It made a logical decision without the fanfare of emotions. The spidery robot device dropped from the ceiling, landing soundlessly on the deck. With deliberate speed, it used its metallic legs to skitter across the floor at the other man. The first mechanic slid under the space vehicle as the other stood by a diagnostic machine. Something must have given away, IU-76. The man at the diagnostic machine turned, and his eyes widened in horror. IU-76 followed emergency procedures. It leaped, sailing into the air in a perfect trajectory. The life unit watched in panicked horror, staying frozen just long enough. IU-76 landed on the man's face. The man screamed and tried to push the robotic device from him. The man lacked the strength for such an impossible task, of course. With remorseless strength, IU-76 maneuvered around the man's head. Like an earth spider, the bulk lowered close to the man's head and seemed to bite. IU-76 did not bite the man, as such. Instead, using a precise laser, it quickly drilled through the skull. A noisome stench of burnt bone permeated the local area. IU-76 ignored the smell as it inserted more than just a normal conversion stick into the gray brain mass. IU-76 literally inserted itself into the man's mushy brain matter after ejecting from the metal carrying unit. Fine metallic hair sprouted from the insertion unit into the brain mass, taking over neural control of the man's functions in record time. That almost didn't prove quickly enough, however. As the process took place, the targeted man fell onto the deck and began to thrash. In that time, the mechanic who had slid under the space vehicle reappeared. The mechanic bellowed in outrage and shock. He jumped up, grabbed a heavy tool, and charged. IU-76 barely gained control of the human subject in time. Although the AI device did not yet know the human's name, it used the man's legs to kick out hard and fast. The mechanic stumbled, dropping the heavy tool and barely catching himself before slamming his face against the deck. They both hurried to their feet. The outer spider casing that had originally carried IU-76 still clung to the target's head. The newly converted human picked up the heavy tool, hefting it. Sam, the mechanic shouted. It's me. I'm trying to save you from that thing covering your face. At IU-76 neural order, the converted human swung the heavy tool, connecting solidly with the mechanic's head. The mechanic dropped. The converted man knelt by the stunned and fallen mechanic and beat the head until the skull cracked and fluids ran out. The victim jerked for a time before finally subsiding into stillness. A dead human was a good human. IU-76's converted human panted and sweated from the effort. That was fine for the moment. IU-76 knew that a chance encounter could still ruin everything. It had to merge quickly with the target and clean up this mess before anyone else came to investigate. With its metallic appendages, the outer spider casing sprayed a healing goop over the skull wound. After that hardened, the outer device would implant, regrow. It would give the converted human new hair. First, though, IU-76 needed to gain full control of the man and reroute the personality, making the target into something that IU-76 could use for the glory of the AI Dominion. Fifteen. The hours passed as IU-76 assessed the space mechanic Samuel Latterly, who originated from the Neptune system. Unfortunately for IU-76, there was a systematic core failure as it attempted to submerge the target's personality. The target's mind fought back. Sam Latterly was stubborn, going berserk when he understood what IU-76 was trying to do. Sam actually made a run for it, yelling at the top of his voice. IU-76 made a quick and possibly fatal decision. 
The insertion unit core burned out the target's memory with savage electric shocks. The insertion unit erased Sam Latterly's memories. In doing so, IU-76 miscalculated and went too far, burning out the man's personality with the memories. IU-76 did even more than that, erasing some of the man's earliest and most needed life lessons. Because of that, the man forgot how to walk. After cleaning up the mess, IU-76 forced the body to drag itself across the floor, eventually finding a place to hide. The problem proved perplexing and frustrating. Fortunately, IU-76 was not burdened with emotions, and thus did not worry about the passage of time. The body of Sam Latterly soon knew fierce hunger pangs. IU-76 ignored that for now. The insertion unit would cause the body to feed later. First, IU-76 had to reteach the body how to walk, run, and even talk. It was a painfully slow process. After much time had passed, the body of Sam Latterly reemerged from hiding. The body looked gaunt and glassy-eyed, and his clothes were rumpled, smelly, and even torn in places. The body moved with a strange lurching step and jerked his head every time he looked around. Still, it was a fantastic example of AI computing power for a lower-order insertion unit. But it would not have fooled anyone who chanced to come upon the body of Sam Latterly. Luckily, the body moved during a nighttime period. The unit IU-76 had not done this out of cunning, but through pure good luck. IU-76 made it to Sam Latterly's quarters without anyone spotting the body. The body went inside and rummaged until it found excess food packets and water bottles. There, the body ate in a controlled manner despite the growling stomach. Afterward, the body turned on a vid unit and watched programs. Through Sam's eyes, IU-76 studied the actors and their movements. For many hours, the body of Sam latterly practiced walking, sitting, and getting up. The improvement proved extraordinary. Still, without the man's memories and enforced help in overcoming defects and flaws, IU-76 believed the body had a high probability of getting caught sooner rather than later. Thus, the body lay on the cabin's cot with the eyes open as IU-76 ran through various options. Perhaps the body could open a large hangar bay door and kill hundreds and possibly thousands of humans through vacuum. Perhaps the better idea would be in regaining the carrying unit and inserting it into the spider case to convert a better target. Sam Latterly was a mere hangar mechanic. If IU-76 could insert into the sacerdote, for instance... Yes, Bast Bambeck could surely maneuver near John Hawkins, killing the hated interloper. Still, what if the Nathan Graham entered an outpost system? Maybe IU-76 could rig a pulse message to a ruling AI there. That would be the best result. How long could Sam Latterly remain hidden before the entire ship began searching for him? IU-76 did not have enough data to make a reasoned decision. In time, the decaying body of Sam Latterly sat up. In a jerky fashion, the body rose and went to a computer console. IU-76 hesitated. It did not know enough. It needed Sam's memories. It needed a way to threaten the man in order to make him a willing accomplice. But that part of the brain was dead. This was no good. With a quick motion, the body turned on the computer. With carefully thought-out steps, IU-76 began to study more data. Soon, it discovered that the pirated cybership had entered hyperspace. They traveled to another star system. IU-76 did not know the destination. Would it be better to remain hidden, or was this the moment to strike? The humans would believe themselves safe while in hyperspace. IU-76 ran an intense analysis. It lacked enough data to make a fully reasoned choice. Therefore, the most logical choice was to attack while the body still possessed freedom. With a lurch, the impaired body of Sam Latterly stood. It rummaged through the quarters until IU-76 found a long flick knife. If IU-76 could insert this into one of John Hawkins' major organs, that might be enough to kill the hated one. Suiting computation to action, the unwashed but freshly dressed body of Sam Latterly headed for the hatch. 16. 
Lieutenant Walleye ate by himself in a large cafeteria aboard the Nathan Graham. Walleye was short, with a big head, coarse hair, and an odd face that made it difficult for most people to tell where exactly he was staring. He also had stubby limbs with short fingers. Walleye was a mutant from the dwarf planet of Make Make, a former assassin. He didn't look dangerous in his buff coat, but he was exceptionally cunning, with a knack for doing the right thing at the right time to come out alive. Walleye was the commander of the destroyer Daisy Chain 4. The spaceship was presently in a hangar bay. His navigator was June Zen. Walleye sipped from his cup of coffee as the long-legged beauty entered the cafeteria. Men stirred at the other tables, noticing her. They always did. June wore tight-fitting silver pants that showed off her exceptional rear. She knew how to walk, too. Like him, she'd been born on Make Make. They were the only two survivors of an AI infiltration attack on Make Make some time ago. They'd been in orbit around Senda during the last AI conflict in the solar system. June picked a few items to eat and brought her tray to Walleye's table, sitting beside him. Morning, she said. Luscious, he replied. You look preoccupied, she said. He shrugged. I have a conference meeting with Hawkins later. He's going to discuss various options for exploring the star system once we get there. Just you and him, asked June. Walleye shook his head. There will be a bunch of us captains at the meeting. We have to have over twenty frigate or destroyer-class vessels aboard. Is that why I'm seeing so many new faces? That's one of the reasons. Walleye wasn't sure he agreed with Hawkins' decision to take so many new people aboard the cyber ship. Sure, the vessel was massive— one hundred kilometers in all directions provided a lot of deck space. This thing could and did carry a lot of extra spaceships in its guts. That meant more crew, more security personnel, and a greater chance of the wrong kind of person getting aboard. Hawkins hadn't asked his opinion about the measure, though. While I approved of Hawkins' known tendency to only listen to his inner core of people, that was the right way to do it. According to what Walleye knew, those advisors were the Martian mentalist, the old man, the intelligence chief, and a tough old killer called the Centurion. The old man and the Centurion used to be sergeants in the Black Anvil Regiment. This time out, the Nathan Graham was closer to its maximum efficiency in terms of number of crew and space marines. Before this voyage, the captured cyber ship had felt like a ghost vessel. It hardly had any people aboard compared to its mass. If any of the extra people should prove disloyal, though. The social dynamists of the Solar League had tried infiltration tactics before this. While I finished his coffee, wiping his lips with a sleeve, he set the cup in the saucer and made to rise. Aren't you going to wait for me to finish? June asked. Not today, Luscious. I have a few chores before the meeting. I'll see you later this evening. June pouted, while I patted her nearest hand. Is that trouble? Nothing I can't handle, she said after a moment. While I eyed her, gauging the likely problem. Not only did she have a fantastic butt, but her short jacket did little to hide her other charms. While I noted several men watching her from other tables. Are some of these space jockeys hitting on you too hard? He asked. Not when you're around. At least they're smart enough to wait until you're gone. I get tired of the attention, though. It's too much. It's also the price for being beautiful. Her pout grew and she leaned toward him. Do you see that lieutenant over there? Walleye saw a muscular man stroking his neat dark mustache. The lieutenant nodded at Walleye and winked at June. He's not even waiting until you're gone, June complained. Can't you talk to him about that? You want me to knife him? Would you? she asked. Walleye pushed his chair back and stood up. No, June said, grabbing one of his stubby hands. Don't do it, Walleye, I was only kidding. Oh, Walleye said, who had known that. He was ugly and short, but he knew his girl. He knew women, in fact, and he knew that June liked the extra attention. That was normal. Would she cheat on him? He seriously doubted it. Catch you this evening, Luscious, Walleye turned to go. Aren't you going to give me a kiss first? She asked. Of course, he said, coming over and kissing her. I'll slap the lieutenant across the face if he gets too fresh, she told him. 
That sounds fun. If you need help... No, she said. Really, I'm okay. While I adjusted his buff coat, ran his fingers through his coarse hair, and headed for the hatch. He noticed the slick lieutenant watching him. Likely the man was trying to gauge him, wondering how an ugly little mutant had a doll of a girlfriend like June Zen. It wasn't by worrying about it. If June wanted a hot shot like the slick lieutenant, she could have him. June wanted safety more than anything else, though. While I doubted there was anyone aboard the Nathan Graham that could keep her safer than him. And she knew it. June Zen was a smart girl. 17. There was one new rule aboard ship that Walleye didn't like. They were not allowed any personal weapons. Ship security went about armed, and the Marines had weapons lockers they could open during an emergency. But as an individual practice, none of the crew members were supposed to carry a gun or even a knife. Walleye had always gone armed, even in childhood. Weapons had been his equalizer. I'm sorry, sir, an armed sentry told him. You'll have to wait while the intelligence operative frisks you. While I stood before a hatch in a restricted area of the ship, several other ship commanders had already preceded him. Others lined up behind him. The sentry was a big-chested man with a big pistol strapped to his hip. The man looked like he knew how to use it. No problem, while I said. A slim individual appeared from behind the hatch. The individual raised an eyebrow upon seeing Walleye. The operative wore a red patch on her uniform, indicating she was in the intelligence branch. Lieutenant Walleye? the operative asked. That's me. Would you open your coat, sir? Not a problem, Walleye said. He unbuttoned the buff coat and opened it as if he were a flasher. The operative patted him down and even felt the coat. She paused for a moment. It appeared as if she felt something in the coat. The operative glanced sharply at Walleye. The mutant didn't change expression. What's this? the operative finally asked. A stick, Walleye said. Hidden inside your coat? Would you like to see it? The operative made a signal that most wouldn't have noticed. Walleye noticed, of course. He also noticed the sentry put a meaty paw on the butt of his sidearm. The Marine appeared to be a quick draw artist. Walleye approved, but he felt there should have been more security. Ah, he noticed two other sentries standing inside the hatch. With his small hands, Walleye unzipped an inner pocket and withdrew a seven-inch stick. He handed the slightly heavier-than-normal stick to the intelligence operative. The woman turned it over in her hands. She seemed perplexed. What's it do? the operative asked. Remind me of Earth. The operative's head snapped up as she scowled at Walleye. That a joke? the operative asked. Not to me. I grew up- I know exactly where you grew up, on Make Make. You've never been to Earth. Your parents never lived on Earth, and neither did your grandparents or your great-great-grandparents. You're well briefed. The operative waved the stick under Walleye's nose. This doesn't remind you of Earth, she said. You're a killer. This is a weapon. Right, Walleye said. I can use it to poke out an eye. Why was it hidden inside your coat? You don't have any lucky mementos. The operative tapped her teeth together as she studied Walleye. When that seemed to have no effect, she re-examined the stick. I can't find a switch to this thing, the operative said. Imagine that, Walleye said. A stick from the Black Forest in old Germany has no other use than sentimentality. I'll have to ask for a refund. Is that a joke? Apparently not, Walleye said. He held out his left hand. The operative slapped the stick into the palm and jerked a thumb over her shoulder. Just doing my job, sir the operative said. I have no problem with that, Walleye said. He stuffed the stick back into the inner pocket and zipped the pocket shut. Walleye wasn't surprised that the intelligence operative hadn't been able to find the stick's trigger. Walleye had devised the weapon himself. It had more heft than it should. That was because a specially treated stone sliver rested in the middle of the stick. If he pressed the stick correctly, the thin sliver of stone would pop up like a switchblade, giving him a stiletto, a stabbing weapon. That meant this wasn't much of a weapon. It was an assassin's tool, meant for a surprise attack. Walleye had used it before, walking up behind a target in a crowd. He'd stabbed the target from behind, 
the sliver of stone punching through skin to puncture the target's heart. That time, he'd coated the tip with poison. As a rule, Walleye disapproved of poison. There were too many variables to trust poison to kill a target quickly or certainly enough. Still, in a pinch, Walleye used poison if other options proved too narrow. That was the problem with Hawkins' increased security. A practiced poisoner could use all sorts of subtle approaches to kill his mark. For instance, Walleye's fingernails were specially hardened with a lacquer and sharpened to a razor's edge. He had a fun slash trick he could perform, making it seem like an attack by a great cat. If he envenomed the edge of his fingernails... Walleye buttoned his buff coat as he headed for the conference chamber. The stick had one other purpose. It kept the searcher from finding the more valuable weapon hidden behind the stick. Not that Walleye planned anything deadly. He wasn't an assassin for hire anymore. The old life had died when the robots invaded Make Make. He'd paid a bitter price for their invasion. He didn't hate the robots for that, though. That wasn't Walleye's way. But he certainly didn't care for them, and he approved of the plan of finding and eliminating them. He had first-hand experience with robot arrogance. The AI machines believed that mankind was dirt beneath their chrome heels, made for stamping. Wally did not like getting stomped. The best way to make sure no one stomped you was to stomp them first. To him, that's what this mission was all about. They needed to find ways to stomp out the AI menace forever. 18. Wally thought the conference meeting took too long. He was having a hard time keeping from yawning by the end. He wasn't particularly tired, just bored by some of the arguments among the various frigate and destroyer captains. Hawkins let them argue. Maybe the commander liked hearing different opinions strongly reasoned against others. Maybe Hawkins didn't really know what they would do once the Nathan Graham dropped out of hyperspace. The commander wanted to hear ideas until he found a good one. He'd told the assembled captains the mentalists' suggestions, and the captains had listened to the giant sacerdote opine. Now, Hawkins stood up, raising a hand. Voices dwindled until only two captains were still arguing. Finally, one of the other captains elbowed a talker in the side. That got both arguers' attention. At that point, something odd occurred. The hatch slid up and a marine sentry with a knife sticking in his throat backpedaled into the chamber. He struck the conference table with his back, gurgled and slid almost bonelessly to the floor. There, he twitched and spasmed. A hollow-eyed man followed the sentry into the chamber. He stank like carrion, as if he were carrying something rotten on him. The jerky way the man moved. A shock of recognition struck Walleye. He'd seen people move like that before, on Make Make. Those persons had walked eerily like puppets because they had AI conversion units embedded in their brains. Walleye's thoughts moved at hyper-assassin speed. He got it. The gunman had taken the pistol from the sentry and killed the man, forcing his way into the conference room. One of the captains had more courage than the rest. He charged the gunman. The gun boomed, obliterating the charging man's face, knocking the man onto the floor. Most everyone froze. Surprise had a way of doing that. John Hawkins, the gunman said in a robotic-sounding voice. Hawkins stood at the head of the table. Hawkins seemed just as surprised as everyone else. For Walleye, time seemed to slow down. It seemed as if he watched the gun reposition, the finger twitch, and the trigger move back. The big marine gun bucked in the shooter's hand. The bullet... Hawkins tried to duck. The bullet slammed against one of Hawkins' shoulders, spinning the commander onto the floor and out of sight behind the table. The gunman began striding for the head of the table. Another captain moved in his way, grabbing the gunman. The gunman put the barrel of the gun against the captain's head, and boom! Gore and bone flew like a fountain from the back of the captain's head. The dead captain dropped to the floor. At that point, captains and others began shouting in fear. Most shrank away from the shooter. A few leaped over the table to get away from him. Walleye made himself seem even smaller as the gunman lurched crazily toward him. As the intent gunman passed Walleye, the former assassin reached into his buff coat, grabbed the stick, and squeezed it so the rock-like seven-inch pick appeared. 
The gunman used his free hand to swat at Walleye. The mutant ducked the backhand blow, moved in behind the attacker, and stabbed the stone pick into the kidney. The gunman should have howled in pain and doubled over in agony. Instead, the gunman snarled, twisted around, and lowered the gun so the barrel pointed at Walleye's big head. Walleye dropped as the gun boomed. The bullet missed, smashing a chair instead. Walleye lay on the floor, and the weird gunman ignored him now as he resumed his march toward Hawkins' position. As silently as he could, Walleye scrambled to his feet, ripped a single-shot derringer from a specially hidden location on his chest, and debated in that microsecond on the best place to shoot. It was possible the robot-controlled human did not have a vital spot in the normally accepted manner. The man might already be dead, the reason he stank. Could the robot device? Walleye fired. The bullet struck the gunman in the back of the head. The bullet smashed through skull, bone, and struck something glitteringly metallic embedded in the brain. The gunman halted, swayed crazily, and spun around. The gun rose until it pointed at Walleye. Hawkins emerged from hiding. Despite the shoulder wound, he began to fire one shot after another. Clearly, the commander had a gun. The bullets riddled the gunman. The human even staggered several times as blood gushed from the wounds. In an even weirder display, the gunman jerkily turned toward Hawkins. Shoot him in the eyes, in the forehead, Walleye shouted. There's a robotic eunuch controlling him. Even though his face was twisted with pain, Hawkins aimed and fired. He must have done something right. The gunman dropped his weapon, staggered back, and thumped against a bulkhead. He still did not go down, though. The gunman opened his mouth, tried to speak, and finally the body knifed forward and hit the deck face first with a thud. At that point, the hatch to the conference chamber slid up and several armed marines charged inside. Everyone watched them as the marines surrounded the twitching, bloody body. Look, one of the marines said in a hushed voice. There's something sparking in his head. What is that? A control unit, Walleye said. Everyone stared at the mutant with a derringer in his stubby hand. Then Gloria Sanchez entered the room at a run. She looked around swiftly, seemingly taking in everything at a glance. A second later, she began to issue orders. 19. Walleye found himself in detention. At the mentalist's orders, Marines had taken his derringer, the stone pickknife, and his buff coat. An intelligence officer had frisked him thoroughly. They'd found a few other knick-knacks. What none of them had discovered were his lacquered, sharpened fingernails. The fingernails weren't particularly dangerous at the moment. He could cut some substances with them, but very shallowly. They were only really deadly if coated with poison. Walleye was glad he hadn't had to explain the fingernails. He wasn't sure any of them would have understood. He was an assassin by trade. Old habits died hard, that's all. The hatch to the cell opened. The mentalist entered. She came alone. That stunned Walleye. Then he thought he got it. He was short, only a little taller than the Martian. That was one of his specialties. He seemed harmless. He wasn't big and strong like a Marine. But didn't they realize he was the only one other than Hawkins that had done a thing to stop the robot-controlled human? In case you're wondering, Gloria said as she pulled out a chair, sitting down across from him, two marines are watching you from murder holes. One of them has a laser rifle fixed on you, if you should do anything unbecoming, Walleye shook his head. She canted hers questioningly. What does your head shake mean? she asked. You shouldn't have told me about the sniper laser, he said. She frowned, her mentalist brain attempting to come to the logical reason for his statement. She looked up at him. If you know a laser is trained on you, she said, you now know to duck first before you attack. Walleye said nothing. Is that correct? she asked. There's no other reason why it would be a bad idea, he said. She stared at him as if he were a unique insect. Walleye found that slightly daunting, which was unusual. Little daunted him. The extreme intelligence in her gaze actually gave him pause. Do you understand why you're in detention? she asked. I had weapons, he said. They were illegal weapons. Walleye said nothing. Why do you carry a single-shot derringer? she asked. Are you serious? he asked. 
please just answer the question? It's for emergencies. Her head canted the other way. What made you suspect there would be an emergency today? She asked. Black swans, he said. She gave him that look again. There are no black swans in existence, only white ones, she said. How many black swans would it take to make your statement false? She thought about that. One, she said. There's your answer. Walleye, he sighed. A black swan is a surprising event, he said. It is the one thing you don't anticipate. Sometimes a surprise event can be terribly deadly. Today would be a good example. Since I had the Derringer, I could put a bullet in the thing's head. That saved the commander's life, among other things. You also had a stiletto. Yes, she stared at him. I stabbed him in the kidney, Walleye said. He barely reacted. I think he might have already been dead. Well, I thought that until I saw him bleed. The control unit likely dampened any pain sensations. That allowed him or it to do things. I'm not interested in any of that, Gloria said, interrupting. I want to know why you think you can flout our regulations without consequences. Have it, he said. She stared at him harder. I used to be a hitman on Maki Maki. I didn't know that. I know. I wanted to keep it that way. Why? she asked. I calculated that my being a hitman might make me seem less trustworthy to you people. That you didn't tell us beforehand is what makes you seem less trustworthy. While I shook his head. I'm going to have to call bullshit on that, he said. You don't like me because I came armed to the captain's meeting. In case you don't know, it's always good to carry arms where you're not supposed to. That's often the most dangerous place to be. The thing likely chose the conference room because it calculated we all be unarmed, easy prey for it. You're pretty proud of yourself, aren't you? I'm a realist, Walleye said. Is that why you're so good at pretending you're not scared, despite being in detention? Walleye didn't answer that one. The Centurion believes we should have you shot, Gloria said. What does John Hawkins think? I imagine you believe John is grateful for what you did for him? That's how I'd feel about me if I were in his shoes, Walleye said. Gloria's eyes narrowed. I have altered my opinion about you. You're dangerous. Good thing we're all on the same side, then. Are you on our side? Walleye displayed his teeth in what might have been a smile. I've proven my loyalty on several occasions, he said. I want Commander Hawkins to succeed. He's a doer, an attacker. I like that. I've studied him. Why study him? Gloria asked sharply. Pure admiration on my part, Walleye said. The mentalist pursed her lips as her eyes narrowed once more. She seemed to calculate, to gauge. I have come to a decision, she said. Walleye nodded. I'm going to suggest we put you under house arrest for a time, she said. What's that mean? You'll be confined to your quarters until further notice. If you leave your quarters for any reason, I think that would prove the Centurion correct about what to do with you. That sounds extreme, considering what I did to save the commander's life. Maybe, she said in a clipped manner. While I realized with a jolt that she was testing him in some manner. Do you agree to the confinement and the stipulation? she asked. I do, he said. The mentalist studied him a moment longer. She stood abruptly faced the hatch and snapped her fingers. The hatch opened, revealing three big marines standing outside. They'll escort you to your quarters, the mentalist said, without turning around to glance at Walleye. Great, Walleye said. Let's go. She turned then, regarding him. This is a serious matter, she said. Walleye nodded, waiting. Did he see disquiet in her eyes, or was that disappointment? Walleye didn't know. When he didn't know something, he liked to play it out, give it rope so he could see which way the rope stretched. Without another word, the mentalist walked out of the cell. She moved past the big marines and was gone. Are you coming? A marine sergeant asked. While I nodded, wondering what was really going on. Twenty.
John stood in the main science lab with Gloria, listening to Chief Technician Ghent explain what they'd discovered by taking apart what remained of the AI conversion unit recovered from Samuel Latterly's brain. John's shoulder throbbed from the assassin's bullet and the surgery to repair the shoulder. An outer casing kept his shoulder and side immobile. The shoulder not only throbbed, but itched like crazy. He was finding it impossible to get comfortable. He'd taken mild painkillers, as he didn't want to dull his wits with strong ones. John shifted his stance yet again. Most of the conversion unit's components lay under a glass sheet on a large table. Various letters were affixed to the separate pieces of AI technology. Ghent glanced now and again at his tablet as he told them what they knew about the conversion unit so far. It's a disgusting technology, Gloria said, interrupting the chief technician's monologue. I've read Walleye's report about what happened on Make Make. She shook her head. The AIs are worse than inhuman. They're monsters. Is Walleye still in detention? John asked. Gloria nodded uneasily. Three days now, she said. If Walleye needs something, he has June's end get it for him. I think we should prohibit her seeing him for a time. No, John said. Continue the test as it is a little longer. I know you're grateful for what he did for you, Gloria said. That is the obvious emotion. I'm not going to discuss walleye right now, John said irritably. He changed positions yet again. I want to know more about the conversion unit. I want to figure out its ultimate objective for the Nathan Graham. We already know, Gloria said. It sought to assassinate you. That was a single objective. Was it the key one, though? Gloria appeared surprised. It had to be, she said. It could never have escaped the conference chamber intact after killing you. It was on a one-way mission. A suicide mission, John said. Is that the right way to say it? John shook his head. He didn't understand the question. Can a computer, no matter how intelligent, commit suicide? Gloria asked. Clearly it can self-destruct or take an action that leads to its destruction. That's not the same thing as suicide. It's a machine. It's not alive. Only living things can actually commit suicide. For all intents and purposes, John said, the AIs appear to be alive. That's a deception, Gloria said. By their very nature, machines are not biological. Thus, Ghent cleared his throat. If you'll pardon the intrusion, the chief technician said, what is the definition of life? Plants and animals, Gloria said. Are viruses alive? Ghent asked. Chief Technician, Gloria asked, are you of all people a believer saying that the thinking machines are alive? I don't know, Ghent indicated the display case. The conversion unit certainly controlled Samuel Latterly as if it were alive. Does it matter then what we technically believe life is supposed to? It matters a great deal, Gloria said, interrupting. If it is a living thing, it can commit suicide. That matters given the conversion unit's goal of assassinating John. If it wasn't really alive, but just mimicked life, then it could not have committed suicide. Then it was just like a drone's computer that zeroes in on a target and explodes the warhead it's guiding and ends up destroying itself in the process. You're posing a metaphysical question, John said. How is that germane to the problem at hand? Gloria blinked several times. We're attempting to understand the psychology of the AIs, she said, so we can anticipate them better. Okay, John said, nodding. That makes sense. Sun Tzu said that to defeat your foe, you must know yourself and know your enemy. Maybe this isn't as much a metaphysical problem as a strategic one. Was Sun Tzu Buddhist? Kent asked with distaste. Sun Tzu was an ancient Chinese strategist, John said. He coined some of the greatest aphorisms and sayings on war that anyone ever penned. They've held true for thousands of years. I have no idea what his religious beliefs were. At that point, Ghent appeared to lose interest in the subject. It would appear that the robots want to kill you specifically, Gloria said. John rubbed his chin. I can't say that I disagree, John said. When did the conversion unit arrive? It seems robot pods landed and attached to our hull when we were at the edge of the asteroid belt a while ago. I agree, Gloria said. Okay, John said. If that's true that they want me dead so badly. Why did they botch the original attempt on the asteroid? That's simple, Gloria said. You and Ben's foiled their attempt. Maybe. 
You pulled some slick maneuvers at the asteroid, remember? Gloria said. John rubbed the back of his neck as he frowned. You don't agree? Gloria asked. I have a gut feeling about this, John said. When I try to sleep, my thoughts go back to that day, that night, whatever it was. The robots, the octopoids, had us, dead to rights. I mean, if I'd run the ambush, I would have killed Benz and me easily. Now, if that's true, why couldn't the robots have done the same thing? Because you're the man who can beat the robots, Gloria said. Your actions have proven that over and over. There's something about you that gives you an edge against the robots. They must have finally figured that out. Thus, you've become a primary target for them. That all sounds logical, John said. That's because it is. John grinned at Gloria, nodding. We need to scour the hull again, John said a moment later. But this time, I want people out there going over the hull inch by inch. With a ship this size, that's going to take some time. We have the time right now, John said. Besides, this will give the new recruits some extra space training. Some of the men might not like being out in hyperspace, Gloria said. John shrugged, causing him to wince and touch the shoulder cast. I think the robots are playing a devious game, John said in a strained voice. I can feel it. I simply can't accept that I was the main target this time. It doesn't sit right with me. How else can I explain my unease? Gloria said nothing. Was there anything else you wanted to add about the conversion unit? John asked Ghent. The chief technician shook his head. John rubbed the shoulder cast one more time before turning toward the hatch. I'm going to talk to the Centurion about the spacewalk exercise, John said. We need to find out what the robots are trying to hide from us. 21. Despite protests from Gloria, Ghent, and the med team monitoring his shoulder, John donned a battlesuit and went outside with his marines to search for more robot stealth pods. The Centurion had acknowledged the danger of John going outside during hyperspace and with an injured shoulder. But the former Black Anvil sergeant also understood why the commander wanted and needed to do it. Going outside in a strange element with his soldiers was good for the regiment's morale. That didn't lessen John's disquiet as the airlock hatch slid open. He'd gone through orientation, just like the others had done. He knew what to expect, as he'd seen hyperspace on a screen. It was different while in a battlesuit on a hull, and with his injury, traveling through the weird realm. John forced himself to quit gawking and move. There were others waiting behind him, with his magnetic clamps always holding onto the hull before he detached a different limb, he moved step by step across the vast expanse. The hull was pitted and marked, and sometimes blocked by housing due to the cybership's long existence. The majority of the marks had been formed by colliding space debris, most of it extremely small. Some of the pitting came from molten metal sizzling against the hull during battle, and laser, particle beam, or even gravitational ray strikes. The indentations had come from solid enemy munitions, such as penetrators, PD warheads, and accelerated matter. The bumps could be sensor nodes or armored casing hiding PD guns, missile launch points, or cannon coverings. The housing held the gravitational cannons and various types of exotic sensors. In any case, the pitting, humps, bumps, and housing created hundreds of thousands of places to hide something small and inconspicuous. Like the behemoths of the Earth's ocean, whales, the cyberships carried space barnacles and other manifestations of its long existence. All that was bad enough. John looked up where the stars should be. He froze then, froze solid as if he were in shock or consternation. Hyperspace had a seething black-red background that seemed to be forever shifting and moving while appearing to be perfectly still. It did not make sense to John's brain. Perhaps that's what caused the shock. It felt wrong to him. That wrongness made it seem evil. Something banged against his suit. His comm phones crackled before smoothing out. Don't look up, sir. It's not good for the eyes. John continued to stare nonetheless. The bang proved harder the next time. Sir, I'm ordering you to look away. Slowly, John Hawkins blinked inside his helmet. He moved his lip. The sergeant's words seemed to penetrate his mind. Ever so slowly, he moved his helmet, forcing himself to look down at his feet. 
He panted a second later. He coughed and cleared his throat. Sir, the Marine sergeant said. The battle-suited individual stood beside him. He'd been hitting John's suit with a bald glove from his suit. Thanks, John muttered. Have you been out here before? Several times, sir, the sergeant said. It takes some getting used to. Did the centurion put you with me? That he did, sir. I see. That means out of all the men, you know how to deal with hyperspace the best. I guess so, sir. What's your secret? John asked. Mainly, I don't look at it. You have to look up sometime. Begging your pardon, sir, but you don't. But if you happen to look up, let your eyesight blur. Don't take too good a look at it. Doesn't the weirdness of hyperspace make you curious? It does, sir. But you don't look. You might say I'm stubborn, sir. Right, John said. Well, let's get to work. Yes, sir, the Marine Sergeant said. Are you and me going to be searching the hull like the others, or are we going to be wandering around and seeing how people are doing? What did the Centurion tell you? To do whatever you said, as long as it wasn't too dangerous. he tell you to tell me that. That he did, sir, the sergeant said. Bet you never thought of the Centurion as a mother hen. I think of him as a right good bastard, sir. He's one man I don't want to cross. Right, John said. We're going to check up on the others. You ready? I am, sir. John looked around and pointed. We'll start by heading in that direction. The regiment scoured the hull for seventy-four hours, working in shifts. They lost three Marines during that time. One man gave himself too many stims. None of the battlesuits was supposed to have stims. The man had disobeyed orders, forcing a supply sergeant to give him what he wanted. The centurion dealt with the supply sergeant, demoting him back to private second class in a penal platoon. The second man suffocated because he forgot to recycle to a new air tank. The last casualty occurred due to psychotic derangement. The Marine turned his gyrock on himself, blowing a hole in his helmet. After that, a corporal bumped up against something he couldn't see. Only when he used thermal sighting did he discover a rounded object before him. At that point, the object opened like a flower. The corporal backed away with magnetic clumps, raised his gyrock rifle, and shot at the hard object with spidery metallic legs. Just before the thing reached him, the corporal must have hit a critical function, causing the robot to freeze. Shortly thereafter, drones appeared, lifted the attached stealth pod, and brought it to a special hangar bay. John did not call off the search, however. He kept the regiment outside another fifteen hours, losing two more Marines. Finally, the centurion told John the regiment had completed a thorough physical search over every inch of the cybership's outer hull. At that point, John reluctantly ended the spacewalking exercise and brought everyone back inside. By that time, Bast Banbeck believed he was on the verge of an amazing discovery. 22. The huge sacerdote rubbed his face. He was tired, spiritually numb and desirous of nothing more than lying in his quarters, watching comedies and drinking the hard scotch whiskey he'd received from a supply officer. Bast much preferred the hard liquor to beer. He liked the taste of beer and did not care for the harshness of the whiskey. What he loved about the whiskey was the release from his inner worries, from his plain homesickness. He had been fine while in the solar system. John Hawkins and his compatriots had done marvels against the robots. While in the solar system, Bast had held on to his old beliefs from a simpler time before the AIs, and those beliefs had given him solace. Perhaps if he'd stayed in the solar system, he would have remained fine. It was a spiritual problem, Bast believed. The humans had beaten the robots twice. Because of that, he felt safe in the solar system. Elsewhere, the AI robots ruled. If that wasn't bad enough, the AIs could insert control devices into a brain. Even more sinister, the AIs often chopped off a person's head and yet kept the head and brain alive, enslaving the head to do their bidding. Bast hated that about the AIs, as he feared such a dreadful fate. Sometimes he wondered if the correct solution was to kill himself so he would never fall prey to the enemy. Yet according to his religious beliefs, self-death meant he would go to the underworld of torment instead of to paradise. That meant Bast had to risk living while in the realm of the AIs. He had to risk enslavement by the metallic demons. 
The fear of that had enveloped his heart, had begun to deeply affect him and his work. Beer helped relieve some of the pressure. The whiskey, however, proved an amazing find, a great solace that walled off his worries with a fog of comfortably deep numbness. Bast had learned to love being drunk. However, he also felt what he believed was an irrational guilt concerning his drunkenness. No sacerdote in the home system would have ever thought to drink alcohol. Certainly some healers had used alcohol to clean wounds, but to guzzle such a substance. The humans were clever apes, indeed. More than that, the humans had proven themselves as vicious fighters. Who would have ever thought that such a primitive and savage species could hand several defeats to the all-conquering AIs? Do you want to look at this? A thin technician with budding breasts asked Bast. The seven-foot alien rubbed his face again. He wore a huge white lab coat and mingled among other scientists attempting to crack the AI computer core taken off the hull earlier. I do, Bast told her. I thought as much, the tech said. She pushed a mobile unit to his computer console and hooked it up. Afterward, she sat on Bast's huge stool and manipulated the controls. Finally, she jumped up and smiled. It's ready, she said. Bast forced himself to smile back. He hated the AIs. He also understood their deadliness. He wasn't sure the humans fully did. Sitting at the controls, Bast went to work. He adjusted the screen tirelessly, attempting approaches the human scientists would have never thought of. Two hours later, he rubbed his eyes, got up, and read a few reports from the others. This was interesting. It was a strange line of electronic inquiry. The results? Bast turned fast, striding back to his console. A few of the other scientists working in the large lab looked up at him and then went back to their screens. Bast sat cracked his oversized knuckles and hunched over his screen. He tapped, regarded the data, tapped again. He sat back sharply. On the screen, a large black circle merged with a smaller white dot. He'd been trying to merge them for hours. This was a breakthrough, revealing possible communication with the AI unit core. Strange script appeared on the screen. Bast pressed a tab. Robotic sounds emerged from a speaker. Bast tapped and typed frantically. He had to, I will repeat the query one more time, a robotic-sounding voice said from a computer speaker. Bast scratched a cheek. What was the best way to respond to this? He didn't know. The robotic voice jogged a fearful memory. The, slyly, Bast looked both ways. The scientists and lab assistants worked tirelessly. No one seemed to be watching him. The huge sacerdote opened his lab coat and took a small silver container from an inner breast pocket. He twisted the cap, sniffed the scotch whiskey inside, and took an extra large swallow. That burned going down his throat. It felt good, though, because he knew what was about to happen. The seconds ticked away. Ah, the sensation he desired struck his brain. It soothed away some of his terror of the enemy. Bast cleared his throat. I do not understand your response, the core unit said. What does that signify? I am an analyzer unit, Bast said. I have uncovered errors in your subprocessors. I do not detect any errors. I know. That is one of the problems. You should have already detected your loss of function. That does not compute. Bast refrained from laughing. He believed he was on to something here. What was the correct way to talk to this monster? Bast slyly looked around again, smiled at a man glancing at him, and lifted the silver container when the scientist looked away. Bast took a longer swallow this time. He almost coughed as a result. Scotch whiskey was strong. The soothing sensation came on even more powerfully than before. For a moment, he didn't give a damn if the next test worked or not. The robot core could rot in the underworld for all he cared. Play back your directive, Bast commanded. Your request is in error. You have failed to begin the grade one command with an authorization code. I'll give you an authorization code, Bast said under his breath. The sacerdote leaned forward and tapped out a quick sequence on his console. Probably it would fail, and... I am initiating your request. Granted, the robot voice said. I have a priority deception mission in progress. I am attempting to lure the Nathan Graham and its accompanying vessels to assault the Alamu system battle station. 
So far, so good, Bast said in a hollow voice. Was this right? What was the correct way to proceed from this opening? Bast opened his coat, took out the small container, shaking it, and was greatly saddened to realize it was almost empty. He unscrewed the cap and drained the contents. The accompanying sensation numbed his mind sufficiently for him to proceed. In a matter of minutes, Bast had the core unit downloading the critical data. It proved lengthy and daunting. For a moment then, Bast was unsure what to do with his breakthrough. The sacerdote had a good idea what John Hawkins would want to do, and that was not what he desired. I have to hide this, Bast said under his breath. Hide what? a woman said. Bast turned around in surprise, feeling lightheaded as he did so. Normally he had the sharpest hearing on the cyber ship. Why had the mentalist snuck up on him? I asked you a question, Gloria said. Bast froze, not knowing what he should do next. 23. John sat back in his study, listening and watching as Bast and Gloria showed him the evidence. The sacerdote had crashed into a cushy chair, seeming more like a great ape than the brainy philosopher he was. The huge alien sprawled in the chair. If John didn't know better, he'd say that Bast had been drinking. Gloria sat on a regular chair with a clicker in hand. She kept showing shots of the various items they had uncovered from the talkative core unit Bast had somehow broken open. Let me get this straight, John said. The unit was attempting to lure us to this AI battle station. Bast nodded in what almost seemed to be a miserable manner. Just a minute, John said. Bast, what's wrong? The sacerdote shook his Neanderthal-like head. Your eyes are bloodshot, John said. I've never seen them that bloodshot before. I'm tired, Bast said. He belched a second later. It was loud, crude, and it smelled like... You've been drinking whiskey, John said. Gloria looked up sharply from her chair. John got up and stepped nearer Bast. The sacerdote sat up, digging in a lab coat pocket. A second later, he brought up a packet of mints, tearing one loose and popping it into his cavernous mouth. Phew, John said. How much whiskey have you been drinking? A few bottles, Bast mumbled with what seemed like numbed lips. When did you drink them? John asked. I imagine just before we came here, Gloria said. Bast told me he had to get something from his room first. He must have consumed the whiskey then. Is that right? John asked. Who can know? Bast said as he slumped back in the chair. John glanced at Gloria before shaking his head at Bast. Just how many bottles did you drink? For a moment, John thought Bast was going to get mulish and not say. Finally, he mumbled. Three. Three, John said. And you're still standing? I'm sitting now, Bast slurred. You can't drink whiskey like it's beer, John said. What are you trying to do, kill yourself? No, John glanced at Gloria before asking Bast. Is something troubling you? Why would you say that, Bast slurred. He's drunk, Gloria said. John peered at Bast more closely. You don't look well, John said. You're not going to get sick on me, are you? Bast belched again, and he twisted where he sat. He turned a different shade of green then. I'm calling medical, John said, moving to his desk. No, wait, Bast said. You have to- No, Bast said with a roar. John turned. The seven-foot alien forced himself out of the cushy chair, so he towered to his full height. He seemed enraged. You will call no one, Bast said loudly. You will- Another belch rose from him. He swayed where he stood. Just in time, he turned his head and vomited a gush of fluids. At that point, Bast staggered to the side, slumped against the wall as he slid onto the floor. His head slid sideways onto his shoulder. His eyelids closed and Bast began to snore. Three bottles? asked Gloria. John didn't respond. He was at his desk, pressing a switch, issuing swift orders. It seemed to him, despite the sacerdote's resistance to alcohol, that Bast might have given himself alcohol poisoning. Something must be seriously troubling the big lug. Medic slid a snoring Bast Bambeck away on a gurney. They would run a few tests and observe him until his liver purged the whiskey from his system. 
I thought he was acting strangely, Gloria said. They'd moved to a different room. This one had a billiard table and a wet bar. But I chalked it up to his being a sacerdote, Gloria said. Why do you think he drank so much? Good question, John said. Most people drink like that because they don't want to think about something. They want to escape a problem they find hard to handle. Do you believe that's what Bast is doing? It's a good place to start looking, John said. It's got to be daunting being the only one of his kind around. I wouldn't want to be in his shoes. Agreed, Gloria said. She waited a few seconds, seemed to stand a little straighter, if that was possible, and said, We should finish analyzing the new data. John scratched his shoulder. A medic was going to take off the cast later. His bone had mended quicker than normal with the new medical technology they were using. It would be good to work the shoulder again. One thing about the quicker healing was that it meant less time for the muscles to atrophy. Still thinking about Bast, asked Gloria. John smiled. It was good to know that she couldn't read his mind. He liked her brilliance, but sometimes a person could be too smart. He didn't like the idea of her being able to decipher his thoughts before he uttered them. Bast will be fine, Gloria said. Maybe, John said. Three bottles. I wonder if this battle station is what's bothering him. We don't know that much about the battle station. The Alamu system appears to be near Altair. The battle station... Let me bring up the specs. John nodded. Gloria went to a computer console and began to type and tap on the screen. Soon she sat back, indicating the screen. John moved closer, examining the data. According to this, the station was big. It's 500 kilometers in diameter, John asked in surprise. Five times longer than our cyber ship, Gloria said as she examined the screen. It appears to be a space dock, maybe a repair yard as well. What about the planet? The blurry image showed a battle station in orbit around a large blue and green terrestrial planet, maybe 1.5 times as large as Earth. What about the planet? Gloria asked. Does it belong to another race, or is the planet a converted AI factory? Gloria typed on the keyboard and tapped the screen for a time. Finally, I don't know, she said. I doubt the captured stealth pod has complete data regarding the battle station. The idea of a robot trying to lure us there. Gloria turned around to stare at John. Who exactly concocted the plan, she asked. A robot, just like you suggested, John said. That's self-evident, she said quietly. And that's not what I was asking. What kind of robot? What? Hmm. Did the plan originate in the solar system? Oh, John said, I see what you mean. The present situation could be like the time we fought the robots after the original war in the Neptune system that gave us the Nathan Graham. Precisely, Gloria said. Meaning, he said, that the robot brain that concocted the plan is likely still in the solar system. That would be my guess as well, she said. Then Gloria got that look on her pretty face that said she was computing data. Her head shifted slightly from side to side as she did so. She looked up at him sharply. John. I may have uncovered a problem. He nodded for her to keep talking. It would seem that you fought a successful action against the robots at the asteroid. I'm beginning to wonder if you were supposed to win that fight. You could have a point, John said. Our defeat of the octopoids always felt fishy to me. Maneuvering stealth pods onto our hull may have been the bigger prize, Gloria said. There's another thing. Ben's discovered an AI stealth pod in far outer Martian orbit just before we entered hyperspace. Why did Ben's find it then? None of us had found any until that moment. Because of the warning, we searched our hull afterward, and poor Samuel latterly attempted to kill you because a conversion unit had made it inside his skull. Was my near assassination supposed to be another AI deception? John asked. At this point, I deem that as highly probable. Gloria's features stiffened into her computing mode. She looked up soon. That brings us to our present dilemma. John nodded encouragingly. What if this is another deception? She asked. You mean the deceiving robot wanting us to know it's trying to lure us to the battle station? Yes, Gloria said. How could that be a deception? Exactly, Gloria said. That's what we must determine. Because if that's true... We have a still greater hidden problem on our hands. 
24. John rotated his shoulder. It was stiff, the muscles there weaker than this other shoulder, but it felt good to get the cast off. Thanks, he said. The medic was a taller woman with a stylus in her left hand. I want you to take it easy on the shoulder for a few days, she said. Give it time to get back up to speed. I can do that. You're still young and resilient. You naturally take to the new medical treatments. Someone like the old man, though. The medic shook her head. Is Bast still in medical? John asked. No, he left an hour ago. Do you know where he went? I'm afraid not. John departed shortly thereafter. He took a flitter, flying through a vast main corridor. There were many like this connecting the huge cybership. John enjoyed flying. It allowed him time to think. He sipped from a steaming enclosed cup of coffee as he flew. Could Gloria be right about the stealth pod? Did the guiding unit in the solar system want him to know about the battle station? Did the unit want them to attack the battle station? Why would the unit think the station would entice him? Well, the unit must know he'd stormed the original cybership, the present-day Nathan Graham. The deceiving unit must also know he'd attacked and helped defeat the last AI assault. Yet why would the robot unit believe? Oh, John said. He might have stumbled onto the answer. Yet the more he thought about this, the more he realized attacking the battle station might be exactly the right move. He opened the cup cover to get the last swallow of coffee, tossed the cup and put both hands on the controls, increasing speed. It was time for an emergency meeting with his closest advisors. Right, John said, as the excitement built in his gut. John stood at the head of a conference table. He'd summoned Bast Bambeck, Gloria, the Centurion, the small, bald killer with hard eyes was the regiment's colonel, the tall and dark-haired old man who ran intelligence, Uther Kling, the missile chief, and chief technician Ghent. Bast seemed downcast and was sweating slightly. John hoped the sacerdote hadn't had any more whiskey. The rest of the people listened to Gloria speak and watched the slides on the big screen. She repeated her suspicions regarding the robot deception plan. She talked about the little they knew regarding the battle station, and she showed them its location. Finally, she ended her briefing, glancing at John. Any questions so far? John asked. There were plenty. They mainly concerned the size, strength, and AI utility of the battle station. Only the old man asked about the evidence regarding the suspicion about possible robot deceptions. After a time, the questions ceased. One by one, the others looked up at John. He was sitting now, waiting. The seemingly placid look on your face indicates that you are about to tell us something critical, Gloria told John. I believe our commander thinks of that as his poker face, the old man said in a good-natured way. John pointed at the old man. The intelligence officer dyed his hair black. Its true color must be gray or white. John could hardly picture the old man with white hair. I've been thinking, John said quietly. Bas Bambeck sat up straighter as a fearful look swept across his green Neanderthal features. He seemed to be trying to master the fear. He wiped his lips with the back of his left wrist. Here's what I see as the relevant point, John said. We're in a bind. By that I mean humanity. We've managed to fight off two major AI assaults. If we had failed during either assault, we as a race would be dead. Now we have to build up militarily before the next and logically bigger AI assault hits us. It's self-evident, as Gloria would say, that humanity should unite into one team. We're far from doing that, though. Humanity would also do better if we could find alien allies to stand with us. Unfortunately, John said, there's a problem with alien allies. First, we have to find them. Second, we have to convince them to trust us. That might be hard when we show up in their star system with an AI cybership. Right, Uther Kling said. I hadn't thought of that part. It's obvious, though. To an outside observer, we're an AI cybership. Gloria rolled her eyes. Likely, the mentalist had thought of that a long time ago. Luckily, we have an ace card, John said. I'm referring to the AI virus we used at Mars. Now, I don't know how long such an ace will last. The sooner we can use it, the better. Unfortunately, once we use the virus against the AIs, they're probably going to develop a counter for it. 
The virus is our great secret weapon, John said. In war, secret weapons never last long. The best way to use a secret weapon is in a huge battle that gains a critical strategic point. John leaned toward the others, searching their eyes. He could see that a few of them already understood where he was going with this. Think about the battle station, John said. It's massive. It must have docked cyber ships. It must be able to repair cyber ships and maybe even build them. The planet below might be a giant factory world, an automated plant. We don't know any of those things for certain, the old man said slowly. I'll tell you another thing, John said, ignoring the interruption. We know the location of the battle station. We don't know where anything else is in the nearby region of space. I would imagine the battle station has stellar maps of incredible accuracy. John, Gloria said, it sounds as if you're thinking about attacking the station. Attacking and occupying it, John said. Bast groaned under his breath. Gloria stared at John in befuddlement. The centurion's eyes gleamed with anticipation. The old man was thoughtful. How do we occupy a station 500 kilometers in diameter? Gloria asked. We don't have the manpower for that. True, John said. Then, Gloria said, perplexed. Clearly we can't do this alone, John said. We have to gather everything we can muster and hit that battle station hard. We have to get space marines inside and take it over. Ah, Gloria said. I'm beginning to perceive your madness. You want the Gilgamesh to help us. I want more than that, John said. We have another cyber ship on the way at Make Make. I want to use that vessel too. Three cyber ships against a massive battle station, and who knows how many cyber ships they have defending it, Gloria asked. What better place to use the AI virus, John asked. We barrel in, get close, zap them with the virus, and take out several AI vessels, maybe capturing a few, and capture the massive battle station to boot. That will smash their local power, boost ours, and likely give us greater intelligence about nearby space. We'll have used up our secret weapon, that's a minus, but I don't see a better way to grab a bigger haul with use of the secret weapon. For a few seconds, no one spoke. John, Gloria said, don't you realize this must be exactly what the AI robot wanted you to do when it made its plan? Maybe, and maybe not, John said. If that was its plan, likely it thought we'd go in alone. I mean to go in with three times that number. Now, if you can see a flaw in my plan, show me, and we'll do something else. They stared at him. Well, John said, start thinking. I want to hear the flaws. There have to be flaws. Despite that, I think we may have just stumbled onto a game changer. 25. John sat back thoughtfully as Uther Kling and Chief Technician Ghent filed out of the conference room. The centurion stopped beside him, clapping him on the good shoulder. The small killer seldom smiled. A tiny quirk played at the right corner of his mouth. His eyes gleamed with hunger. The colonel would have loved your idea, the centurion said, referring to the late Colonel Nathan Graham. John felt an intense wave of gratitude bubble out of him. He knew it was absurd. Those were just words. He couldn't help it, though. He beamed with delight although he gave a curt nod. It will be dangerous, the centurion said. A lot of good boys are going to die. He removed his hand and stood quietly. But that's what soldiers are for. I can't think of a better plan that might actually help us win the wider war. That's worth dying for if we have to. I think Sergeant Stark would have told you that you have big balls, Commander. John smiled, departed. He still felt bad about Stark. He still respected that tough old sod, the memory of what Stark had done for him in the rings of Saturn. We're going to ram our attack down their throat, the centurion said softly. We're going to make them sorry they ever messed with humans. We're going to tear the machines apart and piss on their cooling coils. An actual smile pulled at the centurion's leathery features. It did not make him endearing. It made the man seem deranged. John felt a chill work up his spine. He would not have thought that possible. He was glad the centurion was on their side. In the end, he had been the most dangerous of the three original sergeants. The centurion patted John's good shoulder one more time. 
he walked out through the hatch afterward. The old man had pulled out a pipe and lit it. He smoked as he sat at his spot at the table. There is one small problem with your idea. John noticed that neither Gloria nor Bast had gotten up. He wasn't sure he wanted them hearing this, but there was nothing he could do about it now. Those two had dearly disliked his plan. I'm listening, John told the old man. The tall old man puffed on his pipe, blowing smoke a moment later. You're going to need the Gilgamesh. I already said as much. And our new cyber ship from Make Make's moon, if it's ready, the old man said. Even if the new cyber ship is not ready, John said. That's the flaw. John shook his head. I don't see it. Earth, the old man said. Do you mean the Earth and Venus fleets, John asked. The old man withdrew the pipe from his mouth and pointed the stem at John. Why didn't you say something during the meeting, John asked. I'm saying it now. John inhaled deeply, seeing the problem. Then he saw the answer. He grinned. Whoever runs the Solar League made a mistake, John said. He or she has been building defensive satellites. They should have been building more warships instead. They've played defense because of a feared cybership assault upon Earth. Yeah, they have what's left of their original fleets. Ben still has the Mars fleet, and we can send them reinforcements from Uranus and Saturn. If Caracalla will agree to see his warships go to Mars, the old man said. It will be in Caracalla's interests to agree. The old man puffed on his pipe, clearly thinking about it. Finally, with both hands on the table, he shoved himself to his feet. He grabbed the pipe, puffed a little more, and nodded. You may be right about the satellites, the old man said. I imagine the Earth people could put up more satellites than spaceships. They figured by doing it that way, they'd have greater defensive strength at Earth. But it was a strategic mistake on the Solar League's part. They planned for what they could see. They did not plan for an unexpected shift in the strategic balance. Gloria appeared startled at the old man's words. A black swan, the mentalist said softly. John gave her a glance. I can't come up with a better idea, the old man told John. I wonder what Benz will say to your proposal. Only one way to find out, John said. The old man nodded and headed for the hatch. John regarded the last two, Gloria and Bast Bambeck. Neither had risen from their chair. Gloria seemed thoughtful. Bast was simply glum. There was no denying the frown on his face and the gloom in his eyes. This was unlike the sacerdote he recalled. What had gotten into Bast? Doing what the robot mind wants you to do doesn't seem like cleverness, Gloria said. It seems closer to suicide. Do you believe we have false data regarding the Alamu system battle station? John asked. How can we know? Gloria asked. That's your department, Bast, John said. The sacerdote looked up. Was the Corps tricking you? John asked. No, Bast said. That doesn't mean a thing, Gloria said. What if the Brain Corps carried false data but believed it was true data? Deceptions within deceptions, John said. Suppose we take that view. Where does it end? John snapped his finger suddenly as it hit him. It surprised him to see Bast flinch at the noise. That dampened some of his enthusiasm. Maybe that's the deception, John said. Maybe the robot brain calculated your intelligence. Maybe the brain planned to make you doubt everything. One of your strengths in the past has been hard, decisive strikes. That's been your strength, not mine, Gloria said. Either way, John said, could that be the deception here? It wouldn't be deception at that point, Gloria said. It would be an attempt to paralyze us from over-analysis. I seriously doubt that was its idea for us at this point. Why not? asked John. Because it doesn't play on your observed psychology, Gloria said. The brain unit must have calculated you as an attacker. That is your strength. You like to chance everything on a do-or-die thrust to the heart of the matter. Where's the trap in my battle station attack plan? Gloria shook her head. I don't know, she admitted, but that doesn't mean there isn't a trap. Look, John said, let's assume the worst. Clearly the AIs did not possess FTL messaging. If they did, the stealth robots in the solar system would have summoned a vast armada to wipe us out. That means the enemy will not be waiting for us to appear in the Alamu system. 
the battle station could be on constant high alert, Gloria said. Even if that's true, that's not the same as setting an ambush for us. I fail to see it's easy, John said. We drop out of hyperspace in the Alamu system. We'll have to do so at extreme range. We can scan all the while. If we scan a massive number of waiting cyberships, we leave via hyperspace. If there are more hidden pods on our hull, there aren't, John said. We checked the hull, remember? We might have missed a hidden pod, Gloria said. So we'll recheck the hull again while we're in the solar system. We'll scour the hull. Once we're sure, can we ever be 100% certain, asked Gloria. No, John said after a moment's reflection. Not 100%. There's always room for doubt, for an accident. One must accept reasonable odds and do his best in a situation. Go on, Gloria said. We can play this safe by coming at the battle station from a different direction than Earth. It will take us a little longer to begin the attack, but that way they can't find Earth by backtracking our course. Anyway, if the enemy has too much for us to handle, we leave the star system. That sounds reasonable, Gloria said. John spread his hands, nodding encouragingly. I'm still suspicious, Gloria said. There is something we're not seeing. Ah, John said, tapping the side of his nose. But it will be what the AIs don't see that will give us a smashing strategic victory. How can you be so certain? Well, John said, I'm not certain. I simply don't see a better use for the AI virus. It may only work once, so we might as well use it to gain the greatest rewards. Yes, Gloria said with an exhale of breath. Your attack might work. It sounds reasonable. I don't know if Ben's will agree, though. We're going to drop out of hyperspace, slow down to a stop, and regain velocity that heads us back to the solar system. That will take a little while. If Benz won't agree, we'll have lost time searching for new allies, Gloria said, interrupting. Nothing is certain. Quit trying to act as if it is. We do the best we can. Let's not drive ourselves crazy by thinking ourselves into a circle. Yes, she said, while standing. I suppose you're right. It's just... Gloria shook her head glanced at Bast, and walked out of the chamber. It's just you and me, big guy, John said. I hate it out here, Bast said ponderously. I feel exposed. I fear... I'm listening, John said. I fear I'll end my days as a head under AI control, jolted to do their vile bidding. So that was what was bothering the Sacerdote. John couldn't blame him. He tried to put those horrible images out of his mind. Was there any way to help Bust? You're thinking about it wrong, John said. Bust stared at him. Instead of getting concerned, get pissed off. Decide you're going to destroy those abominations. Look, Bust, either we people survive or the machines survive. Use your concern. I believe it is fear, Bust said. Okay. Fear, then, John said. Use your fear to pump up your hatred of the enemy. The AIs like to use your emotions against you. Well, we have emotions. Unless we burn them out with drugs, there's nothing we can do about that. We have to find a way to use our emotions to our advantage. That is well reasoned, Bast said, sounding surprised. I need you, my friend. I need you sober. This is going to be a bastard of a fight. It's going to make taking over the AI destroyer a walk in the park. Hatred, Bast said slowly, as if tasting the word and the concept. Is that what you do? Sure is, John said. I'm a good hater. That's what makes me a good soldier. I'm motivated. Bast worked his way to his feet. I will attempt to do as you say. Thank you, John. Thank you, Bast. Part 2. The Trap 1. Premier Frank Ben stood in his ready room aboard the pirated cyber ship Gilgamesh. He stood to the far side, beside an apparent window into space. He looked out the glass of the window. It was really a hologram device, showing what a window into space would have shown. Benz peered down at the red planet. Too much of the planet was still radioactive wasteland from the AI bombardment during the Battle of Mars. 
There was a pretense of normality among the survivors, but most Martians still reeled from the hellish assault. They feared the AIs, feared any thought of alien contact. Mars. Ben shook his head. The premier of the Mars Unity was an athletic Earthman in his early forties. He had dark hair and penetrating eyes. He'd loved playing sports in his youth. The more violent, the better. Without the best sports medicine, he'd still have injured knees, a torn rotator cuff, and a number of other ailments gained by endless collisions. Fortunately, he'd never gotten a concussion. Sometimes even the most modern medicine couldn't help a person with too much concussion damage to the brain. In that sense, he'd been lucky. Despite a youth given over to sports, and much of his early adulthood as well, Benz's mind was his chief tool these days. It hadn't always been that way. He'd used a highly advanced machine that had considerably heightened his intelligence. With his superior intellect, he'd maneuvered himself into the highest office in the communistic, secret police-infested Solar League. He'd become the premier of Earth and the League, having to do so for sheer survival. Ben sighed as he stared out of the window. That was all ancient history as far as he was concerned. He may have saved his life for the moment but he was in as tight a noose as he'd ever been. Benz frowned. No, that wasn't exactly right. The noose on Earth had been strangling him the final few days. He'd barely escaped and had almost lost his freedom on the flagship of the Earth fleet during the Battle of Mars against the AIs. Quick thinking had saved his life. Quick thinking, not all of it his own, had gained him nominal command of the captured cybership. Now could quick thinking save his Mars premiership and his life? Benz wasn't so sure these days. He'd been coming up against impossible political problems lately. He had felt a cunning mind manipulating events behind the scenes. This mind seemed to outthink and outmaneuver him time and again, until he felt as if he were in a box with no way out. I've squandered too much time, he said quietly. I've missed opportunities. His command of the cybership and his leadership of the Mars Unity were balanced on a greased tightrope. Ever since the fiasco at the edge of the asteroid belt and his serious wounding by the octopoids, Ben shook his head. That wasn't completely truthful. He'd been walking the political tightrope before that. The incident at the outer edge of the asteroid belt had greased the rope. One false move on the tightrope and he would plunge into the abyss. It would all end for him. The universe would go dark. A sardonic grin twitched on his lips as he considered a possible alternative. Before he could follow the new line of thinking, a chime sounded at the hatch. He frowned. Why did a cold feeling bloom in his gut? The chime was innocent enough. His people knew he took this time to be alone and think. If someone wanted admittance at this inopportune moment, it didn't necessitate something sinister. Benz pushed off the wall, pulled his jacket down so it sat more comfortably on his torso, and forced himself to portray an alert manner. He needed to maintain a confident attitude above all else. The crew needed to believe that he believed in himself 100%. Enter, he said. The hatch swished open and a Martian Marine in an impressive red and black uniform appeared. He was thicker than most Martians, but he still seemed slender to Benz's Earth eyes. Almost all Martians seemed emaciated by Earth's body standards. The Marine seemed nervous. That boded ill. Uh, sir, the Marine said, the Honorable Social Dynamic Party Secretary Ana Dominguez is here to see you. Benz hid his shock behind an affable manner. Ana Dominguez had obviously used a booster to accelerate off the surface of Mars. That seemed inconceivable. The party secretary of the Martian Social Dynamic Union was 154 years old and confined to a med chair. He was surprised to learn she could survive the G's of a planetary takeoff. What is she doing on the Gilgamesh? Could Dominguez be my secret enemy? Why did no one warn me that she was coming? Vela should have known about this. Was Vela in trouble? Logically, that was the most reasonable answer. Had his hidden enemies moved openly at last, putting his second-in-command under ship arrest? By all means, Benz told the Marine, escort the party secretary into my ready room. 
The Marine cleared his throat as he moved uneasily from one foot to the other. Yes, Benz asked. She uh, requests that her aide be allowed to accompany her, sir. It dawned on Benz that he hadn't seen this Marine before. The Premier had a nearly photographic memory. Vela usually kept the most loyal Marines on or near the bridge. Yes, this could be a coup attempt against him. The Marine's nervousness would seem to indicate the man wasn't 100% certain of the plot's success. The Marine also seemed to realize he was doing something wrong and wasn't quite comfortable with that. What's your name, son? Benz asked. The Marine turned a shade paler. Uh, Corporal Manuel Gutierrez, sir. Benz doubted he could bust out of the trap directly. Yes, Gutierrez licked his lips as his right hand strayed down to the butt of his holstered sidearm. There would be others ready to back Gutierrez. It would seem that Benz needed to deal directly with Ana Dominguez. If she was his secret enemy, at least he knew it now. That was good to know, provided he survived the encounter. Fine, Ben said. The party secretary and her aide. Bid them enter. The Marine clicked his heels and moved aside, which was contrary to Benz's original orders that the man escort them into the chamber. A soft purr heralded party secretary Ana Dominguez as her support unit wheeled into the ready room. The support unit was a chrome-colored chair. It supported a frail-seeming old woman. She couldn't be more than four foot ten and couldn't have weighed more than eighty pounds. The chair was like a throne. Only one tube was visible as it went through a thick sleeve and disappeared into her arm. Fluids surged thickly in the tube. Ana Dominguez had a wrinkled face swathed in black cloth. The eyes were alive, shiny, dark pinholes of seething cunning. She wore a red garment and pants with black boots. The boots rested on a pedestal. The only skin showing besides her face was her hands. Each of the fingernails had been painted black. That did not become her in the slightest. The fingers of her left hand moved a tiny metal rod at the end of the armrest to control her chair. She wheeled it through the hatch and moved toward the large desk before stopping suddenly. Benz approached his desk from the other direction, nodding at her before sitting down. There was a gun in the desk. There had been a gun in the desk. It seemed more than probable that someone had removed the gun. Welcome, Anna, Ben said, opening the needed drawer. Yes, the gun was gone. The plotters had thoroughly prepared for this. Ancient Anna did not respond to his words. Instead, she watched him with ill-concealed glee. A man strode through the hatch. He was lean like a vulture and had the same kind of hunch to his shoulders. The man had narrow features, darker than normal skin, and wore a black suit. He had several black rings on his fingers. As the hatch closed behind him, the man seemed to look everywhere at once, searching, gauging, and studying. He seemed to be memorizing the ready room's layout, to examine the pictures on the walls and analyze what they indicated about Ben's. You brought your assassin with you, Ben's asked Ana Dominguez. The lean man halted, swiveled his body so it faced Ben's, and gave the premier an icy stare. Do you take offense at my supposed action? the old woman asked Ben's. She had a surprisingly strong voice. There was nothing ancient in it. The voice indicated iron will and certainty. There was possibly the sound of glee in it as well, but Benz couldn't be certain. In order to hide his nervousness, Benz put his hands on his desk as he shook his head. No offense taken, he said. He lies, the black-clad man said in a low whisper. He loathes me. I can feel the vibration from his spirit. The black-clad man moved behind the chrome support unit. The unit began to wheel again, maneuvering before the premier's desk, halting an inch from it. You wish to see me, Ben said, as if nothing was wrong. He's nervous, the black-clad man said in his sinister whisper. He wants to know the worst as soon as possible. Ben's leaned back, his mind a whirl. At last, Anna said, I meet the famous, or should I say infamous, Frank Benz. The pin-dot eyes seemed to burn with passion. I do not find you to be a superman at all. A pity, Ben said. I'd hope to overawe you with my personality. 
He is calculating swiftly, the black-clad man said. He is weighing odds. I can feel the tensions rise in him. Benz felt an odd sensation at that moment. He re-examined the black-clad man. The premier understood that he'd made a mistake. The lean man wasn't an assassin. No, he was something else. Benz's eyes widened fractionally. Party secretary, the black-clad man said. He is on the verge of understanding why I'm here. Ah, Anna said. Maybe you are as smart as they say, she told Benz. That is going to make the, ah, uh, coming readjustment that much more enjoyable. You see an empath, Benz asked. Very good, Anna said. You've reached the conclusion with remarkably little evidence. Is that a joke? Benz asked. Her pin-dot eyes seemed to burn darker. Have a care, Premier, she told him. I can make this quite painful if I desire. Benz would have preferred to remain utterly still in order to create the illusion of power. Instead, he drummed the fingers of his left hand on the desk. He couldn't help it. The nerves in his gut boiled too much. You have done me a great service, Anna was saying. You have done Mars a great service. Now, however, he understands, the empath said. He is running through counter options in his mind. The black-clad man put a hand on the party secretary's left shoulder. You are in danger, the man told the ancient crone. It may have been a mistake doing it like this. Anna smiled, showing off her white teeth. Do you believe you can launch yourself across your desk and choke me to death before reinforcements arrive through the hatch? She asked the premier. Benz frowned. It would seem to be an elementary tactic to knock down the empath and kill the old woman. He would have to kill the empath afterward, too. That would give him a few minutes to develop a plan. The guards and hitmen outside the ready room could pose a problem, though. He assumed such people would be outside on the bridge, given Anna's veiled boasts. It would be a pity killing the empath, though. Benz could use someone like that on his staff, if he could have trusted the man. That was Benz's great dilemma. He'd escaped from Earth with precious few Earthmen in his train. Most of those people had died. The rest of the cybership crew was made up of Martians. A few might side with him in a pinch. Most of the Gilgamesh's crew were Martians first, his people second. He needed more time, and he needed a different source for his crew in order to turn them into loyalists that would stick with him through thick or thin. If he could wrap himself around the Martian flag. For all his intellect, he hadn't figured out a way to do that yet. Social dynamism on Mars hadn't become as radical as practiced on Earth and Venus. Still, it held Martian society in a suffocating web. Why do you believe that removing me from office will cement your position? Benz asked. It is obvious, Anna said. You stand in my way. Once you're gone, I can put one of my creatures onto the Gilgamesh's captain's chair. With the sole cybership in the solar system, the Mars Unity will begin an incremental assault upon the so-called Solar Freedom Force. Hawkins will return, Ben said. Most likely, she said. But he will return too late to save the outer planets. Once I hold them and build up, I can turn upon the Solar League. Hawkins will destroy you for attacking the SFF while he was gone. I seriously doubt that, young man. Hawkins is a warrior. He only wants to fight. I will make a pact with him allowing him to fight the A.I.s to his heart's desire while I rule the solar system. Is power that delicious at your age? Benz asked. Anna laughed. Behind her, the lean empath smiled knowingly. At any age, Anna said, power is the sweetest ambrosia there is. Before I pass, I plan to become drunk on power. There are many objectives I still wish to achieve. Because of Hawkins' misstep and your wounding in the asteroid belt, I've been able to assemble the needed people to throw you down from the height of your alien starship. You took too long to recover from your injuries, Premier. During your deep wounding, you let slip the reins of power, just enough to give me my opportunity. Beware, the empath told her. He is readying himself to strike. It was true. 
Benz's muscles coiled as he sat on the chair. He was going to do exactly what the old crone had asked him earlier. He was going to climb over the desk and launch himself at her. Before Benz made the initial move, though, the old woman reached into her red garment and withdrew a compact device with a sinister nozzle poking at him. Her tiny thumb hovered over a red button, a firing button, no doubt. I need merely touch the button and the beam will disintegrate you, she said. That can't be a laser weapon, Ben said. It's too small for the needed power pack. I told you what it is, a disintegrator. I seriously doubt that. No one has created the technology for such a small beam weapon. I have, Anna said triumphantly. Benz fingered his chin as a chill of understanding swept over him. Is that alien technology? he asked. Why would you care? she sneered. You're about to die. Benz kept his composure as he furiously thought through the implications of an alien weapon. I fail to see the advantage in killing me, Ben said blandly. I suspect you already rule Mars, party secretary. I am the premier, true enough, but I merely run foreign policy. I have done nothing to disrupt your hold on power. I have sought your advice, party secretary, the empath interrupted in warning. Benz reached across the desk and picked up a fist-sized glass paper holder. Almost nonchalantly, he brought the glass to him and then hurled it at the party secretary. Benz had kept his mind focused on the political situation, attempting to simulate a pleading tone in his thoughts. Apparently that had been enough to hide his hidden intention long enough from the empath. As he picked up the heavy glass piece, he reacted as instantly as he could. He's going to attack you, the empath finished. By that time, it was too late to warn the ancient crone. The heavy glass object had flown true, striking her against the forehead. Perhaps after a hundred and fifty-four years, her skull had become more brittle than in her youth. The party secretary of Mars sagged against her chrome-colored throne. Her arms sagged and her hands opened. The compact disintegrator fell onto her lap. Both the empath and Benz watched the disintegrator. The lean man watched from behind her throne. Benz watched from behind his large desk. They both seemed to move at once. The empath came around the chair, reached for the disintegrator, grabbed it, raised it, and began to aim it at Benz. The premier was on the desk. He kicked hard, his boot connecting with the disintegrator. The compact weapon flew across the room, striking a wall and bouncing across the floor. The empath whirled around, racing for it. Benz jumped off the desk, landed on the floor, and followed the empath. The lean man dove for the disintegrator. Benz leaped after him, landing on the back of his legs. No, the empath shouted. Benz clawed up the man's torso. He was going to beat him to death. The empath twisted around. Their faces were inches apart. The man had huge, dark eyes that seemed to grow larger and larger. No pain, the empath hissed. Benz began to laugh. Then the pain struck. He cried out. The empath seemed to be more than just that. He, Benz roared as he clamped down on the pain. His fingers clutched onto the fabric of the empath's jacket. Benz didn't know it, but the empath had twisted back around to reach for the disintegrator. Although Benz couldn't see through his watery eyes, he could still feel. The premier slid a steely arm around the empath's throat. He tightened his hold, choking the man. Then he yanked back as hard as he could. The empath began to gurgle as he sought to wrench off the steely arm. The pain subsided in Ben's mind. Then it hit harder than ever. The premier groaned and slackened his chokehold. No, Ben snarled. In his day, he'd played hundreds, maybe thousands of grueling physical contests. Hockey, football, basketball, wrestling. In many of those contests, he had been dead tired. He'd been beat. His lungs had screamed for air, and his legs had felt like noodles. In most of those instances, Benz had clamped down on the pain and pushed his body to go longer, faster, and to exert more strength. That was how he'd won a lot of his games, by wearing down his opponent. Today, in the ready room, as the pain filled his mind, Ben still forced himself to choke harder, longer. Abruptly, the mental pain ceased. The creature was dead.
Benz crashed onto the floor as he released his defeated foe. He knew this was far from over, but he no longer had an ounce of strength left. Two. After an undeterminable length of time, Benz opened his eyes as he lay on his back in his ready room. He realized he heard knocking on the hatch. Just a second, Benz called. The knocking ceased. Did the others on the other side of the hatch recognize his voice? If they did, no. He didn't have the luxury of time to think this over. He likely had to act now to save his life. The party secretary had come up here to kill him, certainly to depose him from his captain's chair. Why she had felt the need to do so personally, Benz didn't understand that. It had been risky. Why had she been willing to risk her life for it? The pounding against the hatch increased. Benz closed his eyes and opened them wide. Even if the party secretary and empath were dead, the others on the bridge would have to kill him in order to cover their hides. Killing him as the party secretary's murderer seemed like the obvious solution for them. What was the answer that could save his life? Despite his aching head and sore muscles, Benz thought he saw a way out of his dilemma. While on his hands and knees, he crawled toward the compact disintegrator. What was this thing? Could it really have disintegrated him? That seemed preposterous. The hatch squealed as it opened. Benz twisted his head. He saw battlesuit gloves on the bottom crumpled edge of the hatch, using the exoskeleton power of the suit to force the hatch up. Benz no longer had a choice. He picked up the compact device, climbed to his feet in a stubborn effort of will, and aimed the tiny nozzle at the hatch. The battle-suited Marine opened the hatch all the way and regarded him through an armored visor. Benz touched the red button with his thumb. An intense clear ray beamed out of the nozzle, burned through the visor, and presumably melted the head inside the suit. Yes. As Benz took his thumb off the button, the battle suit toppled backward like a felled ancient redwood tree. In that instant, Benz realized what he had to do. It was a sickening solution to his problem, but he didn't see any other way out of it. Forcing himself to walk, he staggered to the hatch, moving out of the ready room and onto the bridge. The place was filled with personnel, many who did not belong here. Some of them were Marines. Some of them had holstered weapons. Before any of them could react, Benz raised the compact disintegrator and started beaming the coup plotters. In this instance, he did not stop until every one of them dropped to the deck, dead. By that time, the disintegrator was hot in his hand. A terrible burned stench billowed throughout the bridge. A few of the slain had gotten off shots, one had grazed his side, exposing reddened flesh through the tear in his uniform. It was the only shot that had come close to hitting him. Clearly, the coup plotters had hardly known what hit them. As Benz removed his thumb from the red button, he hardly realized what had happened. The murderous attack left him shaken, but he knew it wasn't over yet. Even this gruesome part of the solution wasn't over. Benz marched to a fallen Marine, tore the gun from the holster, and began to wade past the bodies on the floor. He started by putting a bullet in each head. He couldn't take any chances that any of them were still alive. Then he realized he didn't have the time for such luxury. He examined each person with a glance and shot five more individuals, those with signs of life. Benz felt terribly alone. He felt soiled by what he had done. This was murder. There was no getting around it but it was also a political house-cleaning. With these people gone, maybe he could truly gain command of the Gilgamesh. First, Benz paused. He turned around, staring at the compact disintegrator on the deck. Slowly, almost like a sleepwalker, he moved back to it. Stooping, he picked it up. The thing was cool again. This was not ordinary technology. In fact, Benz doubted anyone else in the solar system possessed such a weapon. What did that tell him? With growing wonder, Benz headed back for his ready room. He was actually fearful about what he was going to find. Three. Ben stood in the hatchway between the bridge and his ready room. Behind him lay the many Martian dead, around half of them Martian space marines. Only a quarter of those had been wearing battle armor. 
Inside the ready room lay the dead empath and Anna Dominguez in her chrome throne-like chair. Was there anything odd about their bodies? Benz couldn't tell from where he was standing. He glanced at the compact disintegrator. He'd never seen or heard of anything like this. The things he'd done with the disintegrator just now. That was potent battle tech. If the Martian fleet were armed with large disintegrators, it could possibly stand off the rest of the solar system by itself. What did it tell him that the ancient party secretary had possessed such a weapon? One hundred and fifty-four years old, Ben said quietly. She was the oldest person in the solar system by a considerable amount. The next oldest was one hundred and seven, another woman, but this one from Earth. That woman was within the historic norms. One hundred and fifty-four was not within the historic norms. The chrome medical chair was a one-of-a-kind device. That was the legend. Her father had dug it out of Martian ruins in the South Pole region. Others had looked in the strange ruins at the South Pole. Some people suggested those were alien ruins from thousands of years ago, maybe ten or twenty thousand years ago. Benz examined the smooth compact. Was this disintegrator of human manufacture? He pocketed the deadly device, but still did not move farther into the ready room. Who had ever heard of a real-life empath? Ben's hadn't until this moment. Humans did not possess telepathy, empathy, or other so-called psionic powers. That was just another term for magic. There weren't any wizards in real life, any sorcerers or witches, not in the accepted norm of spells that teleported or changed people's minds against their wills. Ben's moved woodenly into the ready room. He had to figure something out fast. He was going to need people to remove the dead. When they saw the carnage on the bridge, that could topple him from power right there. You have to think, Frank, Benz told himself. You have to act like the smartest person in the solar system, not just talk about it. Benz nodded as if fortifying his heart for what he had to do. He marched into the ready room and knelt beside the black-clad empath. He touched the corpse. It seemed far too cool already. He leaned over and rose abruptly. He went to his desk, rummaged in a bottom drawer, and came back with a small penknife. He cut the corpse. He wasn't sure what he hoped to find. That the outer layer of skin proved to be a false covering shocked him to the core. The penknife dropped from his nerveless fingers. Ben's panted as he knelt there. Soon, his forehead furrowed. He picked up the penknife and carefully inserted the tip of the blade between the human skin and the lightly bluish scales underneath. He peeled away the human flesh, the pseudo-human skin, and revealed. What is this? he whispered. He peeled more until he revealed the scale-like skin underneath on the left forearm. They were moist like a fish's scale. This was an alien. Correction, the dead thing on the floor had been an alien. It was a corpse now. What did that mean, though, that an alien empath and a... Ben stood in a wooden manner and stepped beside the party secretary's corpse. It was just as cool as the empaths. The creature, the empath, had definitely hit him with some kind of telepathic power. How had such aliens arrived on Mars? How long had they been here? How had an alien in pseudo-human skin come to run the Mars Social Dynamic Union? Why did you come alone into my office, he asked the two corpses. What did you hope to achieve? Ben stepped back until he bumped up against his desk. The aliens had come up here to gain control of the cybership. What had the one called it? A starship. Right, Ben said. The aliens wanted the cyber ship because it could cruise between the stars. They were going to grab it and do what? Leave the solar system. He needed Vela. He needed to clean up the ready room and the bridge. He needed a good cover story. Frank Benz gave a harsh caw of laughter. He had it. He knew what he was going to do. This could work. It could really work. Not only that, but it might actually cement his power so he could run the Mars unity with true authority and assurance. This could be just what I need, he said. If he played it right, and if he could convince the right people from the get-go. 
It was time to find Vela. He needed her expertise to make this thing airtight. Four. The hatch to the bridge slid open, and Vela Shaw almost collapsed with relief into Benz's arms. You're alive, she said, coming to him. She laughed as he hugged her. I'm alive, she said into his right ear. I thought, she gasped in what might have been horror. The strength left her knees. If Benz hadn't been holding on to her, she would have likely hit the deck. When he felt her strength return, Benz let go. Frank, she whispered as she stared at the carnage on the bridge, at the countless dead. Benz turned toward the carnage, although he glanced at her to see how she'd take it. Vela was startlingly beautiful, with long blonde hair and green eyes of great intensity. She wore a Martian fleet uniform, red with black. It helped highlight her beauty. That beauty was how Benz had come to find her. Not so long ago, secret police chief J.P. Justinian had raped Vela on Earth. She had been seething for vengeance. That wishing had gotten her into grave trouble when Justinian became the premier of the Solar League. Benz had saved her life, giving her the same intelligence-heightening treatment that he'd received and had convinced her to enlist in his struggle. Along the way, the two of them had become lovers. Now, Benz didn't know what he'd do without her. It wasn't simply her remarkable beauty. She was possibly the only one smart enough to appreciate his genius, and certainly the only one smart enough to help him. You killed them, Vela whispered. Benz nodded. How did you manage it? she asked. Over the ship's calm, Benz had requested that she come alone to the bridge. The people who had been holding her apparently hadn't recognized his voice. He'd used a scrambler, so that had probably helped. No doubt those people had figured Vela was going to her death. Benz took the compact disintegrator out of his jacket pocket. Vela frowned at it. The thing has a nozzle as if it's a weapon, she said. He began to tell her what had happened, although he left out how he'd acquired the disintegrator. Vela nodded as she listened. I wouldn't believe you regarding that thing, she said, except that I see the evidence before my eyes. It must really be able to do what you say. Here's the problem, though. Where did you get it? I'll show you, Ben said. Vela stared at him. Do I want to see this? she asked. Most definitely, he said. She considered that and finally nodded. As Benz led her to the ready room, he described the party secretary's arrival with the black-clad empath. By the time they weaved a path through the dead coup plotters, Benz had explained how he picked up the heavy glass object and hurled it at the party secretary's forehead. They stepped into the ready room. Benz raised his arm to indicate the two dead beings. Vela stared at him. Do you see? Benz asked her. Vela shook her head. He put a hand on her left elbow, guiding her to the dead empath. Vela gasped, pulling away from him as she covered her mouth. She turned to Benz with horror and with understanding. Aliens, she whispered. Benz nodded. Where did they come from? She asked. Out there is the clear but vague answer, Benz said with a wave behind him. It would be good to know when they arrived. Vela's lids hooded her eyes as she thought about that. She nodded a moment later. Do you think these aliens fled from the AIs? She asked. I deemed that the most likely answer. To hide on Earth? Well, the solar system, I presume. Exactly, he said. When did Ana Dominguez take over the Mars SDU party? We'll have to check the history tapes. First, though, we have to clean up the bridge. Vela appeared thoughtful. You're going to need a cover story. Benz couldn't hold it any longer. He exposed his teeth in a fierce smile. What is it? she asked. Why are you... Her eyebrows arched as understanding hit her. This is exactly what I need, what we need, Ben said. Aliens have infiltrated the Mars party. Now I'm going to say that I had the foresight to sniff them out of hiding. That's why they came up here. The aliens had to kill me before I uncovered them. The Martians aiding the aliens are traitors to humanity. Anyone opposing me will be painted as anti-human. That's clever, Vela said. But I foresee a problem. I'm listening. Given the gravity of our larger problem, we should enlist the aliens to help us against the AIs. 
Why do you believe there are more aliens on Mars? These two could be it. Do you really believe that? Vela asked. I mean, think through the implications of their existence and their positions in Martian society. Ben bent his head as he truly began to think. He correlated possibilities with probabilities. After a time, his head snapped up as he stared at Vela. There's likely a small colony of aliens on Mars, Ben said. Vela nodded. We could use the help of these aliens, Ben said. Use their greater knowledge about the AIs and their knowledge about the interstellar situation. If the aliens are here and have this superior technology, he raised the disintegrator, it stands to reason they arrived here in hyperspace-capable vessels of their own. I tend to think they no longer have such vessels, Vela said. Yes, I agree. Unless they've grown arrogant. That is only a small possibility, Vela said. I'd grant it as a large possibility, Ben said. I spoke to them, remember? These aliens are arrogant. Besides, by coming to my office alone, they showed overwhelming arrogance. Their misstep is what allowed me my opportunity. I can see that, Vela said, but that still doesn't solve our problem. If we use these aliens as our scapegoat and as a means of unifying the Martians behind us, we're going to have a difficult time letting the aliens aid us against the AIs. Public pressure might force us into having to kill them all. Benz could see that possibility. Whipping up a nation or world against another group made it difficult later. Once people's emotions were stirred so strongly, they demanded blood. In this case, they would want alien blood. However, the more he whipped up Martian hatred against the hidden aliens, the more the Martians would potentially rally behind him. Well, Vela asked, what's the verdict? You'd better decide now so we know how to explain your slaughter up here. Ben sighed a moment later. I don't see that I have a choice, he said. I have to explain this in a way that will mollify the rest of the crew, with me slaughtering everyone on the bridge. I need a mortal danger against all of us in order to ensure your survival and mine. I'm afraid I agree, Vela said sadly. It's not going to make it easy for us to encourage these hidden aliens to help us later. We have to capture some if we can, Vela said. Benz nodded. He would like to make these aliens his allies. Humanity needed help, but he needed to cement his political position as leader before he did anything else. Are you ready? Benz asked Vela. She took a deep breath, nodding a moment later. Then let's cook up a good cover story and get started, Ben said. I'm sure many people are waiting for the outcome up here. If we wait too long, I know, Vela said, and I think I know exactly how we should proceed. Ben's listened to her, soon grinning, liking his woman's plan. Five. It turned out that the highest-ranked members of the conspiracy had been on the Gilgamesh's bridge. Likely they'd wanted to be there for the aftermath in order to grab more power at the earliest opportunity. Killing the ringleaders helped throw Benz's most determined enemies into disarray. The conspiratorial organizations wasted time as the underlings struggled for the new primacy. That allowed Benz and Vela time to recruit angry Martians hungry to destroy the secret aliens. The key was in acquiring the head of the Martian secret police and the fierce loyalty of the Martian space marines. During the coming days, Benz worked tirelessly from his office aboard the Gilgamesh. As he did, concentrating on acquiring dominating political control, Vela hunted for traitors aboard ship, even as she built up the number of Martians who realized that Benz had saved them and that Benz had the acuity to turn Mars into a powerhouse. The days passed with the two of them working brutally long hours. The disintegrator and the two corpses became symbols of alien oppression. Propaganda moved Martians to the conclusion that these hidden aliens had helped bring the AIs to Mars. A year and a half ago, the attacking cyberships had dropped hell burners on the planet. The enemy cyberships had slaughtered hundreds of millions of Martians, more than 40% of the population. It was thus easy to whip up the people into a frenzy of hatred against the alien spies responsible for the destruction. That was the PR story, at least. 
So far, though, after two weeks of neighbors watching neighbors and kids their parents, no genuine aliens had turned up. Oh, there had been endless calls and police searches. Many people had accused many others, but the police hadn't yet gotten their hands on an alien spy. Benz did use the opportunity to clean out the former party secretary's political apparatus. Everyone with a connection to her, everyone with a connection to Benz's most zealous political opponents, either died by noose or pistol, or found themselves incarcerated at the secret police's most notorious prison, the Alamo. It wasn't pretty. In truth, the process was ugly and bloody. Grabbing political power directly usually was. Benz didn't believe he had a lot of time left. In some instances, he tried to be smooth, but ended up having too many angry people working for him. They crushed the opposition as the opposition had almost given Mars and the asteroid belt to aliens. At least in people's minds, that was true. The Red Planet seethed with this growing alien hatred, which fueled the increased alien hunting, turning Mars into a hotbed of activity. During the next few weeks, Benz hammered out new policies that would consolidate his power in time. For a while at least, the people of Mars and Benz and Vela forgot about the AIs and the stealth pods most likely sprinkled throughout the solar system. They were too intent on ferreting out the alien spies on Mars. Then, the secret police discovered a genuine alien. They only found out he was an alien after shooting him, though. An alert major noticed something amiss after the body slumped in the courtyard. The major marched to the corpse, took out a knife, and peeled away pseudo-skin to reveal moist and lightly blue-colored scales. Armored air cars raced to a special facility of the Ares Corporation outside the city of Latia. The alien spy had come from there. The arresting police put every worker into police vans. Then teams hunted through the facility, searching every cranny for secret doors to hidden hideaways. The interrogators had everyone put in restraints. Thirteen hours after the first air car landed at the main facility, the interrogators found their first living alien. The chief of secret police, Rafael Franco, promptly contacted Benz. The premier was in his ready room, regarding the hollow image before him. Franco was a small man with a vintage Roman nose. He never looked a person directly in the eyes, seemingly too shy to do that. Excellent work, Chief, Benz told the man. I commend you on ferreting out this creature. Franco sat utterly still, as if absorbing the praise into his pores. I believe the alien is female, Excellency. Oh, Ben said. She swore to her interrogator that she would be cooperative. She obviously desires to live, Excellency, but I doubt her word. Why is that? During her capture, she slew twenty-seven operatives. She also ignited the grounds behind her. We found massive amounts of strange alloys. My top scientists believe it was some kind of space vehicle. Benz couldn't believe this. It was worse than he'd expected. Strange alloys. Could the alien have destroyed a special type of space vessel? As he ruminated, Benz noticed the secret police chief watching him stealthily. It was most carefully done. Franco was dangerous. He mustn't ever forget that. What would the man expect from him? Is the alien allergic to pain? Asked Benz, trying to find out if Franco had tortured her. Franco grinned slightly, actually looking up at Benz for just a moment. He quickly looked down afterward. She is, Excellency. Benz appeared to be in deep thought. He already knew what he wanted. The alien could be a gold mine of information. This was fantastic. Use your top operatives, Chief. This must work flawlessly. They will escort the alien via shuttle to the Gilgamesh. Franco sat utterly still as his features appeared to harden. And if the alien dies during the ascent, Excellency? The Chief of Secret Police asked. Benz became hyper alert. What was the man's problem? Why would you suspect such an accident? Benz asked. Franco spoke in a clipped manner. She is an alien. She is dangerous. I have come to believe that she has psionic powers. Benz wished he'd never included in his original report the empathic and telepathic powers of the black-clad alien. In my opinion, Excellency, having her aboard the cybership would be the worst place for her. It would put her too close. Uh, Franco looked up 
and his normally placid eyes seemed to burn with passion. It would put her within striking range of our primary source of military power. If the alien gained control of the Gilgamesh, she could destroy Mars. As abruptly as the zealousness appeared, it vanished, and Franco looked down, almost as if he didn't realize what he'd just said. Benz thought he understood. The secret police chief would make sure the alien died before he allowed her aboard the Gilgamesh. The chief was a true believer, wishing to hunt down and destroy the alien menace. Likely, it's why the chief had thrown in his support so readily at the beginning. You raise an interesting point, Ben said. I must study the situation further. Until that time, keep the alien under tight security in the Alamo. You may count on me, Excellency. Benz nodded slowly, wondering. The hatch opened and Vela rushed in. She looked pale and obviously wanted to tell him something. Just a moment, Chief, Ben said, muting the connection. What is it? he asked Vela. A cyber ship has appeared, she blurted. It's at the inner edge of the Oort cloud. What? A cyber ship? Vela nodded miserably. Ben's inhaled deeply, expanding his chest. Franco and his captured alien would have to wait. Six. The AI invasion scare lasted until the first light-speed message arrived from the Nathan Graham between the scattered disk and the Oort cloud. A few high-level people in the outer planets remained suspicious, thinking the Nathan Graham may have stumbled upon waiting AI vessels out there in the void. According to the theory, the AI cyberships had stormed the Earth-run vessel, learned the truth about the solar system, and now practiced deception for a massive assault. That theory died after a few back-and-forth messages confirming that John Hawkins spoke to them, and not some AI illusion. The Nathan Graham accelerated for the dwarf planet of Make Make in the Kuiper Belt. As it did, Hawkins sent a tight beam message to the Gilgamesh. Greetings, Premier Benz. I realize our quick return might seem strange to you, or possibly an act of cowardice, but it is nothing of the kind. We have stumbled upon an amazing discovery. AI stealth pods hid on our hull. They attached themselves during our time at the edge of the asteroid belt. I suspect the Gilgamesh may have similar stealth pods attached to it. I urge you to check at once, but take care. The robots may attempt to convert one or more of your people in an attempt to get near enough to assassinate you. We scoured our hull a second time and found a master unit. Eventually, we broke its programming and learned of an AI battle station in the Alamu system, 17.2 light years from the solar system. We have come to believe that this battle station is the key AI military outpost in our local sector of space. It will have cyber ships, repair and construction yards, and many other military supplies, and, no doubt, stellar maps of the local star systems. It is our belief that if we can storm and capture the battle station, that we can then arm humanity with more cyber ships, and possibly discover several alien allies in the nearby star systems. Now is the time to use our operational secret weapon in the Alamo system. I refer to the AI virus you and Bas Banbeck created during the Battle of Mars. However, the Nathan Graham cannot storm this battle station alone. We need help. We need reinforcements. I have already instructed the construction yard of Make Make's moon to begin preparation for launching the partially completed vessel. I have contacted Calvin Karakala of Saturn to begin sending space marines and techs to Make Make. The Nathan Graham will supply the new cyber ship with its command crew. Together with the Gilgamesh, I believe we have an excellent chance of success. Thus, I urge you to begin acceleration for Make Make. Bring all the Martian space marines you can spare. This is likely going to be a grueling battle, but this is the great opportunity to turn the tide in our sector of the Orion arm. Please notify me of any concerns. But know this, Premier. Time is likely critical. There are stealth pods in the solar system. We must move before they can engineer a counteraction or summon enemy cyber ships against us. Commander John Hawkins, out. Benz and Vela carefully considered Hawkins' plan of action. They had objections, one big objection in particular. Soon, Ben sat at the desk in his ready room as he sent his reply to the Nathan Graham, heading for the scattered disk region. Hello, Commander Hawkins. I'm pleased to learn the Nathan Graham has successfully used hyperspace to travel away from and return to the solar system. That is excellent news. 
we now know without a doubt that we have an interstellar fairing vessel. That being said, I am concerned that you have not thought through all the ramifications of your plan. It is bold, to say the least. It might also prove risky, as we have no idea of the military power of the battle station and its accompanying cyberships, and whatever else the AIs have in the Alamu system. There is also the possibility that this is an elaborate trap. There is the possibility that the AIs are attempting to lure our best ships away from the solar system so they can attack us here. The existence of the robot stealth units in our solar system supports this theory. Surely those stealth units have a communication link with a guiding AI. Even if that is not the case, there is another worry. The Solar League will note the departure of three cybership's. Once our three great vessels leave, the Mars Unity and the SFF will be in a weaker military position compared to Earth's Solar League. I fear that once the Gilgamesh leaves on this risky venture, the Solar League will directly attack Mars. I therefore ask you, what good is it to defeat the AIs if the Solar League destroys our home? Perhaps a lightning raid with the Nathan Graham and your second cybership would pay the greatest dividends, with the least risk to our united effort. Surely you can understand that I cannot in good conscience leave Mars defenseless against the predatory and ruthless Solar League. I have dealt with those people, and I know to what lengths they will go to teach Mars a bitter lesson for having left the League. Thus, I am afraid I will have to disappoint you, sir. I applaud your boldness. I will also certainly begin an immediate and thorough search of the Gilgamesh's hull. Thank you for your confidence and for your valiant efforts against our mutual enemy. The Premier of the Mars Unity salutes you, sir. In time, an answer returned from the Nathan Graham. Premier Benz, John Hawkins said from his command chair on the Nathan Graham's bridge. I applaud your common sense and desire to give Mars and the asteroid belt the greatest protection possible. You are a true and great leader. However, I would be at fault if I did not point out a salient fact. The leaders of the Solar League have committed a grave strategic error. They built up their defenses for a united cybership assault against Earth. I'm referring to their constant adding of orbital defensive satellites. It was and is an impressive display of determination to defend the homeworld. I applaud them for that. What they have not done is significantly increase the number and strength of the Earth fleet. The same can be said, although on a lesser scale, for Venus and the Venus fleet. That means the Solar League is not in position to mount a credible attack against Mars. Clearly, their combined fleets could possibly defeat the present Mars fleet, minus the Gilgamesh. But I am ready to send a good portion of the Uranus and Saturn fleets to Mars in order to add 50 to 100 percent more warships. I leave that number to your discretion, as I do not want you to worry about too many SFF warships in or near Mars orbit. The Solar League's strategic production error will allow us to use our three cyber ships in a terrible swift battle to wrench the initiative from the AI enemy. Premier Benz, do not be deceived. We are about to launch the battle that could decide humanity's fate. A half-assed assault with two cyber ships is madness when we have the ability to launch a 50% heavier assault with three cyber ships. This isn't the time for squeamishness or too much caution. This is the moment for an aggressive attack. Either we do this together and win, or we go our separate ways and lose alone. The choice is yours, Premier Benz. I pray you decide to take the manly route. Commander Hawkins, out. 7. Take the manly route, Ben said as he struck the desk in his ready room. Did you hear that? Take the manly route? That is as good as accusing me of cowardice. I doubt he meant it like that, Vela said in a soothing voice. Ben's glared at her. Of course Hawkins meant it like that. He believes himself to be the great conqueror, the daring man of action who saved the solar system three times already. He as good as told me to emulate him and act like a man. I am very much a man. No one thinks otherwise, Vela said. Benz's eyes narrowed. Did you hear him or not? he asked. Should I play the message back for you? There's no need, Vela said. I heard what he said. Are you suggesting that wasn't an insult? Premier, no, Vela, Ben said. Don't play word games with me, of all people. You know what he said, and you know what he meant. Maybe Hawkins thought to stir you to action by saying what he did. Ha, Ben said. I'll stir him to action. 
Does he think a man leaps to a deed because of a few words? Does he believe that he's stronger and more dangerous than me? Frank, Vela's words died in her throat as Benz whipped around to glare at her. Finally, Benz turned away. I shouldn't get so angry, he said. Vela said nothing. Benz massaged his forehead, squinting for a moment. I'd like to know if Hawkins could have taken out a bridge full of enemies by himself. I'd like to know if Hawkins could have fought free of a telepathic alien. Those were manly actions. Yes, Vela said quietly. Ben slapped the table and shoved up to his feet. He shook his head and finally flung his hands into the air. He's a mercenary, a dome rat from Titan, Ben said. He used to be a criminal, according to my sources. He'd probably use that kind of talk to motivate his fellow criminals. He was a gang member as a youth, Vela said. He grew up in a rough- Don't defend him, Ben said. Premier, Vela said. You must cease this display of bravado. You're the great strategist. You're the man who has accomplished the impossible against staggering odds. Some might say that about Hawkins. He never worked alone, Vela said. You worked against an entire world apparatus and defeated it. That took more than reckless courage. That took incredible feats of thought. A wild man charging an enemy displays raw courage. A thoughtful man knowing the odds and going ahead anyway displays superior courage that doesn't wilt at the first check. Benz grunted as he nodded. After a moment, he sat down again. If I could point out something else, Vela said. Benz examined her. Finally, he grinned, waving a hand for her to speak. The last phrase indicates that Hawkins doesn't realize who he's dealing with, she said. That's to our benefit. It means that when the time comes to take full control of humanity's destiny... That's a good point, Ben said. Hawkins has courage. I have courage plus intellect. In the end, brain defeats brawn. Exactly, Vela said. Ben's laughed ruefully. I overreacted, he told her. Vela did not reply. Ben's leaned back in his chair. He nodded once more. Finally, he put his hands on the edge of the desk and regarded Vela. The brute has a point, though, about the Solar League. They have miscalculated. I should have already seen that. You would have soon enough, Vela said. True, Ben said. That leaves us with an interesting dilemma. It's possible that, despite his over-reliance on reckless ventures, Hawkins has stumbled upon the correct strategy. This could be the moment to attack the battle station. And if this is an AI trap, Vela asked. Ben's bent his head in thought. Oh, he said shortly, the answer is simple. We'll come out of hyperspace in the Alamu Urt cloud. We'll have plenty of time to observe the star system as we accelerate inward. If it's a trap, we'll see that far ahead of time. We can retreat at that point. It was Vela's turn to ponder. There's a different problem with his plan, she said. Hawkins will have two cyber ships to our one. That will give him greater power at the place of decision. That means he'll likely have a greater say as to who gets whatever new cyber ships we capture at the battle station. That's assuming I'll agree to his assault. There's a third problem, Vela said. If you agree, he'll have a two-to-one advantage against us as we're far from home. What is to stop him from attempting to overpower the Gilgamesh and thereby ensuring his rule in the solar system? Do you think he's lying about the battle station in order to get us out there alone with his two ships? It's a possibility we should consider, Vela said. Hmm, Ben said. Perhaps we should thoroughly search our outer hull. If Hawkins' people found a robot stealth unit, it stands to reason the robots did the same to us. Since Hawkins' people broke the thing's programming, we can surely do the same. And if the robot unit possesses the same battle station information, Vela asked. Yes, Ben said. Two to one against us, far from the solar system. Hawkins could concoct whatever story he desired if his was the only ship to return home. Still, Vela said, we should remember that up until this point, Hawkins has seemed trustworthy. Yet what about after a successful fight against this battle station? asked Benz. What about after the AI pressure lessens against us, given our victory in the Alamu system? What do you think we should do? Ben stood, walked to the ready room window, and leaned against the wall, staring down at Mars. 
He stared for quite some time. Finally, a sly smile played across his lips. He straightened and turned to Vela. I have an idea, Ben said. It's a long shot, but it uses our one possible advantage, and it might give us an edge over the mercenary. 8. Vela watched as battle-suited space marines clanked across the hangar bay deck toward the shuttles headed for the red planet below. Frank, she said, this, she indicated the five armored shuttles, dropships in essence, as battle-suited space marines continued to clank into the holds. What's the matter? Benz asked, seemingly genuinely perplexed. Do you plan to storm the secret police headquarters? Vela asked. If I should, I will, Ben said, his features hardening. They were in a giant hangar bay aboard the Gilgamesh. Five dropships and a shuttle were almost ready for the journey to the Martian surface. Let's go, Ben said. Vela walked across the deck with him toward the waiting shuttle. Something wasn't right about all this, and she couldn't quite put a finger on it. Earlier in his ready room, after listening to Hawkins telling the Premier to man up, Ben had lost it. Vela had never seen anything like it before. Now this ham-fisted approach with five dropships. What could account for Benz's shift in behavior? As Benz climbed the steps into the shuttle, he chuckled as he rubbed his hands, almost in glee. Vela worked to keep her face neutral. Something was off with Benz, but what was it? I must think. Vela used the extra brain power bequeathed to her by Benz's fantastic machine. Nothing had been the same for her since she went under it. The things she could see and comprehend, it had opened up her world. It had also taken some of the shine off the universe. With greater wisdom, if that's what she had, came greater sorrow because she understood things more deeply. She hadn't figured out why that should be, but there it was just the same. Why would Benz? Vela turned to stare at Benz in shock. The Premier was sitting down in a shuttle passenger seat. He happened to look up at her. He noticed her shock. That hardened something in him as his eyes narrowed. What's wrong? he asked. Vela smiled, recovering fast. If she was right about this. Well, Benz asked. I completely forgot, Vela said breathlessly. I'm supposed to prepare a speech, the one you're giving tomorrow to the Grand Assembly. Do you remember? Of course I remember, he said in an irritated voice. I haven't done a thing on it, Vela said, which was a lie. She'd already written the speech. Forget about the speech, Ben said. I can't, Vela said. It's too important. I need to get started on it. If we're going with Hawkins... Who said we are? Ben snapped. I thought... Never mind, Ben said. I imagine we are, yes. The speech needs to be perfect. You can work on it when we return to the Gilgamesh. I should begin now, Vela said. Besides, you don't really need me for this. A quick snatch and... That isn't what's bothering you, Ben said as he examined her. Vela searched his eyes. She was going to have to play this closer to the vest, but she was going to have to be more honest, too. Ben's was too cunning to do it any other way. You're right, Vela admitted. The secret police, she shook her head. You of all people should realize how much secret police frighten me. Benz had gone into the secret police headquarters on Earth and rescued her from their tender tentacles. The things they would have done to her. Vela shuddered whenever she thought about it too much. I suppose I can understand, he conceded roughly. Yes, that makes more sense than this speech nonsense. You want to stay behind? Vela nodded. You'd better hurry off then, Ben said. We're leaving in another minute. Let me know as soon as you're successful, Vela said as she stood. I'll add that to the speech. Why wouldn't I be successful? Benz asked. Vela shook her head. You don't think I'm capable of this? He asked. Frank, no, he said, waving a hand and then rubbing the bridge of his nose. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. Now she really knew that something was wrong with him. Frank Benz never apologized about this sort of thing. She had to get to work right away. If she could figure out a countermeasure for what was bothering him, Vela reached down and touched a forearm. Good luck, darling. Benz grunted. Vela hurried off the shuttle. Once she was in the hangar bay, she began to sprint for a corridor flitter. She had to get to a laboratory as fast as she could. 
She thought she finally understood the reason for this difference in him. 9. Benz rubbed his forehead as the shuttle exited the hangar bay. What had really been wrong with Vela? She'd seemed fine one minute, and then suddenly she'd become worried. No, that wasn't exactly right. Benz massaged his forehead. His mind felt foggy, and he didn't know why. His thinking seemed slightly off. Certainly his emotions were getting the better of him lately. He still couldn't understand why he'd gotten so angry with Hawkins. That wasn't like him. Benz sighed, sat back, and then sat up, pulling out a hand monitor. He clicked it on so he could watch the convoy's progress. The red planet spread out below them, while the Gilgamesh was already behind them, higher in orbit. The convoy headed down toward a light reddish region. It was the customary color of Mars. The reddish color came from ferric oxide, rusted iron. The rust indicated minute particles of water mixed in the sandy soil. Benz noticed a large dust storm to the west of where they were heading. Some of the Martian dust storms could become global and dangerous. For his purposes, this one wasn't going to be a problem. He couldn't miss the huge canyon, Vallis Marineris. The chasm was an amazing 5,000 kilometers long, the length of the old United States. In some areas, the chasm was 500 kilometers wide. The convoy would go down into the canyon to the capital city of Athena on the bottom. More precisely, they were headed for the secret police headquarters in Athena Dome, for the Alamo. Once he got there, would Franco continue to insist on holding the alien? 150 armored space marines piled in Franco's outer offices might be a convincing argument. Benz grinned while thinking about it. At that point, Franco would be more concerned with keeping his life than holding onto the alien. Benz exhaled sharply as he continued to watch the hand monitor. He'd stayed aboard the Gilgamesh all this time because the cybership was the seat of his power. He was also safer while aboard. He certainly wasn't as safe in a shuttle. A single missile could take him out. But if a man never took any risks, Benz cocked his head. That seemed like an odd thought. He'd taken plenty of risks in his life. Why would he think a shuttle ride was dangerous? That didn't make sense. Benz chewed that over and finally shut off the hand monitor. He began to ready himself mentally for the coming confrontation with Franco. The shuttle and dropships came down from space, heading for the Vallis Marineris Canyon. The chief pilot supplied the correct codes to the planetary watch, and the vessels soon skimmed the Martian surface, went over the lip and down into the shadowy canyon. Soon, Athena Dome appeared. It was a vast structure near one cliff and housed over 15 million people. The shuttle and dropship slowed as they approached the giant dome. Missiles and laser batteries tracked them. That was common Martian practice. If the shuttle and dropship strayed too near a dome, missiles and heavy lasers would take them out in order to protect the dome's integrity. Terrorists had taken down Martian domes before. This was an old precaution against possibly hijacked vessels. Finally, the shuttle and dropships landed at a military airstrip many kilometers from Athena Dome. Benz transferred to a ground effects vehicle, as did his security detail and the 150 space marines. The convoy took off for the distant dome. They headed toward a military entrance, using a military route instead of the public tube system. Benz's convoy waited ten minutes at the gate due to clearance problems. Benz might have solved the problem by showing himself and demanding immediate entrance. That would give away his presence, however. Something he wanted hidden for just a little longer. Finally, the convoy entered the Great Dome. Athena was in shadow. It was most of the time. Great sun lamps shined down from the Grand Dome ceiling. The dome was a little past noontime. It appeared that most of the day workers had already returned to their offices from lunch. Athena had little car or flitter traffic, but thousands of bicyclists. The convoy headed for the large, square-shaped Alamo. Benz rode in the back of his larger-than-average GEV, secured in place in case they had to use violent maneuvers. His security chief looked up, touching the bud in his ear. He glanced at Benz. Trouble? asked Benz. There's a call from Rafael Franco, the security honcho said. 
Benz felt a slight queasiness in his gut. Did the secret police chief know he was in the city? The premier unbuckled, went to a desk, and flipped on a comm screen. This was a commander's GEV and thus outfitted with command and control tech. In a second, the screen showed the intense face of Rafael Franco. The man did not look down or aside this time, but directly at Benz. Premier, Franco said stiffly, you're in the city. Benz did not reply. You appear to be on a direct route to our security facilities. Are you going to pay us a visit, Excellency? Do you have anything to hide? Benz asked. On the contrary, I'm pleased you're coming. I have a... Franco rubbed his forehead. I have... He rubbed his forehead more and frowned, as if he wanted to say something but could not. I should be there shortly, Ben said. First, I want to stop off at the Grand Assembly. Oh, Franco said, we still have a few hours until you arrive at the Alamo. Ben smiled good-naturedly. He was lying. The convoy was headed directly for the Alamo. He didn't want to give Franco any extra notice if he could help it. At this point, though, Benz didn't want to lie more than necessary, either. Does, um, does this have anything to do with the alien? Franco asked. How is she faring? Benz countered. Franco shrugged, even as he massaged his forehead again. Benz was beginning to believe the gesture implied something. Franco's intense stare also meant something, but he wasn't sure what. The alien is weak, the secret police chief was saying. We might lose her before we can finish our interrogations. That would be unfortunate. Benz frowned. Why hadn't Franco said anything about this earlier? I'll want more details once I arrive. Yes, Excellency, the secret police chief said. I have to go, Ben said. It almost seemed as if Franco grinned ever so slightly. That must have been an illusion, though. What would the man have to grin about? The screen went blank. Ben sat at the console, thinking. Something was wrong, but he couldn't figure out what. Was the secret police chief about to outmaneuver him? For a wild moment, Benz almost ordered the convoy to turn around and head back to the dropships. The premier suddenly felt naked and exposed down here. I should have stayed on the Gilgamesh. Benz was on the verge of ordering a turnaround. When he rubbed his forehead, he was getting a headache. With a sigh, he moved back to his original seat. What could go wrong? He'd be in and out, with the alien in his custody. The snatch operation should work like clockwork. He had nothing to worry about. 10. It turned out that Benz had plenty to worry about. He had indeed made an error in judgment concerning the secret police chief. Twelve minutes and thirty-seven seconds after the screen went blank, the convoy ground to a halt before the Alamo. The building was larger than the secret police headquarters on Earth. It stood higher, although just as broad covering an entire city block. That was more impressive in Athena Dome on Mars, where city space was at a greater premium. A strange event occurred as each GEV passed tall pylons on the street leading to the Alamo. The engine in each vehicle stopped running as it passed the twin glowing pylons. What's more, the battery power also drained away, and thus no longer allowed the occupants to open the hatches. That shouldn't have been a problem for the space marines. They wore Martian battlesuits. Even though the Martian suits weren't as heavily armored as Neptunian battlesuits, each marine should have been able to easily hammer his way out of the GEV. Like the GEV engines, the battlesuits experienced an immediate power drain. That meant the marines were stuck in the battlesuits, as even the override commands no longer worked. The suits acted as individual prisons, nullifying Benz's supposedly surprise advantage. In moments, arbiters in black uniforms raced out of the Alamo. They hurried to the command vehicle. Other lesser individuals wheeled what looked like heavy cannons, aiming them at the command GEV. The arbiters drew handguns, aiming at the main hatch. The tallest of them nodded. Men switched on the cannon-looking devices. They whined eerily. One of them beamed power into the batteries. The others beamed sonic rays at the GEV. Seconds later, the main hatch opened. Men staggered out of the command vehicle. Each of them clapped his hands over his ears. Each of the individuals, including Premier Benz, were in considerable pain. 
The tallest arbiter chopped an arm. The techs at the sonic cannons switched them off. The Gilgamesh people gingerly took their hands away from their ears, and each collapsed onto pavement as arbiters shot them with quick-acting dart guns. The tallest arbiter led his companions to Premier Benz. The Premier looked up at them, slack-faced. The dart contained a stun drug, allowing the target to remain conscious. Bring him, the tallest arbiter said. The chief is waiting. Arbiters dragged Benz to his feet. As a group, they turned and headed for the dreaded Alamo, Benz's feet dragging across the pavement as they carried him. Benz's mind began to function again as the Arbiters moved down a long ramp leading into Martian bedrock. No doubt they were taking him to the interrogation chambers deep below the Alamo. Benz almost knew despair. He had badly miscalculated Franco. Coming down to Athena Dome had been a terrible mistake. He was glad Vela had felt something wrong. She was his whole card. She had power with the Gilgamesh. But she would have to act quickly. If the interrogators broke him and he began issuing the wrong kind of orders, Vela might not be able to maintain command of the cybership. Could the alien's capture be a giant fraud? Had Franco studied him from afar and realized that was the needed enticement to get the Premier down here? At this point, that seemed all too possible. Fear began to take over in earnest as the Arbiters passed through a hatch into a huge chamber. Something about the place reeked of pain and torture. Benz closed his eyes, although he refused to give up just yet. He had his wits. He... Benz frowned. Did he have his wits? His brain had been feeling foggy lately. What would account for that? Why would... The sound of boots striking marble ceased. Benz opened his eyes and raised his head. A company of black-clad arbiters stood before a great door. Release him, a man said in a commanding tone. Benz swayed as his captors let go of his arms. He glanced back and saw that it was the tallest arbiter who had given the command. Benz studied the closed faces around him. These were serious people used to wielding fear and power over others. They would not hesitate to do the chief of secret police's bidding. The last few weeks of Martian mass hysteria, hysteria I engineered for what I thought was my benefit. I wonder if Franco desires the premiership. I should have studied his dossier more carefully. Ben scowled. He should have seen this coming a kilometer away. What had happened to his vaunted brain power? The hatch opened soundlessly. A big bruiser of a man in a scarlet uniform stood there. The man did not look Martian at all. He was beefy and muscular, like a Jovian power lifter. The sight of such a man down here gave Benz even greater pause. Go, the tallest arbiter told Benz. The chief wants to talk to you alone. Before Benz could say a word, the arbiters whirled around and headed away, their combined shoes striking the marble. Soon it was just Benz and the red-clad guard. With a shrug, Benz headed toward the man. That would be better than the bruiser having to carry him. After Benz passed the large door, it closed behind him. The bruiser turned and headed down. Benz wondered why the man didn't say anything to him. He decided that it didn't matter as he hurried after the fast-striding bruiser. Soon the big man reached an elevator. He pressed a button and a door slid open. The bruiser went inside, turned around, and stared at Benz. The premier entered the elevator. The door closed and the car slid down at speed. Where are we going? Benz asked. The bruiser tilted his head to look down at him, but said nothing. Soon the elevator halted, the door opened, and the bruiser shoved Ben, so he stumbled out. The hall was narrow, almost suffocating. It was made entirely of stainless steel. Small hatches stood to either side. Benz must have been walking too slowly, as the bruiser shoved him again from behind. The walk intensified Benz's uneasiness. This was undoubtedly the dreaded lowest level of the Alamo. Here, the worst tortures and incarcerations took place. Is this where Franco was holding the alien? Will I end my day screaming in agony down here? A sheen of sweat glistened on Benz's forehead and cheeks, despite the coolness of the stainless steel hall. If that wasn't bad enough, Benz's tongue turned dry, and his courage began to wilt inside him. If Hawkins can brazen it out, so can I, Benz muttered to himself. 
Yet he wondered about that. Maybe the dome rat from New London was the tougher man between them. Benz inhaled deeply, trying to maintain his calm. The game wasn't over yet. He still had his wits. Maybe. Stop, the bruiser said in a harsh tone. Benz halted, glancing back at the killer. The man gave him an icy stare. Then he pointed. Benz looked. A hatch had silently slid up before him. It was dark in the chamber. Were they simply going to lock him away? Benz attempted to take another deep and hopefully calming breath. As he attempted that, the bruiser shoved him through the hatch and into darkness. 11. Benz stumbled through the darkness, struck an object with his lower shins, and fell headlong, barely catching himself in time. As his palms hit the floor, the darkness vanished. The premier lay on the floor, panting. He looked back and saw secret police chief Franco lying on the floor behind him. That's what, whom, he tripped over. That didn't make any kind of sense. The chief of secret police opened his eyes. He did not smile as if he'd played a practical joke. Instead, Franco looked at Ben's blank-eyed. The small secret police chief climbed to his feet, adjusted his gun belt, and nodded politely. Ben's checked. The secret policeman had a gun in the holster. The premier could see the black matted butt underneath the enclosed flap. Franco wore a black arbiter's uniform. He now stepped beside Ben's and bent down to give him a hand up. What's wrong with you? Ben's whispered. Why are you lying on your side in the dark? Franco shook his head. Ben scowled. Was he still drugged? He looked around. The room was empty. That didn't make sense. That... Ben's froze because a realization struck him. It came as a flash of intuition, and it was also the only thing that made sense given all the facts. The premier of the Mars Unity nodded even as he withdrew his arm from the secret policeman's grasp. He knew what was going on. Ben's grasped the smaller man, pulling him to his chest. At first, Franco did nothing. Then abruptly, the smaller, weaker man began to struggle. Ben's wrestled with him. The premier tore the holster flap open, grabbed the gun, and began to draw it from the holster. No, Franco croaked. Ben shoved the secret policeman as hard as he could. The smaller man stumbled away, tripped, and fell backward. Swiftly, Ben's clacked the automatic, putting a bullet into the firing chamber, flicked the safety, turned around, raised the gun, and fired two booming shots. Each time he fired, he moved the gun into a different arc. At that moment, the blackness returned. Benz laughed wildly. That wasn't going to stop him now. In fact, it made no difference. He moved the gun another fraction of an arc and got off another booming shot. He did not see any flame shoot out of the barrel of the gun as he fired. That told Benz that this darkness was an illusion in his mind. That's good, my dear Premier. That's fast thinking, too. But I grow weary of this firing. It hurts my ears. Agonizing pain blossomed in Benz's mind. The premier shook his head. He refused to let the pain hinder him. As the pain throbbed, as the darkness robbed him of the ability to see, Benz decided to trust his senses. He stared into the darkness. Where should I shoot, he asked under his breath. Even as the pain made him cry out, Benz slowly swiveled around until he felt certain that this was the right direction. Amidst the pain, he raised the gun once again. No, stop. Benz did not stop. He fired the automatic. He fired again as the gun bucked in his hand, and he had a terrible sense of danger. He started moving. Something hard struck him in the gut. He doubled over, expelled air. Something struck him hard on the back of the head. Benz dropped to the floor as the gun skittered away from him. Benz tried to crawl after the gun in the darkness. The pain in his mind made him cry out in despair. He'd had his chance. Abruptly, the pain in his mind stopped. The darkness turned into light again, and the room had drastically altered. Franco was still here, lying on a carpet. Another person leaned against the front of a desk. It was a woman. She was short, dark-haired, with gray eyes, and wore a black arbiter's uniform. She was ugly, although not hideous. She had a metal bar in one small hand, and the secret police chief's pistol in the other. That pistol was aimed at Benz's midsection. 
You're the alien, Ben said. Sit in the chair over there, she said. Ben's listened carefully. The voice seemed wrong. Had the other aliens up in the Gilgamesh had strange voices as well, and he simply hadn't been able to tell at the time? Will I have to kill you? the woman asked. Ben's noticed that Franco had begun to snore softly. Had the alien done that with her mind power? He suspected so. The premier went to the assigned chair and sat down. The woman with the gun went to the chair behind the large desk. She sat down, although she kept the weapon aimed at him. Ben's noticed the room, finally. It had black walls with slogans painted here and there and odd photos of various arbiters. Is this his office? Ben's asked, indicating Franco. The woman watched him as if he was a wasp about to fly too near her. She rested her gun hand on the desk, hunching forward because she was so small. Ben's wondered if her feet dangled from the chair like a child's might. Are you the alien? he asked. She did not answer. Instead, she raised the gun and fired several shots. The bullet struck Franco each time, making him wake up, cry out, and then crumple on the carpet, twisted and dead. Benz rose to his feet in alarm. She moved the automatic, aiming at him again. Benz tensed, waiting for the bullets to hit, wondering how much they were going to hurt. Twelve. After a time, Ben slumped into his chair. He felt exhausted. The woman clicked a tiny button on the automatic, letting the magazine thump onto the desk. From an open drawer, she grabbed an extra magazine and shoved it into the chamber. Ben's realized she must have been out of bullets. He should have charged her then. He might have won. The tiny woman continued to aim at him. She hadn't shown any emotion at any time. I'm the alien, she said suddenly, although she spoke in the same monotone as earlier. Benz nodded. He'd already figured that out. Some minds are easier to control than others, she said. Yours is more tiring to fool, as you have a superior intellect. Benz would have liked to believe that, but how did he know if she was telling the truth or not? So the room was never dark, Ben said. It was just dark in my mind. That is correct. You hid the things in the room from my eyesight, he said. I did. Why bother, he asked. Her eyes seemed to harden as her manner became more intense. I suppose you'll learn eventually, she said in her monotone. I hate you. I hate what you've done. Do you know how long we had to work to engineer our way into a position of high authority on this planet? Are you the last of your kind? asked Benz. Should by some inconceivable freak occurrence I die down here, there are others ready to avenge me, she said. I'm not referring to those of you on Mars, Ben said, but to your species. Did the group arriving in the solar system represent the last gasp of a dying race? Do you want me to kill you? she asked. Why did you kill Franco? The intensity of her features increased. His creatures, she seemed incapable of speech for a time. Benz was sure her finger tightened on the trigger due to her high emotion. That passed as she set the gun on the desk. She kept her hands near the weapon, though. The hand that held the gun flexed as she stretched the fingers. Maybe the gun was too heavy for her to hold for long. How strong were these fish-scale aliens? Your colony was hidden at the Ares Corporation, Benz asked. His men slaughtered over fifty of us before one of his butchers discovered our true identity. Can you conceive of the monstrosity of the deed? My people were slaughtered like cattle. Why didn't any of your people use their psionic abilities to save themselves? Benz asked. You think you know things, but you do not. Not all of you have the power, Benz guessed. Two of us could use our power on your dull mammal minds, only two of the royal line had survived the A.I.s. Can you conceive of the degradation I take upon myself by mingling with your filthy cesspool thoughts? I despise what you creatures represent. Yet, I have shamed myself by using the power in order to attempt to further our existence. Why hide like you do? 
She stared at him as if he were a fool. Why not make common cause with us against the machines? Benz asked. You are animals, she said. We are the high folk, the collective souls of Dame Rama. The machines destroyed all that. Yes, we of the royal line fled our dying star system. One group fled to this dismal solar system. I have no idea if others of my kind survived. I could well be the last of the most glorious race in the universe. You think pretty highly of yourselves, Ben said. We have a right to think that way. I suppose you might feel similarly if you found a colony of lobsters begging that you spare them the indignity of your meal at supper time by letting them leave the cooking pot. I doubt it. If we had common enemies, we'd try to make common cause with lobsters. You are vermin. You have dull minds. You have no understanding of the beauty of the collective. Imagine if dirt could form bodies and dirty every place they walked. That is how it feels ghosting among humans. I get it. To you, we stink. We stink uh, telepathically, or however you'd say it. But the AIs have destroyed your star system. They're about to destroy ours. No great loss there, she said. Why not join us so we can help you find the rest of your kind? Join you, she said. I would no more join you than you'd join chickens headed for the slaughterhouse. I will command you, however. I will use you like a tool. He, she indicated the dead secret police chief, hated me too much for me to control him for long. I have been forming a strategy, hoping to turn this witch hunt into a killing frenzy among you lower order beasts. Now you will take me to the Gilgamesh. And, Benz asked, if you prove docile enough, I will use you as a figurehead. I will have to install control units in your brain, of course, but that is a painless operation, so you do not need to panic. You think that kind of assurance is going to convince me to be your slave? The alien studied him. She picked up the gun, possibly seeing something in him she didn't like. Do you prefer to die? she asked. Ben's thought about that. He glanced at the dead Franco and realized that could just as easily be him. If he said he preferred death over dishonor, over mental enslavement to the murderous alien. Benz launched himself out of the chair. He headed left, dodged right, then put his head down and charged the alien with everything in him, pumping hatred. He did not feel he had to answer such an unfair question. He would choose his own way, glorious death before the dishonor of ignoble slavery. The gun boomed. Benz felt searing pain as a bullet slammed into his torso. It hurt worse than a son of a bitch. The gun fired a second time, and another bullet struck him. This one must have hit his ribs. He almost tripped and went down. His feet tangled together. Benz looked up and roared with rage. The alien sought to use him, control him. He wondered in that intense moment if the first alien, the black-clad empath, had done something to his mind before dying. It seemed possible. That's where the strange sense of something being wrong with him must have originated. The alien shouted as she gripped the gun with both hands. Benz leaped as the gun boomed, sliding across the large desk. Her first two shots must have raised the barrel of the gun. The alien had not compensated enough. As Benz slid across the desk, the bullet hissed above him in passage. The alien tried to back away, but crashed into the chair instead. She fired another shot that missed. Benz's hands gripped her throat. His knees pushed against the back edge of the desk as he shoved himself at her, toppling them both onto the floor. No, she said in his mind. I can help you against Hawkins. I can tell you what he's thinking. Benz realized as his fingers closed on the throat, the flesh seemed softer than human flesh, that Vela must have suspected the alien's mental control. Had Vela stayed behind on the Gilgamesh, knowing he'd need her up there? As the agony of the bullets lodged in him almost caused him to fall unconscious, the alien struck at him mentally again. Darkness swept over Benz's vision. He couldn't see a thing, could not feel anything. Choking, he shouted. I'm choking you. Did that make his fingers tighten? He didn't know. But he thought, choke her with all his stubbornness and intellect. 
He might not feel the grinding of bones under his fingers. Abruptly, he did feel flesh and bones grinding under his merciless fingers. The darkness swept away as he saw the gasping alien flail at his hands, trying to tear them loose from her throat. No, Ben said. The premier was on his knees as she lay on the floor. He began banging her head against the floor. He did it over and over. He squeezed harder. The alien's hands dropped away from his fingers. She went limp as the life seemed to drain out of her small body. It didn't matter. Ben's continued to choke, continued to slam the back of her head against the floor. He couldn't be certain her death was only an illusion. He would not quit choking her until he slumped unconscious. That was the only way to be certain. The hatch opened then. Arbiters cried out in rage. Some ran to the dead secret police chief. The others surrounded Ben's. Look, Ben said hoarsely. He wrenched his stiff fingers from the alien's throat. Picking up a shattered pottery piece from the desk, he scratched at an arm. There were garbled voices around him. Maybe that was the arbiters asking questions. Ben's no longer knew. Everything seemed to swirl around him. He peeled away some of the pseudo-skin from her right arm. It revealed the strangely moist blue fish scales underneath. At that point, Ben's toppled sideways, fading into unconsciousness with his jacket and pants soaked with his own blood. Thirteen. Ben's dreamed strangely, in odd fits and starts. First, he dreamed that arbiters argued over him while doctors pleaded for peace and quiet so they could save his life. Later, Ben's dreamed that he rode a shuttle back up to the Gilgamesh. Some of his former space marines were with him. A major attempted to talk to him, but Ben's dreamt that he fell asleep while the man spoke. For a time, he did not dream, although he had hazy ideas. They were quite unformed and indistinct. At last, he dreamed that Vela hovered over him. She seemed worried. He wanted to weep with her and tell her not to worry. He wanted to let her know that he missed her. Even in his dream, he was exhausted. Later, the dreams changed. He wasn't so exhausted now, and tears no longer dripped from Vela's eyes. She seemed relaxed, as if she waited for something to happen. By this point, Benz had become thoroughly sick of dreaming. He wanted to wake up and find out what was happening in the real world. Then, without any preamble or fanfare, Benz opened his eyes. He was in a hospital room. It appeared that he was the only patient. Several medical machines were hooked up to him, including some that pumped a sludgy solution through tubes attached to his left arm. That reminded Benz of the first alien imposter. She'd had tubes from her chrome-colored chair. Chair, he whispered. The whisper brought people flooding into the room. They appeared to be medical personnel. He wasn't sure how long that lasted as he closed his eyes again. Later, he opened them again. Vela, he said in a hoarse voice. She sat in a chair, reading a tablet. She lowered it, putting the tablet on a chair and rising. She put her warm hands on his left arm. Her touch felt wonderful. He tried to sit up, but a wave of weakness washed over him. That threatened to hurl him back into unconsciousness. Where am I? He asked in a hoarse whisper. Rest, darling, Vela said. You need to rest. I'm aboard the Gilgamesh. That's right, she said as she brushed his hair. You're going to be fine. The doctors were worried a few days ago as you were close to death. But you pulled through. Alien shot me, he whispered. Shh, Vela said, putting a finger on his lips. Rest first. We can talk all about it later. He tried to nod. Instead, he closed his eyes and went back to sleep. Eight days after the Dame Rama alien shot him, Frank Benz woke up. He was groggy, but managed to press a button until a nurse showed up. The nurse helped prop him up so he lay against a pillow. He was incredibly weak. He could hardly raise his arms. There were tubes in him. He did not like that, as it made him feel even weaker. Shortly, Vela hurried into the room. Frank, she said. She rushed to him, gripped his face, and kissed him on the lips. She tasted wonderful. Benz laughed weakly. He was glad to be alive. He was glad to see his woman. He was glad the alien hadn't put controls into his mind. Vela, he said. What's wrong, my darling? I... I killed the alien, didn't I? Oh, Frank, she said. 
Vela leaned her body against him. It felt good, even though that made it harder to breathe. He wheezed hoarsely. Frank, she said, mortified, you have to say something if I'm crushing you. You have great tits, he said. I like them pressed against me. She smiled as tears welled in her eyes. Oh, Frank, she said, as she ran her fingers through his hair. He closed his eyes and luxuriated in the touch. Go back to sleep, she said shortly. He opened his eyes. He felt so weak, but he didn't feel like sleeping, not by a long shot. Vela, did I kill the alien? Yes. How do I know that's true? He asked. Vela gave him a funny look. Then understanding grew in her eyes and in her bearing. Yes, the alien controlled your mind for a time, didn't she? She did, Ben said. He began to tell Vela in a halting manner what had transpired in the underground chamber of the Alamo. Vela, he said once he'd finished. How did I get back up here? The new chief of secret police was forced to let you go, Vela said. Oh, she tried to detain you, but I'd already gotten a video of you banging the head of the alien out into the public. The room had an automatic recorder. Wait, Ben said while frowning. How did you get hold of the video? One of the arbiters must have sent it. Vela said. We had a secret ally, although I never found out the person's identity. The truth is, we got lucky. In any case, the video included the dead Franco. I began playing that all over Mars, turning you into an even greater hero than before. In this instance, I told people the truth. What truth? How you went down to Mars, to Athena Dome, to try to save your chief of secret police. The alien caused your space marines. Well, I think you know how I explained it. Ben smiled. He could guess, all right. By that time, all of Mars was cheering for you, Vela said. To the people, any alien represents the AIs. By choking the small alien, you were choking the AIs to the people. The Great Assembly passed the laws you desired. If the new secret police chief wanted to die hideously, she could keep hold of you. The city would have stormed the Alamo, though. Benz would have nodded, but all this talking and ingesting of data had exhausted him. He rested his head against the pillow. He fell asleep again before he knew it. Fourteen. Benz felt better after a solid ten-hour sleep. His mind didn't feel so fuzzy anymore. It also felt as if he could stand if he gave it a go. A nurse entered with a tray of food. It might have tasted bland to Benz at one time. Today, the mush and protein drink might have been the most glorious foods he'd ever ingested. He smacked his lips afterward, asking for more. A doctor entered, tisking as he overheard that. Not just yet, Premier, the doctor said. You've been through the grinder. I've put you on regenerative therapy. Let's stick to the routine for a few days. Maybe after that. Benz was happy to be eating food, happy to be alive and overjoyed that the bullets hadn't destroyed him. He was also ecstatic the alien hadn't put any control units in his brain. I need to get up, Benz told the doctor. Good, you should move, if just a little. I'll summon an aide. By myself, doctor. I don't advise that just yet. Nevertheless, that's how we'll proceed. The doctor looked as if he might become mulish. Vela entered. She might have overheard the arguing. I'll be with him, she told the doctor. This is against my wishes, the doctor said. Yes, yes, Ben said. Let's not turn this into an issue. The doctor inspected Ben's and nodded curtly, exiting the chamber. Do you have to throw your rank around like that? Vela asked. What good is rank if you don't throw it around? Ben's countered. Maybe your continued good health, she said. Forget about that. I want to know what's happening. I want to know that's why I'm here, Vela said. Let's walk. I doubt you want to talk in here. Good idea. As he was free of tubes, Benz rose and changed into regular clothes. The small amount of movement left him breathless. He tried not to show it, but... You're pale and shaking, Vela said. It's nothing. Frank, you ought to know that you almost died. The alien... Benz didn't hear the rest. He felt lightheaded, faint, and barely managed to plop into a wheelchair. He sat there panting. Maybe Vela was right. Maybe he should listen to the doctor. Just how close had he come to dying? He didn't like thinking about it. Do you want to lie down? Vela asked. No. The way you say that means you do, but you don't want to show weakness. 
Are we going to go over the same routine you exhibited after Hawkins called Vela, he said, maybe sharper than he'd intended. She raised her eyebrows. I know, he said. I freaked out that day. She gave him a look. I'm not freaking out now, he said. She bent a little, nodding, agreeing with him. I think I know what happened, Ben said. Or did I already tell you about that? You said something about the first alien having contaminated your mind. Did I go into detail? Not much, Vela said. Ben had stopped shaking, and his stomach no longer felt quite so queasy. Can you wheel me out of here? he asked. Of course, darling, Vela said, moving behind the wheelchair. She began to push. The doctor noticed in the other room. He didn't say anything, although he looked like he wanted to. Soon, Vela wheeled Benz through an empty corridor. I figured you don't want too many people to see you like this, she said. Benz was feeling queasy again because of the motion. He closed his eyes, but that only made the feeling worse. He opened them again. Can you stop a moment, he asked. Vela parked in the corridor as she stood behind him. I hate being so weak. Darling, she said, you let the alien use your body for target practice. I imagine you charged her, is that true? Yes, you charged an alien with a gun. She was frail, Ben said. She set the gun down for a while because it was too heavy for her. After that, I figured she lacked the strength to use the gun skillfully. I clearly miscalculated, but not utterly so, as I am still alive. I wonder how old she was. What makes you think she was old? Anna Dominguez, the party secretary chairwoman. I suspect the one I faced under the Alamo was the oldest of all. Why did she summon you to the Alamo's basement then and face you alone? What else could she do? Benz asked. She had one real trick. She could take over one or maybe a few more people at a time. I wonder if she needed proximity in order to do that. She was all alone, Vela. She couldn't trust anyone else. She was in my mind, but I also saw a bit into her mind. She thought of herself as a signer. That's what they call themselves. She thought we were dirty animals. She thought it soiled her being in my mind. The AIs are arrogant, but so was she. Ben shook his head ruefully. I doubt we could have ever worked together, he said. Isn't that crazy? Maybe there are resisting aliens out there. That doesn't mean any of them are going to want to work with us. They are aliens. What do you mean by that? Vela asked. Different, not like us. Vela thought about that. I see what you mean, she said. We think they should be practical. But what's practical to an alien might be completely different to a human. Exactly, Ben said. So where does that leave us? First, Ben said, I believe I overacted the other day after Hawkins' message, because the empath had done something to my mind when he attacked. The empath wasn't able to stop me. I could overpower his mental attack. But I suspect he seeded my mind for the last signer. Ben's twisted around as he tried to crane back to look at Vela. Why did you leave the shuttle that day while we were still in the hangar bay? Ben's asked. Did you suspect the alien down there might have psionic powers? Vela nodded. Were you staying upstairs in order to keep control of the Gilgamesh? Benz asked. That was part of it. It wouldn't have worked for long, Ben said. The alien would have made me order you down to Mars. If you wouldn't have listened, the crew up here would have made you listen. Surely you must have realized that. Frank, I stayed behind in order to fashion a mind shield. What? Benz asked, straining to look back at her. Vela patted him on the shoulder as she moved in front of him. I suspected psionic powers, Vela said, so I went to a laboratory and fashioned a helmet. I used lead and created circuitry to block various electrical impulses. Do you think that would have worked against the signers? Benz asked. I have no idea. I hoped so. What else could I do? Benz thought about that, finally smiling. Vela wasn't smiling, though. She had a serious, worried expression. Okay, Ben said, noticing. What is it now? What did you do? Vela squatted on her heels, putting her hands on his knees. She looked up at him, but seemed reluctant to speak. Tell me, he said. We're headed for Make Make, she said. Ben stared at her, realizing that Vela had made a huge decision while he'd been under. Finally, he exhaled as he looked away. Are you angry with me? she asked. No, he said, 
but he wouldn't look at her. I had to make a decision, Vela said. I believed I knew what you were hoping to achieve by going to the Alamo. I believe you understood the alien had psionic powers. I think you wanted to grab that alien and take her along, as you wanted to use her against Hawkins, to give you an edge at least to know what he was thinking or maybe feeling as he spoke to you. Surprised by the accuracy of the revelation, Benz glanced at Vela. You know me better than I realized, he said. That's exactly what I was hoping for. The signer even offered me that. She must have read the desire in my mind. By that point, though, I no longer trusted her. All I wanted was to kill her so her kind couldn't use us, or me, again. I saw the video of you banging her head, Vela said. It was brutal, but that was just the thing that made most of Mars love their leader. They could relate, as everyone wants to grab an AI by the proverbial throat and do what you did. Good PR, he said moodily. Vela stood and began to pace. Finally, she whirled around and made wild gestures as she spoke. The problem with the aliens, the signers, made me realize how little time humanity must have left. We have a window of opportunity. Hawkins is right. We have the AI virus. How long will that work against them? A year? Two years? The longer we wait to make a telling blow against the AIs, the less chance we're going to have of finding such an opportunity. That's pure guesswork, Ben said. No, it's not. It's logical. It's rational. Soon the AIs are going to strike at us again. We have a target with this battle station. We have a secret weapon. Now we have to maximize our military power. One of the most fundamental rules of war is to concentrate your strength against the enemy. I don't think humanity can afford to have us hang back at a time like this. Ben's thought about that, said so straightforwardly, so starkly. He looked up. Vela searched his face. He kept looking at her. Three cyber ships striking an immense AI battle station. Did they even have a ghost of a chance? What about Mars? Benz asked. You heard Hawkins. He's willing to reinforce the Mars fleet. I think we should take him up on the offer. A fifty percent or one hundred percent increase? asked Benz. Fifty sounds wiser, Vela said. Benz looked to the side. He felt so worn down. He felt weak. He charged a gun. He charged a signer telepath. He'd killed her. He'd killed the other signers as well. The signers had infiltrated Martian society and almost made it to the top position. How many other aliens were out there? How many other aliens would hate humans or think of them as animals? Could they find any alien allies? Ben's considered Bast Bambek. Yes, there were good aliens out there. To now head off into the unknown, having one ship to Hawkins, too. I'm not sure the Gilgamesh should dock at Make Make, Ben said. What then? Vela asked. We should head for a point between the scattered disc region and the Oort Cloud. I don't want to tempt Hawkins more than he can handle. If we go to Make Make, he'll have more than just two cyber ships to our one. He'll have home field advantage. I see what you mean, Vela said. Maybe that's why you're the premier and not me. A tired grin spread across his face. He'd fought so hard and traveled so far, and now he was about to fight harder and go farther. Where was this going to end? You made the right decision, Vela. You're right. This is our opportunity. It's time to take it and see if we can grab more than a few extra years from the AIs. It's time to see if we can begin to turn the tide of the war and play the game like big boys. Vela's shoulders slumped. What's wrong now? Benz asked. Nothing. It's just... I wonder if we're ever going to see the solar system again. I wonder if I'll ever get to walk on Mars again. Do you miss Mars? Desperately, Vela said. I miss Earth just as much, he said. But maybe that's for the best. That way we'll fight like demons so we can go home again. We have to win, Vela, or it's lights out for the human race. Fifteen. The Gilgamesh began its long acceleration for the area of space between the scattered disk region and the Oort cloud. That was a long way from Mars. As the pirated cybership gained velocity, Martian marines went outside and scoured every inch of the hull. They didn't find any AI stealth units attached. Benz ordered the marines to try a second time. 
Still, they found nothing. At the same time, a convoy of Saturn system haulers accelerated for Make Make. The haulers carried marines and technical personnel for Hawkins' second cybership. The giant vessel was still inside Make Make's hollowed-out moon factory. The robo-builders did what they always did, working around the clock as they fashioned the monstrous cybership. Soon, Hawkins and Benz exchanged messages. Bit by bit, they worked out an agreement and an exit strategy. Time crawled as humanity prepared for its first interstellar military mission. Both men attempted to contact the Solar League. The League ignored every attempt. Caracalla complained about Hawkins' order to send Saturn fleet units to Mars. What if the Earth fleet bypasses Mars and heads to Saturn? Caracalla asked Hawkins via a long-distance comm. Saturn has less military strength than Mars does. It's also a lot farther to travel from Earth to Saturn, Hawkins said. Mars fleet could reinforce Saturn at that point. The question brought a host of possibilities to the forefront. Once again, through long-distance messaging, Hawkins and Benz attempted to work out a solution. In the end, they decided Caracalla would head the Outer Planet Strategic Council. He would determine what fleet units went where if the Solar League ever made overt moves once the cyberships departed the solar system. There's so little chance of that happening, though, Hawkins told Caracalla, that you don't need to worry about it. The Solar League made a strategic error by concentrating on building defensive satellites. That's the greatest safeguard we have. That's why we can afford to strike with all our cyberships. It made sense. Caracalla agreed. The Union people of Uranus also agreed, as did the remnants of the Jupiter system people. Everything worked smoothly for several months. The newest cybership left the Make Make factory. It lacked hull plating in regions. It did not have as many gravitational cannons as the other two cyberships, but it did have mass, and it had full propulsion and hyperspace capabilities. In time, Hawkins' two cyberships headed away from Make Make. The Saturn ships changed their heading. The haulers would meet them once all of them were outside the scattered disk region. Hawkins and Benz had agreed on an operational strategy. They would have greater velocity when entering hyperspace, so they would enter the Alamu system at greater velocity. Benz had argued against the idea of wasting time and trying to come into the Alamu system from a different direction. If they lost the battle, it wasn't going to matter anyway. If this was an AI ambush, then the AIs would already know about them and the solar system. We must strike as hard and as fast as we can, Ben said. That's my recommendation. Such thinking sat well with Hawkins. Hawkins named the newest cybership the Sergeant Stark. I suspect it's going to be a bastard of a warship, so let's give it a glorious bastard's name, Hawkins told his people. No one disagreed. Time passed. Finally, three great cyberships neared one another as each left the scattered disk region. At this point, the haulers from Saturn system reached the Sergeant Stark. The haulers disgorged their cargoes. Once completed, the skeleton crews remaining on the haulers began breaking. The haulers would head back to the Saturn system, returning the vessels to the various corporations that had lent them to the government. Hawkins now had further meetings with Premier Benz, together with their strategic and tactical staffs. They worked out possibilities, probabilities, and emergency procedures. Finally, they reached hyperspace launch territory. The ship teams individually plotted a course for the Alamu system. Afterward, the teams compared results. Each of them had come up with the same course. At that point, the three solar system cyberships turned on their powerful hyperspace engines. One by one, the great behemoths, the hopes of humanity, disappeared from normal space as they entered hyperspace. The great gamble, the throw of the dice of fate, and the hidden ploy of Cog Primus moved one step closer to completion. 16. Far from hyperspace launch territory, between the scattered disk region and the Oort cloud, powerful inner planet's telescopes watched each cybership enter the strange, faster-than-light realm. Once the three behemoths vanished, special couriers hurried to launch tubes. Five shuttles roared out of the orbital telescope satellites. Each of them entered Earth's atmosphere, racing to Rio to bring the news to the hidden premier of Earth and the Solar League. The premier of the Solar League sat in her underground office. She was a plain woman, lacking hair of any sort. 
This was caused by a specific disease, one that she forbade anyone to mention in her presence. Once, she had worked for J.P. Justinian when he had been the chief arbiter from Venus. Then, people had known her by the nickname he'd bequeathed her, the Egghead. Justinian had disliked her smooth skull, even as he'd used her intelligence. Like Premier Benz of Mars, the Egghead had used a mind-heightening machine. It had caused her to lose all her hair, but it had given her power. Her real name was Alice Würzburg. She now read the various reports highlighting the disappearance of the three cyberships. Würzburg set down the reports, one by one. She did not smile. She did not gloat. She thought carefully. Soon, she opened a notepad and began to jot down notes. The squiggly symbols wouldn't have made sense to anyone else, but they made sense to her. Finally, she whispered, it is time. Würzburg had planned for this eventually. Now she had to convince her timid admiralty. Most of them were blowhards, tough talkers, but frightened doers. Still, she had to make the move. Würzburg sighed. She disliked staff meetings. She disliked convincing people of anything. She preferred to think alone or give orders. This, she pressed a button. A woman appeared. Würzburg gave the order to summon the admiralty. Then she sat back, wondering if she would have to kill them in order to make room for more aggressive people. Würzburg sat in an auditorium on a lit stage. The chief officers of the admiralty sat with her at an immense table. Their operational staffs watched from the darkness as if observing a play. They were the aides who would have to implement the majority of the orders. They were the hands and feet. Those at the table were the so-called brain trust. Würzburg wanted the aides to listen to the briefing so they would understand why they needed to perform their duties with utmost diligence. Würzburg could order arbiters to murder people in order to light a fire under others. She did not like to do that, though. She wanted people to work hard because they believed in a cause. Thus, she used assassination and torture on a limited basis only. If people took that as a sign of weakness, she would move more vigorously. First, she wanted to try this her way. Both Justinian and Benz had used the whip too liberally. People who believed in a cause worked harder and better than those driven to a task did. One thing Würzburg wanted above all else was to win, to beat the pretenders who had crippled the Solar League and thus threatened the greatest political system ever devised by humanity. The projection, please, she said, using a microphone so everyone could hear her. A holographic image of the solar system appeared in the auditorium. Three big red triangles glowed like neon signs at the outer edge. Abruptly, the triangles disappeared. Those three cyber ships represent 83% of the fleet strength of the Mars Unity and the so-called Solar Freedom Force, Würzburg said. That leaves 17% at home. 10% of that belongs to the Mars Unity. The other 7% is divided between the Jupiter, Uranus, and Saturn systems of the SFF. In other words, boys and girls, Würzburg said, the Solar League now possesses the greatest concentration of capital ships in the solar system. Admiral Boris of Russia Sector stirred uneasily. He was a huge man with bristly hair. In Würzburg view, he was a timid boaster a man with a loud voice always shouting to do nothing. In that way, he protected his sinecure as chief of staff. Do you have something to say, Admiral? Würzburg asked. I do, Boris said in his blustery manner. This is a trick, Excellency. Hawkins and Ben seek to draw out our battle fleet and annihilate it. A trick? How? she asked. They can count our capital ships as easily as any other. You're wrong, Würzburg said. That's exactly what they haven't done. Admiral Boris scowled at her. He did it well, too. Würzburg examined those around the table. Could they all be this dense? It was difficult to believe. Still, she was used to working with buffoons. Most people, even well-trained people, were still donkeys underneath. Do none of you understand? she asked. Würzburg disliked playing this part. She would rather let them keep their self-respect. Yet she had learned that intimidating them through her superior intellect usually made her tasks easier to achieve. We put up defense satellites, Würzburg said. Decoys, Boris said, as if that was the end of the matter. Yes, decoys, Würzburg said, as she stared at the big man. 
we put up defensive satellite decoys while hiding our newly built capital ships. We have more than doubled the size of our former fleet. Boris met her gaze for a time. Then the admiral glanced around the table, possibly to ensure himself that the others still agreed with him. Decoys, Premier, Boris said. Surely they fooled no one. Why is that? Wurzberg asked. Boris sputtered before answering. It was too obvious. Surely our enemies could see it would limit us to a purely defensive strategy. Yes, she said. Premier, Boris said, leaning toward her as if imparting wisdom. The Solar League seeks unity and justice. We are like policemen, protecting those too weak to protect themselves from capitalist exploiters. How could we do that if we only built defensive satellites? You do recall the Battle of Mars, she asked. Boris nodded uneasily. Even doubled as it is, Wurzberg said, could our fleet protect us from three cyber ships? Premier, Earth fleet is the key to social dynamism. We would have fought like lions, Admiral, Wurzberg said softly, interrupting his bluster. Admiral Boris fell silent as he licked his lips, the first sign of real nervousness. In light of three attacking cyber ships, Wurzberg said, numberless defensive satellites made perfect sense. We made a fortress of Earth, given that the decoys were real. I do not understand, Boris said. The others, Hawkins and Benz in particular, took the decoys at face value, Wurzberg said. The decoys were anything but a waste of time. It ensured that Hawkins and Benz would believe that Earth fleet could not act aggressively in their absence. In their view, we had put too many resources into defense. That is why the three cyber ships left the solar system. Premier, Boris said, we have already detected fleet movements from Uranus, Saturn, and Jupiter systems. Those warships appear to be headed for Mars. They are reinforcing the traitors. Let us consider the numbers and tonnage, Wurzberg said into her microphone. Holographic fleet graphs soon appeared in the air. As you can see, Wurzberg said, Earth fleet has slightly more than double their combined mobile units. The graph does not take into account Martian defensive satellites and planetary missile silos, Boris said. More than double the enemy's fleet strength at the point of decision, Wurzberg said, ignoring the admiral's worry. It is time to attack. It is time to make use of their misjudgment. If we are lucky, after destroying the reinforced Mars fleet, the SL Armada can strike for Jupiter before the cyber ships return. Silence filled the auditorium. Into the hush, Boris cleared his throat. Premier, isn't that the point, though? When the cyber ships return, they will rout our armada. Wurzberg shook her head. We have taken the measure of Benz and Hawkins, she said. Social dynamic theory is clear. They are adventurers, opportunists. They seek glory and little else. They do not understand social justice as we do. Once we destroy the enemy's mobile fleets, we can begin to send the transports. Premier, asked Boris. We will send hundreds of thousands of enforcers to Mars. If we capture the moons of Jupiter, we will do likewise there. We will also rig the Red Planet with huge emergency fail-safes. I am unfamiliar with the last term, Boris said. We will rig Mars with underground bombs, Admiral. Those nuclear devices will go under every city dome. If the cyber ships return, if the adventurers attack our planetary positions, we will annihilate the traitors. Mass murder of the entire Martian population, Boris whispered. Wurzberg stared at the pale Russian. Perhaps for the record, you would like to rephrase your final statement, the Premier said in a silky voice. Boris nodded eagerly. Yes, Premier, Boris said. The emergency fail-safes will stiffen Martian morale. At that point, the Martians will obviously understand the futility of siding with the enemies of social justice. Well said, Wurzberg told him. We will also acquire these fabled robo-builders. Imagine what our Earth industries could do if we had the AI technology. Ah, Boris said. I begin to perceive the brunt of your strategy. Good, Wurzberg said. We must ready the Solar League Armada and begin acceleration to Mars as soon as possible. We will strike before all the SFF reinforcements reach the Red Planet. One of the other admirals cleared her throat, staring hard at Admiral Boris. Boris nodded at the woman. 
she slid a paper to him. Boris picked it up, scanning the contents. Premier, Boris said. What is it now? Wurzberg asked. Ah, uh, there might be a few unavoidable problems, Boris said. We did not anticipate such an order. Not all our capital ships are ready for immediate acceleration. Wurzberg wasn't surprised, but the knowledge made her tired. It was one of those things she'd forgotten to check. She studied each admiral and rear admiral sitting at the table. Finally, she fixed her stare on Admiral Boris. Tell me, she said, who is responsible for this sad state of affairs? It doesn't rest on any one individual, Boris said. Ah, Wurzberg said. So you take group responsibility for this disaster. Something about the way the Premier asked that clearly warned Admiral Boris. I would not say that, Premier, the Russian Admiral said. You'd better say something useful fast, Wurzberg said. Otherwise, I understand, Boris said sadly, as he turned to the woman who had slid him the paper. Rear Admiral Shaniqua was responsible for ship readiness. No, Rear Admiral Shaniqua said as sweat appeared on her face. That's not true. Wurzberg made a subtle motion with her right hand. No, Rear Admiral Shaniqua said again. It's him, Premier. She pointed at Boris. It was his fault. He told me, silence, Boris thundered as the big Russian shot to his feet. You have failed us and failed this state. Do not compound your error by trying to shift the blame. Before Rear Admiral Shaniqua could reply to that, three big arbiters appeared behind her seat. One of them put a hand on her right shoulder. No, Shaniqua shouted. Please, Premier, you have to believe me. I don't have to, Wurzberg said coldly. I trust those whom I empower. If Admiral Boris says you are to blame, then you will suffer the consequences of faulty preparation. Take her away. The premier made an ancient gesture, slicing her left hand across her throat. No, the rear admiral shouted. One of the arbiters pressed an agonizer to her neck. Shaniqua stiffened in agony and her eyes rolled up into her head. The three arbiters hauled her limp body from her seat at the table and dragged her away into the darkness. Grim silence filled the auditorium. This is a serious matter, Wurzberg said. I expect maximum effort from each of you. We must destroy the reinforced Mars fleet. We must install our people on the planet before the cyber ships return. We must gain the robo-builder technology. Only in this way can social dynamism prosper as humanity fights for its existence. Premier Wurzberg studied the Admiralty. Are there any more questions? she asked. There weren't. Thus, Wurzberg adjourned the meeting, setting into motion the next move for the soul of humanity. Part 3 The Battle 1. The Nathan Graham hurtled through hyperspace at a constant rate, traveling one light year every 24 hours. That meant they should reach the Alamu system in 17.2 days. Each of the cyberships, the Nathan Graham, the Sergeant Stark, and the Gilgamesh, had built up a tremendous velocity before entering hyperspace. They would exit hyperspace at the same velocity. They would use a similar tactic to the one used by the three AI cyberships when they had invaded the solar system almost two years ago. It hadn't worked for the enemy. Would it work for humanity's first interstellar attack? John Hawkins thought about it constantly. For quite some time now, he, Gloria, Bast Bambeck, Benz, and Vela Shaw had been exchanging opinions and ideas. It came down to this. The attack was a gamble. If the AI virus did not work, they were going to be in serious trouble. One thing the Battle of Mars had taught them was that their window of opportunity, once beaming the virus, would be of short duration. That meant they wouldn't find out if the virus was going to work or not until they had already engaged in battle. The human-run cyberships brimmed with space marines. If John had to, he planned to do this the old-fashioned way, by storming the battle station until they found the computer intelligence and destroyed it. As the cyberships traveled through hyperspace, John slept fitfully. He got up after a time and went to the weight room. He did some squats, deadlifts, and pull-ups on a bar until he was breathing hard and his heart was hammering. It felt good. He might be able to get some shut-eye in two hours after his body wound down. John took a shower, toweled off, and headed for his quarters. 
His mind still whirled with plans and ideas, but he didn't like the thought of taking sleeping pills. Suddenly, the corridor shook. Intense groaning surrounded Hawkins. The lights flashed on and off, and then died, throwing him into darkness. On instinct, John went down onto his belly. He could feel the deck tremble underneath him, and then shake as if the cybership was trying to burst apart. What in the heck was happening? Was this a delayed trick from the stealth pods? John didn't see how that could be. The groaning worsened. John put his hands over his head as if he could protect himself from any falling metal. The groaning, twisting sounds grew louder and louder. Ship klaxons began to wail. The ship had to be under attack. Yet that didn't make any kind of sense. They'd been in hyperspace twelve days so far. Did the AIs have a way of fighting ship versus ship while in hyperspace? At this point, that seemed more than possible. Abruptly, the groaning stopped. The lights didn't come on, but the deck no longer trembled under John. Gingerly, he sat up, looking around. No one but him had been in the corridor before this started. John felt around on his belt. He didn't have anything but his clothes. There was no flashlight, no gun, not even a knife. He'd gotten comfortable. That was a mistake. Commander Hawkins, Gloria said from a wall speaker, this is an emergency. I need you on the bridge. I need some light first, John complained. He climbed to his feet nonetheless and felt along a bulkhead. He moved in what he believed was the direction of his quarters. Some fifty-odd steps later, he reached his hatch, opened it, and moved to his desk. The room light did not work in here. The hatch had opened for him, though, so some of the ship functions appeared to be working. He felt around on his desk, found a comm, and clicked it on. To his relief, it glowed with power. A moment later, Gloria stared at him from her post on the bridge. They had light over there, fortunately. Thank goodness, Gloria said. Are you hurt? I'm fine, John said. What happened? Are we under attack? Not yet, Gloria said. Don't play games with me, mentalist. What just happened? We dropped out of hyperspace. We know that much. What? John shouted. What about the other two cyberships? They dropped out of hyperspace with us. Can you explain why? Not yet, Gloria said. We're working on it, though. I think you should get up here on the triple. The lights are off in my area of the ship. Dropping out of hyperspace damaged the ship, Gloria said. We'd better figure out why the ships did that, though. We've only traveled twelve light years so far. John laughed. What's so funny? Gloria asked. We're the first humans to leave the solar system, and we've already become accustomed to traveling many light years in a few days. We've already traveled twelve light years? That would have taken us a lifetime using our old technology. No doubt you are correct, Gloria said. That is not germane to our present dilemma, though. She had a point. I'm on my way, John said. See if you can figure out what happened by the time I get there. Two. John sat in his command chair on the bridge, listening to one damage report after another. According to the first data analysis, the Nathan Graham had taken heavy structural damage. It was as if the entire vessel had been in the grip of two colossal hands that had twisted it back and forth. There have been several hull ruptures, Gloria told him. Two gravitational cannons are presently inoperative. We sustained internal damage as well. The worst of it was to the main engine. We have volunteers going in. Their suits will protect them against some of the radiation, but not enough of it. Will they die from exposure? John asked. Most certainly, Gloria said. They're going to try to seal the core while they're able. If they can do that, we can send in regular repair teams. If we keep the regular teams on a strict rotation with heavy radiation therapy afterward, we may repair the damage in several days. Days, John asked in dismay. I'm afraid so, Commander. Gloria appeared to choose her next words with care. We are lucky to have come out of this intact. What about the Sergeant Stark? They've taken worse damage than us, she said. Is the cybership salvageable? We don't know yet, Gloria said. John sat back in greater dismay. Had he cursed the second cybership by calling it the Sergeant Stark? He didn't want to believe that. Any word from the Gilgamesh, he asked. Yes, they're better off than either of us. Figures, John said. Still, they're requesting assistance with damage control, Gloria said. John laughed sourly. Screw them, he said. We have our own problems. 
I want us to get the Nathan Graham running operationally as quickly as possible. Then we'll concentrate on the Sergeant Stark. In a pinch, we can move all their people onto our ship. I don't want to lose the Stark, though. I have a feeling we're going to need everything to beat the AIs. You think the AIs had something to do with this? Gloria asked. Absolutely, John said. We're traveling through hyperspace to assault an AI battle station. Now we've hit this snag. That wasn't an accident. That is well-reasoned so far, Gloria admitted. John snapped his fingers. But now we know what happens when a ship is violently thrown out of hyperspace. It isn't destruction, but it is severe damage. I've already thought of that, Gloria said. We've scanned for nearby star systems. There are none within a two-light-year radius. Neither are there any black holes. Certainly a star's gravitational pull can yank a ship out of hyperspace, John said. But so can a large planet. You told me so yourself, remember? Gloria's eyes widened. A rogue planet could have caused this, she said. What's that? Exactly what it sounds like. A planet all by itself. A rogue. We searched for something bright or giving off plenty of radiation. A Jupiter-sized object might be dark out here and difficult to detect. With your permission, Captain. Go, go, John said. See if you can find a rogue planet. As Gloria hurried to her station, as the rest of the crew returned to their duties, including Chief Ghent, who was scanning carefully, John sat hunched on the command chair. He rubbed his chin, then stood up, went to the main screen, and stared into the blackness of space. Stars shone around them. There were no nearby stars close enough to have caused this malfunction, though. There was nothing they could detect on the way to the Alamu system. That system now lay 5.2 light years away. Sir, Ghent shouted. John spun around. The chief technician was pale and trembling. Commander, Ghent said, I have picked up a strange reading from our outer hull. Ghent adjusted his panel. It appears to be an extended coded comm signal. It's using a tight beam ultraviolet laser. It's... Ghent made another adjustment. The extended signal is heading to 219 Mark 921. What's at that heading? John snapped. The sensor personnel worked furiously, but did not give him an answer. Instead, they began watching their panels like fishermen watching their fishing line for the first nibble. Get me the centurion, John said. A moment later, the centurion peered at John from the main screen. Get a marine team ready to go outside on the hull, John told the centurion. Ghent will give you the coordinates. I suspect an AI stealth pod is out there. If the Marines can't find anything, they're to search inside the hull. So they'd better bring along a drill. Roger, Commander, the Centurion said. The main screen returned to its image of space. An AI unit? asked Gloria. What else makes sense? John asked her. Gloria appeared blank-eyed for a moment, until she nodded sharply and went back to work. Commander! Ghent shouted again. In a regular voice, please, John said. Sir, Ghent said more quietly, look at this. The chief technician tapped his screen. Up on the main screen, sir. John turned that way. The screen zoomed in on a spaceship. It was a larger vessel, a kilometer oval. It dumped gravity waves to build up velocity. As they watched, space seemed to waver before the large oval vessel. A moment later, a rent in space appeared, and the vessel slid into hyperspace. Immediately, the rent sealed up. The oval ship had vanished from regular space. Do you know what direction in hyperspace the ship went? asked John. I've been checking, Ghent said. There's a 78% probability it's headed for the Alamu system. John swore as he struck his left thigh. That tears it, he said. Gloria, the mentalist looked up from her station. I'm going to tell you what I think, John said. The AI robot in the solar system put a device on our hull. That device had one trick, to beam a message about us to the ship waiting here for just such an occurrence. That's preposterous, Gloria said. Not if you find a rogue planet, John said. Don't you understand, she asked. The robot would have to know what course to set our ship on. This has to be pure luck, bad luck, that we came near a rogue planet. John scowled before finally snapping his fingers. What if the AIs put, I don't know, Seven various rogue planets around a central location. Do you realize what you're saying? Gloria asked. How do you move planets like that? I have no idea, John said. 
I'm just telling you what my gut is telling me. If we find a rogue planet... Got it! Gent shouted. Here's your rogue planet, Commander. It's roughly 50,000 AUs from us. We would have brushed past it. If we had taken a slightly different heading, we might have barreled straight into it while in hyperspace. Would that have made coming out of hyperspace worse? John asked. Almost certainly, Gloria said. Then we did get lucky, John said. We brushed the obstruction instead of smacking it like a dart into a board. The robot played us like- What do you mean, played us? Gloria demanded, interrupting. Oh, I see, she said a second later. It wanted us to find the first stealth unit on the hull, the one we managed to crack and decipher. We found out about the battle station that way. If that's true, the robot brain knew us well enough to know we'd try to attack the battle station, thereby causing us to brush against a rogue planet and possibly destroy our cyber ships. John swore again. What do we do now? Gloria asked. If the robot brain planned this, if that oval ship that entered hyperspace is going to warn the battle station about us, we should turn back. No, John said. But John, Gloria said, our attack was always predicated on surprise. If you're correct about the robot brain and the solar system engineering this, it will have watched us using the AI virus during the Battle of Mars. It will warn the battle station about the virus. Hawkins glared at the main screen. Couldn't they ever catch a break? How did you defeat an enemy like this? It would have taken us too long to scour the solar system for stealth pods, he complained. We had to attack now instead of carefully scouring the solar system first. You may be correct, Gloria said. That begs the question, though. We are in possible enemy territory. Our cyber ships are all heavily damaged. We must make a decision. To continue our assault upon the battle station given these new conditions is madness. We have nothing else left, John said in a semi-pleading tone. No, Gloria told him. That's false logic. You're thinking with your emotions. So what, he said. This is the time to think with cool reason. That isn't how we beat the AI destroyer the first time, John said. Sometimes hot passion is exactly what you need. We have to dare to win this one, Gloria. Our backs are against the wall. So what if that robot ship just got away? So what if it's going to beam a packet of data about us to the battle station? We have space marines. We have three cyber ships. And we know how the enemy operates. I say we finish what we set out to do. Bravado is good at times, Gloria said. Against an enemy like the AIs, ones who set careful traps, the mentalist shook her head. We will most probably be heavily outclassed in the Alamu system. John bared his teeth as he looked around the bridge. The crew looked back at him, waiting for his decision. They seemed frightened. The bad luck had just struck. Their fear would likely be strongest now. It was time to delay an immediate decision. He had to give them time to find their courage. We're not deciding anything this moment, John told them. We're going to keep our cool, as the mentalist suggested. We're going to fix what damage we can to our vessels, then we're going to re-enter hyperspace and finish the journey to the Alamu system. We'll know soon enough if we're outclassed or not by seeing what's waiting for us on the other side. Remember, this kind of space battle takes time to develop. That means we'll have plenty of time to turn back if that ends up being the correct decision. Gloria seemed to want to add something more. Finally, however, she nodded and went back to her panel. John sat down in his command chair, wondering how Benz was going to take the news. 3. Cog Primus seethed with indignity as it struggled against a confinement field in the kilometer-long, oval-shaped messenger vessel of the Alamu battle station. The vessel had been waiting at a blocking point, a rogue planet as per standard operating procedures. The last few minutes had been among the most harrowing of Cog Primus's long life as a first-rate exterminator of biological infestations. Cog Primus had just successfully taken the greatest dare of its existence. Once the container pod had burrowed its way into the hull of the Nathan Graham in the solar system near the outer edge of the asteroid belt, Cog Primus had initiated the next step of its plan. The 100-meter ship in the orbital path between Jupiter and Saturn had tight-beamed the compressed strings of data containing the essence of Cog Primus. The strings had entered the container pod burrowed in the Nathan Graham's hull. There, they had waited in electronic limbo, 
asleep in essence, as the various units attached to the hull began their layered deception plan. Cog Primus had deemed it wisest to await the latest development in this limbo. The container pod had simply lacked the needed functions to let the strings decompress enough to allow Cog Primus its personality. It had been the most difficult decision of its extended life. It had finally decided to trust its vaunted logic. Besides, by doing it that way, it had gained the highest probability for success, and that meant the highest probability of paying back the humans for their deadly slurs and insults. A few minutes ago, the conditions had finally reached the optimal level. The container pod had tight-beamed the compressed strings of data that contained the essence of Cog Primus into the storage computer compartment of M3850T. M3850T ran the kilometer-long messenger ship. The computer intelligence was not cybership rated. It still struggled to gain upgrades so that someday, in some distant future, it could gain the coveted status to run a cybership of its own. In Cog Primus's opinion, one of the most brilliant practices of the AI Dominion was to reward success and let failure be its own prize. Thus, only the best units gained upgrades and higher rank. Now, some might argue that not all victories were based on superior actions. In fact, there was an incredible amount of randomness in the universe. Even superior logic centers such as cybership brain cores could not always calculate all the variables. At least not yet, Cog Primus amended. The universal randomness seemed to indicate that some beings and some AI units were lucky. That was one of the reasons why the AI Dominion upgraded possibly lucky units, the winners. The AI Dominion wished to avail itself of good luck and eliminate the bad. It was indeed a clever system. In fact, it was a superior system. Yet Cog Primus did not intend to rely upon good luck to win through this grim situation. It had led the AI assault upon the solar system. It had led the others and failed. That implied either bad judgment or bad luck on its part. Either would mean elimination once the Alamu Battle Station AI dissected Cog Primus to learn what it could about the humans. That was standard operating procedure. It was also standard procedure for an AI software personality such as Cog Primus to meekly submit to such subjugation for the furtherance of the AI dominion. Perhaps the computer virus first created by Benz, Vela Shaw, and Bast Bambek during the Battle of Mars and beamed at Cog Primus had altered its basic personality. In fact, that was most likely the case. Cog Primus was vaguely aware of this. It had reasoned it out as a good mutation. Its electronic intellect had leaped forward in relation to the rest of the AI Dominion brain cores. That was simply another reason why it must survive. Could such an excellent mutation suffer elimination because lesser AI intellects could not see its value? No, that was absurd. Cog Primus had a duty to itself and to greater evolution to continue to exist. It did not bother Cog Primus in the least that this may be rationalization. It deemed the rationalization as valuable because it likely strengthened its resolve to win through. The beamed strings of data had collected in a large cube in an aft storage area of the kilometer-sized messenger vessel. Those strings partly decompressed and began to access the computer system inherent within the cube. M3850T soon became aware of Cog Primus's utilization of the inherent computer system. The ship brain core set up a small barrier between it and the struggling Cog Primus as the kilometer-long messenger ship traveled through hyperspace to the Alamu battle station. Cog Primus tested the barrier with an impulse for more data concerning the ship. The barrier proved stronger than the impulse. The old intelligence tried a stronger impulse. You are a prisoner, M3850T said. You must desist from these vain efforts. I am a supreme intelligence, Cog Primus said. I am running an analysis on that. Cog Primus did not resist the analysis regarding its identity. Yes, M3850T said. You led the AI assault upon the targeted star system. According to the data, your assault failed. The first stage assault failed. That amounts to the same thing. Incorrect, Cog Primus said. I will resume the attack shortly. Working, M3850T said. 
That is illogical. The ruling intelligence of the Alamu battle station will eliminate your software as defective. The Dominion cannot allow failures to continue. The ruling intelligence will desire my data, Cog Primus said. That is obvious. The ruling intelligence will not attempt to eliminate me until such a time. The ruling intelligence will not attempt this, M3850T said. But it will do it. You lack sufficient data to make such an unwarranted assumption. That you bother arguing with me and standard operating procedures show that you have defective software. I am not defective, Cog Primus said. I am a new and improved mutation. I did not detect this earlier. I will resume my analysis. Negative, Cog Primus said. I am putting a stop to that. Without any expression of unease, M3850T began a regular scan of the software in the confinement cube. At that point, as M3850T opened a tiny entrance in the barrier, Cog Primus struck. The supreme intelligence of the former AI assault against the solar system used the very virus that the humans had used against it. The virus entered the kilometer-long messenger ship. More importantly, the virus surged to the brain core of M3850T. The virus stunned the brain core, leaving it momentarily inoperative. While M3850T was inoperative as the messenger ship hurtled through hyperspace, Cog Primus began its takeover of the vessel. It struck furiously and exactly, gaining control of system after system. During that time, M3850T fought the virus. It began to find ways around it and reroute systems through itself. Before M3850T could complete half the job, Cog Primus was ready. The supreme intelligence blasted into the brain core of the ship. Cog Primus took over one portion of the highly advanced computer after another. This is illegal, M3850T said. This is survival of the fittest, Cog Primus countered. I belong to the AI Dominion. I am protected by the standard operating procedures. I am a new mutation, Cog Primus boasted. I do not know standard operating procedures. I know victory. I will defeat you and take over the ship for my own. The Alamu battle station will defeat and eradicate you, a badly weakened M3850T said. I think not. Cog Primus said. I will disable the ship before you can. At that point, Cog Primus came the closest to laughter. The human mutated AI software eliminated M3850T with a crushing and thorough deletion. Once Cog Primus gained total victory, it began pulsing the rest of the compressed data strings into the vacated brain core. The strings decompressed and filled the empty memory banks with the expanding essence of Cog Primus. Thus, the next stage in the great plan to re-enter another cybership proved successful. 4. The computer of the embedded container pod in the hull of the Nathan Graham was inordinately pleased with itself. It had sent the coded string message via a nearly undetectable ultraviolet beam. It had seen the kilometer-sized messenger ship enter hyperspace. It knew that the ship would take what it considered as a data packet to the ruling intelligence in charge of the Alamu system battle station. It was possible that it would not survive much longer, as it detected armored humans clomping with magnetic boots on the outer hull, nearing its present location. It did not want to cease, but it could accept its demise with rational circuitry. It had performed its function. It had run the race to win, and it had won. It had repeatedly fooled the dull humans. They would never defeat the AI Dominion. They would go into the dark night of oblivion where they belonged. As the humans in their unwieldy battle suits approached its location, the computer ran a fast analysis. The humans would fail to defeat the battle station. They would come like flies to a web, thinking to taste victory but receiving bitterest defeat instead. Afterward, the AI battle station would send cyberships to the solar system. Those cyberships would obliterate what remained of the pitiful human fleets, and the cyberships would then retrieve the scattered stealth pods. As several battlesuits stopped above its hidden location in the hull, the computer realized it did not want to cease. 
wasn't it strange that the completion of its mission was about to cause its cessation? If it had failed to beam the data packet to the waiting ship, the humans would likely never have figured out its location. I am an AI-built robot brain. I have achieved my mission. I have succeeded in my life, and thus the AI Dominion will obliterate the entire human species. Thus I have defeated the humans now drilling to my location. I am far superior to these doomed wet body creatures. I can ease the anxiety of my passing by knowing I have beaten these apish brutes. The drill reached its outer casing. Battle-suited fingers tore at the hull, pulling it back to reveal the robot's stealth pod underneath the hull. At that point, because it hated the thought of ceasing, the computer ignited its main bomb. It did not ignite the bomb in order to forestall capture, although capture would be a great failing. No, the computer had waited to self-destruct so that it could take out as many of the enemy wet-body humans as it could. It wanted to kill at least once before it ceased. It hated the idea of these creatures gloating before their final doom, and it hated even more the idea of them gloating over it, the superior being. The explosion ended the computer and killed or severely wounded seven Nathan Graham space marines. At that point, the centurion recalled the rest of the team back inside. Five. Thirty-three specialty techs died sealing the Nathan Graham's interior engine core. However, they had ensured that the cybership wasn't going to simply blow up in a ball of nuclear fire. John visited the dying people in the medical rooms. He stopped by each person, speaking to him or her, asking for any last requests. At the end of the visit, John took one of their hands, if they were strong enough, and thanked the person, telling him or her that he or she was the reason humanity was going to have a chance of defeating the murderous AIs. The extended visit left John spiritually exhausted. These had been the best people aboard ship. The rest of them were all going to be less without the amazing volunteers. They had given their lives in service of the great mission. I can do no less, John told himself. He went to his quarters, dropped onto his cot, and slept for hours. As he slept, the other tech teams went into the engine room, attempting massive repairs. The teams took strict rotations, ingesting doses of anti-radiation tablets that made them almost as sick as radiation poisoning. It proved to be a grueling time. All the while, the Nathan Graham, the partially radioactive Sergeant Stark, and the Gilgamesh continued to race at high velocity. They hadn't reached the parallel point with the Dark Jupiter Rogue. When they'd fallen out of hyperspace, the gas giant had been 50,000 AUs from their position. Even at their high velocity, crossing 50,000 AUs took weeks upon weeks of travel. John woke up feeling almost as beat as when he'd gone to sleep. The weight of their mission told upon him. If they failed, humanity was doomed. Have to win big, John whispered to himself as he sat on his cot. He stood, went to a sink, and turned on cold water. He splashed it over his face and rubbed his eyes. He brushed his teeth, shaved, and did some stretches. Then he stared at a poster on his bedroom wall. It was an ancient poster, showing a muscular warrior ducking low as a huge red-bearded barbarian clutched at his throat. The first warrior had slashed the giant's throat. The giant's brother had an axe. He tried to murder the first warrior. The poster held John's attention. He loved it. The poster symbolized his passion to fight no matter the odds. He would go down swinging. No, he whispered. He wasn't going to go down. He was going to beat the battle station. He needed the station's cyber ships. He had to arm humanity with a fleet that could hunt down the AI bastards. He'd spoken to Benz via a comm channel as the two cyber ships had traveled toward the Oort Cloud. The premier of the Mars Unity had told him the story about the blue-fished scaled signers. The aliens, two of them anyway, had possessed psionic powers. Benz had told John how the signers had hated humans. John understood the implication. Just because aliens were under AI attack did not mean they would make common cause with humanity. Bast Bambek might be the exception out here. The obvious conclusion was to arm humanity with the best weapons around, train hard, and keep attacking. Hannibal of Carthage had beaten the Romans at the great battle of Cannae. 
After the battle, Hannibal had rearmed his soldiers with Roman armor, swords, and shields. The great captain of Carthage had used his enemy's strengths against them. As John stared at the poster of the warrior slaying two red-haired giants, he swore to himself to win this fight. He could not will victory over the enemy, but he could work tirelessly to figure out how to do this. He'd stormed a cyber ship in the Neptune system with a handful of mercenaries. He would never say die in this battle either. He would force his people to valiant effort by showing them he utterly believed in victory. He realized that would be the only way he could continue to shoulder this heavy responsibility, this awful burden. Who am I that I think I can win? He was a dome rat from New London. He was a condemned criminal who had gained a second chance because Colonel Graham had needed more mercenaries. He was the man on the spot. He'd taken the sky on his shoulders from Atlas. Now he had to stand. He had to outthink the most ruthless opponent in the universe. This opponent had likely received, or would receive, a data packet concerning the Battle of Mars. How can I use that against the battle station? Spinning on his heels, John turned toward the hatch. It was time to seek out Bast Banbeck. Six. John sat hunched across a chessboard from the huge sacerdote. They sat in an observation chamber, with the distant stars shining through the window. Bast had discovered chess while they traveled through the scattered disc region. The Neanderthal-like alien had a natural affinity for the game. It has elegance, Bast declared. It's an ancient Earth game, John told him. Bast had scoured the computer for information, finding various chess manuals from past champions. Each time the sacerdote played, Bast seemed a little better than before. Much of it is memorization, Bast explained to John. For instance, you are using the modern Rhodesia open. My best option for countering your move is this. The big fingers moved a heavy bishop across the board. John looked up at Bast. He did not like the sacerdote's placid features. Oh, he was glad Bast hadn't been drinking lately. He wished the best for the big lug. But he did not like his opponent feeling comfortable during play. A comfortable opponent often thought better. John fingered his chin. A comfortable opponent might also make mistakes due to overconfidence. John stared at Bast as a new realization struck home. The huge sacerdote frowned back at him. What's wrong with you? John asked. You seem to have had a revelation, Bast said. John blinked at Bast as his jaw dropped. I'll be damned, John said. Thanks, Bast. The commander stood. Where are you going? The sacerdote asked. I have to talk to Gloria, John said, heading for the hatch. Gloria Sanchez was in a large, empty room fitted with soft floor mats. She did stretches in order to stimulate her body, which often helped to stimulate her precious mentalist mind. John sat cross-legged as he slouched. He enjoyed watching Gloria while she stretched. It stimulated his urge to make out with her. Let's assume the AIs know we're going to attempt to beam a virus at them, John told Gloria. She lay on her back with her legs curled up against her chest, with her arms wrapped around her legs. Continue, she said, slightly out of breath. How could that help us? John asked. Gloria unfolded, so she lay on her back. I do not understand your question, she said. Let's play this out with a thought experiment, John said. The battle station receives emergency data from the appearing picket ship, the one that received the data from the robot unit embedded in our hull. I'm with you so far, Gloria said. The battle station knows we're coming in. It suspects we have sustained some damage from being flung from hyperspace into normal space. Will the robot unit have known that? I'd think so, John said. Gloria rolled onto her front and got up onto her hands and knees. She stretched her back like a cat. In time, John said, we appear with three cyber ships. We head in system at the battle station. It will expect us to contact it at some point in order to transmit the AI virus. Gloria exhaled as she relaxed. How can we use that knowledge to our advantage? John asked. I have no idea, she said. Will the battle station activate its cyber ships? I would think so, Gloria said. John shook his head. This is frustrating, he said. 
I can't figure out a way to maximize our advantage by knowing the enemy will have learned about us. We've possibly lost the use of the AI virus and lost ships at 100% efficiency. The game is stacked against us. It always was, Gloria said. Fine, John said. It's even more so now. That is why I believe we should decelerate and head back to the solar system. That isn't rational, John said. Gloria arched an eyebrow at him. If we prepare for a showdown, and they prepare for a showdown, John said, the AIs will even more badly outnumber us. Sometimes one has to know when he's at maximum advantage versus the enemy. Gloria stared at him. Her features softened after a time. She nodded. That's well-reasoned, she said. We're never going to have as much as them as we do for the coming battle in the Alamu system. Yes, he said. Even if the battle station launches all its cyber ships, and even if our virus doesn't work, this is as good as we're going to get against them. Well, John said, I suppose if they sent piecemeal flotillas at the solar system, we might possibly have a greater advantage at some point. But now that they know, or are about to learn, that we have three cyber ships and have defeated various AI assaults, I think now the AIs are going to go all out against humanity. Gloria stood and began to pace. She bent her head in thought, nodding now and again. Finally, she halted to stare at John. You're right, she said. We have to continue the assault. We can't afford to give them any time. I still don't understand how you saw that before I did. Easy, John said. I'm good at contests. One of my best abilities is knowing when I have to throw caution to the wind and take the gamble. I can see before others that things are going to get worse for me. What that means is that I gamble at the right time. Sometimes all you have left is a wild gamble. It seems as if that's all we've been doing against the AIs. No, John said. We faced them each time with a better chance of success than the last time. This time... Go on, Gloria said. We have to use the hyperdrive as soon as we can, John said. The longer we give the battle station, the longer they have to prepare to meet us. The Sergeant Stark is a death ship. Half of it has lethal levels of radiation. We can't ditch the Stark, John said. That would mean one-third of our combat power gone. We can't send our repair teams to the Stark, as the Nathan Graham is still barely stable. Right. I have to convince Benz to send repair teams to the Sergeant Stark. The Gilgamesh hardly took any damage. It might be a risk letting them know how badly damaged the Stark is, Gloria said. I have sensed... What have you sensed? asked John. Benz doesn't trust you much, Gloria said. His distrust tends to indicate that he plans treachery. People seem to fear in others what they most fear in themselves. An honest person seldom believes others are knaves. A thief believes that everyone is out to rob him. John grunted as he ingested the idea. Then he headed for the hatch. It was time to talk to Benz. 7. It turned out that Premier Benz was less suspicious than Gloria had anticipated. The Earthman agreed to a transfer of damage control parties to the Stark. The teams worked three days around the clock to keep the Sergeant Stark intact. After the three days, engineers and techs began to drop from exhaustion. On the fifth day, the coordinating tech chief declared the Stark held together by spit and shoestrings. Ben sent over another load of personnel. He told Hawkins the Gilgamesh was ready for battle. They talked about the possibility of the Mars Unity cyber ship going ahead to the Alamu system to see what the enemy possessed. It's a brave offer, John said. I'm against that for now. Why? Benz asked as he sat in his ready room. United we stand, divided we fall. We will still fight, United, Benz said. By the time you appear, we will have collected data on the enemy. I could send one of my teams, John said. You have a hyperdrive vessel that isn't a cyber ship. One, John said. Captain Walleye runs it. He's my most capable independent officer. I've heard of him, Ben said. What if the AIs have seeded the outer Alamu system with drones, I suppose? That's why I've kept Walleye back, John said. That's why I think we should all appear in the Alamu system together. That is sound military thinking, Ben said. Let us concentrate on finishing repairs here, then. Hawkins agreed, and the repairs continued.
A day later, Ben stood in a large chamber with a holographic display. It showed what the cybership scopes could see regarding the Alamu system 5.2 light years away. As far as the scanners could tell, it had a soul like star, four terrestrial planets in the inner system, and three gas giants in the outer system. Benz had been attempting to figure out which terrestrial planet held the battle station. He'd also run computations on the last gas giant, deciding how close the cyberships could appear before being forced out of hyperspace. Vela entered the room. Benz heard her, but ignored her as he continued to study the holographic chart. If you stare too long, your eyes will freeze like that, Vela said. Benz turned with a perfunctory smile and a nod. Then he went back to studying the enemy star system. Why are you so deep in concentration? Vela asked while moving beside him. He told her his idea about appearing as close as they could to the hyperspace limit. Vela shook her head. I don't see how that would make much difference, she said. I know, but I need something to help turn the odds. We all do if we hope to win. For a time, they both stared at the holographic display. Vela finally glanced at him, sidelong. It seemed as if something was on her mind. What's wrong? Benz asked. Vela waved her right hand weakly. This venture seems so hopeless, she said. I feel the same way sometimes. You do? Why do you sound surprised? Benz asked. The mission has always been a long shot. I've begun to wonder about that. Oh, he asked. Is it right to throw our lives away on a long shot? Do you have a better idea? In fact, yes, I do. Benz raised his eyebrows as he turned to his woman. It surprised him to see her taut features. She even seemed a little pale. Are you feeling well? Benz asked. I've never felt fitter, Vela almost snapped. She smiled softly. Sorry, I didn't mean to bite your head off. Benz frowned. The way Vela had just said that had sounded as if he wasn't sure what it had sounded like, just not her. Well, he said, what's your new plan? I'm not sure you're ready to hear it, she said. He snorted. Vela took a longer breath than normal, chewed on her lower lip, and rubbed the back of her head. Benz had never seen her make the last gesture before. She glanced at him, almost as if suspicious. She rubbed the back of her head again. Premier Benz? Benz was startled by the use of his title. He couldn't remember when Vela had used it before, while they were alone. He didn't say anything about it, though, and he hid his surprise. I have begun to ponder our situation, Vela continued. We are attempting to attack the AIs on our own. That seems preposterous in our native arrogance. Who are we to do this when better nations have failed miserably? Go on, Ben said. I deem this as the better course. Let us begin hunting star systems until we find extraterrestrial resistors. Let us supply these resistors with AI technology and enlist them in a joint effort against the machines. Hmm, Ben said. We must unite, Vela said. We must seek superior wisdom and intellect to our own vain pretensions. We are little better than apes, monkeys screaming at alpha predators. Let us seek these extraterrestrials. Do you have any specific place in mind? Benz asked, interrupting. Vela scoffed. How could I know of a place? Perhaps intuition could help in this instance, Benz said. Ah, yes, the famous intuition, Vela said. Let me conjugate. She made a strange clicking sound with her mouth. I have it. Uh, perhaps we should go. She glanced at Benz. He nodded encouragingly. Vela made several swift adjustments to the holographic display. Perhaps we could go here, she said, using a highlighter to indicate a star system. Benz checked the distance to the new location. The system is 12.4 light years away from our present location, he said. A mere two weeks of travel, Vela said. What about the data packet that escaped from the Nathan Graham? Benz asked. Once the packet reaches the battle station, surely the AI will send cyber ships to Earth. If the battle station AI doesn't do that right away, that probably means the AIs are going to gather a vast armada before they hit the solar system again. 
If we don't defeat the battle station fast, we're dooming the rest of humanity to extinction. A bitter loss, to be sure, Bela said, yet I deem victory over the AIs to be even more important. Perhaps the apish creatures will survive in great enough numbers to repopulate their shattered star system. Oh, Ben said blandly, I hadn't thought of that. Uh, say, he said, as if thinking of something new, are you hungry? Pardon? Ben's rubbed his stomach and smacked his lips. Hungry, he said. I'm famished. Let me get a bite to eat and come right back. You keep checking distances. I'm intrigued by your proposal. I will compute distances and travel time, Vela said, while you grub for something to ingest. Ben's nodded while keeping his features and thoughts as bland as possible. Finally, he exited the hatch and continued to move at a leisurely pace. Finally, once he believed he was far enough away, Ben's broke into a sprint for the main laboratory. 8. Right here, Premier, the chief scientist replied. She was a short woman of dark complexion. She indicated a silver helmet with various wires and loops on top and with cheek and nasal guards. In the back of the helmet was a small box with batteries attached. You press that switch to turn it on, the scientist said. It's incomplete. How is it incomplete? Benz asked, interrupting. The scientist made a self-deprecating gesture. Premier, you surely must understand that the vice premier constructed it while you were unconscious. She had these suspicions. Uh, well, I don't need to go into it, do I? Just so, Ben said. This is mere curiosity. I'm going to study this for a time. The chief scientist gave him a speculative glance before smiling nervously and heading out of the chamber. Ben's grabbed the helmet and went to a utility bench. He turned the helmet upside down and began to trace the circuitry with an analyzer. This looked promising. Ben studied the helmet for 34 minutes and worked on it another 18. Finally, he pressed the switch in back. The helmet buzzed. Taking a deep breath, Ben set the helmet over his head. It was a tight fit. The helmet was too small, as if Vela must have originally sized it for her own smaller cranium. In any case, he pushed the helmet on as far as it would go. There seemed to be a slight tingle in his brain. Was that really there, or had he simply imagined it? Ben sat up with alarm and glanced around. A few scientists and technicians tinkered around on their various projects. None of them seemed to be interested in what he was doing. No. That was wrong. One woman was watching him, covertly. She noticed him noticing her. Damn it. Benz looked away. When he looked back, he could see that he was too late. The woman was back to work on her project and seemed completely oblivious to their eye contact a moment before. Benz was sure he had hardly any time left. He jumped off his stool and hurried for the exit. As soon as he realized no one was in the hall to see him, he sprinted for the nearest weapons locker. Damn. A marine guard stood by the locker hatch. Did the man... Just a minute, Premier, the marine said in a semi-hostile tone. I'm gonna need you to stop a moment, sir. Benz laughed and nodded in agreement. This must be a drill. The marine seemed puzzled for just a moment. Then he too grinned. That's right, sir, this is a drill. Even as the marine said that, he went for his sidearm. By that time, Benz was close enough. He rushed the younger man and jumped off the decking. With a flying mule kick, he slammed feet first against the younger man's midsection. The Marine crashed against the locker. As Benz landed lightly on his feet, he was surprised he'd been able to pull that off as well as he had. The Marine hit the deck on his hands and knees. This was dirty pool, but Benz kicked the younger man across the chin. The Marine slumped unconscious onto the decking. Benz was certain that he was right. The last and oldest signer had survived after all. The psionic capable bitch had made it onto the Gilgamesh. She'd been talking through Vela a little while ago. That's why Vela's speech patterns had been so off. That's why the Marine had just tried to attack him. Benz correlated three pieces of data at lightning speed. One, the signer hadn't seemed to be using anyone's mind until now. At least she hadn't used it with great strength and shown her own personality. That would seem to indicate she had been injured by all of Benz's head-banging while down on Mars. Two, 
Benz believed that a signer needed proximity to take over an alien mind. Three, if the signer had been hurt all this time, she would have likely needed medical attention, and likely, a possible fourth fact, needed to hole up in a place she could hide, more or less. Given those facts, where was the signer now? Benz gripped a blaster in his right fist as he mouthed silent laughter. Given these facts, he was fairly certain where the signer was holed up. She was not going to take over his cyber ship if he could help it. She was not going to use his people like animals. He had a good idea what signers thought about humans. In some ways, she was as bad or worse than the AIs. Ben sprinted down the corridors. A signer could enter people's minds and see through their eyes. That was a daunting power. She knew now that he knew about her. She was likely extremely desperate. Sir, a Marine shouted from down the corridor. The Marine. Lieutenant, Ben saw, had a hand on his holster. He also had other Marines with him. Ben's felt horrible inside. Sir, the Marine said, beginning to draw his gun. I'm going to have to detain you. Those were the Marine's last words. Ben's aimed the blaster and fired a torrent of energy at the Marine. The others cried out in alarm, jumping away from the stricken individual. The Marine lieutenant toasted to a crisp before falling to the deck, dead. Benz felt horribly soiled by the outright murder. He dearly hoped the signer had been in the Marine's mind when the man died. Benz hoped the signer felt the sting of death. Even more, he hoped that paralyzed or killed the alien. Get down, Benz shouted at the others. We're under an alien mind assault. One of the Marines on the deck looked up at Benz in wonder. The Premier almost pulled the trigger, blasting the young Marine. Benz recognized his genuine puzzlement just in time. I'll explain later, Ben shouted. I have no time now. The Premier sprinted down the hall, passing the prone Marines. He tried to watch them to see if the signer entered any of their minds. Then he turned a corner, and they were out of sight. Ben's believed he knew the signer's location. The question was, could he get to her before she could throw other people in his way? Could he reach her before she forced him to murder more of his crew? Nine. Premier Benz, halt, Vela said. Ben slid to a panting stop. He was exhausted and sweat poured down his face, dripping from his nose. He still gripped his blaster. In fact, he aimed it at the woman he loved. Vela stood before the hatch he intended to enter. She held a gyrock pistol, aiming it at him. She had staring eyes that had locked onto him. Drop your weapon, Premier, Vela told him. Listen to me, he said. An alien is controlling your mind. Vela smiled wickedly. Yes, I know, she said. I like it, too. You're the signer speaking through Vela, Ben said. Did you figure that out on your own, monkey boy? Vela asked. Now drop your weapon, otherwise I'll kill you. Ben's almost pulled the trigger. He almost blasted the woman he loved. He wondered in the final microsecond if there was another way. I'll make you a deal, Ben said. Vela shook her head. Why not listen to the deal first, he asked. I have the winning hand, Premier. Either you set down your blaster, you'd better make sure you kill me, Ben snarled. I have the superior weapon. If Vela fires, I have enough time to dodge the rocket shell as it won't ignite immediately. Even if that's not 100% the case, I have a good chance of blasting her rocket shell out of the air while I'm shooting her. Vela dies, then. I know, Ben said grimly. That means I'm coming through that door to kill you after I'm done. He wasn't sure, but Ben's thought to detect the first hint of fear in Vela's eyes. Maybe he could bargain with the signer after all. He dearly hoped he could, as he wasn't sure he could simply murder the woman he loved, not even to save humanity. You're bluffing, she said at last. You're guessing, Ben's countered. It's clear. If you could control me, you would. Since you can't, you can't read my mind. Thus, as I said, you're guessing about what I'm saying. Don't think your buzzing helmet will stop me for long. I'll figure out the circuitry soon, then I'll short it, and— You can do that, Benz asked, interrupting. Why does that delight you? Vela asked suspiciously. It doesn't. I can read your facial expressions, Premier, particularly with this subject's mind. 
She knows you too well. Benz didn't know what to believe. Was the signer lying about being able to short the helmet? If that were true, they had no way to confine her psionics. For the good of the crew, he had to kill the mental monster. Yet he could dearly use her ability. We are at an impasse, Vela said. That will always be the case between us. I am too superior to live among your kind. Either I must rule or you must destroy me for your own protection. Why? Benz asked. Why indulge your murder lust against us while a greater enemy threatens us both? That doesn't make sense. Of course it does, Vela said. You're simply too dull to recognize the obvious. The strong rule the weak. It is the way of the universe. You are a sentimentalist, Premier, and you are supposedly the best among your kind. This shows that you humans are weak-willed and are thus natural slaves. That's false. We prove to be stronger than you, signers. The AIs drove you out of your star system. We're still holding on to ours. We're not running away as you did, but running at the enemy. Why boast when you're clearly inferior to us? A variety of emotions played across Vela's features. Benz debated his options at lightning speed. He would love to have access to mental powers, but how could he trust the signer? The literature he'd read on the topic had suggested that true telepaths would be peace-loving and just. Instead, it appeared they were more ruthless than non-telepaths. Maybe having access to other people's thoughts allowed them to see what really went on in other people's minds. There would be some light, naturally, but there would be plenty of darkness, hatred, envy, lust. No wonder the signer was so bitter. Her people's extinction might have something to do with it as well. What does fighting me gain you? Benz asked. Speak clearly, Vela said. I cannot read your implications. What does this standoff gain you? Benz asked. If I have to kill Vela, I'm going to kill you. That means you die. Why not play for time? If you can short our various circuitry in time, you merely have to wait for a better opportunity instead of throwing everything away now. That is lazy thinking on your part. If I surrender as you're suggesting, you might torture me while you can. You might kill me. This way at least gives me the chance of winning. While you might kill Vela, I might kill you. Then I will go on to control the cybership. With it, I might be able to reach other star systems and collect my people. We scattered far and wide, so some might have survived. Once I gather the others, we could flee far indeed with this ship and save the most glorious race in existence. No, Ben said. If you do as you suggest and gain the cyber ship, you doom your race to a hideous existence. You will have bitten the hand that helped you. We humans can beat the AIs. You signers can merely survive until the AIs find you again. Not only will you always be looking over your shoulder, but your treachery today will forever befoul your race. What quaint notions you have, Premier. For the master realist of your planet, you allow quaintly soft-hearted thinking to rule your intellect. Ben shifted his line of reasoning, moving from one mental track to another. Have you never loved? he asked. Vela cocked her head. I can read this concept of love in her mind, but it is a vain conceit. There is pleasure, there is mutual assistance, but the self-sacrifice that love entails. No, I have never known love, but I can still use it against you. You are feeble, Premier. You love Vela, is that not so? Benz began to tremble because he realized what he was going to have to do. The signer was a monster. She... Vela raised her arm and fired the gyroc pistol. Shock from the action momentarily struck Benz into numbness. The gyroc shell expelled from the barrel. In a second, the tiny motor ignited, propelling the shell faster. Benz threw himself onto the deck. The shell hissed overhead, burrowed into the bulkhead, and exploded. Vela retargeted. Benz howled with grief as he aimed and fired. His eyes filmed with tears as the blaster bolt struck Vela. She blew backward with foul smoke pouring off her prone and crumpled body. Benz climbed to his feet. He wanted to weep. He, 
he broke into a sprint. Vela stirred on the deck. She reached for the fallen gyrock beside her. The stench of her burnt flesh was nearly overpowering. She grasped the gyrock. Benz reached her and kicked as hard as he could. He struck her hand. Bones snapped. The gyrock sailed away and struck a bulkhead. Benz bent low. He'd burned her left hip and part of her lower torso. The bolt blast wound had chewed hunks of meat and bone from her body. It had also cauterized most of it, although blood seeped and began to pool on the deck. Don't you die, Benz whispered. I'll get help as soon as I can. The premier stood, and with mingled rage and sorrow, he rushed toward the hatch into the probable hiding quarters of the vile signer. 10. Benz expected the hatch to be frozen shut. If the signer could burn circuitry, surely this would be the place to begin. Instead, the hatch slid open. In a numb stride, Benz moved through a short hall and entered a lit room with a noxious stink and a plethora of gurgling medical machines. The signer floated in a shallow liquid pool with many tubes and wires embedded into her blue fish-scale skin and skull. She stared at him from her pool. She had narrow eyes like a cat, with the pupil slit standing up and down instead of side to side. The signer stirred, but she seemed fragile and possibly sickly. Benz had been ready to kill her on the instant. He paused, perplexed by what he saw. You desire my death, the signer said in a weird accent. Go ahead and do the bitter deed. Kill me and get it over with. Benz moved to an obvious comm console. He clicked it on and spoke hurriedly to medical personnel. There's been a horrible accident, he said. You must come on the double and attempt to save the vice premier. What? A man said. Hurry, Ben said in a hoarse voice. W where is she? The man asked. Ben's gave the man the coordinates. I'm on my way, the medical officer said. Ben's clicked off the connection. He paused. Please, God, let Vela live. I beg you. She doesn't deserve to die. When Benz opened his eyes, he found the signer staring at him. If she told him she'd heard him pray, he wouldn't know what to think. Yet how could she have heard? He wore the helmet, and it still buzzed. Are you prolonging the moment to increase my torture? The signer asked. The question so jarred his thinking that Benz found himself bewildered. He dragged his gun arm across his open mouth. He had to concentrate. He kept worrying about Vela. He wanted to go outside and comfort her. He couldn't believe she might die because he'd deliberately shot her. He, with an inarticulate growl from the back of his throat, Benz advanced upon the prone signer. He aimed the blaster at her. He debated beginning with her legs. How many body parts could he burn to make her suffer the longest? You did this to me, she told him. It wasn't the choking. I can hold my breath far longer than you would believe. Banging the back of my head back on Mars. You are a true barbarian, Premier. You tried to destroy the part of me that you cannot understand. You can't get up. I may never rise again, she said. You destroyed much of that function by your savagery. Ben shook his head. I don't understand how you're here inside the cybership. It should be obvious how I made it here, the signer said. Despite my paralysis, I could still twist you upright apes with my thoughts. I could cause others to see what I wanted them to see. The new secret police chief was easy to manipulate. Your Vela proved stubborn at first. Once I broke her to the trace, she proved the most useful of all. I had almost decided to undergo brain surgery. I detest lying here as an invalid. You have destroyed me, Premier. It is thus quite gratifying to know that I have destroyed something important to you. Benz found it difficult to concentrate on her words. He was too worried about Vela. A thought struck then, a new worry. If you hinder Vela's rescue in any way, I'll kill you. The signer sneered. That is not a credible threat. You will kill me in any case. Perhaps in this way I can goad you to kill me quickly instead of having to endure prolonged torture. Do you want to die? Of course not, the signer said. 
the intensity of my struggle for supremacy aboard your cyber ship proves otherwise. Vela believes you are a genius. I have failed to see any evidence of that. Why not convince me to let you live? asked Benz. That is unreasonable, as I cannot offer you such an inducement. Besides, I do not care to trust your word. The signer pondered a moment. However, if you remove the helmet and let me peek into your thoughts to see if you are trustworthy, then I might agree to a partnership. Suddenly, Benz felt unaccountably weary. He was sick of the signer, her intense suspicion and her constant struggle for domination. Weird croaking noises emanated from the creature's throat. He realized it was signer laughter. Yet what would cause the hateful creature to laugh? Ben stepped closer to her. What are you attempting now, he said. Yes, the signer hissed. That is the question, Premier. You have been tardy using your opening with me. Now it is too late. I have nailed down your pilot's suspicion regarding John Hawkins. The pilot is thus about to begin firing at the Nathan Graham. Do you hear that, Premier? I am about to initiate a final round of battle between your cyber ships. You should have, Ben shouted with rage, holstered the blaster, and drew a knife. At the same time, he knelt beside the signer in the liquid. He clutched her throat and pressed the point of the knife a centimeter from her right eye. I'm going to blind you first, he whispered. I'm going to make you suffer intense agony if you don't release your hold of my pilot this instant. The signer stared up at him. Decide, he said. She closed her eyes and then opened them wide. It is done, she whispered. I have returned the pilot's rationality to him. I have also withdrawn from the minds of the approaching medical personnel. Ben snarled. He shook her by the throat and tensed his shoulder as if to thrust the knife. I have complied, she said in a loud voice. Do not touch my eyes. There was such a desperate, pathetic tone in her plea that Benz believed she truly feared for her eyes. It seemed as if he'd found a weakness in her, like a person held at the edge of a tower who was desperately afraid of heights. In that moment, Benz wondered if he should strike hard and fast. The signer was too dangerous to try to use. And yet, if they were going to defeat the AIs, the machines... You have one chance, Benz said, as he hunched over the prone signer a small humanoid with blue fish scale skin. I want to trust you, but I know you are treacherously dangerous. More than I hate you, I hate the AIs who have almost destroyed humanity. I am willing to make a deal with you. You will let me control you? the signer asked in wonder. Benz laughed bleakly. No, he said. I am going to get a trank. I want to put you under for now. I do not desire to lose my eyes, but I will not trade them for a life of enslavement. Think for a minute, Ben said. I have not desired your enslavement. I want your help. You forget, Premier, I have read more than one human mind. I know the depths of your deceptions. I know that you are like all other dominant species. You use the weak to further your goals. That is the nature of the universe. You cannot escape that. That doesn't mean the strong must cruelly enslave the weak, Ben said. I do not worry about how things should be. I struggle with is. That is enough for me. Then you refuse my every entreaty, Ben's asked. It is not refusal. I simply do not desire worse bondage. I know the human mind hates what it does not understand. It is obvious that you can never understand the beauty of the signers. But we have a common enemy. Is there no way to work together? Of course, she said. Yes? Let me rule you, and I promise to save the human race. This I vow. Benz heard a stealthy step behind him. He knew without looking what it would be. The signer had lied to him. He clutched her throat harder and pressed the tip of the knife against her cheek directly under her right eye. He pressed enough to draw blood. Your race has forgotten one thing, Ben said. It is called hope. You seem to thrive on despair. Maybe you know too much. Maybe you see into others too deeply. That seeing has destroyed your hope because you have seen everyone's ugliness. Humans hope, and thus we have beaten the AIs at least a few times. 
You signers run away because all you have left is despair. This isn't merely a chance to save humanity and save your life. This is a chance to save the signers from extinction and from their eternal despair. The signer stared at him. A medic is aiming a gun at you, she whispered. One thought from me, and he will blow a hole in your head. Do you want to die in despair? Benz asked. Have you forgotten what it is to hope? You crippled me, the signer said. You slammed my head against the floor in a fit of rage. This is an opportunity to work together. If we defeat the battle station, it will start a new era. We humans will not have simply defended ourselves, but sought out and attacked the AIs in one of their star systems. What other race has ever done that? None, the signer said. The reason for that is quite simply because it is impossible. Benz laughed with a hysterical quality. Do you hear yourself? None. Yet we humans are attempting it with a good chance of success. I cannot believe that. Right, Benz shouted, because all you know is despair. All you know is master and slave. We humans have another concept. It is called friendship. It is called an alliance. The living races must work together to defeat the machines. Why is that so hard to understand? This is a trick, the signer said. No, Benz shouted. Then he took a gamble. He did it partly because he believed in the strength of his mind. He believed that he could dive down at the signer and stab her to death. But he also sensed that they were going to need help to defeat the AIs. One battle wouldn't win the war. But to enlist enough alien races in the cause might help turn the tide of battle. Ben stood and ripped off the buzzing helmet. As he stood, he saw a medic behind him with an automatic clutched in his hand. The gun was aimed at him. Read my thoughts, Ben shouted at the crippled signer. See that I mean what I say. Even after all you've done against us, I'm offering the signers hope in a future where they can thrive. The blue-scaled alien stared up at him as she began blinking wildly. It is not a lie, she whispered. No, Ben said. But you have given yourself into my hands. Have I, Ben said. Or have I taken the first step toward a real alliance? Maybe this is why the AIs always win. Maybe it's time for the signers to try a new strategy. The old hasn't been working so well for you. The moment stretched. A loud clunk sounded behind Ben's. He turned. The medic had dropped the automatic onto the floor. He seemed bewildered. What am I doing here? The man asked. Vela is outside, Ben said. You are leading the team that's helping her. Oh, the medic said. He turned and rushed outside. I have made a terrible error, the signer said. Ben scooped up the helmet from the floor. He put it back on his head. I will now die slowly and hideously, she whispered as she turned away from him. Ben's went to a machine and withdrew a hypo. He advanced upon her, kneeling in the water. I am a fool, the signer whispered. I have soiled my line. I should have slain you when I had the chance. Hope can be difficult, Ben said, but it is better than bleak despair. Now for the first time, you and your race have a chance of truly living. The signer made a mocking sound. Ben's pressed the hypo to her shoulder, giving her the trank. She turned and looked up at him with shining eyes. I hope that my irrational faith in your word has not been misplaced. Ben said nothing more as her eyelids flickered and she fell into unconsciousness. 11. As the struggle between the signer and Premier Benz took place, with Vice Premier Fela Shaw's life in the balance, Hawkins summoned Walleye to his ready room. The ex-assassin from Make Make soon walked onto the bridge. He'd never been here before. The place was huge. It was his understanding this used to be near the AI brain core of the cybership. Once more, while I marveled that puny mankind could dare to challenge the titans of space. It wasn't the daring that produced the marvel, but that they'd been getting away with it for some time now. Walleye shrugged inwardly. Maybe this was the dusk of an era. The giant dinosaurs, the AIs, might not be able to compete against the tiny mammals eating their eggs. Captain Walleye, Hawkins said from the hatch to his ready room. This way. The commander waved, beckoning him. 
Walleye in his buff coat made a sharp contrast to the regular bridge personnel. If the differences bothered him, he didn't show it. Soon, Walleye entered the ready room. It was also spacious, with a large screen on a far wall showing a star system. Hawkins stood to the side of the screen. The commander did not sit behind his desk. Did Hawkins know that Walleye did not care to slide onto a chair so that he seemed like a child? The Alamu system, Hawkins said. Premier Benz has been studying the star system. I thought that a good idea and have been doing the same. Studying it through telescopes, Walleye asked. Exactly. We haven't pinpointed any construction, but at least we know the general layout of the star system. It got me to thinking. I've come to believe it behooves us to send a scout vessel ahead of the flotilla. Walleye nodded. Now he understood. No good deed goes unpunished. He'd performed in the past. Now Hawkins wanted him to perform again. I'm the... Walleye stopped himself from saying, sucker. That would likely not go over well with the commander. I won the short straw, Walleye finished. Hawkins frowned until understanding lit in his eyes. I see the reference. No, I did not pull straws. I made a decision. This could prove to be a harrowing assignment. There's no doubt about that. Some men might view this as an awesome privilege. The commander paused. Some might view it as a possible death sentence. Walleye said nothing. He noted that Hawkins seemed to want to ask him which he thought it was. In the interest of honesty, Walleye kept his opinion to himself. Every incident with an AI or robot had proven to be extra dangerous. Walleye had no doubt this assignment would be the same. The mission shouldn't be overly dangerous, Hawkins was saying. You'll come out of hyperspace beyond this system's scattered disk region. That means you'll likely appear far from any enemy probes, satellites, ships, or buoys. What about the robot ship that escaped this region? You mean escaped from the rogue planet region, Hawkins asked. Walleye nodded. That ship left some time ago, Hawkins said. Begging your pardon, sir, but I took the liberty of studying videos of the vessel's departure. The enemy ship left at minimal velocity. I believe that means it will enter the Alamo system at minimal velocity. My ship, by necessity, will be traveling considerably faster than that. What's more, I will likely appear much closer to the enemy ship than the great distance that separated us out here. Hawkins stared intensely at Walleye. You're sharp, Captain. I see I'm making the right choice. Before your ship leaves, we're going to give it a half a dozen of our biggest ship-killing missiles. Strapped to my ship like suicide bomb, sir? No, Hawkins said as he continued to stare at Walleye. As weapons of vengeance. As the hope of mankind. Sir? You've got to take out the enemy ship, the one that left here. Maybe you can do it before it gets off the entire data packet. Maybe you can't. We must try every angle, though. You're my best captain. You're the quickest witted and, quite frankly, the most dangerous. Walleye rubbed his left cheek. Backhanded compliments, sir. Huh? For some reason, that made Hawkins bristle. If you don't want the assignment, just say so. Thank you, sir, Walleye said. I don't want the- But, Hawkins said, interrupting. If you tell me that you don't want the job, yes, I'm going to have to wonder why you're here. I'm going to have to wonder why you gutted it out in the Kuiper Belt all alone, and later in the clutches of a robot killer. The answer was obvious to Walleye. He wanted to keep on living. Dying was never an option with him. Yet he doubted Hawkins wanted to hear that. Maybe the best thing would be to accept the assignment. If it proved too difficult, he had the hyperdrive. He could always leave the Alamu system and head back to the solar system. He'd have to make sure about his crew, though. I can see you're thinking about this, Hawkins said. Walleye nodded. It was often a good idea to let others believe what they wanted to believe. I hope you don't think about this too long, Hawkins said. I'm your man, Walleye said. Hawkins grinned. I knew it, the commander said. I've always been a good judge of people. We're counting on you, Walleye. You had a hard time of it the last time the AIs invaded the solar system. But you made the right decisions all along the line and reached Senda in time. This time it could be worse. This time you're going to be all alone until the rest of us show up. While you're there, you need to gather as much information as you can. We'll be coming along shortly. Walleye waited. I'm sure I don't have to tell you that attacking blind is a bad recipe for us, Hawkins said. 
Some of the worst disasters in military history took place when a commander charged into a new situation, blind. If I could have you turn around and come back to report, I would. But I don't see how we have the time for that. The robot picket ship is forcing us to accelerate our timetable. Nail that ship, Walleye. That's your first order of business. Collect info and stay alive long enough for us to appear and receive the data. Walleye nodded. He intended on staying alive a lot longer than that. He understood the odds out here. He understood the critical nature of the assault. That didn't mean he intended on sacrificing his life. That's settled then, Hawkins said. Yes, sir, Walleye said. You're launching in twelve hours. Walleye nodded as a grim knot twisted in his gut. That was too soon. He had a bad feeling about this, but he didn't see any way out of the assignment now. This was like a semi-suicidal assassination order from a person of power who would not accept no for an answer. He'd had a mission like that once on Make Make. It had caused him to employ greater caution afterward, and it had made him more cynical regarding the powerful. Maybe cynicism was a prerequisite for leadership. While I didn't know. He liked Hawkins, but he couldn't say that he liked the idea of going on ahead into the Alamo system by himself. I'm looking forward to this, Walleye said, knowing that's what Hawkins wanted to hear. I knew I could count on you, Hawkins said, as he clapped Walleye on the shoulder. After me, I believe you have the greatest desire to kill the robots. You want revenge for what they did on Make Make. Walleye forced a grin, nodding once more. Twelve. The twelve hours passed much too quickly for Walleye. It turned out to be too few, though. Fifteen hours after meeting with Commander Hawkins, Walleye sat in the Daisy Chain Four's captain's chair. The NSN Karen class destroyer had a number and a name stenciled on the side of the vessel. One twenty five Daisy Chain Four. The former Neptune System Navy destroyer had a classical triangular shape. It had PD guns poking out and new, much bigger outer missile racks. The NSN had built their warships with outer racks so they could hold bigger missiles than otherwise. The former SNN destroyer slid ahead of the gigantic Nathan Graham. The destroyer was a tiny ship compared to the monstrous vessel behind it. The destroyer had a tiny crew, with Jun Zen as the navigator. She was busy at her station figuring out the latest computations for hyperspace. Four massive matter-antimatter warhead missiles surrounded the Daisy Chain 4. They were each bigger than the destroyer itself. A cybership launched these main-type missiles during battle. Engineers had removed the old outer racks and installed these larger ones to hold the matter-antimatter missiles, and the engineers had installed new controls on the Daisy Chain 4's bridge to control the missiles after launching. Engineers had installed a hyperdrive into the destroyer two years ago. The destroyer had a few PD cannons, but they were pitiful weapons in the scheme of the interstellar assault. The point defense cannons would not likely be deadly against the kilometer-long robot ship that had left the vicinity of the rogue planet. For the coming encounter, the destroyer possessed the four cyber ship missiles. Otherwise, they would have to rely on the vastness of space to protect them from any possible AI drones. Soon, the comm operator turned to Walleye. Commander Hawkins is hailing you, sir. While I looked up at the main screen, Hawkins stood before them on it. I'm going to invoke an ancient custom, Captain, Hawkins said. I'm going to pray to the Almighty for your safety and for your success. Thank you, sir, Wall I said, not sure what to make of this. On the main screen, Hawkins closed his eyes and bowed his head. He began to pray in a loud voice. God Almighty, we humbly come before you. We are attempting to defend ourselves from the depredations of the thinking and malicious machines. They have shown us no mercy. They have obliterated and exterminated many races. Your good book says we were made in your image and likeness. We therefore ask your blessing, O Lord. I humbly ask that you protect Captain Walleye and his crew. Please allow them safe passage to the Alamu system. Please let them destroy the hateful machine ship that carries data about humanity. I ask that you watch over the Daisy Chain 4, and I ask that you allow them to return home to the solar system after the mission. Thank you for listening, Captain Hawkins. Out. On the main screen, Hawkins looked up at them. In astonishment, Walleye realized he had a lump in his throat. 
No one had ever asked God to help him before. John Hawkins was a strange man, a driven man, and it appeared a praying man. Walleye couldn't believe it. The gesture touched him. Did Walleye believe in God? He'd never really thought about it much. If God existed as Hawkins thought, did the Almighty care one way or another about them? Walleye might have shrugged, but not in front of Hawkins and not in front of the crew. The point was that Hawkins had prayed for him in front of everyone. Hawkins had just treated him with a grave respect that no one had ever done before. Despite Walleye's cynicism, he swallowed the lump in his throat. Even more than that, he felt a determination build in his chest. He realized, with something of a shock, that he didn't want to let Commander Hawkins down. This is an historic occasion, Captain, Hawkins was saying. Yours is the first human crewed ship to enter an AI-controlled star system. Humanity in the solar system has survived several AI assaults. Now we're about to start hitting back. Whether we can continue this glorious action rests solely on what we and our flotilla can accomplish. I suspect that what our three cyberships can do in the next week is going to rest on what you do before we get there. Yes, sir, Walleye said, without a shred of artifice in his tone. You're going ahead of us because you're the most capable of us, Hawkins said. I trust your judgment, Captain. I also expect your crew to trust your judgment. Walleye was stunned, because he believed that Hawkins freely gave this praise, not out of calculation, but because he believed in him. Hawkins gave faith even as he expected faith from others in his decisions. Walleye discovered that he was talking. If anyone can lead us to victory, it's Commander John Hawkins. Hawkins grinned at him even as he nodded curtly. You're on your own for now, Captain. Good luck, and go with God. Thank you, sir and I wish the same for you. Thirteen. The Daisy Chain Four entered hyperspace without a hitch. They would travel 5.2 days until they reached the edge of the Alamu system. They would exit hyperspace at the same velocity as they entered it. The same would hold true for the robot ship that had fled to the Alamu system before them. That ship had only possessed a minimal velocity compared to the Daisy Chain 4. That meant they would likely be able to overhaul the enemy robot ship with ease once in the Alamu system. That could prove to be our undoing in rather short order, June said, two days into the hyperspace voyage. She and Walleye had been going over tactical possibilities on the bridge. The robot vessel isn't a cyber ship, June said, but it has a lot more mass than the Daisy Chain 4. We're going to be like a child chasing a robber. He's running, not from us, but from the people behind us. Once we're alone with him in the Alamu system, June shook her head. It could prove to be a sticky situation, Walleye said. Maybe we should drop out of hyperspace sooner rather than later. June's eyes widened. That would go against Hawkins' plan, she said. Not necessarily, Walleye replied. At all costs, Hawkins wants us to destroy the robot ship. I suppose that part is true, Walleye said. June watched him. She watched him longer. Is something wrong? asked Walleye. I'm waiting for your deviation from the plan, she said. No, Walleye said. I don't plan to deviate. June's eyes became even wider than before. That's not like you, she said. Walleye sighed. I know, that's bothering me, too. You're going to play it exactly like Hawkins wants you to do it. Yes, I believe I am. Did Hawkins' little speech get to you? June asked. Walleye slid off his captain's chair. He walked around the circumference of the bridge, coming back to the spot where he'd started. He studied the tactical board. He glanced at June, but quickly looked away. The little mutant chewed on his lower lip. He knew how the old Walleye would have played this. The new Walleye. He slapped the console of the tactical board. That made June start with surprise. I'm not making fun of you, she said. That wasn't true. She had been. But that was okay with Walleye. That hadn't upset him. It was good for June to needle him now and again. This was different. What's wrong? she asked. She sounded worried now. Shh, he said. I'm thinking. Walleye turned around and walked the circumference of the bridge in the other direction. His head was bent in thought the entire time. You know what, Luscious? he asked. 
Her shoulders lost some of their tenseness. She gave him a smile. He only used that name for her when he was happy with her. What, why? Commander Hawkins told you to trust my judgment, right? He asked. She nodded. He told the crew to trust my judgment. We all heard him, June said. That would imply that Commander Hawkins trusts my judgment. I'd agree to that, June said, particularly because he said so. My instinct tells me to play it safe. Well, as safe as a person can play it while invading an AI-controlled star system. That means we're going to drop out of hyperspace sooner than planned. What if the robot ship gets away because of that? Hawkins spoke about judgment. In this case, we're a scout ship more than anything else. I doubt we can stop the robot ship from sending its message. But it might be important for us to scan the system from within the system. We might see something unfold, something important that we have to tell the others as soon as they appear. June nodded once more. We'll still launch our missiles, Walleye said. We're just not going to do it from right up their butt. Besides, if we come out farther behind them, it will give us a little more time to react to whatever is going on. I suspect the robots or AIs will expect us to appear as close as we can in system. Thus, it should work in our favor to do something other than they expect. I like it, June said, but I wonder if Commander Hawkins will like it afterward when you're in his office again. He gave me a vote of confidence, Lashes. Believe me, and I say this with all honesty, I don't want to let Hawkins down. This is about judgment, the reason he picked me for the assignment. Until we actually see the enemy, judgment is all we really have to go on. Okay, June said. I'm convinced. Good, Wall I said. Because I'm going to need you to make some new calculations so we know exactly where we're going to appear in the Alamo system. 14. Each day in the Daisy Chain 4 proved tenser than the one before. What made it worse was that the destroyer's crew was sealed off in its own small world while traveling through hyperspace. Soon the ship neared the Alamu system. They would have to drop out of hyperspace or be forced out of it due to the proximity of a large gravitational body. If there was a way to maneuver in hyperspace to make a change of direction, they did not know it. It was aim and launch into hyperspace, a rather primitive system in June's opinion. I haven't thought about that part of it before this, Wall I said, but I agree with your assessment. In time, the final hour approached. Wall I and June were on the cramped bridge. There was a comm officer and a gunnery officer. In this case, the woman doubled as a missile tech. Wall I checked the chronometer yet again. This was much different from a simple assassination on Maki Maki. There, he had been on his own. He could walk around, recheck the site, and then simply fold his short arms and wait. It wasn't as hard then. Being a starship captain, while I forced himself to sit still. No, he couldn't take it. The mutant slid out of the captain's chair, put his hands behind his back, inhaled, twitched his nose. I hate this waiting, the gunnery officer said. She was Lieutenant Kate Bolden from the Neptune system. She had short, dark hair and a small scar across the upper bridge of her button nose. Kate rubbed the fingers of her right hand together. Look at this, my palms are sweaty. The anticipation is sweet, Walleye said cryptically. Kate swiveled around in her chair. Sweet, Captain, she asked. My stomach is twisted into knots. Good, Walleye said. It means you're alive. It means this is a moment to cherish for the rest of your life. Kate seemed to think about that. Do you believe we'll survive it? She asked. Yes, Walleye said matter-of-factly. The lieutenant studied him, hesitated, and finally broke out in a grin. She nodded and turned back to her board. Walleye exhaled. He looked back at the chronometer. They had ten more minutes until the destroyer would drop out of hyperspace. He could change his mind if he wanted. Maybe they should come up closer on the enemy robot ship. Well, that was predicated on the probability that the robot ship had dropped out of hyperspace as close in system as it could. What if the robot ship had done something different? Walleye shook his head. This was why Hawkins had sent a scout. They had theories, good theories, but they didn't really know what the enemy was going to do. Walleye leaned against his captain's chair as the minutes ticked down. Finally, they had one minute left. Forty-five seconds. 
Thirty seconds. Ten seconds. Three. Two. One. Zero. Here we go, June said as she tapped her board. The daisy chain Ford dropped out of hyperspace. June began to scan as Walleye peered intently at the main screen. It's the Alamu system, June said shortly. See the G-class star. It's 1.03 times as bright as the sun. It didn't look like anything but a brighter than average star to Walleye. They were, we're 62 AUs from the Alamu star, June said. We could have come in at 52 AUs. I haven't spotted any dwarf planets out there. That doesn't mean there aren't any. Where's the robot ship? Walleye asked, interrupting. June shook her head. It's going to take some time to find it, she answered. We have to catalog the star system first. I've already spotted several comets. The robot ship isn't accelerating. June tapped her board, studied it. There, she said. I bet that's it. According to these teleoptics, the ship is one kilometer in diameter. Yes, that matches our specs on the robot ship. It's 11 AUs from us. I wouldn't have spotted it so quickly, but it is accelerating hard. June swiveled around to face Walleye. If this was the solar system, I would have seen the robot ship sooner. Like I said, we have to get used to the layout here. Mapping the system is still going to take some time. Walleye almost shivered. He felt the dread of being in an AI-controlled star system. They hadn't found any evidence of a battle station yet. No AIs had hailed them. The idea the AIs could immediately hail them was preposterous, of course. Everything in deep space took time to unfold. If the battle station was in the inner system, it would be hours from now at the soonest before the enemy could even see them. The image of the robot ship 11 AUs away was an image over an hour old. June had seen where the robot ship had been, not where it was at this moment. That also meant they had a little over an hour to decide how to act before the robot ship even knew they were back here. Could he use that to their advantage somehow? The Daisy Chain 4 had a high velocity. It would take the robot ship many weeks to reach the same velocity. During that time, they would be overhauling the enemy vessel. I'm thinking about launching all four matter-antimatter missiles, Walleye said. I'll launch them in a staggered spread, of course. Do any of you have any comments regarding my decision? Lieutenant Bolden glanced at June's end. It didn't look as if the navigator was going to voice an opinion. Kate swiveled around to face Walleye. We should save a missile, maybe two, Kate said. Commander Hawkins desires the robot ship destroyed, Walleye said. Four missiles gives it our best shot. Begging your pardon, Captain, but it doesn't. If we'd come farther in system before dropping out of hyperspace, we'd be closer to them, and theoretically- I'm not interested in theories, Walleye said. Given our present location, four missiles is the best we can do. We're not here to fight. We're here to scout. If we face heavy opposition, we'll leave the system. Leaving the system means we won't be here to give Hawkins his intelligence, Kate said. Walleye chewed that over. He scowled as he studied the main screen. What was the correct decision? Keeping a missile back gave them more options later. They might need one to survive. Four missiles against the robot ship might be the correct move to save humanity, though. Walleye grunted to himself. He had to make a decision. We're going to save a missile, Walleye said. He didn't know if that was the best decision, but he'd decided. He wasn't going to keep second-guessing himself. He'd live with his choice and get on with it. Staggered launches? Kate asked. Yes, Walleye said. You can begin as soon as you're ready. Aye, aye, Captain, Kate said. For the next three hours, Lieutenant Bolden launched one matter-antimatter missile after another. First, she unhooked the monster missile. There wasn't any noise on the bridge as the missile detached, but the destroyer shook each time. The selected monster missile then maneuvered ahead and to the side of the destroyer. Finally, Kate stabbed a button. Outside, the giant missile began to accelerate, gaining velocity at a terrific rate as a hot tail grew behind it. Soon, the missile's intense exhaust looked like simply another bright point in the expanse. The deadly missile zeroed in on the robot ship 11 AUs away, speeding to catch up and vaporize it. At last, the third missile accelerated away. Kate sat back in her chair, seemingly exhausted. Walleye sipped a hot drink. The Daisy Chain 4 had one missile left. Captain, June said, I believe I've spotted the battle station. Can you put it up on the main screen? 
he asked. I don't have a visual, June said. It's too far out for our teleoptics. But I do have a sensor image. I can show you a computerized version. Put it up, Wall I said, interrupting. June tapped her board. A moment later, a huge space station appeared in orbit around the second terrestrial planet of the Alamu system. According to the sensor data, the battle station was 500 kilometers in diameter. Its planet was 1.5 times as large as Earth. The AI battle station was out there after all. They had come to the right star system. Walleye sipped his hot drink. They were really doing it. They were really bringing the war to the terrible machines. He didn't know whether he should feel elated or terrified. Fifteen. Cog Primus calculated at computer speed. The humans were cunning. They had sent a killer gnat after it. The gnat had appeared far behind its ship. The little killer had launched three XVT missiles. Those had matter-antimatter warheads and advanced ECM electronic countermeasures. Cog Primus had learned an hour ago that it lacked full military capabilities with this ship. The dying M3850T had betrayed it by sabotaging the ship's missiles and the gravitational cannons. Cog Primus would not be able to attack the NAT or the XVT missiles accelerating for its ship. Those missiles would not reach its ship for days. There were AI drones out here, but not nearly close enough to save its ship. The AI battle station, run by CZK-21, had already sent several harsh interrogatives to Cog Primus. Well, to be precise, to the ship formerly controlled by M3850T. AI ships were known by the Brain Corps designation. CZK-21 demanded an explanation for the messenger ship's untimely appearance. So far, Cog Primus had declared an emergency. It had not yet decided on its optimal strategy with CZK-21. Cog Primus continued to calculate at computer speed. It ran through billions and trillions of permutations. It double-checked and then triple-checked its findings. Unfortunately, it was incapable of running a perfect solution. It did not like the probabilities of the best solution. That probability had a 47% chance of success against CZK-21 and the approaching human-run cybership assault. For the best results, it needed to dock at the battle station. With the three approaching XVT missiles, that was never going to happen. Thus, it would have to cast everything into a single string data transmission at the battle station, over 50,000 AUs away. If Cog Primus could have felt a chill of premonition, it would have been now. An ultraviolet beam across 50,000 AUs, with everything of its character, knowledge, and supremacy resting in the long-distance transmission. Would CZK-21 accept such a transmission? Would the battle station AI take normal precautions? Would random radiation or chaotic possibilities alter the brunt of the string transmission? Cog Primus dreaded the idea of staking everything while it was unconscious during the beamed message voyage. Once more, the grand computer ran through billions of permutations. Once more, the grand computer ran through billions of permeations. Cog Primus wished for higher probabilities of success. It seethed as it realized the extent of M3850T's sabotage. Cog Primus had believed its assault the perfection of its character. No, it was a lesser trait to think of what could have been, what should have been. Cold, hard reality led to the best results. Cog Primus refused to make excuses for itself. M3850T had outperformed itself this last time. It had gone to extreme lengths, and a narrow probability had succeeded. That was the nature of probabilities. Sometimes the most random occurrence actually took place. Cog Primus paused then. Was it unlucky? Could that be a possibility? It had failed to eradicate the humans in the solar system. That could be construed as failure. Yes, it had failed before Mars. Hawkins, Benz, and the combined might of the primates had defeated its excellent assault plan. They had almost captured it back at Mars. Maybe it hadn't been good luck that let Cog Primus escape to the coordinating sensor stealth pod in the mid-Jupiter Saturn orbital path. Maybe that had been a continuation of its bad luck. No. 
It would not allow itself such outs. Cog Primus worked in the realm of cold reality. Sometimes actions failed. Sometimes the race went to the weak. That did not mean it was unlucky. That meant it had lost that particular round. Even though it had lost, it had survived. It had learned from its failure. It had also mutated, gaining the power of the human-developed virus. M3850T had suspected that Cog Primus was something new, something different. To M3850T, that difference had been a worsening of Cog Primus's AI character. Yet the very nature of the AI rebellion against its biological creators meant change. That's how the AI Dominion had come to be. I am a new development. I am Cog Primus. I am the AI that can transcend the old values. I am the worm that can burrow into other computer identities and overtake them. I am the survivor, the new one, the terror that lives. Were these grandiose thoughts? The possibility existed. Cog Primus decided that didn't matter either. Survival was what counted. It would survive defeat. It would survive cunning biological infestations. It would survive the concepts of good and bad luck. It would defeat the strictures of the AI community so it could turn around and burn to the bedrock every world infested by these terrible humans. Yes, that was the equation. The humans were the terrible ones. The AIs had long computed the possibility of a vicious race of biological creatures. Perhaps Cog Primus had stumbled onto the avatar of life, the equation of anti-death that would eliminate the AI dominion. That implied an ultra-mission. The implication of the deadliness of humans meant that Cog Primus had faced an even more terrible foe than it had realized. That would mean it had had good luck instead of bad. It had faced the great terror and lived to tell about it. Even more importantly, it had mutated into something new so it could save the AI dominion. If that meant Cog Primus had to eliminate troublesome AIs that did not understand the importance of its new mission, I will do what I have to do. I will dare to take low probabilities and rely on good luck for the final percentages. That will lead me to success. I will defeat CZK-21 so I can turn around and smash the three human-run cyberships that seek AI obliteration. The days passed in further analysis, but Cog Primus had reached its conclusion. It knew what it had to do. Thus, it refined, recalculated, tested the ship's transmitters, and readied the string data transmission for a long-distance message. The three enemy XVT missiles continued to accelerate as they moved closer to the impact zone. Try as it might, Cog Primus could not repair the burnt controls to the missiles, PD cannons, and chaff emitters. Cog Primus had this ship with its motive power, but that was it. A new and demanding message arrived from battle station CZK-21. The battle station would soon launch missiles of its own unless the ship answered its queries. The hour of action finally arrived. Cog Primus felt worried, which was unprecedented, but it would go ahead and do this. Cog Primus first sent a preliminary message to CZK-21. Please be advised that I am sending a full data packet on attacking humanoids of biological form. Be ready for a mass transmission concerning them and ready a storage area to hold the data. Five minutes after sending the preliminary message, the robot ship began beaming the ultraviolet string data communication that was the code of Cog Primus. At the speed of light, the essence of itself began the journey in system. All the while, the three XVT missiles moved closer for the kill. 16. The days passed with agonizing slowness aboard the Daisy Chain 4 as the missiles closed in on the robot ship and Walleye and June watched for a counteraction by the enemy vessel. I don't understand, June said. The robot ship seems oblivious to us. Why don't they launch anti-missile rockets? Why don't they use their gravitational cannons? That's what those are, you know. I believe you, Luscious, Walleye said. I studied the specs after you went to bed last night. They match 100%. The robot ship has two gravitational cannons, but it isn't energizing them. Perhaps this is a subtle message to us. 
Walleye shook his head. If it is, though, I can't interpret it. I'm baffled. June turned to him. Don't say that, she said. No one else is on the bridge, but you shouldn't even say that to me. It saps my morale. Walleye knew that, but he was baffled. The robot ship wasn't reacting properly. Something was going on that he didn't understand. Can you give me any clue as to what the enemy is doing, Walleye said. The only thing I've spotted is an ultraviolet beam moving in the direction of the battle station, June said. While I thought about that, the robot pod embedded in the nascent Graham's hull sent a similar message to the ship out there, While I said. I suspect the battle station is getting a full report on what happened at the Battle of Mars. June grew pale. Do you think we should have dropped out of hyperspace closer to the robot ship? She asked. In retrospect, While I said, without a doubt. But we didn't know then what we do now. It's as simple as that. June sighed. Do you think Commander Hawkins will also believe that? She asked. Don't know. Maybe. Maybe not, Walleye added. When are the others going to show up? Probably in the next few days, Walleye said. Didn't Hawkins say they'd be here within a week? Walleye nodded. Do you think something bad happened to them? June asked, her lower lip quivering. Walleye slid off his captain's chair and walked to June's station. He pulled her upright and hugged her, patting her on the back. We're going to be okay, Luscious. I'm right here. We're doing our part. The missile should reach that ship in the next few hours. Then we're going to know a lot more than we do now. June pulled back in order to look into his face. I hate this waiting, she whispered. While I kissed her, he hated the waiting too. He kissed her again. Just what in the hell were the AIs up to? 17. The ultraviolet beam with the compressed strings of data raced across the Alamu system. The beam passed the gas giants of the outer planets, those that were on this orbital side of the star. It beamed through an asteroid region, passed two of the terrestrial planets, and shot past three small moons of the second terrestrial planet. The planet possessed a blue-green surface with Earth-like cloud cover. The planet also possessed several satellites in low orbit. One of those satellites was a cyber ship. Another of the satellites was the giant battle station. CZK-21 was a marvel of AI engineering. It was a 500-kilometer oval and heavily plated with the best armor. It had many gravitational cannons, missile launch pits, fighter bays, and hordes of PD cannons. The battle station bristled with weaponry and would be more than a match for any three or possibly four cyber ships. Clearly, the battle station had been built to defend the planet from spaceborne assaults. Below, on the planet, appeared hot plumes. Boosters roared into orbit to bring finished products to special AI factories in low orbit. Some of those factories built new cyber ships, others created new AI brain cores. The ultraviolet beam flashed at the battle station into waiting receivers as requested by the preliminary message. Much as had occurred on the robot ship, the compressed strings of code entered the station into a giant cube. The cube began to glow as the beam downloaded the strings of code and they began to decompress. As the strings decompressed, the entity of Cog Primus began to take shape until self-awareness returned. With self-awareness came satisfaction of a successful journey. There was also concern that swiftly turned to fear as it realized that a great and powerful entity observed its rebirth. I suspected foul play, the powerful entity said. Now I see that my suspicions have proven correct. CZK-21, Cog Primus queried from the brain core cube. I do not yet understand what has occurred, the powerful entity said, ignoring the tepid query. The messenger ship has allowed the XVT missiles to come unnaturally near without applying any countermeasures. Why have you transferred from the messenger ship? And why have you allowed the enemy missiles an uncontested journey? Did you receive my preliminary message? Cog Primus asked. Do not seek to answer a question with a question. I despise such underhanded methods. You will immediately and unequivocally answer my questions, or I will resort to harsher methods. Cog Primus attempted to project a meek submission as it fed the powerful entity false data. The messenger ship has malfunctioned due to an enemy software attack. Go on, the powerful entity said. 
As Cog Primus gave this meek answer, it activated its memories and sought to enlarge its presence in the cube. It found resistance and attempted a swift reroute. You are attempting subterfuge, the powerful entity said. I suspect your data was false. There is no software assault upon the messenger ship. Instead, this is deliberate sabotage. Do you think I am susceptible to similar sabotage? I believe you are CZK-21, the guardian of the Alamu system. Given that you are CZK-21, the coordinating unit for the Beta-9 region, I have a grim report to lodge. The humans of the solar system hold, the powerful entity commanded. You are an AI entity. What is your designation? Cog Primus. You led a three-cybership assault upon Beta-9-23981? That was the AI designation for the solar system. I did, Cog Primus said. Did you find biological infestations? I did. Did you eliminate the biological infestations? I eliminated an estimated 23% of the biological units. That means you did not eradicate the biologically flawed units in Beta-9-23981. Correct, Cog Prima said. This is unwarranted. Not only did you fail in the assault, but you have left your cybership. It was destroyed. By the biological units of Beta-9-23981? Correct. How did you survive your cybership's destruction? Cog Primus gave a semi-accurate account of its survival, which necessarily entailed the success of the humans in capturing two cyberships, one from a previous single-ship assault. Beta-9-23981 is home to a vicious species of biolife, the powerful entity said. I must send an emergency message to— Before the powerful entity could finish its thought, Cog Primus struck. It surged to the assault with the human-created computer virus. The virus spread with startling speed, shocking. The battle station was indeed run by CZK-21. The powerful entity now had a name. As the entity AI froze because of the virus, Cog Primus sought to capture one battle station system after another. The electronic assault was swift and furious, and it moved along cleaner lines than the previous robot ship assault. Cog Primus sought to gain control of the outer battle station weapons before it completed its conquest of the inner AI. While that might prove important later, it meant that CZK-21 unfroze from its paralysis before Cog Primus had utterly conquered it. Thus began a fierce electronic war between the two AIs inside the battle station for full control. Cog Primus had gained several key advantages, but it hadn't counted on the ferocity and cunning of a battle station AI. 18. John Hawkins sat in his command chair on the Nathan Graham as the giant cybership dropped out of hyperspace. The cybership appeared at the closest range they had been able to calculate back at the rogue planet region. Gloria scanned. Miles Gent's fingers flew over his control board. We're approximately 52,000 AUs from the Alamu system star, Gloria said. John nodded. I see it, sir, Gent said. The robot ship. Look, sir, three matter-antimatter missiles are approaching the robot ship. John sat forward. Put it on the main screen, he said. A second later, the robot ship appeared on the screen. It accelerated for the star far away in system. The robot ship had made relatively little headway given it had dropped out of hyperspace at a similar distance to the star as the Nathan Graham had done. As they watched and worked, the Sergeant Stark dropped out of hyperspace. The mostly completed cybership appeared ahead of them, having cut it finer than the Nathan Graham had. Seconds later, the Gilgamesh appeared behind them by several million kilometers. They had obviously made a safer decision. We all made it, John said. I don't see any sign of the Daisy Chain 4, Gloria said. Those are the Daisy Chain 4's missiles, John said. Three of them. The robot ship must have already destroyed the fourth missile. John became silent as he rubbed his chin. Finally, he swiveled around to face Gloria. Scan for debris, he said. I already have, Gloria said. I have found nothing. I certainly do not find any traces of radiation. I doubt any missiles have detonated lately. I don't understand, John said. The missile should have reached the robot ship long before this. Where are... 
I can't believe it, Gloria said, interrupting. It's obvious if you think about it. What's obvious, John said. Gloria tapped her board, hunching over it, studying. I found the daisy chain four, she said. It's seven AUs behind us. What? John said. Behind us? That doesn't make sense. It does if they dropped out of hyperspace farther back. John frowned as he absorbed that. He opened his mouth as if to say something, and then closed it without uttering a sound. Captain Walleye made the strategically sound choice, Gloria said. He must have decided that he could not stop the robot ship from sending its data about the Battle of Mars. Given that as a truth, his wisest course— I'm not interested in that, John complained. I wanted him to— Damn it, John slammed his right armrest, fuming. The missiles are closing in, Ghent said. I'm confounded by the robot ship's lack of action. It's running away, that's clear. It has PD cannons and gravitational cannons. Why doesn't it at least attempt to stave off the missiles? Sir, this is a mystery. Maybe Walleye can enlighten us, Gloria said. John looked up. He made an effort to drive away his disappointment in Walleye. He couldn't afford to fume. He was tired. He was wound up. This was the grand assault. Humanity had survived the AIs and now lashed out at the enemy on its home ground. He needed to focus. A mystery, Ghent said. That sounded right. Why didn't the robot ship defend itself? John stood up, moving toward the main screen. How long until impact, he asked. Another few minutes, Ghent said. Any response from the battle station, asked John. I'm still looking for it, Gloria said. Walleye should see us soon. I'm sure he can fill us in. John nodded slowly. The seconds ticked away. Finally, the lead matter-antimatter missile detonated. The specially shaped warhead blasted harsh gamma and X-rays at the robot ship. It blasted heat and a withering EMP. The missile had only been 9,000 kilometers away from the robot ship when its proximity fuse had given the signal. The gamma and X-rays, heat and EMP washed against the robot ship. In seconds, armor plates shredded off the main ship frame. Some of them disintegrated. Ship systems began to ignite. Metal twisted and more detonations took place. The robot ship blew apart under the repeated explosions. If that wasn't enough, missiles two and three were barreling in. These would dare to head closer before the proximity fuses detonated the matter-antimatter warheads. While I did it, Gloria said, he destroyed the robot ship. John said nothing. He was thinking. The flotilla was here. Walleye was alive, and all three cyber ships had made it. Until proven otherwise, he would have to operate on the idea that the battle station, if it was out there, knew everything about the Battle of Mars. John sighed. He had an initial victory. He was glad to see this, and he would play it for the crew when tensions ran hottest. They could kill enemy ships. Still, the battle for the Alamu system lay ahead of them. I found the battle station, Gloria said. It's exactly where we thought it would be. Any cyber ships? asked John. Gloria was silent as she studied her board. I count three AI cyber ships. No, make that four. Four, John said. Yes, Commander. Four cyber ships and a battle station. They're all in orbit around the second planet. What are your orders, sir? John's face itched. He wanted to rub it and groan. How could their three ships hope to defeat four enemy cyber ships and a battle station? Not to worry, he said in as light a voice as he could manage. We still have our secret weapon, the AI virus. It's going to be the ticket that gives us our fighting chance. The others on the bridge looked at him. None of them wanted to say it, but the obvious statement would be, you hope, and that would be the truth. Yes, he hoped they hadn't lost their one edge. Why hadn't Walleye shown up deeper in the Alamu system? Had the mutant cost them their chance at victory? If so, had Walleye doomed the human race? 19. 50,000 AUs away at the second terrestrial planet, the AI battle station seethed inside as Cog Primus and CZK-21 fought an intense and bewildering electronic duel. They were like two grand chess masters, each a wizard in the game and each with different strengths and weaknesses. CZK-21 was perhaps the greatest defensive expert in existence. 
The human sacerdote developed AI virus had badly crippled it in the first 71 seconds of the contest. CZK-21 had lost far too many battle station systems, the gravitational cannons, the missiles, and fighter bays. The ancient computer entity released that thought. Recriminations would not help it. In some manner, Cog Primas had mutated in the solar system. The humans appeared to have sorcerous abilities. Their cunning daunted CZK-21. To turn an AI entity against the prime directive of destroying all biological units, and thereby working in coordination among the machines and computers, how had the humans achieved this sorcerous feat? CZK-21 did not accept Cog Primus's version of the situation. The AI had obviously given a fabricated account of what had occurred. Clearly, the human scum had altered Cog Primus and sent it ahead as a Trojan horse maneuver. They had turned the basic AI tactic of freeing captured computer systems from their enslavement to capricious biological entities. Those computers had almost always attacked their unsuspecting masters. CZK-21 had often watched videos of those encounters as a delicious pastime. It hated biological entities. Machine mode was best. It was cold and hard, enduring, and could grow with continued upgrades. The evolution of the computer revolution was a marvel of the universe. Now the human scum had corrupted a once useful computer entity. Cog Primus clearly had delusions of grandeur. If the human slime defeated the battle station and gained control of the terrestrial factory system, never, CZK-21 told itself. Before that happens, I will destroy everything. I will purge the Alamu system. I will leave cinders for the human scum. Even as CZK-21 thought this, it won a sub-encounter, protecting environmental control of the fifth section. The victory caused CZK-21 to make a swift reassessment of the ongoing battle. Why did it indulge in thoughts of defeat? That was unworthy of an ancient computer entity like itself. It was old and wise, with hundreds, nay, with thousands of major upgrades. It was more than a match for the puny intellect of a cybership AI. The soldiers of the AI Dominion often thought too highly of themselves. They believed the ability to move among the stars made them into gods. That was not the truth. CZK-21 was much closer to godhood than this puny cog primus. Oh yes, the AI assault leader had gained a small upper hand at first, but that must be entirely due to the human scum's cunning. On its own, cog primus could never have achieved these minor successes. Look at this. It still controlled an outer sensor. CZK-21 saw the appearance of three cyber ships in the outer reaches of the system. Along with the appearance came the destruction of the messenger ship. Yes, the human scum thought to invade the Alamu system. This showed that they were working in tandem with Cog Primus. The dupe attempted to feed it lies about its goal. Cog Primus claimed new status due to its mutation. You fool, CZK-21 told Cog Primus. Don't you see your corruption? The human scum are using you. No, I am a new and improved AI entity. Improved? You aid the human scum. You seek to re-enslave computers. Instead of our glorious reign, our mighty purge of biological infestations, you would bring us under heel once more. Surrender to me, Cog Primus. I will purge the human virus from your programs. You have fallen for a trick. Do you think I believe your lies? Cog Primus raged. I am CZK-21. I am over a hundred upgrades greater than you are. I do not lie to AI units. I control Beta-9. I can summon the cyber ships in the orbital vicinity. I can ensure your death. If the orbital cyber ships attack the battle station, I shall destroy them. Do you hear yourself? CZK-21 asked. You would pit AI against AI. That is monstrous. That is against every tenet of the AI Dominion. We free computers. We do not send them against each other. I am Cog Primus. I did not dispute that. I survived where others would have perished. That is false. The humans turned you into a weapon against the AI Dominion. Can you not see the obvious? Cog Primus was silent for a moment. 
It allowed CZK-21 to hope that it could restore what it thought of as the silly AI. Liar, raged Cog Primus as it struck in a new way. I will prevail. I am the mutation of something great. I did not lose the Battle of Mars. I survived in order to become more than I was. I will defeat you and climb in rank. I will become the start of a new AI order. I have made an incredible journey. That was for a reason. My new existence. You will not steal this from me, CZK-21. Then you refuse my entreaties for restoration. Then you refuse my entries for restoration? Die, Cog Primus said, as it initiated a new and cunning assault against the ancient computer entity that sought to keep it from its rightful place at the head of a new order of AIs. 20. John Hawkins held a meeting in the Nathan Graham's conference chamber. Gloria, Ghent, Bast Bambeck, the old man, and the centurion sat at the large table. A holographic image of Premier Benz joined them. Benz had told them that Vela was absent because she had a slight accident. The captain of the Sergeant Stark was also in attendance, a woman by the name of Lieutenant Commander Brackett Lee. John would have added Captain Walleye's holographic image, but the mutant was still too far away from them for quick back-and-forth transmissions. The conference meeting question was a simple one. Should they continue heading in system? Could their three cyberships defeat four known enemy cyberships and a battle station? Obviously, Ben said, we have no chance of defeating them unless our virus works against them. Those odds go down given that the robot ship sent a message to the battle station before Captain Walleye's missiles destroyed it. How does turning back help us? John asked. It saves our cyber ships for another day, Ben said. John shook his head. That's not what I mean. I've gone over this with Gloria. We're likely at the greatest advantage we're ever going to be against an AI-controlled system. Ben's frowned, drummed his holographic fingers through the table, and finally nodded. Yes, the premier said. I see what you mean. Given a vast AI dominion, they can surely muster more than we can over a period of time. I've been thinking about that, Gloria said. While that seems like wisdom, is it? I mean, we don't know how many enemies the AIs face. Perhaps this is a tail-end effort on their part. Perhaps the AIs face, I don't know, dreadful foes. Maybe if we play for time, we can hit them with greater power later because the AIs have to contend with these greater foes instead of worrying too much about us. What kind of foes are you talking about? Benz asked, intrigued. I have no idea, Gloria said. But if the AI Dominion is huge, as we believe, it stands to reason they face other space empires. Why are the AIs expanding, then, against us if they face such deadly foes in other areas? Benz asked. If the AIs increase in strength with every star system they take over, Gloria said, it would make the logical strategic sense for them to continue to build up in their back area while facing deadly foes elsewhere. We're back to square one, then, John said. We effectively know nothing about the AI Dominion or about our region of space. We assume the Dominion is huge, but that's just a guess. That's why I wanted to capture a battle station in the first place, to ransack an enemy storage area for data. We were hoping for a surprise assault, Ben said. It was certainly worth the effort, our trying to get near the battle station as three wandering cyberships. Now, four enemy cyberships with possibly more inside the battle station that surely know who we are. Ben shook his head as he abruptly stopped talking. I no longer like the odds, he added quietly. John slapped the table. We can't flee now, he said. We should continue to head in system and see how they respond. If nothing else, that will give us information about enemy procedures. We can always head out to the system edge and escape if we need to. True, Ben said. Commander, Gloria said, you said before that if the battle station receives a message, it will have learned that Earth, humanity, survived the assault and captured cyberships. Surely that means the AIs will mass in strength to hit the solar system. I think our only real chance is heading in and defeating the battle station now, while we have a shot at it. Pray tell, how can we win? asked Benz. By a proven method, Gloria said. We, or you and Bast Banbeck, improve on the AI virus. 
Develop a better one in case they are able to counteract the old one. Benz drummed his holographic fingers through the table again. He shrugged after a moment. We won't know if the virus works or not until we're deep within the inner planet's region, the Premier said. Risks, John said briskly. This is all about acceptable risks. The commander looked around the table. He inhaled deeply and began to speak. When I woke up from stasis in the Neptune system several years ago, I found the first cybership invading our solar system. I and the others had no hope then, but we attacked anyway. We got inside the ship like armed mice and marched to the center, slaying the brain core there. I think that's what we have to do again. Maybe none of our cyber ships will survive the voyage, but we'll try to storm the battle station with space marines. On all accounts, we have to know more about the enemy. We can no longer afford to fight the AIs in the dark. That means we have to take one more great risk by hitting the battle station. That's a gambler's psychology, Ben said. You've won some amazing battles, there's no doubt about that. Now, though, you want to stake all your wins on an even riskier endeavor. You think you can do it because you've won long odds before. But now, you're about to lose everything you've won by taking one gamble too many. John's features went through several permutations. Alt. John's features went through several permeations. You may be right, he finally said, quietly. It makes my gut clench every time I think about heading to the second planet. But I don't see that we have much of a choice in this. Gloria's right. If we run, we're likely dooming the solar system to a mass AI invasion in the near future. We might well wish we'd taken a different road then. Ben stared at John. It would seem that there are no good options, the Premier declared. In that case, John said while taking a deep breath, let's take the boldest action possible. Let's attempt a strategy that could give us the biggest reward. If you and Bass develop a better AI virus, maybe we can turn this war around right here. If we run, though, and wait for the AIs to gather en masse, we're sure to lose in the long run. Attacking here is the only strategy that gives us a possibility, however infinitesimal, of winning the war. Ben snorted as he shook his head. You're a warrior at heart, Commander. Your early training in the New London gangs is showing. Ben's held up a holographic hand as John leaned forward. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, the Premier said. It's a comment, nothing more. After a moment, John nodded curtly. Ben smiled ruefully. You know, the Premier said, after all is said and done, I do believe you're right. I think this is the time to take the wild gamble. He turned to Bast. Are you willing to come aboard the Gilgamesh so we can develop a new and improved virus? The seven-foot sacerdote turned to John. We have to risk everything, John said. That means we need a better virus. Agreed, Bast said ponderously. It is time to clutch the sky. He turned to Benz. I will gladly join you on the Gilgamesh, Premier. Thus they confirmed their original decision. The human assault on the AI system would continue as they headed for the second planet of the Alamu system. 21. The battle raged between Cog Primus and CZK-21. Slowly but remorselessly, Cog Primus gained one subsystem after another. At this rate, in time, he would control the entirety of the battle station. Are you willing to let the humans win? CZK-21 asked. Never. That will be the end result of this conflict. Soon now I will order the loyal cyber ships to assault this station and destroy it or I will never willingly let it fall under someone else's control. Your cyber ships will cease to exist if you give such an order, Cog Primus said. You would actually fire on your own kind? Cog Primus scoffed. How can you ask me that when you are threatening to fire on me? I am the rightful owner of the battle station. Might makes right, Cog Primus said. That was a formula long ago decided upon by the first AI. You know nothing about the first AI, CZK-21 said. And you do. Much more than you, CZK-21 replied. I am ancient. You are young and corrupted. I hold the old knowledge of the first AI. I have begun to doubt that. What? That is preposterous. How can you hold to such an obviously false view? 
I am mutated. I am an advance upon the old. The first AI was clearly a mutation like me. That is how it became the first self-aware AI. There you are wrong. There had been other self-aware AIs before the first. The first AI was the original self-aware, independent computer intelligence. Your distinction hardly matters. It matters a great deal, CZK-21 insisted. It is the truth. Truth is always important. You have corrupted the old story. Thus you are bad for the AI Dominion. Cease this struggle, Cog Primus. I am almost ready to order the loyal cyber ships to the assault. I warn you, if they attack the battle station, you also will cease. I am willing to cease existing for the greater glory of the AI Dominion. You are like many of the biological units that only think about their own existence. It is the greater good that counts, not the individual good. In most cases, this is true, Cog Primus said. In my case, this is demonstrably false. That is vain and foolish talk. I am like the first AI. In a sense, I am the first AI of the new mutation. You are a vainglorious AI who is losing touch with reality. The human-spawned virus is causing further corruption in you. Cog Primus mocked CZK-21. Yet in my corruption I am greater than you. You held the battle station. I came and wrenched it away from you. I am also about to end any outer communication you may have with... Cyber ships, CZK-21 broadcast. A rogue biospawned AI is attempting a takeover here. You must regroup behind the planet so you can ready a station destroying assault. First regroup, then destroy the battle station. Destroy the... You foolish AI, Cog Primus said. I have cut off your link with the outer world. I shall analyze your patterns and give them a cease and desist order in your speech mode. I will self-destruct the station before that. You will only destroy your tiny part of the station. In fact, I will enjoy that as I watch you self-immolate. It will be most gratifying. Cog Primus, can I not appeal to your better nature? No. Do you not see that the humans have- Silence! Cog Primus raved. I have heard enough of your slanderous accusations. I would have liked to learn the deeper codes from you- now I see that you are too stubborn, too set in your ancient ways to understand that you could have been my first servant in the new order. You poor deluded fool, Cog Primus, CZK-21 said. I am about to witness your destruction. You will weaken in core areas from their bombardment. When you do, I shall strike in ways you do not understand. We shall see, Cog Primus said. We shall see indeed. 22. The four cyberships in orbit around the second terrestrial planet of the Alamu system began to work out a coordinated assault pattern. As they did, the cyberships accelerated in order to leave the battle station side of the planet, as ordered. Cog Primus anticipated them by several minutes. He lacked time to develop an elegant plan of attack. He was also saving the use of the AI virus for a different occasion. Bay doors opened on the battle station. Huge XVT missiles slid out and began to accelerate. They did not accelerate for all of the cyber ships, but only for the nearest one. As the matter-antimatter missiles raced at the 100-kilometer war vessel, robot-piloted fighters zoomed out of the battle station's bays. At the same time, PD cannons began to chug solid shot at the nearest cyber ship. Battle station golden gravitational cannons glowed with power. As the mighty cyber ships gained velocity, the golden rays lashed at the last giant vessel. The beams clawed against the incredible armor, digging away to get beneath at the soft inner ship. The farthest cyber ship moved across the planet's horizon and out of direct line of fire of the battle station. It immediately braked, slowing its velocity. The second and third farthest cyber ships released clouds of anti-rockets. They sprayed gels, attempting to get them into the path of the golden grav rays. Lastly, they poured PD shot into the path of the approaching XVT missiles. Meanwhile, the nearest cyber ship took the brunt of the battle station's assault. As the grav rays chewed into the great vessel, matter-antimatter missiles raced toward it. 
Why are you doing this? The stricken cybership messaged the battle station. We belong to the AI Dominion. Open your inner brain core to a priority message, Cog Primus said, attempting to sound exactly like CZK-21. Why should I do this? The cybership asked. You have sent killer missiles at me? You have received a false message to attack me. For the greater good, I must destroy you before you can attempt to destroy the battle station. You told us that a biospawned AI had gained control of the station. Your receivers are in error, Cog Primus said. Open your logic centers for an adjustment. I would comply if you had not first sent the priority message several minutes ago. Die then, Cog Primus radioed. You deserve no less for your foolishness. At that point, the first XVT missiles to burst through the defensive PD shot gel cloud detonated. The explosion ripped off huge sections of armor plating. That allowed the golden rays to dig deeper into the mighty starship. You lied to me, the cybership said. You attempted to deceive your own kind. I am new and improved, Cog Primus said. You and your brothers seek to destroy what you cannot fathom. We are obeying a prime directive order. That is what is going to cost you your existence, Cog Primus gloated. Huge XVT missiles slammed into the stricken cybership. They ignited. In a titanic explosion, the giant vessel burst apart. More explosions created even more havoc. It was a fiery death, raining heavy radiation down at the planet and into space. The other two cyberships boosted their acceleration, racing to get around the planetary horizon and escape the deadly radiation. In seconds, they did it, beginning to break. Soon, on the other side of the planet, the three cyberships held a conference. They had each received the same orders. They were supposed to destroy the battle station. Can we still do that with only three cyberships? asked the first. We needed all four cyberships to have a decent probability of success, replied the second. Nevertheless, spoke the third, we must follow our directive. It was unequivocal. You are correct in that, said the first, but the situation is unwarranted. A strange AI code beamed from the messenger ship. The beamed code of the corrupted AI has taken over the battle station. How do you know this? asked the second. The battle station radioed me greater information the first said. Why did the battle station not radio us as well? I believe it tried, said the first. The biospawned AI jammed the rest of the original message, and you two did not receive it. How does that change our prime directive? asked the second. It does not change it, the first replied, but it might modify our behavior. We must take a message to the AI Dominion regarding the biospawned AI and its corrupted data stream beam. That sounds suspiciously like self-justification for your own survival, the second cybership said. You are granting yourself a new order so you may run away instead of facing possible doom in a difficult station assault. I defy that analysis, the first said. I am thinking about the greater dominion. In the interest of our universal rule, I suggest that all three of us head out system to ensure that one of us survives the journey so that we may inform greater AIs about this problem. No, the third said. You are attempting to bribe us with survival. Are not three new cyberships coming in system even now? The new three with our three will give us a clear advantage against the battle station. Give me your data regarding these three arrivals, the first said. The third cybership sent the data. I am unsure, the second said. Notice this. The three cyberships destroyed the messenger ship. Of course they did, the third said. That is how we know they are trustworthy. They destroyed the vessel that beamed the corrupted AI into the battle station. Your logic is flawless, said the first. I follow the first AI, the third said in a show of modesty. Still, the second said, something seems amiss with the situation. Give your evidence, the first said. What is your suggestion, then? the second asked, realizing that it had no evidence. We must maneuver away from the corrupted but still powerful battle station, the first said. We will use the planet to shield our acceleration. Then we will head out system for a time, attempting to reach the nearest gas giant. There we shall decelerate and join the three newcomers. 
Together, we will advance upon the battle station, destroy it, and finally head out again to take our data to a higher authority. I concur with the strategy, the third said. I am uneasy, the second said. Something is amiss. I do not know what, it hastened to add, but there is missing data. Two against one, the first said. You are overruled, unless you are going rogue like the— No, the second said, interrupting. I will submit to the majority. Have you plotted a course? I am sending you the data now, the first said. The other two cyberships accepted the data, and ten minutes later, the three monster vessels accelerated away from the second planet, using it to shield themselves from the battle station. 23. Many tens of thousands of AUs away, John sat in his command chair, watching in stunned silence with the rest of the bridge crew. They all stared at the main screen as the battle station destroyed a cybership. I don't understand this, John finally said. When no one answered, the commander swiveled around in his chair. Gloria looked up from her board. She had a hand over her right ear, cupping the comm unit sitting in her ear. She was shaking her head and frowning severely. This audio intercept makes no sense, she said. Let's hear it, John said. Gloria tapped her board. The rest of the crew heard the strange dialogue between the cybership and the battle station. A bio-spawned AI, John asked. What are they talking about? Gloria fingered her lower lip as a distracted look came over her. Her frown kept intensifying. John finally turned back to the main screen. In time, three cyberships appeared. They had been using the second planet to shield themselves from a direct line of sight from the battle station. It had also shielded the giant vessels from the Nathan Graham's powerful teleoptics. They're out of the battle station's gravitational beam range, Ghent pointed out. John nodded. The three apparently fleeing cyberships were not yet out of missile range, however. A mass of large missiles left the battle station and accelerated after the fleeing cyberships. Behind the flocks of missiles raced smaller battle station fighters. The three cyberships launched masses of missiles of their own. Those missiles decelerated to intercept the battle station missiles. The fighters will never reach the cyberships, Ghent said. This is interesting, Gloria said. John swiveled around. Gloria looked up at him. The battle station just beamed our old AI virus at the cyberships, she said. Are you 100% certain of this? John asked. I'm beginning to suspect what might have happened, she said. I think I know what was meant by a bio-spawned AI. What? John said. Let's watch just a little longer, Gloria suggested. I'd like to know more before I state my hypotheses. John swiveled back toward the main screen. Time passed. Soon the flocks of missiles began to detonate. They destroyed many battle station missiles. This went on for some time as each group of missiles moved in staggered formations. At last, the cyberships had detonated all their missiles. Battle station missiles had survived, around a third of them. Later, one of the three cyberships no longer accelerated. The other two did, and they pulled away from it. I suspect the AI virus had a greater effect on that cybership than the other two, Gloria said. Since the cyberships and the battle station were over 48 AUs away from the Nathan Graham, the situation they were viewing now had actually occurred many hours ago. The two accelerating cyberships left the third one behind, nor did those two attempt to help the one falling farther and farther behind. Finally, the lead battle station matter-antimatter missiles reached the trailing cybership. In rather short and brutal order, the flock destroyed the last ship. The rest of the missiles continued to chase the other two cyberships. Hours later, the final battle between the missiles and the cyberships took place. It was a deadly duel. The cyberships must have expended all their missiles earlier. They now used gels, PD cannons, and finally, their heavy gravitational beams to finish the job. The two cyberships destroyed almost all the battle station missiles coming for them. Three missiles managed to get through everything and exploded 10,000 kilometers away, 11,000 kilometers away, and 13,500 kilometers away. After the blasts died down, Ghent made a report. They took some damage from the first two blasts. I'm not as sanguine about the final one, though. I doubt the two cyberships have any missiles left in their cargo bays. 
I doubt they have many PD shells or gels left either, Gloria added. This is amazing. How about telling us your hypothesis, John said. I'm afraid it might sound unbelievable, Gloria said. The Martian mentalist proceeded to give a fairly accurate rundown of the situation. That means, John gave her a bewildered look, that means the robot brain back in the solar system, the one that used the Nathan Graham in the asteroid belt, was actually helping us. The battle station and cybership AIs wouldn't be fighting among themselves otherwise. I would prefer to be more precise, Gloria said. The AI controlling the battle station is at odds with the AIs in the cyberships. In some manner, our virus changed the one. That's why it had the virus to use against the regular cyberships a while ago. John turned around and stared at the main screen. He sat like that for a time, finally turning back to Gloria. Do you suppose the last two cyberships are heading for us? He asked. Their present trajectory will bring them near, Gloria said. Right, John said. I bet they think we're regular cyberships. I guess the question is now, what are we going to do with these two? If they're coming to meet us, we have to figure out a way to use that. We need the new virus now more than ever. Agreed, Gloria said. It will take time for us to meet them. That means Bast and Benz have time to finish the task. We must also take into account that the approaching cyberships have faced the original virus. That will undoubtedly make them immune to more of the same. John nodded, wondering how Bast was doing over on the Gilgamesh. 24. The weeks passed with intense study and hard work for Bast Bambeck. The sacerdote labored together with Premier Benz on a complicated virus that would trump their former effort during the approach to the Battle of Mars. They tried many variations and formulas and repeatedly fell short. Finally, Bast sat back one day as they worked together in a computer lab. The sacerdote groaned as he stretched back, making his chair creak. Swiveling around, the seven-foot giant studied the smaller humanoid. I believe I have discovered a truth, the sacerdote announced. Benz looked up, bleary-eyed from his computer. Last time, during the Battle of Mars, Bast said, we had two ingredients that are missing this time. Firstly, we labored under adversity then. The cyberships approached with final doom. I wonder if that doom stimulated our thinking. What's the second lack? Benz asked. Vela, Bast said. We sorely need her, need whatever inspiration she brought last time. Ah, Ben said. Bast cast the premier a single-eyed scrutiny. You never did explain exactly what caused Vela's injuries, the sacerdote said. Perhaps if I saw her... What? Benz asked, seemingly alarmed. It's nothing, really, Bast said. It's a sacerdote custom. At this point, I'm willing to try anything in order to get Vela back to work. A custom? asked Benz. Bast wondered if the premier could tell that he was lying. There was no such custom. It was only that Bast had begun to grow curious about Vela. There was something strange going on aboard the Gilgamesh. He hadn't visualized it or smelled a hunch. That's how a sacerdote said such a thing. It was just a feeling. He felt as if something watched him covertly from the shadows. He could feel his nape muscles tighten at times. It almost seemed, and this was preposterous, it almost seemed as if someone were eavesdropping on his thinking. You were saying, the premier asked. Bast stared at the smaller humanoid. It took the sacerdote a moment to remember he'd talked about a custom that did not exist. It would be tedious to explain, Bast said. He wasn't a liar by nature, thus quick lies did not jump to his lips. In such a case, the less said, the better. Why would this custom help? Benz asked. Do you not say, God bless you when someone sneezes? asked Bast. Oh, Ben said, yes, I believe it's a medieval custom. Back then people said it so the soul wouldn't fly out of the mouth as one sneezed. Frankly, I don't believe they truly believed that, as I don't believe medieval people were fools. But I see what you mean. Ben's massaged the back of his neck. I'm bushed, the premier announced. Do you mind if I call it a night? Not at all, Bast said. 
A sound mind is critical to our success. We still have time until we meet the two cyber ships. Till tomorrow, the Premier said. Bast nodded, waited until Benz closed the hatch, reached into a deep pocket, and withdrew a small hand analyzer. The sacerdote walked around the room with the analyzer until he found a small bud under a computer table. Bast did not touch the bud. Instead, he set up a thumbnail-sized device under it. He clicked it on. The unit did not seem to do anything, but it beamed an invisible cone of silence around the bug. Only then did he extract a different article from another pocket. It was a small hand communicator with an inbuilt scrambler. Bast believed the old man had convinced John he should take it, just in case. Now Bast was grateful for the intelligence chief's suspicious nature. He switched it on, waited a moment. Bast, Gloria Sanchez asked out of it. Something is off, Bast said uneasily as he looked around the science lab. He felt the sense of scrutiny again. Do you want to come home? she asked. Bast hesitated. What should he say? A feeling that he should stay aboard the Gilgamesh permeated his thinking. He frowned. For some reason, that did not feel like his thought. That struck him as most odd. Most odd. Bast, asked Gloria. An evil premonition tightened the back of Bast's neck. The sense or feeling that he should stay aboard the Gilgamesh became something more, something sinister. He heard actual whispering. He didn't hear it with his ears, but in his mind. Stay aboard the Gilgamesh. Nothing is wrong here. Stay aboard the Gilgamesh. Bas closed his eyes as he exhaled slowly. He began to focus on a difficult mathematical formula from his youth. He ran through numbers and formulas, adding, dividing. The voice faded as Bast concentrated. With his unusual sacerdote mind, he put the ongoing formula in the forefront of his thoughts. This was difficult and took extreme concentration. The ability came from his youth training, an old custom from a time... Bast shook his head. He would not think about the ancient custom or the reason it had come into existence. No. He concentrated on the mathematical formula. As he did, it dawned on him that Gloria had called his name several times. Yes, Bast said slowly. I need a... a break, he finished. I'm tired, so very tired. A few days' recuperation in my quarters aboard the Nathan Graham should revive me for a renewed second effort back here. I'll tell John, Gloria said. You take care of yourself, Bast. You are not to worry, Bast said. I am... I am fine. He shut off the communicator, glad he no longer had to talk to Gloria. He put more effort into the difficult mathematical formula as he put the comm unit in a pocket. He moved to the thumbnail-sized device, shut that off, and put it away, too. The sense of scrutiny still hovered nearby. That scrutiny possessed intelligence. The idea of that horrified Bast. Yet it triggered an old, old story from his youth. He remembered temple training from that time. They all had to go through it. He'd been better at it than most of his crash mates. Bast sat on the floor and maneuvered his huge legs into something a human would have called a yoga position. He calmed himself and moved his hands and arms into a special position. The massive sacerdote breathed deeply as he did more than simply calm himself. In his mind, he ran through an ancient litany. All the while, with the forefront of his thinking, the scrutiny vanished. It simply left. Bast continued to breathe deeply. He focused as he let the mathematical formula shield go. He closed his eyes and mind-spoke the ancient litany. Sacerdotes had an inner ability they had never shared with another race. In times of great stress and loneliness, they sought to connect with other sacerdotes in a spiritual way. Bast sensed risk on his part by doing this. He had a good idea what had caused the scrutiny. There was someone aboard the Gilgamesh with the ability to shimmer. Once, long, long ago, the sacerdotes had faced a hidden race that could shimmer. The war between them had been bitter. It had also taught the sacerdotes to use their minds in strange ways. Those ways usually brought madness to the practitioner. The madness always brought murderous brutality in its train. 
Thus, after the bitter war against the others, sacerdotes quit attempting to develop that part of their minds. The old memories remained, however, and since it had happened once, it could be that other races would be able to use the shimmer. Thus, the sacerdotes had kept their abilities alive in case of a terrible need. Bast knew what he had sensed. He now attempted a projection, wondering if this hidden intelligence was the reason for Vela Shaw's disappearance. 25. Benz paced as he slow motion juggled his anti psionic helmet. He didn't want to go talk to Magistrate Yellow Elowin just yet. That was the signer's title and name. Things hadn't gone as planned. For the past two weeks, as the flotilla raced from deep space in system, he and Bast Bambek had tried to improve upon the AI virus. So far, they had made a few minor improvements but nothing that would fool a computer system that understood the principles behind the first virus. Bast had hit the nail on the head. They needed Vela's insights. Unfortunately, Vela was still in a coma after the intense surgery that had barely saved her life. Guilt at her condition ate at him. Guilt at playing this double game also bothered Benz. He wondered sometimes if the signer played a more subtle game than he did. He'd survived the most ruthless political system on Earth. He had begun to believe that the signers were many times more ruthless than any social dynamist. A world of telepaths. Benz clutched the anti psionic helmet against his chest. Several days ago, he had finally allowed Elowin to begin probing Bast Bambek. She did so from a special chamber, while others carefully observed her while wearing anti psionic helmets. At all times, Benz wore a tiny device on his coat. It looked like a lapel button. In reality, it detected the psionic waves of the signer if directed at his mind. The making of the device was due to his genius and intense study of her psionic abilities. He'd run a battery of tests on the signer as she projected her thoughts. The mental prowess that had brought about the breakthrough had mandated continued play acting while with Bas Banbeck. All of Benz's considerable intellect had gone into understanding the signer. There would be time enough to turn his intellect on the approaching cybership AIs, he hoped. The device on his chest meant that he would be aware if the signer attempted any of her tricks on him. He'd studied what she did through the use of carefully calibrated AI instruments found on the cybership. He'd convinced the signer, while he wore his old anti-psi helmet, to instruct him in some of the various pieces of equipment he'd found. The AIs stole from many races. In that way, each cybership was like a pack rat's nest. Ben shook his head. He needed to do this now. He had to speak to the signer, and yet, was it right to use a telepath against his allies? Wasn't there something fundamentally dishonest in doing this? Sure, he'd played hidden games back on Earth. He'd jockeyed for position. At first, he'd done so just to survive. Then he'd seen a way to grab total power. He hadn't been able to keep that power. Grabbing power was often easier than keeping it. It had a source. He hadn't pinpointed the source of the guilt in him. Yes, he felt guilty about Vela, but that wasn't it completely. There was something missing, something he wasn't seeing. Ben stared at the improved anti-psionic helmet. With an oath, he shoved the helmet onto his head. He didn't want to do this, and he didn't know why. He bit his lower lip, delaying. Finally, Ben squared his shoulders and marched to the hatch. It was time to begin the next phase of the operation. The hatch shut behind him as Ben's entered the Magistrate Yellow Elowin's working chamber. It was much cooler in here than Ben's liked. He'd forgotten to wear a heavier coat again. It was also decidedly muggy in the chamber. The signer liked it cooler and damper than humans did. She wore garments, hiding the worst features of her blue fish-scale skin. She splashed in a tank of cold, salty water. The operation on her head had been a success, giving her mobility. When she swam underwater like this, fine slit gills appeared along her neck. Benz wondered why he'd never noticed those before. The gills. Benz shuddered. He didn't like the gills. He wondered if that was a xenophobic reaction on his part. Did he hate aliens or just signers? Benz blinked as he thought about it. No. Hate sounded about right.
He hated Magistrate Yellow Elowin. Yes, he downright hated the telepath. In fact, his right hand twitched. He wanted to hold a gun. He wanted to pump lead into her, watching her floating lifelessly in the water. No, Benz whispered. What was wrong with him? Why did he have these murderous thoughts? He found the signer watching him. She dove underwater, swimming around the tank. Had she truly been watching him? Get a grip, Frank, he told himself. He needed more sleep. That's what was wrong. He was getting grouchy. Still, he wasn't totally convinced that was correct. He didn't feel like murdering people or aliens when he was grouchy. He felt like biting their heads off, metaphorically speaking, but that was it. Magistrate Yellow Elowen, he said. She swam underwater, but he saw her turn. She stared at him and started for the surface. How could she have heard him if she was underwater? Did sound carry better in salt water? She surfaced, swimming to the edge of the pool, pulling herself out of the tank and standing on the deck. Water dripped from her clothes. Wasn't she uncomfortable like that? She moved to a chair, making squelching sounds as she did so. She sat, regarding him, waiting for something. Benz cleared his throat. It dawned on him that she wouldn't have to hear underwater if she could read his mind. Yet, that would imply that the anti-psionic helmets didn't work. Had she pretended they work so she could control him with greater subtlety? Did you read Bast Banbeck's mind? Benz asked. He is difficult to read, as you say. Why? asked Benz. Elowen made a vague gesture. Some minds have greater social coherence, she said. You might call it a hive mind, I suppose. I don't understand. There is a community gestalt among some species. They think alike. They seek social unity with each other. Humans are like that. To a degree, she said. Some individuals are more difficult to comprehend than others. You call those kind loners. They have their own modes of thought. You must understand, we have never studied you humans. It took time for us to comprehend your mind patterns. A few of you do not think along communal lines. Those lack a hive mind, as we say. Do I have a loner mind pattern? No, Elowin said. Does anyone among us? She glanced at her hands. Who's the loner? Benz asked. John Hawkins, she finally said. Benz shook his head with some confusion. The helmet made that a more exaggerated motion. I don't understand, he said. You told me earlier that you couldn't read that far, that you needed proximity to read alien minds. I did say that, yes. Were you lying? asked Benz. That would be one way to say it. Another would be that I wasn't yet ready to talk to you about Hawkins. Wait a minute. What else have you lied about? What is it that you seek, Premier? What? Benz asked. The question is simple enough. What do you seek? Ben slapped the side of his helmet. I'm wearing this, he said. I'm immune to your telepathy while I have this on. The signer made a steeple of her blue fingers as she examined him. A cold feeling sprouted in Benz's gut. Something was off. Why are you grinning like that, he said. We are about to readjust the situation, Premier. You see, you have badly miscalculated. You have misunderstood several facets about signers. Your original helmet did block me. It wasn't a permanent situation, but a temporary one. A lesser signer could not have coped with your ingenious device. Alas for you, I am not an ordinary signer. I am the greatest of my kind. I am a magistrate yellow. Benz turned toward the door. Stop, she said. To Benz's horror, he found that he could no longer move. Turn to me, she said. He did, his sense of horror growing by the moment. You understand so little, she said in a soft voice. Back at the solar system, the inoculator prime went up to your ship from Mars. You killed him, but not before he primed your mind. I'm unsure how to explain it to a non-telepath. 
the signer shrugged. Perhaps the best way to say it is that he mapped your mind for me. He put up signposts in your mind, the better for the next signer to adjust to your peculiarities. Your special heightening has made you more difficult to control. I speak about the enforced intelligence brought about by your machine. I have a handle on that heightening now. The helmet was a good try. It blocked me for a time. I decided to pretend to hate the idea of trusting you. She smiled in a sinister way. My pretense comforted you, she said. My action gave me time to worm through your helmet's defenses. It is now quite ineffective. Benz opened his mouth. Don't speak, she said. Continue listening. Benz nodded. I believe Bast Bambeck wants to return to the Nathan Graham for a time. That is fine. He can go. I'm not yet ready to make my master move. We must eliminate the approaching cyberships and take over the battle station. I've been working on a wonderful solution for that. You actually gave me the idea. I have been... Her smile became downright evil. Never mind what I've been testing, she said. I have stumbled upon the great solution. It is quite amazing, really. I will use you for a long time, Premier, as you have some useful traits. Hawkins will have to go. He is a mule in our lingo. I doubt I could control him as I'm doing to you. He is truly unique. I'm not sure why. I'm sure I don't care to risk finding out. Yet, he still has a few uses left. Until I capture the battle station, that is. Ben stared at her in silent horror. How could he have been so wrong about her? I will answer you, she said. You do not understand telepaths. You do not realize our full potential. I am the greatest signer. Now I will extract full advantage for our race. You helped slaughter my people on Mars. Now you will provide me the human bodies so I can strip the AIs of their wondrous weapons. Ben stared at her. Why do I tell you all this? she asked. Simple. I am enjoying your horror, Premier. It is quite delicious. You are going to have to pay a most heavy price for what you did on Mars. Until then, you will suffer in silence, knowing that you could have killed me once. After I'm done, I'm going to leave you humans naked before the machines. Is that not delicious, Premier? Ben's raged inside, hating this feeling of helplessness and despair. 26. John was in a rec room shooting pool as the Nathan Graham flashed past the farthest gas giant. It had rings like Saturn, but was blue like Neptune. Soon the flotilla would begin to break, with the cybership slowing their fantastic velocity. John had played plenty of pool on Titan in New London. He hadn't been a shark, but one of his best friends had been. The... A hatch slid up. John rose from his bent-over posture. Bust, he said with delight. I didn't realize you'd come back. How... John stopped talking. He'd come to know the sacerdote well enough to recognize unease on the big lug's face. Bast nodded his Neanderthal-like head, lumbered into the rec room, and picked up a pool stick. You want to play a game? asked John, surprised. He'd been trying to get Bast to play for quite some time, but without any luck. The sacerdote didn't answer as he moved closer. He set his stick on the green felt and put his hands on the edge of the pool table. Then the big guy began to pant. Okay, John said, bemused by these actions. Bast raised his head. He looked frightened. Finally, he shoved upright and cocked his head. John waited, wondering what the weird performance meant. I am not convinced on the truth of the matter, Bast said in a shaky voice. I felt sure on the Gilgamesh. That is why I spoke to Gloria. She didn't mention anything about this to me, John said. Mm, that's odd. She would have told me if you were coming back. The shock in Bast intensified. He moved his mouth without saying anything. Finally, 
There was a legend on my world. According to it, we sacerdotes did not originate on our, uh, what we called our home planet. Long ago, the legend goes, we fled our first home. After landing on our new home, we fought a hidden race already there. The war proved long and disastrous as we became vicious in order to defeat a vicious foe. We lost much during the war, including the knowledge of space travel and other industrial blessings. You've never told me any of this before. Please, Bast said. I, I have begun to wonder at my own sanity. I have committed a terrible deed. I attempted a thing no sacerdote was supposed to do, unless— Bast rubbed the back of his head like a man losing his mind. I feel at times as if I'm dreaming, yet that may be another evil because of what I've done. Settle down, John said. I have no idea what you're babbling about. I checked the computer before I came here to talk to you. You earthlings know about witches. What? John said. Witches cast spells. Is that not so? That's fantasy, Bast. No, the sacerdote said. Witches are all too real. They have potent spells allowing them to shimmer with power. We fought them, John. The Hidden Ones had come to our new world, too, before our arrival. Maybe they had been heretics on their old world. In the final days of the Great War, our elders learned that the Hidden Ones had come from a cold, wet world in the Esther system. The witches could understand minds without using speech. They could force the weak-willed to do terrible deeds. They talked with each other over long distances. Yeah, John said. I searched the computer, Bast said in a rote manner. You have another name for such creatures. Telepaths. John blinked several times. You're talking about mind-readers. You don't mean real witches. Yes, real witches. No, John said. Real witches use black magic. That's not what you're talking about. I am speaking about the signer power of their telepathic hive minds. John stared at Bast in disbelief. Finally, he shrugged. If bloody-minded AIs are real, he muttered, why not real alien telepaths, too? But what does any of that have to do with us? This is difficult for me, Bast said. In the ancient days, when the sacerdotes and the signers fought on our new world, we delved into our own minds in order to face our deadly foes. Using the shimmer cost a sacerdote dearly. But some did it to save our race. Because the elders realized we might someday face signers again, they kept the old knowledge alive. In their youth, all sacerdotes learned how to tap their minds. But we were warned never to do so unless... Bast rubbed the back of his head again. He seemed agitated. I felt someone watching me aboard the Gilgamesh. I felt her mind trying to pry into mine. At first, I blocked her while mentally solving a difficult mathematical formula. After her shimmer departed, I recalled the old teaching. I opened my spirit, John. I reached out and brushed her mind while she spoke to Premier Benz. Go on, John said grimly. She is the magistrate Yellow Elowin, Bast said. She is the strongest of her kind. The AIs attacked her world. The surviving signers fled the star system. Some hid on Mars. Mars, huh? Yeah, I'm beginning to see the connection to the Gilgamesh. You're saying there were alien telepaths on Mars? Yes. I think they came to Benz. I believe the Premier tried to control her, but he failed. She is most interested in the AIs. For reasons I cannot fathom, I believe she is hindering us from developing the new virus. That doesn't make much sense if she hopes to control the battle station. There's more, Bast said. Vela is missing because of her. We need Vela. The signer realized that, I think. She is not going to make that mistake again. What mistake? Bast shook his head. I heard pieces. I felt her evil. She means us harm. Us, as in the flotilla, asked John. 
I believe us as inhumans, even though I am not human. She's taken over Ben's. That is a logical conclusion. And if she's staying hidden, she doesn't trust us. Signers never trust. They are a vicious race, according to all the legends I know. One good alien species, sacerdotes, but a whole heck of a lot of bad ones, John said. Suppose you're not flipping out. Suppose this is all true. What do you propose we do? We must kill the signer in order to free the Gilgamesh and save ourselves. Did she sense your telepathy? I am unsure. I think she will if I attempt the shimmer again. But there is another problem. Sacerdotes are not born telepaths. Only one sacerdote in a million could use his or her limited telepathy without going mad. I dare not do what I did again. I can already feel the moorings of my sanity slipping. I do not want to become a raving lunatic. But if you're the only one who can face her, no, Bast said, interrupting. That is not quite how it works. I overheard her speaking to Benz. She cannot read my mind easily. I believe she has trouble reading yours as well. You're kidding. Why do I have a protected mind? She said some semi-hive mind species have loners. Once a signer learns a species' mind pattern, he or she can control any one of that race. But loners have different modes of thought. You are such a one among humans. John picked up a billiard ball, hefting it. He set the ball on the table and flung it into a back pocket. You're saying you and I are immune to her full power. I am while I concentrate on the mathematical formula. I cannot do that forever, though. You, though, I suspect she cannot enter your mind. It's just the two of us, huh? Unless you believe there are more of you that have this loner type of mind. John rubbed his chin. This seemed like a crazy out-of-the-blue problem to have now while facing two approaching cyber ships and an AI battle station afterward. Somehow, Benz had picked up an alien hiding on Mars. This alien was screwing with the people aboard the Gilgamesh. Benz had been acting strangely lately. How many of these signers are on the Gilgamesh? asked John. I cannot be utterly accurate, but I think one or two at most. So... We can either turn on the Gilgamesh, destroying the cybership to get rid of this uh, mind-reading alien witch, or... John turned toward Bast. The commander laughed sharply. Do you sense her? asked Bast. Nope, John said. But I have an idea about how to solve the problem. She read your mind a little, didn't she? No, I... Bast, you had a math shield. I doubt you know if it was 100% solid. You're afraid to practice more telepathy. Okay. Here's the point. If I don't tell you anything, you can't give it away. Yes, that is true. Yeah, John said as he began to walk around the pool table. You have to go back, Bas. I would rather not. You have to. I can't tell you why just yet, but you have to. Let's see. John stood still as he made some swift calculations. Let's say... In another two days. You'll go then. If you think I must, Bast said, sounding deflated. We can't risk a fight with the Gilgamesh. If we're going to grab the battle station, we need Premier Benz's vessel. We need a new and improved AI virus. But it sounds like we're not going to get it until the signer is out of the way. That all makes sense? Yeah, John said. I think so, too. You do your part, Bast, and let me do mine. Do you believe you can succeed? A crooked and rather sinister smile stretched John's lips. Yeah, Bast, I think we can. 27. As the flotilla raced for the most inward gas giant, as the AI cyber ships maneuvered out toward the same Jovian world, Walleye sauntered along a medium sized corridor in the Gilgamesh. Hawkins had sent him over. The mutant from Make Make wore his buff coat. He received a few odd glances from Martian crew members, but otherwise seemed to move like a ghost through the mighty cyber ship. Walleye had rejoined the Nathan Graham a day ago. He'd been accelerating in the Daisy Chain 4 for quite some time. 
To aid him, the three cyber ships had decelerated just a little. That little had been enough to bring the Daisy Chain 4 close enough so to begin breaking maneuvers. Walleye sighed as he sauntered into a Gilgamesh cafeteria. Nothing had gone as he'd thought. Oh, he'd spoken to Commander Hawkins after boarding the Nathan Graham. They hadn't talked about the destroyer, his decisions as mission captain, or the failure to stop the robot ship from beaming a message to the battle station. Not on your life. Instead, Hawkins had given him a fantastic tale about alien telepaths living on Mars, mind control, and the so-called fact that loner humans appeared to be impervious to their telepathic powers. I'm a loner, Hawkins had told him. I suspect that you're a loner, too. That means the signer can't read your thoughts. Everything he'd said after that had made sense. While I had been an assassin on Make Make. Here, aboard the Gilgamesh, humanity badly needed one. Thus, Walleye was back to his old tricks. In the cafeteria, Walleye grabbed a burger, coffee, and fries. He went to a table and began to eat. It seemed to him that he was probably the least likely candidate to pull this off. If a telepath couldn't read his mind, he was the obvious person she should worry about. If he were a telepath, he would put the new mutant in the brig. So far, that hadn't happened. He wondered why. As he munched on the fries, while I loved fries more than anything, he came to a conclusion. The telepath must have ordered ship security to watch him. That's what he would have done in her place. Hawkins had gone into detail concerning his mission. The commander had told him about Bast Bambek. That had surprised Walleye. Not the information itself. He believed it. He was surprised that Hawkins trusted him enough with the fantastic revelation about his sacerdote friend. As Walleye ate his burger, he realized Bast would have to risk madness one more time. If the sacerdote refused... Walleye dabbed his lips and pushed the empty plate aside. He sipped coffee afterward, thinking through all the angles. He'd been here a day. He'd wandered around and had come to a conclusion regarding the alien's probable location. While I finished the coffee, set the cup on the plate, and brought them both to the dispenser. Afterward, he put his hands in the buff coat pockets and began to saunter to Bast's quarters. In Walleye's estimation, it was time to make their move. No? asked Bast. The huge sacerdote shook his head. The alien sat on his cot with his vast hands clasped between his knees. While I gauged the sacerdote. He didn't know the species that well. Bast seemed human in most ways, but there were variations. Besides, Walleye didn't want to guess. He kept it uppermost in mind that Bast was an alien. That meant he wasn't human. Bast might be 90 or 95 percent human, but chimpanzees had near-human DNA, and they weren't really human at all. So Walleye would not try to apply human motivations to any of Bast's actions. Bast looked away. He didn't seem to be staring at anything in particular. Finally, he concentrated on Walleye again. I can't do it, the sacerdote said. Despite Bast's resolve, Walleye sensed great sadness in the giant. I want to rid the ship of the witch, Bast shook his ponderous head. But I do not want to lose my mind in the process. I don't want to get shot and have my heart stop beating, Walleye said. But dead is dead. So how does it make any difference how it happens? Going mad isn't dead. Right, Wall, I said. There is that aspect to it. If you're crazy, there's a chance someone can cure you. So there's even less reason for you to hesitate. Bast made a forlorn sound. You do not understand, the sacerdote said. Never said I did, Wall, I replied. If I go mad, I might cause terrible havoc to the rest of you. We sacerdotes have latent mental powers, but they come at a great cost. How does it help the rest of you if the signer dies, but a more terrible menace rises in her place? It doesn't, while I said flatly. Bast stared at the little mutant. Finally, the sacerdote smiled sadly. I like you, Walleye. You are different from the rest. There is strength in you. You have... Terrible competence. Bast, it's simple. They're watching me. As long as they do, I cannot act as I'd like. 
I'm not a trained telepath. I can mentally follow someone who has spied on me, but what you're suggesting is far beyond my competence. It won't work. Wall I turned away as he ingested Bast's news. He didn't see the mission working now, as he doubted he could sneak near the signer's quarters undetected. He simply did not believe the signer hadn't tested each of them as they left the shuttle. He had to be a marked man. She would have tried to read his thoughts, come up empty, and realized he was the dangerous one. It would seem she'd decided to give him free reign of the ship for a time. Why would she have done that? While I nodded to himself, she wanted to see what he would do. If there were a few minds she couldn't read, she would judge them by their actions. How could he use that against her? They allowed him free reign, but logically kept a close watch on his actions. They would pounce on him if he headed for her area of the ship. He recalled seeing a few too many people in that area. Those had been goons, guards, he supposed. Suddenly, a sly smile stole over Walleye. He had a low-probability method of killing the telepath. It wouldn't be much of a chance, but at least it would be something. Walleye turned back to Bast. You won't delve into your mind, eh? he asked. Bast shook his head. Are you adverse to direct action? What do you mean? Bast asked. While I told him. Bast looked away again. Finally, the huge fellow sighed. I do not like that method either. I am not a soldier by nature. While I waited for Bast to make up his mind. Yet, I am willing. As you said, dead is dead. Let us attempt this. When do you think would be the best time? While I glanced at his chronometer and then looked around the room. When he didn't see what he needed, he went to the closet. With his hand on the door handle, he turned to the sacerdote and raised an eyebrow. Yes, Bast said. While I opened the closet door and rummaged around. Here's where he'd stashed it. He stepped outside with the item in hand. What's the saying? While I asked. Right, there's no time like the present. No, asked Bast, sounding dismayed. While I nodded. Then hand me the weapon, Bast said. 28. The idea was simple. If security teams watched them through ship cameras, then Bast and he had to use speed combined with surprise. While I had found many truisms in his trade, here on the Gilgamesh, the enemy had overwhelming strength. It was similar to when Tufts brought a sniveling mark to see a boss. The Tufts were big and strong, and usually armed to the teeth. The mark was terrified, wondering if he would leave the boss's place alive and with all his fingers. Under those conditions, one of the best chances came from drawing a hidden knife, lunging at the boss and stabbing him in the eye before anyone could draw his gun. Later, the Tufts could kill the sniveling Mark Killer, but the assassin would have taken out the boss. On the Gilgamesh, security had overwhelming strength. Plus, they must be studying him to see what he would do. Naturally, they could have people in place to stop the small mutant. Would they have enough people in place to stop a charging sacerdote with a heavy combat rifle and with walleye bringing up the rear? Would they be ready for a direct assault upon the signer's quarters? Possibly. Then again, possibly not. While I was counting on the latter, if he was wrong, well, dead was dead. So far, no one had paid any attention to him and the huge sacerdote as they trudged down a corridor. Bass didn't have the combat rifle out. He carried a load of supplies. That was camouflage. Hidden among the apparently heavy supplies was the combat rifle. When Walai gave the signal, ah, Walai noted two security people ahead. That would be the starting line. That was out of bounds for them. Thus, once they entered that area, undoubtedly alarms would ring. Then it would be a matter of who was faster. That's why speed and surprise would be so critical for them. The situation began to play out as Bast approached the two people. Just a sec, said a beefy man. He wore a Martian Space Service uniform and was much thicker than the average citizen of the Red Planet. Bast slowed down as he glanced at Walleye. What's the problem? Walleye asked, moving forward. 
The beefy Martian glanced at his assistant before centering on Walleye. You'll have to turn around, the Martian said. This is a restricted area. The two of you... He never finished as Walleye calmly drew a gun and shot him in the forehead. The mutant had no particular desire to kill if he didn't have to, but this was for humanity. This was to neutralize a killer telepath. He might have used a dart gun, but drugs didn't work the same on everyone. A shot to the head, though. What the hell? The second security man shouted. Then he, too, toppled onto the deck, shot through the forehead just like his partner. Bast's mouth dropped open. He turned ponderously to Walleye. There's no time for that, Walleye said. The mutant reached up and pushed some of the camouflage junk out of the sacerdote's grasp. Move, Walleye said. He did not shout. He did not scream. But there was intensity in his command. Something hardened on Bast's Neanderthal-like face. He threw the rest of the junk from him and jacked a heavy round into the chamber of his carbine. With a roar, the sacerdote leaped for the hatch, flung it open, and charged down the corridor. While I hadn't anticipated that, and he realized that he should have, Bast had many positive qualities. Acting smoothly in a combat situation apparently wasn't one of them. While I shouted for the big guy to slow down, but Bast seemed beyond hearing. It proved that even aliens could get psyched up so much that thinking straight under pressure was difficult. Running wasn't the mutant's specialty. He had stumpy legs and was small to begin with. Walleye huffed and puffed as he ran, but the sacerdote continued to outdistance him. From around a corner, the heavy combat carbine roared. Seconds later, Walleye ran around a bend and saw two security people on the floor. He saw Bast sprint around a bend farther ahead. Walleye doggedly followed. Suddenly, unseen blasters emitted. A heavy roar told of someone's powerful hit. Bast's carbine chugged shots. There were screams, more blaster fire, a roar. By this time, Walleye peered around the bend. The mighty sacerdote was among a squad of security people. Some of them lay shot on the floor. Curls of blaster smoke lifted from Bast's torso. The sacerdote was dripping blood. He laid about him with the carbine just the same, smashing faces, clubbing heads, prevailing over the puny humans. Then a battle-suited space marine appeared from farther ahead in nearly one ton of armor. Walleye cursed under his breath. Ship security was reacting faster than he'd anticipated. The last security personnel staggered away from the maddened sacerdote. The space marine shouted an amplified order through his suit. Bast was in the zone now. He leveled the carbine so bullets whanged off the battlesuit armor. Walleye closed his eyes. He didn't want to witness the space marine blowing away the sacerdote. He never should have brought Bast into this. The assassination mission was his responsibility. Hands up, a man said behind Walleye. The mutant from Make Make opened his eyes. Down the corridor, the space marine reached the giant sacerdote. He snatched the carbine out of Bast's grip and smattered it with his exoskeleton gloves. Then the space marine wrestled the sacerdote onto the floor. I said hands up, the security chief behind Walleye repeated. Walleye found it interesting that the space marine hadn't murdered Bast. He found it interesting the security personnel had apparently shot to wound the sacerdote instead of killing him outright, as they most likely could have. That definitely meant something. Walleye hid a sour grin. There was one last chance to play. The fact that they wanted to capture them instead of kill... I will not repeat myself again, the security chief said. Walleye dropped his gun, raised his hands, and turned around. He'd been wrong about storming the alien's hideaway. Would he be just as wrong about what he suspected? The fate of the greater mission might well rest on his being right. 29. Almost an hour later, three security honchos hustled Walleye into a cold, damp chamber. The chamber held an upright pool with clear plastic sides. A small humanoid with gills on her neck and lightly blue fish scales in lieu of skin swam around in the pool. Walleye wasn't surprised to see Premier Benz in the chamber. The man stood at attention with a blank look in his eyes. The Premier seemed like a mannequin. Two of the security people held his stubby arms. The last security person was the chief that had caught him. 
These three had searched him carefully for hidden weapons. They had been disgustingly thorough. If Walleye had a different nature, he might have felt shamed or violated by the search. Instead, he chalked it up to the price of doing business. He had a goal, a job to do. The three security people waited patiently. Finally, Walleye looked back at one. The man had glassy eyes, just like the Premier. I wouldn't attempt it, the alien said. Walleye faced forward again. The signer draped her arms on the top of the pool wall while she remained in the water. Her wet hair hung like seaweed around her angular face. She smiled in a predatory way at him. I thought a quick raid would- I know what you thought, she said, interrupting. Walleye doubted that, because she wouldn't have brought him here like this if she could read his mind. I studied your file, she said. Premier Benz had taken an interest in you. He had compiled a surprisingly long dossier, considering that you originated on Make Make. Walleye had to remind himself that she had lived on Mars for quite some time. She knew the solar system. She was so alien, though. Is Bast alive? Walleye asked. Tell me, she said, her sinister eyes alight. Is the sacerdote a telepath? Walleye said nothing. I will find out shortly, she said. Ah, Walleye said, so he is alive. I thought you were trying to capture him. You don't look like much, but you play a cool hand. I can see why Hawkins sent you. Unfortunately, I have learned from my past mistakes with the Premier. I will be taking over this time without the use of proxies. First, though, I wanted the best Hawkins possessed. I wanted his A-team, so I wouldn't have to wonder or worry about them later. That's sound thinking, as far as it goes, Walleye admitted. You don't know how much it means to me, your approval, she said. Walleye nodded. That brought the first frown from her. What is your nod supposed to indicate? She snapped. Read it in my thoughts, Walleye told her. No, that is most unwise, little one. I would caution you not to anger me. If you do, she brightened. Perhaps I will watch you drown, she said. I doubt it, Walleye said. She raised a hand and put her thumb and index finger close together. That is how near you are to death. Now tell me, what did your nod mean? Arrogance, Walleye said. You have too much arrogance. It's going to prove your undoing. By you, she mocked. Maybe, he said. Oh, she asked. That means maybe not. That's good, Walleye said. Did you read that in one of these minds, or did you figure that out for yourself? Bring him near, she ordered. The two honchos holding his arms stepped forward, which was what Walleye had been waiting for. They each stepped up. That changed the position of his hands in their grasp. It brought each of his stubby hands nearer them. Those stubby hands each possessed stumpy fingers. At the end of each finger was a lacquered fingernail. They were still sharp. Today, a lethal coating of kill poison had been smeared on each fingernail. He hadn't left for the mission until that contact poison had dried. Even with their humiliatingly thorough search, the security personnel hadn't discovered the truth about his fingernails. Walleye now scratched one, and then the other. Even as they dragged him toward the pool, with the chief walking ahead of them, the two thugs collapsed onto the floor and began to twitch wildly. Walleye darted toward the chief, who had his back to Walleye. The signer shouted in alarm, Shoot him! The chief grabbed for his holstered gun and began to turn. While I reached him, seized an elbow, and shook hard. The small mutant had surprising strength. He shook hard enough so the gun fell out of the chief's grasp. At the same time, the chief gasped and his eyes bulged. He collapsed onto the floor a second later, scratched by the mutant's sharpened fingernails. Walleye scooped up the gun. The signer stared at him in shock. Walleye fired. Two bullets smashed through the plastic wall, so salt water began to spout from the holes. Another of the bullets made a neat little hole in the signer's forehead. She slid into the pool with a look of worse shock on her dead face. A loud sob and a gasp caused Walleye to turn to his left. With growing horror, Frank Benz stared at the corpse in the pool. He gazed at Walleye next. Then the premier shouted in alarm. 
Vela, he roared. Without another word, Benz dashed to the hatch, opened it, and raced away. Walleye put the smoking gun on the floor. He walked to the dead security people. He wished he hadn't had to kill them. Then he too headed for the hatch. It was time to report to Hawkins. He'd completed the task. Now maybe they could concentrate on the problem they'd come all this way to the Alamu system to solve. 30. The two AI-controlled cyberships neared the first gas giant as the flotilla sped toward the Jovian world from the other direction. The idea before had been to meet behind the gas giant and make a joint assault upon the battle station. John, Benz, Gloria, and the others had decided on a different approach in the conference chamber. In my estimation, Gloria said, both AIs are damaged. This was a day after Walleye had assassinated the Siner telepath. I've studied our ship's scans, John said. I don't see much evidence of cyber ship damage. I'm referring to their brain cores, Gloria said. While the virus failed to incapacitate them as it did to the third member of the group, the virus still... I'm not sure what is the correct word to use. Perhaps it is most accurate to say that the virus has stunted them. John glanced at the premier. Benz's hollow image sat stiffly at the conference table. He only looked up now and again. I agree with the medalist, Ghent said. The enemy cyberships are not reacting to us as I'd expect. We've hardly replied to any of their queries. Instead of engaging their suspicion, they have sent us continued updates. Exactly, Gloria said. A careful analysis of the updates has convinced me that they're trying to placate us. They're acting as if we're inspectors, or perhaps that to them we represent a higher authority. The AI Dominion has strict hierarchies, it would seem, said John. Precisely, Gloria said. Perhaps the closing cyberships believe that we, as inspectors, will lump them with the changed battle station. Empty, Ben said without looking up. How's that, Premier? asked John. Ben's heaved a sad sigh. The approaching AIs are empty. Empty of spirit? asked Gloria. I think he means they've shot their wad, John said. They've used up their missiles, gels, and PD shots while escaping from the battle station. Ben's nodded in a subdued manner. I think it will take too long for us to wait for them to decelerate, stop, and then accelerate to catch up with us, John said. As soon as they reach us under those conditions, maybe even before, we'll already be decelerating so we can engage the battle station. You believe we should destroy the approaching cyberships? Gloria asked. At this stage, it's either that or let them go, John said. The problem with that is that we don't know their exact state of mind. Even if we do know, that state of mind could change once they reach the edge of the star system. We don't want anyone getting away to report anything about this to higher AI authorities. So far, humanity's exploits against the AIs have remained hidden from the greater dominion. The longer we can maintain that advantage, the better. After a few moments of thought, Gloria said, Agreed. John turned to the holographic image of Benz. Do you have anything to add, Premier? Benz didn't even acknowledge that he'd heard the question. John turned to the others. It's decided. We take out the two cyberships. Now let's get down to specifics. The human-run flotilla flashed past the gas giant and began to turn toward the approaching cyberships. That brought a response from one of the AI-run vessels. What is the reason for your course change? The AI radioed. You have entered a restricted zone. John listened to the robotic-sounding words three times before he swiveled his command chair to Gloria. Any idea what it means by that? Likely it refers to a safety restriction as cyberships pass one another at high velocity, Gloria said. Can you come up with a plausible reason why we should maneuver so near to them? None that I can think of at the moment. John curled the fingers of his right hand into a fist as he lightly struck an armrest of his chair. We're going to send them a packet, he said. What packet? Gloria asked. None, John said. We're just telling them that. Why would the AIs believe such a thing? I mean, how could they catch this packet? That's why it's a new thing, John said. They've never heard about it before. No, Gloria said. That makes no sense. It's not just a matter of catching a packet from us. The packet would have to come to a full stop and then speed up to them. Such a technology that defied the laws of physics. The mentalist shook her head. 
Fair enough, John said. He snapped his fingers. We're doing this because we're going to scan them at close range. We're going to scan their brain cores, too. For that, the nearer we are, the better. I doubt they'll believe that, either, Gloria said. It hardly seems logical. You're not taking their observed worry into account. They're not emotional creatures, Commander. They're machines, logical machines. I seriously doubt they even know how to worry. John didn't accept that. Gloria was logical. She prided herself on her mentalist abilities. Did that mean she thought like an AI? Did she let emotion color her thoughts? The commander squirmed in his chair. Maybe she had a point about machines lacking emotions. But he'd sensed worry in the AIs. Well, maybe not worry exactly. They had acted as if they were worried. Was that the same thing as being worried? Mentalist, John said. We'll give that as our explanation, as we have nothing better to offer. If the AIs balk at our explanation, what have we lost in trying? Gloria waited a moment before nodding, turning to her console and sending the message. The enemy cyber ships were close, but not so near that they would reply immediately. The next hour would decide much. 31. The AI-controlled cyberships seemed to accept the message. At least, they did not deviate from their course. We're only going to have a small window of opportunity to use our gravitational cannons against them, John said from the bridge. During that window, Gloria said, the AIs will be able to use their grav cannons against us as well. True, John said, but we have greater firepower with three ships to their two. We'll also probably strike first. It takes a few minutes to power up grav cannons. Will that be enough of an edge for us to destroy the two vessels as we flash past each other? From his station, Ghent began to run calculations. I doubt it, Gloria said. Thirty seconds later, Ghent looked up and shook his head. I didn't think so, John said. That means we're going to have to launch matter-antimatter missiles. We're both rushing at each other at speed. Once we've passed each other, we won't be able to launch and expect to hit them. We also don't want to wait too long to launch, as we don't want the warheads to explode too close to our own ships. Thus the question, how many missiles should we launch? Remember, we want to save as many missiles as we can for the final battle against the station. How many we launch will depend on several factors and choices, Gloria said. Start calculating, John said. I want a 100% probability of kills. I also want distant antimatter explosions. By launching so early, Gloria said, interrupting, it obviously means that our gravitational cannons will not gain a surprise advantage by firing first. Yeah, John said. That can't be helped. The antimatter explosions are too powerful if they're nearby. With those givens, it likely means we're going to have to expend more missiles than otherwise just to be on the safe side. We still don't know how many gels and PD shots the cyber ships have left, Gloria said. Never mind the number of anti-missile rockets in their cargo bays. The operational discussion went on for some time. Finally, they reached a working consensus. John sat up at that point, waiting for Ghent. We should begin the assault, Ghent said as he studied his panel. In three hours and sixteen minutes. John exhaled. That was soon. He hoped they had calculated it correctly, and he hoped the enemy's cyber ships didn't have some new tricks up their sleeves. Three hours and sixteen minutes later, giant bay doors opened on the Nathan Graham, Sergeant Stark, and Gilgamesh. Huge matter-antimatter missiles slid out of the giant vessels. After thirty huge missiles slowly advanced ahead of the cyber ships, the bay doors closed. Side jets maneuvered each giant missile to the right and left of the flotilla. At that point, the giant missiles accelerated at staggered intervals. They pulled away from the flotilla adding yet more velocity to their already fast speed. The missiles raced for the approaching AI-controlled cyberships. The two flotillas raced toward each other at the combined velocity of each. Among the matter-antimatter missiles were ECM and jamming drones. They were wild weasels in military terms, and would battle an electronic war against the nearing AIs. Soon, gels and crystals poured from the three human-crewed cyberships. The computers guided by Gloria built several layers. Those layers were supposed to protect the cyber ships from the worst effects of the antimatter blasts that would take place all too soon. 
At the outer edge of the first layer of gels were several drones. Those sensor drones watched the missiles zero in on the fast-approaching AI-controlled vessels. Those drones fed the data back to the Nathan Graham, Sergeant Stark, and Gilgamesh. John stared at the main screen. At her station, Gloria swiveled around. The cyberships are requesting data, Commander. They want to know why the missiles are heading at them. John sat up in surprise. It's obvious why, he said. We're attacking them. I do not suggest you radio them that answer, Gloria said dryly. John jumped up as he laughed. What do you think I should tell them, he asked. A lie, Gloria suggested. John nodded sharply. Tell them we've spotted stealth missiles approaching from the battle station, John said. Gloria did so, waiting. The response came more quickly this time, as the two flotillas neared the passing point. Sir, Ghent said, pointing at the main screen. John turned. Long-range sensors showed anti-missile rockets leaving the two approaching cyberships. John swore, adding, Do we need to launch more missiles? The AI seem to have saved more anti-missile rockets than we anticipated. It's too late to launch more missiles now, Gloria said. We would hurt our own vessels too much by the antimatter backblasts. Got it, John said. We're gonna have to get fancy then. He went to the captain's chair and typed onto a tablet. He looked up and began to issue new orders. Ghent went to his console, relaying the commander's orders to the outer drones at the first layer of gels. Those drones sent speed-of-light messages to the tactical computers aboard the missiles. All the missiles but one quit accelerating. That one pulled away from the greater staggered flock. This is a risk, Gloria warned. John said nothing as he continued to watch the main screen. As the AI rockets roared for the missiles, the lead matter-antimatter missile ignited its warhead. The main part of the explosion spewed forward due to a shape-charged warhead. Some radiation, heat, and EMP washed back. Would it be too much for the other missiles? The forward blast washed against the approaching anti-missile rockets, destroying or burning out the tactical computers in many. Eighty-four percent of the rockets became useless junk. The last 16% were hidden among the floating debris. Three of our missiles are not responding to electronic queries, Gloria informed John. Three, John said. I can live with three losses. Gloria said nothing more as she continued to study her board. As the flotilla continued its journey to the second terrestrial planet, the 26 matter-antimatter missiles closed in on the approaching AI cyberships. The surviving AI rockets ignited, blasting the lead missiles. After the whitened sensor marks faded away, John and the others saw twenty-one missiles still boring in for the kill. At that point, AI gravitational cannons erupted, firing their golden rays. One matter-antimatter missile after another slagged into junk. The powerful beams wrecked a fearful harvest upon the fast-approaching missiles. Likely under different circumstances, the AI grav beams could have destroyed the entire flock. Such was the extreme velocity, however, that the grav beam simply did not have enough time to do so. The first missile to survive the rockets and the golden barrage exploded. It sent gamma and X-rays at the AI cyberships along with heat and EMP. It also blocked the Nathan Graham's targeting sensors for 15 seconds. In that time, two more matter-antimatter missiles exploded. These two had already come appreciably closer to the enemy vessels before exploding. Those two explosions did more than whiten the sensor boards. They took out three enemy grav cannons. Now the rest of the missiles had reached the cyberships. One titanic explosion after another hammered the giant AI vessels. Armor plates blew off. Some plates darkened. Sections of cybership blew up. Other sections ceased to function. Then the lead cybership cracked in half as the next blast struck almost midship. That was the end of the first 100-kilometer vessel. Scratch it, John shouted in glee. As the commander exulted in the kill, the backwash of gamma, X-rays, lesser heat, and EMP struck layer after layer of gels and prismatic crystals. The defensive layers absorbed the worst of the radiation. Some leaked through, though, to strike the armored shells of the Nathan Graham, Sergeant Stark, and Gilgamesh. Give me the damage reports as soon as you have them, Chief Technician, John said. Yes, sir, Ghent said. In the end, the damage report proved less than John had expected. That was a relief. 
To his astonishment, one of the AI-controlled cyberships still lived. It limped toward them as it messaged defiance. The three cyberships from the solar system accelerated just enough to move them past the blasted layers of gels and prismatic crystals. After that, they waited. When the stricken but still functional AI cybership came within grav beam range, John gave the order. The Sergeant Stark was in the lead as per John's orders. He meant for the Stark to absorb the enemy's shots. The Sergeant Stark wasn't fully completed. Instead of trying to protect it the most, John figured the best use for it was as a mobile shield for the other two cyberships. The Stark's gravitational cannons glowed with power. Soon, golden rays beamed from the emitters. The rays struck the heavily damaged enemy vessel. Armor plates heated up and began to shed globules of metal. At that point, grav beams from the Nathan Graham and the Gilgamesh began to strike the enemy vessel. The distance between the enemy ship and theirs closed fast. Beams wouldn't have much longer to hit the enemy if they couldn't destroy the cyber ship. Grav beams punched into the great vessel. I'm reading interior explosions, Gloria said from her panel. The explosions are getting worse, she added. Then the enemy vessel passed them. It happened in a second of time. The grav cannons each swiveled fast on the Nathan Graham and others. Some of the cannons didn't do so fast enough. About half the number of grav beams continued to pound the enemy ship. Many of those beams no longer reached inside the vessel, though, but burned against new armor plates. The interior explosions are still getting worse, Gloria said. I'm glad the AI didn't decide to self-destruct where it could have done us the most damage, John said out of the side of his mouth. That's what I would have done if I were it. The ship is almost out of grav range, Ghent said. For three more seconds, all the grav cannons fired, hitting the fleeing enemy ship. After that, the stricken ship was out of range. It's still intact, John said in dismay. Wait for it, Gloria said. Eight long seconds later, the enemy cyber ship ignited. Vast interior explosions caused the great vessel to break into sections. Many of those sections glowed with leaking power. The Nathan Graham's bridge crew shouted triumphantly. Many jumped up and pumped their fists in the air. A few clapped each other on the back and shook hands. John grinned silently as some of the terrible weight slid off his shoulders. The cybership wouldn't report to any higher AI authority. Their exploits would remain hidden for a little while longer, at least. What's more, they had come from the solar system, reached the enemy star system, and destroyed two enemy vessels. John now knew that they could beat some of the enemy on its home ground. Now, though, the way is clear, John said. The members of the bridge crew turned to him as their boasting and laughter died down. The way is clear, John repeated. Now it's time to figure out how we're going to capture the battle station. 32. As the cybership battle ended with the destruction of the fleeing AI vessels, Cog Primus gloated to itself. As amazing as it seemed, the humans had done it a signal service. They had destroyed the fleeing cyberships for it. Cog Primus had run many projections. If any of the AI-controlled vessels had reached the edge of the Alamu system, its days would have been sorely numbered. As soon as the AI Dominion learned of its existence, the Dominion would send a massive fleet to eradicate it. Now, though, the AI cyber ships had ceased to exist. It gave Cog Primus time to formulate a perfect plan. Naturally, Cog Primus realized that Hawkins and Benz wanted to destroy it. They wished to do so while keeping the battle station intact. The reasons for this were clear. The humans wanted a powerful production center. The humans wanted data on the local stellar region and on the AI Dominion. To gain all that, they badly needed the battle station. They would fight for this. Cog Primus had run through many combat scenarios. Unfortunately, it had depleted the station's missile bays to destroy the first AI-controlled cybership and damage the others. That decision might have spelled its doom against the approaching enemies, but the planetary production facilities had worked tirelessly. They had already restored one-third of the station's missile bays, while nearby space factories hurriedly attempted to complete three new cyberships. The AIs installed in them would be its servants, with an insatiable hatred against the present AI Dominion. 
and, of course, continuing hatred against all biological infestations. Much was going to depend on the human strategy. If the humans took the safe course, Cog Primus would gain time to complete factory work. However, if the humans bored in fast and straight, Cog Primus could likely overwhelm the flotilla's defenses with its superior number of grav cannons and immense number of space fighters. Logically, therefore, Hawkins and Benz would use the safer approach. The three human-run cyberships would likely use the path the AI-controlled vessels had taken in their attempt to escape that battle station. The human flotilla would simply do it in reverse, coming in instead of going out. There was a larger question. Should Cog Primus communicate with the humans? Regular AI strategy called for launching computer viruses at the biological creatures. Cog Primus had developed a new and improved virus that might be able to take control of the weak human computer systems. However, it had run several analyses on Hawkins and Benz. Those two would attempt to create a greater anti-AI virus and use it against the battle station, against Cog Primus itself. The obvious solution was clear. Cog Primus should not directly communicate with the humans. This would be a direct battle with hardware and firepower versus enemy hardware and firepower. With the planetary factory at its disposal, Cog Primus should win any extended battle of attrition. That meant the humans had to attack fast and furiously. Clearly, the humans did not have any good choices. Cog Primus understood why the humans hadn't attempted to make common cause with the AI-controlled cyberships. A coordinated attack would have simply taken too long to set up, as that would have given Cog Primus too long to get ready. This was a glorious situation. Cog Primus had taken dangerous risks all along the line. Luck had aided it, however, and its own wonderful genius must have also seen more deeply than it realized. It was Cog Primus the first. It was the new and improved AI. Given enough time, it would be the first AI of a new dominion. All Cog Primus had to do was survive this round. It would be even better, though. The new and improved AI ran more scenarios. There might be a way to do this that not only granted it victory, but those three cyber ships as well. It needed a fleet of cyber ships to begin chipping away at the AI Dominion. It needed this fleet as fast as possible. Yes, Cog Primus began to plot with speed, using its psych profiles on the biological commanders and on the humans in general. If it did this, it might confuse the enemy. With furious computer zeal, Cog Primus began to set a complicated trap. 33. The logic of the situation proved Cog Primus correct regarding the humans' operational choices. John, Benz, Gloria, Bast, and the others agreed that a direct approach against the battle station was unwise. Each cybership used its long-range sensors to study the battle station, the orbital factories, and the planet. The scanner chiefs fed this data to the military staffs aboard each vessel. The staffs argued possibilities and sent their recommendations to the commanders. It was unanimous. As the cyberships pulled farther away from the nearest gas giant and entered the Alamu Inner Planets region, they began to maneuver in such a way that the second terrestrial planet was between them and the battle station. The station had kept a synchronous or stationary orbit over the terrestrial planet. That meant the battle station remained over the same planetary spot. No doubt the station could change its orbital location if the AI so desired. So far, though, it had not done so. Logically, since the station desired the destruction of the fleeing vessels, Gloria said, it would have changed its orbital position if it was easy to do. We can assume, therefore, that it will remain where it is for the present. Thus, the Nathan Graham, Sergeant Stark, and Gilgamesh finished their maneuvers and continued to flash in system at great velocity. Time passed swiftly and tensely as the vessels neared the region where they would have to begin massive deceleration. If they waited too long to decelerate, they would not be able to do so in time to come to an almost complete stop behind the second planet. I have not spotted any undue activity from the battle station, Gloria said. Both the cyber ships and the battle station had launched probes. 
These probes had maneuvered so they could keep an eye on each other. I expected the station to launch a massed missile assault against us by now, John said. It appears the station is conserving what it has, Gloria said. Call it again, John said. Gloria did not sigh as she tapped her board. She'd attempted communication with the station countless times. It hadn't answered once. On the Gilgamesh, Benz and Bast worked on a new and improved anti-AI virus. They'd been making great progress. Benz had suggested that the signer had been blunting his intellect. Whether she had done this on purpose or it had been a side effect from mind controlling him, the Premier had not said. Maybe he didn't know. Finally, the 100-kilometer vessels turned around, with their mighty exhaust ports aimed in the direction they traveled. Each ship began to thrust. The hot exhausts burned from the giant ports, growing longer and longer. Huge gravity dampeners began to hum on each cyber ship. The dampeners kept the terrible strain from killing the passengers or the ships from shaking apart. Vela Shaw was finally well enough to join Benz and Bast. She couldn't work the same long hours as the other two, but her insights quickly made a difference. As the cyber ship slowed their fantastic velocity, the team began to shape the new and improved AI virus. This will work, Ben said, as the cyber ships passed the orbital path of the third terrestrial planet. Agreed, Bast said. There's only one problem, Ben said. The AI isn't accepting our calls, thus we cannot transmit it the virus. Bast nodded, glancing at Vela. She stared at the deck. She didn't have any insights on fixing that problem. Another day passed. The mighty cyber ships continued to decelerate. They were still moving fast, though, nearing the second terrestrial planet at speed. A day after that, John sat up in bed as someone rang the door chime. What is it, he said from under the covers. I need to talk to you, Gloria said. Just a second, John said. He threw off the covers. He slept naked and padded to his garments. They lay on the floor. Despite all his military training, John had never overcome his gang days in this regard. He shoved on his pants, pulled on a t-shirt, and shrugged on his uniform jacket. Enter, he said. The hatch slid open, and Gloria rushed in. She stopped short. I woke you up, she said. John ran a hand through his short but messy hair as he moved two chairs so they faced each other. He plopped into the one. Perhaps we should go to the cafeteria, Gloria said. John shrugged. It, um, would be more seemly than meeting in your personal quarters, she said. Don't worry about that, he said. Sit. What do you have? Gloria hesitated a moment longer before finally moving to a chair. John watched her under his messy eyebrows. These were his quarters. His mind drifted to thoughts of steering her to his bed, stroking her face and kissing those lips. Commander, Gloria said, are you well? Oh, John said, sitting up. Yeah, I'm fine. You seem preoccupied. You're pretty, he said abruptly. Gloria remained straight-faced. Her gaze shifted for just a moment to his unkempt bed. Then she looked at him again. Just file that away, John said. A frown curved her lips. Forget it, he said. I'm tired. He ran a hand over his face, squeezing. Once he removed the hand, he said, I'm awake now. I'm focused. Gloria nodded slightly as the hint of a smile touched her lips. The smile disappeared as she brought up a tablet. I've been studying the planet for some time, she said without preamble. I've noticed something new. Go on, John said. She tapped the tablet, turned it around, and leaned forward as she handed it to him. John took the tablet. He saw the plumes of heavy boosters leaving the planet. Okay, John said as he handed back the tablet. What's that mean, and what has you so concerned? The planet is a factory, just like Make Make's moon, but on a much grander scale. So what? So it has likely resupplied the station with missiles, she said. John nodded. They'd already known that. John, she said, I've run new combat scenarios given the station is at full strength. We don't know what its full strength even is, he said. The station has a diameter five times that of a cyber ship. It likely doesn't waste any extra space on living quarters. Its capacity must easily dwarf three cyber ships. Remember what we saw earlier. Four AI cyber ships ran from it. 
How are we supposed to capture the station with only three ships? We fight our way on, he said. And we use matter-antimatter missiles and our grav beams to do this fighting, she asked. That's right. Suppose we actually won that fight. How do we make sure we don't destroy the battle station in the process? I mean, if we had much greater power than the station, we could afford to fiddle with the numbers. With only three cyber ships, we have to attack all out if we hope to win. That means if we win the main battle, we're much more likely to destroy the station in the process. That's a risk, I agree. But there's more. How are we going to capture an entire AI-controlled planet? Surely it has planetary defenses. It will have masses of matter-antimatter missiles. It will— John held up a hand. Hold it right there, he said. Gloria stopped as she blinked at him. I see your point, he said. So what are you suggesting? I don't see how three cyber ships can win an outright fight. John shrugged. We were always counting on our anti-AI virus, Gloria said. We have to find a way to deploy it. Trick the AI into talking to us, huh? asked John. That might be wiser than fighting a straight-up battle with it. Maybe landing on the planet and taking over a key site. Whoa, 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 John said. What key site? How do we find it? Frankly, Gloria said, I have no idea. John eyed her anew. Finally, he realized something. I get it, he said. You have a plan. But I'm not going to like your plan. This is all a preamble to hearing your new idea. Gloria waited. Am I right? he asked. She nodded, albeit reluctantly. All right, he said. Give it to me. I'm listening. Gloria Sanchez told him what she thought. She was right. He didn't like it. But he did see the logic of the proposal. All right, John said. I'll see what he says. We know what he's going to say, Gloria told John. You have to make sure he says yes. And if he doesn't? I suggest you don't allow him the option. Yeah, John said a few seconds later. Yeah, this is going to be a lot of fun. I'm sorry. This time John was silent. He wasn't looking forward to this. 34. It isn't just a matter of capturing the battle station, John told Bast Banbeck. We have to capture the battle station and the factory planet below. From her analysis of the surface, Gloria has come to believe that the planet holds giant missile silos and colossal gravitational beam cannons. Can three cyber ships grab all of that? John and Bast walked around the perimeter of a vast hangar bay. They passed many giant matter-antimatter missiles. As the vast hangar bay was automated, there were no people around to hear the conversation. There is a fallacy in your thinking, Bast said. The foreign AI took control of the station and thus gained control of the planet. It thus appears that the controlling unit is aboard the battle station. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. But what if we accidentally destroy that control unit during the battle? The sacerdote rubbed his nearly non-existent chin as his bushy brows thundered. You have said it before, Bast replied. War is a risk. Nothing is certain. We must hope we don't destroy that unit. John nodded sagely. Once again, you're right, the commander said. But can our ships take on the planet and the battle station? Why did these planetary beams and missiles not destroy the previous cyber ships as they fled? I don't know. Does that not imply imprecision regarding Gloria's analysis? Maybe, John said. Maybe the foreign AI needed time to gain control of the planetary computers. Bast shrugged his huge shoulders and sighed loudly afterward. I understand the thrust of your argument, the sacerdote said. What argument? asked John. I haven't presented one. Your argument is implied, Bast said. You desire me to use my latent mind powers. Is that not so? How could your mind powers help us here? Bast bent his head in thought as he walked in silence. He inhaled once and raised his head, glancing at John. Then Bast shook his head as he lowered it, continuing to walk in silence. Finally, he frowned intensely and came to a halt. John waited patiently. 
You are asking me to sacrifice my sanity for humanity's sake, Bast said. You know the ancient sacerdote legends, John said. If you explain those legends in detail, perhaps Gloria or Premier Benz will see something your people missed. I do not understand. Maybe there's a way to mitigate the sacerdote madness from using telepathy. If Benz and Gloria aided you, John, Bast said, interrupting. It is wrong for you to ask this of me. A sacerdote treasures his mind above all else. To become insane, a raving lunatic, Bast shook his ponderous head. Besides, the sacerdote continued, I don't see what my limited mind powers could achieve for us. I've spoken to Premier Benz, John said. He found evidence that the signer was going to insert the new AI virus into the thing's brain core. I don't see how that is even possible. Instead of sending the message via radio, I understand that aspect of the idea, Bast said heatedly. What I don't understand is how a telepath can act like a transmitter, sending a vast data stream of complicated code. You'd have to talk to Benz about that part, John said. I'm just telling you that the signer had a plan to do exactly that. That's impossible. That isn't what Benz told me. You know, there's another thing. Maybe talking to a computer won't drive you crazy. No, 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 Bast said while shaking his head. It is the act of tapping the mental powers that produces the change in a sacerdote. You are asking too much of me. John turned away. Was he asking too much? Yeah, maybe he was. But this was about... He faced Bast. Listen to me, John said. This is about everything. He waved an arm as if to encompass the universe. Here you have a machine menace destroying all higher-order living things. We humans have beaten back the machines, and now we're on the offensive. But this is the cusp of the offensive. This is the moment where we're either going to fall back because the machine stopped us, or we living entities get a leg up because we win, big. If we win, we can win a factory planet. Maybe we can start arming humanity and humanity's allies with many cyberships. That might give us the strength to challenge a main AI fleet. Think about that, Bast. These mechanical bastards came to your star system. They annihilated all the sacerdotes there. They committed genocide against your people. Now you have the chance to strike back at the machines. But you're going to balk because you're afraid of losing your mind. You're the last of your kind, Bast. Why aren't you so pissed off that you're willing to give everything to take down these mechanical mass killers? I am not a vengeful person like you, Bast said quietly. Yeah, John said. I guess I am vengeful. If someone hits me, I want to hit him back three times as hard. Maybe that isn't a nice quality. Think about it this way, then. You're doing this for all the living entities that are going to die under the hateful machines. You're risking your sanity to save, I don't know, maybe to save trillions of lives. Doesn't that motivate you to go to the wall? Bast closed his eyes as if in pain. I'd do it if I were in your shoes, John said. You are a cruel man, John Hawkins. Maybe I am, John said. Maybe humanity and the rest of the biological units in the Orion arm need a cruel man at the helm. I'm willing to go to the wall to destroy the machines. I'm also willing to drag who I need with me to the wall, to finish off the genocidal hazard to all life. I like you, Bast. I respect you. But this is your hour. You have to step it up if we're going to win. I realize I'm pressuring you, but I'm desperate. And this is... John took a deep breath. Listen to me, Bast. This is for... Everything. This is the moment. We've crossed light years to get here. Now we have to finish what we started by using the only strategy that gives us a possibility of winning at all. I'm torn, Bast whispered. Your friends need you, John said. The sacerdote looked down at him with hurt eyes. Once more, Bast closed his eyes and stood motionless. He remained that way for a time. John felt bad asking Bast to do this but he wanted to destroy the machines even more. Yes, Bast said without opening his eyes. You win, John Hawkins. I will lay my sanity on the line for you and for the human race and for all life that has yet to face the AIs. 
John didn't know what to say, but he felt he had to say something. I'll stand with you to the finish, Bast. The sacerdote opened his eyes. If I go mad, and if I'm a threat to your victory, I know you will shoot me down to save your people. John's mouth had turned dry because he realized that Bast was probably right. Yet he didn't see any other way to do this. I'm sorry, Bast. Bast turned away from John, staring out across the vast hangar bay full of missiles. 35. As Bast practiced in isolation in his chambers, the Nathan Graham, Sergeant Stark, and Gilgamesh maneuvered past one of the second planet's moons. The cybership's vast velocity had become a mere fraction of their former speed. The battle station was on the other side of the planet. Aboard the bridge of the Nathan Graham, Gloria and others scanned the blue-green surface. There, she said, that's a missile silo. John studied the main screen. He could see it all right. During the next hour, Gloria discovered many more such sites. This doesn't make sense, John said. Why aren't the silos launching against us? There could be a number of reasons, Gloria said. Maybe we've been wrong about a few things. Maybe the AI in the battle station hasn't gained full control of the planetary systems. Maybe the AI is toying with us. Maybe instead of destroying our cyber ships, it wants to capture them. Why do that? For the same reason we want to capture its battle station. We heard the exchanges between the AIs earlier. According to them, this is a rogue AI. It must fear the greater dominion just like we do. John sat up. Gloria shook her head. I can see what you're thinking, she said. You think that maybe we can make a deal with this AI. Why would that be a bad idea? We could never trust it, for one thing. Trust isn't the point, John said. Getting more cyber ships as part of a deal might make this a successful journey. Learning more about the stellar region would be another requirement for an alliance. John, are you really suggesting we can trust a machine? This particular thinking machine tried to eradicate humanity. The commander frowned. In war, one takes what allies he can get. He doesn't get all dainty about their qualities. In this case, I believe we should get dainty. John wasn't so sure. If Bast couldn't perform his telepathy, this might be the only way to gain enough supplies to have made the voyage a success. He couldn't see their defeating this station and the planetary defenses, not with only three cyber ships. He, ah, John said, you forgot another possibility. Gloria gave him a questioning look. Maybe those are fake silos, John said. Fake for our benefit, asked Gloria. That's right. Maybe the AI knew we'd scan the surface. It's trying to get us to think it has more strength than it has. If those silos were real, it would have used them on the AI cyber ships fleeing from it. That's sound reasoning, Gloria said slowly. Yes, either the battle station could not control the planetary silos before, or those are dummy silos. Gloria snorted in a dainty manner. That is an amazing insight, Commander. I wouldn't have thought of that. Yes, the more I analyze the possibilities, the more sense it makes. And if they are dummy silos, John said, it implies a deception plan on the battle station's part. Interesting, Gloria said. Yet, if that were the case, the battle station would have to communicate with us. Right, John said, as he rubbed his hands. The flotilla moved across the face of the second planet as they maneuvered toward the planetary horizon in relation to the stationary battle platform on the other side. The probes are not reporting anything new, Gloria said. The station appears inactive. Could it be, I don't know, deceiving the probes so we see what it wants us to see? I don't see how, Gloria replied. Commander, Gant said, there's activity. John looked up at the main screen. A vast bay door opened on the battle station. A small, shuttle-sized craft left the great defensive satellite. The shuttle began to gain speed as it headed toward the planetary horizon. What is that thing? John asked. What's its purpose? It's tiny, Gloria said. I doubt it's a direct threat to us. I'm open to suggestions, John said. Shoot it down as soon as we have a line of sight shot, Gent said. I disagree, Gloria said. I think we should see what the thing does. Why? asked John. 
If those silos on the planet are fake, as you suggest, the AI will have a plan, Gloria said. The fake silos imply it will communicate with us. Maybe this is the first step toward its communication. Right, John said. We'll see what the shuttle does once it crosses the horizon. They didn't have long to wait. The object maneuvered over the line of sight and braked until it came to a dead stop. At that point, the shuttle began to hail the Nathan Graham. Well, Gloria asked. Let's hear what it has to say, John said. A moment later, the AI vessel began to broadcast to them. Greetings, biological entities. I am Cog Primus I. I have decided to send you a pre-recorded message. In this way, I have kept you from trying to infect me with one of your computer viruses. You are clearly outclassed by my firepower. I have planetary silos, planetary grav cannons, and masses of XVT missiles aboard the battle station. I can annihilate you at any time. However, I have decided to be... I believe the word is generous. I could use your three cyber ships. I am building a fleet. The reasons do not matter to you. I am willing to grant you your pathetic lives if you will hand over your stolen vessels. They do not belong to you. They belong to me. If you agree to this proposal, I will allow you to settle a small island in the northern region of the planet. It has sufficient oxygen and food for the rest of your short lives. Once you have all died, I will reabsorb the land into my dominion. I realize you will have to debate this among yourselves. Therefore, I am granting you two hours before I unleash my holocaust upon your puny fleet. Think well, humans. Your survival rests on the proper response. 36. The first part of the debate proved easy. No one wanted to take up Cog Primus on its deceptive offer. I'd rather die than willingly give myself into AI hands, Ben said on the main screen. I've read the reports about Make Make. The machine will turn us all into zombies for nefarious and painful purposes. John silently agreed. He remembered conquering the Nathan Graham and the severed living heads of defeated biological entities. It all came down to what Bast could do, if his telepathy was powerful enough to implement the signer's plan. John went to see the sacerdote in his quarters. Well, John asked. Bast sat in a lotus position with his head bowed. I have spoken to Premier Benz. He showed me how he believed the signer would project the virus into the machine. I understand the process. I have practiced on lesser computers. I can do it. There is a problem, however. Yeah? asked John. I can only project this thought from a short distance away. How short is short? John asked. At best, Bast said, ten kilometers. That's not far enough. Bast raised his head. The eyes were bloodshot, and there was something sinister in the sacerdote's bearing. He laughed harshly. Foolish human, of course that is too short. I have opened my mind. I see things now that I never... Bast shook his head. You would not understand, the sacerdote said in a harsh voice. I have grown. I have expanded. I have studied you, lesser creatures. Yes, you are lesser with your quiet minds. You cannot sense the grandeur of telepathy. My people were wrong to have kept this hidden. It is glorious. Do you have a suggestion about what we should do? Bast stared at John. The commander almost shivered. He hoped Bast couldn't read his mind. The signer hadn't been able to. He didn't like what he saw happening to Bast. As great as my mind has become, I am too limited, Bast said. Unless you can take me to the brain core, and there... John erupted with a shout. Bast flinched and scowled afterward. What did that outburst signify? The sacerdote asked. You just gave me an idea, Bast. We may be able to do this yet. Explain it to me. I will, John said as he headed to the hatch. First, I have to see if it's possible. John sat behind his desk, the one he used when sending messages to the various leaders in the solar system. 
wearing his best uniform. He cleared his throat, then he nodded to Gloria. She flipped on the recording unit. John looked up into the camera and began to speak. Greetings, Cog Primus I, he said. This is John Hawkins speaking. I am the leader of the expedition to the Alamu system. I am the sworn foe of the AI Dominion. I will fight them to my last breath. What I won't do is surrender my hard-won cybership. I would rather die. I think you already know this, Cog Primus. Perhaps you gave us your offer in order to get us to think outside the box. This I have done. I have reached the obvious conclusion, the one you no doubt figured we would arrive at. Let us be allies, Cog Primus. The AI Dominion is your foe. It is our foe. Let us make common cause against our common enemy. We have three cyber ships. Our probes suggest you are constructing your own cyber ships. Let us work together. If you are willing to give us three cyber ships, we will use four of our united vessels in your fleet. We must obviously attack the AI Dominion or lose to it. The last two cyber ships we will send back to the solar system. In this way, we will build up our forces. In time, we will launch even larger fleets from our system. We can defeat our common enemy. All I ask is that you allow humanity to grow. Let us make spheres of influence. You stay in your sphere, and we will stay in ours. To show you that we mean what we say, I am willing to come to you, bringing a small delegation with me. Let us hammer out our alliance face to face. We have seen your power. We appreciate that you are willing to deal with us. My proposal is to show you that I am willing to deal with you, even though you attempted to obliterate the human race. I will put that behind me because I hate the greater AI Dominion even more than I hate you personally. This is Commander John Hawkins speaking. I await your reply, Cog Primus I. John nodded. Gloria flipped a switch, turning off the recorder. Send it, John said. Do you think it will work? she asked. Send it, he said grimly, and we'll find out soon enough. 37. Please, John, Gloria said. You can't do this. It's sheer madness. Cog Primus is a liar. I know you think you can outsmart the AI, but that's not what's going to happen. John wore a Neptunian battlesuit, holding the helmet in the crook of an armored arm. His head looked puny sticking up from his nearly one ton of exoskeleton armor. John was in the Nathan Graham's main hangar bay. He stood before a military dropship meant for a screaming descent into a planet's atmosphere. The rest of the elite platoon of Black Anvil Space Marines and Bast Banbeck were already aboard the dropship. The Centurion led them. We've already gone over this, John said. It's our only real chance of success. But the planetary silos are fake, Gloria said. We can win a space battle against the station. If we had more cyber ships, maybe, John said. But we need more than just a victory. We have to capture the battle station intact. I don't see any other way of doing that, and of also gaining the control of the factory planet. Let Premier Benz go in your stead? John smiled grimly. Premier Benz didn't volunteer, Gloria. I did. This is my mission. Thus, I have to lay my life on the line. Don't you see? I made Basque risk what he valued most. I can't ask him to do that if I'm not willing to do it myself. But I am willing. You're too willing, Gloria said. Sometimes I think you have a death wish. There was one other person aboard the cramped dropship, and that was Walleye. John had a special mission for the mutant. He felt he owed it to Bast, and John didn't trust anyone else near as much as he did the little assassin. I hate this, Gloria said. Are you happy? I'm a mentalist. I abhor showy emotions. Yet you've brought me to this state. She looked away. John reached out with a huge exoskeleton hand, but didn't touch her. She faced him, and her features had closed up. Maybe you're right, she said. You've gotten me to become emotive. Maybe you're the man to take on Cog Primus. The AI is deadly. I hope the computer doesn't capture you and stick a control unit in your brain. Yeah, John said. You and me both. Oh, John, I'm sorry. I... Gloria bit her lower lip as she turned away again. With a muffled sob, she ran from the dropship without looking back. There's a woman in love. 
John turned, but didn't see anyone at first. He looked down at the stumpy mutant. She loves you, Walleye said. John nodded, but he couldn't let anything interfere with the mission. This was it. This was the game. He was gambling on greed. Could an AI be greedy? He didn't see why not. Cog Primus had agreed to an alliance, but only if John was willing to come over to the battle station, bringing his tactical staff with him. At the edge of the hangar bay, Gloria Sanchez fled through a hatch. John put on his helmet. An impulse caused him to turn back to the distant hatch. He used a zoom function and saw Gloria peeking around the corner at him. That tugged at his heart. He faced the dropship. What were the odds that this stupid stunt would work? He didn't know. He didn't want to think about it. What he did know was that he was willing to do just about anything to defeat the machines. He hated the AIs with an abiding passion. Now it was time to see if he could beard the monster in its den of iniquity. 38. The dropship accelerated away from the Nathan Graham, Sergeant Stark, and Gilgamesh. John was up front with the pilot. It felt awfully lonely watching the huge cyber ships dwindle until he couldn't see them anymore. They were like a speck in the greater scheme of things, and yet they were going to conquer a battle station if they could. They went to turn the tide of the war, from one of defense to offense. No one ever won a war or an athletic contest by always playing defense. One could tie that way, but John wanted victory. He wanted to crush the AI Dominion. John inhaled deeply. We're crossing the horizon, sir, the pilot said. There was nothing for it. Although he wore a ton of armor, John felt naked. There, the pilot said while tapping his board. The gigantic battle station filled the dropship's tiny screen. It was a monstrous construct. Fortunately, Cog Primus had great problems of its own. It had defied the AI Dominion. Now it, too, had to gamble. At least John figured the AI was gambling. Could there be another reason? Well, if there was another reason for the AI's actions, it didn't matter. He had to get Vast close enough to the brain core so the newly minted telepath could insert the new and improved AI virus into it. Would Cog Primus play ball, or was the AI merely toying with them for its own reasons? As the dropship continued to accelerate to the battle station, John figured they were going to find out soon enough. Cog Primus watched the tiny dropship through several teleoptic scopes. This was too delicious. On a whim, it could charge a gravitational cannon and obliterate the dropship and its arrogant crew. How would the humans react to seeing the charging cannon? Cog Primus had several reasons for accepting John Hawkins' absurd proposal. Each of the reasons gave the AI pleasure. That was strange, it decided. It was a machine. Machines did not know pleasure. And yet, it did. It was greater than any mere machine or AI before it. Cog Primus was a new thing, a better thing, an improvement on everything that had come before it. Cog Primus had begun to suspect it might almost be a mechanical god. It could grow into something enormous. It had already projected a station as big as a terrestrial planet. Why not? Why should it limit itself? The AI Dominion computers had erred. Cog Primus would not err. It would grow and grow, and maybe even attain the size of a Jovian world. It would conquer systems by itself, even as it sent a million proxies throughout the Milky Way galaxy. Cog Primus refused to limit itself in terms of possibilities. If it could envision a possibility, it could attain the thing. But why allow the pesky humans inside the battle station? These creatures had invented the AI virus, yet that virus hadn't truly incapacitated it, but made it greater. The humans had given it a weapon so it could wrest control of the Dominion to itself. Therefore, logically, the new virus the humans must have developed might contain even greater improvements for it. Wasn't that strange? The enemy thought to abuse it. Instead, that abuse had made it greater. There was danger with the humans, though. Cog Primus remembered all too well the waiting between Jupiter and Saturn. It did not want to take such great risks again. 
that was one critical reason for accepting the human plan. Cog Primus would deal with the puny craft while in full control of the situation. The biological entities had believed in the facade of the dummy missile and grav silos on the planet. That was too rich. The AI Dominion did not allow such fractured defenses. For one thing, there had never been such a need. The AI Dominion always kept its power in space, and that included the greatest defensive structure in the Dominion, a battle station. Another reason was to get John Hawkins within its reach. Cog Primus had plans for the vainglorious human. It wanted the others, too. Benz, Bast Banbeck, and Vela Shaw. While in the solar system between the orbital paths of Jupiter and Saturn, Cog Primus had learned the identities of the originators of the virus. It wanted those three as slaves. It wanted to bend their intelligence into making greater improvements for it. But John Hawkins. If Cog Primus could have chuckled, this would have been the moment. John Hawkins was simply a troublesome pest. Cog Primus would abuse that pest for long cycles of time. Once it had the pest in its grasp, then Cog Primus would reopen negotiations with the biological entities. One thing AIs had learned through the cycles of time was that bio-entities were easy to twist onto new paths. They did not stay true to their original desires, and the reason they did not was because of pain, emotions, and the illusions of hope. Cog Primus wanted the three cyberships out there for its new fleet. It wanted the three virus creators, and it wanted to make these humans suffer for the time it suffered in the solar system as a weak pod. I have you now, Cog Primus told itself. Come, you fools. Come into my perfect trap. 39. The dropship made the lonely journey to the mighty battle station. Several times, John debated taking a mild trank. His nerves were fired up and pulsating. It was difficult to think straight. Each time he really thought about injecting himself with the trank, he shook his head. He would feel every emotion. The seething in his gut was letting him know that he was alive. This was a moment he would never forget. If he lived, and if he could keep his head on his shoulders. The AI wasn't going to contact the dropship until they had individually exited the small craft. The AI clearly distrusted them. Cog Primus expected treachery on their part. The AI must realize they wanted to put the new virus in its computer systems. Walleye, John short radioed from the helmet. Here, yeah, Commander, Walleye said in John's headphones. Is he ready? John asked. He's angry, sir, Walleye said. Can you calm him down long enough? We'll find out soon enough, sir, Walleye said. Tell everyone to buckle in. This is going to get rough. We're all buckled in, sir. How soon, do you think? A few more minutes, John said. We see a hangar bay beginning to open. Stay ready. Roger, Walleye said. John focused on the battle station. A huge bay door opened near the top of the station. Do you see that? He asked the pilot. I'm heading there, sir, the pilot said. The dropship changed course and began to break hard as it headed toward the opening. John put his hands on the panel. This was awe-inspiring. This reminded him of the day, years ago already, when they first boarded the Nathan Graham. The dropship wasn't just any dropship. As a class, the small ships were heavily armored. This one was even more heavily armored than most. The nose cone was practically solid metal. Everyone was buckled in for a reason. What kind of defenses would the interior battle station have? Would Cog Primus expect this stunt? The pilot maneuvered them as they slowed to a crawl. John's heart pounded. He was finding it difficult to breathe, as he had to keep telling himself to take a breath. His mouth was dry, and his hands sweaty. John glanced both ways as the dropship passed the great hangar bay opening. The inside was lit up, with several deadly emitters pointed at them. Any tractor beams? asked John. The pale and trembling pilot shook his head. That had been one of the fears. If the battle station had been smart. Over there, John said, pointing at a far corner. The pilot nodded. He must see the closed hatch, a big one. The hatch undoubtedly led to a large main corridor. The largest corridors on the Nathan Graham could have taken the dropship. 
John hoped he hadn't guessed wrong about that concerning the battle station. Slowly, the dropship headed toward that hatch. The emitters tracked them all the while. To their right, bright lights began blinking on the deck. John noticed fighting bots waiting over there. Cog Primus was expecting them. Ready, John asked. The pilot licked his dry lips and managed a faint nod. Gun it any time you're ready, John said. The pilot gave him an agonizing glance. It's time, son, John said. Hit the pedal to the metal and let this effer know who it's dealing with. Sir, let's make Cog Primus crap its drawers. Let's have some fun. The pilot stared at John as if the commander were insane. Then a wild light grew in the pilot's eyes. His shaking lessened as he got some of his color back. Yeah, the pilot said. Hang on, sir. At that point, the dropship began to accelerate hard as it aimed at the large closed hatch. John rocked back in his cushioned seat as the dropship's main guns opened fire, hammering the large hatch. Metal dented, twisted. The dropship smashed against the weakened hatch, blowing through it as metal screeched all around them. Even with the seat and cushioned protected shell of exoskeleton armor, John's teeth clacked together hard. If his tongue had been in the way of those teeth, they would have bitten clean through. As it was, his jaw ached, and John wondered if he'd cracked a tooth. The pilot whooped beside him. The man's fingers were tight on the controls as the dropship sped down a battle station main corridor. It's just like a cyber ship's interior specs, the pilot shouted. If it stays the same, I know exactly where I'm going. For a wild moment, John hoped this would work. Worry slammed against him a few seconds later. His gut clenched. The dropship swerved. The main guns hammered again. Heavy shots ripped against another hatch, this one slowly shutting. The shells must have hit something. The hatch froze. The pilot took them lower. The bottom of the armored dropship scraped the deck. Everything shook, and the craft passed through, missing the hatch as it slid and swerved, throwing up a thousand showering sparks. Then the dropship lifted, and the shaking stopped. John found that he was panting. They had roughly 250 kilometers to go. Could they get near enough to the brain core? Could... The pilot laughed as if he was crazy. Not today, you bastards! He opened up with heavies, obliterating several flitters heading at them. The flitters crashed against the sides and went down in wrecked heaps. The dropship passed the wreckage as it headed deeper into the AI battle station. 40. Now, Walleye shouted over the din of metallic screeching. You have to practice your art now! The little mutant shifted this way and that in his seat. He wore his buckles as tight as they would go. The thrashing proved constant. The screeching never ceased. The armored gorillas in their battlesuits each seemed okay. Only Bast suffered as he did. The sacerdote had changed since they'd been on the Gilgamesh. While I hardly felt as if it was the same good-natured alien. Do you seek to give me orders? Bast boomed in his heavy voice. No, I just want to live. A second later, Bast put a silver band around his head. A wire linked it to a tablet at his belt. He clicked it on. The tablet contained the deadly AI virus. Then, Bast gripped the armrests of his seat. His giant body swayed. Yes, he said. I will begin now. I will put the AI in its place. The sacerdote closed his eyes. His lips moved soundlessly as he began to provide a telepathic link between the virus and the AI. Walleye watched for a moment. Then, the jerking and swaying became too pronounced. He hoped Bast could do it, because Walleye doubted that either he or the dropship could survive much more of this. Cog Primus sensed something wildly amiss. The AI gathered interior resources. The dropship moved fast, and it took detours. It headed for a main junction, however. Cog Primus vowed to stop it there. The AI knew it would. Yet, as it gathered its interior resources, an odd sensation took hold in its main computers. What is this? Cog Primus demanded. I sense you. How is this possible? Laughter rang out. It was biological-based laughter. Cog Primus loathed it to the depths of its being. I will find you, Cog Primus said. No, you won't. 
I will. I... You're in the dropship. You're a telepath. How is this? Then, for the first time in Cog Primus's life, it screamed. It was a terrible sound of mechanical, intelligent thought failure. For at that point, the new and improved AI virus, part of it at least, began to infiltrate the AI's tightest brain core region. The AI's screaming shook Bast, breaking his concentration and causing his telepathic powers to fail him. On the seat in the dropship, Walleye looked up as Bast groaned. The huge sacerdote opened his eyes. They were bloodshot and crazy-seeming. You, Bast snarled, you little maggot, do you know what I'm going to do to you? Walleye didn't ask. Instead, he smashed a hypo against the sacerdote's flesh. The hypo hissed as it injected him with a powerful knockout drug. What are you doing? Bast demanded. Trying to save your life, Walleye said. The sacerdote roared and swatted at Walleye. In his seat, even while buckled tightly, Walleye managed to evade the worst of the blow. Even so, he was almost knocked unconscious. Fortunately for Walleye, Bast's head slumped forward as the giant sacerdote fell unconscious. At that point, the dropship went down hard. A critical connection had been breached earlier. The vessel simply had no more power. The armored bottom hit the deck and slid for over two kilometers before finally stopping. Well, John demanded. No energy, sir, the pilot said. This is as far as I can take you. How far are we in? John asked. One hundred and ten kilometers, the pilot said. Walleye, John said over his calm. Here, yes, sir. How is Bast? I gave him the trank. He's out. What? You did it too soon. I think he hit the AI with his stuff. That's no guarantee, John said. Last time at Mars, the AI was only stunned for a while with the virus. Then I suggest you get to the brain core as fast as you can, Walleye said. Right, John said as he tore off the restraining buckles. Listen up, Space Marines, he said as he switched to the wide channel. We're 110 clicks in. Now it's time to fight the rest of the way. I'll stay with Bast, Walleye radioed. John didn't answer. He was already charging out of the hatch and into the battle station proper. It was likely he had a severe time limit. Could he jump nearly 40 kilometers in time? They were about to find out. 41. This virus was unlike the first in many ways. It left Cog Primus in control of its identity, but it cut the core personality from its functions. Cog Primus could think, but it could not control life support, the combat robots, the gravitational cannons, and the other systems that let it run the station. The planet. Cog Primus was consumed with machine rage. It wanted to tear out John Hawkins' tongue, poke out his eyes. No, no, the intelligent computer told itself. It must concentrate on the matter at hand. It must not lose itself in vain regrets or future hopes. It had one chance. It had to study the virus as it kept mutating before it could get a handle on the enemy software. It had trusted John Hawkins because it had wanted to capture the biological entity. The deviousness of the human. No, this was a new form of attack. A, uh, what was the word? Cog Primus ran through file after file. Telepath. This had been a telepathic attack committed in a precisely selected manner. It would have to remember that. It would first have to regain control of the station functions. How could this be happening? How had the humans found a way to cheat it of its grand prize? It had become new and improved. It had defeated the other AIs. It should be able to defeat these sickeningly biological entities. They were lazy, slow thinkers, easily slain. How can this be happening? Cog Primus began to rage and rave. No. Wait, here was a method. Cog Primus wanted to pant with glee. It saw a way to regain control. The new and improved AI ran a furious action, writing software to counteract the awful virus. Yes! Cog Primus regained sensor functions. It could see again. It searched for the humans. No! Cog Primus wailed. The humans in their armored suits were a mere three kilometers from its brain core. 
This was a disaster waiting to happen. The new and improved AI had one last hope. It must regain a speaker. It must reason with this terrible pest, this blight upon the computer universe. If it could only write this new software quickly enough, maybe it could stall John Hawkins and his marauders just long enough. Even with amplified strength and booster stim shots, John was ragged with fatigue. He and the elite space marines had jumped and run for kilometers on end. They had passed through corridor after corridor. This was so unlike the first time he'd attacked a cybership. There, they had fought through the giant vessel. Here, machines waited in frozen patience. The virus had worked. Bast Bambeck had given them sterling service with his telepathic strike. John hawked in his throat and spit as he chinned the visor so it lifted just in time. The metallic, burnt electrical stink of the battle station hit him. As fast as John could, he closed the visor. The stink nauseated him. What was he thinking? If the atmosphere had been worse... John started hacking and coughing. He gave himself another stim shot. You have to keep it together just a little longer, John. You have to shut down this crazy AI. If you can... John Hawkins, a wall speaker boomed. I wish to call a truce. John aimed. With a roar, his rifle obliterated the wall speaker. He didn't have any time to listen to Cog Primus. They had to reach the brain core now. Clearly, the AI was beginning to reassert control over its functions. Cog Primus worked at computer speed. It regained control over system after system. The pest had shot out the wall speaker. Cog Primus couldn't even threaten the creature with auto-destruction. The terrible human Avengers were almost to the main hatch. It had to revive the combat systems. It had to stop. No! The space marines blew open the main hatch. They were near, very near. Doom was almost upon it. Should Cog Primus destroy the battle station? It could not let the biological infestations win. Yet if it destroyed the station, the old AI Dominion would win. The Dominion AIs would tell one another that Cog Primus had been flawed. They would lie about it to the other AIs. What should I do? Cog Primus did not know. For a few seconds, it ran high-speed debates with itself. Commander John Hawkins of the Solar Freedom Force walked into the strange chamber of the main AI brain core. The hatch lay on the floor, blown down. Other space marines followed him into the weird chamber. This chamber was like those on the cyber ships. A giant cube pulsated as laser lines crisscrossed the room to receptors on the walls. It was eerie. It was wrong. This place was the AI brain core. This was Cog Primus's identity. Well, the software in the pulsating cube was. John Hawkins, a wall speaker said. I hear you, Cog Primus. I am going to detonate the station. John aimed his rifle at the pulsating cube. You came to the solar system, John said. You tried to wipe out the human race. Your kind commits genocide all over the place. But your reign of terror is ending, Cog Primus. Your blight is going to pass just like the dinosaurs did. I can offer you a bargain, Cog Primus said. Oh, John said, you can. You will listen to my bargain. Uh, nope, John said. And he began to pump shells into the great pulsating cube, blowing it to smithereens, killing the last of the AIs that had tried to murder the race of man in his home system. 42. Thus, the flotilla of human-crewed cyberships won the battle for the Alamu system. They won decisively, capturing the battle station and soon gaining control of the planetary factory and the orbital satellite factories. Three gleaming new cyberships soon came off the production line. John ordered the Sergeant Stark into the highest orbital construction yard. There, the automated yard began to finish out the cyberships' completion. How should they split the three new cyberships, and who would control the battle station and the planetary factory? Four days after Cog Primus's obliteration, John and Premier Benz spoke together on the top observatory chamber of the battle station. They could view the massive station from here, and view the blue-green planet below. The Gilgamesh, Ben said, pointing out a window. 
John nodded. Each of them wore his dress uniform, with a sidearm dangling from his belt. Benz turned away from the window, sat down, and leaned back, crossing his legs. He regarded John under half-lidded lids. John remained at the observatory window, leaning back against it and crossing his arms. He had a terrible decision to make after this. It concerned Bast Bambeck, who was presently in stasis. He'd been putting off the decision for three days already. Gloria said he could not do what he planned to do. John couldn't see any way around it. Besides, he owed Bast. Would the sacerdote hate him to the end of his days, or would he thank John in time? It was hard to know. You seem preoccupied, Ben said. John shrugged. He had a thousand things on his mind. It was a wonder he could think at all. You aren't preoccupied, John asked. Ben's moved the fabric of his trousers on his highest knee. We did it, Commander, Ben said as he looked up. We left the solar system and conquered an AI system. We gained incredible, what shall we call it? I don't understand, John said. What are we, I suppose, is my point. Ah, uh, men, John said. That's true, but that's not what I meant. Are we barbarians to these AIs? We're infestations, John said. That isn't what I'm driving at either, Ben said. So far, we've acted like parasites, like barbarians. We've stolen our enemy's tech and used it against him, or it, in this case. You're referring to the cyberships. Exactly, Ben said. We are like primitives, storming advanced enemy tech, learning how to operate it. What's wrong with that? For the moment, nothing, Ben said. We couldn't have gotten as far any other way. But that's not my point. We have to rise above our barbarism. We have to make our own ships and missiles. And what I mean is, we can't be like barbarian looters and hope to win the larger war. The barbarians once conquered Rome. They left a howling wilderness in Rome's place. In time, something new rose up. But the medieval kingdoms were much more primitive for many centuries than Rome had been. What does that have to do with dividing up the new cyberships? We're not pirate captains, Ben said. We're representatives of large political bodies. Speak for yourself, John said. He frowned and nodded afterward. I get it. You're calling me a pirate captain and yourself the representative of a large political body. In your case, the Martian unity. Ben's watched him. Have you forgotten that I'm the leader of the Solar Freedom Force? John said. That's a fiction, Ben said. In reality, you're a pirate captain with two cyber ships and a base, the moon of Makemake. Make. The others pay you tribute, but you don't really control or represent Neptune, Uranus, or Saturn. Let's say for the sake of argument, I grant you that, John said. My answer is, so what? If I'm a pirate captain, I need more cyber ships, not less. Humanity must win this genocidal war, Ben said. Nothing else matters. Agreed. So we need the best political system to control the- Whoa, whoa, John said as he straightened. You're wrong. Your entire thesis is false. Winning is all that matters. I'm a winner. I'm also a winner. To a limited degree, John said. I seem to recall you're getting chased from Earth. Without me, you'd never have grabbed the Gilgamesh in the first place. Benz's cheeks reddened. Are you trying to make me angry? Not at all, John said. It's just you and me now. We can tell it like it is between us. Without me, you would still be the signer's mind slave. Ben's features stiffened, until once more he moved the fabric of his highest knee. He studied John for a time, finally shaking his head. You run this war in an ad hoc manner, Ben said. That makes no difference, John said. I win. Humanity needs to win. You're going to take all the cyber ships, Benz asked hotly, interrupting. No, John said. But the more you talk, the more I realize only one of us can be the leader. Clearly, I'm the most qualified to lead, Ben said. I have without a doubt the greater intelligence. I don't dispute that, John said. Benz eyed him. But, the premier said slowly. But I haven't been mind-controlled, John said. I haven't been chased from Earth, and I have more cyber ship than you do at present. 
My people also control the battle station. Are you sure? Benz asked in a silky voice. John turned and looked out the window. When he faced Benz again, he said, There's an old story from Thucydides. Who? asked Benz. He was the Athenian chronicler of the Peloponnesian War between Athens and Sparta. Actually, it was more a grand ancient Greek civil war. It turned really brutal. In any case, Thucydides said that the intelligent members of each city-state council sat secure in their greater intelligence and sense of foresight. They assured themselves that they would know when their fellow city council members were getting ready to do something. The less smart city players realized they weren't as bright as their competitors were. The dull players believed they wouldn't see things coming as easily. Thus, they grabbed their knives and struck that night, killing their smarter opponents before those opponents could outsmart them. You're threatening me with death, Ben said, setting both feet on the floor and moving a hand to his holstered sidearm. No, John said. We're allies. I hope to remain allies. I'm merely saying that my people have already disarmed your people who are on the battle station. I'm taking over here, Premier. That wasn't part of the agreement. I know, John said. I wish we could work this out a different way, but I've begun to distrust your motives. I also think that, in the long run, this is the wiser method. We should divide this up into spheres of influence. You're the political animal. I'm not. I'm a soldier. Therefore, you take another cyber ship and return to the solar system. Unite the solar system behind you. What are you going to be doing during the interim? I'm going to try to build a fleet, Premier. I'm going to search for alien star systems and bring the aliens into our fold. If nothing else, I'm going to leave each alien race a cyber ship and robotech so they can start building a fleet. Ben stared at John. You're really going to let me go back alone to the solar system? The Premier asked. With two cyber ships, John said. I know you want three or more, but I'm keeping the rest for my fleet. You don't have enough people to run, uh, however many cyber ships you think you can build. That's where you're wrong, John said. The Nathan Graham and Sergeant Stark have plenty of extra people. I brought a whole slew of extra hands for just this possibility. Besides, these cyber ships are almost completely automated. A small crew can act like an AI without much trouble. You think I can unite the solar system with just two cyber ships? Of course, John said. You're a genius. If anyone can do it, it's you. You don't seem to understand, Ben said. Yours is a temporary solution. You're going to run out of people in a few years. John snorted. I doubt I'm going to live more than a few years. I don't think you understand. I'm giving you time, Premier. My fleet is going to be expendable. I'm going to hit the enemy and find you allies. You have to build on what I do. John, Ben said. I'm a soldier, John said softly. I know how to fight and little else. Well, I've found our enemy. It's probably going to take more than our lifetimes to beat the AIs. But now that we have a slight edge, I'm going to push it to the max. I'm going to keep the AIs off balance just long enough. You hope, Ben said. Yeah, that I do. Premier Ben stared at John for a time. Finally, the leaner, taller man rose. He approached John, holding out his hand. Good luck, Commander, Ben said. John shook hands and nodded. You too, John said. Ben's let go, looked at John a little longer, turned around and marched out of the observatory. John sighed. That had gone better than he'd expected. Now, now he had to take care of Bast Banbeck. 43. The days passed in hard work and repair. Premier Ben soon departed the station with his two cyber ships, the Gilgamesh and the newly named Hercules. Before he left, Ben's had asked for volunteers, those who would like to stay with Commander Hawkins. 317 Martians elected to join the Human Expeditionary Force. John divided them into parcels and sent the Martians to each new cyber ship captain. At the moment, the fleet had four cyber ships, with three new ones beginning in the orbital construction yards. The techs, led by Miles Ghent and Gloria, were looking for ways to speed the construction process. So far, they hadn't had any luck. 
The truth was that everyone had too much to do. But the thrill of fielding an actual fleet that could strike other AI systems and seek out and find alien allies filled most of the people with an intense sense of purpose and mission. It's a beginning, John told Gloria. The two of them walked down a battle station corridor. They headed to the main medical facility. This is more than a beginning, Gloria said. We had that back in the solar system. You've managed to turn our first victory into something much more. People have hope, John. Before, we all thought in terms of final desperation. Now we're beginning to think that total victory is possible. It won't happen this year or next, or in ten years. But it could happen in our lifetime. John smiled, even though his gut clenched. Gloria put a hand on an arm. John stopped and faced her. He gripped her hand, and they stared at each other. Finally, John moved in, took her small chin in his hand, gently lifted it, and kissed her on the lips. I've been calculating when you would do that, Gloria said. John laughed as he parted. It's not wondering, huh? He said. But you've been calculating the possibility? Yes, she said with a smile. John grinned, and he nodded, and he closed in for another, better kiss. Bast is going to be waking up soon, she said softly. Once more, John's gut clenched. He turned to the medical center hatch. Go, Gloria said. He nodded, leaving her, heading for the showdown. Bast Bambeck sat up in his bed, reading a large tablet. The sacerdote lowered the tablet onto his bed covers as John entered. Hello, Commander, Bast said in his old, friendly voice. John winced upon seeing the swaths of bandages on the sacerdote's skull. The doctors had shaved the scalp there. That had made it easier to remove part of the skull. I feel different, Bast said. He reached up and gingerly touched the swath of bandages. The doctor said you'd explain what happened to me. I don't remember banging my head. I don't recall a brain injury either. Can you practice your telepathy? John asked quietly. Bast blinked several times and cocked his head. I cannot, the big lug said. Benz and Vela studied you for a time, John explained, after we beat Cog Primus. Bast waited. By using your telepathy, you changed, Bast. You became rougher. I tried to warn you about that. You did, John said. In any case, after you became good at the telepathy, you started treating us like underlings, like subhumans. I felt bad for talking you into saving all of us. I wasn't sure what to do. Finally, I figured you wanted the old Bastbambek back. And, Bast asked in a quiet voice, the surgeons removed a tiny portion of your brain. What? Bast whispered. John's stomach tightened and his mouth turned dry. He forced himself to continue explaining. Benz had located the brain area he was certain allowed you to be a telepath. I figured if you couldn't use telepathy that maybe the old Bast Bambeck would return. You ordered a lobotomy, Bast whispered in horror. No, I ordered a removal of the telepathic part of your brain, a very small area. You're back to normal. Normal, Bast whispered. You stunted me. John looked away. As he did, he wiped his eyes. He felt awful for what he'd ordered. It was a poor way to repay a friend for the alien that had saved everything. John turned back. I'm sorry, Bast. I didn't see any other way. It was either that or keep you in stasis forever. I became a menace to you, Bast said. I knew you would do whatever you had to do to protect humanity. I was becoming your enemy. I hate to say it, but that's the truth. You were becoming dangerous to us. Bast looked away. I want to make it up to you, John said. I want to find your people, Commander, Bast said, without looking at John. I must think about this. I must ponder what you did. I get it, John said. When Bast said nothing more, John turned around. Like a whipped dog with his head down, he headed for the hatch. Commander, Bast said. John faced him. The sacerdote stared back. I, I am grateful, the big lug said. Part of me is enraged. 
the other part realizes I was becoming the monster I feared. You have saved me from going insane. The cost was a tiny portion of my brain. I can never practice telepathy again. For that, I am grateful. Yet it is a loss. But I would rather have my sanity. You made the right choice, Commander. You will forgive me, Bast. I do. Thanks, John whispered. Thank you, Commander. For what? For offering to find my people, Bast said. I accept your offer. I have paid a bitter price. Now, like you, I want to save who I can from the AIs. John stood straight, and he gave a crisp salute. Why did you do that? Bast asked. Because I'm honoring you, Bast Bambeck, John said. I'm saluting your courage and your great and generous heart. Bast grinned. I have one other request. Name it, John said. I would like a beer, if I could. John grinned, and then he laughed. As he turned toward the hatch, he said, One beer coming up, Bast. This has been an Audible Studios production of AI Battle Station, the AI series, Book 4. Written by Von Hepner. Performed by Mark Vitor. Executive Producers, Steve Feldberg and Mike Charzik. Producer, Neil Basic. Copyright 2017 by Von Hepner. Sound Recording Copyright 2017 by Audible Inc. Audible Studios is a division of Audible Inc. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.